Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 1, where we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on variables and expressions. All right, so we're going to start out by evaluating each algebraic expression or the given values of the variable. So remember, when you have an algebraic expression, so for example, 3x minus 5, the value is going to change as we change the value of the variable or in some cases, the variables, right, if you have more than one. So we have 3x minus 5, as I just said, and we want to start out by evaluating this for x equals 1. So the way we do this is we just plug in for our variable what the value is that we're given. So if x is equal to 1, we plug a 1 in for x. So this 3 will now be multiplied by 1. Right? I just replace the x with a 1. And then everything else is the same, so minus 5. So now we have a problem that is basic arithmetic, something we did in pre-algebra. We'd multiply 3 times 1 first because of the order of operations. That would give us 3. Then we would subtract away 5. So 3 minus 5, you can think of as 3 plus negative 5. It's going to give you negative 2 as a result. So this algebraic expression, 3x minus 5, is going to be equal to negative 2 when x is equal to 1. Now when we try a different value for x, we're going to get a different answer. So if now x is equal to negative 2, I'm going to plug in a negative 2 for x. So I'll have 3 times negative 2, just plugging in a negative 2 for x, that's all I'm doing, then I'm subtracting away 5. So we do 3 times negative 2 first, that's going to give us negative 6. So we'd have negative 6 and then minus 5. And you can just think of this as negative 6 plus negative 5, make it kind of easy, and that's going to give you negative 11. Negative 11. So 3x minus 5 has a value of negative 11 when we let x equal negative 2. All right, let's try x equals 12. So again, we have 3x, 3x minus 5, and I'm just plugging in a 12 for x. That's all I'm doing. So let's replace x. And just put a 12. And let me kind of stretch this out a little bit. Again, order of operations tells us we multiply first. 3 times 12 is 36. 36. And then we're subtracting away 5. 36 minus 5 is 31. So 3x minus 5 has a value of 31 when we let x equal 12. Okay, let's take a look at one more for the 3x minus 5 algebraic expression. And here we're going to let x equal negative 7. So again, if x is equal to negative 7, I'm just plugging in a negative 7 there for x. That's all I'm doing. So I'd have 3 times negative 7 minus 5. 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. So that would be negative 21. Subtract away 5 more. So negative 21 minus 5 is negative 26. Okay, so again, 3x minus 5 is going to equal negative 26 when we let x equal negative 7. So very important that you understand, when you have an algebraic expression, the value of the algebraic expression is going to change as you change the value of your variable, or again, if you have more than one, your variables. All right, let's take a look at one that is a little bit more complicated, only because we have two variables involved. So we have 4x squared plus 2y, and we're going to start out by saying that we want x to equal 3 and y to equal 2. So where I see an x, I'm going to plug in a 3. And where I see a y, I'm going to plug in a 2. Very, very straightforward. So I would have 4 times the value for x is 3. And then that's going to be squared plus 2 times the value for y is 2. Very, very simple. So order of operations tells me I need to apply any exponents first. So 3 squared is 9. So this would become 4 times 9 plus 2 times 2. So now I need to do multiplication, and I have two multiplication problems here. I have 4 times 9, and I have 2 times 2. 4 times 9 is 36, and 2 times 2 is 4. So I'm going to write that I have 36 plus 4, right? Again, all I did was I multiplied 4 times 9, and I wrote the answer here. 4 times 9 is 36. Then I multiplied 2 times 2, and I wrote the answer here, right? They're just separated by this plus sign which is the final operation we're going to do, right? 2 times 2 is 4. Again, 4 times 9 is 36. So we have 36 plus 4. That's going to give us a final answer of 40. So 4x squared plus 2y 
has a value of 40 when we let x equal 3 and y equal 2. All right, again, 4x squared plus 2y. Now we're going to change. We have x equals 1, y equals 15. So again, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put in a 1. And everywhere I see a y, I'm going to put in a 15. Very, very simple. All right, so 4 times plugging in a 1 for x, and then that value is going to be squared, plus we have 2 times plugging in a 15 for y. So we square 1 first. 1 squared is obviously 1. And so we'd end up with 4 times 1 plus 2 times 15. So 4 times 1 is 4 plus 2 times 15, that's 30. So then 4 plus 30 is 34. And so our answer here is 34, right? 4x squared plus 2y has a value of 34 when x equals 1 and y equals 15. All right, so we're going to look at a different scenario now. So we have x equaling negative 2 and y equaling negative 2 also. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a negative 2. And everywhere that I see a y, I'm also going to plug in a negative 2. But we're going to learn something here. I have 4x squared. So 4 times negative 2, plugging that in for x, and then squared, plus 2 times negative 2 for y. Now, it's a very good idea to always put the number that you replace your variable with inside of parentheses, and here's why. When you start working with exponents, remember that if I have, if I have negative two squared like this, this gives me positive four, right? Both the negative and the two are squared. If I have negative two written like this squared, this equals negative four. And if that doesn't make sense to you, you have to go back to pre-algebra where we went into depth on this concept, but essentially this is negative one times two squared. Two squared would be done first because of the order of operations, that's four. Multiply that by negative one, you get negative four, right? So you have to be very, very careful when you're replacing your variable with a number, specifically a negative number when exponents are involved, right? Because you can get the wrong answer. Whatever value I have for x, I want it to be squared, right? That's what this is here. I want x to be squared. The value I'm giving you is negative 2. So I want negative 2, the negative and the 2, to be squared. And this is how we do that. So when I square negative 2, I get positive 4. So this will be 4 times positive 4, and then plus 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. And let's continue this down here. So 4 times 4 is 16, then plus negative 4, or you could say minus 4, however you want to do that. 16 plus negative 4, or 16 minus 4, is going to give me positive 12. So again, we can say that if we have 4x squared plus 2y, evaluated for x equals negative 2 and y equals negative 2, we get a value of 12. And again, very, very important. One thing you can do is every time you plug something in, every time you take a number and plug it in for a variable, put it inside of parentheses. It's going to save yourself some confusion later on. All right, now we want to move on to a different section. We want to determine whether each are like terms. So we have 3z and we have 2z. So remember, for you to have like terms, the coefficient parts, the parts that are multiplying the variable or variables involved, can be different, okay? But what can't be different are the variable or the variables themselves. They have to be exactly the same. It has to be the exact same variable, and it has to be raised to the exact same power or powers if we're talking about multiple variables. In this case, I have z and I have z. Both are raised to the first power or both really don't have an exponent showing. So we have like terms here. So these are like terms. Here I have 4z squared and 6z. These are not like terms. Although the variable is the same, right? We have z in each case. What's going to throw it off for us? I have a squared term here, and I, I don't have anything here, right? If nothing's showing, then it's raised to the first power. So the exponents are not the same. Exponents are different, different. So they're not like terms. They're not like terms. What about this one? We have negative 3x squared y cubed, and we have negative 8x cubed y squared. 
So we have the same variables, right? We have x and x, and then we have y and y. But look at the exponent on x. In this particular scenario, it's a 2. And in this scenario, it's a 3. So that's not the same. Not the same. Each variable involved has to be raised to the exact same power. So if I had x cubed and x cubed, I'd be fine. Those would be OK. I'd move on to check y. But in this case, y also violates this, right? Because I have y cubed and y squared. Again, those are not the same. So we don't have like terms. They're not like terms. And once you have one of them fail, you can just stop, right? Because it doesn't matter if, let's say I had, for example, negative 3x squared, y cubed, and negative 8x cubed, y cubed, right? I just changed it to where I made this cubed instead of squared. This fails here, right? When we look at x squared and x cubed, it's the same variable, but they have different powers. One is squared, one is raised to the third power or cubed. Even though it's OK over here, right? We have y cubed and y cubed. Because it failed here, it fails everywhere, right? We don't have like terms, right? It has to be the same everywhere, OK? So they're not like terms. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 9x squared, y cubed, z to the fourth power. And then we have 54y cubed, z to the fourth, x squared. Now, don't let the order fool you. Remember, the commutative property of multiplication tells us that we can multiply in any order. And so something like 3 times 5 is equal to 5 times 3. So the order of the factors is never going to matter, right? So in this particular case, we have x squared. So I have x squared. Over here, I have x squared. So I'm going to put a check mark here and here. I have y cubed and I have y cubed. Check mark, check mark. z to the fourth power, z to the fourth power. We have the same variables. We have x, y, and z raised to the exact same powers. x here is raised to the second power, x here is raised to the second power. y is raised to the third power, y is raised to the third power. z is raised to the fourth power, z is raised to the fourth power. So everything is the same. That's what we're looking for, right? Only the coefficients can be different. 9 can be different from 54. That doesn't matter. So we do have like terms. All right, so now we want to simplify. We have 5x plus 7x plus 9 minus 3x minus 2. So the way we simplify is we combine like terms, or we combine what we can. So we have 5x, 7x, and we have, you can think of this as negative 3x, right? I could really rewrite this to make it easy as 5x plus 7x. And I'm going to move this over, right? I'm going to think of this as plus negative 3x. I'm going to reorder my addition. Remember, I can do that because of the commutative property. So I'm going to put plus negative 3x and then plus 9, and then minus 2. So everything I want to combine is next to each other. Right? I'm going to combine these. Now I have the same variable. Okay? If I have the same variable, all I do is add and subtract coefficients. So in other words, I would look at, I would look at 5, 7, and negative 3. So what is 5 plus 7 plus negative 3? 5 plus 7 is 12, plus negative 3 is 9. So really, this is going to give me 9, and then the variable part is the same, so 9x. And you can kind of think about this using apples or oranges or whatever you want to think of. If I have 5 apples, and then I get 7 more apples, I have 12 apples. If I then subtract away 3 apples, I have 9 apples. So that's kind of how you can visualize what's going on there. Another thing you can do is you can just write out, so 5x is x plus x plus x plus x plus x. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 x's. Then plus 7 more. So plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So if I added all these up, I'd have 12 of these guys. right? I'd have, again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, let's say I take three of them away. So get rid of these. What am I left with? Well, let's count again. I'm going to be left with 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So again, that's how we end up with 9x, right? That's just kind of a way to visualize it. But all you're doing when you're combining like terms, you leave the variable part or the variable parts the same, and you just add or subtract the coefficients. So again, x stays the same, 
that's the variable part. And then 5 plus 7 is 12. 12 minus 3 or 12 plus negative 3 is 9. So we put that 9 next to the x. And we have 9x. So then plus, now we have 9 minus 2. That is 7. And so we simplify this to 9x plus 7. All right, let's look at one that's a little bit harder. So we have negative 2 times the quantity, 7x squared minus 9, then plus 4x squared minus 3x. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the distributive property to simplify. So I'm going to multiply negative 2 times 7x squared. So negative 2 times 7 is going to give me negative 14. So that's negative 14. And then x squared just comes along for the ride. Right? If you're multiplying a number times a term, you just multiply the number parts together. And then the variable part is just going to stay the same. Right? Very, very easy. So again, negative 2 times 7x squared is negative 2 times 7, which is negative 14. And then the x squared just comes along for the ride. Then we're going to have minus. You have negative 2 times 9. That's going to give me negative 18. So I can put minus negative 18. Or again, minus a negative is plus a positive. So I can just write this as plus 18. And a lot of people just think about this as, OK, I have minus 9 here. But really, I could write this as plus negative 9. So when they go through and do their multiplication, they'll say, OK, I have negative 2 times negative 9 to get positive 18, kind of skip a step, right? So you can do that if you want at this point. So then plus, we have 4x squared minus 3x. So what are my like terms? What can I combine? Well, negative 14x squared and 4x squared are like terms. They have the same variable, x, raised to the same power, the power of 2. This is not involved in that. This is x raised to the power of 1. That's not going to be like terms with anything. And this 18 is just a constant, a number hanging out by itself. I can't combine that with anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reorder this. I'm going to put negative 14x squared plus 4x squared. And then I'm going to put plus negative 3x. You can leave it as minus 3x if you want. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. And then plus 18. Now I can combine these. They're like terms. So negative 14 plus 4 is negative 10. Again, I'm just working with the number parts. The variable part, x squared, is going to be the same. So again, negative 14x squared plus 4x squared will be negative 10x squared. Then I have plus negative 3x, or I can write minus 3x, and then plus 18. So this is as simple as I can make this. We don't have any more like terms that we can combine. And so again, we just write our answer. So negative 10x squared minus 3x plus 18. All right, let's take a look at a last one. We have negative 2 times the quantity, negative 3x plus 2, minus the quantity 6x minus 5, then minus 4x, then minus 3. So we're going to use our distributive property to remove all the parentheses first. So negative 2 times negative 3x is 6x. Again, if you're multiplying a number times a term with a variable, all you do is multiply the numbers together. So negative 2 times negative 3 gives me 6. And then the variable just comes along for the ride. So you end up with 6x. Then you have negative 2 times 2. Really, that's going to be negative 4, right? So I can put plus negative 4, or I can just write minus 4 to kind of make it easy on myself. Now we deal with minus, and then we have 6x minus 5 inside of parentheses. So this is the first time we've kind of come across this. And this gives students a lot of difficulty. One of the things my teacher always taught me is that if I come across this scenario where I have a minus sign out in front of a set of parentheses, go ahead and put plus negative 1. You want to distribute a negative 1 to each term inside the parentheses so you can remove the parentheses. Right? So put a plus negative 1. Once you get good at this, you're just going to see this and you're going to say, OK, well, to remove the parentheses, I need to change the sign of each term inside of the parentheses. Because I'm subtracting away 6x, so really that's minus 6x. And I'm also subtracting away a negative 5, or I'm subtracting away a minus 5. So that's like plus 5. So a few different ways you can think about it. I change the sign of each term inside the parentheses, and I can remove the parentheses. Or I can just multiply by a phantom negative 1, so plus negative 1. A lot of your teachers, a lot of textbooks are going to recommend this at first because it makes it easier for you to mentally grasp what's going on. I mean, we've just come out of pre-algebra, and now we're all of a sudden just multiplying and changing things left and right, and a lot of you are going to get lost. Hey, where did that come from? Where is this negative 1 all about? So I can put plus negative 1 to kind of make it easier for myself. 
Multiply the negative 1 times 6x, I'm going to get negative 6x. Multiply the negative 1 times minus 5, or multiply the negative 1 by negative 5, if you want to think about it that way, and I'm going to get plus 5. Either way you do it, in order to remove the parentheses, the sign of each term is going to change. So from 6x goes negative 6x. From minus 5, you get plus 5, right? So then minus 4x and then minus 3. All right. So now we're ready to combine like terms. And I have 6x, negative 6x, and negative 4x. Let me write those next to each other. So 6x, I can write minus 6x, or I can write plus negative 6x, whatever you want. And I'll write minus 4x, and then minus 4, and then plus 5, and then minus 3. Now, here's what I can combine. 6x minus 6x minus 4x. Just work with the coefficients. 6 minus 6 is 0, minus another 4 is negative 4, and the variable stays the same. So I'll have negative 4x, and then I have negative 4 plus 5 minus 3. So negative 4 plus 5 is going to be 1, and then if I subtract away 3, I'm going to get negative 2, so minus 2. So I'm going to end up with negative 4x minus 2 as my simplified answer. And there's nothing else I can do. I can't combine negative 4x with negative 2, right? There's, there's nothing I can do. I don't have a value for x that's given, so that is my simplified answer. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Variables and Expressions. We want to evaluate each algebraic expression for the given value or values of the variable or variables. So we're going to start out with negative 7x minus 3, or x equals 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug a 2 in for x, right? It's just that simple. So we have x equals 2. I'm going to plug in a 2 for x, and then I'm going to figure out what the value of the algebraic expression would be. So we have negative 7 times, instead of x, I'm plugging in a 2, then minus 3. So negative 7 times 2 is negative 14. So this is negative 14, and then we're subtracting away 3. So negative 14 minus 3 is negative 17, and that's our answer. So this algebraic expression, negative 7x minus 3, has a value of negative 17 when we let x equal 2. All right, let's take a look at negative 7x minus 3, where x equals negative 2. So again, I'm going to plug in a negative 2 for x. So I'd have negative 7 times negative 2. Right, all I did was replace x with negative 2, then minus 3. So negative 7 times negative 2 is positive 14. And then I'm subtracting away 3, and that's going to give me 11. So negative 7x minus 3, when we evaluate for x equals negative 2, is 11. All right, let's look at negative 7x minus 3 for x equals 5. So I'm just going to plug a 5 in for x there. So we'd have negative 7 times 5, and then we're subtracting away 3. Negative 7 times 5 is negative 35, so that's negative 35, and then minus 3. Negative 35 minus 3 is negative 38. And so negative 7x minus 3, when we evaluate this algebraic expression for x equals 5, is negative 38. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 10x squared plus 7x minus 1 for x equals 2. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a 2. Now this one's a little bit more work because we have two occurrences of x. I have an x squared and I have an x to the first power. So everywhere I see an x, I'm plugging in a 2. So I'd have 10 times, plug in a 2, and then it's squared, plus 7 times, plug in a 2, then minus 1. So because of the order of operations, I'm going to square 2 first. So 2 squared is 4. And so I'm going to have 10 times 4 plus 7 times 2 minus 1. Let me scroll down and get some room. So 10 times 4 is 40 plus 7 times 2 is 14 minus 1. So now we just have addition and subtraction. We can go left to right. So 40 plus 14 is 54 then minus 1 is 53. So this will be 53. All right, now let's look at 10x squared plus 7x minus 1 again, but now for a value of x equals negative 2. So again, everywhere I see an x, which is here and here, I'm plugging in a negative 2. So I have 10 times negative 2, and that's squared, plus 7 times negative 2 minus 1. 
And I talked about this in another video. If I'm plugging in something for x, and I want that value to be squared. So I'm plugging in a negative 2 for x. I want that value to be squared. I want to use parentheses because I want to make sure that I'm squaring the negative and the 2. I don't want any sign mistakes. right? I want negative 2 to be squared. Right? That's why it's set up this way. The easiest way to do this and make sure you don't make a mistake is always to use parentheses when you plug in for something. So let's continue. Negative 2 squared is 4, so I'm going to have 10 times 4. Then plus 7 times negative 2 minus 1. So 10 times 4 is 40. Plus 7 times negative 2, that's negative 14. And then minus 1. We just go left to right. 40 plus negative 14 is going to give me 26. And then minus another 1 would be 25. Okay, last one. We have 10x squared plus 7x minus 1. And now we're going to put x equal to 5. So again, everywhere I see an x, which is here and here, I'm plugging in a 5. So we'd have 10 times 5 squared plus 7 times 5 minus 1. So if I square 5, I get 25, right? So 25 then would be multiplied by 10. 10 times 25 plus 7 times 5 and then minus 1. Now, quick way to do 10 times 25 again. 25 times 1, put a 0 at the end. So 25 times 1 is 25, put a 0 at the end, it's going to be 250. Plus 7 times 5, that's 35, and then minus 1. So what is 250 plus 35? That's going to be 285. And then if I subtract 1 away from that, that's going to be 284. 284, and that's going to be my final answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Variables and Expressions. So we want to evaluate each algebraic expression for the given value or values of the variable or variables. So we're going to start out with negative 9x cubed minus 6y for x equals 1, y equals 3. So very, very simple to work these type of problems. I'm just going to plug in. So if I have x equals 1, everywhere I see an x, I'm putting a 1. If I have y equals 3, everywhere I see a y, I'm putting a 3. Very, very straightforward. So negative 9 times, plug in a 1 for x, and then that's cubed, minus 6 times, plug in a 3 for y. And now I just go through and crank out the operations. So 1 cubed is going to be 1, and then I'd have negative 9 times that 1, then minus 6 times 3. So we're going to do multiplication first before we tackle subtraction. Negative 9 times 1 is negative 9, and we're subtracting away 6 times 3, which is 18. So negative 9 minus 18 is going to give me negative 27. So negative 9x cubed minus 6y is equal to negative 27, when we have x equal to 1 and y equal to 3. All right, so we have negative 9x cubed minus 6y again, but we've changed the values for the variables. So x is now going to be equal to 2, y is now going to be equal to negative 5. Again, very simple. If I see an x, I plug in a 2. If I see a y, I plug in a negative 5. Okay, so let's crank this out. I'd have negative 9 times, plug in a 2 for x, that's cubed minus 6, plug in a negative 5 for y. So if I cube 2, I'm going to get 8. So I'm looking at negative 9 times 8 minus, and then I have 6 times negative 5. Okay, so we're going to do multiplication now. So negative 9 times 8 is negative 72. We're subtracting away 6 times negative 5, that's negative 30. So the first thing we can do is we have minus a negative, that's plus a positive, so negative 72 plus 30. Very, very easy to do that in your head. That's going to be negative 42. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 2z squared minus 5x minus y. For x equals 3, z equals 2, y equals 7. So again, if I see something that's a z, I'm plugging in a 2. If I see something that's an x, I'm plugging in a 3. And if I see something that, let me look for a different color here. If I see something that's a y, I'm plugging in a 7. So, very, very easy. So I have 2 times, what am I plugging in for z? I'm plugging in a 2. And then that's squared, minus 5 times, I'm plugging in 3 when I see x. 
then minus, I'm plugging in a 7 when I see y. And now we just rip through the operations here. We square 2 first. 2 squared is 4, so I'd have 2 times 4, minus 5 times 3, minus 7. Now we multiply. 2 times 4 is 8, minus 5 times 3, that's 15, minus 7. And basically, we just do 8 minus 15. That's going to give me negative 7. And then negative 7 minus 7 is going to give me negative 14. So that is my final answer. All right, so let's look at the same algebraic expression, but we're going to change the value for the variables. So we have 2z squared minus 5x minus y. And again, this is for x equals negative 1. x equals negative 1. It's for z equals 5. And it's for y equals negative 4 y equals negative 4. So let's plug in. We have 2 times, my value for z is 5, and that's squared minus 5 times, my value for x is negative 1, and then that's minus, my value for y is negative 4. So immediately we know that minus a negative is plus a positive, so just go ahead and write this as plus 4. Plus 4. Save yourself some time. So the first thing we would do here is to evaluate the exponent. So we have 5 squared, that's 25. So let's go ahead and write 2 times 25. And then we have minus 5 times negative 1 plus 4. Now, we have 2 times 25, that's 50. So up to this point, I kind of did this the slow way. I'd have 5 times negative 1, that would give me negative 5. I would say, okay, well, I have minus a negative 5 here. And then I go through and say, okay, minus a negative 5 is plus a positive 5. But really right now, you can do this in one step. I know that minus 5 is the same as plus negative 5. So really, when I'm multiplying, I can just include that sign and just think about this as negative 5 times negative 1. And a lot of videos you see when you're in Algebra 2 or College Algebra or anything beyond kind of the basics, they just do that and they assume that you know. I want you to know where that's coming from. I mean, essentially I'm saying, okay, this is plus negative 5 and negative 5 times negative 1 would give me 5. It's just a shortcut to kind of do it so where you're not doing two or three steps for everything, right? You want to kind of get this to where you can go as quickly as possible through the basics. And then we're going to have plus 4. So 50 plus 5 is 55, then plus 4 is 59. Okay, and that's going to be our answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on Variables and Expressions. All right, we want to determine if each are like terms. And remember, for us to have like terms, we have to have the same variable raised to the same power. Or if you have more than one variable, you have to have the exact same variables. So, you know, if you have x in one scenario, you have to have x in the other. If you have x, y, you have to have x, y. And you have to have the same powers on each of the variables. So, in this example, we have 4x and we have negative 13x. So, the coefficients are different. The number parts are different. But the variable has to be the exact same. And in this case, it is. We have x, and then we have x. And each case is raised to the first power. And so these are like terms. Like terms, right? The variable part is the same. What about 12yz and 7xz? Well, these are not like terms, right? I have to have the exact same variable parts. Here I have z and I have z. So that's the same. But what's wrong here is I have an x and I have a y. Those aren't the same. So the variable parts have to be exactly the same. If they're not, you do not have like terms. So these are not like terms. What about 9ab and negative 4ba? Well, these are like terms. And the order of the variables does not matter. Right? If I have multiplication, I can do 4 times 3, that's 12, or I can do 3 times 4, that's also 12. So remember, the commutative property of multiplication tells us that we can multiply in any order. Here I have A raised to the first power, B raised to the first power. Here I have B raised to the first power, A raised to the first power. Right? B and B, A and A. So I have the same variable parts, so I have like terms. All right, what about this one? We have negative 3y squared x and 15xy squared. So let's look at it. We have y squared and y squared, so that's a check mark. We have x and we have x, so that's another check mark, and we're good to go, right? Our variables are the same. 
we have an x and we have a y, and they're raised to the same powers, right? We have y raised to the second power, and we have x raised to the first power in each case. So these are like terms. Here we have 10z squared, x to the fourth, a cubed, and we have negative 5a squared, x to the fourth, z cubed. So if I look at z here, it's squared, z here is cubed. So right there it fails. You don't need to look at anything else because this is squared, this is cubed. It's not the same, and so you don't have like terms. You don't need to look at any other variables. Even though x to the fourth here is the same as x to the fourth here, it doesn't matter. And if you look at the a, that, that fails also. You have a cubed and a squared, so that doesn't work. So you don't have like terms, not like terms. If one of them fails, it's not like terms. It's not like you can have, okay, well, one's different, but all the rest are the same. It doesn't work that way. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on variables and expressions. All right, so we just want to simplify. And we're going to start out with 3 times the quantity t minus 4 plus 7 times the quantity x plus 4. So the main goal is to get this as simple as possible. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the distributive property to remove our parentheses. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 3 and we're going to multiply it by each term inside the parentheses. So 3 times t would be 3t. Then minus, we'd have 3 times 4. That would be 12. Then plus, we'd have 7 times x. That would be 7x. Then plus, we'd have 7 times 4. That would give us 28. Now, if I want, I can regroup this or reorder it using the commutative property to try to get my like terms next to each other. So let's put 3t, and then let's put plus 7x, and then minus 12, and then plus 28. I can't combine 3t and 7x, right? There are different variables involved, and they're not like terms, so I, I just have to leave them as they are. I can combine negative 12 and 28. If I have negative 12 plus 28, that's going to give me 16. So I can write this as 3t plus 7x plus 16, and that would be my simplified answer. All right, for the next one, we have 6 times the quantity z minus 6 plus 3 times the quantity z minus 7 plus 5. So again, the same thing. I'm going to use my distributive property here. 6 times z is 6z minus 6 times 6, that's 36, plus 3 times z, that's 3z, minus 3 times 7, that's 21, plus 5. So I can regroup this here to put the like terms next to each other. So I have 6z and 3z. Those are like terms, so 6z plus 3z, and then I have minus 36, minus 21, plus 5. So I can combine this, and I can combine this. So 6z plus 3z. Again, you're going to keep the variable part the same. So z is going to stay the same, add the coefficients. So what is 6 plus 3? That's 9. So that's going to give us 9z. Now for the number parts, that's relatively simple, right? We're just doing negative 36 minus 21. And we can pretty much add that in our head at this point. That's going to give me negative 57. And then I want to add 5 to that. So that's going to give me negative 52. So it's going to be minus 52. So 9z minus 52 is our simplified answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on variables and expressions. All right, so we want to simplify. We have 3 times the quantity 2y minus 9 plus 7 times the quantity z squared minus y. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use our distributive property to remove the parentheses. And then we're going to look to see what like terms we can combine. So we'll have 3 times 2y to start. And to do this, we multiply the number parts. So 3 times 2 is 6. The variable is going to stay the same, so just y. Then minus, now we have 3 times 9. That's 27. Then plus, 7 times z squared is 7z squared. Then minus, 7 times y is 7y. So what can we combine? Well, we have like terms here and here, but nothing else, right? I can't do anything with this, and I can't do anything with this. So let's write 7z squared, and then I have plus 6y, minus 7y, and then minus 27. All right, so I'm going to combine 6y with negative 7y. So if I have 6 of something and I take away 7, I'm going to have negative 1. Right, so I'd have a negative 1y, or we can really just write this as negative y. So we'd have 7z squared minus y. 
Again, that's the same as if I had negative 1y, exact same thing, and then minus 27. Okay, so that's our simplified answer. All right, let's finish off with one that's kind of tedious. We have negative 2 times the quantity, negative 3x plus 4, minus the quantity 5x minus 7, minus 10. So what we're looking at, again, we're using the distributive property to remove parentheses, and then once we've done that, we're looking to combine any like terms. So negative 2 times negative 3x. Again, if you're doing this, multiply the numbers together. Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. The variable just comes along for the ride. So you're going to stay the same. So you'd have 6x. Then plus, you have negative 2 times 4. That's going to give me negative 8. So I can write plus negative 8, or I can just write minus 8. Now, I have a minus sign out in front of parentheses. I can think about this as plus negative 1, and then multiply the negative 1 by each term inside the parentheses. So I can go, okay, I'm going to have negative 1 times 5x, that's plus negative 5x, and then negative 1 times basically negative 7 there would be plus 7. Or, kind of the easier way to do it, so erase all this, I can say, okay, if I have a negative outside of parentheses, all I need to do to remove the parentheses is change the sign of every term inside those parentheses. If you can just remember that, okay, it's very important because I'm subtracting away 5x, that's minus 5x. So I'm going to put minus 5x or plus negative 5x, whatever you want to do. And then I'm subtracting away a negative 7. That's the same as plus 7, so plus 7. Again, I don't want to confuse you because I know a lot of times when students get to this point, they get very confused. Let me reiterate, if you have a negative sign and only a negative sign outside of a set of parentheses, to remove the parentheses, you must change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. So I can remove the parentheses and say, okay, instead of this being 5x, it's negative 5x. That's why I have the minus sign out here. Instead of this being minus 7, it's plus 7. Or the trick that they're going to teach you in class is they're going to say, if you have a minus sign outside of a set of parentheses, you're going to put plus negative 1 and you're going to distribute the negative 1 to each term. What does multiplying by negative 1 do? It just changes the sign. Okay, So I'm trying to just not confuse you on that. If I multiply negative 1 times 5x, I get negative 5x or minus 5x. If I multiply negative 1 times a negative 7, I get plus 7 right, or positive 7. So either way you do it, you're changing the sign of every term inside the parentheses in order to remove the parentheses. Okay? And then after that, I just have minus 10. All right, so now it's pretty straightforward. 6x and negative 5x are like terms. I can reorder it or I can just go ahead and say, okay, well, 6 minus 5 is 1. So I'm just going to have 1x or we really just write that as just a single x. You can write 1x if you want, but this is, this is more common just to see them write it just as x. Then after that, I have negative 8, positive 7, and negative 10. So negative 8 plus negative 10, that's easy to do in your head, same sign, that's negative 18. Now, if I have negative 18 and I add 7, that's going to be negative 11. So I just have x minus 11 here as my simplified answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 2. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on equations. So we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. All right, so we're going to start out with x plus 2 equals negative 7. And essentially here, inside the parentheses, we have three proposed solutions. And the way we find out if we have a solution to an equation or not is we plug in the value for the variable and we see if the left and the right side are equal. So we have a proposed solution of 3. So we're going to plug that in for x there. So I'd have a 3 instead of an x plus 2 equals negative 7. Now, if I simplify the left side here, 3 plus 2 is 5. And that's obviously not equal to negative 7. See how the left and the right side are not the same value? So I know that 3 is not a solution to this equation. right? So I can cross that out. Now let's try negative 9. So if I plug in a negative 9 for x, I'd have negative 9 plus 2 equals negative 7. If I simplify the left side, negative 9 plus 2 is in fact negative 7. So I get negative 7 equals negative 7. Yeah, that's the same value. 
So this works out as a solution. All right, let's try zero. Let's try zero. So we'd have zero plus two equals negative seven. The left side is gonna simplify to two, and then we have equals negative seven, and two and negative seven are not equal, they're not the same value, so zero is not a solution. So we have our solution of x equals negative nine, x equals negative nine. And again, at this point, I'm not really teaching you how to solve an equation, I'm just teaching you how to check to see if a proposed solution is correct. All right, for the next one, we have one over k minus one equals five over k. And here are my two proposed solutions. I have negative four and I have two. So I'm gonna start out with the proposed solution of negative four, and I'm just gonna plug that in for my variable k. So I have one, I have one over k, so one over negative four. Again, that's what I'm plugging in for k. Then minus one, and this should be equal to five over k, and I'm plugging in a negative four for k. All right, so how do we simplify the left side? Well, we've worked with fractions before, and the first thing is I need to have a common denominator. Now, the easiest thing to do is going to be to do kind of two steps here. The first thing is to rewrite this fraction on the left as negative one over positive four. Remember, that's legal because if I'm dividing, a negative divided by a positive is a negative. Also, a positive divided by a negative is also a negative. So whether or not I put the negative in the numerator or the denominator, this fraction is negative. So I can kind of switch that back and forth. Now, the reason I do that is so that I can just take this one and rewrite it as four over four, four over four. And now I have the same denominator, right? Very, very easy. So all I would do is work with the numerators. Negative one minus four would be negative five. And so I would have negative five negative five over four. So are these two values the same? Negative five over four, is that equal to five over negative four? Well, yes it is, just as I just told you. If I'm dividing and I have a negative in the numerator and a positive in the denominator, it's the same as if I'm dividing with a positive in the numerator and a negative in the denominator. In each case, it's negative, right? That's the result. I can switch this and write it like this, or I can switch both of these and write them like this, it's the same value, right? So we can just write both of them as a negative out in front of the five fourths, right? So we have the same value. So this does work out as a solution. All right, let's try the other proposed solution, which is two. So we have one over two, plugging in a two for K, minus one equals five over two or five halves. Let me kind of write that a little better. So I'm gonna write one as two over two, so I can have a common denominator. And one minus two is gonna give me negative one. So I'd have negative one over the common denominator of two. Is that equal to five halves? Well, no, it's not, right, it's not. So this is not a solution. All right, let's take a look at a final one. We have a squared minus three a equals zero. And our proposed solutions are two, zero, and then one. So I'm gonna start out by plugging in two. If I plug a two in for A, I'm looking to plug that in here and here. So I have two that's going to be squared, remember to use parentheses here, minus three, okay, minus three, that's times two, and this equals zero. So now I can just crank out the operations. Two squared is four, minus three times two, that's six. This should be equal to zero. 4 minus 6 is negative 2, and that is not 0. So 2 is not going to be a solution. Now let's try 0. Let me just erase these numbers inside of the parentheses here, right? That's where we put 2 in. We plug that in for A. Make it nice and easy for us to keep plugging in without rewriting everything. So if I plug a 0 in here and here, I can eyeball that and see I'm going to get a true statement, right? 0 squared is 0. Minus 3 times 0, that's 0, equals 0. Of course, zero minus zero is zero, so I get zero equals zero. Yeah, that's true. So zero does work as a solution. What about one? Again, I'm just gonna erase what's inside of parentheses, make it easy on us. So if I plug in a one here and here, 
1 squared is 1, minus 3 times 1 is 3, equals 0. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. That's not equal to 0, so 1 is not a solution. All right, that doesn't work. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Equations. All right, so we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. So we're going to start out today with b over 2 is equal to negative 11. And here are our two proposed solutions. We have negative 5 and negative 22. So to see if our proposed solution is an actual solution, we plug our value in for the variable. In this case, the variable is b. And we see if we get a true statement. Right, we're going to see if the left and the right side are equal. So if I start out with negative 5, let me highlight that. If I start out with negative 5, I'm just going to plug that in for b. So I'd have negative 5 over 2 is equal to negative 11. The left and the right side here are not equal. Right? They're not the same value. And so this is not a solution. Next, we try negative 22. So let me erase this. And we'll use a different color. Let's say negative 22 over 2 is equal to negative 11. Well, if I divide negative 22 by 2, negative divided by positive is negative. 22 divided by 2 is 11, so this would in fact be negative 11. So we have the same value on the left and the right side. So yeah, this is a solution. Just put a big check mark here. Negative 22 is a solution for the equation. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 301 is equal to negative 7 times the quantity 1 minus 6a. Now our two proposed solutions here, we have negative 7 and then we have 4. So let's start out by working with negative 7. So I'm going to have negative 301, and this is equal to negative 7 times the quantity 1 minus 6, and then I have a there. Remember, I'm plugging in a negative 7 for a. And let's copy this over here, negative 7. Inside the parentheses, I do 6 times negative 7 first. That's going to give me negative 42. I'd have minus a negative 42, so that's plus 42. So I'd have 1 plus 42. And I can go ahead and just replace this. 1 plus 42 we know is 43. So this would be 43 here. And let's scroll down a little bit. And I'll kind of close this up a little bit. So negative 301 is equal to, now I have a negative times a positive. I know that's negative. Now what's 7 times 43, now that we've worked out the sign? Well, 7 times 40 is 280. 7 times 3 is 21. So 21 plus 280 is, in fact, 301. So this would be negative 301 as well. So the left and the right side here are equal. So negative 7 is, in fact, a solution. So that works out. So now let's try 4. Let's erase all this. I'm just going to erase this part here because that's where I plugged in for A. Put a 4 there. And let's see what we get. So we have negative 301 over here. We have negative 7 times this quantity, 1 minus. 6 times 4 is 24. So this is 24. And 1 minus 24 is going to be negative 23. So I'd have negative 301 is equal to negative 7 times negative 23. And at this point, you could stop. You know it's not going to work because you have a negative times a negative. That's positive. Over here, you have a negative. So it's not going to be the same number no matter what. Right? So you could stop at that point. But for the sake of completeness, we're going to continue. This is, again, negative 301. Over here, I have negative times negative. That's positive. And then 7 times 23. 7 times 20 is 140. 7 times 3 is 21. So that's 161. So this would be positive 161. These two are not the same value. And so 4 is not a solution. So we can come back up here at the top. Just kind of cross this out and say 4 is not a solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on Equations. All right, so we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. And we're going to start out with 256 is equal to 8 times the quantity, negative 7p plus 4. And our two proposed solutions, we have 0 and then we have negative 4. And again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the proposed solution I'm going to plug it in for the variable in the equation, and I'm going to see if the left and the right side are equal. If they are, then my proposed solution is an actual solution. If it's not, 
then my proposed solution is not a solution. So let's start out with zero. So we have 256 is equal to, we have eight times this quantity negative seven. Instead of P, I'm plugging in a zero, then plus four. Now, we start out inside the parentheses over here. Negative seven times zero is zero. And then if I added that to four, I'd get four. So I'd have 256 is equal to eight times four. And we know eight times four is 32. And that's not equal to 256, right? That doesn't work out. So I can go ahead and cross out zero as a solution because the left and the right side here are not equal when I plug zero in for the variable. All right, let's take a look at negative four now. And all I'm gonna do is just erase this right here. That's where I plugged in for P, right? So I'm just gonna plug in a negative four. Very, very simple. 256 over here is equal to eight times this quantity. Negative seven times negative four is 28, then plus four. And 28 plus four is 32, so I'd have 256 is equal to eight times 32. So 256 over here. What's eight times 32? Well, eight times 30 is 240. Eight times two is 16. 240 plus 16 is 256. So the left and the right side here are the same, right? It's the same value, they are equal. And so negative four is a solution. Come back up here and I'm just going to check mark negative four. Again, when we plug that in for P in our equation, the left and the right sides are equal, so it is a solution. All right, so let's take a look at another one. We have one over three X minus two over three X squared equals one over X squared. Now our two proposed solutions, we have five and then we have negative six. So let's start out with five. And again, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this in everywhere I see X and I'm gonna see if the left and the right side are equal. So I'd have one over three times five minus two over three times five squared, right? I'm just plugging in for the X's here is equal to one over five squared. All right, let's take a look at the left side first. One over three times five is one over 15, right? Three times five is 15, of course. Minus, we have two over, we have three times five squared. Five squared is done first, five squared is 25. Multiply that by three, you get 75. And this equals one over five squared is 25. All right, so I need a common denominator over here. And I know that 15 times five is 75. So I can just multiply this by five over five. Five times one is five. Five times 15 is 75. Then minus two over 75. This should be equal to one over 25. So five minus two is three. So I'd have three over 75 equals one over 25. And that's going to be true. So these two fractions are in fact the same. So we have a solution, right? Three over 75 reduces to one over 25. Three divided by three is one. 75 divided by three is 25. So I get 1 25th is equal to 1 25th, right? It's the same either way. So we can go back up here and just put a big check mark here. And let me just erase all this. All right, so now we wanna try negative six. So let me just erase everywhere I plugged in a five and replace that now with a negative six. And let's try this out. So we have one over three times negative six. So three times negative six is negative 18. So this would be one over negative 18 minus, now we have two over, we have three times negative six squared. Negative six squared is 36. And we'd have three times 36. So what is this? Let's go ahead and crank this out. Three times 30 is 90. 3 times 6 is 18. 90 plus 18 is 108. So this would be 108. And this should be equal to 1 over negative 6 squared is 36. So to make this easy on myself, I know that 2 over 108 would simplify to 1 over 54, right? If I just divide both by 2. 1 over 54. Now, I know that... 54 is a multiple of 18. 18 times three is 54. So essentially to get a common denominator here, I'm going to rewrite this where the negative is in the numerator, right? Remember I can switch them from the numerator to the denominator. And I'm gonna multiply the top and bottom by three. 
And so negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Over 18 times 3, that's 54. Then minus 1 over 54. And this should be equal to 1 over 36. So negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. So I'd have negative 4 over 54. This should be equal to 1 over 36. And it's not going to be. Although I can reduce this, I'm not going to end up with this. One of the keys here is you can just look at this and say, okay, this is negative, this is positive. So it's not going to work out, right? It's not going to be the same value. But if you want to go through for completeness and reduce this, well, 54 is divisible by 2. 54 divided by 2 is 27. So this is 27. And negative 4 divided by 2 would be negative 2. So negative 2 27ths is not going to be equal to 1 over 36, right? It's not the same. Does not work out. All right, so negative 6 does not work. We'll put a big X through that. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 3 on equations. All right, so we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. And we're going to start out with x squared plus 7x equals negative 10. And the two proposed solutions here, we have negative 5 and we have 0. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to plug in our proposed solution for each occurrence of the variable in the equation. And then we're going to see if we have a true statement meaning does the right side and the left side have the same value. So I'm going to start out with negative 5. I'm going to be plugging that in for the x there and the x there. So let me just kind of highlight that. And so let's write that out. We'd have x squared, so I'd have negative 5 squared. And we're going to use parentheses. Plus 7 times negative 5 equals negative 10. So negative 5 squared is 25. And then we have 7 times negative 5, that's negative 35, so let's put in minus 35 equals negative 10. Simplifying over here, 25 minus 35 is negative 10, so you get negative 10 equals negative 10. So yes, negative 5 is a solution to the equation. Now let's try 0. And I'm just going to erase what's inside the parentheses here because that's what I plugged in. You can kind of eyeball that and see it's not going to work, right? If I put a 0 in here and a 0 in here, well, the left side's just going to be 0, and I'd have 0 equals negative 10, right? 0 squared is 0, plus 7 times 0, that's 0, equals negative 10. So 0 plus 0 is 0, equals negative 10. So that doesn't work, right? 0 and negative 10 are not the same value, so this is not a solution. All right, we can go ahead and cross that out. does not work. All right, let's try another one. So we have z over 20 equals negative 18, and we have three proposed solutions. We have 360, we have negative 1, and we have negative 360. So again, I'm just going to plug in for the variable. So I have 360, we're starting with that, and you don't even need to plug this in. You can kind of eyeball it and see it's not going to work. I have a positive 360 divided by a positive 20, it's not going to give me a negative. I can just cross this out, I don't even need to do the work. but for the sake of completeness, 360, plug that in for z, divided by 20, equals negative 18. So if I was to simplify this, remember this little trick, you can cancel this 0 with this 0, right? because I'm just basically canceling a factor of 10 between the numerator and the denominator, I'd be left with 36 divided by 2, and that's positive 18, and that's not equal to negative 18. right? That doesn't work. But now I know that this one's going to work out. Right? If I had a negative 360 divided by a positive 20, that would in fact work. So let's do that one real quick, since we're right there. Negative 360 divided by 20, again, use the same trick here. Negative 36 divided by 2 would be negative 18. So negative 18 does equal negative 18, so that works out. So we can say that this, negative 360, is a solution to our equation here. Right? That does work. Now let's try negative 1. So we have negative 1 over 20 equals negative 18. And of course, those two values are not equal. And so we're going to put a big fat x through this. That doesn't work either. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on equations. All right, so we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. And we're going to start out with 1 over 2y plus 1 over 2y squared equals 1 over y. So essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the two proposed solutions. 
We're going to plug each one of them in for each occurrence of the variable. We're going to see if the left and the right side are equal. If they are, then our solution works, right? It's not a proposed solution, it is a solution. If it doesn't, right, if the left and the right side are not equal, then we don't have a solution, right? We can reject the proposed solution. All right, so our variable here is y. So I'm going to be plugging in everywhere I see a y. And so I'm going to start out with this 10 here. I have 1 over 2 times 10. So just plug in a 10 for y. Plus 1 over 2 times 10 squared. Again, plug in a 10 for y equals 1 over 10. All right. So all the way here on the left, 1 over 2 times 10 is 1 over 2 times 10 is 20. Plus 1 over 1 over 2 times 10 squared. You do 10 squared first, that's 100. 2 times 100 is 200. And that's equal to 1 over 10. So you can kind of eyeball this, and you should know that this is not going to work out. But for the sake of completeness, let's go through it. To get a common denominator here, I would multiply this by 10 over 10. Right, 20 times 10 is 200. So in the numerator, I'd have 10, right? 1 times 10 is 10. Over in the denominator, I'd now have 200. Right, again, 20 times 10 is 200. So then plus 1 over 200 is equal to 1 over 10. And we'll continue this. We have 10 plus 1, that's 11, over 200 is equal to 1 over 10. So that doesn't work. Our proposed solution of 10 is not going to work, right? 11 over 200, you can't reduce that because 11 is a prime number. And there's nothing else I can do here, right? The left and the right side are just not going to be equal. I'm just going to go ahead and cross out the 10. That didn't work. And I'm just going to erase everywhere we plugged in a 10, and I'm going to replace it with a 1. And now let's see if this works out. So let's scroll down. We have 1 over 2 times 1. 2 times 1 is 2, so this is 1 half. Plus, here we have 1 over 2 times 1 squared. 1 squared is done first. 1 times 1 is 1, of course. Then times 2 is 2. So this is plus 1 half, and that equals 1 over 1. Now, 1 over 1 is just 1. Right? That's just 1. Now, you can eyeball this and see that it's going to work out. If I have a half plus another half, I have one whole, right? If I have half of a dollar or 50 cents plus another half of a dollar or another 50 cents, I have a full dollar. And you can go through this again for completeness. One plus one is two over the common denominator of two. Two over two is one. So you get one equals one. So that works out. All right, so we'll just come back up here, put a check mark here next to one. That is a solution to this equation. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have k squared minus 16k equals negative 64. And our two proposed solutions, we have 3 and then we have 8. So let's scroll down a little bit. So I'm going to start out with 3. And again, everywhere I see the variable k, I'm going to plug in a 3. So I'm going to have 3 squared minus 16 times 3. I'm saying that equals negative 64. All right, so 3 squared is 9 minus... 16 times 3, that's 48. And does that equal negative 64? No, it doesn't. All right, if I take 9 and I subtract away 48, I'm going to end up with negative 39. So negative 39 is, of course, not equal to negative 64. So this does not work. I can go ahead and cross out 3 as a solution. All right, the next one we want to try is 8. So we would have, instead of k, I'm going to put 8 in there, and I'm going to square it, minus 16 times 8. This should be equal to negative 64. All right, so 8 squared we know is 64. Minus, what is 16 times 8? Let's do that in our head. 10 times 8 is 80. 6 times 8 is 48. 80 plus 48 is 128. Equals negative 64. And 64 minus 128 is going to give me negative 64. So negative 64 equals negative 64. Same value on the left and the right side here. So yes, 8 is a solution. So let's go ahead and go back up and just put a check mark next to 8. Say so yes, 8 is a solution to this equation. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on equations. All right, so we want to determine whether each is a solution to the given equation. And we're going to start out with x squared minus 15x equals negative 56. 
And our two proposed solutions here, we have zero and then we have seven. So let's start out with zero and I'm just gonna plug in for X, right? Everywhere I see an X, I'm gonna put in a zero and I'm gonna see if I get a true statement, meaning I'm gonna see if the left and the right side are equal. You can eyeball that and see that it's not gonna work, right? If I put a zero in here and a zero in here, the left side would be zero, the right side would be negative 56. But for the sake of completeness, let's go through this. We'd have zero squared minus 15 times zero equals negative 56. Zero squared is zero, minus 15 times zero, that's zero, equals negative 56. So I'd have zero equals negative 56, and that's false, right? That's false. Zero and negative 56 are not the same, so this is not true. That does not work. All right, so let's try seven now. And to keep it simple, I'm just gonna erase what's inside the parentheses and plug in a seven. So I'd have seven squared minus 15 times seven equals negative 56. So seven squared is 49 minus, what is 15 times seven? Let's do this in our head. Seven times 10 is 70. Seven times five is 35. 70 plus 35 is 105. So I'd have 49 minus 105 equals negative 56. And so what is 49 minus 105? Well, that's gonna be negative 56. So I'd have negative 56 equals negative 56. Same value on the left and the right side here. So I can check that seven is a solution to our equation. Let me erase all this real quick. Come back up here. So we're just gonna check this seven and say that it is a solution to this equation. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have eight times the quantity four minus r plus three equals 91. Our two proposed solutions, we have negative seven and we have negative four. So we're just gonna plug in for that variable r. So I'm gonna start with negative seven. So we have eight times, we have this quantity four minus, I'm plugging in a negative seven. So I can plug in a negative seven like this, or I can say, okay, minus a negative is plus a positive. So really I'm just plugging in plus seven. So plus three equals 91. Now four plus seven is 11, so I'd have eight times 11. Eight times 11 plus three equals 91. 8 times 11 is 88, 88 plus 3 equals 91, and 88 plus 3 is in fact 91, so 91 equals 91. Yes, that works out, so negative 7 is a solution to that equation. So let's go ahead and try negative 4 now. So let's erase all this, and originally I plugged in a negative 7, I put minus a negative 7, so I put plus 7. We're going to do the same thing here, I'm, I have a negative 4, Minus a negative four, if I put a negative four in for r, I basically have plus four. So four plus four there. And let's just continue. Four plus four is eight, so I'd have eight times eight. Plus three equals 91. And eight times eight is 64. 64 plus three equals 91. And of course, 64 plus three is 67. That's not equal to 91. Right, those values are not the same. So this negative four is not a solution to this equation, right? This does not work. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, practice set number three, where we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on the addition property of equality. All right, so for the problems we're gonna look at, we wanna solve each equation and check the result. All right, so we're gonna to begin today with x minus one equals negative three. So just to give you a quick kind of rundown of what we did in the lesson, we learned how to solve linear equations in one variable that resemble this format, sort of x plus some number equals some number. We do it using something known as the addition property of equality. Now what the addition property of equality tells us is that we can add or subtract the same number to or in the case of subtraction from both sides of the equation. Now, the reason we need this is that our goal is to isolate the variable in the equation. So with this one, x minus one equals negative three, I wanna isolate x, I want to isolate x on the left side. So in order to do that, I've gotta find a way to get rid of this minus one. And to make it easy, I can just think of this as x plus negative one equals negative three. So what value can I add to the left side of the equation to make negative one disappear? 
Well, recall our friend zero. If I add zero to something, it's just the same number, right? So if I was to make this into x plus zero, I would just have x. Right? I would no longer have anything other than x on that side of the equation. So in order to do that, I think back to when we were adding opposites, right? If I add a number and its opposite, I always end up with zero. So what I wanna do is I wanna add the opposite of negative one to the left side of the equation. So let's add plus one, right? That's the opposite of negative one. And then the addition property of equality tells me that I can only do this if I do it to the right side as well. So I've also got to have a plus one over here also. Kind of think about it as a scale. You're just maintaining the balance. So if I add one over here, I add one over here. Now, what I'll do is just simplify the left and the right side. When I simplify on the left, negative one plus positive one is zero. So this is gone, right? I basically have x plus zero, which is just x. Now I've successfully isolated x on the left side. That's all I have is just an x over there. On the right side, I'm now just gonna have a number. Negative three plus one is gonna give me negative two. So I have my solution. I have x equals negative two. And now all I need to do is just check. And the way I check is I take the value I got for x and I plug it in for x in the original equation. Once I simplify, the left and the right side should be the same. So let's erase all of this. And let's plug in for x there. So let's plug a negative 2 in there. And I'd have negative 2 minus 1 equals negative 3. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So you'd have negative 3 equals negative 3. So yes, this solution, x equals negative 2, is correct. All right, let's look at v plus 7 equals 16. So again, I want to isolate, I want to isolate this variable v. So how do I do that? Well, again, I'm adding seven over here. I just wanna get rid of that. So how do I get rid of it? I add the opposite of seven to both sides of the equation, right? That's gonna let v be by itself. So v plus seven plus the opposite of seven, which is negative seven. You could also just put minus seven if you want, it doesn't matter equals 16, and then because I did it to the left, I've also got to do it to the right. So here's what I did. I added negative seven to both sides of the equation. And again, the reason for that is, if I'm adding seven, that's what I start out with, I have v plus seven. To get rid of seven, I've got to add the opposite of it. The opposite of seven is negative seven, so that's why I'm adding that to both sides of the equation, so that seven plus negative seven is zero. This is gone, and I'm just left with v on the left side now always want to isolate your variable. So V is going to equal 16 plus negative seven is nine. And again, we want to check to make sure we got the right answer. So to do that, let's go back. We're going to plug in a nine there. So nine plus seven equals 16. Yes, that is true. Nine plus seven is 16. So 16 equals 16. So yeah, V equals nine is the correct solution. All right, now let's look at z minus eight equals negative 16. So now I have eight being subtracted away from z. You could also just think about this as plus negative eight if you want, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you're just gonna be adding eight to both sides of the equation. And why are we doing that? Again, I'm trying to isolate the variable. I'm trying to isolate the z there. So if I'm adding negative eight to z, or if I'm subtracting away eight, either way you wanna think about that, in order to have that go away, I need to add something to negative eight that results in zero. So I can have z plus zero or just z on the left side. So you add the opposite of negative eight, which is eight. So z plus negative eight plus positive eight, again, I'm adding that to this side, is equal to negative 16, and then because I added eight over here, I also add eight over here. It's a balanced thing. So whatever I do to the left, I've got to do to the right. So this is gonna cancel, right? Negative eight plus eight is zero. So z plus zero is just z. And then on the right, negative 16 plus eight is negative eight. So z is gonna equal negative eight. And again, we wanna check. We wanna make sure we got the right answer. And the reason you have to check right now is you might make a silly mistake. You might 
add eight to one side but forget to do it to the other. You might add the wrong number. At this stage of the game, you always want to check, make sure you got the right answer. So plug in the negative eight for Z. So we'd have negative eight minus eight equals negative 16. And of course, negative eight minus eight is negative 16. So yeah, this checks out. This checks out, so Z equals negative eight is the correct solution. All right, let's look at two that are a little bit more challenging. So we have five X minus four X minus three equals seven. So now this looks a lot different than what we've been working with. But when you first encounter the section in your book on linear equations and one variable, the first section is addition property of equality. You're likely to get a problem like this. And what I want you to think back to, remember in the first and second lessons where we were talking about algebraic expressions and equations, we talked a lot about simplifying. So I can simplify when I have like terms. 5x and 4x are like terms. So I can simplify this before I even start. 5x minus 4x is just x, right? Because 5 minus 4 is 1. This would basically be 1x. And we just write that as x, right? We don't need to put the 1 out in front. So we'd have x minus 3 equals 7. And once I simplify this, it looks like something I can solve, right? Something I can do at this point. So if you see something like this in your section on the addition property of equality, it's kind of a little trick question. Basically, you want to simplify first and then attack the problem. So now we have x minus 3 equals 7. So again, I want to isolate the variable. Isolate. And I'm basically subtracting away 3 or I'm adding negative 3. So in order to get x by itself, I'm going to add the opposite of negative 3. I'm going to add 3, right? The opposite of negative 3 is 3. So x, so x minus 3. Then I'm going to add 3 equals 7, and then I'm going to add 3 over here. Again, whatever I do over here, I've got to match it over here. I've got to maintain the balance. Okay, very, very important. So over here on the left, negative 3 plus 3, that's, of course, 0. So that's gone. x plus 0 would just be x, and this equals 7 plus 3, which is 10, and that is going to be my solution. All right, so let's plug in a 10 for x and see if we get a true statement. Now let's plug it into the original equation, not the simplified version. Because remember, you might have made a mistake simplifying. So you always want to check in the original equation. So I'd have 5 times 10 minus 4 times 10 minus 3 equals 7. So 5 times 10 is 50 minus 4 times 10, that's 40, minus 3 equals 7. We'll go left to right. 50 minus 40 is 10. 10 minus 3 is 7. So you get 7 equals 7. So yeah, this is correct. X equals 10 is correct. All right, let's look at one that's, again, kind of challenging. We have 8 fifths X minus 2 is equal to 3 fifths X plus 11. So some of you might look at this and go, whoa, this looks really, really advanced. Again, you can solve this just using the addition property of equality. Now, the first thing you need to know is that when you have a variable like x on both sides of the equation, you want to use your addition property of equality to get all of the variable terms, meaning the terms that contain you know, your variable, to one side of the equation. So remember, I can add or subtract whatever I want as long as I do it to both sides. So I'm going to move 3 fifths x over here. And the way I'm going to do that Let's rewrite this. I have 8 fifths x minus 2 equals 3 fifths x. I'm going to subtract it away from over here so that it doesn't exist. So minus 3 fifths x plus 11. But it's not legal for me just to subtract it away on one side. I have to also do it over here. So I need to put minus 3 fifths x over here as well. Now what's that going to do for me? Well, over here, it's going to disappear. 3 fifths x minus 3 fifths x, anything minus itself is 0. That's gone. So on the right side now, I just have equals 11. On the left side, I have 8 fifths x minus 3 fifths x minus 2. And now I have a common denominator here of 5. What's 8x minus 3x? Let's just work with the numerators. Well, the x stays the same. 8 minus 3 is 5, so I have 5 fifths x, and remember 5 over 5 is 1, 
So really I have one X or just X. So I have X minus two equals 11. So what started out as something that was extremely complicated looking turned out to be something we can solve with just a simple property that we've already learned. So watch out for problems like that in your textbook. I'm sure they're going to give it to you on homework or a test. Try to simplify as much as you can. Again, the main thing here was to learn that you had to move all the variable terms to one side before you could do your simplification. All right, so now we have X minus two equals 11. So what's being done to X? I'm subtracting away two. So to get X by itself, I just need to add two to both sides. So X minus two plus two equals 11 plus two. Again, whatever I do to the left, I got to do to the right. So this will go away, right? Minus two plus two, that's zero. So I just have X over here. And this is going to be equal to 11 plus two is 13. So X equals 13. And let's go ahead and check that. So the original equation, let me scroll down and write it down here. Again, X equals 13 is the answer. We had eight fifths times X. So I'm going to plug in a 13 here or X minus two is equal to three fifths. So three fifths times X, I'm going to plug in a 13 and then plus 11. So this one's kind of tedious to check but I think it'll be worth our while just to get a little practice. So I can't really cancel between 13 and five. I kind of have to just do the multiplication. What is eight times 13? Well, eight times 10 is 80, eight times three is 24. So that's gonna be 104 over five. And then I'm subtracting away two. I wanna get a common denominator here. So essentially I can just multiply this by five over five, right? So it's 10 fifths, right? This is the same as two. This should be equal to, over here I have three fifths times 13, can't cancel between 13 and five, so I just, three times 13 is 39, so 39 fifths plus 11. Now I want a common denominator, so I'm gonna multiply by five over five. This will be 55 fifths. All right. So over here I have a common denominator of five, 104 minus 10 is 94, so I have 94 fifths. And then this is equal to, we have 39 fifths plus 55 fifths. Again, that common denominator of five. What's 39 plus 55? Easy way to do this is just think about 39 as 40 for a second. 40 plus 55 would be 95. Now I added one to get it to 40, so just take one away now, it would be 94. So 94 fifths equals 94 fifths, yeah, that's true. And so we know that our solution, x equals 13, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on the Addition Property of Equality. All right, so we want to solve each equation and check the result. All right, so we're going to start out by looking at x minus 6 equals 84. And again, my goal is to isolate the variable. So to isolate the variable x. And how do I do that? Well, I got to look at what's being done to x. And in this case, I have this minus six here. So how do I get rid of that? Well, remember, if you add a number and it's opposite together, you get zero. So if I add the opposite of negative six, remember, I can think of this as plus negative six if I want to. If I add the opposite of negative six, which is positive six, negative six and positive six will give me zero. So if I add six over here, these two would cancel out and become zero. So I'd have x plus zero, which is just x. I've successfully isolated x on one side of the equation. But there's a problem. I can't just add six to one side of the equation and not do anything to the other. You gotta have a balance. So the addition property of equality tells us we can add the same number to both sides of an equation and maintain our solution. But we gotta do it to both sides. So I'm gonna also do plus six over here. And so 84 plus six would give me 90. And so my solution is that x equals 90. Now we go back and check. We take our value for x and we plug it in for x in the original equation. So we would have 90 minus six equals 84. And of course that's true, right? 84 does equal 84. So yeah, this is true. X does equal 90. All right, now let's look at x plus 71 equals negative 16. So again, I wanna isolate x. I want to isolate x. And look at what's being done to x. I'm adding 71. So to undo that, I basically would add negative 71 or subtract 71 
away from both sides of the equation. So I would have x plus 71. You could put minus 71 or you could put plus negative 71 equals, and then you're gonna have negative 16 and minus 71. So again, over here, a number and its opposite will always be zero. So this cancels out completely, that's zero, and I'm just left with x, and on the right-hand side, I have negative 16 minus 71, and that's gonna give me negative 87. So x here is gonna be negative 87, and of course, we wanna check this by plugging a negative 87 in for x. So we'd have negative 87 plus 71 equals negative 16. And if we do the addition here, on the left-hand side, negative 87 plus 71 is negative 16. So we get negative 16 equals negative 16. So yeah, our answer here is correct. X equals negative 87. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section two on the addition property of equality. All right, so we wanna solve each equation and check the result. So we're gonna start out with X minus 12 equals two. All right, so what are we doing when we solve an equation? We wanna isolate the variable on one side of the equation. And so if I see my variable X right here, I just want to isolate. And I'm just gonna think about what's being done to X. Well, I'm subtracting away 12, or I can think about that as adding negative 12. So let's write X minus 12, or you could put X plus negative 12. It doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. So that equals two. Now. To get x by itself, I need to find a number that I can add to negative 12 that would result in zero, right? Because if I could make this side right here be x plus zero, I would really just have x, x would be by itself. Remember that a number plus its opposite is always zero. So what's the opposite of negative 12? Well, that's positive 12. So really what I want here is x plus negative 12 plus positive 12 equals two now, because I do it to this side over here, I added 12, I have to also do the same thing over here. I have to add 12. That's what makes it legal, right? You think about an equation as it has to be balanced. You do something to one side, you gotta do it to the other. So I add 12 to one side, I add 12 to the other, and the solution stays the same. Now, over here, negative 12 plus 12 is, of course, zero. And so this is gone, right? You'd have x plus zero, which is just x. On the right side, two plus 12 is 14. And now I have a variable, which is x equals some number. So x equals 14 is my solution. And we're not done. We always wanna to check to make sure that we got the right answer. So the way we do that is we plug in 14 for x in the original equation, and we see if we get a true statement. So x minus 12 equals two. So we'd have 14 minus 12 equals two. And of course, we'd get two equals two. Of course, this checks out. So x equals 14 is our solution. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have six equals negative five minus b. So in this case, we have something that's a little bit different. We're used to having the variable on the left-hand side. Now it's on the right. And we have a negative sign out in front of the variable, which we're gonna see in a minute is gonna kind of complicate things. So six equals negative five minus b. So I want you to just think about getting rid of this negative five first. How can we do that? Well, we can add five to both sides of the equation. So six plus five is equal to negative five plus five minus b. So again, I just added five to both sides of the equation because I'm trying to get rid of that negative five. If I wanna get rid of something, I just add the opposite of that to both sides of the equation and it's gonna zero it out. So in other words, here, negative five plus five, that's zero. Then over here, six plus five is going to give me 11. So I'd have 11 is equal to negative B. So here's why this is an issue. We usually have the variable, not the negative of the variable. A lot of students will see this and go, yay, I got the answer. 11 equals negative B, yay. No, you don't want the negative of B, you want what B is. So you can use some general reasoning here. If the negative of b is 11, well, that means b has to be negative 11, right? Because if I had the negative of negative 11, that would give me positive 11. That would be that. And that's what this is saying. 11 is equal to the negative 
of whatever B is. So B must be negative 11 because the negative of negative 11 is 11. Now, if that's a little confusing for you, and I, I know that might be, another way you can do this, this is kind of in the next lesson, but you can always multiply both sides of an equation by the same non-zero number. We'll learn about that in the next lesson. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but you can multiply both sides of the equation by negative one. And basically, when you multiply by negative 1, you're just changing the sign. So negative 1 times 11 is negative 11. And that's equal to negative b times negative 1. That's just b. So b equals negative 11. So that's another way. So again, we have b equals negative 11. So we have 6 equals negative 5 minus a negative 11. And of course, minus a negative is plus a positive. So you'd have 6 equals basically negative 5 plus 11. And so 6 is going to equal 6. So yeah, this is the correct solution. B equals negative 11. And so we saw kind of a few different ways that we could come about getting a solution when that scenario arises. Really, in the future, you're just going to be multiplying by negative 1 so that you can change the sign. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on the addition property of equality. All right, so we just want to solve each equation and check the result. So we're going to start out with R minus a negative 34 equals negative 34. So remember, when we have minus a negative, it's plus a positive. So let's start out by just rewriting this as r plus 34 equals negative 34. Now, remember, our goal when we're solving an equation is to isolate the variable on one side. So I'm going to isolate r. So that means whatever is being done to r, in this case, I'm adding 34, I need to kind of undo it. right? I need to add something to 34 that results in zero, so I can have r plus zero or just r. Now, a number plus its opposite is always zero. So if I'm adding 34, I can add negative 34 to that. 34 plus negative 34 would be zero. So I can change this to r plus 34 plus negative 34. And then remember, the addition property of equality allows me to do that so long as I add negative 34 to the other side of the equation as well. That maintains the balance. So I added it to the left. I've got to also add it to the right. Now on the left, I've isolated my variable. 34 plus negative 34, that's 0. So I'd have r plus 0, and that's just r. So on the left, we just have r, then equals. Negative 34 plus negative 34 is negative 68. And that is my solution. Now, pop that back in and check. So we're going to take negative 68, plug that in for r. So you'd have negative 68 plus 34 equals negative 34. And of course, that's true. Negative 68 plus 34 is negative 34. So that equals negative 34. So yes, r equals negative 68 is the correct solution. All right, let's look at 10x minus 9x minus 5 equals negative 7. I gave you a problem like this in the lesson. We saw that you see something kind of looks complicated, but really all we need to do is simplify before we try to attack the problem. So 10x minus 9x, if I simplify that, 10 minus 9 is 1, and then the x comes along for the ride. So that's 1x or just x, and then minus 5 equals negative 7. And now it's something we can solve, right? If I have 5 being subtracted away, I just add 5 to both sides, to kind of get rid of that. So if I have x minus 5 plus 5 equals negative 7 plus 5. Again, I just added 5 to both sides. And the reason I did that is because I always want to add the opposite of what's being added to x. So in this case, I can just think about this as I'm adding negative 5 to x. So the opposite of that would be positive 5. So if I add that to the left side, Negative 5 and positive 5, when they're added together, they cancel and become 0. And so x is just left by itself. On the right side, I have negative 7 plus 5. That's going to give me negative 2. So x equals negative 2 is my solution. And let's check that in the original equation. You always want to check in your original equation in case you made some sort of error when you simplified. So 10 times negative 2 minus 9 times negative 2 minus 5 should be equal to negative 7. So 10 times negative 2 is negative 20. You can think about this as negative 9 times negative 2, that's 18. So plus 18 minus 5 equals negative 7. Negative 20 plus 18 is negative 2. 
Negative 2 minus 5 is negative 7. So you have negative 7 equals negative 7. So yeah, this checks out. X equals negative 2 is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on the addition property of equality. All right, so we want to solve each equation and check the result. So we're going to start out with n plus 65 equals 138. So again, I always want to isolate my variable. In this case, that's n. And in order to do that, I have this plus 65. I'm adding 65 to n. So to kind of undo that, I want to add the opposite of 65, or I want to subtract 65 away. I can think about it as, okay, I'm adding negative 65, or I'm subtracting 65 away. When I do that to the left side, these two are going to cancel, right? 65 minus 65, or 65 plus negative 65, that's 0. n plus 0 would just be n. Now, in order to make this legal, I've got to also do it to the right side of the equation. So I added negative 65 over here, or I subtracted away 65. Again, however you want to think about that. So I've got to do that over here as well. So what's 138 minus 65? Well, you can kind of eyeball that and do it. 8 minus 5 would be 3, and then 13 minus 6 would be 7. So n would equal 73. Now let's check that. You plug in a 73 for n. And plus 65 equals 138. And again, I can eyeball it to add. 3 plus 5 is 8. 7 plus 6 is 13. So 138 equals 138. So yeah, n equals 73 is the correct solution. All right, let's look at one that's a little bit more tedious. We have 5 halves x minus 1 equals 3 halves x plus 12. So it might look like something we can't solve at this point. You might say, okay, well, we haven't gotten to equation with fractions yet. Really, all we're going to do is just kind of rearrange some stuff first, and then you're going to see it in a format that you're familiar with. So the first thing is you always want all your variable terms on one side of the equation. So when I say variable terms, I mean this term and this term. It's a term that contains a variable, right? So in order to do that, I can subtract 3 halves x from both sides of the equation. So if I do minus, if I do minus 3 halves x, I'll have 5 halves x minus 3 halves x minus 1 equals, over here, 3 halves x minus 3 halves x plus 12. Now, on the right side, I've basically just made this go away. Anything minus itself is just 0. So on the right side, I just have equals 12 now. On the left side, think about this. If I want to combine these like terms, that's what I have. I have like terms, right? The variables x raised to the first power. I have the same denominator, which is 2. And I just look at the numerators. What is 5 minus 3? That's 2. So 2 over 2 is 1. So basically, I have 1x or just x. So I have x minus 1 equals 12. So now this is something that looks very familiar to us and something that's very easy to solve. If I have x minus 1 equals 12, to isolate x, I just add 1 to both sides of the equation. I just think about this as adding negative 1 to x or subtracting 1 away. So do the opposite operation. What is the opposite of adding negative 1? Well, that's adding positive 1. So x minus 1 plus 1 equals 12. And again, because I did it over here, I've got to do it over here. Right? It's got to be a balance. So this is going to go away. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So this will be x equals, over here, 12 plus 1 is 13. There's my solution, x equals 13. So now let's check this in the original equation. So again, x equals 13. I'm going to have 5 halves times 13 minus 1 equals 3 halves times 13 plus 12. All right, so 5 times 13 is 65 halves minus, and then I'm going to write this 1 as 2 over 2. So I can have a common denominator with 65 halves. And this equals 3 halves times 13. 3 times 13 is 39 over 2 plus. And then I'm going to write 12 as 24 over 2. So I can have a common denominator with 39 halves. All right, so over here, 65 minus 2 is 63. And that's over 2. And over here, 39 plus 24 is going to be 63 as well. And then over 2. So 63 halves equals 63 halves. So yeah, we got the correct solution. We could say that x is equal to 13. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on the addition property of equality. 
All right, so we want to solve each equation and check the result. So we start out with x minus 72 equals negative 24. So again, our goal is to isolate the variable on one side of the equation. So I want to isolate x, isolate x. And I realize that I have 72 that's being subtracted away. Or you can think about this as I'm adding negative 72 to x. So what I want to do is I want to add the opposite of negative 72, which is positive 72, to the left side of the equation because negative 72 and positive 72 will become 0, and x plus 0 would be just x. But to make this legal, I use something called the addition property of equality. It tells me I can add anything to both sides of the equation without changing the solution. So I can't just add it to one side. I have to add it to both. So I'm going to have x minus 72 plus 72 equals negative 24 plus 72. So what I did was I added 72 to both sides of the equation. Now when I go to simplify on the left, negative 72 plus 72 or minus 72 plus 72, however you want to think about that, that becomes 0. So that's gone. I would basically have x plus 0, which is just x. Over on the right-hand side, now I just add negative 24 plus 72. That's going to give me 48. So x equals 48 is my solution. And again, we always want to check and make sure we got the right answer. So let me erase all this. And to check, we just plug in for x. We just plug 48 in. And let's see what we get. So 48 minus 72 equals negative 24. Yeah, that's correct. 48 minus 72 is negative 24. So negative 24 equals negative 24. And so yes, x equals 48 is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. And again, it's one that looks kind of complicated when you start, but really it's not. Just need to do a little bit of rearranging. So we have 1 eighth y minus 3 equals 5 minus 7 eighths y. Now the first thing you want to do if you see something like this just move all the variable terms to one side. And when I say variable terms, I mean terms that have a variable involved. So this has a y, this has a y, so these are variable terms. So it's going to be easier to move everything to the left. And to do that, I'm just going to add 7 eighths y to both sides. The reason for that is, look, I'm subtracting it away here. If I add it to the right-hand side, so if I have 1 eighth y minus 3, equals 5 minus 7 eighths y. If I add it over here, what's going to happen is it's going to disappear. Negative 7 eighths y plus 7 eighths y is going to be 0. So that's gone now. But to make it legal, I have to also add 7 eighths y to the left side. Remember, I can add or subtract anything as long as I do it to both sides of the equation to maintain that balance. So essentially over here, I have 1 eighth y, and then I'm going to move this over and put plus 7 eighths y minus 3 equals 5. So now we can kind of see if we combine like terms here, the y comes along for the ride, and I'm just adding 1 eighth plus 7 eighths, that's 8 eighths or just 1. So 1 y is the same as just y, so I have y minus 3 equals 5. And this is very easy to solve. Now it's in a format that looks familiar to us, and I just want to add 3 to both sides to solve the equation, right? Because I'm subtracting away 3 from y. Do the opposite. y minus 3 plus 3 equals 5 plus 3. So on this side, this is going to go away. I'll just have y. On this side, 5 plus 3 is 8. And so y equals 8 is the solution. Now let's erase everything and just check. You always want to make sure that you check in your original equation in case you made a mistake when you were simplifying. So again, our solution that we came up with was y equals 8. So we'd have 1 eighth times 8, just plugging that in for y, minus 3 equals 5 minus 7 eighths times 8. Now, this 8 here would cancel with this 8 there. Think about cross-canceling with fractions. So I'm really just left with a 1 minus 3 over here, and that's equal to, we have 5 minus 7 eighths times 8. This 8 would cancel with this 8, just like it did over there. And what I'm going to have is 5 minus 7. So 5 minus 7. So 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and that should be equal to 5 minus 7, which is also negative 2. So yeah, this works out. 
Negative two equals negative two, so y equals eight is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One practice set number four. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on the multiplication property of equality. All right, so we're gonna start out with x over 13 equals negative six. So remember that the absolute goal is to isolate your variable. So here's your variable here, and you want to isolate this guy. So what am I gonna do? We always wanna think about undoing what's being done to x. Right now I have x that's divided by 13. So how do I undo that? What's the opposite operation of division? It's multiplication. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by 13. I'm gonna multiply over here by 13, and I'm gonna multiply over here by 13. And remember, the multiplication property of equality allows me to do that. I can multiply both sides of the equation by the same non-zero number, and the solution will remain the same. So when I do this, 13 divided by 13 is one, and then one times x is just x. So the left side is now just x, I've isolated the variable. On the right side, I have negative six times 13. Negative times positive is negative, six times 13 is 78. So I'm gonna have x equals negative 78. Now we always wanna go back and check to make sure that we got the right answer. And the way we do that, we plug a negative 78 in for x in the original equation. So I'd have negative 78 divided by 13 equals negative six. And then we just simplify. What is negative 78 divided by 13? Well, that is negative six. So I'd have negative six equals negative six. This x equals negative 78 is the correct solution. All right, so for the next one, we have negative four b equals eight. And again, we're trying to isolate the variable. We're trying to isolate, isolate b. Now, how do I get b by itself? Well, what I can do is I can divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of b, which in this case is negative four. So if I have negative four b equals eight, and I divide this side by negative four, and this side by negative four to make it legal, well, what's gonna happen is negative four divided by negative four is one, right? Divide the same non-zero number by itself, you get one. And so I'd have one times b or just b on the left. And so I've isolated the variable. On the right, I'd have eight divided by negative four, and that's negative two. So I have b equals negative two here. And we just check that. We go back and plug in. We plug in for b in the original equation. So I'd have negative four times negative two, right? Just plug the negative two in for b, and that equals eight. And of course, if I simplify over here, negative four times negative two is eight. So we get eight equals eight. And so my solution here, b equals negative two, is correct. All right, for the next one, we have 11x equals 165. And again, this is a very straightforward problem. If I have a number that's multiplying x, remember, I'm trying to isolate x. So all I need to do is divide both sides of the equation by that coefficient, right? Divide both sides of the equation by 11, and then I'll have x by itself, right? 11 divided by 11 is one, one times x is just x. So 11x equals 165. Again, divide both sides of the equation by 11. That's the coefficient of x. And what you'll see is this is gonna cancel with this and give me one. And so on the left side, I'm just gonna have x. On the right, what is 165 divided by 11? Well, that's something you might wanna punch into your calculator. I happen to know already that it's 15. So x equals 15. All right, so let's go back and check. And I'm just gonna plug a 15 in here. So 11 times 15 equals 165. And yeah, that's true. If I kind of mentally do this, I can think about 11 as 10 plus one, right? So kind of think about 10 times 15, that's 150. One times 15 is 15. Add 150 and 15, you'll get 165. So 165 equals 165. And so we know that our solution here, x equals 15 is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 11 x equals 99. So again, I want to isolate, I want to isolate my variable x. Now, if I have a number that's multiplying x, what I need to do is divide both sides of the equation by that number, right? Divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which in this case is negative 11, 
right? Nice and easy, very straightforward. So let's rewrite the problem. Negative 11x equals 99. And I'm gonna divide both sides of the equation by negative 11. Again, that's the coefficient of x. So this cancels with this and gives me one. So I have one times x or just x. Over here, 99 divided by negative 11 is gonna give me negative nine. So x equals negative nine. Now let's go back and check. And again, in order to do that, I just plug in for x in the original equation. So I'm gonna plug in a negative nine here. So I'd have negative 11 times negative nine equals 99. Yeah, negative times negative is positive. 11 times nine is 99. So 99 equals 99. And we could say that our solution here, x equals negative nine is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have y over three equals negative 10. So in the lesson, I kind of showed you a few different ways to think about this. You can immediately say, okay, well, I have division here. I'm trying to isolate y trying to isolate the variable y. And if I'm taking y and I'm dividing by three, kind of to undo division, I multiply, right? If I'm dividing y by three, to kind of undo that, I'd multiply by three. I need to always think about the opposite operation. The opposite of division is multiplication. So I can multiply by three. And if I do it over here, I have to do it over here as well. So this will cancel with this. And I'll have just y on the left. On the right, I'll have negative 10 times three or negative 30, so that's my solution. Another way to think about this is to rewrite y over three as one third y, and this is equal to negative 10. Now, it's very straightforward, because all I'm gonna do is multiply by the reciprocal of one third, right? So I'm gonna multiply here by three over one, over here by three over one. Remember, three over one is just three. It's what I just did a second ago. So this will cancel, become one, and I'll have y is equal to, again, negative 10 times three, is negative 30. So either way you wanna do that, y equals negative 30. Now let's plug in and see if we got the right answer. So we'll have negative 30, plugging that in for y, over three equals negative 10. So negative divided by positive is negative, 30 divided by three is 10. So I'd have negative 10 equals negative 10. So yeah, this checks out as the correct solution. y equals negative 30. All right, let's look at one final problem. Again, we have x over four equals negative seven. So I'm dividing x, my variable, by four. Again, I'm trying to isolate this guy. So I'm trying to undo what's being done to it. So if I'm dividing x by four in order to undo the division, I do the opposite. The opposite of division is multiplication. The opposite of multiplication is division. The opposite of addition is subtraction, you know, so on and so forth. So if I'm dividing x by four, in order to get x by itself, I wanna multiply by four. So x divided by four equals negative seven. I want to multiply by four, and I gotta do it to this side as well to make it legal, right? Do it to this side, gotta do it to this side. So this cancels with this and becomes one, and I just have x there, and then over here on this side, negative seven times four is negative 28. So I have x equals negative 28. And again, you can think about this, whenever you see a problem set up this way, if you see a variable over a number, you could really just kind of split that up and say, okay, well, this is one fourth times x equals negative seven, if that makes you feel more comfortable. And then just multiply by the reciprocal. The reciprocal of one fourth is four over one. So do that over here as well. This cancels and you'll have x, which is what we have here. And then this is equal to over here, negative seven times four over one, or negative seven times just four is negative 28. All right, so we get the same thing either way. All right, so let's check this real quick. I'm gonna plug in a negative 28 for x there. So I'll have negative 28 over four equals negative seven. And yeah, that's true. Negative 28 divided by four, negative divided by positive is negative. 28 divided by four is seven. So you get negative seven equals negative seven. So this is correct, x equals negative 28. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section one on the multiplication property of equality. All right, so let's take a look at our first problem. We have x over five equals negative three. So what we wanna do when we're solving an equation, our goal is always to isolate the variable. So we want to isolate 
we want to isolate x there. Let me just rewrite this here. We have x divided by 5, or x over 5, equals negative 3. So what can I do to get x by itself? Well, remember, if I multiply a number times its reciprocal, I end up with 1. So if I want to think about x over 5 as 1 fifth times x, and then just copy the rest, equals negative 3, really all I need to do here is multiply this side of the equation by 5 over 1, which is the reciprocal of 1 fifth, in order to get x by itself. Right? This is going to cancel out completely and become 1. 1 times x is just x. So this over here is just going to be x. Now, to make this legal, I have to do it to both sides of the equation. So I'm going to also multiply negative 3 by 5 over 1, or just 5. So negative 3 times 5 is going to give me negative 15. So my answer here is that x equals negative 15. But in this case, there's kind of a shortcut. Right? We didn't need to go through all that. If I'm dividing, right? if I have x divided by 5 equals negative 3, really I just need to think about, forget about reciprocals for a second, what is the opposite of division? Well, it's multiplication. So if I'm dividing x by 5, really to get x by itself, I just need to do the opposite of that and multiply by 5. So multiply by 5, do the same thing to the other side of the equation so it's legal. This cancels with this. And so I have x equals negative 15, right, either way. Now, in order to check this, we always want to check our work. We plug a negative 15 in for x in the original equation. So I'd have negative 15 divided by 5 equals negative 3. And so negative divided by positive is negative. 15 divided by 5 is 3, so I'd have negative 3 equals negative 3. And so yes, x equals negative 15 is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at negative 20 equals 2x. So for this type of problem, it's very straightforward. Again, we want to isolate x. So we want to isolate this guy. And how do we do that? Well, since 2 is multiplying x, again, just think about the opposite operation. The opposite of multiplication is division. So if I divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is 2, x is going to be by itself. Right, because 2 divided by 2 is 1, 1 times x is just x. So over here, I'd have negative 20 divided by 2, that's negative 10. Over here, I'd have 1x or just x. So I have negative 10 equals x, and of course, we can flip that around and say x equals negative 10. Right? You can always flip the order, it doesn't really matter. So this is our answer here, and if we want to check, we can just plug a negative 10 in for x and say, okay, negative 20 is equal to 2 times negative 10. Negative 20 is equal to 2 times negative 10 is negative 20. So yes, we have the correct solution here. X equals negative 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on the multiplication property of equality. All right, let's start out with negative 7x equals 0. So again, the goal here is to isolate the variable. In this case, that variable is x. So I want to isolate this. And in order to do that, I see that I have this negative 7 that is multiplying x, right? Negative 7 is the coefficient of x. So to get x by itself, to isolate it, I just divide both sides of the equation by negative 7, right? The coefficient of x. You're always thinking about this in terms of what is the opposite operation. So in this case, I'm multiplying negative 7 times x. So I want to divide to get x by itself. If I was dividing, I'd want to multiply to get x by itself. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. So negative 7x equals 0. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 7. Remember, I'm allowed to divide 0 by something. I'm just not allowed to divide by 0, right? So as long as I'm not dividing by 0, I'm OK. 0 divided by a number other than 0 is always 0. So this will cancel with this and give me 1. So I'll have x equals 0 divided by negative 7 is just 0. So x equals 0 is our solution. And let's go back and check that. If I plug in a 0 here for x, I'd have negative 7 times 0 equals 0. And yeah, that's true. 0 times any number is 0, so this would be 0 equals 0. And our solution is correct. x equals 0. All right. Now we have x divided by 12, or x over 12, equals 11. 
So again, I want to isolate my variable x. I want to isolate. And I'm always thinking about doing the opposite operation. So if x is divided by 12, I want to multiply by 12, right? What's the opposite of division? It's multiplication. So I'm dividing x by 12. So I want to multiply by 12. And to make that legal, I've got to do it to both sides of the equation. Right? Whatever I do to one, I've got to do to the other. So this will cancel with this, and x will be by itself. Over here, 11 times 12 is going to give me 132. So x here is going to equal 132. And again, if you want to check, plug in, okay, plug in for x in the original equation. You'd have 132 divided by 12 equals 11. 132 divided by 12 is 11. So you'd have 11 equals 11. And so this checks out. X equals 132 is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on the multiplication property of equality. So we're going to start out today with z over 15 equals negative 9. So our goal is to isolate, is to isolate our variable z. And in order to do that, if I'm dividing z by 15, I want to do the reverse, right? The reverse of division is multiplication. So I'm going to take z over 15 equals negative 9, and I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 15. All right? 15 over 15 is 1, so on the left I just have z. Now because I did it to the left, I've got to do it to the right, so I'm going to also multiply by 15 over here. Negative 9 times 15, negative times positive is negative, 9 times 15 is 135. So this would be negative 135 over here, and that's going to be my solution. z equals negative 135. And of course, we can always check this. So we'll have negative 135 divided by 15 equals negative 9. And of course, that's true, right? Negative divided by positive is negative. 135 divided by 15 is 9. So this would be negative 9 equals negative 9. And so this solution here, z equals negative 135, is correct. All right, let's take a look at negative 2x equals 30. So again, I'm trying to isolate my variable x. So I'm trying to isolate the variable. If I have negative 2 that's multiplying it, in order to get rid of that negative 2, I can just divide by negative 2, right? Negative 2 divided by negative 2 was 1. 1 times x is just x. But to make this legal, I've got to do it to both sides of the equation. That's the key. So I'm going to divide this side by negative 2 and also this side by negative 2. And this is going to cancel, and I'll just have a 1 here times x, which is just going to be 1x or x. And over here, 30 divided by negative 2 is negative 15. So that's going to be my solution, x equals negative 15. And again, we always want to check to make sure we got the right answer. So I'm going to plug a negative 15 in there for x. So I'd have negative 2 times negative 15 equals 30. So now simplifying on the left, negative 2 times negative 15 is 30. So I'd have 30 equals 30. And yeah, that's true. So this x equals negative 15 is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on the multiplication property of equality. All right, so we're going to take a look at negative 8x equals 72. So the first thing I want to do here is realize that, okay, my goal when I'm solving an equation is to isolate to isolate the variable on one side of the equation. So how am I going to do that? Well, if I have negative 8 that's multiplying x, I want to always think about doing kind of the opposite operation to get x by itself. So the opposite of multiplication is division. So I want to divide both sides of the equation here by the coefficient of x, right? That's what's multiplying x. So if I divide both sides by that negative 8, what's going to happen is this will cancel with this, right? Negative 8 divided by negative 8 is 1. Any non-zero number over itself is 1. So I'll have 1 times x, which is just x. And then 72 divided by negative 8 is negative 9. So I have x equals negative 9 as my solution. So now I always want to check to make sure I got the right answer. And I'm just going to plug in for x to do that. So I'm going to plug in a negative 9 here. So I'll have negative 8 times negative 9 equals 72. Negative 8 times negative 9 is 72, so 72 equals 72, and so we have the correct solution. x equals negative 9. All right, let's take a look at another one. 
we have 7x minus 5x equals 12. So when we first look at this, it might look like something we can't solve yet. But really, let's think about what if we simplify the left-hand side? I see that 7x and 5x are like terms, and so it's very easy to simplify, right? 7 minus 5 is 2. Bring the variable along for the ride. This would be 2x. So 2x equals 12. And now it's something we know how to solve, right? We divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is 2. And we have x by itself, so we have x is equal to 6, and that is our solution. Now, again, we want to check to make sure we got the right answer. So we're going to plug in a 6 here and here. So I'll have 7 times 6 minus 5 times 6 equals 12. 7 times 6 is, of course, 42. Minus 5 times 6, that's 30, equals 12. And 42 minus 30 is 12, so you'll have 12 equals 12. And so yeah, we have the correct solution here, x equals 6. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5, on the multiplication property of equality. All right, let's take a look at our first problem. We have p over 8 equals 14. Remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to always isolate the variable. So I'm trying to isolate the variable p. So how do I do that? Well, what's being done to p? p is divided by 8. So the opposite operation is what we look to. If we're dividing, we want to look to multiplication. If we're multiplying, we want to look to division. If we're adding, we want to look to subtraction. If we're subtracting, we want to look to addition. So in this case, we have p. We're dividing by 8. So to kind of undo that, I'm going to multiply by 8 on both sides. So if I have p divided by 8 equals 14, I just multiply both sides by 8. And what's going to happen is this is going to cancel with this and give me 1. And on the left side, I just now have p, right? 1p or just p. On the right side, I have 14 times 8, which you can kind of do quickly. 8 times 10 is 80. 8 times 4 is 32. So if I add 80 and 32, that's 112. So p equals 112. So let's check this. We're going to plug in for p in the original equation. So 112 divided by 8 equals 14. And of course it does. 112 divided by 8 is 14. So 14 equals 14. And so we can say that p equals 112 is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at one that looks a little hard, but really it's not. We have 7 thirds x minus 6 thirds x equals 15. So the first thing I'm going to do if I see something like this on a test, I know that I can't solve something like this right now, right, with the, the limited knowledge I've given you. So there must be some sort of trick to it. And you're going to get that a lot on homework or tests. Can't do it yet, but what's there must be some trick here. Well, really all you need to do is just look at this side and simplify. I have the same denominator, so let's just look at the numerators. What is... 7x minus 6x. Well, I can do that. They're like terms. 7 minus 6 is 1. So really, I would just have 1x or just x. So I can write this as 1 third, right? Remember, the denominator was 3, so it stays the same, times x, or I could write it as x over 3. doesn't really matter. So x over 3 equals 15. And so when I have division involved, if I have x divided by 3, to get x by itself, to isolate x, I want to multiply by 3. So I'd multiply this side by 3, and then multiply this side by 3. This will cancel with this and give me 1. And so on the left side, I'd have x. On the right side, 15 times 3 is 45. So x equals 45. Now, it's a little bit more work to check it, but let's go ahead and do that. And I just want to warn you, I want you always to check your answer in your original equation. Don't check it in the simplified one because you might have made a mistake, right, when you're simplifying. So always take it back into the original equation. So 7 times 45 over 3 minus 6 times 45 over 3 equals 15. So this will cancel with this and give me 15. 7 times 15 is 105, so that gives me 105 minus this will cancel with this and again give me 15. 6 times 15 is 90. So I have 105 minus 90 equals 15. And yeah, that's true. That's going to become 15 equals 15. So our solution here, that x equals 45, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 5. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving linear equations in one variable.
All right, so let's take a look at the first problem. We have four minus two V plus three V equals one. So kind of what I taught you in the lesson was a four step procedure to solve any linear equation in one variable. So the first thing we always wanna do is we wanna simplify each side completely. So over here, let me just kind of rewrite this. We have four minus two V plus three V equals one. I can't do anything to the right side, just a single number. On the left side though, I can combine like terms, right? I have negative two V plus three V, that's just V. So we'd have four plus V on the left and then equals one on the right. Now, kind of the next thing that I wanna do here, this is a more simple problem than we kind of looked at in the lesson. I wanna get V by itself. And right now, what's being done to V, I'm adding four. So you think about the opposite operation all the time when you're trying to isolate something. So if I'm adding four, I wanna do the opposite operation, which is to subtract four, right? So if I subtract four from this side and I subtract four from this side, it clears four from this side of the equation. And so I just have a zero there. Zero plus V is just V. So I've isolated the variable. And then over here, one minus four is gonna give me negative three. So now I've isolated the variable and I have my solution, V equals negative three. Now we always wanna plug our solution back in for the variable and check. All right, we want the same value on the left and the right side. So we would have four minus two times, we're putting in a negative three there, plus three times, put in a negative three there, equals one. So multiplication is gonna be first here, four minus, Two times negative three is negative six, or I could think about this as negative two times negative three, and that's gonna give me positive six. Then I have plus three times negative three, that's negative nine. This equals one. So now on the left, I just have four plus six, which is 10, then 10 plus negative nine, which is one. So I have one equals one. Same value on each side. So yes, our solution V equals negative three is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative five times the quantity, three X plus three equals negative 105. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is use our distributive property to remove our parentheses, right? Again, we're trying to simplify each side. And I really can't do anything with it in this state, so I have to remove the parentheses to start. So negative five times three X would be negative 15 X. Then negative five times three would be minus 15 or plus negative 15, however you wanna think about that. And this equals negative 105. All right, so I want to isolate my variable term and that's negative 15 X right now. And so I always wanna think about, okay, if I wanna isolate the variable term, what do I do? Well, I'm subtracting away 15. So that means I wanna do the opposite of that and add 15, so plus 15 and I've got to do it to both sides of the equation to make it legal, that's gone. So now I've isolated the variable term, so that's negative 15x, and this equals negative 105 plus 15 would be negative 90. And now I have one more step to solve the equation. I want to isolate the variable. First I isolated the variable term, now I'm going to isolate the variable itself. And in order to do that, again, I'm thinking about the opposite operation. Right now I have negative 15, that is the coefficient of X, right? It is multiplying X. And so to kind of get rid of it, I divide by negative 15. The same non-zero number divided by itself is always one. So negative 15 divided by negative 15 is one. One times X is just X. But in order to make this legal, okay? In order to make this legal, I need to do it to both sides of the equation. So I also need to divide the right side by negative 15 as well. Negative 90 divided by negative 15 is going to give me positive six. So I have X equals six here. All right, so let's go ahead and erase everything. And we're going to check. So we're gonna have negative five times this quantity. We have three times, plug in a six for X, plus three, close the parentheses, equals negative 105. So inside parentheses, three times six is 18, then 18 plus three would be 21. So I'd have negative five times 21 equals negative 105. So negative five times 21 is negative 105. So equals negative 105. We 
We have the same number on both sides of the equation, and so our solution, x equals 6, is correct. All right, now we have negative 162 equals negative 6 times the quantity, negative 1 plus 4x. Okay, so on the left, I can't really do anything to simplify, just negative 162. On the right, I'm going to use my distributive property to remove the parentheses. Negative 6 times negative 1 is 6. Then I have negative 6 times 4x. That's going to be minus 24x. All right. So now I'm looking to isolate the variable term, right? So before I can isolate the variable itself, I need to just isolate the variable term. And I'm just going to think about that as negative 24x. That's what I want to isolate. And so right now I can just think about, okay, 6 is being added to that, right? I can just have 6 out in front. Really, I could write plus 6 over here. It's the same thing if you want to kind of move it around to mentally understand that 6 is being added to that. So if 6 is being added to that, to get rid of it, I need to subtract 6, right? Or I need to add negative 6. So I subtract 6 over here, and I subtract 6 over here. This is going to cancel out. That's just 0 now. And over here, negative 162 minus 6 is negative 168. So this equals negative 24 x and now we have almost finished right we have one more step we want to isolate the variable itself and again if i'm multiplying negative 24 by x now i want to divide by negative 24 right i want to have negative 24 cancel with negative 24 right if i divide the same non-zero number by itself it cancels right it becomes one so i'm just left with x over here and then to make it legal I need to divide by negative 24 over here. So negative 168 divided by negative 24 would give me 7. And so I'm going to have 7 is equal to x. Now, as I told you in the lesson, a lot of people like their variable on the left. So 7 equals x is the same as if I wrote x equals 7. You can flip that around if you're more comfortable with it. It does not matter. All right, let's erase everything and check. All right, so we have negative... 162 is equal to negative 6 times this quantity, negative 1 plus 4 times, and I'm going to plug in a 7 there, and then close that. All right. So we have negative 162 equals, we have negative 6 times, inside the parentheses we do 4 times 7 first, that's 28, and then we add negative 1, that's 27. So you'd have negative 6 times 27. And so negative 6 times 27 is negative 162. So you'd have negative 162 is equal to negative 162. So each side is the same value, right? Negative 162. And so our solution, x equals 7, is correct. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. We have negative 6 times the quantity, 11x minus 12. This is equal to negative 4x minus 11 times the quantity, x plus 12. All right, so again, we're going to try to simplify each side. And we're going to remove parentheses over here on the left. So negative 6 times 11x is negative 66x. Negative 6 times negative 12 is going to be positive. 6 times 12 is 72. So this equals. Now over here I have negative 4x. And then I have minus 11 times this quantity x plus 12. Again, I'm going to use my distributive property. And I'm going to think about this minus 11 as plus negative 11. Right? So I'm just going to say, okay... Negative 11 times x is negative 11x, so minus 11x. And then negative 11 times 12 is going to be negative 132, so minus 132. All right, so on the left-hand side, we have negative 66x plus 72. And this equals, on the right-hand side, I have negative 4x minus 11x. That's negative 15x, and this is minus 132. All right, now I want my variable term on one side of the equation. I can't isolate the variable until I can isolate the variable term, okay? And right now, if you look at it, I have this negative 15x and I have negative 66x. This is where a lot of students get confused. They're like, well, what do I do? I'm used to just having it on one side of the equation. Well, you have to just move one or the other. So I can choose to move this one over here or I can move this one over here. And I always like the variable on the left, and a lot of other people do. So if I have a variable term on the right and on the left, 
I'm going to take the one from the right and I'm going to make it disappear. So how do I do that? So if I add positive 15x to both sides of the equation, what's going to happen is negative 15x plus 15x, that's zero. So this has gone from this side of the equation. All I have left on the right side is negative 132. On the left side, I now have negative 66x plus 15x, which is going to give me negative 51x. So negative 51x plus 72. So now this looks like something we can solve, right? Because I have a variable term on one side of the equation. I have a number that's being added to it, but that's no big deal, right? So in order to now isolate the variable term, I can get rid of this, right? Again, to get rid of something, if I'm adding 72, just subtract 72 away from both sides of the equation. So minus 72, minus 72, right? It's just that simple. That's gone from over here. And we'll have negative 51x on the left. On the right, negative 132 minus 72 would be negative 204. Okay. So now I want to isolate my variable x. Okay, that's always the goal. But again, you got to do this in steps. Now, if I'm taking negative 51 and I'm multiplying it by x, right, that's what the coefficient is. Negative 51x is negative 51 times x. The opposite of multiplication is division. So in order to kind of get rid of this, I divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, this negative 51. So this will cancel with this and become 1. And now x is by itself. On the right-hand side, negative 204 divided by negative 51 is going to give me 4. So x equals 4 is my solution. Now, let's erase everything and we'll go back up to the top and check our answer. All right, so we'll have negative 6 times, inside of parentheses here, 11 times 4 minus 12, and then equals negative 4 times. We're going to plug in a 4 there, minus 11 times. We're going to plug in a 4 for x plus 12. All right, so inside the parentheses on the left, 11 times 4 is 44. 44 minus 12 is 32. So I'd have negative 6 times 32 over here. On the right, I work inside the parentheses, 4 plus 12 is 16. So I'd have negative 11 times 16, and that's going to give me negative 176. So I'd have negative 4 times 4, and then minus 176. Okay. So now on the left, negative 6 times 32 is negative 192. On the right, negative 4 times 4 is negative 16, and then minus 176. And so negative 16 minus 176 is going to give me negative 192. So I have the same value on each side of the equation, negative 192. And so our answer, x equals 4, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on solving linear equations in one variable. All right, so let's take a look at negative 17 equals negative 5n minus 1 minus 1. So the first thing we always want to do when we tackle a linear equation in one variable, we want to simplify each side separately. So on the left side, I just have negative 17. So I can't really do anything with that, so I'll just kind of rewrite it. Then equals on the right side, if I look through here, I have basically negative 1 minus 1. So negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So I can rewrite this side as negative 5n minus 2. Now I can't really do anything else to simplify either side. So now what I'm going to do is concentrate on getting my variable term on one side of the equation and just a number on the other. So right now if I look, I have negative 5n on the right side, but I have this minus 2 here, and that's stopping me from having my variable term isolate. So what I've got to do is get rid of this minus 2. And so how we do that is we add 2 to both sides of the equation. Right? If I'm subtracting away 2, when I add 2, negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So this will cancel itself out. And so what I'm left with on the left-hand side is negative 17 plus 2, which is negative 15. And on the right-hand side, just negative 5n, right? Because if we're adding 0, negative 5n plus 0 is just negative 5n. Now, 
kind of the final step here is to just isolate the variable itself. So to isolate n. And to do that, we're going to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of n, which is negative 5. Right? If I divide negative 5 by negative 5, I'm going to get 1. And 1 times n is just n. So I do that over here. Negative 15 divided by negative 5 is 3. So I'll have 3 equals n. Or, of course, you can flip that around and say n equals 3. Now, of course, we can check this by plugging a 3n for n in the original equation. So we're going to have negative 17 equals negative 5 times, I'm going to plug in a 3 for n, minus 1 minus 1. So the negative 17 equals negative 5 times 3 is negative 15, and then minus 1 minus 1. And so negative 17 equals negative 15 minus 1 is negative 16, then minus another 1 is negative 17. So we have negative 17 equals negative 17, the same value or the same numbers on each side of the equation. And so we know that our answer here, n equals 3, is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative b plus 5b equals negative 16. So again, simplify each side separately. So I can't do anything on the right with negative 16, but on the left I can combine like terms, right? Negative b and 5b are like terms, so I can add them. Negative b plus 5b would be 4b. So I get 4b equals negative 16. Now, I just have a variable term over here and a number over here. So the only thing I need to do at this point is just isolate the variable. Right, so isolate b, and in order to do that, since I'm multiplying 4 times b, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 4. Right, so that's going to put b by itself. 4 divided by 4 is 1, and so I'm going to end up with b equals negative 16 divided by 4 is negative 4. So my solution here is b equals negative 4. And again, we want to check, make sure that we got the right answer. And so I'm going to plug in a negative 4 everywhere I see a b. So I have minus be very, very careful here. I have a minus out in front, and then I'm plugging in a negative 4 for b. So I'm plugging in a negative 4 here. So I'm going to have a minus a negative 4. Very important that you just don't throw in a negative 4 there. You have a minus sign or a negative sign out in front, so you have to have minus a negative 4. Then plus 5 times negative 4 equals negative 16. So I'm going to start out with 5 times negative 4, that's negative 20. Minus a negative is plus a positive, so this is 4. So you have 4 minus 20, that is negative 16, and that equals negative 16. Right? So the same value on each side of the equation. Again, b equals negative 4 is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on solving linear equations in one variable. All right, so we're going to start out with 6 times the quantity z plus 7 equals 90. So the first thing we want to do here is simplify each side completely. On the left side, I'm going to do that by using my distributive property to remove the parentheses. So I'm going to multiply 6 times z. That's going to give me 6z. Then plus, I'm going to multiply 6 times 7. That's going to give me 42. And then this equals 90. Now there's really nothing else I can do to simplify on either side. So now what I want to do is isolate my variable term on one side of the equation. Now notice that I didn't say isolate the variable yet. I need to isolate the variable term before I can isolate the variable itself. So this is the variable term, 6z. So how do I get that by itself? Well, I'm adding 42 to 6z. So what's the opposite of adding 42? It's subtracting 42 away or adding negative 42. So I'm going to subtract 42 away from both sides. And I'm going to cancel this. And so 6z is going to be equal to 90 minus 42, which is going to give me 48. All right, so now we have a variable term equals a number. When we get to this stage, we're looking at, okay, how can I isolate my variable now? In this case, I have multiplication, right? I have six times this variable z. So when you look at a coefficient, again, always think about that, the fact that it's multiplication, and to undo multiplication, you do division. So if I divide this side by 6, the coefficient of z, 6 divided by 6 is 1, and 1 times z is just z. So I've isolated the variable. But because I did it to this side over here, I've got to also do it over here. So 48 divided by 6 is going to give me 8. So z equals 8 is my solution. 
All right, so let's plug in for our variable and check to make sure that we got the right answer. So I am going to plug in an eight here. And that's gonna give me six times this quantity, eight plus seven, and this equals 90. Okay, so eight plus seven is 15, so I'd have six times 15 equals 90, and six times 15 does equal 90. So we get 90 equals 90, and so z equals eight is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have eight times the quantity five y plus six is equal to 168. All right, so I wanna use my distributive property here to remove the parentheses. So we'll have eight times five y, that's gonna give me 40 y then plus eight times six, that's gonna give me 48, and this equals 168. Again, I wanna always isolate my variable, okay? That's my end goal. But in order to do that, I first gotta have the variable term isolated. So right here I have this 40y, okay? I've gotta have that isolated first. So in order to do that, I need to get rid of this plus 48. Again, if I'm adding 48 to something, and I want that to disappear, do the opposite. So subtract 48, so minus 48, and just do it to both sides so that it's legal. So that's gonna go away. And now my variable term, which is 40y, is isolated. And so now over here, 168 minus 48 is gonna give me 120. So it's very simple now. I just wanna isolate the variable y, and again, I want you to understand, the first thing we have to do is isolate the variable term. So that's this whole thing, right? That's this whole thing. Once I have that on one side of the equation, once I have that set equal to a number, well then it's easy, right? I have 40 times y, and to get rid of 40, I just divide by 40. And to make it legal, I do it to both sides of the equation. So this cancels with this and gives me one. So I just have y, and that's gonna be equal to 120 divided by 40 is 30. So y equals three is our solution. And let's go back and plug into the equation. Plug that in there. So we have eight times the quantity, five times three plus six, and then close that equals 168. All right, so five times three is 15. So we're gonna have eight times this quantity, 15 plus six, and this equals 168. 15 plus six is going to give me 21. So I'll have eight times 21 equals 168. And that's true. Eight times 21 is 168. So you get 168 equals 168. And so y equals three is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Three on solving linear equations in one variable. All right, so we have six plus eight times the quantity three plus four x equals two times the quantity 12 x plus 11. So the first thing we wanna do is simplify each side completely. So on the left, I'm gonna have six plus, I'm gonna use my distributive property to remove parentheses. So eight times three is 24, plus we have eight times four x, that's 32 x. And this equals, on the right side, again, I'm gonna use my distributive property to remove the parentheses. So two times 12 x is 24 x. And then two times 11 is 22, so plus 22. All right, so what else can I do? Well, on the left, I can combine six and 24. Six plus 24 is 30. So I'm gonna write this as 32 x plus 30. On the right, I have 24 x plus 22. Nothing I can do there. In order to solve an equation, my ultimate goal is to isolate the variable. In order to isolate the variable, I first gotta have the variable term on one side of the equation. So if I look here, I have a variable term here and I have a variable term here. So I have to move one of these to the other side of the equation. I can move this one over here or I can move this one over here. Right, but I don't wanna do both, I just wanna pick one. Now my preference and the preference of a lot of you watching is to have the variable term on the left side of the equation. So that means I wanna move this guy over here. Now how do I do that? Well, what I wanna do is subtract 24x away from both sides of the equation. If I subtract 24x over here 
and subtract 24x over here, this is going to cancel. Right? This will become 0. And on the right side now, I just have 22. On the left, 32x minus 24x is going to be 8x. And then I have plus 30. So now all the variable terms for this equation are on one side. I just have one now. Okay, that's what I want. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think about, okay, I need to isolate the variable term. I'm not going to isolate the variable yet, just the variable term. And if I look, I have this plus 30 over here. That's what's being added to 8x. So to get rid of that, again, very, very simple. If I'm adding 30, I just subtract 30. So minus 30. And then just do it to both sides so that it's legal. That's going to go away. And so 8x is equal to 22 minus 30, and that's going to be negative 8. So now the final step here is to isolate the variable itself. And to do that, I'm just going to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is 8. Right? If I'm multiplying 8 times x, to kind of get rid of the 8, I divide by 8. So divide by 8 over here, divide by 8 over here. This cancels with this and becomes 1. 1 times x is just x. So I've isolated the variable. So then negative 8 divided by 8 is negative 1. So x equals negative 1 is our solution. All right, so let's go back up to the top. We're going to plug in a negative 1 for x, and we're going to see if we have the same number on both sides of the equation. All right, so x equals negative 1. So then 6 plus 8 times the quantity 3 plus 4 times negative 1. Okay, close parentheses, equals 2 times this quantity 12 times negative 1 plus 11. So we have 6 plus 8 times this quantity. I'm going to work inside the parentheses first. So I have 3 plus 4 times negative 1. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. So this will be 8 times negative 1. And this equals, we have 2 times, inside of parentheses here, 12 times negative 1 plus 11. So 12 times negative 1 is negative 12. Negative 12 plus 11 is negative 1. All right, so on the left, we have 8 times negative 1. That will be done first. That's negative 8. So you'd have 6 minus 8 or 6 plus negative 8. That's negative 2. Over here, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So in each case, we have negative 2, right? Negative 2 on the left side, negative 2 on the right side. So then we can say our solution here, x equals negative 1, is correct. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on solving linear equations in one variable. All right, so we have negative 5 times the quantity 5 plus 4r plus 3 equals 6 plus 7 times the quantity negative 5r minus 4. All right, so the first thing we want to do is just simplify each side separately. So over here on the left, I'm going to use my distributive property to remove parentheses. So negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. And then negative 5 times 4r, that's going to give me negative 20r. And we have plus 3 here. This equals, on the right side, we have 6 plus, we have 7 times this quantity. So I'm going to use my distributive property again. So 7 times negative 5r is negative 35r. I'll just erase this and write minus 35r. And then we'll have 7 times negative 4. That's negative 28. Now, I can do some more simplification. On the left, I can combine negative 25 with 3. Negative 25 plus 3 is negative 22. So this would be negative 20r minus 22. On the right, I can combine 6 with negative 28. That's also negative 22. So I'd have negative 35 times r minus 22. I want my variable term on one side of the equation by itself. So if you look here, you have negative 35r and you have negative 20r. Again, you need to move one of these to one side of the equation, but not both. So I'm going to move this over here. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to add 35r to both sides of the equation. So plus 35r plus 35r. This is going to go away. So I don't have a variable term over here anymore. Negative 35r plus 35r is 0. And so what's on the right-hand side is just negative 22. OK, on the left-hand side, negative 20r plus 35r is 15r. 
then minus 22. All right, so we have 15R minus 22 equals negative 22. Now here's a little trick that's gonna save you a lot of time in the future. If you have the same exact thing on both sides of the equation, you can just cancel that out and put plus zero. So in other words, right now I can just put plus zero, plus zero. And I'm gonna show you why right now. If when I look at this, I say, okay, now I wanna isolate the variable term completely. So I want this by itself. So what will I do? I have minus 22 here. So if I'm subtracting away 22, the opposite thing is to add 22. So plus 22 and plus 22. Now, if I'm adding 22 to both sides and both sides have negative 22, the negative 22 is gonna cancel out everywhere. So this is gone. This is plus zero, which we can just leave out. And this is gone. And I'm gonna put plus zero here because you don't wanna just leave it blank. You wanna at least put something. The reason that on this side, we can just write 15R is that if I put plus zero, it's still just 15R. On this side, if I just put equals and don't put anything, you're not, there's no value there, right? So you need to put a zero there so that it makes mathematical sense, right? You can't just leave it blank and say, okay, it equals and there's nothing there. So yes, it's canceled out. And generally when we cancel stuff out, we don't write anything in its place. But in this case, because there's nothing else on this side, we're gonna put a zero. So we have 15R equals zero. So the last step is to isolate the variable completely. And in order to do that, we're just gonna divide both sides of the equation by 15, right? The coefficient of R. This will cancel with this and become one. And then so we'll have R over here. Zero divided by 15 is just zero, right? Remember you can divide zero by a number as long as it's not zero, right? You just can't divide by zero. All right, so R equals zero is our solution. And we wanna check this. All right, so everywhere I see an R, I'm gonna plug in a zero. So I'll have negative five times the quantity five plus four times zero. Close the parentheses, plus three equals six plus seven times the quantity negative five times. Plug in a zero minus four, close the parentheses. Okay, so over here on the left, we have five plus four times zero inside the parentheses. Four times zero is zero, five plus zero is five. So I'd have negative five times five plus three and let me just simplify this side before I even go over here. So negative five times five is negative 25 and the negative 25 plus three is negative 22. Okay, on this side, we have six plus seven times this quantity, negative five times zero minus four. So inside the parentheses, negative five times zero is zero, zero minus four is negative four. So I'd have six plus seven times negative four. Seven times negative four is negative 28 and negative 28 plus six is negative 22. So negative 22 equals negative 22, same number on both sides of the equation, so r equals zero is the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Five on solving linear equations in one variable. All right, let's take a look at our problem here. We have negative eight times the quantity n minus five, then minus two, and this is equal to negative three n minus six, times the quantity n minus five. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is simplify each side separately. So on the left, I'm gonna use my distributive property to remove the parentheses. Negative eight times n is negative eight n. Then negative eight times negative five would be plus 40. Then we'll have minus two. And this is equal to, on the right, I have negative three n. And then I'm, again, gonna use my distributive property to remove parentheses, so I'll have negative six times n, that's negative six n. Then negative six times negative five is positive 30, so plus 30. Now I can still simplify on each side. On the left, I can add 40 and negative two, or 40 minus two, that's 38. So negative eight n plus 38, and this equals, on the right, negative three n minus six n plus 30. I can combine negative three n and negative six n, that's negative nine n. So then plus 30. And what we need to do now is get all the variable terms on one side of the equation. So I can move this one over here or I could move this one over here. It doesn't matter. You're gonna end up with the same answer either way. My preference is always to have my variable term on the left. I know a lot of other people are like that because they first read that in textbooks. That's how they usually present it. But you know, let's do it for the sake of completeness. Let's move this one over here just to do one example. 
So in order to do that, I would add 8n to both sides of the equation. So negative 8n plus 8n is 0. So I'd have 0 plus 38, which is just 38. So the left side is now just 38. On the right side, I'd have negative 9n plus 8n. That's negative n. Let me kind of write that a little better. Just negative n. So then plus 30. Now, the next thing I want to do is isolate the variable term. So I want to isolate this guy. So I'm adding 30 to that. And so again, to get rid of it, just subtract 30. Subtract 30 over here. Subtract 30 over here. This is gone. Now I have negative n plus 0, which is just negative n. And 38 minus 30 is just going to be 8. So I'll have 8 equals negative n. Now, I want to isolate the variable n. And I don't have that. I have negative n. You can really just think about this as negative 1 times n to kind of make it easy on yourself. This negative 1 is multiplying n, so to get n by itself, I just divide by negative 1. Divide by negative 1. And if I divide by negative 1 or if I multiply by negative 1, all I'm doing is I'm just changing the sign of the number. So really, 8 divided by negative 1 is just negative 8. And this equals, this cancels with this and becomes 1, just n. So negative 8 equals n, or you can flip that around and say n equals negative 8. Either way, that's your solution. All right, so let's erase everything and go back and check. All right, so we have n equals negative 8 here. And we want to plug in a negative 8 for n there and there. And also there. Almost missed that one. So we'll have negative 8 times this quantity. I'm plugging in a negative 8 for n, minus 5, and then minus 2. This equals negative 3 times n, so negative 3 times negative 8, minus 6 times the quantity. We have an n there, so negative 8, minus 5, and close parentheses. Okay, so let's start out on the left-hand side here. So we have negative 8 minus 5, that's negative 13. So I would have negative 8 times negative 13 minus 2. Now, negative 8 times negative 13 is positive 104. So I'd have positive 104 minus 2, which is 102. On the right, I have negative 8 minus 5. That's negative 13. So I would have negative 3 times negative 8. And then I'd have minus 6 times negative 13. So negative 3 times negative 8 is 24. Negative 6 times negative 13 is positive 78. So plus 78. And then 24 plus 78 is, in fact, 102. Let me scroll down here. And we could see that 102 is going to be equal to 102. So our solution here, n equals negative 8, is correct. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 6. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving linear equations with fractions or decimals. All right, so we're going to start out by looking at negative 5 thirds x minus 11 6 x equals negative 11 fourths plus 2 x. All right, so the first thing we want to do here is clear the fractions, right? So the way we do that is we multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, or the least common denominator, for all the fractions involved. So how do we do that? Remember, the least common denominator is found by finding the LCM, the least common multiple of all the denominators. So what is the LCM of 3? 4, and 6, right? That's your denominators, 3, 4, and 6. Well, 3 doesn't factor, and 4 factors into 2 times 2, and 6 is 3 times 2, and those are already accounted for. So the LCM would be 3 times 2, which is 6, times 2 again, which is 12. So that's our LCM. It's also our LCD. So the LCD, the least common denominator, is 12. Now, I want to multiply both sides of the equation by 12. In order to do that, I want to use parentheses or brackets to make sure that that 12 gets multiplied by each and every term. So 12 times inside of brackets, I'm going to put negative 5 thirds x minus 11 sixth x, and then equals, I'm going to have brackets over here as well, negative 11 fourths plus 2x, and this is times 12 over here as well. All righty, let's do some multiplication. So we're going to do 12 times negative 5 thirds x, 
12 times negative 5 thirds x minus, we'd have 12 times 12 times 11 6 x equals. Over here, we're going to have 12 times negative 11 fourths. So 12 times negative 11 fourths. And then plus, finally, we're going to have 12 times 2x. 12 times 2x. All right, so 12 will cancel with 3. This will give me 4 here. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. So this is negative 20x minus. Over here, I have this 12 that will cancel with this 6 and give me a 2. 2 times 11 is 22. So this will be minus 22x equals. Over here on the right, 12 will cancel with 4 and give me 3. 3 times negative 11 is negative 33. So negative 33 plus. Over here, 12 times 2x is 24x. All right, so now you can see you have an equation that has no fractions involved. And that was our goal. And now I can just move about solving this equation like I normally would. I'd simplify each side. And so on the left, I can combine like terms. Negative 20x minus 22x is negative 42x. On the right, negative 33 plus 24x cannot be combined. So I'll just write that as negative 33 plus 24x. Now, the next thing I want to do is move all the variable terms to one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract 24x from both sides. So this is gone. And over here, negative 42x minus 24x will be negative 66x. Over here, I'll just have negative 33. Now, my final step is just to isolate the variable. And I'm going to do that by dividing both sides by the coefficient of x, which is negative 66. And I'm going to end up with, this cancels with this and becomes 1, x equals 1 half. You know, if you think about breaking down this fraction here, the negatives cancel, obviously. 3 times 11 over here. And this is 3 times 2 times 11. So this cancels with this, this cancels with this, and you're left with 1 half. All right, so again, x equals 1 half. So negative 5 thirds, negative 5 thirds times 1 half minus 11 6 times 1 half equals negative 11 fourths plus 2 times 1 half. So on the left-hand side, negative 5 thirds times 1 half is negative 5 6, then minus. Over here, 11 times 1 is 11. Over 6 times 2, that's 12. And then equals negative 11 fourths plus, we have 2 times 1 half, that's going to be 1. All right. So let's see what we can do to simplify. Well, I can multiply this by 2 over 2, so I can have a common denominator here. Negative 5 times 2 is going to give me negative 10. So I would have negative 10 minus 11 over the common denominator of 12. And if I go ahead and crank that out, I'm going to have negative 21 over 12. Now, if I want to, I can simplify that because I know that negative 21 is negative 1 times 7 times 3. So let me write this like this. Negative 1 times 7 times 3. And I know 12 is 2 times 2 times 3 or 4 times 3. So let's cancel this with this, and I'm going to end up with negative 7 fourths. Negative 7 fourths. Now over here, I can really write 1 as 4 fourths. 4 fourths. And negative 11 plus 4 is negative 7. So I'll end up with negative 7 fourths, negative 7 fourths. And so we have the same value or the same number on each side of the equation. So we know our solution, which was x equals 1 half, is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 3 fifths y minus 1 fifth equals 199 over 30 plus y minus 1 half plus 3 halves y. So again, if I want to clear the fractions, I want to look at what is the LCD here? So I have 5, 5, 32, and 2. Now, most of you who did well in pre-algebra can tell that the LCD is going to be 30, right? The LCM here for 5, 2, and 30 5 isn't going to factor, 2 isn't going to factor, so 5 times 2 is 10. Now, 30 you could think of as 10 times 3, so really 30 is going to be the LCD. So I would just multiply both sides of the equation by 30. So 30 times, and again, use parentheses or brackets, 3 fifths y minus 1 fifth equals, use brackets, 199 over 30 
plus y minus 1 half plus 3 halves y. Again, this is times 30. All right, so 30 times 3 fifths y. Let's kind of do that in our heads to save a little time. 30 divided by 5 would be 6, right? So if I multiply, really I'm going to cancel the 30 with the 5 again and get a 6. 6 times 3 is 18, so that's 18y. Then minus. 30 times 1 fifth. 30 divided by 5 is 6. 6 times 1 is just 6. So 18y minus 6. Then equals. Now I have 30 that's being multiplied by 199 over 30. This 30 would cancel with this 30. Right, 30 over 30 is 1, so I'm just going to have the 199. Then plus, 30 times y is 30y. Then minus, 30 times 1 half. 30 would cancel with the 2 and give me 15. 15 times 1 is 15. Then plus, 30 times 3 halves y. 30 divided by 2 is 15. 15 times 3 is 45. Then times y. Let's combine any like terms on each side. On the left, I can't do anything. I have 18y minus 6. On the right, I can combine 199 minus 15. That's going to give me 184 plus 30y plus 45y is going to give me 75y. All right, so now I want all my variable terms on one side of the equation, all the numbers on the other. So let's do this in one step. So I'm going to move this over here, and I'm going to move this over here, okay? So in order to get all the variable terms on one side, I'm going to subtract 75y from both sides. Okay, so this is going to go away. So I would just be left with a number here and here. Now, what I can do simultaneously is I can add 6 to both sides of the equation. And that's going to get rid of this to where the variable term, whatever it ends up being, is isolated. Okay, so kind of do two things in one step. So what is 18y minus 75y? That's going to be negative 57y. And this is going to be equal to, what is 184 plus 6? That's 190. So the final step is to isolate the variable completely. And in order to do that, we want to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of y, which is negative 57. So that's going to cancel out. And I'm going to have y equals negative 190 over 57. Now we can simplify this. Let's think about 190. I know that it's 19 times 10. 19 is a prime number, so let's say 19 times 5 times 2. What about 57? Well, 57 is 3 times 19. So 19 times 3. And I can see that I can cancel a 19 with a 19, and I would have 5 times 2 or 10 over 3. Now, don't forget about this negative over here. And so I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to write that this is negative 10 thirds is our answer, right? So y equals negative 10 thirds. All right, so we're going to check this now. And we know that the solution, again, is y equals negative 10 thirds, so I'm just going to plug that in everywhere I see a y. So I have 3 fifths times negative 10 thirds minus 1 fifth equals 199 over 30, then plus y, so I'm going to put minus 10 thirds, then minus 1 half, then plus 3 halves times negative 10 thirds. All right, so on the left side, I can immediately see that this 3 would cancel with this 3 if we were to multiply, and I'd have negative 10 fifths. So I would have negative 10 fifths minus 1 fifth. On the right side, I have 199 over 30 minus 10 thirds minus 1 half plus, if I do this multiplication here, I can see that this 3 would cancel with this 3, and I'd end up with negative 10 over 2, which is 5, but I'm just going to keep it as negative 10 over 2 for right now. All right, so on the left side, I already have a common denominator. I have negative 10 fifths minus 1 fifth. So really that's going to be negative 10 minus 1, which is negative 11, over a common denominator of 5. Over on the right, I need to get a common denominator, and that's going to be 30. So I'm going to leave 199 over 30. Then minus, I'm going to multiply 10 thirds by 10 over 10. So that's going to be 100 over 30. 
Then minus, we have 1 half, so I'm gonna multiply that by 15 over 15. So minus 15 over 30. We have plus negative, so I might as well just say minus. We have 10 halves, so I'm gonna multiply this by 15 over 15. So 10 times 15 is 150, so this would be minus 150 over 30. All right, so if I do 199 minus 100, that's 99. If I subtract away 15, that's 84. And if I subtract away 150, that's negative 66. So I'd have negative 11 fifths is equal to negative 66 over 30. And a lot of you, when you get results like these, you stop and you go, oh, I got the wrong answer. Always make sure your fractions are simplified. So on the left, I can't do anything to simplify this, but on the right, I can. If I think about 66 and 30, forget about the negative for a second. 66 is 6 times 11. 30 you can think about as 6 times 5. So if I cancel a common factor of 6, this would be 11 and this would be 5. So I get negative 11 fifths. So I get negative 11 fifths equals negative 11 fifths, right? The same value on each side. And so our solution is correct. All right, let's take a look at a few with decimals now. And working with an equation with decimals is pretty simple overall. Really, if you have a calculator, it's kind of a waste of time to clear them, but this is taught in your textbook and you might get a, a test on how to do it. So it's important just to go through the basics, understand how you do it and why you would do it if you wanted to, but you don't necessarily have to use it. So the whole premise here is that you can clear decimals by multiplying by the appropriate power of 10. So for example, if I look at this equation, 9.14 minus 1.8x, minus 0.6x equals x minus 1.4, the first thing I'm gonna do is look for what is the largest number of decimal places I have. Here I have two, here I have one, one and one. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by 100, that's the power of 10 with two zeros, it would move this two places to the right and it would clear all the decimals, right? You wouldn't have any decimals involved in this problem anymore. So if I just multiply both sides by 100, again, you got to use parentheses to make sure you get everything. One hundred times nine point one four. When we do that, again, you just move your decimal point two places to the right. So this would be nine hundred fourteen. Then I have minus. I have one hundred times one point eight x. Move the decimal point two places to the right. That's going to be one hundred eighty x. Then minus, I have 100 times 0.6x, that's going to be 60x. Then equals, now I have 100 times x, that's 100x. Then minus, next I have 100 times 1.4, that's 140. So on the left-hand side of the equation, I can simplify. Negative 180x minus 60x is negative 240x. So I'd have 914 minus 240x. On the right side, can't really do anything. I just have 100x minus 140. So again, I want all my variable terms on one side of the equation, and I just want a number on the other. So I can do that in two steps, or I can do it in one. I can say, okay, I'm gonna subtract 100x from both sides of the equation. And so that's gone. And then I could subtract 914 from both sides of the equation also. So that's gone. So I'm going to end up with just a variable term on the left, negative 240x minus 100x is negative 340x. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to end up with just a number, negative 140 minus 914 is negative 1,054. Now for our final step, we're just going to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, so that x can be by itself. So we divide both sides of the equation by negative 340. So this cancels with this, and we'll have x on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, what is negative 1,054 divided by negative 340? Well, negative divided by negative is positive, and you're going to end up with 3.1. Now, the reason I'm using a decimal here is because we're working with decimals. You could go through and reduce this fraction if you wanted to and answer this in fractional form. For the purposes of checking especially, if you were working with decimals, it's easier to stay with decimals. If you were working with fractions, it's easier to stay with fractions, but they're the same number, it's the same value. So this right here is the same thing as this. 
If you wanted to simplify this fraction and use that as your answer, your teacher can't mark it wrong, right? She can't say, oh, well, that's wrong. Unless she specifically said, give me the decimal form of the number, and then it would be wrong. But for all intents and purposes, you can use either one. You can report your answer as a decimal or as a fraction, but it's always going to be easier if you're working with decimals to report a decimal, if you're working with fractions to report a fraction. So let's take 3.1, plug it back in for x in the original equation, and see if we get the right answer. All right, so we have 9.14 minus 1.8 times 3.1, plugging that in for x, minus 0.6 times 3.1 equals 3.1 minus 1.4. So let's do the multiplication first on the left. 1.8 times 3.1 is 5.58. So I'm going to have 9.14 minus 5.58 minus 0.6 times 3.1 is 1.86 equals 3.1 minus 1.4. Okay, so we're going to do 9.14 minus 5.58. That's going to give me 3.56, and then I'm going to subtract away 1.86. So that gives me a final value of 1.7. Over here, 3.1 minus 1.4 is also 1.7. So that tells me that x equals 3.1 is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at another problem. We have 1 minus 2.4y equals 4.66y plus 5.236. I want to multiply both sides of this equation by the power of 10 that clears all the decimals. And to do that, I'm looking at, okay, I have one decimal place here, one, two here, one, two, three here. So I need to multiply by a one followed by one, two, three zeros, right? Because I got to move this three places over to get rid of the decimal point there. So I want the number 1,000, right? A one followed by three zeros. So I'm going to multiply by 1,000 over here and also over here. All right, so 1,000 times 1 is just 1,000 minus 1,000 times 2.4y would be 2,400y. Then 1,000 times 4.66y would be 4,660y plus, now we'd have 1,000 times 5.236, and that would be 5,236. All right, very easy to solve this at this point. All the variable terms are going to go to the left. All the numbers are going to go to the right. So I'm going to subtract 4,660y from both sides of the equation. And I'm going to subtract 1,000 from both sides of the equation. So that's gone, and that's gone. So let's scroll down here. Negative 2,400y minus 4,660y is negative 7,060y. 5,236 minus 1,000 is just 4,236. And then for our final step, we just want to isolate y. So we divide both sides of the equation by negative 7,060. And so this cancels with this, and I just have y. Over here, I'd end up with negative 0.6. So 4,236 divided by negative 7,060 would be negative 0.6. And again, because we're working with decimals, we report our answer as a decimal, right? That's what makes the most sense. If we're working with fractions, we would simplify this and report it as a fraction. All right, so let's check our answer. We're going to have 1 minus 2.4 times negative 0.6 equals 4.66 times negative 0.6 plus 5.236. So over on the left, I have negative 2.4 times negative 0.6. So that's 1.44. So I'd have 1 plus 1.44, and that would be 2.44. So that's nice and simple. On the right, I'd have 4.66 times negative 0.6. That's going to give me negative 2.796, then plus 5.236. And if I sum these, negative 2.796 and 5.236, I'm going to get 2.44. And so yes, my solution of y equals negative 0.6 is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on solving linear equations with fractions or decimals.
All right, so we're going to look at negative 7 fifths x plus 1 equals negative 23 fifteenths plus 2 thirds x plus 2 thirds minus 1 fifth. All right, so what we want to do here is multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD of all the fractions involved. So remember, the LCD is the least common multiple of all the denominators. So the denominator here is 5, 15, 3, 3, and 5. So my LCM, my least common multiple for those numbers, would be 15. All right, so therefore my LCD would be 15. And I'm just going to multiply both sides of the equation by 15. And you can either use brackets or parentheses. I prefer to use big brackets when I'm dealing with fractions. It seems like it's a little easier. So I'm going to multiply 15 times negative 7 fifths times x plus 1. This equals, put some brackets over here, negative 23 fifteenths plus 2 thirds x plus 2 thirds minus 1 fifth. And again, we're multiplying this side by 15 as well. So two things to really remember here. The first thing is that I can multiply or divide both sides of an equation by the same non-zero number and not change the solution. So that's why this is legal. And the second thing is that I'm putting the parentheses or the brackets here to make sure that I multiply that number by each and every term of the equation. It's very, very important. If you forget to put the brackets there, you might not end up multiplying 15 by everything, and you'll end up with the wrong answer. So let's get started here. We're going to use our distributive property to get rid of the brackets. 15 times negative 7 fifths x. So 15 divided by 5 is 3. 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. So this would be negative 21x. And then next, I'd have 15 times 1. So this would be plus 15. Then this equals over here. 15 times negative 23 over 15 is going to be negative 23. Right? 15 would cancel with 15. Then 15 times 2 thirds x. 15 would cancel with 3 and give me 5. 5 times 2 is 10. So this would be plus 10x. Then 15 times 2 thirds. 15 would cancel with 3 and give me 5. 5 times 2 is 10. So plus 10. And then lastly, 15 times negative 1 fifth. So we know that's negative. And then 15 would cancel with 5 and give me 3. 3 times 1 is 3. So we're going to simplify each side now. On the left, I really can't do anything. I just have negative 21x plus 15. On the right, I can see that I can simplify. I can do negative 23 plus 10. That's negative 13. Then subtract away 3. That's negative 16. So this is 10x minus 16. Now, I want all my variable terms on one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract 10x from both sides. That's going to go away. And I'll have negative 21x minus 10x. That's negative 31x. And then over here, I'm going to subtract 15 from both sides of the equation so that this will go away. And I'll have negative 16 minus 15. That's negative 31. So this negative 31x equals negative 31. And my final step is just to isolate the variable completely. So isolate this guy. And to do that, I divide both sides of the equation by negative 31, the coefficient of x. Right. So. This is going to cancel with this. And so I'll have x by itself on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, negative 31 divided by negative 31 is 1. So x equals 1 is our solution. Now, to make sure that we got the right answer, we always want to check. And the way we do that is we plug 1 back in for x in the original equation. So let's take a look at that. All right, so we have x equals 1. And we're going to plug a 1 in everywhere we see x. So we have negative 7 fifths times 1, which would just be negative 7 fifths, plus 1 equals negative 23 over 15, plus 2 thirds times 1, which would just be 2 thirds, plus 2 thirds again, minus 1 fifth. Okay, so we need to get some common denominators going. On the left-hand side, I can write 1 as 5 over 5. So I'll just erase that and write 5 fifths. Negative 7 plus 5 is negative 2, so this is negative 2 fifths. On the right side, the LCD is 15. So let's multiply this by 5 over 5. And let's multiply this by 5 over 5. And let's multiply this by 3 over 3. So I'd have negative 23 plus 2 times 5 is 10, plus 2 times 5 again is 10, minus 1 times 3 is 3, over the common denominator of 15. And so negative 23 plus 10 is negative 13, plus 10 again 
is negative 3, minus 3 is negative 6. So this will end up being negative 6 over 15 equals negative 2 fifths. And again, if you see something like this, don't stop and assume you got the wrong answer. This is simplified over here. This is not, right? Both are divisible by 3. If I divide 6 by 3, I get 2. If I divide 15 by 3, I get 5. And so I end up with negative 2 fifths over here as well, right? Negative 2 fifths equals negative 2 fifths. And so my solution, which was x equals 1, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on solving a linear equation with fractions or decimals. All right, so we're going to start out with 12 fifths plus 2n equals 8 fifths n plus 7 halves minus 2. So again, the idea here to clear the fractions from an equation, you multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD of all fractions involved. So if I look at the denominators here, I have 5, 5, and 2. So really, the LCD is just going to be 5 times 2, or 10. So I would multiply both sides of the equation by 10. And you want to use brackets or parentheses to do that to make sure that you multiply each and every term of the equation by that number 10, right? It's only legal if you do that. All right, so 10 times 12 fifths. 10 would cancel with five and give me two, right? Two times 12 is 24. So this would be 24 plus 10 times 2n is 20n. This equals over here, I have 10 times 8 fifths n. 10 would cancel with 5 and give me 2. 2 times 8 is 16. So this is 16n. Then plus 10 times 7 halves. 10 would cancel with 2 and give me 5. 5 times 7 is 35. And then minus 10 times 2 is 20. So I can simplify here. 35 minus 20 is 15. So let's do that. So I have 20n plus 24 equals 16n plus 35 minus 20 is 15. Now I want to move all my variable terms to the left, and I'm going to move all the numbers to the right. So I'm going to subtract 16n from both sides of the equation. So that's going to get rid of this. 20n minus 16n is 4n. So I can write plus 24 equals 15, or I can just do it up here, right? It doesn't matter. But I'm going to end up getting rid of 24 from this side of the equation, right? Because I need to isolate this variable term here 4n. So I'm going to subtract 24 away from both sides. And I could have done that up here if I wanted to. I do it in kind of one step. This will go away. And then down here, this wouldn't be here. And I would just have 15 minus 24. 15 minus 24, which is negative 9. Now to solve the equation, I have 4 that's multiplying n. So to isolate n, I just need to divide both sides of the equation by 4. Right? What's multiplying n? And so I'm going to end up with n equals negative 9 fourths as my solution. All right, so to go back and check and make sure that this is the right solution, we're going to plug this in for n in the original equation. All right, so we'd have 12 fifths plus 2 times, we have negative 9 fourths, 2 times negative 9 fourths equals 8 fifths times, again, negative 9 fourths plus 7 halves minus 2. So on the left, 2 times negative 9 fourths, this will cancel with this and give me 2. So I'd have 12 fifths plus negative 9 halves. On the right, 8 times negative 9 will give me negative 72. 5 times 4 would give me 20. So i got to get some common denominators going. Over here, the common denominator I'm going to use is 10. right? That's the LCD. So I'm going to multiply this by 2 over 2. I'm going to multiply this by 5 over 5. So 12 times 2 is 24. And then we're going to subtract away 9 times 5. That's 45. This is over 10. So 24 minus 45 is negative 21. And then this is over 10. All right. Over here, let's use a common denominator of 20. Right? That's going to be my LCD. So I'm going to multiply this by 10 over 10. And I'm going to multiply this by 20 over 20. So I'll have negative 72 plus 7 times 10 is 70. And then minus 2 times 20 is 40. OK, this is all over 20, the common denominator. Negative 72 plus 70 would be negative 2. Negative 2 minus 40 would be negative 42. 
So I'd end up with negative 42 over 20. And I just need to simplify this by dividing the numerator and the denominator both by two. All right, if I divide negative 42 by two, I get negative 21. If I divide 20 by two, I get 10. So I get negative 21 tenths equals negative 21 tenths. So yes, our solution, which was n equals negative 9 fourths, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on solving linear equations with fractions or decimals. All right, so we have 25 40 fourths plus 2x equals negative 10 over 11 times the quantity negative 1 half x plus 3 halves. So when you encounter an equation, and you want to clear that equation of fractions, and you have brackets or parentheses involved, go ahead and get rid of the brackets or parentheses first, then tackle clearing the fractions. It's going to make it a lot simpler for you. So let's start off over here with 25 over 44 plus 2x equals, I'm going to use my distributive property, and I'm going to have negative 10 elevenths times negative 1x over two, or negative one half x. So what I want you to see is, okay, this is gonna cancel with this and be five, and the negatives are gonna cancel, so I'm gonna end up with five times x or five x over 11. So this is gonna be five x over 11. Next I have negative 10 elevenths times three halves. So I know that's gonna be negative. And then let's go ahead and write 10 elevenths times three halves like that. This will cancel with this and give me a five. Five times three is 15, and this will be over 11. All right, so now when I look at my fractions, and I look at the denominators, I have 44, I have 11, and I have 11. So the LCD is really easy to get here, it's just 44. So I'm gonna multiply both sides of the equation by 44. And again, I wanna use brackets or parentheses to do that. So let me scroll down a little bit. So 25 over 44 plus 2x this equals 5x over 11 minus 15 over 11. Okay, so this is times 44. All right, so if we do 44 times 25 over 44, this 44 we cancel, this 44 I just have 25. Then plus. Next I'd have 44 times 2x. That's gonna give me 88x, then equals. Now I have 44 times 5x over 11. The 44 would cancel with the 11 and give me four. Four times five is 20, so that would be 20x. The next I'd have 44 times negative 15 elevenths. Again, the 44 would cancel with the 11 and give me a four. Four times 15 is 60, so this is minus 60. So now when I look at this equation, it's fraction free. And all I need to do is solve it like I normally would. I'm gonna move all the variable terms to one side, all the numbers to the other. So let me subtract 20x from both sides of the equation. That's gone. And let me subtract 25 from both sides of the equation. So that's gone. So on the left, I just have my variable term, 88x minus 20x would be 68x. On the right, negative 60 minus 25 would be negative 85. And now it's very, very simple to get my solution. I'm looking to isolate the variable x. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide both sides of the equation by 68, the coefficient of x. So 68 divided by 68 is one, or just x. And negative 85 over 68, negative 85 over 68. We need to think about, can we simplify that? So negative 85, I can write as negative one times five times 17. 68, I can write as four times 17, right? Really four is two times two, but why bother when there's nothing to cancel it with up there? So this will cancel with this, and I'm gonna end up with negative five over four, or negative five fourths. So this equals, I'm gonna write negative five fourths. So that's my solution, x equals negative five fourths. And let's go ahead and plug this back in for x and check. All right, so again, x equals negative 5 fourths, so we'd have 25 over 44 plus two times negative 5 fourths equals negative 10 over 11 times this quantity. We have 
negative one half times negative five fourths plus three halves. All right, so on the left, I have 25 over 44 plus, then over here, two times negative five fourths, I can cancel this two with this four and get a two. So this is plus negative five halves. Now, if I just wanna complete this left side, I can multiply this by 22 over 22. And so I'd have 25 over 44 plus, what is negative five times 22? Well, it's negative 110. And this is over two times 22, which is 44. So 25 plus negative 110 is negative 85. So this would be negative 85 over 44. And this fraction is as simple as we can make it. So we're gonna go back up here and see what we can do with the right side. So on the right side now, I have negative 10 elevenths times inside the brackets, negative one half times negative five fourths. That's gonna be positive. One times five is five. Two times four is eight. So then plus three halves. You get a common denominator here. I'm gonna multiply this by four over four. Scroll down a little bit. So I'll have negative 10 elevenths. Again, times this quantity in the brackets, we have five eighths plus three times four is 12. Two times four is eight. So this equals. So five plus 12 is 17. So I'm gonna have negative 10 over 11 times inside here is gonna be 17 eighths. So what can we cancel? I know that 10 is five times two. I know that eight is four times two really. So I can cancel this and put a five, cancel this and put a four. So negative five times 17 is gonna give me negative 85. 11 times four is 44. So we have the same number on both sides of the equation. And so we know that our solution, which was x equals negative 5 fourths, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on solving linear equations with fractions or decimals. All right, now let's look at a problem that deals with decimals. So we have negative 0.305x plus 10.1805 equals 1.3x plus 3.6. So if you want to clear the equation of decimals, you're going to have to multiply both sides of the equation by the appropriate power of 10. So remember, if you're multiplying by 10 or a power of 10, you're moving your decimal point one place to the right for every zero and the power of 10. So the first thing you're gonna do is look at the equation. Look for the number of decimal places in each number. So I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, and then one. All right, so if I have that situation, the largest number of decimal places that occurs is here. So that's four. So I wanna multiply by the power of 10 that contains four zeros, right? A one followed by one, two, three, four zeros. So the number 10,000. If I do that, I'm gonna move each decimal point four places to the right. And so this is gonna end up all the way over here and I'm gonna be decimal free. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Remember to use parentheses so that you multiply each and every term by that number. So 10,000 times negative 0.305x plus 10.1805 equals, and then inside of parentheses, 1.3x plus 3.6, and then over here times 10,000. All right, so now let's use our distributive property. So we're gonna have 10,000 times negative 0.305x, and this is just gonna go four places to the right. So we'll have negative, and then we're gonna have three zero five zero, right? Because this would go, starts here, and it goes one, two, three, four places to the right, and then we put the x, then plus. Next, you have 10,000 times 10.1805. So this is gonna go all the way to the end. So you're gonna have one zero one eight zero five. Put your comma in, you'd have 101,805, and this equals, so now over here, I'm gonna multiply 10,000 by 1.3x. So I'd have one, three, and I'm gonna put one, two, three zeros behind that because this is gonna go one, two, three, four places to the right. So this is 13,000 and then my variable x and then plus. Now I have 10,000 times 3.6 and that's gonna be three, six, and then again, three zeros. One, two, three, 
or 36,000, right? Because this is going to go one, two, three, four places to the right. All right, so once we've got that worked out, now we want to move all the variable terms to one side, all the numbers to the other, right? You want a variable term equals a number, right? So you can complete that step. What I want to do is move this guy, 13,000x, to this side. So I do that by adding negative 13,000x or subtracting 13,000x away from both sides of the equation. And this is gone over here. All I'm left with is just a number. And now I don't want a variable term plus a number. I need to get rid of this also. So I'm going to do this in one step. So I'm going to subtract 101,805 away from both sides of the equation. That way that's gone. And now I have negative 3,050x minus 13,000x. And that's going to give me negative 16,050x. Now this is going to be equal to, over here I have 36,000 minus 101,805. That's going to be negative 65,805. So now to get x by itself, to isolate the variable completely, we want to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x. So that's this negative 16,050. And when we do that, what are we going to get? So this is going to cancel with this and become 1. So we just have x over here. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to end up with 4.1. Right? If I divide negative 65,805 by negative 16,050, I get 4.1. All right, so this is our solution, x equals 4.1. And now let's go back up to the top and check it. So I'm going to have negative 0 0.305 times 4.1 plus 10.1805 equals 1.3 times 4.1 plus 3.6. So negative 0 0.305 times 4.1 is negative 1.2505. Then this is plus 10.1805. If I sum these amounts, I get 8.93. Over here, 1.3 times 4.1 is 5.33. Then plus 3.6. And if I sum these amounts, I again get 8.93. So 8.93 equals 8.93. So we have verified that our solution, which was x equals 4.1, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on solving linear equations with fractions or decimals. All right, so let's take a look at negative 10.34 plus 1 plus 3.1x minus 2.7x equals negative 3.3x minus 4.9. So again, the whole idea here, if you want to clear your equation of decimals, you want to look and see, okay, how many decimal places do I have in each number, and what's the largest amount? So here I have two, here I have one, here I have one, here I have one, here I have one. So you need to multiply by the appropriate power of 10. And when I say that, I mean the power of 10 that would clear the decimals from the number that has the largest number of decimal places. So in this case, that's this number. So if I multiply by 100, the power of 10 with two zeros, I'd end up moving this decimal point two places to the right, and it would be clear of decimals. Now, everything else gets multiplied by 100, but it has fewer decimal places, so the decimals will be gone from the entire equation. So we're going to multiply both sides by 100. And make sure you use parentheses, and that's going to force you to multiply each and every term by 100, which is what you need to do. Okay, so we're going to start out with 100 times negative 10.34. So that's negative. The decimal point goes two places to the right, so 1,034. Then plus, now we have 100 times 1, that's just 100. Then plus, now we have 100 times 3.1x. That's going to be this moving 1, 2 places to the right, so 310x. Then minus, now we have 100 times 2.7x, so this is going to go 1, 2 places to the right, so that's 270x. And this equals, again over here, 100 times negative 3.3x. This is going 1, 2 places to the right, 
So that's negative 330x. And then minus, finally we have 100 times 4.9. Again, one, two places to the right. So 490. Okay, so no more decimals. Now we just work with it like a regular equation. And so we simplify each side. On the left-hand side, negative 1,034 plus 100 is going to be negative 934. Then 310x minus 270x is going to be 40x. So plus 40x. Then this equals, over here I have negative 330x minus 490. What we can do now, we want all the variable terms on one side of the equation, all the numbers on the other. I am going to add 330x to both sides of the equation. So that's going to clear it from over here. I'm going to put plus 330x. And then I'm going to get rid of this over here. I just want a variable term by itself. So I'm going to add 934 to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. And so on the left-hand side, 40x plus 330x is 370x. On the right side, negative 490 plus 934 is 444. So now I just need to isolate the variable x. And to do that, I want to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is 370. So what I'm going to end up with is x equals 1.2. 444 divided by 370 is 1.2. So now let's check this solution of x equals 1.2 in the original equation. So we're going to have negative 10.34 plus 1 plus 3.1 times 1.2 minus 2.7 times 1.2. And this equals negative 3.3 times 1.2. And I'm going to scroll over. This is going to go off the screen. And then minus 4.9. So let's start off on the left. I'm going to start by multiplying. What is 3.1 times 1.2? That's 3.72. What is negative 2.7 times 1.2? That's negative 3.24. So minus 3.24. And I'm just going to copy everything else. So plus 1 plus negative 10.34. So now I just have addition and subtraction over here. And let's go through that. So negative 10.34 plus 1 is negative 9. 0.34. Then if I add 3.72, that's negative 5.62. Then if I subtract 3.24, I get negative 8.86. Let me scroll over here. All right, on this side, I have negative 3.3 times 1.2. That's negative 3.96. Then minus 4.9. If I do this subtraction here, negative 3.96 minus 4.9 is negative 8.86. So again, just what we have here, negative 8.86. And so our solution, which was x equals 1.2, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 7. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. All right, so for our problems today, we want to solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. So let's take a look at the first example. We have negative 6 times the quantity n plus 12, then minus 6n, and this is equal to 3 times the quantity n plus 1. So we're just going to start out by trying to solve the equation just like we normally would. We don't know what type of equation it is at this point. So I'm going to start out by using my distributive property here to remove parentheses. So negative 6 times n is negative 6n. And then we'll have negative 6 times 12. That's going to be minus 72. Then we have minus 6n. And this equals, now I'm going to use my distributive property again. 3 times n is 3n. And then plus 3 times 1, that's 3. Now if I simplify on the left here, negative 6n minus 6n is negative 12n then minus 72. This equals 3n plus 3. So I need a variable term on one side and a number on the other. And right now I have a variable term here and here, and I have a number here and here. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you do this. I mean, you can move this guy over here, or you can move this guy over here. I like my variable to be on the left. So I'm going to subtract 3n away from both sides of the equation. 
so that there's no variable term on the right. Right now I only have a variable term on the left. Negative 12n minus 3n would be negative, okay, negative 15n, and then we have minus 72, and this equals 3. Now I want to isolate the variable term. So because I'm subtracting 72 away from it, in order to get rid of this minus 72, I add 72, and I do so to both sides of the equation. So this is going to go away, and on the left I'm just going to have negative 15n. On the right, 3 plus 72 is 75. Now I have negative 15n equals 75. I want to isolate the variable n, and to do that, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 15, right, the coefficient of n. So this will cancel with this, and I'll just have n, and over here, 75 divided by negative 15 is negative 5. So we got a solution here, n equals negative 5. So this is the type of equation that is true under a certain condition. Right? It's true if n equals negative 5. It's false if n equals anything else. So this type of equation is conditional. All right, this is a conditional equation. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have 9 times the quantity x plus 11 equals the negative of the quantity negative 9x plus 3. So I'm going to start out by using my distributive property to remove parentheses. So 9 times x is 9x. Then plus, we have 9 times 11, that's 99. This is equal to, remember, I told you that if you have a negative outside of a set of parentheses, you have a few different options. You can just change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. So I can just say, okay, well, minus a negative 9x is going to be plus 9x, and minus a positive 3 is minus 3. Or to get the same thing, you can put plus negative 1. So you have that negative 1 there to remind you to distribute the negative to each term inside the parentheses. Remember, if you're multiplying by negative 1, you're just changing the sign. So you'd have negative 1 times negative 9x, that's positive 9x. Negative 1 times 3 is minus 3. So either way you want to do that, you're going to get the same thing. Now if I look at this, I have 9x on this side, 9x on this side. So that shows me I have a problem. Right? If I subtract... 9x away from here and here, this goes away and so does this, and I'm left with 99 equals negative 3. This is nonsense. This is nonsense, right? It doesn't work. So 99 doesn't equal negative 3, so there's no solution. There's no solution, and this is an example of a contradiction. Contradiction. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 7 times the quantity 1 minus 8v is equal to 9 times the quantity 1 minus 6v. So again, use my distributive property to start. 7 times 1 is 7 minus 7 times 8v is 56v. You can use my distributive property. 9 times 1 is 9 minus 9 times 6v is 54v. So we're good to go. I can already tell this is a conditional equation. Right? I don't have the same thing on each side. And I can solve it really quickly. I can add 54v to both sides of the equation. And I'm also going to subtract 7 away from each side of the equation. So this is gone, and so is this. So on the left side of the equation, I have negative 2v. So negative 2v. On the right side, 9 minus 7 is 2. So I have a variable term equal to a number. Once I have that, I just want to isolate the variable. If I have negative 2 times v, to get v by itself, I just divide by negative 2, right? the coefficient of v. And I do it to one side, so I have to do it to the other. This cancels with this and just leaves me with v. Over here, 2 divided by negative 2 is negative 1. So this is my solution. v equals negative 1. So this type of equation, again, is conditional. It's true under the condition that v equals negative 1 and false any other time. Right? If I said v equals 7, it would be false. So this is conditional. All right, let's take a look at another. We have negative 60p minus 72 is equal to negative 6 times the quantity 10p plus 12. So again, negative 60p minus 72 is equal to, you have negative 6 times 10p, that's negative 60p, and then you have negative 6 times 12, that's negative 72. So the same exact thing is on the left and the right. And so when you see that, you know you have an identity, right? No matter what I choose for p, 
it's going to work out. So the solution is all real numbers. And we have what's called an identity. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. All right, so we want to solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. So our first problem is 6 times the quantity 1 minus 3k is equal to negative 6 times the quantity 12 plus 3k. So if you get this type of problem, you just try to solve the equation just like you normally would. Because at this point, we don't know what it is. So we'll use our distributive property here to simplify on the left. 6 times 1 is 6, minus 6 times 3k is 18k. And this is equal to, on the right, negative 6 times 12 is negative 72. And negative 6 times 3k is going to be negative 18k. Now I'm looking at this, and I know that if I have the same thing on both sides of the equation, it can be canceled out, right? So this can cancel with this. And the reason I say that is, again, if I added 18k to both sides of the equation, which is legal because of the addition property of equality, this goes away and this goes away. So if the same thing is on both sides, you can get rid of it. Now, what I'm left with is 6 equals negative 72. So that's false, right? That, that doesn't work. This is not true. Not true. And I'll just put a big X through it. So this type of equation is known as a contradiction, right? It's never going to be true. So there's no solution, no solution, again, because it's a contradiction. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. So we want to solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. All right, so let's take a look at our problem. We have negative 2b plus 10 times the quantity 1 plus b equals negative 2 times the quantity negative 2b minus 8 minus 6. So I'm just going to simplify each side, and I'm going to start with the left side. So negative 2b, negative 2b plus, we have 10 times 1, that's 10, and then 10 times b, that's 10b. So plus 10b. This is equal to, over here I have negative 2 times negative 2b, that's 4b. And then I have negative 2 times negative 8, that's plus 16. And then I have minus 6. So on the left, negative 2b plus 10b is 8b. So this would be 8b plus 10. On the right, I have 4b plus 16 minus 6. 16 minus 6 is 10. So 4b, 4b plus 10. Now, as I've told you, if the same thing is on both sides of the equation, you can get rid of it. I can at this point subtract 10 away from each side, and this will go away, and so will this. So I'm left with 8b equals 4b. Now, you might think at this point that there's no solution. You would be wrong. So 8b equals 4b. Now, if I subtract 4b away from both sides, this goes away, and this becomes 4b. Now, here's where people make a mistake. They see that there's nothing here, and they go, well, 4b doesn't equal anything, so there's no solution. Now, remember, this cancels and becomes 0. So you have to put the number there. In the case where I had something like 3 plus 4b, and I subtracted 4b away, if this cancels out, I can write plus 0, but really it's still just 3 over here. But when there's nothing there to start with, and everything cancels, you've got to remember to put the 0 there. Very, very, very important. So let me rewrite this as this canceling completely. So I have 4b equals 0, and if I divide both sides of the equation by 4, which is the coefficient of b, what happens is I get that b equals 0, right? That's my solution. b is equal to 0. And if you don't believe me, go back to the original equation. I'll scroll back up so you can write it down for a second. And plug it in, right? So take a 0 and plug it in here, here, and here. And let's just do that. So I know some of you are going to doubt that it works. And let me just write that b equals 0, and that this is conditional. 
And again, what does conditional mean? Well, it means that this equation can be made true if b equals zero, but it's not true for anything else. If I said b equals seven, it's not true, right? It's not gonna work out. So let's go ahead and plug in a zero everywhere there's a b. So I'd have negative two times zero, that's zero. So I can just do that, negative two times zero. Just leave it there for now, plus 10 times the quantity, one plus zero. And we know that's just one, but just leave it there. Equals negative two times the quantity, negative two times zero. We know that's zero, minus eight, and then minus six. So this is gone, negative two times zero is zero. This is gonna be one, right? One plus zero is just one. So 10 times one is 10, so that's this side. On this side, this is gone, negative two times zero is zero, so I'd have negative eight. So you'd have negative two times negative eight, that's 16. And then 16 minus six would give you 10. So 10 equals 10, that checks out. So B does in fact equal zero. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section three on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. So we wanna solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. So we have 115 minus 10P is equal to negative 12 minus five times the quantity 2p minus six. So to start, I'm just gonna simplify both sides. So I have 115 minus 10p on the left, nothing I can really do with that. On the right, I have negative 12, and then I have negative five times 2p. So negative five times 2p is negative 10p. And then I have negative five times negative six, that's gonna be plus 30. And so if I look at this, I can right away tell that, okay, I have the same thing on both sides of the equation, negative 10p. So my variable is gonna disappear here. So you can stop at this point and say, this is a contradiction, right? Because if I keep simplifying, this would be 115. Over here, negative 12 plus 30 would be 18, right? So that doesn't work out. 115 doesn't equal 18. So this is no solution. And we could write that this is a contradiction. Now, if you're a little confused at how I cross these out, I just wanna make you aware of something. I say it in almost every video now, but in case you haven't seen any other videos, if you have the same thing on both sides of the equation, just think about this. If I was to add 10P over here, this would cancel. Negative 10P plus 10P, that cancels. When I add 10P over here as well, because you do the same thing to the left as you do to the right, this is also gonna cancel, so it's gone. That's why I'm saying if you have the same thing on both sides of the equation, you can get rid of it because if I add the opposite to both sides of the equation, it's gonna drop out from both sides, right? Just like it did here. I added the opposite of negative 10P, which is 10P to both sides of the equation, and it's gone in each case. So again, there's no solution here. This is a contradiction. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section four on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. So we wanna solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. All right, so we have negative 11 times the quantity r plus nine is equal to negative six r plus five times the quantity negative r minus 99 fifths. So I'm gonna simplify here on the left to start. So negative 11 times r is negative 11 r. And then we have negative 11 times nine, that's minus 99, this equals. Now we have negative six R, and then we have five times negative R, so that's minus five R. And then we have five times negative 99 fifths, this five will cancel with this five, and I'm gonna be left with negative 99, so minus 99. And so now if I simplify further on the right, negative six R minus five R is negative 11 R, and then minus 99, and I can see I have an identity, right? Negative 11 R minus 99 on the left, negative 11 R minus 99 on the right. So no matter what I choose for R, I'll get a true statement, right? So all real numbers, all real numbers would be your solution here, right? So this type of equation is called an identity. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section five on linear equations with no solution or an infinite number of solutions. So we wanna solve the equation if possible and identify as conditional, contradiction, or identity. So we have negative nine times the quantity one plus five X 
is equal to negative 4 times the quantity 11x minus 3. So what we're going to do here is simplify each side and take a look at what we have. So negative 9 times 1 would be negative 9. Then negative 9 times 5x would be minus 45x. And this equals over here negative 4 times 11x is negative 44x. And then negative 4 times negative 3 is plus 12. So nothing looks suspicious. It looks like a regular equation. And so I can already tell at this point this is going to be a conditional equation. right? True for some replacement of the variable, but not true for everything. So what I'm going to do is just solve the equation now. So I want to move all the variable terms to one side, all the numbers to the other. So I'm going to add 44x to both sides of the equation. That will cancel. And so let's do this in two steps so you can kind of see it. So negative 9, negative 45x plus 44x would be negative x. This equals 12. Now I want this by itself. So I'm going to add 9 to both sides of the equation. So this is going to go away. And what I'm going to have, I'm going to have negative x is equal to 21. And so I don't want negative x. I want x. So in order to get x by itself, I can what? I can multiply both sides by negative 1, or I can divide by negative 1. Remember, you could write this as negative 1 times x like that. And so you can see negative 1 is the coefficient of x, so we divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is negative 1, to get x by itself. So then x is going to be equal to negative 21. This type of equation, again, is called a conditional equation. The reason it's conditional is it works when x equals negative 21, right? If you take negative 21, you plug it in for x, you get a true statement. If you plug anything else in for x, you will not get a true statement. It will be false. So it's a conditional equation. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set number 8. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on applications of linear equations, part 1. All right, so we just want to go back through the procedure that we learned in the lesson for solving a word problem. The, the first thing you always want to do is read the problem carefully and determine what you are asked to find. This is the most important thing. If you don't know what you're asked to find, you're just going to be kind of scrambling around through the problem, rereading it, and just completely dazed and confused. So this is very, very important. Before you move through anything, make sure that you know what you're being asked to find. The next thing you're going to do is assign a variable to represent the unknown. And in the case where you have more than one unknown, for the problems we're looking at here, we're only using one variable. When you're using one variable and you have more than one unknown, you're going to express the other unknowns in terms of that variable. And I'll show you that in a second. All right, so the third thing you're going to do is write out an equation. Followed by that, you're going to solve the equation. And then you're going to state the answer in terms of the problem. The last thing you're going to do is check the result and then make sure it's reasonable. Very, very important because that's key to understanding whether you got the right answer or not. All right, let's take a look at our first problem. So a dirt bike uses a mixture of oil and gas. The mixture uses 18 ounces of gas for every one ounce of oil. If the tank holds a maximum of 133 ounces, how many ounces of gas and oil are present when the tank is full? This is another example where you're given some information about the individual amounts and how they relate to each other, and you're given a sum for the individual amounts, but you're not given the individual amounts themselves, and that's what you need to find. So our goal here is to find out how many ounces of gas and oil are present when the tank is full. So how many ounces of gas are present in a full tank? How many ounces of oil are present in a full tank? Now, we're told that the tank holds a maximum of 133 ounces. So that's going to be important for us when we're setting up the equation. So now that we know what we're being asked to find, let's set up a variable to represent our unknown. In this case, we have two unknowns. We don't know how much oil in terms of the number of ounces of oil are going to be present in a full tank. And the other thing is we don't know how many ounces of gas are going to be present in a full tank. So we can let x equal one of those, and then we can represent the other in terms of that variable x. Now, let me kind of scroll down here real quick, and I'm going to let x, I'm going to let x equal one of them. It doesn't matter which one, 
but I'm going to go ahead and say that X is the number, the number of ounces of oil in a full tank. So then how can we represent the number of ounces of gas in a full tank? Let's go back up to the problem. Well, again, if you read back through it, it says the mixture uses 18 ounces of gas for every one ounce of oil. So whatever the amount of oil is, I'm going to have 18 times that amount in terms of the amount of gas I have. So if the amount of oil that's in there is represented with X, then 18 times X or 18 X would be representing the amount of gas that I have. So I can say that then 18 X will equal the number of ounces of gas in a full tank. So very, very straightforward. X is the number of ounces of oil in a full tank, and then 18 times X is the number of ounces of gas in a full tank. All right. So now that we have that, we want to set up an equation. And remember, we're gonna go back and use that information, which is that if the tank holds a maximum of 133 ounces, so this right here, the tank when it's full is 133 ounces. So that's consisting of all the gas in the tank and all the oil in the tank. So the two amounts combined together. So if X is the number of ounces of oil in a full tank, and I add that to 18 X, which is the number of ounces of gas in a full tank, I should get 133, which is the total number, the total number of ounces with oil and gas. It's the two combined, right? This is the total and these are the individual amounts, right? So they should sum to that. Now, very easy to set up and solve this equation. I would combine like terms here on the left and I would just get 19X and this equals 133. Divide both sides of the equation by 19. This will cancel with this and I'll just have X. And then 133 divided by 19 is seven. So I'm not done. I don't put X equals seven down on my paper and then hand it in and say, okay, great job. I have to go back with a word problem and make sense of that. So X equals seven. Remember, X is equaling the number of ounces of oil in a full tank. So there are seven ounces of oil in a full tank. And let's write that. There are seven ounces of oil present in a full tank along with and we need to also say how many ounces of gas are in there and so we know that 18 times x or 18 times 7 is the number of ounces of gas in a full tank 18 times 7 is 126 so along with 126 ounces of gas Okay, nice and neat. So there are seven ounces of oil present in a full tank along with 126 ounces of gas. All right, so you always wanna come back up here and make sure that your answer makes sense. So the mixture uses 18 ounces of gas for every one ounce of oil. So that's kind of something you could think of as a ratio, right? We talked about that in pre-algebra. So we have 18 ounces of gas for every one ounce of oil. So that means that if I had 36 ounces, if I had 36 ounces of gas, right, I just multiplied 18 times two and got 36, I'd have to multiply this by two to maintain that ratio. So I'd have to have two ounces of oil. Well, it turns out that if I took this original amount here and just multiplied the numbers in the numerator and denominator by seven, what I'd have is the same ratio. So 18 times seven, is 126, so 126 ounces of gas, and one times seven is seven, so seven ounces of oil. And that's exactly what we have, right? We have the same ratio. We have 126 ounces of gas to seven ounces of oil, which is the same as 18 ounces of gas to one ounce of oil, right? So the ratio is the same. Now, the next thing you wanna think about is, does the sum make sense? If the tank holds a maximum of 133 ounces, okay, so that's with gas and oil. If I take the total amount of gas, which is 126 ounces, 
and the total amount of oil, which is 7 ounces, well, 126 plus 7 is 133, so that checks out as well, and we do have the correct answer. Again, there's 126 ounces of gas and 7 ounces of oil when the tank is full. All right, let's take a look at another one. The sum of three consecutive even integers is multiplied by 7. The result is 168. What are the three integers? So let's talk for a second about what a consecutive integer is, and then let's talk about a consecutive even integer. So a consecutive integers would be two integers that differ by one. So in other words, you could have one and two, or you could have 167 and 168, or it could even be something like negative one and negative two, right? Because we're saying integers. Now we're saying consecutive even integers. Remember an even number is a number that's divisible by two. So you could have something like two and then four. So the difference would be two. You could have 6 and then 8. You could have negative 12 and negative 10. You know, so on and so forth. They have to be consecutive, though, so they differ by 2. The first thing we want to do here, we're trying to find what are the three integers. So you have three unknowns here. You have x, which I'm going to say represents the middle, the middle even integer right so you have three of them you have kind of a smallest one a middle one and a largest one so then what I can say is x minus 2 is the smaller or the smallest even integer and x plus 2 is the largest even integer Remember, with consecutive even integers, they're going to differ by 2. Again, go back to the example. So 2 and then 4. Okay, or let's say 6 and then 8. Or negative 12 and then negative 10. So again, if x is the middle one, then 2 less than that would be the smallest. And then 2 greater than x would be the largest. We're told that the sum of these, the sum of three consecutive even integers. So that would be x. So that would be x plus x minus 2 plus x plus 2. That's the sum right here. The sum is multiplied by 7. So here's the trick. You have to make sure that you include all of this. So I'm going to put some brackets around it because this whole thing right here is the sum. Don't just put a 7 out in front without any brackets because you just have 7x there. That doesn't work. You need brackets around the whole thing because 7 is multiplied by that whole sum. Very, very important. So the sum of three consecutive even integers is multiplied by 7. The result is 168. So this equals 168. So very straightforward from here. I have my equation set out. I just need to solve it. So one thing I'm going to do to make it easy on myself, I could use the distributive property right away, or I can just combine like terms inside of those brackets. So I'm going to do that first. So I'm going to have 7, my brackets here, x plus x is 2x plus another x is 3x. And then I have negative 2 plus 2. That's going to be 0. So I just have 3x there. So what is 7 times 3x? That's 21x. This equals 168. Divide both sides of the equation by 21. That cancels with that. I'm going to get x is equal to 8. So x equals 8. But again, we have to make sense of this. So if we go back up here, x is the middle even integer. So then x minus 2 is the smallest. So that would be 6, right? 8 minus 2 is 6. And then x plus 2 is the largest. So 8 plus 2 is 10. So you have 6, 8, and 10. So let's go back up to the top. We can say that the three integers are 6, 8, and 10. And then check to make sure that it makes sense. So the, the sum of three consecutive even integers. So these are three consecutive even integers. We have 6, then 2 more is 8, then 2 more is 10. So that works out. The sum, 6 plus 8 is 14, 14 plus 10 is 24. So the sum is multiplied by 7. So what is 24 times 7? Well, that's in fact going to give you 168, right? So the sum, 24, is multiplied by 7. The result is 168. So yes, if I sum these, I get 24 multiplied by 7, I get 168. 
So this is the correct answer. The three integers are 6, 8, and 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Applications of Linear Equations, Part 1. All right, so we're just going to solve each word problem here. And we're just looking at one. We have a piggy bank contains nickels, dimes, and quarters only. There are twice as many quarters as dimes, but only half as many nickels as dimes. The total value of the piggy bank is $11.25. How many quarters, dimes, and nickels are in the piggy bank? So the first thing you always want to do with any type of word problem is figure out what you're asked for. And we're asked to find how many quarters, dimes, and nickels are in the piggy bank. So individually, how many nickels, how many dimes, how many quarters? And we're given the dollar amount when all of these are combined. It's $11.25. So we're going to use that when we're setting up our equation. So the next thing we always want to do is set up a variable to represent the unknown. Well, here you have three unknowns. So we'll let a variable like x represent one of them, and then we'll express the other two in terms of that variable. So it always helps if you have a comparison like we have here, if one of them is involved in each comparison, like we have here that there are twice as many quarters as dimes, but only half as many nickels as dimes. So you can see you have dimes and dimes. So let's let x equal the number of dimes that we have, and then we can express the other two in terms of that. So let's let x equal the number of dimes in the piggy bank. So then how do we express the other amounts? So now we read back through and we see there are twice as many quarters as dimes. So since we said that x equals the number of dimes, the number of quarters would be twice that amount or two times x, right? So I'm going to put then 2x is equal to the number of quarters in the piggy bank. Then lastly, we have the number of nickels. And we say, but only half as many nickels as dimes. So I could take the number of dimes and divide by 2 or multiply by 1 half. It's the same thing. And I would have the number of nickels. So nickels, so then 1 half times x, or 1 half x, is equal to the number of nickels in the piggy bank. Now, there's an extra step here. Normally, at this point, when we set up our equation, we can just say, okay, x plus 2x plus 1 half x equals some amount, right? That's what we've seen in our previous examples. We can't do that here because we're given a value, a dollar amount that all of these are worth. X is the number of dimes in the piggy bank, okay? The number of dimes. If I was to go into my pocket and say that I have four dimes in my pocket, well, that doesn't give me a value, right? It's 40 cents is what I have, right? It's 40 cents. But I need to find a way to sum this and get it to equal this amount here, this $11.25, the information we're given. Well, I know that each dime is worth 10 cents or 0 0.10. So 0 0.10 times x would be the total value for all dimes. Why? Well, again, the number of dimes in the piggy bank is x. And if I take this amount, the amount per dime, right, 0 0.10 or 10 cents, and I multiply it by x, I get the total value for all dimes in the piggy bank. And then similarly, for quarters, I'd have 0.25 times the number of quarters, which is 2x. And this is the total value for all quarters. And then lastly, I'm going to have 1 half x as the number of nickels, and each nickel is worth 0 0.05. So I'd have 0 0.05 times, and I can put 1 half 
Well, remember, one half is the same as 0.5. Because we're working with decimals here, it's going to be a little easier for us to just write one half as 0.5. And don't get these two confused. This is 0 0.05. This is 0.5. Those are different. Very, very different. Right? If this was a fraction, this would be 1 over 20. If this is a fraction, this is 1 half. So those are different values. All right, so I'm going to finish this up. I took 1 half and made it 0.5, and then we'll put x here, and this is the total value, the total value for all nickels. So now I have something that I can use to make an equation with. And this is one of the type of problems to where it'll trip you up if you're not really thinking. Right? You're like, okay, well, I have a total amount. I have a sum. But that sum doesn't actually relate to this until I do an extra step. If I take 0 0.10 times x and I add it to 0.25 times 2x and then I add 0 0.05 times 0.5x, this should be equal to 11.25. Remember, $11.25. And again, let me break this down one more time. This is the value per dime. This is the number of dimes. Value per quarter, number of quarters. Value per nickel, number of nickels. If we sum these amounts up, total value of all dimes plus total value of all quarters plus total value of all nickels is going to give me a total value of 1125. Right? That's what we're told. So now we can just kind of simplify the left side and go about solving the problem. So 0.10x, nothing I can do with that. 0.25 times 2. That's going to give me 0.5. So I'll have 0.5 and then x. And then plus 0 0.05 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.025. And then times x, and this equals 11.25. So these are all like terms here. You just need to add the coefficients. So you'd have 0.10 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.025, that's going to give you 0 0.625 times the variable x, and this equals 11.25. Now, just as you normally would, you divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.625, 0 0.625, and that isolates x. So you'll have x equals 18. And a couple things here. We're working with decimals, so we went over a lesson where we taught you how to clear the decimals from an equation. You can do that, but if you're using a calculator, why waste your time, right? On most of your tests, you're going to be timed. You're going to figure out the answer just as quickly if you don't get rid of the decimals, right? Especially if you have a calculator. If you don't have a calculator, if your teacher is like, you can't use calculators, then you might want to take the time to do that. But, you know, in a lot of cases, it doesn't end up saving you any time. Clearing the fractions might, but clearing the decimals usually does not. All right, so x equals 18. So we have to go back up and make sense of that. So x equals 18. Again, x is the number of dimes in the piggy bank. So we have 18 dimes. We have 18 dimes along with how many quarters? Well, we have two times x, or 2 times 18, which is 36, so along with 36 quarters, and how many nickels? 1 half x is the number of nickels. So half of 18, or 18 divided by 2, is 9. So and 9 nickels. And then you can check these amounts. If we go back up to the problem, again, there are twice as many quarters as dimes. So we had 18 dimes, 36 quarters, that checks out. But only half as many nickels as dimes. So we had 18 dimes, 9 nickels, that checks out. The total value of the piggy bank is $11.25. So again, if you went through and said, okay, I have 18 dimes, 18 times 0 0.10 would be 1.80 or $1.80. I have 36 quarters. 36 times 0.25 would be 9. So that's $9 in quarters. And then I have 9 nickels. 9 times 0 0.05 is 0.45. So 0.45. 
So if we kind of think about this, we could just do a vertical sum real quick. This would come down and have 5. 8 plus 0 plus 4 is 12. Bring this up here. 1 plus 1 is 2. Plus 9 is 11. Plus 0 is still 11. So that's $11.25, which is exactly what the problem told us it would sum to. So we know our answer here is correct. We have, again, 9 nickels, 18 dimes, and 36 quarters. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Applications of Linear Equations, Part 1. So we have here that Jacob inherited some money from his father. He deposited part of the money in a savings account paying 7% annual simple interest and $40,000 less than that amount in a different account paying 13% annual simple interest. The annual income from both accounts is $8,800. How much was invested at each rate? So this is our key question here. This is what we need to find out in order to get a correct solution. How much was invested at each rate? So how much was invested at 7% and how much was invested at 13%? So before we kind of begin, we have to have a quick little tutorial on simple interest. So the simple interest formula, as you'll see in your textbook, you have I, that stands for simple interest, simple interest earned is equal to the principal, which I'll put P here, and it's spelled a little bit differently. It's P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. So it's principal. You can think of it like that. It's not principal like these are my principles. It's a little different. So this is the principal. This is the amount of money that you start with. That's what principal means with this spelling. Then times R, which is the rate. So this is your interest rate. And this is always as a decimal. Okay, so if it was 7%, you would convert that to 0 0.07. And then times T, which in this case is going to be the time in years. And in some cases, you can change that to, you know, time in weeks or time in months, just depending on what information you're given. In this case, we're talking about annual. So we're talking about time in regard to years. Now, if I give you a principal amount, like let's say $100, let's say $100, and I give you an interest rate, let's say it's 5%. So that's as a decimal, so that's 0.05. And I give you a number of years that it's invested for, so let's say that's two. I can give you the amount of simple interest earned. So 100 times 0 0.05 would be five, and then times two would be 10. So the simple interest earned is $10 over two years, where my principal or my amount invested is 100, and my interest rate is 5% or 0 0.05 as a decimal. Now, one thing that you have to understand before we kind of move forward Simple interest is different from what you get in your bank account currently. You probably get something called compound interest. So in this scenario, you'll notice that we weren't allowed to earn interest on the interest. So we started out with $100 and we earned interest on that $100. We didn't earn interest on the interest. So at the end of year one, you know, if I change this to one, I would have had $5. So I'm not allowed to take this five and put it into this balance and say, okay, now I have 105 times 0 0.05, you know, and so on and so forth. This would be a, a bigger number. That's compound interest. I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So I'm just using the simple interest formula. All right, so let's move to our next step, which is to assign a variable to represent the unknown. There's two unknowns here. So one of them is going to be how much was invested at 7%, and the other is how much was invested at 13%. So let's let x, let's let x equal the amount of money invested at 7%. So then how do we represent the amount of money invested at 13%? Well, if we look back through the problem here, we see that this sentence here tells us that he deposited part of the money in a savings account paying 7% annual simple interest and, okay, here's the key, and $40,000 less than that amount in a different account paying 13% annual simple interest. So whatever he invested into 
the account paying 7%, which we said was X, 40,000 less than that would be the amount he put into the account paying 13%. So I can say then X minus 40,000 is the amount of money invested at 13%. So now we have our unknowns represented and we wanna move into the next step which is to set up an equation. Now the equation is kind of complicated to set up because you really have to understand that simple interest formula, that I, that I equals P times R times T, which I gave you earlier. Now, we're told that the annual income from both accounts is $8,800. So I know that the income or the interest earned each year is 8,800. And I know that this is per year, so this T, this time in years is one. So anything times one is just itself, so I can kind of just get rid of this. So I'm looking at just these two, the principal times the rate, okay? The principal times the rate. Now, I have two amounts going on. I have X, which is the amount of money invested at 7%. So the principal there is X, okay? The principal is X. And the rate, the rate is 7%, or as a decimal, 0 0.07. So this is the rate, and this is the principal. And remember, this principal is spelled differently. It's not principal like, hey, these are my principles. All right, so 0 0.07 times X is going to give me the interest earned in a year for the money that I put at 7%. Now, if I add that to the rate, which is 13%, 0.13 as a decimal, times the principal, in this case, that's going to be X minus 40,000. Again, this is the rate, and this is the principal. Each amount is the amount earned from that specific account in a year. So summing these two will give me that $8,800, which it tells me is the annual income from both accounts. So once you get the equation set up, it's pretty simple to solve it. So now we just go through, we have 0.07x plus 0.13 times x, 0.13x minus, I'll have 0.13 times 40,000, which is 5,200. This equals 8,800. Now, some of you like to clear decimals, others don't. I find it to be a waste of time, so I don't do it. If you want to, go ahead and take that extra step. You get the same answer either way. So I'm going to combine like terms here. 0.07x plus 0.13x is 0.2x. So then minus 5200 equals 8800. Okay, add 5200 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. I'll have 0.2x is equal to 14,000. Okay. Final step, divide both sides of the equation by 0.2. So I'll have x is equal to 70,000. So we're not done. We have to go back up and make sense of what we just found. Remember that x is equaling the amount of money that's invested at 7%. So I'm going to say that Jacob... Jacob put $70,000 in the account paying 7% annual simple interest. And Remember, he put 40,000 less than that amount in the account paying 13% annual simple interest. So 70,000 minus 40,000 is 30,000. So and $30,000 in an account paying 13%, again, annual simple interest. Okay, and that's your answer. Now let's go back up to the top and make sure that that makes sense. All right, so Jacob inherited some money from his father. 
he deposited part of the money in a savings account paying 7% annual simple interest and $40,000 less than that amount in a different account paying 13% annual simple interest. So the first part checks out. He's got $70,000 in the account that pays 7% and then he's got $40,000 less or $30,000 in an account paying 13% annual simple interest. Now the annual income from both accounts is $8,800. So let's prove that that's the case. So in the account that pays 7%, he has $70,000. So his annual income is 70,000, which is the principal, times the rate, which is 0 0.07. So this is what he makes per year. That's gonna be $4,900. Then the account that pays 13%, He's got $30,000 there. 0.13 is the decimal form of that. That's $3,900. So sum these two amounts together. So $4,900 and $3,900, and you should get $8,800. These zeros would just come down. 9 plus 9 is 18. 1 plus 4 is 5 plus 3 is 8. So you do, in fact, get $8,800. So his annual interest between the two accounts is going to be $8,800. So this is exactly in line with what was told to us in the problem. So we have the correct answer. Jacob put $70,000 in the account paying 7% annual simple interest and $30,000 in an account paying 13% annual simple interest. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on Applications of Linear Equations Part 1. So a drugstore clerk counts her cash register and finds that she has 10s, 20s, and 100s only. There are five times as many 20s as 10s and one quarter the amount of hundreds as 20s. The total value of all bills is $2,820. How many 10s, 20s, and hundreds were in the register? So our question here, what we need to answer is how many 10s, 20s, and hundreds were in the register? And that's all we have, right? It's telling us that there are only 10s, 20s, and hundreds. We need to assign a variable to represent one of these amounts and then express the other amounts in terms of that variable. Now, if I look at my problem here, it tells me there are five times as many 20s as 10s and one quarter the amount of hundreds as 20s. So 20s or the amount of $20 bills is expressed in both comparisons. So we're going to let X, we're going to let X equal the number or the amount of 20s. So then, what can we say about the number of 10s? So there are five times as many 20s as 10s. So that means I could take the number of 20s that we have, which in this case is x, divide that by five, and I would get the number of 10s. So then x, the number of 20s, divided by five is equal to the number of tens. All right, then what about the number of hundreds? We're told that one quarter the amount of hundreds as 20s. So one quarter the amount. So that's like one fourth or 0.25. And since I'm already working with fractions, I'm going to keep working with fractions. So I'm going to say one fourth times the number of 20s. Number of 20s is x, so one fourth times x. Or we can just write this as x over 4. So we can say then x over 4 is equal to the number or the amount of hundreds. Okay, So x is the number of 20s, x over 5 is the number of 10s, and x over 4 is the number of hundreds. Now how do we set up an equation? Well, we're not given a total number of bills. What we're told is we have the total value, this is the key, a total value of all bills, and it's $2,820. So I can't just go through and sum these and set them equal to 2,820. I have to do a little bit more work. So the dollar amount is $2,820. That means that I have to take the amount of 20s and multiply it by the value per 20, which is 20. So 20 times x, this is the value per $20 bill. And then this is the number, number of 20s. If I take that amount and I add it to, do the same thing for the 10s. So you have x over 5, 
That's the amount of tens times 10. Right? This is the value per $10 bill. And then I add that to, I have the amount of hundreds, which is x over four, times the value per hundred, which is 100. So now if I do this all the way across, and I can erase this, we know what everything means now. This is equal to 2,820. You can just leave the dollar symbol off for now. We just add it back in when we start writing our sentence. So all I need to do is simplify the left side here. And to do that, 10 will cancel with five and give me two. 100 will cancel with four and give me 25. So I get 20x plus 2x plus 25x equals 2,820. 20x plus 2x is 22x. 22x plus 25x is 47x. So 47x equals 2,820. Divide both sides of the equation by 47. And I'm going to get that x is equal to 60. And again, that doesn't mean I'm done. I can't stop here and go, okay, I'm done, turn in my paper, woohoo, I'm not finished. So let's make sense of this. If x equals 60, remember x was the number of $20 bills that the clerk has. So the clerk, the clerk has 60 $20 bills. Along with, we said that the number of tens was x over 5. So x is 60. So x divided by 5 or 60 divided by 5 is 12. So along with 12 $10 bills and so how many hundreds? We said x divided by four was the number of hundreds. So 60 divided by four is 15. So and 15 hundred, hundred dollar bills. So let's check this to make sure it's accurate. So a drugstore clerk counts her cash register and finds that she has tens, twenties, and hundreds only. So good to go there. So there are five times as many 20s as 10s. So we said that we had 12 10s and 60 20s. 12 times 5 is 60. Good to go there. And one quarter the amount of hundreds as 20s. I have 15 hundreds and then I have 60 20s. So 15 times 4 is 60. And so that works out as well. Now the total value of all bills is 2,820. So let's go through and calculate the total value. So 60 $20 bills, you can think about 60 times 20, that's 1,200. And there's 12 $10 bills. So 12 times 10, that's 120. And 15 $100 bills, 15 times 100, that's 1,500. So if you sum these amounts, 1,200 plus 1,500 is 2,700, and then add another 120, you're gonna get 2,820. And of course, we're talking about in terms of dollars. And this is exactly what we're told in the problem. The total value of all bills is $2,820. And so we have the correct solution. Again, there are 60 $20 bills, there are 12 $10 bills, and there are 15 $100 bills. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on Applications of Linear Equations, Part 1. All right, so let's take a look at our problem. We have that the owner of a sandwich shop found that the orders on Monday for ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey and one half that of chicken. If 70 total sandwiches were sold between these types, how much of each type of sandwich was sold? So here's what we're looking for. How much of each type of sandwich was sold? So how many ham and cheese, how many turkey, and how many chicken? So when we move on to our next step, which is to assign a variable to represent the unknown, we have three unknowns. Now, it usually helps in this situation to let your variable, whatever you decide that's going to be, I'm just going to use x, represent the one that's involved in both comparisons. So in this case, we found that the orders on Monday for ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey and one half that of chicken. 
So ham and cheese is involved in both comparisons. So I'm going to let x, I'm going to let x equal the number of ham and cheese sandwiches sold for that Monday. All right, so then we can represent the number of turkey sandwiches sold on that Monday and the number of chicken sandwiches sold on that Monday in terms of our variable x. So we're told that ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey. If x is the amount of ham and cheese sandwiches sold, half of that amount, or x over 2, would be the number or the amount of turkey sandwiches sold. And you kind of have to be able to change things back and forth. It says that the orders on Monday for ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey. So if I took the turkey sandwiches sold, which in this case is x over 2, and I doubled them, I would multiply by 2. So 2 times x over 2 would give me x, which is the amount of ham and cheese sandwiches sold. And I know when you first start doing this, it gets extremely confusing, but after you work problem after problem after problem, you're going to be able to go back and forth. If it's easier for you, you could have let the x variable represent the number of turkey sandwiches sold, and then 2x would be the number of ham sandwiches sold. You could do it like that. And you have to figure out a way to model the number of chicken sandwiches you sold. But this is easier for me because the number of ham sandwiches sold are involved in both comparisons. So I just start out with x being the number of ham sandwiches sold, and then I can kind of represent the turkey sandwiches sold and the chicken sandwiches sold more easily. All right, so let's figure out chicken sandwiches. So ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey and half that of chicken. So it's half the amount of chicken. So chicken is two times the amount then, right, or 2x. So then 2x is equal to the number or the amount of chicken, chicken sandwiches sold. And that makes sense because if I cut this in half, if I took 2x and I divided it by 2, I would get just plain x. The number of chicken sandwiches sold were two times the amount of ham and cheese sandwiches sold, or as it says in the problem, the number of ham and cheese sandwiches sold were half of the amount of chicken sandwiches sold. So you need to be able to go back and forth between the different ways of representing these things. All right, so now that we've represented all the unknowns, let's go through and make an equation. So 70 total sandwiches were sold between these types. So all I need to do is take the number of ham and cheese sandwiches sold, which is x, and add it to the number of turkey sandwiches sold, which is x over 2, and add it to the number of chicken sandwiches sold, which is 2x, and that's going to equal 70. There's my equation, and now I just need to solve it. So simplifying on the left, I know x plus 2x is 3x, so plus x over 2 equals 70. So how do I simplify here? Well, really, I have to realize that, let me kind of move this over a little bit. This is 1 half times x. Okay, that's what x over 2 is. So my coefficient is 1 half. So it's a little tricky. If you see something written like x over 2, you're like, well, what do I do? Remember, this is 1 half times x. So all I need to do is think about adding some fractions, right? I would multiply this by 2 over 2. So I have a common denominator. So I would have 6 halves plus 1 half and that's gonna give me seven halves. So I would essentially have seven halves x equals 70. Or you can always write one half as a decimal, put 0.5, and so you'd have 3.5, right? 3.5 times x. Seven halves, if you do that on a calculator, seven divided by two is 3.5. So if I wanted to write 3.5 x equals 70, it's the exact same thing, right? It really does not matter. All right, so how do I solve this equation? Well, again, when you have a fractional coefficient for x, you multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal. In this case, that's going to be 2 sevenths. So that'll cancel. And on the left, I'll just have x. On the right, 70 will cancel with 7 and give me 10. 10 times 2 is 20. So x equals 20. 
Remember, X is the number of ham and cheese sandwiches sold. This is 20. Then X over 2, 20 divided by 2 is 10, so that's how many turkey sandwiches we sold. And then 2X, 2 times 20 would be 40, so that's how many chicken sandwiches we sold. The owner sold 20 ham and cheese sandwiches. Ham and cheese along with 10 turkey and 40 chicken. And go back and read through the problem and make sure that that makes sense. So the owner of a sandwich shop found that the orders on Monday for ham and cheese sandwiches were double that of turkey. So 20 ham and cheese sandwiches, 10 turkey. So that makes sense because 20 is double that of 10, right? 20 is two times 10. And one half that of chicken. So one half that of chicken. We sold 20 ham and cheese. We sold 40 chicken. So that's also true, right? Because 20 is one half of 40. 70 total sandwiches were sold between these types. So we have 20 for the number of ham and cheese. We have 10 for the number of turkey. And then we have 40 for the number of chicken. 20 plus 10 is 30. 30 plus 40 is 70. That's what we have here. So the answer here is correct. The owner sold 10 turkey sandwiches, 20 ham and cheese sandwiches, and 40 chicken sandwiches. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on Applications of Linear Equations Part 1. Okay, so three siblings, Jane, Bernie, and Ralph, are different ages. Bernie is six years younger than Jane and six years older than Ralph. If the combined age of the three is 54, how old is each person? So this is the key here. We're trying to find out how old is each person. So how old is Jane, how old is Bernie, and how old is Ralph? Now, when we assign a variable, it's usually easier to let the person that's involved in each comparison to be equal to a variable. And then the others can be expressed in terms of that variable. So in this case, we have Bernie that's six years younger than Jane and six years older than Ralph. So let's start out by letting Bernie's age be X. So let's let X equal Bernie's age. So then, what else can we say? We need a way to represent Jane's age. Well, Bernie is six years younger than Jane. So that means whatever Bernie's age is, if I add six to that, I'm going to get Jane's age, right? Because Bernie is six years younger. So then X plus six, this amount is Jane's age. Jane's age. Because if I take this X plus six, which represents Jane's age, and I take six away, I'm gonna get back to Bernie's age, which is exactly what it tells me in the problem, right? Bernie is six years younger. You can kind of think about that as saying, okay, well, Jane is six years older. So it also says, and six years older than Ralph. Six years older than Ralph. So another way to think about that is Ralph is six years younger. So we can say then, X minus six is Ralph's age. So we have their individual ages represented now. And we just wanna set up a nice little equation. And the key to this equation is that the combined age of the three is going to be 54, right? That's told to us right here. The combined age of the three is gonna be 54. All right, so that means that X plus x plus 6 plus x minus 6, the combined ages will be 54. Again, this is Bernie's age, this is Jane's age, this is Ralph's age. Okay, all those combined together gives me 54. All right, so let's simplify. x plus x plus x is 3x. 6 minus 6 is 0. So we get 3x equals 54. Divide both sides of the equation by 3, and x is going to be equal to 18. Again, x is Bernie's age, so Bernie is 18. x plus 6 is Jane's age, so Jane is 18 plus 6, or 24. 
And then Ralph is x minus 6, so that's 18 minus 6 or 12. So let's write that. So Barney is 18 years old. Jane is 24 years old. And Ralph is 12 years old. Nice and simple. All right, let's check this. So again, Bernie is six years younger than Jane. So Bernie is 18, Jane is 24. That checks out. Six years older than Ralph. So Bernie is 18, Ralph is 12. That checks out. The combined age of the three is 54. So 18 plus 12 is going to give me 30, and then plus 24 is going to give me 54. So yeah, the ages of the three sum to 54, and then we've already checked the comparisons in here, so we can say that our answer is correct. Bernie is 18, Jane is 24, and Ralph is 12. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set number 9. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on applications of linear equations part 2. So we're going to start out with a mixture word problem. So Farmer Heather's Produce Stand sells 8 ounce bags of mixed nuts that contain 35% peanuts. To make her product, she combines Lyle's mixed nuts, which contain 25% peanuts, and Kevin's mixed nuts, which contain 45% peanuts. How much of each does she need to use? So let's go ahead and highlight that. How much of each does she need to use? So again, we're asking the question, how much of Lyle's mixed nuts is she going to use? And how much of Kevin's mixed nuts is she going to use? So those are our two unknowns. We can assign a variable like x to represent one of them. Let's let x equal the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts. So this is the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts that she's going to use. So how do we represent the other variable in terms of x? Well, you have to read through the problem again. Let's read through it and see if you can catch it. Farmer Heather's produce stand sells 8 ounce bags of mixed nuts that contain 35% peanuts. So stop there, because the information's already been given to you. The produce stand sells 8 ounce bags. Okay, so that tells you that the total weight at the end of the day is 8 ounces. Now, if X is the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts that she's going to use, that means that 8 minus X has to be the amount in ounces of Kevin's mixed nuts. So the amount in ounces of Kevin's mixed nuts. I'm going to put then right here. So I put lead and then I put then. So lead x equal the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts and then 8 minus x, that quantity, is the amount in ounces of Kevin's mixed nuts. Alright, so now that we've kind of modeled our unknowns, let's think about an equation. So at the end of the day, the produce stand sells 8 ounce bags of mixed nuts that contain 35% peanuts. So the end mixture is 8 ounces, I'm just going to write 8, and it's 35% peanuts, so times 0.35. So this is the amount in ounces, so ounces of peanuts. Let's set that equal to, because this is the end mixture, the amount of peanuts in Lyle's mixed nuts plus the amount of peanuts in Kevin's mixed nuts. And how do we get that information? We know the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts is X. If we come back up here, we're told that Lyle's mixed nuts, which contain 25% peanuts, so that's 25%, and Kevin's is 45%. So I would have 0.25, which is 25% as a decimal, times X to represent the amount of peanuts in ounces that's in Lyle's mixed nuts. So this is ounces of peanuts. 
So then plus, I've got to sum these two amounts together because I'm combining them to get this end result. So then I'm going to have 0.45, remember it was 45% for Kevin's mixed nuts, times this quantity, 8 minus x. And 8 minus x is the amount in ounces of Kevin's mixed nuts. And again, this is ounces of peanuts. So we have the ounces of peanuts from Lyle's mixed nuts plus the ounces of peanuts from Kevin's mixed nuts has to be equal to the ounces of peanuts in the end result, right? The bag of mixed nuts. Alrighty, let's go through and solve this equation now. So we'll have 0.25x plus 0.45 times 8 is 3.6. Then minus 0.45 times x is minus 0.45x. And this equals 8 times 0.35, which is 2.8. Combine like terms here. 0.25x minus 0.45x is negative 0.2. You can put 0.20x or just 0.2x, same thing. Then plus 3.6 equals 2.8. Subtract 3.6 away from each side. That's gone. We'll have negative 0.2x is equal to 2.8 minus 3.6 is negative 0.8. So now our final step is to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is negative 0.2. So that cancels with that. We'll have x is equal to negative 0.8 divided by negative 0.2 is going to give me 4. So x equals 4. But again, 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 x equals 4 doesn't really solve the problem. i got to go back and translate that into a sentence. Okay, so again, x is the amount in ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts. So that was four. So then they should use, they should use four ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts. So then, and how do we get the amount used for Kevin's mixed nuts? Remember, the bag that they're selling is 8 ounces. So we said that 8 minus the weight of Lyle's mixed nuts, which we represented with x, we found out that was 4. So 8 minus 4 would be 4. That gives us the weight of Kevin's mixed nuts, right? What we're going to use. So and 4 ounces of Kevin's. Kevin's mixed nuts. All right, so let's check this. So the first thing is that Farmer Heather's Produce Stand sells 8-ounce bags of mixed nuts. Now, let's stop there. So we said there was 4 ounces being used from Lyle's mixed nuts and 4 ounces being used from Kevin's mixed nuts. 4 plus 4 is 8, so that's 8 ounces. So that works out. And then we say that it contains 35% peanuts. So 35% of 8 is 2.8. So that means there's 2.8 ounces of peanuts. That's what we have in the end result. So to make her product, she combines Lyle's mixed nuts, which contain 25% peanuts. So we're using four ounces of that. So four times 0.25, four times 0.25 is one, right? So you'd have one ounce of peanuts coming from Lyle's mixed nuts. And then with Kevin's mixed nuts, Again, you have four ounces, and it's 45% peanuts. Four times 0.45 is 1.8. So you'd have 1.8 ounces of peanuts from Kevin's mixed nuts. So if you sum these two amounts, an ounce of peanuts and 1.8 ounce of peanuts, the two quantities you're mixing together to get this, you see that they do sum, right? One ounce plus 1.8 ounces is 2.8 ounces. So everything checks out here. So Farmer Heather is going to use four ounces of Lyle's mixed nuts along with four ounces of Kevin's mixed nuts to get her eight ounce bag of mixed nuts that's 35% peanuts. All right, let's take a look at another one. And this one's going to involve the distance formula. Remember, distance equals rate times time. So Melvin left home driving east 3.8 hours before Ralph. Ralph drove home in the opposite direction going 42.1 miles Per hour faster than Melvin. After Ralph was driving for 1.2 hours, the two were 279.3 miles apart. What was Melvin's average speed? So this is the goal, to find out what was Melvin's average speed. 
So before we start working on this problem, I want you to recall that we have this formula, this distance formula that says that distance, distance is equal to rate of speed times the amount of time traveled. So if I'm in a car and I'm driving at 60 miles per hour and I do this for five hours, I have a distance, right? 60 miles per hour times five hours, that's 300 miles. So if I give you a rate of speed and I give you a time, you could give me a distance, right? You just multiply. If you're in a car and you're going 40 miles an hour for two hours, you go 80 miles, right? So on and so forth. So in this particular case, we really have to kind of think a little bit because we're not used to solving these problems at this point. After a while, after you solve so many of these, once you read the problem, you're gonna know exactly what to do, right? All of them have like a similar setup. In this particular case, I want you to notice one thing. They're traveling in opposite directions. So Melvin left home driving east, 3.8 hours before Ralph. Ralph drove home in the opposite direction. So it's telling you that, in the opposite direction. And then it tells you he's going 42.1 miles per hour faster than Melvin. But right now, I just want you to note that they're going in opposite directions. So they have a starting point. Let's say that's here. And one's going this way, and the other's going this way. So what that means in the end is that we have a distance for one of them. Let's say the distance for Melvin. And then we have a distance for the other one. Let's say that's the distance for Ralph. And it tells us that after a certain amount of time, they're 279.3 miles apart. So if I sum the distances, if I sum the distances, they're gonna be equal to 279.3 miles. Let's go back up and read that. So again, Melvin left home driving east 3.8 hours before Ralph. Ralph drove home in the opposite direction going 42.1 miles per hour faster than Melvin. After Ralph was driving for 1.2 hours, the two were 279.3 miles apart. So 279.3 miles apart. So that's gonna be key. All right, so let's start thinking about assigning a variable to represent your unknowns here. So the main question asked us, what was Melvin's average speed? So let's start out by just saying, okay, let's let X equal Melvin's average speed. Now, we're told specifically that Ralph is going 42.1 miles per hour faster than Melvin. So I can say that then x plus 42.1, this quantity is equal to Ralph's, Ralph's average speed. So now I have a rate for each person. And so again, if I have a distance formula, it's rate of speed times time. So if I have a rate and I have a time, I can give you a distance. Do I have a time? So Melvin left home driving east 3.8 hours before Ralph. So however long Ralph travels for, Melvin does 3.8 hours more than him. Now it says that Ralph was driving for 1.2 hours and the two were 279.3 miles apart. We could say that Ralph drove for 1.2 hours and Melvin drove for 3.8 hours more than him. So 3.8 plus 1.2 would give me five. My time for Ralph is 1.2 hours. And for Melvin, it's 3.8 plus 1.2 or five. So let's see if we can put this together and make a nice little equation. So we have enough information at this point. So let's get a fresh sheet of paper. Again, we know that distance is equal to rate of speed times amount of time traveled. Now let's think about the distance that Melvin travels. His rate of speed is x, his amount of time traveled is five. So Melvin, his distance is five x. This is Melvin's distance. Now, let's think about Ralph's distance. He's gonna have a different scenario. His time is 1.2 hours, 
and his rate of speed is x plus 42.1. So we multiply those two. We would say that 1.2 times the quantity x plus 42.1, this is Ralph's distance. Now, how can we relate the two distances here? I want you to recall that earlier I showed you that the sum of their distances is 279.3, right? They go in opposite directions, and so we don't know how far they go individually at this point. We do know if we added their individual distances, we'd end up with 279.3. So I have Melvin's distance, I have Ralph's distance. Let's just add them, so 5x, plus 1.2 times the quantity x plus 42.1 is going to be equal to, again, 279.3. So this is our equation to solve. We're going to solve this and find out what x is. That's going to tell us Melvin's average speed, which is what we're looking for. And then once we have that, we have all the information we need about everything they did on their trip. So let's simplify the left side. 5x stays the same plus... 1.2 times x is 1.2x, plus 1.2 times 42.1, that's 50.52, and this equals 279.3. All right, so over here, 5x plus 1.2x is 6.2x, then plus, we have 50.52 equals 279.3. All right, so let's subtract 50.52 from both sides of the equation. That's gone. On the left, I just have 6.2x. And if I do 279.3 minus 50.52, I'm gonna get 228.78. We'll finish this up by dividing both sides of the equation by 6.2, the coefficient of x. So I'll end up with x is equal to 36.9. So this is Melvin's average speed, right, in terms of miles per hour. Remember, we let x equal Melvin's average speed. So let's write that. So Melvin's average speed was 36.9 miles per hour. And that's all it asked for. So for the purposes of a test or something like that, you just put that and you're done. But we want to go and figure out everything else so that we can check it. So we know that Ralph was going 42.1 miles per hour faster than Melvin. So he was going 79 miles an hour. Let's see if this calculation is true. So Ralph travels for 1.2 hours at 79 miles per hour. So this is going to be his distance, right? You've got the number of hours or your time times your rate of speed, right? So you have 1.2 hours times 79 miles per hour, and that gives us 94.8. So this is Ralph's distance. Now, remember, Melvin drives for 3.8 hours more, right? Because he leaves 3.8 hours before Ralph does, and Ralph drives for 1.2 hours. So 1.2 plus 3.8 gives us five. So Melvin travels for five hours, and he does so at 36.9 miles per hour. So what's his distance? Well, it's 184.5 miles. Now, if I sum these two, I should get this amount because their combined distance should be 279.3 miles because that's how far they are apart after Melvin had been driving for five hours and Ralph had been driving for 1.2 hours. And yes, if I sum 94.8 and 184.5, I do in fact get 279.3. So we can say that our answer here is correct. Melvin's average speed was 36.9 miles per hour. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Applications of Linear Equations, Part 2. So Jessica wants to make 5 gallons of a 31% acid solution by mixing together a 15% acid solution and a 65% acid solution. How much of each should she use? So here's the key here. It asks how much of each should she use? So again, her end goal is to make five gallons of a 31% acid solution. Now, she's mixing together a 15% acid solution and a 65% acid solution. So, 
Let's use a variable. Let's use x. So let's let x equal the amount in gallons of the 15% acid solution. Now we know at the end of the day that our acid solution is going to be a total of five gallons. So then we could say five, which is the total amount of gallons, minus x, which is the amount in gallons of the 15% acid solution, is going to be equal to the amount in gallons of the 65% acid solution. So we have these two unknowns represented now. And it's time to think about making an equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to relate the amount of pure acid that comes from here and here to the final product. So from the 15% acid solution, she has 0.15, or 15% as a decimal, times x, which is the amount in gallons of the 15% acid solution she's going to use. This right here, when I multiply those two together, it gives me the amount of pure acid. If I add to that 0.65, which is 65% as a decimal, times the quantity 5 minus x, which again is the amount in gallons of the 65% acid solution she's going to use, this is again telling me how much pure acid I have from that. So the amount of pure acid from this one plus the amount of pure acid from this one should be equal to the amount of pure acid in the end mixture. And in the end mixture, it's five gallons and it's 31% acid. So I'd have 0.31 times five. So we'll have 0.15x plus 0.65 times five, which is 3.25. Then minus, we'll have 0.65 times x, which is 0.65x. And this will be equal to 0.31 times 5, which is going to be 1.55. All right, so let's combine like terms here. 0.15x minus 0.65x is going to be negative 0.50x or just 0.5x. Either way, it's the same. Then I have plus 3.25, and this equals 1.55. Then I'm going to subtract 3.25 away from each side of the equation. That's going to go away. And I'm going to have negative 0.5x is equal to 1.55 minus 3.25 is equal to negative 1.7. So now to finish this off, I divide both sides of the equation by negative 0.5. Right, that coefficient for x, that's going to cancel. This is just going to be x. On the right side, I divide that by negative 0.5 as well. Negative 1.7 divided by negative 0.5 is 3.4. So that's what x is going to be equal to. So if I go back up, again, x is the amount in gallons of the 15% acid solution she's going to use. So we know that's 3.4. So she needs to use, she needs to use 3.4 gallons of the 15% acid solution. Then we can say along with, now we know that 5 minus x, in this case x is 3.4, 5 minus 3.4 would be 1.6, so along with 1.6 gallons of the 65% acid solution. Now let's check this to make sure that it's correct. So again, Jessica wants to make five gallons of a 31% acid solution. Now our answer said that we're using 3.4 gallons of the 15% acid solution along with 1.6 gallons of the 65% acid solution. So 3.4 plus 1.6 is five, so that part checks out. And then we just need to compare how much pure acid is in the final mixture. So five times 0.31, we already know it's 1.55, so 1.55 
that's in terms of gallons, how much pure acid? So pure acid in gallons. That's the final mixture. This should be equal to the amount of pure acid that we put in from the 15% acid solution. So we have 3.4 gallons times 0.15, right? 15% of it is acid and we're using 3.4 gallons. So when we do 3.4 times 0.15, we get 0.51. So I have 0.51, that's pure acid in gallons. And then plus, how much pure acid in gallons do we get from the 65% acid solution? We're using 1.6 gallons and it's 65% acid. So 1.6 times 0.65, is 1.04, 1.04. So again, this is the amount of pure acid in gallons. And if you sum this amount, 0.51 plus 1.04, you do get 1.55. So the amount of pure acid from the 15% acid solution combined with the amount of pure acid from the 65% acid solution gives us the same amount as the pure acid in our final mixture, five gallons, that's 31% acid solution. Again, 1.55 gallons of pure acid in total. So we have the correct answer. She needs to use 3.4 gallons of the 15% acid solution along with 1.6 gallons of the 65% acid solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on Applications of Linear Equations Part 2. All right, so vegetable oil, which costs $2.44 per pound, is made by combining soybean oil, which costs $3.45 per pound, with canola oil, which costs $2.10 per pound. Find the amount in pounds of soybean and canola oil required to make 13.5 pounds of vegetable oil. So here's your key right here. Find the amount in pounds of soybean and canola oil required to make 13.5 pounds of vegetable oil. So how do we go about figuring that out? Well, we're gonna have two unknowns here. We're gonna have the amount in pounds of soybean oil that we're gonna use and the amount in pounds of canola oil we're gonna use. So let's go ahead and assign a variable to one of them. So let's let x equal the amount in pounds of soybean oil used. And then what we can say and then when we look at the problem, we know at the end, the result is 13.5 pounds of vegetable oil. So if I take 13.5 and I subtract away X, okay, 13.5, I subtract away X, X is the amount in pounds of soybean oil. That's gonna give me the amount in pounds of canola oil. that's used, okay? Because if I add the two amounts together, I get 13.5, right? So the amount in pounds of canola oil plus the amount in pounds of soybean oil, that's gotta equal 13.5. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's think about getting an equation going. And the equation we're gonna come up with here is gonna relate to cost. Now we're told that the vegetable oil, which costs $2.44 per pound, is made by combining soybean oil with canola oil, and it gives us the cost for each, but let's focus on this. Vegetable oil, which costs $2.44 per pound. So we know that it's also 13.5 pounds. So at the end of the day, I have 13.5 pounds, that's $2.44 a pound. So this is the total cost. And I'm gonna set that equal to the cost from the soybean oil used plus the cost from the canola oil used, because those two have to be equal to the total cost, right? They have to be equal. So how much is a pound of soybean oil? Well, it tells us that soybean oil costs $3.45 a pound. So I know that if I multiply 3.45 times X, I'm gonna get the cost from soybean oil. Now I'm gonna add that to the cost from canola oil. So how much is the canola oil per pound? So canola oil per pound is $2.10. So I can write 2.10 or 2.1 times this right here, this 13.5 minus X. So this is the cost 
This is the cost from canola, canola oil, okay? So the cost from soybean oil plus the cost from canola oil gives me my total cost, right? Because these were my two things that I put together. So let's see if we can simplify and solve this equation. So I'm gonna have 3.45 times X plus 2.1 times 13.5 is gonna be 28.35. Then minus 2.1 times X is 2.1 X. Then equals, we're gonna see 13.5 times 2.44, that's 32.94. So 3.45 minus 2.1 is 1.35. So if I combine like terms here, I'll have 1.35x, then again plus 28.35, and this equals 32.94. So I'm gonna subtract 28.35 from both sides of the equation. This is gonna cancel. I'll have 1.35x is equal to 32.94 minus 28.35, which is 4.59. As a final step, I'm gonna divide both sides of the equation by 1.35, the coefficient of x. So x is equal to, divide this by 1.35, and I'm gonna get 3.4 here. x equals 3.4. x was equal to the amount in pounds of soybean oil used, so that was 3.4. So they will use 3.4 pounds of soybean oil And 13.5 minus 3.4, which is 10.1, so 10.1 pounds of canola oil. All right, so let's check this. So we know that 10.1 plus 3.4 is 13.5. So that's what we're looking for in our end result. 13.5 pounds of vegetable oil. All right, so it's easy to check the weight, but now we wanna to check to make sure that the costs relate to each other. So we said that we had an end result that was $2.44 per pound, and it's 13.5 pounds. So if I multiply $2.44 or 2.44 times 13.5, I am going to end up with 32.94. So this is the total cost. Now this total cost comes from two places. It comes from the amount we spend on soybean oil. So soybean oil is $3.45 per pound, and we're using 3.4 pounds of that. So if I multiply these two together, I get 11.73. So this is your soybean oil cost. Now I have another component and that's canola oil. Now the canola oil is cheaper. It's $2.10 a pound. So I can put 2.10 or just 2.1. And that's multiplied by the number of pounds we use, which is 10.1. So that's gonna give me 21.21. So this is the canola oil, canola oil cost. If I sum this with this, I should get this. Right, these are the two inputs into my final mixture. So the cost from soybean oil plus the cost from canola oil should give me the total cost. So what happens if I sum 11.73 and 21.21? Well, I do in fact get 32.94. So I've proven that my answer is correct, right, in terms of weight and in terms of cost. So they will use 3.4 pounds of soybean oil along with 10.1 pounds of canola oil to end up with 13.5 pounds of vegetable oil that costs $2.44 per pound. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on Applications of Linear Equations Part 2. All right, so we're going to look at one that involves the distance formula. So Eduardo left the mall and traveled toward his cabin on the lake at an average speed of 37.1 miles per hour. Nancy left 3.2 hours later and traveled in the opposite direction with an average speed of 62 miles per hour. How long does Nancy need to travel before they are 297.1 miles apart? So it specifically asks, how long does Nancy need to travel, doesn't say anything about Eduardo, 
is Nancy need to travel before they are 297.1 miles apart? So in other words, they both leave from the same point. So this is the starting point. One goes this way and the other goes this way. Now they do so at different rates of speed and for different amounts of time, but basically we're trying to figure out at what point in Nancy's travels will the sum here of their distances be 297.1. So the distance from Nancy plus the distance of Eduardo. And that's pretty easy to figure out. I want you to remember that the distance formula is very intuitive. So for distance, this is equal to rate of speed times time traveled. So if I give you a rate of speed, like let's say 60 miles per hour, and I give you an amount of time that you do that for, let's say seven hours, well, 60 times seven is 420, that's a distance, 420 miles. So if you have a rate of speed and a time, you have a distance. Now, let's look back through this problem and see if we can get something going here. In terms of rate of speed, they give it to us. For Eduardo, they tell us in the problem, his average rate of speed is 37.1 miles per hour. And for Nancy, they give us that one too, it's 62 miles per hour. What's unknown is the amount of time that they travel for. All we're told is that Nancy left 3.2 hours later. So she traveled for 3.2 hours less than Eduardo did. So I can let a variable like x equal the amount of time Eduardo travels for. And of course, this is in hours. So then based on the problem, we can also say that x, again, the amount of time Eduardo travels for, minus 3.2 is going to be equal to the amount of time Nancy travels for. Because again, in the problem, it says that Nancy left 3.2 hours later. So she travels for 3.2 hours less than Eduardo does. So whatever Eduardo travels, which is x in this case, we subtract away 3.2 from that, and we get Nancy's travel time. If we take their rate of speed, and we multiply it by the amount of time they travel, we get a distance for each one of them. So if I take Eduardo's rate of speed, which is 37.1, and I multiply it by the amount of time he travels for, which is x, I have Eduardo's distance. This is how far he's going to travel. I can do the same thing for Nancy. She's traveling at 62 miles per hour, and she's doing so for x minus 3.2 hours. This is Nancy's distance. Now, if I sum these two amounts together, remember it's gonna equal 297.1, because the key is how long does Nancy have to travel before they are 297.1 miles apart? So before the sum of the individual distances equals this. So if we go through and just solve this equation, we can get that answer. So 37.1x plus 62 times x is 62x minus 62 times 3.2 is 198.4. And this equals 297.1. So then if I combine like terms here, 37.1 plus 62 is 99.1. And then of course x comes along for that ride. So then minus 198.4, this equals 297.1. All right, so I'm going to add 198.4 to both sides of the equation. That's going to go away. I'm going to have 99.1x is equal to 297.1 plus 198.4 is 495.5. We'll finish this up by dividing both sides of the equation by 99.1. That'll cancel with that, and I'll just have x over here. 495.5 divided by 99.1 is 5. So x equals 5. So that doesn't answer our question, though. Let's go back up and make sense of this. So again, x was the amount of time that Eduardo travels for. And again, we found that to be 5. And so 
5 minus 3.2 or 1.8 is the amount of time that Nancy travels for. So to answer this, we're going to say that Nancy, Nancy travels for 1.8 hours when they are 297.1 miles apart. And that's specifically what it asked you for. It asked you for how long does Nancy need to travel before they are 297.1 miles apart. It doesn't ask you anything about Eduardo. So you put that down as your answer and that's it. Now, of course, you want to check to make sure that it's right. And what you're going to do is you're going to find out how far did Eduardo travel in five hours. And you're going to add that to how long did Nancy travel in 1.8 hours. And that distance should be 297.1 miles. You can plug that into this original formula. Just plug in a five here and here. 37.1 times five is 185.5. Five minus 3.2 we know is 1.8. 1.8 times 62 is 111.6. And then if we sum these two amounts, we do in fact get 297.1. So this shows us that our answer is in fact correct. Nancy is gonna travel for 1.8 hours. And at that point, they're gonna be 297.1 miles apart. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on applications of linear equations, part 2. Okay, so Dan drove to the train station and back. It took 2.7 hours longer to go there than it did to come back. The average speed on the trip there was 31.5 miles per hour. The average speed on the trip back was 72 miles per hour. How many hours did the trip there take? So this is what we're trying to figure out. How many hours did the trip there take? Now, by this point, you should have memorized the distance formula. The distance traveled equals the rate of speed times the amount of time traveled. Now, in this problem, we're told the rate of speed, but we're not told anything about the time other than it took 2.7 hours longer to go there than it did to come back. So let's let a variable like x be used to represent either the time for the trip there or the time for the trip back. Doesn't really matter. So let's let x equal the time for the trip there. And this is in hours. So in hours. Now again, it says that it took 2.7 hours longer to go there. So that means that what we can say about the trip back we could say then x minus 2.7 is going to be the time for the trip back. And again, this is in hours. Because it takes 2.7 hours less to go back than it did to get there. Now, what do we know about the rate of speed? Well, we know that the average rate of speed on the trip there was 31.5 miles per hour. And we know that the average rate of speed on the trip back was 72 miles per hour. So remember from the distance formula, if I have a rate of speed and I have a time, I have a distance, right? If I'm going 20 miles per hour for seven hours, I went 140 miles, right? If you give me a rate of speed and a time, I can give you a distance. So that's what we have here. So for the trip there, for the trip there, I have a rate of speed that's given to me of 31.5 miles per hour. This is my rate. I have a time that's x. So I'll just write that next to that, 31.5x. This is my time. So when these two are multiplied together, it gives me a distance. So it gives me a distance. Now, for the trip back, I'm given a rate of speed of 72 miles per hour. So that's my rate. And then my time, which is right here, is x minus 2.7. So this is my time. And again, they're multiplied together. That gives me a distance. Now, what can I do to relate these two trips to each other and make an equation? Well, I'm going to and from the same place. So the distance is the same, right? It's just done in a different amount of time. So the distance for the trip there is equal to the distance for the trip back. So I can say the distance for the trip there 
which I have as 31.5x, is equal to, or is the same as, the distance for the trip back, which is 72 times the quantity, x minus 2.7. So now I have an equation that I can solve for x and figure out my unknown, right, which is the time for the trip there in hours, right, and that's what I want to find out. So if I simplify 31.5x, can't really do anything there, 72 times x is 72x, and then 72 times negative 2.7, is negative 194.4. And I'm gonna subtract 72x from both sides of the equation. 31.5x minus 72x is negative 40.5x. And this will be equal to negative 194.4. Right, this is gonna cancel. So my final step is to divide both sides of the equation by negative 40.5, the coefficient of x. So that's going to cancel with that, and I'll have x is equal to 4.8. Negative 194.4 divided by negative 40.5 is 4.8. So x equals 4.8. But we're not done. We have to make sense of that. So again, x was the time for the trip there in hours. So to kind of answer our word problem, we can say that the trip there, the trip there took... 4.8 hours. Now let's check to make sure that that's true. So if I think about the distances should be the same, right? Because I'm going from one place to another and then back. So the distance is the same. So remember on the trip there, I went 31.5 miles per hour. So 31.5 for 4.8 hours, that'll give me a distance. And that distance would be 151.2 miles. And now I should drive the same distance if I drove for, plug in a 4.8 here and subtract away 2.7. So if I drove for 2.1 hours at a rate of speed of 72 miles per hour. And 72 times 2.1 is in fact 151.2. So in each scenario, the distance is the same and that, that works out here. So what we can say is that our answer is correct. The trip there took 4.8 hours. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on Applications of Linear Equations Part 2. All right, so we're going to finish up with another motion word problem. So Angel left the mall and traveled toward the street fair at an average speed of 52 miles per hour. Will left 1.2 hours later and traveled in the same direction, but with a speed of 67.6 miles per hour. Find the number of hours Angel traveled before Will caught up. The main thing here is to realize we're trying to find, again, the number of hours Angel traveled before Will caught up. Now, at this point, you should know the distance formula by heart. Distance is equal to rate of speed times the amount of time traveled. If we look at this, we're given rates of speed, but we're not given the amount of time traveled. All we're told is that Will left 1.2 hours after Angel. So let's let a variable like x, let's let x equal the amount of time in hours that Angel travels for. And then we know that Will is gonna travel 1.2 hours less, right? Because he leaves 1.2 hours after Angel. So then we could say x minus 1.2 is the amount of time in hours that Will travels for. Now, if I give you a rate of speed and I give you a time, you can give me a distance, right? If I gave you a rate of speed of 40 miles per hour and I gave you a time of nine hours, well, you could multiply. Right? 40 times 9 is 360, so you could give me a distance back, 360 miles. So that's what we're going to do here. So the rate of speed for Angel is 52 miles per hour, and the rate of speed for Will is 67.6 miles per hour. So Angel travels at 52 miles per hour for X hours. This is his distance. And I'm going to put distance of Angel. And then for Will, he's traveling at 67.6 miles per hour. And for the amount of time, it's going to be the quantity x minus 
That's how many hours he does it for. So this is the distance of Will. Now, let's read back through the problem one more time. So Angel left the mall and traveled toward the street fair at an average speed of 52 miles per hour. Will left 1.2 hours later and traveled in the same direction, but with a speed of 67.6 miles per hour. Find the number of hours Angel traveled before Will caught up. So what does that mean, Will caught up? That means they've traveled the same distance. So that means the distance that Angel traveled will be equal to the distance that Will traveled. So we have the distance for each person. We have the distance that Angel's gonna travel, and the distance that Will's gonna travel. We just have to set them equal to each other and solve for x. So we'll have 52x is equal to 67.6 times the quantity x minus 1.2. So let's solve this guy. So 52x is equal to 67.6 times x is just 67.6x, then minus. 67.6 times 1.2 is 81.12. So if I subtract 67.6x from both sides of the equation, this is going to go away. And then 52x minus 67.6x would be negative 15.6x. And this, of course, equals negative 81.12. Now, divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is negative 15.6. So that cancels with that, and you just have x. Then negative 81.12 divided by negative 15.6 is 5.2. So we get x equals 5.2. So again, x was the amount of time in hours that Angel travels for. And the question asks us specifically, Find the number of hours Angel travels before Will caught up. So X gives us that, and again, X is 5.2. So we can say that Angel travels for 5.2 hours before Will caught up. And we can check that pretty easily. Again, if we just look at the fact that their two distances will be equal. Well, Angel goes 52 miles per hour for 5.2 hours. That's a total of 270.4 miles. And then Will travels for 1.2 hours less, so four hours, at a speed of 67.6 miles per hour. So if I did four times 67.6, I'd also get 270.4. So the distance in each case is the same, so we have the correct answer. Again, find the number of hours Angel traveled before Will caught up. Well, Angel traveled 5.2 hours before Will caught up. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 10. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on proportions. All right, so let's take a look at the first problem. We have x minus 1 over x is equal to 6 over 3. So remember, to set up and solve a proportion equation, you take the denominator from the first, you could say ratio or fraction, however you want to think about this, and multiply it by the numerator of the second one. So denominator of the first times the numerator of the second one. So x times six is six x. You're gonna set this equal to the denominator of the second fraction times the numerator of the first fraction. Now in this case, I'm multiplying three by more than one term. So I've gotta use parentheses because the three has to be multiplied by the x and the negative one. So I'm going to put 3 times the quantity, x minus 1. A very common mistake would just be to have 3x minus 1, like that. And again, you don't want to do that. You need parentheses around the x minus 1 so that the 3 gets distributed to each term. So once you set up your equation, it's pretty easy, right? From this point on, it's kind of the same as what we've been doing since we started solving linear equations in one variable. So we have 6x on the left, on the right, 3 times x is 3x, then minus 3 times 1 is 3, and essentially I just need to move this over here. So I'm going to subtract 3x away from both sides of the equation. This is gone. I'm going to have 6x minus 3x, that's 3x, and on the right I'm going to have negative 3. Very easy to finish this up. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 3, the coefficient of x, and I'm going to end up with x is equal to negative 3 over 3 is negative 1. All right, let's plug this back in for x and see if we got the right answer. 
All right, so I'm going to plug a negative 1 in for x there and there. So I'd have negative 1 minus 1 over negative 1 is equal to 6 over 3. Now, negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So I'd have negative 2 over negative 1, which simplifies to just 2. Over here, you basically have 6 over 3, which means 6 divided by 3. That's also 2. So you'd end up with 2 equals 2. And we know our solution here, x equals negative 1, is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one now. So we have 4 over 11 is equal to v minus 11 over v. So again, I'm going to cross multiply and set up an equation. So I'm going to have this 11 here. And I'm going to multiply by this quantity here, which is v minus 11. So 11 times the quantity v minus 11. Remember to use parentheses here, v minus 11. And I'm going to set this equal to, I have this v over here times this 4 over here. So v times 4 is just 4v. All right, so on the left side, I'm going to use my distributive property. 11 times v is 11v. Then minus 11 times 11, that's 121. This is equal to 4v. Now, in order to get the variable term on one side and just a number on the other, kind of the quick way to do it would just be to subtract 11v away from both sides of the equation. So this would cancel out. And on the left, I would have negative 121. This is going to be equal to 4v minus 11v would be negative 7v. Now, as a final step to get v by itself, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 7. So now this is going to cancel with this. And I'm just going to have v on the right side of the equation, and it's isolated. On the left side, negative 121 over negative 7, we really can't simplify that. All we can do is just say that it's positive. So we'll put positive 121 over 7. So we're going to go back up and check our result, which is v equals 121 over 7. All right, so we're going to plug this in for v here and here. So on the left, I just have 4 elevenths. This is equal to, in the numerator, I'll have 121 over 7 minus, then for 11, I'm going to multiply it by 7 over 7, all right, so I can have a common denominator. So this would be 77 over 7, all right, 77 divided by 7 is 11. I just rewrote it. Then for the denominator here, I have V, which again, I'm going to plug in a 121 over 7. So 121 over 7. So on the left again, 4 elevenths. On the right, 121 minus 77 is 44. So I'd have 44 over 7. And then this would be divided by 121 over 7. So basically, to divide these fractions, I would multiply this first one by the reciprocal of the second one. 7 would come up here. 121 would go down there. And I can just erase this from here. And I know that the 7s would cancel completely. So that's gone. And then 44 and 121 are both divisible by 11. So 44 divided by 11 is 4. 121 divided by 11 is 11. And you'd end up with 4 over 11, which is exactly what you have here. And so our solution, which was v equals 121 over 7, is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have x minus 11 over 9 is equal to x minus 1 over 5. So I'm going to start out by taking this denominator here and multiply it by this numerator over here. Again, remember, if you're multiplying by more than one term, you need to make sure that you're using parentheses. I want 9 to be multiplied by both x and negative 1. So I'm going to say 9 times the quantity x minus 1, and then is equal to, again, the same thing over here, 5 times this quantity here, this quantity x minus 11. So 5 times the quantity x minus 11. Very important that you use parentheses, otherwise you will not get the correct answer. So use my distributive property to start. 9 times x is 9x. Then minus 9 times 1 is 9. And this equals 5 times x, that's 5x. And then minus 5 times 11 is 55. All right, so I'm going to add 9 to both sides of the equation. That's going to get rid of the number part from over here. And I'm going to subtract 5x from both sides of the equation. That's going to get rid of the variable term from this side. 
So over here, I'll just have a variable term. Over here, I'll just have a number. This is exactly what I want. So 9x minus 5x is 4x. Over here, negative 55 plus 9 is negative 46. Okay, now I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which is 4. And so this is going to cancel with this. So I'm just going to have an x. And this equals negative 46 divided by 4. That's not going to give me a whole number, so I'm just going to reduce the fraction. So I know it's going to be negative. And then if I divide 46 by 2, I'd get 23. So negative 23 over 4 divided by 2 is 2. So negative 23 halves is our solution. All right, let's check our solution now. And I'm going to plug a negative 23 halves in everywhere I see an x. So that's going to be here and here. So I'm going to start out with negative 23 halves minus 11. I'm going to make this easy on myself and just write this 11 as 22 over 2. All right, so I have a common denominator. Then this is over 9. And we're saying this is equal to, up here we have x, so we're going to say negative 23 halves minus 1. I'm just going to write 2 over 2. All right, again, so I have a common denominator. Then this is over 5. So negative 23 minus 22 would be negative 45. So you'd have negative 45, and then over 2, and then that's over 9. And then for the purposes of us working with fractions, I'm going to write this as 9 over 1. Now this is equal to, over here I had negative 23 over 2 minus 2 over 2. So that would be negative 25 over 2. And then this is over 5, and I'm again going to write this as 5 over 1. So now I'm going to take this fraction here, negative 45 halves, I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal of this fraction here. The reciprocal of 9 over 1 is 1 9th. So we can see what's going to cancel. This would cancel with this and give me a 5. So I can kind of erase this now and just say I have negative 5 halves. This is equal to, over here I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have negative 25 halves times the reciprocal of this guy. The reciprocal of 5 over 1 is 1 5th. And so we're going to see that this is going to cancel with this and give me a 5. So then I can erase this and just say I have negative 5 halves equals negative 5 halves. And so we can say our solution, which is x equals negative 23 halves, is correct. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 10 twelfths is equal to v minus 9 over v plus 11. So again, I'm going to take this denominator, multiply it by this numerator, and this numerator here is a quantity, so 12 times the quantity v minus 9. Again, make sure you use parentheses around v minus 9. I need 12 to multiply v and also negative 9. This is equal to this denominator, v plus 11, times this numerator, which is 10. Again, make sure you use parentheses, so 10 times v plus 11, right, this quantity. All right, so use our distributive property, 12 times v is 12v minus 12 times 9, that's 108. Then this equals 10 times v is 10v. Then plus 10 times 11 is 110. So to get all the variable terms on the left, I'm going to subtract 10v away from both sides. So that's going to go away. And then to get all the numbers on the right, I will add 108 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. And so on the left, 12v minus 10v is 2v. On the right, 110 plus 108. And now we just want to solve for v. So I divide both sides of the equation by 2, the coefficient of v. And I'll have v is equal to 109. Right, 218 divided by 2 is 109. All right, so let's check our solution. We're going to plug 109 in for v here and here. So I'd have 10 over 12 is equal to 109 minus 9 over 109 plus 11. So the first thing is that 10 over 12, I could really reduce that if I wanted to. Each is divisible by 2. I could write this as 5, right? 10 divided by 2 is 5 over 12 divided by 2 is 6. Over here, 109 minus 9 is 100. And then 109 plus 11 is 120. So each here is going to be divisible by 20. If I divide 100 by 20, I'd get 5. 
If I divide 120 by 20, I get six. So you can see once you simplify each one, you get five six equals five six. And so V equals 109 is the correct solution. All right, let's take a look at a typical word problem that you might see. If five suits are sold for $10.60, how much would 12 suits cost? So the way you're gonna set this up, remember when you're thinking about a unit rate. So if I'm talking about, I have five suits that are sold for $10.60, how do I figure out the cost per suit? So I'd put the dollar amount for all the suits up top. So $10.60 is gonna go on my numerator, and this is over five, suits in the denominator. Now, I could go through and simplify this and get a unit rate, and I could find out what the cost per one suit is, and then I could just multiply that by 12, right, and I can get an answer. Or, what I could do is I could set this equal to the unknown amount, which I could just use a variable for, let's just say x, over 12 suits, 12 suits. Right, I'm setting up a proportion. I'm saying that $10.60 for five suits will be equal to or the same as some unknown, which we're gonna solve for, for 12 suits. Now net in the end, this variable x is gonna give me a value that when divided by 12, gives me the same unit price or the same price per one suit as over here, right? And I'll show you that I'll do it both ways. So I'm gonna multiply this times this. And when you work with a rate, remember you have all these different units that are going on. You just need to worry about the number part. So I'm just gonna multiply five times X. I don't need to write suits in there. I'm just gonna write five times X or five X. And I'm gonna set this equal to, we have 12 suits and I'm multiplying this by $10.60. Again, don't worry about the units. So I'm just gonna multiply 12 times 10.6, you can put 10.60 or just 10.6, is the same value. All right, so let's figure out what this is. So we have 5x is equal to 12 times 10.6 is 127.2. Now if I divide both sides of the equation by five, I'll have x is equal to 25.44. So remember, X was the cost for 12 suits, right? X was the cost for 12 suits. So let me erase everything. We're just gonna write up here, it would cost $25.44 for 12 suits. Now, let me kind of prove this to you. I could plug 25.44 in there and we could go through and prove that one side equals the other but I wanna show you that it's the same unit rate in each case. So over here we have $10.60 for five suits. So if I divide 10.60 by five, I'm gonna get 2.12. So really, the cost per suit, it's $2.12 per one suit, All right? This is the unit rate. So you're taking your total dollar amount, the total amount you spent, and you're dividing it by the total quantity that you received to get the amount you spent per each unit. So we end up with $2.12 per one suit. If I took this amount, one suit is $2.12, and I multiplied it by 12, I would in fact get 25.44, or I would get a cost of $25.44 for 12 suits. So kind of two different ways to solve this problem. The first method and kind of the faster method would be to set up a proportion, just like we did here. And basically we're just saying that these two unit rates will end up being the same. You have $10.60 for five suits, and we're setting that equal to an unknown amount for 12 suits, right? When you cross multiply and set up the equation, you solve for the unknown, you get the correct answer of $25.44 for 12 suits. The other way would be to calculate the unit rate right off the bat, right? So you take the known information, get a unit rate, which is $2.12 per one suit, and then you could multiply $2.12 times 12, that's the number of suits you're looking for the cost for, and you'd find out also that it's $25.44 for 12 suits. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on proportions. All right, so we're gonna start out with 12 over 10 equals x over x minus three. 
So to set up and solve a proportion equation, basically you just have to remember that when you have a proportion, it means that the cross products have to be equal. So in other words, I can take the denominator of the first fraction and multiply it by the numerator of the second fraction. So 10 times x, that would be 10x. And this has to be equal to the denominator of the second fraction, which in this case is x minus 3, times the numerator of the first fraction, which is 12. So I would have 12 times the quantity x minus 3. And make sure that you use parentheses here. I'm multiplying this whole quantity x minus 3 by 12. A common mistake is just to put 12 out in front and think that you have 12x minus 3. You need the parentheses because 12 has to be multiplied by both x and negative 3. So once you've set up your equation, it's no different than what we've been doing since we started. We would simplify each side completely. So the left side is 10x. I don't really need to do anything with that. On the right side, I'd use my distributive property. 12 times x is 12x minus 12 times 3 is 36. Now I'm going to move all the variable terms to one side and all the numbers to the other. So I'm going to subtract 12x away from both sides of the equation. So that's going to go away. And on the left, I'm just going to have negative 2x, right? 10x minus 12x is negative 2x. And on the right, I have negative 36. So I have my variable term on one side and I have a number on the other. Nothing else we really need to do here other than isolate the variable. So to isolate x, I just divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of x, which in this case is negative 2. So this will cancel with this and give me x. Over here, negative 36 divided by negative 2 is 18. So x equals 18 is my solution. And again, we always want to check to make sure we got the right answer. So we plug 18 back in for x in the original equation, and we see if the left and the right side are equal. So we're going to have 12 over 10 is equal to plugging in 18 up top over 18 minus 3 in the denominator. So 18 minus 3 is 15. I can go ahead and just do that. And really, let's just simplify each fraction. So on the left side, each is divisible by 2. 12 divided by 2 would be 6. 10 divided by 2 would be 5. So this is 6 fifths. Each here is divisible by 3. 18 divided by 3 is 6. 15 divided by 3 is 5. So you see if you simplify each fraction, you get 6 fifths equals 6 fifths. And so our solution here, x equals 18, is correct. All right, for the next problem, we have negative 7p over p plus 4 is equal to negative 3 tenths. So again, I'm going to take the denominator of one fraction. You could say the first fraction. Multiply it by the numerator of the second fraction. So p plus 4, that quantity, is being multiplied by negative 3. I've got to make sure that I have negative 3 outside of a set of parentheses. Right? p plus 4, that quantity, has to be multiplied by negative 3. So we put this inside of parentheses. This is equal to the denominator of the second fraction times the numerator of the first fraction. So 10 times negative 7p. And then once you've set this up, you just go through and solve it like you normally would. Use your distributive property to remove parentheses. So negative 3 times p is negative 3p. And then you'd have negative 3 times 4, that's negative 12. So minus 12, and this equals. Here we have 10 times negative 7p. That's going to be negative 70p. All right, so I want all my variable terms on one side, all my numbers on the other. So really to do that, all I need to do is just add 3p to both sides of the equation. That's going to go away. On the left side, I'm just going to have negative 12. On the right side, negative 70p plus 3p is negative 67p. And now I just want to isolate the variable p. So I divide both sides of the equation by negative 67, which is the coefficient of p. So this cancels with this, and I just have p. Over here, negative 12 over negative 67. I really can't do anything to simplify that other than just to say that it's positive, right? So I just write this as 12 over 67. So p equals 12 over 67. All right, so I'm going to plug 12 over 67 in for p here and here. I'm going to see if the left and the right side are equal. So I would have negative 7 times 12 over 67. And this is over 
12 over 67 plus 4. All right, so this should be equal to negative 3 tenths. So when I multiply here, I can't cross cancel. 67 is not divisible by 7. So I can just multiply negative 7 times 12. That's going to give me negative 84. So I would have negative 84 over 67. That's my numerator. In the denominator, I want to get a common denominator here to add. So I would multiply 4. We write this as 4 over 1 times 67 over 67. So 4 times 67 is 268. So what I would have, let's put equals negative 3 tenths here. In the denominator, I'll have 12 plus 268 over the common denominator of 67. So 12 plus 268 is 280. So I'd have negative 84 over 67. This is divided by 280 over 67. And this should be equal to negative 3 tenths. So for this, I'm just going to divide with fractions. So I'm going to take this first fraction, negative 84 over 67, and I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal of this fraction, which is 67 over 280, and this should be equal to negative 3 tenths. So we know that this will cancel with this, and then to think about, okay, we have negative 84 now, negative 84 over 280, this should be equal to negative 3 tenths, and what can I do to simplify this? Well, if I think about 84, if I think about 84, it's 7 times 3 times 2 times 2. Then if I think about 280, it's 7 times 2 times 2, that would be 28, times 10, which would be 2 times 5. So I can think about the GCF. as 7 times 4, or 28. And you can see that if you canceled all this, you'd be left with 3 in the numerator over 2 times 5, or 10 in the denominator. The only thing I'm missing is this negative sign out in front. right? So if we kind of just think about dividing the numerator and denominator here by the GCF, which is 28, well, negative 84 divided by 28 would give me negative 3. And we know that 280 divided by 28 would be 10. So you'd have negative 3 tenths equals negative 3 tenths. And so our solution, which was P equals 12 over 67, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on proportions. All right, so let's take a look at our first problem. We have K plus 8 over 12 is equal to 5K plus 6 over 4. So again, you set up your equation by cross multiplying. So you'll take the denominator of the first fraction, which is 12, multiply by the numerator of the second fraction which is 5k plus 6. So you've got to use parentheses here because you want 12 to be multiplied by each term. So times 5k and also times 6. So we put 12 times the quantity, 5k plus 6. This is equal to, we take the denominator of the second fraction, multiply it by the numerator of the first fraction. So again, same scenario. You have 4 times this quantity, k plus 8. Very important that you remember to put these quantities, these amounts that have more than one term, inside of parentheses. Otherwise, you'll end up with the wrong answer. If I just put 4k plus 8 like that, I'm not multiplying 4 times 8. I'm just doing it times k, and so that's going to give me the wrong answer. All right, so once you've set this up, pretty much the same thing as what we've been doing. We're going to use our distributive property to simplify. 12 times 5k is 60k. Then plus 12 times 6 is 72. This equals 4 times k is 4k. Then plus 4 times 8 is 32. Now I want all my variable terms on one side and all my numbers on the other. So let's do this in one step. Let's subtract 4k away from each side. That will go away. And let's subtract 72 away from both sides. That will go away. So if I look at 60k minus 4k, that's 56k. And this is equal to, I have 32 minus 72, and that's going to give me negative 40. So negative 40 here. And now, I just want to solve for k. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 56. That's going to cancel, and I'll have just k over here. 
this is equal to, I have a negative. If I think about what the common factors are between 40 and 56, to keep it simple, I can think of 40 as eight times five, and 56 is eight times seven. So the GCF there is eight. So 40 divided by eight would be five, and 56 divided by eight would be seven. So I'd end up with K equals negative five sevenths. All right, so now I'm gonna plug a negative five sevenths in for K. And so I'd have negative five sevenths plus eight. Now I need a common denominator add. So I'm just gonna write eight as 56 over seven, right? 56 divided by seven is eight. Now this is over 12. And this should be equal to, now over here I'll have five times, where K I'm plugging in negative five sevenths, then plus six, and then over four. All right, so negative five plus 56 is 51. So I would have 51 over seven, and then this is divided by 12. And for the purposes of us working with fractions, we'll write 12 over one. And then this is equal to, over here I have five times negative five, that's negative 25 sevenths, and then plus six. Now six I'm gonna write as 42 over seven, just so I can have a common denominator here. Remember 42 over seven is the same thing as six. Then this is over four. And again, because I'm working with fractions, I'm gonna write it as four over one. So on the left side I have 51 sevenths divided by 12 over one. So I take the first fraction, 51 sevenths, and I multiply it by the reciprocal of the second, so 1 12th. So 51 and 12 are each divisible by three. 51 divided by three is 17, and 12 divided by three is four. So this will end up being 17 over, seven times four, which is 28. Now over here on the right, negative 25 plus 42 is 17. So I would have 17 sevenths divided by four over one. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna take my 17 sevenths, 17 sevenths, and I'm gonna multiply it by the reciprocal of this, which is one fourth. And you can see already this is gonna work out. I'll have 17 over 28 over here. 17 times one is 17. Seven times four is 28. 17 over 28 is equal to 17 over 28. And so we can say our solution, K equals negative five sevenths is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on proportions. So we're going to take a look at 4 over r minus 3 is equal to 12 over 11 r minus 1. So we're going to set up an equation here. Remember if you have a proportion it must be true that the cross products are equal. So that means the denominator of this first fraction times the numerator of this second fraction so 12 times the quantity r minus three. When you're multiplying 12 times this quantity, you gotta use parentheses. You need 12 to be multiplied by each term. This should be equal to this denominator here, the denominator of the second fraction, times this numerator here. So four times this quantity, 11r minus one. And again, make sure you use parentheses here. I need to multiply four times 11r and also negative one. So once you've set this up, you just wanna go through and solve. So I would use my distributive property here to simplify. 12 times r is 12r, then minus 12 times three is 36. This is equal to four times 11r, that's 44r, then minus four times one is four. All right, so we want all the variable terms on one side, all the numbers on the other. So I'm gonna add 36 to both sides of the equation. So that's gonna take care of that. And I'm also gonna subtract 44r from both sides of the equation. So that's gone. And what do we have left here? 12r minus 44r is gonna be negative 32r. So negative 32r, and this is equal to negative four plus 36 is gonna be 32. So we have negative 32r equals 32. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 32 which is the coefficient of r. This will cancel with this, and I'll have r by itself on the left, and this is equal to 32 divided by negative 32, which is negative one. So r equals negative one is our solution. All right, so I'm just gonna plug a negative one in everywhere I see r. So I'm gonna have four over. For r, I'm gonna plug in a negative one, and then minus three, 
and this equals 12 over, we have 11 times r, so we have 11 times negative 1, and then minus 1. So then we'll have over here, 4 over, negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. We know this would simplify to negative 1. And then over here I have 12 over, 11 times negative 1 is negative 11, negative 11 minus 1 is negative 12. So 12 over negative 12 is negative 1. Negative 1 equals negative 1. So we can say our solution here, r equals negative 1, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on proportions. All right, let's take a look at y minus 10 over 2y plus 8 is equal to negative 11 over 12. So remember, when we're working with proportions, it has to be true that the denominator of your first fraction which in this case would be this one, 2y plus 8, times the numerator of the second fraction, which would be negative 11. So negative 11 times the quantity, 2y plus 8. And we're using parentheses here because I need to multiply negative 11 by each term here. It's got to be multiplied by both 2y and 8. This has to be equal to the denominator of the second fraction, which is 12, times the numerator of the first fraction. Right, so the cross products have to be equal. So the numerator up here is y minus 10. And again, this is a quantity, so we're going to put this inside of parentheses. 12 has to be multiplied by y and negative 10. All right, so let's simplify. Negative 11 times 2y is negative 22y. And then negative 11 times 8 would be minus 88. This is equal to 12 times y, which is 12y. And then minus 12 times 10, that's 120. So now I want all my variable terms on one side and all the numbers on the other. So I'm going to subtract 12y away from both sides of the equation. And I'm going to also add 88 to both sides of the equation. So this is gone, and this is gone. On the left, I have negative 22y minus 12y. That's going to be negative 34y. And this equals negative 120 plus 88. And so that's negative 32. So we have negative 34y equals negative 32. So we divide both sides of the equation by the coefficient of y, which is negative 34, so that we can isolate y. So this will cancel with this. And I'll just have y. And over here, we know it would be positive. And each is divisible by 2. If I divide 32 by 2, I'd get 16. If I divide 34 by 2, I'd get 17. So we'd have positive 16 seventeenths. So again, y equals 16 seventeenths. All right, so let's check our answer here. I'm going to plug in a 16 seventeenths everywhere I see a y and see if the left and the right side are equal. So I'd have 16 seventeenths, 16 seventeenths minus 10. So I can go ahead and write this with a common denominator. If I multiply 10 by 17 over 17, I'd have 170 over 17. And this is over, we have 2 times y, so 2 times 16 over 17, plus we have 8. So I know I'm going to need a common denominator of 17. So if I multiply 8 times 17 over 17, I'd have 136 over 17. So we'll just go ahead and write that now. And this equals negative 11 twelfths. So this equals negative 11 twelfths. All right, so over here on the left, 16 seventeenths minus 170 seventeenths. We know that's negative. 16 minus 170 is negative 154. So this would be negative 154 over 17. And then this is over. 2 times 16 is 32. So I would have 32. I'll just go ahead and kind of do this in one step here. I'll put 32 here. 32 plus 136, which is 168 over that common denominator of 17. So this, again, should be equal to negative 11 twelfths. So now we're dividing with fractions. So I'm going to take this first fraction, negative 154 over 17. I'm going to multiply it by the reciprocal of this fraction. So that's going to be 17 over 168. And this should be equal to negative 11 twelfths. All right, so we know that this would cancel with this. And if I think about 154, it's 7 times 11 times 2. Then if I think about 168, it's 2 times 2 times 2 times 7 times 3. 
So the GCF, we have a 7 and a 7, and we have a 2 and a 2. The GCF is going to be 14. You can see that if I canceled the 7 and the 2 there, I just have 11 left. So this would be negative 11, and then over here. What about 168? Well, if the 2 and the 7 were gone, I just have 2 times 2, which is 4, times 3, which is 12. So I'd have a 12 there. I can erase this. I don't need it anymore. And then this is equal to negative 11 twelfths. So same value on both the left and the right. So we know our solution is correct. Again, y is equal to 16 seventeenths. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on proportions. So we're going to take a look at a word problem. If 7 gallons of gas costs $27.58, how much would it cost to fill a 40 gallon tank? So we've looked at a problem like this before, and basically there's two different ways you can go about solving it. Kind of the first way would be to find the unit rate. So in other words, if 7 gallons of gas cost $27.58, I would take $27.58, put that in my numerator, and put it over 7 gallons of gas. Now I can find the unit rate by dividing 27.58 by 7. That would give me the cost per 1 gallon of gas. And we'll do that in a minute. The other way to do it is to set up a proportion. So you have $27.58 to 7 gallons of gas would be equal to an unknown amount in dollars, we'll use X to represent that, to 40 gallons of gas. Now if we set up a proportion like this, we just solve it like we normally would. Now because we have some units involved, when we have a rate we have different units so we write it with the units. Just ignore that and just work with the number parts. So I would have 7 times x or 7x and then I'd have 27.58 times 40. Again, ignore the units. You don't need to put those in. So this is equal to 1,103.2. Now I just divide both sides of the equation by 7 in order to isolate the variable x and that's going to give me 157.6. Now, that's my value for x. So what I'm saying is that, if I went back and plug this in, it's $157.60 to purchase 40 gallons of gas, right, in this scenario. Now, how do we check something like this? Well, again, you could cross multiply and check it, or you could see if the unit rate is the same in each case. So. To calculate the unit rate here, I just take 27.58 and divide by 7. That gives me 3.94. So the unit rate is $3.94 per 1 gallon, 1 gallon of gas. Now we're just taking the same unit rate and saying, okay, well, we're buying 40 gallons of gas now. How much would that cost? So I can just take this amount, the price per 1 gallon, and multiply it by 40, and I should get this amount here. So 3.94 times 40 is in fact 157.60. So we can say that the unit rate would be the same in each case. If a person spends $27.58 on 7 gallons of gas, they're paying the same price per gallon as if they pay $157.60 for 40 gallons of gas. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 11. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving linear inequalities, part one. All right, so let's take a look at our first problem. We have x minus 6 is greater than negative 2. So just like when we're solving equations, we want to isolate our variable on one side. So in this case, it's just we're isolating it on one side of the inequality. So in order to do that, I see that I have this minus 6 here. So just like with equations, I'm allowed to add or subtract the same number, 2 or in the case of subtraction, from both sides of an inequality. This rule is known as the addition property of inequality. So I can add 6 over here as long as I add 6 over here, and I'll preserve the solution. So this would cancel, and I would have x is greater than negative 2 plus 6 is 4. So there's my solution. x is greater than 4. 
So in the lesson, I taught you how to write your solution using something known as interval notation. So essentially what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the smallest value that works as a solution, and I'm going to put that on the left-hand side. Now, what's the smallest possible value that x can take on? Well, if I look at the graph here, x can't be 4, but it can be anything larger than 4. And that presents kind of a problem. If we want to write a number down that's the smallest possible value, we really can't write an exact value because if I put down, let's say, 4.1, and I say, that, okay, that's the smallest value you can take on. Well, I could find something smaller, 4.01, or 4.0000001, or 4.0000000001, you know, so on and so forth. So in order to kind of solve that problem, I'm just going to write down a 4 here. And I'm going to put a parenthesis next to 4 to say that it's not included, not included in the solution. But anything that you could think of, any possible value that's greater than 4, no matter how close you want to get to 4, as long as it's larger than 4, it's a solution. But 4 itself is not. So I put 4, and then I put a parenthesis to say it's not included. Put a comma, then put the largest possible value. Now, since x is anything larger than 4, really there is no largest possible value. So in order to solve this, we use the symbol for infinity. Infinity, and that looks like a sideways 8. This is also not going to be included, so we're going to put a parenthesis there as well. So in interval notation, we have a parenthesis, 4, comma, infinity, another parenthesis. Now graphically, we kind of do something that's similar to this. At 4, I'm going to put a parenthesis that faces to the right. It's always going to face towards the solution region. And then I'm going to shade all of this, everything to the right of 4, and I'm even going to shade that arrow in to say that it could be any amount larger than 4. 4 is not included, and again, that's why I have the parenthesis there. So this is not included. So the next one we're looking at, 4 is greater than or equal to y over 5. Just like with an equation, I'm allowed to multiply both sides of an inequality by the same non-zero number. But there's one key difference. If I multiply by a negative number, I have to flip the direction of the inequality. If I multiply by a positive number, I don't need to do anything. So that's the multiplication property of inequality. I can multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by the same positive number and preserve the solution. If I multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, I must flip the inequality. I must flip the inequality. So in this particular case, to isolate y, I need to multiply both sides of the inequality by 5. Right? That's what I'm dividing y by. 5 is a positive number, so I don't need to flip the inequality. This cancels with this. And on the left, I have 5 times 4, that's just 20. And this is greater than or equal to y. And if I want to, I can kind of write the variable on the left. You just have to be very careful. 20 is greater than or equal to y is the same thing as saying y is less than or equal to 20. So again, we want to write this in interval notation and then graph it. So if I think about y is less than or equal to 20, the smallest possible value, is there going to be one? Well, no, because y can be anything less than or equal to 20. So that means that the smallest possible value that I'm going to list, I'm just going to use negative infinity because there is no smallest possible value. And when I use infinity or negative infinity, I always use a parenthesis to say it's not included. Now, for the largest possible value, y is anything that is less than or equal to the number 20. So that means that it can be 20 or anything less. So the largest possible value that this can take on is 20. And to say that 20 is included, we're going to use a bracket. This means it's included. And again, the parenthesis means it's not included. So when we graph, we're going to put a bracket at 20, facing to the left, facing to the solution region. And we're just going to shade everything to the left, including the arrow to say, hey, 20 is included, so is included. 
and everything to the left is as well. All right, let's take a look at negative 50 is less than or equal to 5r. So if I want to isolate my variable r here, I'm going to divide both sides of the inequality by 5. On the left, negative 50 divided by 5 is negative 10. And then is less than or equal to, on the right, 5 and 5 cancel out, and I just have r. So negative 10 is less than or equal to r. Or I could flip that around and write that r is greater than or equal to negative 10. You just have to be very, very careful when you flip these around. I can't just flip this with this and say, okay, well, r is less than or equal to negative 10. That, that doesn't work. Negative 10 is less than or equal to r, so therefore r is greater than or equal to negative 10. Just look at the direction. This right here is facing the open side. So it's got to face the open side over here as well. So you got to make sure that you get that right if you're going to put the variable from the right onto the left, right, if you're changing where it is. So r is greater than or equal to negative 10. And again, in interval notation, we think about the smallest possible value that r can take on. In this case, it's going to be negative 10, right, because it's anything greater than or equal to negative 10. So here or anything larger. So I put negative 10 down and I put a bracket to say that it's included, is included. Then comma. Now r can also be anything larger. So that includes out to infinity. So for the largest possible value, I use the infinity symbol. And I always use a parenthesis there to say it's not included. So this is your interval notation. And then graphically, I would put a bracket at negative 10 facing to the right. And I would shade everything to the right, including this arrow. So negative 10, again, is included. And that's why we have the bracket. And then I shaded everything to the right. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have x over 4 is less than or equal to negative 1 half. So really, I'm going to think about this as 1 fourth times x is less than or equal to negative 1 half. And to isolate x here, I want to multiply both sides of the inequality by the reciprocal of 1 fourth. So the reciprocal of 1 fourth is 4 over 1. I got to do it to this side as well. Now I'm still multiplying by a positive number, so I don't need to flip the inequality. So this will cancel out, and I'll have x is less than or equal to, over here, negative 1 half times 4 over 1. This will cancel with this and give me a 2. So basically I'd have negative 1 times 2 or negative 2. So x here is less than or equal to negative 2. So in interval notation, what does this look like? Well, think about it. If x can be negative 2 or anything less. So the smallest possible value, since it can be anything less than negative 2, there's not going to be one. So we use negative infinity. And we put a parenthesis next to it to say that's not included. And then the largest possible value would be negative 2. right? Because x can be less than or equal to negative 2. So because it can also be equal to negative 2, we use a bracket. Again, this means it's included, so is included. All right, so graphically, again, I'm going to put a bracket facing to the left at negative 2. And again, it faces to the left because that's our solution region. So we're going to shade all this, and we're going to shade that arrow. And so this is x is less than or equal to negative 2. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. So we have negative 3x is greater than negative 9. So in order to get x by itself, I want to divide both sides of the inequality by negative 3. Now, red flag should come up. As soon as you divide by a negative, you got to be thinking immediately, I've got to flip. Flip the direction of the inequality. So instead of greater than, it should be less than. So you got to do that right away so you don't forget. So this cancels with this, and I have x. And over here, negative 9 divided by negative 3 is 3. So I get x is less than 3. In an interval notation, the smallest possible value, there won't be one, right? Because x can be anything less than 3. So we use negative infinity for that. Then for the largest possible value, well, it can be anything smaller than 3. So we're going to put 3 there and put a parenthesis next to it to say 3 is not included. 
And then graphically, again, put a parenthesis at three, facing to the left, and then shade everything to the left, including the arrow. So this is X is less than three. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on Solving Linear Inequalities, Part 1. All right, so we want to look at x minus 1 is greater than or equal to 5. So the way we attack this problem, we just think back to when we were solving equations. We want to isolate the variable on one side of the inequality. So same thing, I just want to add 1 to both sides of the inequality. And when I do so, this goes away. And on the left, I just have x, and then is greater than or equal to 5 plus 1 is 6. And so I have my solution. x is greater than or equal to 6. Now, usually with an inequality, your teacher is going to want you to write the answer in interval notation and probably graph it as well. So for interval notation, if we have x is greater than or equal to 6, the smallest possible value that x can take on would be 6. So we write that on the left, and we put a bracket next to 6 to say that 6 is included in our solution. We put a comma, and then the largest possible value won't actually exist, so we're going to put infinity in here for the place of the largest possible value, right? Because x can be anything greater than or equal to 6. So that means if I look at 6 here, it could be 6 or anything to the right of that. So really we'll use infinity there. And because infinity is not really a number, we're going to put a parenthesis next to it because you can't actually get to infinity. All right, so we have our solution in interval notation, and now we just want to graph it. So we want to put a bracket at 6 facing to the right, right? It always faces to the solution region. And then we're going to shade all of this. And so that is x is greater than or equal to 6. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 20 plus x is less than or equal to negative 18. So in order to isolate x, I'm just going to add 20 to both sides of the inequality. This will go away. I will have x is less than or equal to negative 18 plus 20 is 2. So I have x is less than or equal to the number 2. All right, so to write this in interval notation, we know that x is less than or equal to 2. So it can be 2 or anything smaller. So that's going to continue to the left forever and ever and ever. So there's no smallest value that x can take on, so we use negative infinity there. So negative infinity, and we always use a parenthesis with infinity or negative infinity. And then for the largest value that x can take on, we're going to use 2, right? Because x could be 2 or anything less. Now because 2 is included, we use a bracket next to 2. And the same thing goes for when we're graphing. We're going to use a bracket next to 2, and it's going to face to the left. And then we're going to just shade everything in going to the left. So that would be x is less than or equal to 2 graphically and then an interval notation. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on solving linear inequalities part 1. All right, so let's take a look at negative 17 is less than or equal to x minus 17. So in order to solve this inequality, again, I want to isolate x on one side. Now I can add 17 to both sides. This is going to go away. Over here, be very careful. You have negative 17 plus 17. So you don't want to just cross it out and not put anything. Negative 17 plus 17 is 0. So go ahead and write 0 is less than or equal to x. Now on this side, technically you could put plus 0, but x plus 0 is just x, so we just write it as x. Over here, because there's nothing else there, we make sure to write the 0. So we have that 0 is less than or equal to x, or I could write this as x is greater than or equal to 0. Remember, if you're moving your variable from right to left when you're rewriting it, just look at this. x is facing the open side, and x here is facing the open side again. So make sure you look at that. You don't want to just flip the positions and say, OK, well, x is now less than or equal to 0. That would be wrong. All right, so we got x is greater than or equal to 0. And so in interval notation, we're going to put a bracket, and then we're going to put a 0. Right? The smallest value that x can take on is 0, and we put a bracket because that's included. 
then comma. X can be anything larger, so we use infinity here in the space for the largest possible value. So now I'm going to put a parenthesis there because we never want to include infinity. And so graphically, it looks basically the same. We put a bracket at zero facing the direction of the solution, and we shade everything to the right, including that arrow. And so here's your solution. X is greater than or equal to zero in interval notation and then graphically. All right, for the next one, we have K plus 19 is greater than or equal to 38. So to get K by itself, I'm just going to subtract 19 away from both sides of the inequality. This will go away, and I'll have K is greater than or equal to 38 minus 19 is 19. So K is greater than or equal to 19. All right, so now looking at interval notation, my smallest possible value that K can take on is 19. So I'm going to put a bracket there because 19 is included, and I'm going to write 19. That's the smallest value it can take on. Now 19 is somewhere over here. So it could be 19. It could be anything larger, any value larger. So for the largest possible value, we're going to put infinity, right? Because it could be anything larger. So going to the right forever and ever and ever. And we always use a parenthesis when we have infinity. So there's your interval notation. Now graphically, I don't have a notch for 19, so let me just kind of put one in. Let's say this is 19 right here. So I'm going to put a bracket at 19 that faces to the right, the direction of the solution region, and then I'm just going to shade everything to the right, including that arrow. And so this is k is greater than or equal to 19 graphically, and then an interval notation. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on solving linear inequalities part one. All right, for the first problem, we have 3 fourteenths is less than n over 14. So if I want n by itself, I'm dividing n by 14. So to undo that, I'm just going to multiply both sides by 14. So I have 3 fourteenths is less than n over 14. I would multiply this side by 14 and this side by 14. And because I'm multiplying by a positive number, I keep the direction of the inequality the same. So this cancels with this, this cancels with this. Now I'm going to have 3 is less than n, or I could say that n is greater than 3. Again, if you change your variable from being on the right to the left, pay close attention. In this case, n is facing the open side. So when I change it over from being on the right to the left, it's facing the open side again, right? It's a greater than symbol that I'm looking for. n is greater than 3. So let's write this in interval notation. This n is greater than 3. So the smallest value that n can take on, we're going to put 3 down. And 3 is not included, right? It's anything larger than 3. So to say that, I'm going to put a parenthesis next to 3. And then it can be anything larger out to infinity. So my largest value, I'm going to put infinity there. And again, I'm going to use a parenthesis because that's not included. Now, graphically, this looks very similar. At 3, I'm going to put a parenthesis there to say 3 is not included, and it's going to face to the right in the direction of the solution region. Then I'm going to shade everything over here to the right, including that arrow. And so this is n is greater than 3 in interval notation, and then graphically. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 15v is less than negative 60. So to get v by itself, I want to divide both sides of the inequality by the coefficient of v. Now, divide this side by negative 15 and this side by negative 15. Now, this is legal, but I'm dividing by a negative. So if I have an inequality and I'm dividing by a negative or I'm multiplying by a negative, I have to flip. I have to flip the direction of the inequality. So right now it's a less than. I'm going to change it to a greater than have to do that, otherwise you won't get the right answer. So this cancels with this, and I just have v, and then negative 60 divided by negative 15 is 4. So v is greater than 4 is your solution. In an interval notation, we would have 4 as the smallest value, and it's not the actual smallest value, so we're going to use a parenthesis to say 4 is not included, and then it can be anything larger than 4. So for our largest value, we're going to put infinity and put a parenthesis to say that's not included 
either. So graphically, we're going to find 4, and we're going to put a parenthesis at 4, facing to the right, facing the solution region. And the parenthesis says that 4 is not included, and then we just shade everything to the right of 4 to say, hey, all this is in the solution region. Can't be four, but anything larger than four is included, right? Out to infinity, that's why we shade in the arrow as well. So here's V is greater than four in interval notation, and then graphically. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on Solving Linear Inequalities, Part 1. So for the first one, we have P over eight is greater than negative four. So since I'm dividing P by eight, what I want to do to isolate P is multiply by 8. And I'm going to do it to both sides of the inequality so that it's legal. And remember, if I'm multiplying by a positive, I don't need to do anything. Right? I just go through with the multiplication. So this will cancel with this. And on the left, I'll have P. And this is greater than, on the right, negative 4 times 8 is negative 32. So P is greater than negative 32. So we're going to write that in interval notation. So again, P is greater than negative 32. And so what does that look like? So for the smallest possible value, it's not quite negative 32, but that's what we're gonna write. We're gonna write negative 32, and we're gonna put a parenthesis next to negative 32 to say negative 32 is not included. It's anything larger than negative 32, anything you can think of. Then for the largest possible value, there really isn't one, right? This continues to the right forever and ever and ever, so we use infinity for that, okay? We use infinity for that. And then we're going to put a parenthesis next to that to say that that is not included. All right, so graphically, we don't have negative 32 on our number line, but we can put a notch in for that. Let's say this is negative 32 about right here. So I'll say this is negative 32. And basically, all I want to do is put a parenthesis in at negative 32 facing to the right, right? It faces to the solution region. And then I just want to shade everything to the right, including this arrow here. Say, hey, negative 32 is not a solution. That's why I have the parenthesis. But anything after that, anything to the right of that, is part of the solution. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 5 is greater than x over 8. So to isolate x, I'm going to multiply both sides of the inequality by 8. So I have negative 5 is greater than x over 8. Multiply this by 8. Multiply this by 8. And again, if I'm multiplying by a positive, I don't need to do anything with the inequality symbol. Right? I can leave it alone. So 8 times negative 5 is negative 40. This cancels with this, and I'll have is greater than x. So negative 40 is greater than x, or you can say x is less than negative 40. What does that look like in interval notation? Well, for the lowest possible value, for the smallest possible value, think about it. It can't be negative 40, but it can be anything less. Going out to the left forever and ever and ever, so we represent that with negative infinity. Put a parenthesis next to that to say it's not included. And then for the largest possible value, it can't be negative 40, right? But it can be anything less than that. So the largest possible value, we're going to put negative 40, and we're going to put a parenthesis next to it to say that it's not included. Now graphically, again, it looks very similar. We put a parenthesis at negative 40, facing to the left, facing towards the solution region, and then we just shade everything into the left, including that arrow to say, hey, Negative 40 is not included, but anything to the left of that all the way out forever and ever and ever is included in the solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on Solving Linear Inequalities, Part 1. All right, so we want to look at negative 15 is greater than or equal to 15k. So to isolate the variable k, I'm just going to divide both sides of the inequality by 15. On the left, negative 15 divided by 15 is negative 1. And this is greater than or equal to. On the right, 15s cancel out, and I just have k. So negative 1 is greater than or equal to k, or you can say that k is less than or equal to negative 1. Pay close attention when you rewrite this like this. k is facing the pointy side. So k needs to be facing the pointy side over here as well. right? So k is less than or equal to negative 1. So in interval notation, the most k can be is negative 1 but it can also be anything less than that. So that moves to the left forever and ever and ever. So the smallest value, we use negative infinity. And that's never included, so we put a parenthesis there. 
And then for the largest value, remember we said negative one was included. So it can be anything up to and including negative one. And we show that by putting a bracket next to negative one. Let me kind of redraw that. So the bracket again tells me that negative one is included in the solution. Now graphically, I'm just gonna put a bracket at negative one facing the solution region. And then I'm gonna shade everything to the left over here, everything to the left. And so K can be negative one or anything to the left. All right, let's take a look at negative two Z is less than negative 14. So to isolate our variable Z, I wanna divide both sides of the inequality by negative two. But when I divide by a negative, I've gotta flip the direction of the inequality. This has gotta get flipped. So this cancels with this, and I'm going to have a Z. Now flip the inequality and make it greater than. Here it's less than, you flip it, it becomes greater than. Then negative 14 divided by negative two is seven. So I get Z is greater than seven. In interval notation, the smallest possible value Z can take on, it can't be seven, but it can be anything larger. So we're gonna put a seven there and put a parenthesis next to that to say seven is not included. Then I'm gonna put a comma, and then Z can be anything larger than that, going out to the right forever and ever and ever. So we're gonna notate that with infinity, and we'll put a parenthesis next to that as well. Now graphically, I'm gonna put a parenthesis at seven, and it's gonna to face to the right. It's gonna to face to the solution region. And let me redraw that. And then I'm gonna shade everything to the right of seven, including this arrow to say, it can't be seven. That's why we have the parenthesis there, but anything larger, any amount larger, will work as a solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Practice Set 12. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving linear inequalities, part two. All right, so let's look at the first problem. We have 2x minus 6 times the quantity 2x plus 2, and this is greater than 4 times the quantity x minus 3 plus 4x. So the first thing I'm going to do is simplify each side. So I'm going to have 2x, and then I can think of this as negative 6 times 2x, so that'll be minus 12x. I can think of this as negative 6 times 2, so that'll be minus 12. And this is greater than 4 times x is 4x, minus 4 times 3 is 12, and then plus 4x. Now, I can continue simplifying on the left. 2x minus 12x is negative 10x, so negative 10x minus 12. This is greater than, on the right, 4x plus 4x is 8x, and then minus 12. So I want a variable term on one side and a number on the other. So in order to do that, I'm going to subtract 8x from both sides. So that's gonna cancel. And I'm also gonna simultaneously add 12 to both sides. So over here, negative 10x minus 8x is gonna give me negative 18x. And this is greater than, over here, everything's gonna cancel out. So we're gonna put a zero in because everything is canceled. So now I have negative 18x is greater than zero. I divide both sides by negative 18, the coefficient of x. And I remember, because I'm dividing both sides by a negative, I flip the direction of the inequality. Right now it's greater than, I'm gonna make it less than. So this becomes x is less than zero, right? Zero divided by negative 18 is zero. In interval notation, x is less than zero is gonna look like this we'd have negative infinity here, next to parenthesis, comma, and then zero, right? And that'd be next to parenthesis as well. So on the number line, you would use a parenthesis at zero, and it would face to the left because that's the solution region, and you would shade everything to the left, including this arrow. All right, for the next one, I have the opposite of the quantity y plus four, and this is less than negative four times the quantity two y minus six. Now, if I have a negative out in front of a set of parentheses, again, all I basically need to do is change the sign of each term inside the parentheses to get rid of the parentheses. And basically, you want to think about this as, okay, I'm multiplying a negative one times y, so that's negative y, and then a negative one times four, so minus four, right? That's the easy way to think about that. And then as less than, you have negative four times two y, that's negative eight y, and negative four times negative six is plus 24. 
All right, so I want a variable term on one side, a number on the other. So I'm going to add 8y to both sides, and I'm also going to add 4 to both sides. So this will be gone, and this will be gone. On the left side, negative y plus 8y is 7y, and this is less than. On this side, 24 plus 4 is 28. I divide both sides of the inequality now by 7, which is the coefficient of y, and I'll have y is less than 28 divided by 7 is 4. In interval notation, we would have a parenthesis next to negative infinity, comma, and then we'd put 4, and a parenthesis next to that to say 4 is not included. So at 4, I'd put a parenthesis facing left, and then I would shade everything to the left of that number, okay, including that arrow. All right, let's look at another one. I've got negative 3x minus the quantity 1 minus x is greater than negative 3 times the quantity x plus 4. So again, I'm going to simplify each side to start. So I've got negative 3x. I've got a negative out in front of parentheses. So just think about this as negative 1 times 1, that's minus 1, and then negative 1 times negative x is plus x. All right, this is greater than, we'll have negative 3 times x, that's negative 3x, and then negative 3 times 4 is minus 12. All right, so on the left, I can combine negative 3x and x, that's negative 2x, and then minus 1, this is greater than negative 3x minus 12. Now, I'm going to add 3x to both sides of the inequality, and I'm also going to add 1 to both sides of the inequality. So that's going to cancel, and that's going to cancel. Negative 2x plus 3x is x. And this is greater than, we have negative 12 plus 1, that's negative 11. So we get x is greater than negative 11. So x is greater than negative 11. So in interval notation, the smallest value we're going to write, we're going to put negative 11, and that's not included, so we're going to put a parenthesis there, comma, and then infinity for your largest value, right, because this is going to continue forever and ever in the right direction. Graphically, negative 11 is here. We're going to put a parenthesis facing to the right. And again, we're going to shade everything to the right all the way out here to this arrow. All right, let's take a look at one with some fractions involved. We have negative 41 eighths plus 3 halves x plus 10 thirds x is less than 9 fourths x minus 5 fourths. All right, so we can multiply both sides of the inequality by the LCD. And in this case, we have 8 2, 3, 4, and 4. So the LCD would be 8 times 3, or 24. So I'm going to do 24 times this. Remember to use brackets or parentheses. So negative 41 over 8 plus 3 halves x plus 10 thirds x. And then is less than, we have inside of brackets, 9 fourths x minus 5 fourths. All right, so make sure you put 24 over here as well, because again, I've got to multiply both sides by that number to make it legal. All right, so we start out with 24 times negative 41 eighths. The 24 would cancel with the eight and give me a three. Then three times negative 41 would be negative 123. So next I'd have plus 24 times three halves x. So 24 would cancel with two and give me 12. 12 times three is 36. Then times x is 36 x, then plus. Now I've got 24 times 10 thirds x. 24 cancels with 3 and gives me 8. 8 times 10 is 80, so I'd have 80x. This is less than. Now I have 24 times 9 fourths x. 24 would cancel with 4 and give me 6. 6 times 9 is 54, so that's 54x. Then minus 24 times 5 fourths. 24 would cancel with 4 and give me 6. 6 times 5 is 30. All right, so I want to combine like terms here. So I'd have negative 123 plus 36x plus 80x is 116x. And this is less than 54x minus 30. So I want to get a variable term on one side and a number on the other. So let me add 123 to both sides. That's going to go away. And I'm going to have 116x is less than 54x and then negative 30 plus 123 is going to give me 93. So this will be plus 93. 
And then I want to get a variable term alone on this side. So I'm gonna subtract. I'm gonna subtract 54x from both sides. So that's gonna go away. 116 minus 54 is 62. So this is gonna end up being 62x is less than 93. Now, as a final step, I'm gonna get x by itself. So I'm gonna divide both sides by 62, the coefficient of x. So this cancels with this, and I'll have x is less than. 93 and 62 have a common factor of 31. 93 divided by 31 is three. 62 divided by 31 is two. So x is less than three halves. So in interval notation, x is less than three halves is gonna look like this. It's less than three halves, so it's gonna to continue to the left forever and ever and ever. So we put a parenthesis and then a negative infinity. And then for the largest value, we're gonna put three halves. We're gonna put a parenthesis because it's not included. All right, so graphically, we don't have a notch for three halves, but in decimal form, it's 1.5, right? If you divide a three by two, you get 1.5. So that's about right here. Not exactly, but about. So let's say this is three halves or 1.5. So x is less than that, strictly less than that. So let's put a parenthesis there facing to the left. And we're gonna shade everything to the left, including this arrow. All right, let's take a look at some three-part inequalities now. So we have seven x plus one is greater than or equal to negative 48 and less than or equal to eight. So I wanna end up with x isolated in the middle. So the first thing I wanna do is subtract one from each part. And again, I gotta do it to each part. So this is gonna cancel. Negative 48 minus one is negative 49. And eight minus one is seven. Now to isolate x, I'm gonna divide each part by seven. Negative 49 divided by seven is negative seven. Seven cancels with seven and it becomes one. One times x is just x. And then over here, 7 divided by 7 is 1. So x is greater than or equal to negative 7, and it's also less than or equal to 1. So in interval notation, what does this look like? Well, the smallest that x can be is negative 7. And because this is a non-strict inequality, we have this or equals to, we're going to put a bracket there, put negative 7, because negative 7 is included, comma, the largest it can be is 1. And again, it's a non-strict inequality, so we're going to use a bracket. So x can be negative seven and anything larger up to and including the number one. So graphically, at negative seven, we have a bracket that faces to the right. At one, we have a bracket that faces to the left and we shade everything in between. And again, because we have the brackets, negative seven and one are included. So it could be negative seven up to and including the number one. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. We have 9x plus 9 is less than or equal to 63 and greater than negative 45. So again, it's a three-part inequality. So I'm just going to subtract 9 from each part. So this is going to cancel. 63 minus 9 is 54. Negative 45 minus 9 is negative 54. And so now I want x by itself, so I divide each part by 9. So 9 cancels with 9 and becomes 1, so x is in the middle. 54 divided by 9 is 6. Negative 54 divided by 9 is negative 6. So we want this to be in the order of the number line. So negative 6 needs to go to the left, and it's less than x. So this is less than x, and then 6 is going to need to go to the right and it's greater than or equal to x. So six is still greater than or equal to x, and negative six is still less than x. But again, we read this as x is greater than negative six, and x is less than or equal to six. So for interval notation, our smallest value we're gonna write as negative six. It's a strict inequality. X is strictly greater than negative six. So we're gonna put a parenthesis there, and then for the largest value, I'm gonna put six. This is a non-strict inequality, right? We have this or equal to, and so I'm gonna use a bracket there. So that's your interval notation. And then graphically, at negative six, I'm gonna have a parenthesis facing to the right. At positive six, I'm gonna have a bracket facing to the left, and we're gonna shade everything in between. So 
x can be anything larger than negative 6 up to and including positive 6. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on Solving Linear Inequalities Part 2. So let's take a look at our problem. We have 3 times the quantity 5 minus 5x minus 3 times the quantity 2 minus 6x and this is less than negative x plus 3x. So I'm going to simplify each side. So 3 times 5 is 15 then minus 3 times 5x, that's 15x. And then negative 3 times 2 is going to be minus 6. Then negative 3 times negative 6x is plus 18x. And this is less than negative x plus 3x. I can combine like terms there, that's going to be 2x. So negative 15x plus 18x would be 3x. 15 minus 6 would be 9, so plus 9. And this is less than 2x. So I can subtract 3x away from both sides. So that will cancel. And I'll have 9 is less than negative x. So I don't want negative x, I want x. So in order to get x, I can divide both sides by negative 1, or I can multiply by negative 1. So let's multiply by negative 1. But let's remember, if I multiply or divide by a negative, I've got to flip the direction of the inequality. So because this is a less than right now, I've got to make it a greater than. So this will be negative 9 is greater than x. Or I can say that x is less than negative 9. All right, so now let's write this in interval notation and graph it. So x is less than negative 9. So in interval notation, if we think about this, there is going to be no smallest value. So we're going to put negative infinity. And we always put a parenthesis next to that. And for the largest value, well, x can be anything that's less than negative 9. So I'm going to put negative 9. And it can't quite be negative 9, so I'm going to put a parenthesis next to that. Now, graphically, I'm going to put a parenthesis at negative 9. Let's say negative 9 is not included. And then I'm going to shade everything to the left, including that arrow to say negative 9 is not included but x can be anything to the left of that. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on Solving Linear Inequalities Part 2. So let's take a look at our problem. We have negative 2 times the quantity 1 plus 5x. This is greater than or equal to 3 plus 3 times the quantity 1 minus 6x. So I'm going to simplify each side. So I'm going to start with negative 2 times 1, that's negative 2. And then we'd have negative 2 times 5x, that's going to be minus 10x. This is greater than or equal to, we have 3 plus, we have 3 times 1, that's 3, and then minus 3 times 6x, that's 18x. So on the left side, nothing I can really combine. So negative 2 minus 10x, that'll stay as is. This is greater than or equal to. On the right side, 3 plus 3 is 6, so I can put negative 18x plus 6. I want a variable term on one side and a number on the other. So let me add 18x to both sides. And simultaneously, let me add 2 to both sides as well. So this is going to go away, and so is this. So now, on the left, I just have a variable term. Negative 10x plus 18x is 8x. This is greater than or equal to. 6 plus 2 is 8. So now it's very straightforward. We're just going to divide both sides by 8. And so this cancels with this and gives me 1 times x, which is just x. This is greater than or equal to 8 divided by 8 is 1. So we have x is greater than or equal to 1. So let's take a look at this in interval notation. So the smallest x can be is 1. So I'm going to put a bracket to say 1 is included. And that's the smallest number that x can be. Now x can be anything larger than that. So for the largest value, I'm going to use infinity. And I'm always going to put a parenthesis next to that. Now graphically, at the number 1, I'm going to put a bracket that faces to the right. All right. It's going to face to the solution region. And I'm going to shade everything to the right, including that arrow. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on Solving Linear Inequalities Part 2. So we have the negative of the quantity 1 plus 2x. And that's greater than negative 6 times the quantity x minus 4 minus 1. All right, so I'm going to distribute the negative to each term inside the parentheses. So you can think of, hey, I'm multiplying negative 1 
times each term inside the parentheses, or you can just change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. Either way, so negative 1 times 1 would be negative 1, and then negative 1 times 2x would be minus 2x, and this is greater than negative 6 times x is negative 6x, and then negative 6 times negative 4 would be plus 24, and then minus 1. All right, so on the left, I really can't do anything to simplify, so I'll just write negative 1 minus 2x again. On the right, I can combine 24 minus 1. That's 23. So I'll have negative 6x plus 23. All right, so I want a variable term on one side and a number on the other. So I'm going to add 2x to both sides of the inequality. And I'm going to simultaneously subtract 23 away from both sides of the inequality. So this is going to go away and this is going to go away. And what I'm going to have is negative 1 minus 23. That's negative 24. And this is greater than negative 6x plus 2x is negative 4x. So to get x by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 4. Now remember, if I divide by a negative, I've got to flip the direction of the inequality. So instead of that being a greater than, it's now going to be a less than. So negative 24 divided by negative 4 is positive 6. Negative 4 divided by negative 4 is 1. So this cancels, and I'll just have x. So 6 is less than x, or you could say x is greater than 6. x is greater than 6. So x is greater than 6. So I'm going to put 6 as my smallest value, and I'm going to put a parenthesis next to 6 to say that that's not included. For my largest value, I'm going to put infinity, right? because this continues to the right forever. And again, I always use a parenthesis next to infinity. Let me kind of make that symbol a little better. All right, so graphically, I would find 6 on the number line. So that's right here. I'd put a parenthesis that faces to the right. And then I would shade everything to the right, including that arrow. And that is x is greater than 6 graphically and an interval notation. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on solving linear inequalities part two. All right, so let's take a look at this three-part inequality. So we have 4x minus 6 is greater than negative 46, and it's less than or equal to negative 26. So when we solve a three-part inequality, we do the same thing to each part. And our goal is to isolate the variable in the middle. So if I want to isolate x here, I've got to get rid of this minus 6. I'm going to add 6 here, but I've got to do it here and also here. Again, if it's a three-part inequality, kind of think about each time you see an inequality symbol, it kind of separates the parts, right? So each part, you have three parts. You have this one, this one, and this one. Each part you have to add six to, right? So you gotta do the same thing to each part. So now this is gonna cancel. Negative 46 plus six is negative 40. So this is less than, we'll just have four X. And then we have less than or equal to, negative 26 plus six is negative 20. So now as a final step, I'm going to divide each part by 4, so x can be by itself. So this cancels with this and gives me just x. Then negative 40 divided by 4 is negative 10, so I'll have negative 10 over here. And then negative 20 divided by 4 is negative 5, so I'll have negative 5 over here. So we end up with x is greater than negative 10 and less than or equal to negative 5. So let's write this in interval notation. So again, we had that x was greater than negative 10, and x was less than or equal to negative 5. So in interval notation, the smallest value, we're going to put negative 10, and we're going to put a parenthesis next to it to say that negative 10 is not included, and comma. For the largest value, we're going to put negative 5, and we're going to put a bracket next to negative 5 to say that it is included. Now graphically, we're going to find negative 10, and we're going to put a parenthesis there. We're going to find negative 5, and we're going to put a bracket there. I know this is kind of hard to find, but here's negative 5 here, and here's negative 10 here. Right? That corresponds to this and this. And now we're going to shade everything in between. So negative 5 is included, and then we go to the left, up to and not including negative 10. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5, on solving linear inequalities Part two. All right, so we're going to take a look at this three-part inequality. We have x plus 3 is greater than or equal to negative 4 and less than or equal to 2. All right, so when we solve a three-part inequality, 
we want to isolate the variable x in the middle. So if I have 3 that's being added to x, all I need to do is subtract 3 away, but I need to do it to each part. That's the key thing with the three-part inequality. So I subtract away from here, I subtract away from here, and I subtract away from here. So this is going to cancel. Negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So I get that x is greater than or equal to negative 7, and x is also less than or equal to negative 1. So in interval notation, the smallest possible number for x is negative 7. So we're going to put a bracket next to negative 7 to show that that's included. And then the largest possible value is negative 1. We're going to put a bracket next to negative 1 as well. So we have negative 7 to negative 1 with both included. So graphically, here's negative 7. I'm going to put a bracket that faces to the right. Here's negative 1. I'm going to put a bracket that faces to the left. And I'm going to shade everything in between. All this in between. And so, again, x can be anything starting out at negative 7, including negative 7, and up to, going to the right, up to and including negative 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 13. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on linear equations in two variables. All right, so we want to determine if each ordered pair is a solution to the given equation. So our given equation is that 6x equals 5y minus 15. And here's our three ordered pairs that we're given. We're given the ordered pair 0 comma 3, the ordered pair negative 5 comma 9, and the ordered pair 3 comma negative 0 0.6. So let's start out with this first ordered pair, 0, 3. So remember, with an ordered pair, you have an x value, which is the value on the left. So 0 is your x value. And then you have a y value. That's your value on the right. So 3 is your y value. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug a 0 in. right? That's my x value. I'm going to plug that in for x in the equation. So instead of 6x, I'd have 6 times 0. And this is equal to 5y, so 5 times y, my y value is 3. So I'm going to plug in a 3 for y, and then minus 15. So what we're going to do is see if the left and the right side are equal here. 6 times 0 is 0. 5 times 3 is 15, minus 15. So we'd have 0 is equal to 15 minus 15 is 0. So that does check out. The left and the right side are the same. And so we can say that this ordered pair 0, 3 is a solution to this equation 6x equals 5y minus 15. All right, so let's check the next one. And to make it a little faster, I'm just going to replace the parts where I plug in. So in other words, this is where I'm plugging in for x, right? Because I have 6 times x, so that's where I'm plugging in for x. This is where I'm plugging in for y, because I have 5 times y here. So when I move on to my next ordered pair, we have negative 5, 9. Again, the value on the left is the x value. And the value on the right is the y value. So I'm going to plug a negative 5 in for x. So again, we have 6 times x. I'm going to have 6 times negative 5. So I'm plugging this negative 5 in here. And then this equals 5 times y. And my y value here is 9. So I'm going to plug a 9 in for y. And then minus 15. So on the left, 6 times negative 5 is negative 30. This is equal to, on the right, 5 times 9 is 45. And then minus 15. Over here, this is going to stay negative 30. On the right, 45 minus 15 is positive 30. So these two are not equal. I have negative 30 and I have positive 30. It's not the same value. So this is false. Right? This is false. Negative 30 does not equal positive 30. So we're going to say this is not a solution. All right, for the last one, again, this ordered pair 3, comma, negative 0 0.6, this is your x value, the 3. And this is your y value, the negative 0 0.6. All right, so we have 6x. And again, my x value is 3 here, so I'm going to plug a 3 in for x, is equal to 5 times y. My y value is negative 0 0.6. So I'm going to plug that in for y. I need to expand this a little bit. I'm going to put negative, instead of 0 0.6, I'm just going to put 0 0.6, and then minus 15. All right, so over here, 6 times 3 is 18, and this equals 5 times negative 0 0.6. 
Just know that this is negative. 5 times 6 is 30, so let's start with that. And then I have one decimal place between the two factors. So this would go one place to the left, and so I'd end up with negative 3. Okay, then minus 15. And so you'd have 18 on the left equals, on the right, negative 3 minus 15 is going to be negative 18. So we do not have the same value on each side. This is positive 18, this is negative 18, so this is false. So again, this is not going to be a solution. So let's mark this out, not a solution. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative x plus 5y equals negative 10. So here are the order pairs to check. We have this first one, 0 comma 2, then we have 5 comma negative 1, and then we have 10 comma 0. So again, with this first one, 0 comma 2, the value on the left is the x value. The value on the right is the y value. So when I set this up, I have negative, then I'm plugging in a zero for x, so instead of x there, I'm gonna have a zero, and then plus, I have five y, so instead of y, I'm gonna plug in a two, and this should be equal to negative 10. All right, so we have the opposite of zero here, and that's just zero. So we'd have zero plus five times two is 10, and this is supposed to be equal to negative 10, and it's not, right? Zero plus 10 is just 10, 10 is not equal to negative 10. Those are not the same. This is false. So this does not work out as a solution. And let's move on to the next ordered pair. So I'm only going to erase where I plugged in the values. So again, this is where we're plugging in for x. This is where we're plugging in for y. And on our next ordered pair, 5 comma negative 1, again, the value on the left is the x value. The value on the right is the y value. So I'm going to plug a 5 in for x. I have negative x. So I'm going to have a negative and then a 5. Plug that in for x. Then plus 5 times y. I'm plugging in a negative 1 for y. So I'm plugging in a negative 1 here. And this equals negative 10. So I'd have negative 5. Let me scroll down a little bit. Plus 5 times negative 1, which is negative 5, should be equal to negative 10. And it is. Negative 5 plus negative 5 is negative 10. You get negative 10 equals negative 10. So this is true. So we can say that this ordered pair 5 comma negative 1 is in fact the solution to the equation. Again, negative x plus 5y equals negative 10. All right, let's take a look at the next one. So we have the ordered pair 10 comma 0. Again, the value on the left is your x value. And the value on the right is your y value. So we're going to plug in. We have negative x, so I'm going to have negative, plug in a 10 for x, so negative, and then plug in a 10 there. Then plus 5 times y, plug in a 0 for y, equals negative 10. So if I simplify this, the opposite of 10 is negative 10. 5 times 0 is 0, so I'd have plus 0. I can really just leave that off, right? Because something plus 0 is unchanged. So equals negative 10. And we can see that this is true. Negative 10 equals negative 10. That's true. And so this is a solution. This ordered pair 10 comma 0 is a solution to this equation. Negative x plus 5y equals negative 10. All right, now we want to complete each table of values. So in case you didn't watch the lesson, here's what this is about. So you have your linear equation in two variables. I'm going to give you a value for one of the variables. So for example, let's say I give you the value of negative 5 for y. That means you're going to plug in a negative 5 for y, and you're going to simplify, and you're going to have a linear equation in one variable. In this case, you'd have a linear equation with just x. Now, you solve for x just like you would when you're solving a linear equation in one variable, and you get that unknown value. So I can plug in one of the values and solve for the other one. So for example, our equation is x plus 5y equals negative 25. I'm given a value of negative 5 to start for y. So I would have x plus 5, plug in a negative 5 for y, so negative 5 equals negative 25. Now this is what's unknown right now. I don't know the value for x. I know the value for y because I just plugged it in. But I don't know what this is, and so I'm solving for this unknown. And this is no different than us solving a linear equation in one variable because that's all I have right now is just x to solve for. So then to simplify, I'd have x plus 5 times negative 5 is negative 25 equals negative 25. 
and I would add 25 to both sides of the equation. And I'm going to get that x is equal to 0, right? Negative 25 plus 25 is 0. So I would put a 0 in here. So as an ordered pair, I'll write this as 0, comma, negative 5. So that's one solution to the equation. Now, here's another one. We're given an x value of 10. So that means I'm going to plug a 10 in for x there. So 10 plus 5y equals negative 25. And my goal is now to find the unknown y. So when x is 10, what's y going to be? So we're solving for this guy right here. Let me scroll down a little bit. And essentially, again, I'm solving a linear equation in one variable right now. It's subtract 10 from both sides. That would go away. I'd have 5y is equal to negative 25 minus 10 is negative 35. Divide both sides of the equation by 5. And I would have that y is equal to negative 7. So if x is 10, y is negative 7. Let me erase all this. So if x is 10, y is negative 7. So this is the ordered pair, 10, comma, negative 7. All right, let's take a look at a y value of negative 4. So again, I'm going to plug that in for y, solve for the unknown x. So I'm going to have x plus 5 times, plug in a negative 4 for y, equals negative 25. So 5 times negative 4 is negative 20. So I'd have x minus 20 equals negative 25. So I can add 20 to both sides of the equation. And I'll have x is equal to negative 5. All right, so this spot right here, we're going to put a negative 5 in. Right, that's our unknown x. All right, so our ordered pair would be negative 5 comma negative 4. All right, for the last one, I'm given an x value of 15. So I'm going to plug that in. And I'm going to find the unknown y value. Right? This is what I'm missing right here. So I would have 15 in place of x plus 5y equals negative 25. So I would subtract 15 away from both sides. That would cancel. I would have 5y is equal to negative 25 minus 15. That's negative 40. Divide both sides of the equation by 5. And I'll have y is equal to negative 8. So I would have 15 for my known x value and negative 8 for my y value. So then our ordered pair would be 15 comma negative 8. And if you want to go back, you can take any of these ordered pairs and plug them in. So in other words, if I took the ordered pair 10 comma negative 7, I could plug a 10 in for x and a negative 7 in for y, and I would get a true statement. The left and the right side would be equal. Let's go ahead and check that out. So let's plug in a 10 for x plus 5 times a plug in a negative 7 for y, and this should equal negative 25. So this would simplify over here. We'd have 10 plus 5 times negative 7 is negative 35 equals negative 25. 10 plus negative 35 is negative 25. So you see how the left and the right side are equal. You can go through and check your ordered pairs like that. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 2x plus 5y equals 0. So I'm given this table of values, and I'm starting out with a known value for y of negative 2. And I want to solve for the unknown x. So in order to do that, I take my equation, which is 2x, 2x plus 5y, and I'm plugging in a negative 2 for y, equals 0. So 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. I'd have 2x minus 10 equals 0. Then I could add 10 to both sides of the equation. And I'd have 2x is equal to 10. If I want to solve for x, I divide both sides by 2. And I'd have x is equal to 5. So if y is negative 2, x is equal to 5. So if we want to write that as an ordered pair, you could put 5 as the x value. That's always on the left, comma, negative 2. Right? The y value is on the right. All right, so the next thing we're given, we're given an x value of 10, and we need to find the y value. So I'd plug in, I have 2 times x, plug in a 10 for x, plus 5y equals 0. So 2 times 10 is 20, so I'd have 20 over here, plus 5y equals 0. I would subtract 20 away from each side of the equation. That would go away, and I'll have 5y is equal to negative 20. To isolate y, I would divide both sides of the equation by 5. That will cancel with that, and I'll just have y equals negative 20 divided by 5 is negative 4. 
So if x is 10, y is equal to negative 4. So I'll put a negative 4 there. So as an ordered pair, this would be 10 comma negative 4. All right, next we're given a y value of negative 6. So I'm trying to solve for the missing x value. So again, I'm going to have 2x, so 2x plus 5 times y. I'm given a value of negative 6 for y, so 5 times negative 6. This equals 0. So we have 2x, 5 times negative 6 is negative 30. So minus 30 equals 0. I will add 30 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. We'll have 2x is equal to 30. Divide both sides of the equation by 2. And I'll have x is equal to 15. So if y is negative 6, x is going to be 15. So that's going to be the ordered pair, 15 comma negative 6. All right, one final one. We're given an x value of 3. And we need to solve for the unknown y value. So I'm going to plug in a 3 for x. So I have 2 times x, so I'll plug in a 3 there, plus 5y equals 0. So 2 times 3 is 6. I'm going to drag this over here. Plus 5y equals 0. Subtract 6 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. We'll have 5y is equal to 0 minus 6 is negative 6. We divide both sides of the equation by 5 so we can isolate y. This will cancel with this and give me a 1. So I just have y is equal to negative 6 fifths. So if x is 3, y is negative 6 fifths. All right, so as an ordered pair, the x value is 3. The y value is negative 6 fifths. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on linear equations in two variables. All right, we want to determine if each ordered pair is a solution to the given equation. So our equation is 5x plus 4y equals negative 12. And we're given two ordered pairs here. We have 6 comma 4, and we have 4 comma negative 8. So let's check the ordered pair 6 comma 4 first. So remember that 6 is your x value. And 4 is your y value. And so we're going to plug in a 6 for x in the equation a 4 for y in the equation, and we're going to see if the left and the right side are equal. So we would have 5 times, plug in a 6 for x, plus 4 times, plug in a 4 for y, equals negative 12. 5 times 6 is 30, plus 4 times 4 is 16. And this is supposed to equal negative 12. And at this point, you can see that it's not going to. 30 plus 16 is 46. That is not equal to negative 12. This is false. So we can go ahead and say that the ordered pair 6 comma 4 is not a solution to this equation 5x plus 4y equals negative 12. Let's take a look at the other one. We have ordered pair 4 comma negative 8. So again, the left value, the 4 is the x value, the x value, and the right value, the negative 8, is the y value. All right, so I'm going to plug in a 4 for x. So we'd have 5 times 4 plus 4 times, I'm going to plug in a negative 8 for y. So negative 8 equals negative 12. All right, so 5 times 4 is 20 plus 4 times negative 8, that's negative 32. And this should be equal to negative 12. So 20 plus negative 32 is negative 12. So you get negative 12 equals negative 12. And so we can say that our ordered pair here, which is 4 comma negative 8, is a solution to our equation 5x plus 4y equals negative 12. So we'll put a check mark here. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on linear equations in two variables. All right, we want to determine if each ordered pair is a solution to the given equation. So our equation is x minus y equals 1. And we have two ordered pairs to check. The first one is 2 comma 3. The second one is negative 5 comma negative 6. So with the first ordered pair, 2 comma 3, again, the left value is the x value. This is the x value. And then the right value is the y value. This is the y value. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to plug in a 2 for x and a 3 for y. And I'm going to see if the left and the right side are equal. 
So I'd plug in a two for x, so two minus, plug in a three for y, and this should be equal to one if this is a solution for the equation. Well, it's not, two minus three is negative one. So you get negative one equals one, that's false, right? Negative one and one are not the same number. So this one doesn't work. All right, let's try the next ordered pair, which is negative five comma negative six. So again, this is your x value, always on the left. This is your y value. So I'd plug in a negative five for x, so I'd have negative five. Then minus, I'd plug in a negative six for y. So plug in a negative six for y. And then this is supposed to be equal to one. Now pay close attention here. You have a minus sign out in front of y. The value I'm plugging in for y is a negative six. So a lot of students will make a mistake and see a minus out in front and just throw in a six behind it. You have minus a negative six because I'm plugging in negative six for y. So minus a negative six. So this ends up being negative five plus six, right? Minus a negative is plus a positive. So then equals one, negative five plus six is one. So you get one equals one. So that works out. And we can say that this ordered pair, negative five comma negative six, is a solution to our equation x minus y equals one. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section three on linear equations in two variables. All right, so we wanna determine if each ordered pair is a solution to the given equation. And our equation here is five x minus three y equals negative three. And we're given two ordered pairs. One of them is zero comma one, the other is four comma negative three. So let's start out by checking to see if this ordered pair zero comma one is a solution to this equation. So recall with an ordered pair, the left value is known as the x value, and the right value is known as the y value. Now what I'm gonna do is, I have this equation, we have five x. So everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna plug in a zero. So five times zero, then minus, I have three y. Everywhere I see a y, I'm gonna plug in a one. So three times one, this should be equal to negative three. So five times zero is zero, so we can put zero minus, we have three times one, which is three, equals negative three, and so yeah, we have the same number on each side. When we simplified, we have negative three equals negative three, so our ordered pair zero comma one here is a solution. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have our ordered pair four comma negative three. So our value on the left, again, is the x value, and our value on the right is the y value. All right, so we're gonna plug in for x and y. So five times x, four is our x value, so five times four minus three times y, negative three is our y value, so three times negative three equals negative three. So five times four is 20, and then we have basically negative three times negative three that's gonna be positive nine. So plus nine equals negative three. 20 plus nine is 29, and that's surely not equal to negative three. So this is false. So our ordered pair four comma negative three is not a solution to our equation five x minus three y equals negative three. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section four on linear equations in two variables. All right, so we wanna complete each table of values. And so we have our equation here, 10y minus 50 equals 4x. Now here's our table of values. So what it gives us is, it gives us either an x value or a y value. Now, if it gives us an x value, we wanna plug in for x in the equation and solve for the unknown y. If it gives us a y value, we wanna plug in for y in the equation and solve for the unknown x. So for example, if I look at my table here, this value of two is given to me for y. So what I do is I would plug in a two for y in the equation, so I would have 10 times two minus 50 equals four x. So when I do that, I just have one unknown here, right? I'm just gonna solve for this variable x, and it's no more difficult than when we solved a linear equation in one variable because that's what we have now. So 10 times two is 20, minus 50 equals 4x. 20 minus 50 is negative 30. So negative 30 equals 4x. To get x by itself, we divide both sides by four. And this will cancel with this and just give me x. Over here, 
30 and four are both divisible by two. So I can cancel this with two and get 15, cancel this with two and get two. So X is gonna be equal to negative 15 halves, or you could write negative 7.5, right? If you did that on a calculator, negative 15 divided by two, you get negative 7.5. So over here where X is, I'm gonna put negative 15 halves. And if you want to, you could write that as an ordered pair. So next to this, I'm gonna write the ordered pair, negative 15 halves, Remember, your x value is always first, comma, 2. And what we're saying here is that if I plug a negative 15 halves in for x and a 2 in for y, I would get a true statement, right? The left and the right side would be equal. All right, so now we're given an x value of 0, and we're expected to find the missing y value. So my equation, again, is 10y minus 50 is equal to, now we have 4x, plugging in a 0 for x, so 4 times 0, when I simplify, 4 times 0 is 0, so I get 10y minus 50 equals 0. So add 50 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. I'll have 10y is equal to 50. And divide both sides of the equation by 10. And this will cancel with this. I'm going to get y is equal to 5. So right here, I'm going to put a 5. Let's erase all this. So my ordered pair here. Remember, x comes first, so I'm going to put a 0 for x, comma, a 5 for a y. Now, again, what I'm saying here is that this ordered pair, 0, comma, 5, is a solution to the equation. If I plugged in a 0 for x and a 5 for y, I would get a true statement. All right, now we're given a y value of 3. So I'm going to plug a 3 in for y, so I'd have 10 times 3 minus 50 equals 4x. So I need to find the missing x. All right, so 10 times 3 is 30, minus 50 equals 4x, and 30 minus 50 is negative 20, so negative 20 is equal to 4x. Divide both sides of the equation by 4, so I can get x by itself. So this cancels, negative 20 divided by 4 is negative 5, so negative 5 equals x. So I'm going to put a negative 5 right there, and this would be the ordered pair, negative 5, comma, 3. All right, so the last one we're going to look at, we're given an x value of negative 10. We would have 10y minus 50 is equal to 4 times x. We have negative 10 for x, so 4 times negative 10. All right, so we have 10y minus 50 is equal to 4 times negative 10 is negative 40. Then I could add 50 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. 10y is equal to negative 40 plus 50 is 10. Divide both sides of the equation by 10, which is the coefficient of y. That's gone. We'll have y is equal to 10 over 10 is 1. So we'll put a 1 here, and then this ordered pair would be negative 10 for the x value, comma, 1 for the y value. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on linear equations and two variables. All right, so we want to complete each table of values. And we have an equation here that's negative 15x equals 3y. So the idea here is that if I give you an x value, you can plug it in into the equation and you can solve for the unknown y. Or I could also give you a y value, you could plug it into the equation and you could solve for the unknown x. When I give you one of the values and you plug it in, you're basically turning it into a linear equation in one variable because we only have one unknown at that point and we solve it just like we normally would solve a linear equation in one variable. So I start out with negative 15x equals 3y, and my table of values gives me a y value of 4 to start. So what that means is I'm going to take this equation, and where I see y, I'm going to plug in a 4. So I have negative 15x equals 3 times 4. So then I'd have negative 15x is equal to 3 times 4 is 12. I'm just solving for x, so I just divide both sides of the equation by negative 15. So that's going to cancel, and I'll just have x. And what is 12 over negative 15? Well, that's not going to be an integer or a whole number. It's going to be a, a fraction or a decimal, right, however you want to write it. It's going to be negative, and I know that 12 is divisible by 3, and so is 15. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 15 divided by 3 is 5, so this would be negative 4 fifths. So now I have my missing x value. So when y is 4, x is negative 4 fifths. So we're going to put that over here, negative 4 fifths. 
And if you want, you could write this as an ordered pair. You can say that this is the ordered pair negative 4 fifths, comma, 4. Remember, it's always the x value first, which in this case is negative 4 fifths, comma, the y value, which in this case is 4. Now we're given an x value of 6, and we want to find the missing y value. So I'd have negative 15x, so negative 15 times 6 is equal to 3y. So negative 15 times 6 is negative 90. So I'd have negative 90 is equal to 3y. To get y by itself, I divide both sides by 3. Negative 90 divided by 3 is negative 30, so I'd have negative 30 equals y. So my missing y value is negative 30. So then my ordered pair would be 6 for the x value, comma, negative 30 for the y value. All right, now we're given a y value of negative 2. So I'm going to plug that in and find the missing x value. So negative 15x is equal to 3 times negative 2. All right, so 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. So this would be negative 15x is equal to negative 6. So now I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 15, which is the coefficient of x. So this will cancel with this. And then I'll have x is equal to, again, I'm not going to have an integer or a whole number. I can write this as a decimal or as a fraction. So it's going to be positive. Both are divisible by 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. 15 divided by 3 is 5. So our missing x value here would be 2 fifths. So then this ordered pair, the x value would be 2 fifths. The y value would be negative 2. All right, last one, we're given an x value of 1. So I'm going to plug a 1 in for x there. So I'd have negative 15 times 1 is equal to 3y. And negative 15 times 1 is negative 15. So negative 15 equals 3y. To get y by itself, we divide both sides by 3. And we'll have negative 15 divided by 3. That's negative 5. So negative 5 equals y. So the missing value here for y is negative 5. And as an ordered pair, we'll put 1 as the x value, comma, negative 5 as the y value. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set 14. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on plotting ordered pairs. All right, so we want to plot the following ordered pairs. So we're going to start out with 3, comma, 7. I'm going to go down to my coordinate plane, and I'm looking for... 3, comma, 7. So remember, the value on the left is the x value, and the value on the right is the y value. So in terms of our coordinate plane, remember our horizontal axis is known as the x-axis. This is where we're going to find our x location. Our vertical axis is our y-axis. This is where we're going to find our y location. And then this spot, this point of intersection, is known as the origin. And technically, we could say that this point is 0, comma 0, right? It's an x location of 0 and a y location of 0. So let's get started. We want to plot the ordered pair 3, comma 7. So I can start at the origin, and I can go three units to the right to arrive at an x location of 3. And then I can go up seven units. So I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 units up. And I'll arrive at 3, 7. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can start out at 7 on the y-axis and go over to the right 3 units. Or you can kind of find 3 on the x-axis and find 7 on the y-axis. And you could draw a line from each to get to the point of intersection. However you want to do it, this is where 3, 7 is going to be. Now I want to do negative 2, comma negative 2. So now I want negative 2 comma negative 2. So both the x and the y are negative 2. So an x location of negative 2 is right here. A y location of negative 2 is right here. So you can think about this as going to the left 2 and then going down 2. That's how you'd find negative 2 comma negative 2. Or you could go down 2 first and then go to the left 2. doesn't really matter. This is going to be negative 2 comma negative 2. All right, let's look at negative 4 comma negative 6. So negative 4 on the x-axis is going to be right here. Negative 6 on the y-axis is going to be down here. 
So I can think about this as going to the left four and down six, or I could say I'm going down six and to the left four. Again, you can kind of go back and forth, it doesn't matter. You're gonna end up at this point, which is negative four for the x location, comma negative six for the y location. All right, now we're gonna look at 10 comma four. So let's find 10 on the x-axis, that's gonna be right here. Let's find four on the y-axis, that's right here. So I can think about going to the right 10 units and up four, that's right here. Or I could think about going up four and to the right 10. Again, it doesn't matter. Either way, this is gonna be 10 comma four. All right, now we're gonna look at negative three comma zero. So negative three is my x location. So that's gonna be over here. And then what's a y location of zero? Well, this is, right? If I think about the y axis, anything above this point is positive, anything below it is negative. This point right here, this spot that's completely even with the x axis would be y equals zero. So that lies on the x axis. And so what we get here, we go three units to the left, but we don't move vertically. So this is the point negative three comma zero. All right, what about zero comma negative four? So zero comma negative four. All right, so that's an X location of zero. So that means I'm not gonna move at all horizontally, but I am gonna move vertically, right? Because my Y location is negative four. So that means I'm just gonna go down four units. Let me erase that. And here's negative four. So I'm gonna highlight that right there. And that's gonna be zero comma negative four. Again, it's on the Y axis because I'm not moving at all horizontally. I'm only moving vertically, right? If I get an X location of zero, I don't move horizontally, so that's on the Y axis. If I get a Y location of zero, like I got here with negative three comma zero, that's on the X axis because I'm not moving vertically, I'm only moving horizontally. So let me label this. This is gonna be zero comma negative four. All right, now we have negative five comma negative three. So negative five comma negative three. So where is negative five on the X axis? That's here. Negative three is here. So I'd go left five units and then down three. One, two, three, that's right here. Or again, I could go down three units, start at negative three and go to the left five units. Either way, you're gonna end up at negative five comma negative three. All right, the last one is seven comma one. So where's my X location of seven? That's gonna be right here. And my Y location of one is right here. So I'm going to the right seven units and up one, or I could say I'm going up one unit into the right seven. Again, it doesn't matter, you end up at the same spot. This is seven comma one. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section one on plotting ordered pairs. All right, so we wanna plot the following ordered pairs. And we're just gonna do three. We have three comma negative two, one comma negative seven, and four comma four. So let's start out with three comma negative two. Here's our coordinate plane. I'm looking for three comma negative two. And this is my X value, this is my Y value. The horizontal axis is the X axis. This is the X axis. The vertical axis is the Y axis, okay, the Y axis. This point of intersection here, again, is the origin. That's the point zero comma zero. So to find the point three comma negative two, I'm going to be going to the right three units, right? This is an X location of three. I'm going to be going down two units, a Y location of negative two. So that's right there, right? This is a Y location of negative two. So you can just eyeball that and see it's the intersection of those two, right? The intersection of where X is three and Y is negative two. So this is the point three comma negative two. So the next one is one comma negative seven. So I'm gonna look for an X location of one, which is here, meaning I'm going to the right one unit, a Y location of negative seven, which is here. So I'm gonna fall seven units or drop seven units. So I go to the right one and then down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a location of one comma negative seven. All right, then lastly, we wanna plot four comma four. So an X location of four is here, a Y location of four is here. So essentially we're going to the right four units and up four units, or I can go up four units and to the right four units. Again, it doesn't matter. Either way, you end up at the same spot. This is four comma four. 
Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Plotting Ordered Pairs. All right, so we want to plot the following ordered pairs. We have negative 6, negative 1, negative 4, negative 3, and 5, 2. All right, so we're going to start out with negative 6, negative 1. And remember, this is the x location. This is the y location. This is your x-axis. This is your y-axis. And this is your origin. Okay, this is the point 0, 0. All right, so to find negative 6, negative 1, I can go to the left 6 and down 1, or I can go down 1 and to the left 6. Either way, you're going to end up right here. This is negative 6, negative 1. Then the next one was negative 4, negative 3. So negative 4, negative 3. Again, negative 4 is the x location. Negative 3 is the y location. So for that, I would go to the left 4, and I would go down 3. 1, 2, 3. Again, you can see your x location is negative 4. Your y location is negative 3. Right? It's the intersection of those two points. So then this is negative 4, comma, negative 3. Then we have 5, comma, 2. So an x location of 5, a y location of 2. So x location of 5 is here. Y location of 2 is here. So I'm going to the right 5 and up 2. Or again, you could say up 2 and to the right 5. So this is 5, comma, 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 3 on plotting ordered pairs. All right, so we want to plot the following ordered pairs. We have negative 1, comma, negative 1, 0, comma, 8, and 6, comma, negative 4. All right, so we're starting out with negative 1, comma, negative 1. Remember, this is the x location, this is the y location, and this is your x axis, the horizontal axis. This is your y axis, the vertical axis. And then this is your origin, right? The point 0, comma, 0. So if we want negative 1, comma, negative 1, I want to go left 1 and down 1, right? If I kind of fill this in here, you can see this corresponds to an x location of negative 1 and a y location of negative 1. This is negative 1, comma, negative 1. All right, we want 0, comma, 8. So an x location of 0, what does that mean? It means that we don't move at all horizontally, right? We just travel along our y axis. If you think about where x is 0, just imagine only a horizontal number line. Forget about the y-axis for right now. Just think about this one. This is x equals 0 right here. It just also happens to be y equals 0. So if x is 0, that means I'm just going to be on the y-axis. I'm just going to be traveling up and down. That's it. Now, y equals 8, so that means I'm just going to go up 8 units and find y equals 8, which is right there. And so this would be x is 0, y is 8. All right, the last one is 6, comma, negative 4. And so 6 is the x location, negative 4 is the y location. So that means I go to the right 6 units. Here's 6 on the x-axis, and down 4 units. 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, here's negative 4 on the y-axis. Again, it's the intersection of those two. All right, so this is where x is 6 and y is negative 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4, on plotting ordered pairs. All right, so we want to plot the following ordered pairs. We have negative 7, negative 3. We have 5, 5, and we have 0, negative 2. So let's start out with negative 7, negative 3. So negative 7, negative 3. Again, this is the x location. This is the y location. This is your x-axis, the horizontal axis. This is the y-axis, the vertical axis, and this is your origin, right? The point that's 0, comma, 0. So if I'm looking for negative 7, comma, negative 3, an x location of negative 7 is here, a y location of negative 3 is here. So I can think about this as going to the left 7 and down 1, 2, 3, or I can think about it as going down 3 and to the left 7. Either way, you're looking for the point where x is negative 7, which it is here, and y is negative 3, which it is here. So this is negative 7, comma, negative 3. All right, so the next one we're looking at is 5, comma, 5, an x location of 5 and a y location of 5. So 5 units to the right and 5 units up, or 5 units up and 5 units to the right. Either way, you'll end up at this spot, which is 5, comma, 5. All right, lastly, we have 0, comma, negative 2. So an x location of 0 means I don't move at all horizontally. It means I'm on the y-axis. So 
So then y is going to be negative 2. So that, let me erase this part right here from a previous problem. Let me circle negative 2. That's where y is negative 2. Now if x is 0, that means that I don't move at all horizontally. So I'm going to lie on the y-axis right there. This is 0 for x and negative 2 for y. So 0 comma negative 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on plotting ordered pairs. All right, so we want to plot the following ordered pairs. We have negative 4 comma negative 4, 6 comma 2, and negative 2 comma negative 5. So let's start out with negative 4 comma negative 4. So negative 4 comma negative 4. And again, this is your x location. This is your y location. This is your x-axis. This is your y-axis. And this is your origin. So negative 4 comma negative 4. So that's negative 4 on the x-axis, negative 4 on the y-axis. So to the left four units and then down one, two, three, four. So you can see where that lines up to where the x location is negative four, the y location is negative four. So this is the point negative four comma negative four. All right, next we want six comma two. So an x location of six, a y location of two. So I go to the right six units and up two. That's right there. So this is six comma two. All right, then we have negative two comma negative five. So that's an x location of negative 2 and a y location of negative 5. So I go to the left two units and then down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's right there. Or again, you could start out at negative 5 and go to the left two units, however you want to do that. So this is negative 2 comma negative 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set 15. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we just want to graph each linear equation in two variables. We're going to start out with 2x plus y equals negative 2. So I'm going to use the intercept method. So remember, that's where you plug in a 0 for x, plug in a 0 for x. That gives you your y-intercept. So we'd have 2 times 0 plus y equals negative 2. So this would go away and you just have y equals negative 2. And then I'd also use the x-intercept. So I'd plug in a 0 for y. That would give me the x-intercept. So 2 times x plus 0 equals negative 2. So then I'd have 2x is equal to negative 2. Divide both sides by 2. I'd get x is equal to negative 1. So now I need a third point as a check. I always want to try to end up with nice small integers. So let me just use 1. So I'm going to plug in a 1 for x. 2 times 1 plus y equals negative 2. This would be 2 plus y equals negative 2. Subtract 2 away from each side of the equation, and I would get y is equal to negative 4. So if x is 1, y is negative 4. So now I have three ordered pairs. I have 0 comma negative 2, I have negative 1 comma 0, and I have 1 comma negative 4. So I'm going to plot these and then draw a line through them. So again, my equation is 2x plus y is equal to negative 2. My ordered pairs, I have 0 comma negative 2, which is the y-intercept. I have negative 1 comma 0, which is the x-intercept. And then I have a point for a check, which is 1 comma negative 4. So 0 comma negative 2. So that's going to be right here. And again, that's where we're going to cross the y-axis x is 0 at that point, this is the y-intercept. This is the y-intercept. Now for my x-intercept, negative 1 comma 0, that's right here, this is where we're going to cross the x-axis. And then lastly, my point that I'm using as a check, 1 comma negative 4. So here's 1, and then I'm going down 4. So that's right here. All right, so we're going to draw a line through these points. Okay, and I always draw arrows at the end of the line that I create. And the arrows just tell me that the line is going to extend in both directions forever and ever and ever. So this line is the graph of the equation 2x plus y equals negative 2. So 2x plus y equals negative 2. All right, what about something like x equals 1? Well, we saw this in the lesson. This is a vertical line. So I don't need to go through and make points because 
no matter what the value is for y, x is always 1. So if I put y is 5, x is 1. y is 0, x is 1. y is negative 5, x is 1. y is 2 billion, x is 1. So in order to graph something like this quickly, our equation again is x equals 1, you just find 1 on the x-axis. So that's right here. And I'm just going to draw a vertical line, right? Because no matter what the value is for y, x is 1. So if it helps you, you can do a few points. So let's say y is 6, x is going to be 1. Let's say y is 3, x is going to be 1. Let's say y is negative 7, x is going to be 1. Again, just find 1 on the x-axis and draw a vertical line. Okay, and not perfectly straight, but again, I'm drawing this kind of freehand, so just kind of bear with me. And I'm going to put arrows at each end, again, to say that this goes up forever and ever and down forever and ever. It continues forever and ever and ever in each direction. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have x minus 5y equals 0. So we saw in the lesson that this is an example of a line that passes through the origin. So when you get something like this, it's more work because you can't just use the x and y intercepts. The x and y intercept both occur at 0 comma 0. If I plugged in a 0 for x, I'd have negative 5y equals 0. Well, negative 5y can only be 0 if y is 0. So when you see something in this format, ax plus by equals 0, you know one point on the line is 0 comma 0. This line passes through the origin. Now, to get another point going, I'm going to rewrite this equation as negative 5y is equal to negative x. I just subtracted x away from both sides. The reason I want to do that is I want to make sure when I choose points for x or I choose points for y that the result for the other one is a nice clean integer that I can graph. Because I'm going to be dividing by negative 5 here, why don't I use the number 5? So if x is 5, I'd plug in a 5 here, and to solve this, I'd divide both sides by negative 5. So this would cancel, and this would cancel, and I'd have y is equal to 1. So if x is 5, y is 1. So now let me use negative 5. So if x is negative 5, what's y? So remember, I already have a negative out in front, and I'm plugging in a negative 5 for x. So that's minus a negative 5, which is plus 5. And now I'm dividing by negative 5. So that cancels with that. I get y is equal to negative 1. So this is now negative 1. And so I have three points. 0 comma 0. I have 5 comma 1. And then I have negative 5 comma negative 1. So let's take those down and graph them. So again, I'm working with x minus 5y equals 0. And my points are 0 comma 0, 5 comma 1, and negative 5 comma negative 1. So if I plot the point 0 comma 0, that's at the origin. And again, we know this goes through the origin because of the way it's set up. Now the next point was 5 comma 1. So 5 on the x-axis, 1 on the y-axis. So there's 5 comma 1. And then we had negative 5 comma negative 1. So negative 5 over here, down 1 over here. And now we have our three points, and we connect them to graph the line. Okay, and then I put arrows at each end to, again, show the fact that this line continues indefinitely in both directions. So this line is the graph of the equation, x minus 5y equals 0. All right, let's take a look at y equals negative 6. So this is an example of a horizontal line. No matter what we choose for x, no matter what value we choose, y always equals negative 6. So to graph this, we just go down to our coordinate plane, and again, y is equal to negative 6. So we find negative 6 on the y-axis. That's right here. And we just create a horizontal line, right, that touches that point. Because no matter what value I choose for x, if I choose 3 for x, y is negative 6. If I choose 6 for x, y is negative 6. If I choose 9 for x, y is negative 6. If I choose negative 5 for x, y is negative 6. So you can kind of go through and make some points if that makes it easier for you. But essentially the quick way to do it is find negative 6 on the y-axis and just draw a horizontal line.
And again, I extend arrows from both ends to show that this line continues indefinitely in both directions. So this is your graph for y equals negative 6. All right, let's take a look at one more. We have 8x plus 5y equals negative 15. So let's use our intercept method. So let's start out with the x-intercept. So to get the x-intercept, y needs to be 0. So y would be 0. So I would have 8x equals negative 15. All right, if I plugged in a 0 there, that would go away. Now, if I divide both sides by 8, I'm not going to get an integer. So I don't want that. I want something that's easy for me to graph. So I'm going to throw this out. I don't want that. Now I'm going to think about the y-intercept. So what if x was 0? So 8 times 0, that would go away. And I can just write 5y equals negative 15. Divide both sides by 5. This cancels with this, and I'm going to have what? I'm going to have y equals negative 15 divided by 5 is negative 3. So both are nice, clean integers, very small. I'm good with that. So I'm going to choose two more ordered pairs, and I've got to choose properly. So let's just look at this 5y equals negative 15, just this part of the equation. Forget about this for a second. If 5y equals negative 15, I know that negative 15 right now is divisible by 5. Right? If I divide both sides by 5, I end up with an integer. So that's good. Now I'm adding back on 8x to the mix. So plus. I want to choose a value for x that when I move this guy over here and I divide by 5, I get an integer. So one thing that jumps out at me right away, I know if I use negative 5 just by eyeballing this, if I use negative 5 for x, this would be negative 40. So I add 40 to both sides of the equation. This is gone. And I'll have 5y is equal to 25. Divide both sides by 5, and I'll have y equals 5. Nice, clean, small integer. So now I just need one more. Let me use 5 now, positive 5. So 8 times positive 5. So this would be positive 40 plus 5y equals negative 15. Subtract 40 away from each side. That's going to go away, and I'll have 5y is equal to negative 55. Divide both sides by 5, and I get y equals negative 11. Now, that's a little big for me, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. I like things to be between the range of negative 10 and positive 10, but we'll go ahead and use it. You can always stretch your graph by 1 or 2 to make it work. So my ordered pairs would be 0, comma, negative 3, negative 5, comma, 5, and 5 comma negative 11. So again, my equation is 8x plus 5y equals negative 15. And there are my ordered pairs. So let's find 0 comma negative 3. 0 comma negative 3. So that's going to be right here. And because x is 0, remember that's the y-intercept. And you can see this is where it's going to cross the y-axis. Again, this is your y-axis, right? the vertical axis. So next we have negative 5 comma 5. So 5 units to the left and 5 units up. So that's right here. And then lastly, we have 5 comma negative 11. So 5 units to the right and 11 units down. So this is going to take me off my graph here. So if I measure, it's going to be about right here for negative 11, so that's where it would be. I'm just going to kind of extend this and put that this right here is negative 11. Again, if it's one or two more than what you have, you can make it work. right? I don't like to, but you can make it work. Okay, so there's our line. And again, we put arrows at each end to say that it continues indefinitely in each direction. And again, our equation here our equation for this line is 8x plus 5y equals negative 15. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we just want to graph each linear equation in two variables. We're going to start out with 5x plus 5y equals negative 10. So I'm going to use the intercept method. So that's where we're going to plug in a 0 for x, find out what the y-intercept is. So let's start out with that. 
So if I plugged in a zero for x, I would just have 5y equals negative 10, right? Because plugging in a zero there makes it be five times zero, which is just zero. Zero plus five y is just five y. Now I would divide both sides of the equation by five to get y by itself. And I would get y is equal to negative two. So if x is zero, y is negative two. So this is your y-intercept. The next thing I'd look for is the x-intercept. For the x-intercept, the y-coordinate needs to be zero. So if I plugged in a zero for y there, I'd have five times zero, which is zero, then five x plus zero is five x. So I'd have five x equals negative 10, divide both sides of the equation by five, and I'd get x equals negative two. So this would be negative two over here. All right, now we always wanna get a third point going as a check. So I see immediately that if I plug in a one for x, that's gonna give me an integer result for y. So let's do that. Let's put a one in there. So I'd have five times one plus five y equals negative 10. This would be five plus five y equals negative 10. I would subtract five away from each side of the equation. So that's gone. And I'd have five y is equal to negative 15, right? Negative 10 minus five is negative 15. Divide both sides of the equation by five so that y can be by itself and I'd have y is equal to negative three. So if x is one, y is negative three. So I have three ordered pairs. I have the ordered pair zero comma negative two, negative two comma zero, and one comma negative three. Let's take these down and plot them. So let's plot our first point, zero comma negative two. And again, because the x coordinate is zero, that's our y intercept. So it's right here, and you can see that's on the y-axis, right? That's where our graph is gonna cross the y-axis. Then we have negative two comma zero. This is the x-intercept. This is where the graph is gonna cross the x-axis. So negative two is here, and a y location of zero. Then we have one comma negative three. So I go to one, and then I go down three. That's right there. Okay. And then I just want to draw some arrows at each end just to show that this is going to continue forever and ever and ever in each direction. And again, this is the graph of the line 5x plus 5y equals negative 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we want to graph each linear equation in two variables. So we're going to look at negative 9x minus 2y equals 18. We're gonna use our intercept method here. So what that means is that we're going to find the x-intercept and the y-intercept and then one point as a check. So to find the x-intercept, I want y to be zero. So if I plugged in a zero for y there, I'd have negative two times zero, which is just zero. I'd basically just have negative nine x is equal to 18. Easy to solve, divide both sides of the equation by negative nine. That cancels with that, and I'd have x is equal to negative 2. So if y is 0, x is negative 2. Similarly, I want to find my y-intercept. So for the y-intercept, the x-coordinate is 0. So I'd plug in a 0 there, and I'd have negative 9 times 0, which is 0. So I'd have negative 2y equals 18. So negative 2y equals 18. Again, very easy to solve that. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. This cancels with this, and I'd have y is equal to... 18 divided by negative 2 is negative 9. So if x is 0, y is negative 9. All right, now I need a point as a check. So I have negative 9 times x minus 2y equals 18. Now, I need to multiply negative 9 by a value that's going to produce something that I'm then going to move over here. Now, let's think about this mentally. If I do 1, I'd end up with negative 9, I'd add nine to both sides of the equation, and over here I'd have 27. 27 is not divisible by negative two, so I don't want that. If I try two, that would end up working. So let's go with two. So negative nine times two is negative 18, minus two y equals 18. Add 18 to both sides of the equation. That's gone, I'll have negative two y is equal to 18 plus 18 is 36. Divide both sides of the equation by negative two. And I'm going to get y is equal to negative 18. Now, although this produces an integer, it's too big, right? It's not going to fit on my graph that I'm using. So what if I tried 
let's say negative 4. I can't use negative 2 because I already know that that's going to give me a y value of 0. It's already a point for me. So let's go with negative 4. So negative 9 times negative 4 is 36. So minus 2y equals 18. Subtract 36 from each side. That's gone. I'll have negative 2y is equal to 18 minus 36 is negative 18. And then to get y by itself, I divide both sides by negative 2. I'll end up with y is equal to 9. So if x is negative 4, y is 9. So now I have three ordered pairs. I have negative 2 comma 0. I have 0 comma negative 9. And I have negative 4 comma 9. All right, so my equation again is negative 9x, negative 9x minus 2y equals 18. And these are my ordered pairs. I have negative 2 comma 0, which is the x-intercept. So that's right here. I have 0 comma negative 9, which is the y-intercept. And that's right here. And then I have negative 4 comma 9. So go to the left 4 and up 9. OK, so let's draw a line now. And again, I always want to put arrows at the ends to say that the line continues indefinitely in both directions. So this line is the graph of the equation negative 9x minus 2y equals 18. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we want to graph each linear equation in two variables. So we're going to look at x equals negative 4. So when you see something like this, you don't even need a table of values. Essentially, this is a vertical line. Because no matter what value you give me for y, x is always going to equal negative 4. So to graph x equals negative 4, all we do is find negative 4 on the x-axis. That's right here. Then all I need to do after that is just draw a vertical line. Because if you were to generate points here, no matter what value you choose for y, let's say I choose 6 for y, it's going to be negative 4 for x. So 4 for y, negative 4 for x. Negative 7 for y, negative 4 for x. And you can see this just forms a vertical line. OK, and it's not perfectly straight, but it'll do. We always make sure to put arrows at each end to indicate that the line continues indefinitely in each direction. Again, this line is the graph of the equation x equals negative 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we want to graph each linear equation in two variables. We have y equals 6. So this is an example of a horizontal line. And so we don't need our table of values here. We have a horizontal line. It's actually pretty easy. Let's come down to your coordinate plane. Again, we have y is equal to 6. Just find 6 on the y-axis. That's right here. So remember, no matter what x is, y equals 6. So if x is 3, y is 6. If x is 8, y is 6. If x is negative 7, y is 6. So you don't even need to go through and make any points. All you do is find 6 on the y-axis and draw a horizontal line. Because y will always be 6 no matter what the value of x is. All right, and again, you always want to extend arrows at each end of the line. This is to show that the line continues indefinitely in both directions. And this line, again, is the graph of the equation y equals 6. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on graphing linear equations in two variables. All right, so we want to graph each linear equation in two variables. I'm going to look at x minus 2y equals negative 6. So I'm going to use the intercept method. And to do that, I'm going to first start out by finding the, let's say, x-intercept. So to find the x-intercept, you'd plug in a 0 for y. You need to find your resulting value for x. So I'd have x minus 2 times 0 would be 0 equals negative 6. So you can basically get rid of this and say that x is equal to negative 6. All right, now I want to find my y-intercept. And to find the y-intercept, I let x be 0. So if x is 0, I'd have negative 2y equals negative 6. All right, if I plugged in a 0 over here, on the left side of the equation, I'd just be left with negative 2y, which is what I have over here. So now I divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. And I would get y is equal to 3. 
And then I need a point as a check. So let's try x equals two. Let's see if that would work out for us. So if I put a two in for x, minus two y equals negative six, subtract two away from each side, that goes away. I'd have negative two y is equal to negative eight. Divide both sides of the equation by negative two. This cancels with this and I'd have y is equal to four. So if I plug in a two for x, I get a y value of four. All right, so now I have three ordered pairs. I have negative six comma zero, I have zero comma three, and I have two comma four. Again, our equation is x minus two y equals negative six. And our ordered pairs, we have negative six comma zero, zero comma three, and two comma four. So let's start out with negative six comma zero, which again, because the y coordinate is zero, that's the x-intercept. So that's gonna be right here. You can notice that that's on the x-axis, right? This is where the line is gonna cross the x-axis, known as, again, the x-intercept. Next, we're gonna look at the y-intercept. So we have zero comma three. So that's gonna be on the y-axis. That's gonna be right here. We go up three units to there. This is where our line is gonna cross the y-axis at zero comma three. And then we have a point that we're using as a check. We have two comma four. So go to the right two units and up four. That's gonna be right there. All right, so now we're gonna draw a line connecting the points. Okay, and then make sure to draw arrows at each end to say that the line is gonna continue indefinitely in each direction. We'll just label this. This line is the graph of the equation x minus two y equals negative six. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Practice Set 16. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on finding the slope of a line. All right, so we wanna find the slope of the line that passes through each pair of points. And we're gonna start out with two given points of 20 comma one and negative six comma negative 15. So just in case you didn't watch the video, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the slope formula. Something you wanna copy down and memorize. Your teacher may give it to you on the test. She may not. So good thing to know it off the top of your head. So slope we denote with m. So this is a slope. And this is equal to y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. Now, this sub two sub one is just notation. This is just telling us that we have two different x coordinates we're working with. We have an x coordinate from kind of the first ordered pair and an x-coordinate from the second ordered pair, and we need a way to differentiate between the two. And then similarly, we have the same thing with y sub one and y sub two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick one of the ordered pairs and label it as x sub one, y sub one. So I'll label this as x sub one, y sub one, and then I'll label the other point as x sub two, y sub two. And again, so that you don't get confused, we can change this up. I could have said this is x sub two, y sub two, and this is x sub one, y sub one. It does not matter at all. You can do it both ways and see that you get the same answer. All right, so once you've kind of set this up, the rest of it is basically a breeze. You're just gonna plug into the slope formula. So where I see y sub two, I just plug in a one, right? y sub two is one, so I'll erase that and put one, and then minus. For y sub one, we're given a value of a negative 15, so that's minus a negative 15 or plus 15. Then for x sub two, I'm given a value of 20. So I'll erase this and put 20. And then for x sub one, I have a value of negative six. So again, minus a negative six is plus six. So one plus 15 is 16, and this is over 20 plus six or 26. So I have 16 over 26, which we know we can reduce. 16 is divisible by two and so is 26. 16 divided by two is eight. 26 divided by two is 13. So this is your slope, it's eight over 13. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have the point 16 comma negative six and another point 16 comma negative four. So when you see the same value, okay, the same value in the same position of each point. So in other words, when I think about this, this is the x value here, let's just say this is the point x sub one, y sub one, and this is the point x sub two, y sub two. When I see the same value for x in each case of 16, 
I know I have a special situation, right? If x equals 16 in this case, and equals 16 in this case, that tells me that what I have is a vertical line. It's the vertical line that's x equals 16. So no matter what y equals, x will always be 16. So I don't need the slope formula in this case, because as we learned in the lesson, this is an undefined slope. Undefined slope. And why is that the case? Well, if we plug everything into the slope formula, we end up trying to divide by zero, which again, that's undefined. So if I have m is equal to, again, m is slope. So y sub two, which is negative four, minus y sub one, which is negative six, minus a negative is plus a positive, so plus six over x sub two, which is 16, minus x sub one, which is 16. So negative four plus six is two, and then you see the problem. 16 minus 16 is zero. This is undefined, undefined. So you can save yourself the time of going through and plugging things in. If you see the same value in each x spot, right? no matter if this is x sub one or if this is x sub two, it doesn't matter because in each case, you have a 16 for your x value. You know that in the end, once you plug that into the slope formula, the same thing minus itself is zero. You can't divide by zero. And in fact, when you look at your slope formula in a textbook, it specifically says that x1 cannot be equal to x2, right? Because we can't divide by zero. So when you see that come up, you know you have an undefined slope. All right, now we have negative three comma negative 20 for a point and also five comma 12. So I'm gonna label this point as x sub two, y sub two, and this one is x sub one, y sub one. Again, I could reverse that, it wouldn't matter. My slope formula is that m, again, that's for the slope, is equal to y sub two, which is negative 20, minus y sub one, which is 12, over x sub two, which is negative three, minus x sub one, which is five. So negative 20 minus 12 is negative 32, and negative three minus five is negative eight. So negative divided by negative is positive, and 32 divided by eight is four. So this would be four, or if we think about slope, we could say four over one, doesn't matter, it's kind of the same thing. When you think about rise over run, it's you rise four units for every one that you run over to the right. So let's try something different now. So we wanna find the value of x or y, so the line through the given points has the given slope. All right, so this might be a little confusing, I'm gonna kind of walk you through this. You might see a problem like this on your test. So you have the given point one comma zero, and you have another point, but you have an unknown x value. And I know this gets confusing because you see x sub one and x sub two, and now you just see plain x there. But everything is given to you. Even the slope is already calculated for you. So in other words, if I was to set up the slope formula, it usually looks like this, m is equal to y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. So now I'm gonna plug everything in and solve for what I don't know. I know what m is, it's two fifths. So go ahead and just plug that in. And I can arbitrarily label these points. I know this says x here, but I can just label this as x sub one. It's just something I don't know. This is y sub one. This over here is x sub two. This is y sub two. Okay, so if I plug in for y sub two, I have zero. So just put a zero in there. If I plug in for y sub one, I have negative two. Again, minus a negative two is plus two. And then x sub two over here is one. And then minus, for x sub one, I don't know what the value is. I'm just given an unknown of x. So I can just put x there. That's all I have. I don't know what this is. So if I simplify this in the numerator, I have the value of two. So in order to solve this, we think back to when we were solving proportions. So we have two fifths is equal to two over one minus x. All I need to do is multiply five times two, which is 10, and set that equal to this quantity one minus x times two. Again, make sure you use parentheses, two times that quantity one minus x. So 10 is equal to, two times one is two, minus two times x is two x. Simply subtract two from each side of the equation. So that's gone. 10 minus two is eight. So I'd have eight is equal to negative two x. 
Let's scroll down and get a little room going. So I'll divide both sides of the equation by negative two. And I'll have that negative four is equal to X. So very, very simple. So now what does that mean? Well, we go back up here. So what this is telling me is that this should be a negative four here. You can go back through and verify that gives you the correct answer. So again, using the slope formula, M should equal two fifths. So M, which is slope, should be Y sub two, which is zero minus y sub one, which is negative two, so zero plus two, over x sub two, which is one, minus x sub one, which is negative four. Minus a negative is plus a positive, so one plus four. And it is, you end up with zero plus two, which is two, over one plus four, which is five, so you get two fifths. Right? That's exactly what we said you would get. So if you get a problem like that in your textbook, just set everything up and then solve for your unknown. All right, let's take a look at another one like that. Here we have the point one comma y. And again, it's just y right now because we don't know what it is. It's an unknown value. And another point two comma negative three. And we're given our slope. It says m equals negative six. So for the slope formula, again, it's m equals y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. I know what m is, it's negative six. And I can label one of these points as x sub one, y sub one, and the other as x sub two, y sub two. And now I'm just gonna plug in and solve for the unknown. So y sub two is negative three. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that in. y sub one is just y. It's something I just don't know what it is. x sub two is gonna be two. And x sub one is one. And again, very, very easy to solve this. I would simplify in the denominator first. Two minus one is just one. And because I have a denominator of one, dividing by one leaves something unchanged. So I can just erase this and just treat it as the problem negative six is equal to negative three minus y. So to get y by itself, I'd add three to both sides of the equation. Negative six plus three is negative three. So I get negative three is equal to negative y. And I can multiply both sides of the equation by negative one. Negative one times negative three is positive three. Negative y times negative one is just y. So I get that y is equal to three. So in other words, if I plugged a three in there, everything would work out, right? That's my missing value. And again, let me show you that real quick. All right, so m is equal to, again, y sub two, which is negative three, minus y sub one, which we know is three, over, we have x sub two, which is two, minus x sub one, which is one. So negative three minus three is negative six over two minus one, which is one. So we get negative six over one, which is negative six. Right? And that's exactly what we have right here for our slope. So our missing value again was three. All right, now we wanna find the slope. And you might get a problem like this on your test. And you're just given a linear equation and two variables and they're saying, hey, find the slope. So what information do you already know that's gonna allow you to find the slope? Well, remember, we know how to get ordered pairs for a linear equation in two variables, right? We know how to find solutions. So I go back to my x, y table. If I generate two ordered pairs, that's enough to plug into the slope formula. Kind of another way you can do it, and we'll do it both ways, you could also graph it, and you could look at the graph, and you could find the slope in that manner, as long as you had nice, easy points that you could find. Some of these computerized graphs that you get, you might have values on there where you can't really determine what they are. It might be 3 eighths, it might be 4 fifths, something like that, right? If you have a nice clean integer, then you can do it that way. So let's get started. I'm gonna use the intercept method. So I'm gonna plug in a zero for X, find out what the Y intercept is. So if I plugged in a zero here, I would basically just have negative Y is equal to negative five. And I could multiply both sides by negative one and I get y is equal to five. So my y-intercept occurs at zero comma five. And where's my x-intercept gonna occur? Well, I'd plug in a zero for y now, and I would have three x minus zero equals negative five. Of course, I can just subtract this. I would divide both sides of the equation by three. I can use this for the sake of just plugging into the slope formula, right? So x would be equal to negative five-thirds. So negative five thirds. So I can use this for slope formula, but it's not, not something I wanna use if I'm graphing, 
right? Because that's not a nice clean integer. It doesn't really work well on a graph. All right, so for the slope formula, again, m is equal to, this is the slope, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And I have two points. I have the point 0, 5, and I have another point, which is negative 5 thirds, 0. Okay, so I'm going to label this one as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this one is x sub 2, y sub 2, and I'm just going to plug in. y sub 2 is 0, and subtracting away y sub 1, which is 5, and then this is over x sub 2, which is negative 5 thirds, minus x sub 1, which is 0. So if I'm subtracting away 0, I just have that number. So to simplify this, I'd have negative 5 over negative 5 over 3. So let me write negative 5 over 1 divided by negative 5 over 3. Right? I'm basically just dividing fractions here. Very, very simple. The first fraction, negative 5 over 1, is the same. Multiply it by the reciprocal of this guy, which would be negative 3 fifths. So this would cancel with this, and I'd have a 1 there. So negative 1 times negative 3 would basically just be positive 3, so that's my slope. So the slope here is 3. Now, the other way you could have done this, let me just erase everything, and I'm going to erase this point here because it's not going to be helpful to us if we're graphing. So, again, we already found out that m is equal to 3. Now, what would be another good point to use? Well, if I plug in something for y, think about how you solve an equation. So you have 3x minus y equals negative 5. I can add y to both sides of the equation and rewrite this equation as what? I could rewrite it as equals negative 5 plus y. So I need to add something to negative 5 that would be divisible by 3 because I'm going to end up dividing by 3 to isolate x. So what could I do? Well, I could add negative 4, right? Because negative 5 plus negative 4 would be negative 9. That's going to be divisible by 3. So let's start out with that. So negative 4 is going to be plugged in for y. And what's that going to give me? Again, this would be negative 9 over here. Divide both sides by 3. And x would equal negative 3. So if x is negative 3, y is negative 4. And let's try another one. Let's try another one. So again, 3x is equal to negative 5. And I move this guy over, so plus y. So another thing we could think of would be positive 2. Right? If I plugged in a positive 2 for y, this would end up being what? Negative 5 plus 2, that's negative 3. So that's negative 3. Divide both sides of the equation by 3, and I get x is equal to negative 1. So this is negative 1. So then my three ordered pairs here would be 0, 5. Uh, we'd have negative 3, negative 4. And we'd have negative 1, 2. All right. So let's take these points down to the coordinate plane and let's plot them. We'll graph it and then we'll look at the slope using that rise over run. So for my points, I have 0, 5, which again was the y intercept, so that's right here. We have negative 3, negative 4, so negative 3, negative 4, and we've got negative 1, 2. So negative 1 and then 2. That's right there. Okay, so there's my line. Now, in order to calculate slope using the rise over run, I know some of you saw the lesson, some of you are just viewing this because you have homework and you want a couple of quick examples. Rise over run is very, very simple. If I have a slope of 3, the rise is 3 and the run is 1, right? Because I can write 3 as 3 over 1 using fractional form. Now, that means that I go up from any given point three units and to the right one unit to get to the next point. So we can check that. We can start at this point, which is negative 1, 2, and I would rise three units, so I would go up 1, 2, 3, and I would run 1. So I go over 1, and I'm back on the line. So let's try that again. So I'd rise three units, 1, 2, 3, and over 1, and I'm back on the line. And it looks like I'm not exactly there, but that's just because of a slight error when you kind of freehand draw your line. But you can see that it's there. And you can also reverse this process 
by writing 3 over 1 as negative 3 over negative 1. Remember, negative divided by negative is positive. So this is equal to 3 over 1. Those are the same. So I could use that to say, okay, if I started out here, my rise is now negative 3. So I would fall 3 units, 1, 2, 3. My run is negative 1. A run of negative 1 means I'm going to the left 1 unit. So I go over to the left, and bam, I'm back on that line. Fall 3, 1, 2, 3, left 1, bam, back on the line. So you can see that we have the correct slope, right? The slope is 3, calculated using the slope formula. Or again, you could do it this way. You could do it graphically. You could you know, find three points, graph the line, and you could go through and calculate your rise over your run, and that is your slope. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on finding the slope of a line. All right, so we want to find the slope of the line that passes through each pair of points. So to start, we're given these two points. We have negative 5, 14 and 5, 20. So again, our slope formula is m, again this stands for slope, is equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So kind of once you have your slope formula kind of written down, the next thing you want to do is just label the points arbitrarily x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2. So it does not matter which one you label as which, right? So I could take this point and say this is x sub 1, y sub 1, and this one is x sub 2, y sub 2. Or I could change my mind and say that, okay, now this is x sub 2, y sub 2, and this is x sub 1, y sub 1. Doesn't matter, okay? As long as you're consistent with plugging into the formula, you'll be fine. So now I just plug in. So I want y sub 2 minus y sub 1. So y sub 2 is 14. So I'll erase that and put 14 minus y sub 1, y sub 1 is 20. So this is over x sub 2, which is negative 5. So negative 5 minus x sub 1, which is 5. So minus 5. Okay. So now you just crank out the arithmetic. 14 minus 20 is negative 6. And this is over negative 5 minus 5, which is negative 10. So the first thing is you know that negative over negative is positive. So that part is determined. And then 6 over 10, they're both divisible by 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 10 divided by 2 is 5. So you'd end up with positive 3 fifths as your slope. Right? So m is equal to 3 fifths. All right, for the next one, we're given points of 7, 4 and negative 3, 4. And you should immediately note that in each case, your y value is 4. So what does that tell you? Well, let me stop and go through the problem and just kind of think about it as I'm doing this. Okay, so I'm going to label this point as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this one as x sub 2, y sub 2. And again, you could change that up if you wanted to. It does not matter. Now, my slope formula, again, m, the slope, is going to be equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Now that you've had time to think, what type of line is this? It's a horizontal line. And how do you know that? Because you have the same y value in each case. So these two points are on the line y equals 4. Because no matter what x is, y is going to equal 4 x value of negative 3, y equals 4. x value of 7, y equals 4. x value of 2,700,000, y equals 4. Okay? So when you plug in the same number, like you will here, for y sub 2, you're going to have 4. And for y sub 1, you're going to have 4. So when you plug in the same number and you're doing your subtraction, you're going to end up with 0. 0 divided by any non-zero number is 0. So your slope here is going to be 0. Right? And that's the fact of the matter for any horizontal line. So you can save yourself some time if you notice that and say m is 0 right away. So for x sub 2, I'm going to plug in a negative 3. And for x sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 7. Let me kind of just erase this. I'm going to write this up here. This line is y equals 4. So 4 minus 4 is 0 over negative 3 minus 7, which is negative 10. And of course, 0 divided by negative 10 is just 0. So m equals 0. And again, remember this. If you have a horizontal line, the slope is always going to be 0. 
right? Because if you think about this in terms of rise over run, you're not going to move vertically at all. You're just moving horizontally. So the change in Y is zero and zero divided by anything you do as far as changing X, you could change X by one or change X by three. The change in Y is always zero. So zero divided by any non-zero number is zero, which produces a slope of zero. So just keep that in mind that whenever you run across a horizontal line, you're going to get a slope of zero. So again, if you would have noticed right away that you have the same value for Y in each case, you know that is a horizontal line and that your slope will be zero. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on finding the slope of a line. So we want to find the slope of the line that passes through each pair of points. And we're going to start out with these two given points here. Negative 6 comma negative 10 and 0 comma negative 18. The first thing you want to think about is your slope formula. And for most of you... At this stage of the game, you've probably memorized it. In case you haven't, just write it on a flashcard. It's M, which stands for slope, is equal to Y sub 2 minus Y sub 1 over X sub 2 minus X sub 1. Now, we take these two points. We're going to label one of them as X sub 1, Y sub 1. The other is X sub 2, Y sub 2. And it doesn't matter which one you assign to which. So I can just say that this is X sub 1 and this is Y sub 1. I can say this is x sub 2 and this is y sub 2. Again, it does not matter. I could have changed my mind and said that this was going to be x sub 2, y sub 2, and this was x sub 1, y sub 1. You get the same answer either way. Okay, so now you just plug in. So I want y sub 2. So that's negative 18. So plug that in there. Minus y sub 1, we have a negative 10. Minus a negative 10 is the same thing as plus 10. So I'd put plus 10. And then down here, x sub 2, that's 0. So I'll put a 0 there. Minus x sub 1. So minus a negative 6 is the same thing as plus 6. So plus 6. Now we just simplify. Negative 18 plus 10 is negative 8. And this is over positive 6. So both are divisible by 2. If I think about this negative out here, I'll just put this negative, And I'll think about 8 over 6. Divide 8 by 2, you get 4. So I'd have negative 4 over. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So your slope m is going to be equal to negative 4 thirds. All right, what about if we had the points 6, 11, and 9, 8? So again, I'm going to write my slope formula here. And that's m, the slope, is equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Now, I'm going to label the points as x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2. So let's just go ahead and make this one x sub 2, y sub 2, and this one x sub 1, y sub 1. Again, it does not matter which one you assign to which of these. It can be either. All right, so I'm just going to plug in. So for y sub 2, I have a value of 11. For y sub 1, I have a value of 8. So just plug in. For x sub 2, I have a value of 6. For x sub 1, I have a value of 9. Very, very easy. So then it's equals. 11 minus 8 is 3. Over 6 minus 9, that's negative 3. And 3 divided by negative 3 is the same thing as negative 1. So my slope here, m, is just equal to negative 1. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 3, on finding the slope of a line. All right, so we want to find the value of x or y so the line that goes through the given points will have the given slope. So it sounds kind of complicated, but if you see this on your homework or on a test, it's actually really, really simple. So in this case, instead of having to find the slope, the slope's already given to us. We know that the slope is 7. Now we're given two points, and if we were to plug these two points in, we should get a slope of 7, only the problem is, we're missing one of the values. Instead of having an actual value there, we just get y. So what you do here is you set it up the same way. You put your slope formula down. So your slope formula is m, which again is the slope, is equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Now, label the points again as x sub 1, y sub 1, just like you normally would and x sub 2, y sub 2. Now, 
I know what slope is. I know what m is. It's 7. So just replace this with 7. I don't know what y sub 2 is, but I'm just going to substitute that in with just y for right now. That's my unknown that I'm going to solve for. y sub 1 is negative 2. So minus a negative 2 is the same as plus 2. So let's write plus 2 there. For x sub 2, I have a negative 2. And then for x sub 1, I have a negative 3. So minus a negative 3 is the same as plus 3. All right. So negative 2 plus 3 is 1. So let's put this over 1. And we know that anything over 1 is just itself. So I can just erase this all together. And I have a very simple equation with one unknown. How do I solve for y? All I need to do is subtract 2 away from each side. That's gone. And I'll have that 5 is equal to y. So in other words, the missing value here, the unknown value in this ordered pair is 5. So this should be negative 2 comma 5. And let's see that real quick. So again, m is going to be equal to y sub 2, which we know now is 5, minus y sub 1, which we know is negative 2, so plus 2, over x sub 2, which is negative 2, minus x sub 1, which is negative 3. Minus a negative 3 is the same as plus 3. And so this equals 7, 5 plus 2 is 7, over 1. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1, which is 7. It's exactly what we were told in the beginning of the problem. So again, we found the missing value, right? That y there that we didn't know was 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on finding the slope of a line. All right, so we want to find the value of x or y so the line that goes through the given points will have the given slope. So... In case you didn't see the last video, I'll kind of explain this real quick. We have these two points. So we have x comma 1 and we have negative 1 comma negative 3. So you notice that this part right here is not a number. It's just saying x. Now, that just stands for just some unknown value that we don't know. There's some value that should be plugged in there that will produce a slope of 4 fifths. All right, we're given the slope. So if we see a problem like this, we use our regular slope formula. Again, m is equal to, and again, this is the slope, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. Now, go ahead and assign one of these points to be x sub 1, x sub 1, y sub 1, and then the other is x sub 2, y sub 2, and then just plug in. So I know m is 4 fifths. I know this is 4 fifths. And I know y sub 2 is negative 3. So that's negative 3. y sub 1 is 1. x sub 2 is negative 1. And I don't know what x sub 1 is. So I'm just going to write x. So minus x. And now I'm just going to simplify. So let me scroll down and get a little room going. So 4 fifths, nothing I'm going to do with that. Negative 3 minus 1 is the same thing as negative 4. And negative 1 minus x, I can't really simplify that any further. So I'm going to write negative 1 minus x. Now, if I'm solving something like that, I want you to think back to when we worked with proportions. All I need to do is cross multiply. So I'll multiply 5 times negative 4. That will give me negative 20. And this has to be equal to, okay, this has to be equal to this quantity, negative 1 minus x times 4. So make sure you use parentheses, 4 times the quantity, negative 1 minus x. And so negative 20 stays the same on the left. This equals 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, minus 4 times x is 4x. All right, so let me add 4 to both sides of the equation. So this is going to go away. Negative 20 plus 4 is negative 16. This is equal to negative 4x. And let's divide... Let's divide both sides of the equation by negative 4. And we're going to get that 4 is equal to x, right? This will cancel with this. Negative 16 divided by negative 4 is 4. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this unknown x here is a 4, right? The two points that should be here would be the point with 4 comma 1 and another point negative 1 comma negative 3. So in other words, I could replace this x with a 4, and I would get the given slope of 4 fifths. Negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. Negative 1 minus 4 is negative 5. And if I think about the signs here, negative over negative is positive. So really, I could just write this as 4 fifths. 
right? So my slope here, again, four fifths, the unknown value was four. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section five on finding the slope of a line. All right, so we wanna find the slope and we're given just a graph here and we don't know what the equation of the line is. We don't know anything other than we just have a line and we have some points that we can see, but we can find the slope of a line from its graph. All we basically have to do is use our rise over run. So I can start at any given point and it's obvious that there's a point right here and that point is what? It's zero comma four, it's the y-intercept. And I can calculate how much I have to rise and how much I have to run to get to the next point. So you get to the next point right here, which is at one comma zero or the x-intercept, I have to fall four units. I have to fall one, two, three, four units. And I have to run over to the right one unit. So falling four units is the same thing as negative four. So my rise is negative four. My run is one. I moved over one unit to the right, so that's over one. So my slope M would be negative four. Or you could write negative four over one, it doesn't matter. And you could verify this by plugging these two into the slope formula and calculating it, and you will in fact get a slope of negative four. I'll let you try that on your own. Another thing you can do is you can test it again. You can go down four, so one, two, three, four, and over to the right one, and you end up on the line again. All right, so let's try that one more time. We have another graph, and for this one, let's start out at this point right here in the middle. We have the y-intercept, which is zero comma negative two. And again, it's rise over run. That's what we're looking at, rise over run. So how much do I have to rise to get to this point here? So I go one, two, three, four, five. So I rise five and I go over to the right, I run one, two. So my rise is five, my run is two. And this point right here is two comma three. So if I took those two points and plugged them into the slope formula, I would calculate a slope of five halves. And you can go down here if you wanted to and try that. Remember, you could write five halves as negative five over negative two. So my rise is negative five, so that means I'm going down five units. One, two, three, four, five. My run is negative two. That means I'm going left two units. One, two, and I do end up right there, which is gonna be the point negative two comma negative seven. And again, you can take any two points here, plug them into the slope formula, and you will in fact get that your slope is five halves. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 17. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on equations of a line. All right, so step one, we wanna write the slope-intercept form of the equation of each line given the slope and y-intercept, and then we wanna graph each equation. All right, so we're given a slope of three halves, right? Again, remember, m means slope, and we're told the y-intercept occurs at zero comma negative five. So our generic formula for the slope-intercept form looks like this. We have y equals m the slope times x plus b, where b is the y-intercept. Let me kind of label this real quick. This is your y-intercept, and then m is your slope. And let me kind of fix this. Okay, so all I need to do really here is just plug in. All right, you get something like this on the test, super simple. So I'd have y equals, in place of m, I'm gonna write three halves, right? Because that's what my slope is. Then times x, then plus. For b, my y-intercept, I'm just gonna put the y value that occurs at the y-intercept. So we always know that x is zero, right? X is gonna be zero, y would be negative five in this case. So plus negative five, or I can put minus five. So to write this in slope-intercept form, I end up with y equals three halves x minus five. Now to graph this, I have a point on the line, which is the y-intercept, zero comma negative five, and I have the slope, which again is three halves. So my point on the line is zero comma negative five. And again, my slope, which I'm gonna write as rise over run, is equal to three halves. So the first thing I'm gonna do is plot that point, my y-intercept, that's zero comma negative five. So that's gonna be down here. 
and then rise over run. So I'm going to rise three. So I'm going to go up one, two, three, and I'm going to run two. So one, two. There's another point. Rise three, one, two, three, over to the right, one, two. So there's three points. And we're going to graph this line. Let's put some arrows at each end. And again, this is y equals 3 halves x minus 5. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have a slope m that is equal to negative 5 thirds. We have a y-intercept that occurs at 0, 1. So again, y equals y equals m the slope times x plus b. Again, this is the slope. This is the y-intercept. Let me kind of write that better. Okay. All right, so let's just plug in. So we have y equals, again, m is negative 5 thirds, so negative 5 thirds times x plus, for b, I'm putting in a 1, so plus 1. All right, so now all I need to do to graph this, again, I have a point on the line, which is 0, 1, and I have the slope, which is negative 5 thirds. So my point is 0, 1, and then I'm going to put rise over run is equal to, again, that slope is negative 5 thirds, so negative 5 over 3. You could also write it as 5 over negative 3. It doesn't really matter. So I'll start out at the point 0, 1, so that's going to be right here. And then I'm going to rise negative 5, so that means I'm falling 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm going to run 3. So 1, 2, 3. And then I can do that again, or I can reverse this. And I can say this is also 5 over negative 3. So starting at this point, I could rise 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I could go to the left 3. So 1, 2, 3. So here's another point on that line. Let me make that a little better. And let's graph it now. Okay, arrow at each end. So again, this is the equation. y is equal to negative 5 thirds x plus 1. All right, so now we're going to look at something else. So we want to write each in point slope form, then solve for y and place the equation in slope intercept form. So remember, we use point slope form when we're given a point and also the slope, or we could also be given two points. So we have our slope, m equals negative 2, and the line goes through the point 4, 5. So point slope form looks like this. We have y minus y sub 1, where y sub 1 is your given y coordinate from your point, equals m, the slope, times x minus x sub 1. Again, x sub 1 is the x from your given point. So we label this as x sub 1, y sub 1. We just plug in, right? And once we plug in, we have the equation in point slope form. So I'd plug in for y sub 1. So I'd plug a 5 in there. I'd plug in for m. I'd plug in a negative 2 there. And I'd plug in for x sub 1. I'd plug in a 4 there. So I'd have y minus 5 equals negative 2 times the quantity x minus 4. So this right here right now is called point slope form. So this is in point slope form. And if your book calls for that, then stop there. You're done. That's You don't need to do anything else. But what we're asked to do is to go further, solve for y, and put this in slope-intercept form. So let's do that. So we need to simplify. So we have y minus 5 is equal to negative 2 times x is negative 2x, and then negative 2 times negative 4 is plus 8. All right, so now I would add 5 to each side of the equation, and I would have y is equal to negative 2x, plus 8 plus 5 is 13. So this is my slope intercept form. I have y equals mx plus b. m here is negative 2, b here is 13. Right? So this is now in slope intercept form. All right, now we're given a slope m of 8 thirds, and this is going to go through the point negative 3 comma negative 3. So again, the point slope formula is y minus y sub 1, is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. All right, so I'm just going to plug in. And again, this right here, this point, this is x sub 1, y sub 1. So for y sub 1, I'm plugging in a negative 3. For m, I'm plugging in 8 thirds. And for x sub 1, I'm plugging in also a negative 3. Let's get a little room going. 
So y minus the negative 3 is the same as y plus 3. So y plus 3 equals 8 thirds times the quantity x minus a negative 3, so that's x plus 3. Now this is point slope form, so we can stop here if that's what it calls for. But again, in our instructions it said, go ahead and put it in slope intercept form, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to simplify, so y plus 3 is equal to 8 thirds times x is 8 thirds x, and then plus 8 thirds times 3, the 3's would cancel and you just have 8. Now all I need to do is get y by itself, so I subtract 3 away from each side, so that's gone, I'll just have y on the left, on the right I'll have 8 thirds x plus 8 minus 3 is 5. So this is your slope intercept form. Remember, it's y equals mx plus b. So m here is 8 thirds, b here is 5. All right, so for the last one we're going to kind of look at that deals with this, we have two points now. We're not given a slope. So through 2 comma negative 3 and 5 comma 3. So this may kind of stun you when you first get to it. You may be like, well, what am I doing here? Again, you know how to find a slope. So just take the two points and use your old-fashioned slope formula to get a slope, and then you can use the slope and one of the points, doesn't matter which one, to write it in point-slope form, and then you can solve that for y and get it in slope-intercept form. So, kind of tedious, but something you need to practice. So let's go ahead and crank it out. Let's label this as x sub 1, y sub 1, and let's label this as x sub 2, y sub 2. And so m, the slope, is equal to y sub 2, which is 3 here, minus y sub 1, which is negative 3, so that would be plus 3, over x sub 2, which is 5, minus x sub 1, which is 2. So 3 plus 3 is 6, over 5 minus 2 is 3, 6 over 3 is 2. So my slope here is going to be 2. All right, so for point slope form, I need one of these points and the slope. So it doesn't matter which one of these points I choose. I know a lot of you are going to look at this and, well, I got this as x sub 2. It doesn't matter. You can erase all that. This is... We're starting something else, so flush that from your memory. Either one of these points now, doesn't matter which one, can be labeled as x sub 1, y sub 1. And that's a big source of confusion. So I can choose this one and say it's x sub 1, y sub 1. Or I can choose the other one. It does not matter. So at this point, I just need one of them. So I'm going to go with this one. So I'm going to plug this into my point slope formula, which is y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. So I'm going to plug in. So I'm going to plug in a 2 for m. I'm going to plug in a 3 for y sub 1. I'm going to plug in a 5 for x sub 1. And again, I don't need this point. We're not doing anything else with it. We're done. Okay? Please don't comment and ask me what I'm doing with that. Nothing. That's the answer. Okay. So continuing. All right. So we have y minus 3 is equal to 2 times the quantity x minus 5. All right, so this at this point is the point slope form of the line. You can stop if you're asked for that, but again, we're asked to get it in slope intercept form. Y minus three is equal to two times the quantity X minus five. So two times X is two X minus two times five is 10. And now I just need to add three to both sides of the equation. So I'd have Y is equal to two X minus seven. And again, this is in slope intercept form, All right? Remember this is Y equals mx plus b, right? m is your slope, and b is your y-intercept. So 2 is your slope, negative 7 is your y-intercept. And just for the sake of completeness, to show you this one more time, I just know I'm going to get somebody that's going to comment and say, what, what about that other point up there? Okay, let's say I had done something different. Let's say I had said, okay, I'm going to make this x sub 1, y sub 1, and plug those points in. Guess what? you get the same thing in the end. So y sub 1 would now be negative 3. x sub 1 would now be 2. So I'd have y minus a negative 3. So this would be y plus 3. And I would have equals 2 times the quantity x minus, and this would be a 2. So let's go through everything. I'm going to show you it's going to be the exact same. So I'm leaving this, because that was my end result. So I have y plus 3 is equal to 2 times the quantity x minus 2. So 2x minus 4. Subtract 3 away from each side. That will go away. And you'd have y is equal to 2x minus 7. The same thing as you got over here. So again, 
please understand, if you get a problem and it doesn't give you a slope, you just get two points, you're only using the two points to get a slope. Once you're done with that, once you've got a slope, you only need one of the points. The other one, you can just forget that it exists, okay? Please don't let that confuse you because that's probably the biggest thing that I hear. What am I doing with that other point? Nothing. Leave it alone. Forget it exists, please, okay? You just need one of the points at that point, and it doesn't matter which one it is. Okay, moving on. All right, now we want to look at kind of the final thing, which is to write the standard form of the equation of each line. So I have y equals negative 3 halves x plus 3. So kind of I gave you two definitions of standard form when we talked about it in the lesson. I gave you kind of a generic one, and then I gave you kind of a stricter version that you'd see in high school. So kind of in high school, you see ax plus by equals c. Your teachers will say, okay, a, b, and c need to be integers, and a needs to be greater than or equal to zero, and a and b are not both zero at the same time. So how can we achieve something like that? Well, the first thing is I need to move this over here so that my x term can be on the left side with that y. So I would add 3 halves x to both sides. So if I did that, it would cancel over here, and I would have 3 halves x on the left side plus y, and then equals just 3. Now, I'm not in the format that I want yet because this is not an integer. It's greater than or equal to 0, but it's not an integer. So I need to fix that. So what I can do is I can multiply both sides of the equation by 2, right, the denominator here, and that's going to clear that fraction. Multiply this side by 2. i got to do it over here to make it legal. 2 times 3 halves x would just be 3x, plus 2 times y is 2y, and this equals 3 times 2, which is 6. So this is your equation in standard form. We end up with 3x plus 2y equals 6. All right, what about y equals 3 fourths x? Again, I want this to look like this. ax plus by equals c. And a, b, and c need to be integers. a and b cannot both be 0. And a is greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract 3 fourths x from both sides of the equation. If I do that, I'm going to have a 0 over here. And right? if I subtract 3 fourths x over here, that would become 0. And if I subtract it over here, I'd have negative 3 fourths x plus y is equal to 0. Now, nothing said that c couldn't be 0. c can be 0. You can have something equal to 0. That's fine. That's still standard form. The problem we have right now is that the coefficient of x is negative, and it's a fraction. And we said that a, b, and c need to all be integers. And we said a needed to be greater than or equal to 0. So how do we fix this? Well, we can do it in two steps, or we can make it easy and do it in one. The first thing, to fix the fact that it's negative, we would multiply by a negative, right? We multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, and that would change the sign of everything, and that would make this positive. But if we realize that we also want to multiply by the number 4, right, to clear the denominator, we can kind of combine the two and say, okay, if I, if I multiply both sides of the equation by negative 4, I would clear the negative and I would clear the fraction, right? So let's do that. So we'd have negative 4 times... Over here, negative 3 fourths x plus y equals 0 times negative 4. So over here, negative 4 times negative 3 fourths. The negatives would cancel. 4 would cancel with 4, and I'd have just 3x. So 3x, and then negative 4 times y would be minus 4y. And this is equal to 0 times negative 4 is 0. So I'd have 3x minus 4y equals 0. All right, last one. We have y equals 3 fifths x plus 6. So again, I want this in the format of ax plus by equals c. And so I'm going to move this 3 fifths x over here. So I'm going to subtract it from both sides of the equation. So I'd have minus 3 fifths x plus y equals 6. Now, again, a, b, and c need to be integers, and we want a to be greater than or equal to 0. This is not an integer, and it's not greater than or equal to 0. So again, I'm going to use the same trick. I want to clear the denominator here, so I need to multiply both sides of the equation by 5. I want to clear the negative, so I'm going to multiply by negative 5. So I'll multiply this side by negative 5 and this side by negative 5. And negative 5 times negative 3 fifths, the negatives would cancel. 5 would cancel with 5. I just have 3x. Then plus negative 5 times y is minus 5y. So this will be minus 5y. And this equals 6 times negative 5 is negative 30.
So I'm in good shape. 3, negative 5, and negative 30, those are all integers. And then a, which is the coefficient of the x, is positive, right? It's 3. So it fits the definition of a is greater than or equal to 0. So we're good to go there. And a and b are not both 0, which obviously you can tell that. So 3x minus 5y equals negative 30 is this equation written in standard form. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on equations of a line. All right, so we want to write the slope-intercept form of the equation of each line given the slope and y-intercept. So to start out, we're given a slope m that's equal to negative 2 fifths and a y-intercept that occurs at 0, comma, negative 2. So our slope-intercept form looks like this. It's y equals m the slope times x plus b, where b is going to be the y value or your y-intercept. So this is b. So if I was to write this, all I need to do is plug into the formula, right? I would have y equals, for m, I'd plug in a negative 2 fifths, then times x, and then where I have plus b, I could write plus negative 2, or of course I could write minus 2. So this would be in slope-intercept form, y equals negative 2 fifths x minus 2. All right, for the next one, I'm given a slope m that's equal to 3 fourths, and now a y-intercept that's at 0, comma, 1. So again, we have y equals mx plus b. So m is the slope, that's the slope, and then b is going to be 1. All right, that's the y value for your y-intercept, right? It occurs at 0, comma, 1. Let me make that a little clearer. So we would have y equals, for m I'd plug in 3 fourths, times x, and then plus b. So b is 1, so plus 1. So y equals 3 fourths x plus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on equations of a line. So we want to write the slope-intercept form of the equation of each line given the slope and y-intercept. So the first one here, we have that m, which is our slope, is equal to negative 5 fourths, and the y-intercept is going to occur at 0, comma, 3. So the generic formula for slope-intercept form is y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So this is the slope, and this is your y-intercept. Right, so in this case, m is negative 5 fourths, and b is 3. So we just have to plug in. Right, so y is equal to, again, the slope is negative 5 fourths, that represents m here, times x, and then plus b, so plus 3. That's the value for y in the y-intercept, right? So the y-intercept occurs at 0, comma, 3, so 3 is going to get plugged in for b. So y equals negative 5 fourths x plus 3. All right, so now we have a slope m that's equal to negative 6 and a y-intercept that occurs at 0, comma, 5. So again, y equals mx plus b. I'm going to plug in for m. I'm going to plug in a negative 6. I'm going to plug in for b. I'm going to plug in a 5. So y equals negative 6x plus 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on equations of a line. All right, so we want to graph each line. We're going to start out with y equals negative 2x plus 4. So this is given to us in what is known as slope-intercept form. So slope-intercept form is y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So if I have an equation in this form, I immediately know two things. I know the slope, and I know a point on the line, which is the y-intercept. So the slope here, m, is equal to negative 2, right? It's the coefficient of x. And the y-intercept, the y-intercept is going to occur at 0, comma, 4. So let's go down and graph this. So again, the point I know is 0, comma, 4, and my slope is negative 2. So m equals negative 2. And in terms of us graphing things, we like to write this as rise over run. So I'll write negative 2 as negative 2 over 1. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plot this point 0, comma, 4, right, the y-intercept. So I'm going to go up here, plot that point, and then I'm going to get some additional points using the slope. 
So the rise is negative two, so that means I fall two, one, two. My run is one, so that means I go to the right one. So here's another point. Fall two, one, two, to the right one. There's another point. Fall two, one, two, to the right one. There's another point. And you can keep going, or you could change this up and say, okay, well, negative two over one is the same thing as two over negative one. So I could have started here, and I could go up to one, two, I'd rise two, and then go to the left one, right? Because a run of negative one means I go to the left one. So here's another point. And then once you have enough points, really you only need two or three, you can just draw a line. Okay, so again, this is the graph of y equals negative 2x plus 4. All right, let's take a look at y equals 4 fifths x plus 1. So again, I'm given the slope. This is your slope. This is m. I'm given the y-intercept. The y-intercept is going to occur at 0, 1. I can go down to my graph. I know a point on the line. It's 0, 1. And I know the slope, m, is again 4 fifths. So I'm going to write this as rise over run to make it easy for us. So this is 4 over 5. I'm going to start at that point 0, 1. So that's right here. I'm going to rise 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to run 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm going to, again, rise 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Run 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if I want some points over here, I can kind of write this as negative 4 over negative 5. Right? It's negative over negative is still positive. So I would fall 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And I would go to the left 5. 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So that points on the line as well. I make that a little better. Now I can graph the line. Okay. And we'll connect that with some arrows. And let me kind of make that a little cleaner. Okay. So this is the graph of y equals 4 fifths x plus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on equations of a line. All right, so we want to write each using point-slope form, then solve for y and place the equation in slope-intercept form. All right, so for the first problem, we have a line that goes through the point negative 5, 3 and has a slope that's 2. So for the point-slope formula, we have y minus y sub 1, is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay, so this given point here, we label this as x sub 1, y sub 1. So I'm going to plug into the point slope formula. So for y sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 3. For m, I'm going to plug in a 2. And for x sub 1, I'm going to plug in a negative 5. So I'd have y minus 3 is equal to 2 times the quantity x minus a negative 5, which is the same as x plus 5. So this right here is called point-slope form. So if you're asked for that on a test, that's where you could stop, right? This is the point-slope form. But we're asked to go further and put this in slope-intercept form, which means we want to solve for y, right? We want y on one side of the equation by itself. So to do that, let's simplify. Let's go y minus 3 is equal to 2 times x, that's 2x, plus 2 times 5, that's 10. I would add 3 to both sides of the equation, and I would have y is equal to 2x plus 13. So this is slope-intercept form. And again, this mirrors y equals mx plus b, where m is your slope, right? That's the coefficient of x, and b is your y-intercept. In this case, that's going to occur at 0, comma, 13. So for the next one, the line goes through the point negative 1, comma, 2, and the slope m is negative 3. Again, the point-slope formula is y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. All right, so I'm going to plug in for y sub 1, for m, and for x sub 1. So again, I'm going to label this point as x sub 1, y sub 1, and just plug in. So for y sub 1, I'm plugging in a 2. For m, I'm plugging in a negative 3. For x sub 1, I'm plugging in a negative 1. So we'd have y minus 2 is equal to negative 3 times the quantity x minus a negative 1, which is the same thing as x plus 1. So this is point-slope form, 
And again, we want to continue until we get it in a slope intercept form. So I'm going to keep simplifying. So y minus 2 is equal to negative 3 times x is negative 3x. And then negative 3 times 1 would be minus 3. So now I can just add 2 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. I'll have y is equal to negative 3x. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. So y equals negative 3x minus 1. And again, this is slope intercept form. We have y equals mx plus b, right? Where negative 3 is the slope, m, and negative 1 is your b, your y intercept. All right, so now we have a line that passes through two given points, but we're not given the slope. So through 0, comma, negative 5 and 5, comma, 2. So in this situation, we have to use our old-fashioned slope formula to calculate a slope. So then we can use either point and the slope that we just got to put it in point slope form. And then we can then solve for y and get it in slope intercept form. So I'm going to label this as x sub 1, y sub 1. And this is x sub 2, y sub 2. And my slope formula, as you'll remember, m, the slope, is equal to y sub 2, which is 2 minus y sub 1, which is negative 5, minus the negative 5 is plus 5, over x sub 2, which is 5, minus x sub 1, which is 0. So 2 plus 5 is 7, over 5 minus 0, which is 5. So my slope m is 7 fifths. Now, here comes the tricky part, part that nobody gets. Once you've used these two points to calculate the slope, you only need one of them, and it does not matter which one it is. You can pick this one and forget about this one or you can pick this one and forget it doesn't matter just get rid of one of them in your head so i'm going to erase everything and just say okay this right here is going to be my point x sub one y sub one you don't need to worry about this no matter which point you end up choosing it works in the end when you solve for y you get the same thing okay and i've demonstrated that before in previous videos so what we're going to do now is we have our slope and we have a given point we're going to plug it into the point slope form so we have y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. All right, so for y sub 1, we have a 2 that we're going to plug in. For x sub 1, we have a 5 that we're going to plug in. And for m, we have a 7 fifths that we're going to plug in. Okay, so y minus 2 is equal to m, which is 7 fifths, times the quantity x minus 5. So now this is in point slope form. Again, if we solve for y, it's going to be in slope-intercept form. So we'd have y minus 2 is equal to 7 fifths x minus 7 fifths times 5. The 5s would cancel, and you just have 7. So to solve for y, I just add 2 to both sides of the equation. That's gone, and I'll have y is equal to 7 fifths x minus 5. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on Equations of a Line. All right, so we want to write the standard form of the equation of the line. And the definition I'm going to use of standard form is going to be where we have ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are all integers, and a is greater than or equal to 0, and then a and b are not both 0 at the same time. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at what we're given here. We have that y equals negative 7 thirds x plus 1. So the first thing is I want my ax plus by on the left. So I'm just going to add, I'm going to add 7 thirds x to both sides of the equation. What does that look like? It looks like this. I'm going to have 7 thirds x plus y is equal to, this would have canceled, so just 1. Now the problem I have is that this is a fraction, right? So I want to make this a non-fraction because I'm told that a, b, and c need to be integers. So to do that, I just need to clear this 3. So I can multiply both sides of the equation by 3 to do that. And what am I going to get? 3 times 7 thirds is 7. So I'd have 7x plus 3 times y is 3y equals 1 times 3 is just 3. So to put this in standard form, I end up with 7x plus 3y equals 3. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have y equals 1 fifth x plus 3. Again, I'm looking for ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers. a is greater than or equal to 0, and a and b are not both 0 at the same time. So again, the first thing is I'm going to move this term over here 
I'm going to subtract 1 5th x away from both sides of the equation. So I'd have negative 1 5th x plus y is equal to 3. Now there's two problems here. This is negative, and I'm saying that a needs to be greater than or equal to 0, so that's a problem. And this is a fraction, and I said this needs to be an integer. So I can do this in two steps or one. So to kind of do it in two steps, the first thing I would do is I would multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. So let's just do that real quick. So negative times negative would be positive. So I'd have 1 fifth x. Negative times positive would be negative. So this would be minus y equals positive times negative would be negative. So this would be equals negative 3. So I've solved the problem where this was negative. Right? I just multiplied both sides of the equation by negative 1. The other problem is that this is a fraction. So again, I can just clear the fraction by multiplying both sides of the equation by 5, right? this denominator here. So what's going to happen is 5 times 1 fifth is just 1. Right? So I'd have 1x or just x. Then minus 5 times y is 5y. This equals negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. Now, I get x minus 5y equals negative 15. The quicker way to do that would have been in one step. I could have multiplied by just negative 5, and it would have taken care of both in one step. So again, I wanted to separate it so that you could see what I'm doing. But on your homework or on a test, you want to do it in one step so you can save yourself a little bit of time. All right, let's look at one last problem. We have y equals negative 9 fifths x plus 6. Again, I'm looking for ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers. a is greater than or equal to 0 and a and b are not both zero. All right, so I'm gonna start out by adding 9 fifths x to both sides of the equation. So we're gonna have 9 fifths x plus y is equal to six. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides of the equation by five, right? Because I don't want this to be a fraction, I need an integer. So I'm gonna clear that fraction, multiply by five over here and over here. So then five times 9 fifths is just nine, then times x, then plus 5 times y is 5y, and this equals 6 times 5, which is 30. So here's our equation in standard form. We have 9x plus 5y equals 30. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 18. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on parallel and perpendicular lines. All right, so we want to determine if each pair of lines are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So we're going to start out with 7x minus 4y equals 12, and 8x minus y equals 3. So you'll recall from the lesson, if we have parallel lines, the lines have the same slope but different y-intercepts. If we have perpendicular lines, when we analyze the slopes from the two lines, they have a property to where if you multiply the two slopes together, the product is negative 1. Now, the quickest and easiest way to do this is to solve each equation for y and put it in slope-intercept form. That's going to allow us to analyze the slopes. And so let's start out by just taking this guy here. We have 7x minus 4y equals 12. To solve it for y, I'm going to subtract 7x away from each side of the equation. This is going to cancel. I'm going to have negative 4y is equal to negative 7x plus 12. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 4. All right, so now this is going to cancel, right? Negative 4 over negative 4 is 1. So you'd have 1y or just y. And this equals negative 7 over negative 4 is 7 fourths times x. And then 12 over negative 4 is negative 3, so minus 3. So y equals 7 fourths x minus 3. So again, y equals 7 fourths x minus 3. All right, so let's work on this one now. So we have 8x minus y equals 3. I'm going to subtract 8x away from each side of the equation. Again, that's going to cancel. So we're going to have negative y is equal to negative 8x plus 3. And then to get y by itself, I'm just going to either multiply or divide both sides of the equation by negative 1. doesn't matter which one I do. Let's go ahead and multiply both sides by negative 1. It's a little bit quicker. So then this would be y is equal to negative 1 times negative 8x is 8x, and then negative 1 times 3 is minus 3. So this guy is going to be y equals 8x minus 3. So when we look at the slopes here, they're not the same. 
you've got a slope of 7 fourths and you've got a slope of 8. Not the same slope, so the lines are not parallel. With these two slopes multiply together to give me a product of negative 1. You can see that it wouldn't, right? Both are positive numbers. Positive times positive is positive, so we know that's not going to work. We can do it for the sake of completeness. This would cancel and give me a 2. 7 times 2 is 14. That's not negative 1. So these lines aren't parallel. They're also not perpendicular, so they're neither. All right, for the next one, I have x minus 4y equals negative 16. And then also we have 1 half x minus 2y equals 10. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to solve each one for y, and I'm going to put it in what's called slope-intercept form. That's going to allow me to analyze the slopes by just looking at the equation. So let's bring this down here. I'd have x minus 4y equals negative 16. I would subtract x away from each side of the equation, so that's gone. I'll have negative 4y is equal to negative x minus 16. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 4. And I'm going to end up with y is equal to negative x over negative 4. Basically, think about this as negative 1 over negative 4. That's 1 fourth times x, and then negative over negative is positive, 16 over 4 is 4. So y equals 1 fourth x plus 4. So again, this is y equals 1 fourth x plus 4. All right, for the next one, I have 1 half x minus 2y equals 10. So 1 half x minus 2y equals 10. Again, I'm going to subtract 1 half x away from each side of the equation, and that's going to cancel. I'll have negative 2y is equal to negative 1 half x plus 10. And I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. But because I have a fraction here, kind of an easier way to think about this would be I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 1 half. Right? That's the reciprocal of negative 2. And when you multiply a number by its reciprocal, you get 1. So I'm going to multiply over here by negative 1 half also. And you get a little room going. So we know that this is going to cancel and become 1. So I'll just have y on the left. On the right, negative 1 half times negative 1 half is 1 fourth. So this would be 1 fourth x. And then negative 1 half times 10, we know that's negative. 10 would cancel with 2 and give me 5. So this would be a minus 5 here. So y equals 1 fourth x minus 5. So y equals, again, 1 fourth x minus 5. So just casually looking at the two equations, you can now see that the slopes are the same. All right, remember, y equals m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So we have 1 fourth here and 1 fourth here. Same slope, different y-intercepts. These lines are parallel. All right, so just to kind of show you this on a graph, you have y equals 1 fourth x plus 4. So to graph that, I would find 0 comma 4, the y-intercept here, and that occurs right here. That occurs right here. And the slope is 1 fourth. So I would rise 1, and I would go to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4. Or I could fall 1 and go to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4. Doesn't matter. Let me graph that line. OK. And then the next one is y equals. Okay, y equals 1 fourth x minus 5. So the y-intercept is going to occur at 0 comma negative 5. It's going to be right here. And again, the slope is 1 fourth. So I'm going to go up 1 to the right, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or I can go down 1 to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's graph this guy. Okay, so when we look at these two lines, we can tell that although they're not drawn perfectly, they have the same slant or steepness to them, right? Because they have the same slope. So these lines are parallel, right? And it's important that we understand what parallel lines really mean because in a, in a few lessons, we're going to start talking about systems of linear equations. And we'll talk about situations where we have two parallel lines. And the main thing is you have to understand that these two lines will never intersect, right? They're going to keep going forever and ever and ever with the same slope or steepness, so they'll never touch each other, no matter how far you extend these graphs. So it's very, very important that you understand that. All right, let's take a look at 3x plus 5y equals 20, and 35x minus 21y equals 21. So again, I want to solve each one for y. So 3x 
3x plus 5y equals 20. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 3x away from each side of the equation. It's going to cancel. I'll have 5y is equal to negative 3x plus 20. Divide both sides of the equation by 5. And this is going to give me y is equal to negative 3 fifths x plus 20 over 5 is 4. So y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 4. All right, for the next one, I have 35x minus 21y equals 21. So let me do this down here. We have 35x minus 21y equals 21. So again, subtract 35x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 21y is equal to negative 35x plus 21. So I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 21. Scroll down and get a little room going. So that's going to cancel. I'll have y is equal to negative 35 over negative 21. We know it's positive, so we don't have to worry about the sign. 35 is divisible by 7, so is 21. 35 divided by 7 is 5. 21 divided by 7 is 3. So this would be 5 thirds times x, and then 21 over negative 21 is just minus 1. All right, so now that we have each in slope-intercept form, I can just look at the slopes. They're not the same, right? This one's negative 3 fifths, and this one's 5 thirds. But obviously, those are going to multiply together and give you a product of negative 1. So these two lines are going to be perpendicular, right? If I take negative 3 fifths and I multiply it by 5 thirds, this will cancel with this and give me a 1. This will cancel with this and give me negative 1. Negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1. So the product of the slopes is negative 1. That's the characteristic of perpendicular lines. So these are perpendicular. All right, let's take a look at these two graphically real fast. So we have y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 4. So the y-intercept is going to occur at 0 comma 4. So that's going to be right here. And then my slope is negative 3 fifths. So I'm going to go down 3, 1, 2, 3, to the right 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right there. I can go down 3, 1, 2, 3, to the right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's kind of a far point on the in the coordinate plane. So I could have done a point over here by saying, okay, I can also do up 3, 1, 2, 3, to the left 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let me just erase this point. It's kind of far. Okay. Now the other one, we have y equals 5 thirds x minus 1. So the y-intercept is going to occur at 0 comma negative 1. That's right there. And then the slope is 5 thirds. So I would rise 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Go to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. And again, I could fall 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And go to the left 1, 2, 3. So what you're going to notice when you draw these two on a coordinate plane, at the point of intersection, for perpendicular lines, you're going to form 90 degree angles. Okay, so that's your symbol for a 90 degree angle, and you could draw those all the way around if you wanted to. I'm not going to, just in the interest of time. Alright, so the next thing we want to do is we want to write the standard form of the equation of the line described. Alright, so it's going through the point 4, 3, and it's parallel to 5x minus 4y equals 20. So what are we going to do here? Well, we can write the equation of a line if we know a point on the line and the slope of the line. Now, we are not told the slope of the line directly, but what we're told is that the line is parallel to this one, and so if we get the slope from this one, it would be the same, right? Because parallel lines have the same slope. So that's why we kind of have to do a little work to get this going. So the first thing I'm going to do is just solve this for y. So I have 5x minus 4y equals 20. I'm going to subtract 5x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 4y is equal to negative 5x plus 20. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 4. And so I'll have y is equal to 5 fourths x minus 5. 
So I don't need anything from this equation other than its slope. The slope is 5 fourths. So now I can just write m equals 5 fourths. I can erase all this work. I don't need any of it anymore. And I can't stress this to you enough. Once I've finished working with this equation, just line it out. There's nothing else for you to do with it. Okay, so just take it out of your mind. So now I have a point on the line and I have a slope. So what am I going to use? I'm going to use point slope form, right? So the point slope formula is y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. So I'm going to use this and I'm going to plug in. So this point here, this 4 comma 3, this is my x sub 1, y sub 1. So I'm going to plug in a 4 for x sub 1. I'm going to plug in a 3 for y sub 1. And I'm going to plug in a 5 fourths for m. So I'll have y minus 3 is equal to 5 fourths times this quantity, x minus 4. So this is point slope form. It did not ask for that. It asked for standard form. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solve this for y, put it in slope intercept form, and then I'm going to do one more conversion and put it in standard form. So we're going to do y minus 3 is equal to 5 fourths times x is 5 fourths x, and then minus 5 fourths times 4, the 4s would cancel, right? This would cancel with this, and I just have minus 5. So now all I need to do to solve this for y is add 3 to both sides of the equation. So I get y is equal to 5 fourths x and then minus 2. So this is slope intercept form. We got to go one more step further and put it in standard form. So remember, standard form looks like this. It's ax plus by equals c. And there's a lot of different definitions of this floating around. I don't want to make anybody mad, but typically in high school they're going to tell you a, b, and c are to be integers. a and b cannot both be 0, and a is to be greater than or equal to 0. So I would move this over here to start. So I would subtract 5 fourths x away from each side of the equation. I would have negative 5 fourths x plus y equals negative 2. Right? All I did was subtract it from over here. That would make it cancel. Subtract it from over here. So that's why I have the negative 5 fourths x on the left. Now, continuing this, I want a, which is the coefficient of x, to be an integer. I want b, the coefficient of y, to be an integer, and c, the constant, to be an integer. So what I can do is I can just multiply both sides of the equation by 4 to clear this denominator. But there's one additional thing that I can do right now to kind of speed this up. I know also that a, the coefficient of x, has to be positive. So if I go ahead and multiply it by negative 4, I can kill two birds with one stone. So I can multiply by negative 4 on both sides of the equation. That will make this positive and an integer. Negative 4 times negative 5 fourths is positive 5, and then times x. Negative 4 times y is minus 4y, and then negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. So this equals 8. So 5x minus 4y equals 8 would be this equation in standard form. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have through the point 1 comma 0, and it's perpendicular to 6x plus 6y equals 30. So I'm going to solve this guy for y, so I can find out what the slope is here. So 6x plus 6y equals 30. Subtract 6x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. 6y is equal to negative 6x plus 30. Divide both sides of the equation by 6. And we're going to get y is equal to negative 6 over 6 is negative 1 times x plus 30 over 6 is 5. So this is y equals negative x plus 5. So the slope here the slope here is negative 1. Okay, it's a negative 1. But that's not the slope for the equation of the line I'm trying to produce because it's perpendicular to this. Perpendicular slopes have a property where the product of them would be negative 1. So negative 1 times what equals negative 1? Well, when I multiply a number by something and I get the same number back, the only number that can do that is 1. Right? So this has to be 1. So then the slope for this line here is 1. Now once I've figured all that information out, get rid of this thing. Just line it out because you're going to keep coming back to it and saying, what was I supposed to do with that? You've already got all the information out of it that you need. You're done. So now I can use my point slope form. y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1 to write the equation of this line. 
So my given point, my x sub 1, y sub 1 is 1 comma 0. So I'm plugging in a 1 for x sub 1, I'm plugging in a 0 for y sub 1, and I'm plugging in a 1 for the slope. So I will have y minus 0 equals 1 times the quantity x minus 1. So that's point slope form. And we're going to solve this for y, put it in slope intercept form. So I would have y equals 1 times anything is itself, so x minus 1. And now to put it in standard form, all I would need to do is I would subtract x away from each side of the equation. So I would have negative x plus y equals negative 1. And now remember that we want the coefficient of the x variable. Remember this is ax plus by equals c. We want a to be greater than or equal to 0. We want a, b, and c to be integers. And we want a and b to not both be 0. So to fix this problem here, because the coefficient of x, the a, is negative, I can just multiply both sides by negative 1. Very easy fix. So negative 1 times negative x is x. Negative 1 times y is minus y. And then negative 1 times negative 1 is 1, so equals 1. So we get x minus y equals 1 as the standard form for the equation of the line that passes through the point 1 comma 0 and is perpendicular to 6x plus 6y equals 30. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. We have through the point negative 4 comma negative 3 and perpendicular to 12x plus 3y equals 15. So again, I'm just going to solve this guy for y and get the slope. So I've got 12x plus 3y equals 15. I'm going to subtract 12x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'm going to have 3y is equal to negative 12x plus 15. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 3. And I'm going to get that y is equal to negative 12 over 3 is negative 4 times x plus 15 over 3 is 5. So y equals negative 4x plus 5. So then what's my slope going to be for this equation I'm trying to generate here? Remember, these two lines are perpendicular. So that means that negative 4 times the slope equals negative 1. Right? You can use a variable there. You can just put m. That stands for slope. And so what would I do if I had negative 4m equals negative 1? I'd divide both sides by negative 4, and I'd solve for m, right? That would cancel, and I'd have m is equal to 1 fourth. So there's your slope. m is going to equal 1 fourth, because 1 fourth times negative 4 is negative 1. All right, now once we got the information from this thing, line it up. I don't need it. I don't want to think about it. I'm done with it. All right, so we're going to use point slope form, right? We have a point on the line and the slope. So point slope form is y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay. So for y sub 1, I'm plugging in a negative 3. That's what they're giving me. So I'm plugging that in. For x sub 1, I'm plugging in a negative 4. For m, I'm plugging in a 1 fourth. So what's this going to look like? It's going to be y minus a negative 3, so that's y plus 3, is equal to 1 fourth times the quantity x minus a negative 4 is plus 4. So then if I solve it for y, 1 fourth times x is 1 fourth x, 1 fourth times 4 is 1. So continuing, if I subtract 3 away from each side of the equation, I'll get y is equal to 1 fourth x minus 2. All right, now the last thing I want to do, remember I want to put this in standard form. So ax plus by equals c. A is greater than or equal to 0, A, B, and C are integers, and A and B are not both 0. So I'm going to subtract 1 fourth X away from each side of the equation. That would cancel. I'd have negative 1 fourth X plus Y equals negative 2. Now I've got two problems here. This is not an integer, and it's negative. So I'm going to multiply by negative 4 to fix both those problems. The negative times the negative here will make that a positive, so that's, that'll work out there. And the 4 part will cancel with this 4 here, and that will make it an integer. So again, I'm going to multiply by negative 4 to kill two birds with one stone. So let me scroll down. Negative 4 times negative 1 fourth. Negative times negative is positive. The 4s would cancel, and I just have 1. right? So this would basically just be x. And then negative 4 times y is minus 4y. This equals negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. So x minus 4y equals 8 is the standard form of the line that passes through the point 
negative 4 comma negative 3 and is perpendicular to 12x plus 3y equals 15. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on parallel and perpendicular lines. All right, so we want to determine if each pair of lines are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So we're going to start out with 7x plus 2y equals 10 and 4x minus 14y equals 42. So let me just kind of review a little bit from the lesson. Parallel lines have the same slope. Perpendicular lines have slopes where their product would be negative 1. So the first thing we want to do here is put each in slope-intercept form. So slope-intercept form. And what that looks like specifically is we've solved it for y, and it's y is equal to m the slope times x plus b the y-intercept. So this is your slope here. And again, this is your y-intercept. All right, so let's start out with 7x plus 2y equals 10. Let's solve it for y. So remember, I'm trying to isolate this term here to start. So I would just subtract 7x away from each side, and I would have 2y is equal to negative 7x plus 10. And then to isolate y, I'd divide each side of the equation by 2. Let me scroll down and get a little room. So obviously this cancels, and I have y on the left. On the right, I'd have negative 7 halves x, and then plus 10 over 2 is 5. So y equals negative 7 halves x plus 5. So let me erase everything. I'm going to write that up top. So again, in this particular case, this is your slope. This is m. And again, this is the y-intercept. Okay. Let's take a look at this one right here. So we have 4x minus 14y equals 42. 4x minus 14y equals 42. So subtract 4x away from each side. Cancel so that out. You have negative 14y is equal to negative 4x plus 42. I'm going to divide each side of the equation by negative 14. That's going to cancel with that, and you'll have a y, and this equals negative over negative is obviously positive. Each is divisible by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2, so that would be 2. 14 divided by 2 is 7. So then times x. So then we have plus. We have 42 over negative 14. So I know that's negative, so I'm going to put a minus there. And 42 divided by 14 is 3. So this would be minus 3. And so I get y equals 2 7 x minus 3. This right here is, again, your m. It equals 2 7 And this right here, this negative 3, is your y-intercept. Your y-intercept. So when we look at our slopes here, we have a slope of 2 7 and we have a slope of negative 7 halves. Okay, they're not the same value, so we know the lines are not parallel. The next thing you're looking for is, are the lines perpendicular? Well, if they are, I can take the slope of one, which is 2 sevenths, multiply it by the slope of the other, which is negative 7 halves, and I should get negative 1. And in fact, I will, right? Because you can look at this and say, okay, well, the 2s would cancel. 2 over 2 is just 1. And then negative 7 over positive 7 is negative 1. So this would be negative 1. And 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. So because these slopes, when multiplied together, give you a result of negative 1, we have perpendicular lines. So these lines are perpendicular. So one cool thing we can do is graph it to see what perpendicular lines look like on a coordinate plane. So the first one, we ended up with y equals negative 7 halves x plus 5. Then for the next one, we had y equals 2 7 x minus 3. So again, if I know a point on the line and I know the slope, I can graph the line pretty easily. So for this first one, y equals negative 7 halves x plus 5. The y-intercept occurs at 0 comma 5. So let's start out there. And then let's use our rise over run with our slope of negative 7 halves. So we rise negative 7. That means I'm going to fall 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm going to run 2. So 1, 2. So that's right there. 
And I'm going to do that one more time. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, run two. One, two. That's right here. Let me just graph the line. And let me put an arrow there. Let me reduce this a little bit over here. Kind of hanging off the plane. So right there. Here's my first line. And then I have y equals 2 sevenths x minus 3. So my point now is going to be at 0 comma negative 3. That's the y-intercepts so that's there. And then the slope is 2 sevenths. So let's erase this. And let's put 2 over 7. So I'm going to rise to 1, 2. Go to the right 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then I can also go down 2 and to the left 7. Right? This is the same. Negative over negative is positive. So I can go down 1, 2 and to the left 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right there. Okay. That's your second line. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the point of intersection here. Now I know these lines aren't drawn perfect, but with perpendicular lines at the point of intersection, you get a 90 degree angle. So this is a 90 degree angle, and this would be two. This is a 90 degree angle, and this would be two. 90 degrees, and this would be also 90 degrees. So this is what two perpendicular lines would look like on a coordinate plane. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on parallel and perpendicular lines. All right, so we want to determine if each pair of lines are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. And we're going to look at 2x minus 5y equals 0 and 6x minus 15y equals negative 30. So what we want to do here is put each equation in what's called slope-intercept form. So slope intercept form. Now, to do that, we just solve for y, and it looks like this. We have y equals m the slope times x plus b, which is the y-intercept. Now, once we know what the slope is for each equation, we can compare the two. Parallel lines, or more specifically, non-vertical parallel lines, are going to have the same slope. And when you talk about non-vertical lines where they're perpendicular, the slopes are going to have a product of negative 1. So let's go ahead and start out our problem by solving this 2x minus 5y equals 0 for y. I'm going to just subtract 2x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 5y is equal to negative 2x. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 5. And I'm going to get y equals 2 fifths x. Right? The negatives would cancel there, and I'd have 2 over 5 times x, or 2 fifths x. Now, what can we say about this equation? Something like 2x minus 5y equals 0, we should have already known from a previous lesson that that's a line that goes through the origin. So if I write plus 0 here, I can make it completely clear that the y-intercept is going to be at the origin. Right, because the y-intercept is going to occur at the point 0, comma, 0. So this guy right here is y equals 2 fifths x. So m is equal to 2 fifths, right, your slope. It's always the coefficient of x. And then the y-intercept, the y-intercept is going to occur at the point 0, comma, 0, or the origin. Okay, for the next one, we have 6x minus 15y equals negative 30. Again, I want to solve this for y. So I'd have 6x minus 15y equals negative 30. And I'm going to subtract 6x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 15y is equal to negative 6x minus 30. And to get y by itself, I just divide both sides of the equation by negative 15. So cancel that with that. And I'll get y is equal to... Negative 6 over negative 15, it's positive. They're each divisible by 3, so it's 2 fifths, right? 6 divided by 3 is 2. 15 divided by 3 is 5. So 2 fifths x, and then negative 30 over negative 15 is plus 2. Okay. So we get y equals 2 fifths x plus 2. The slope m, m is equal to 2 fifths. 
and your y-intercept, your y-intercept is going to correct 0, 2. Now, what you can immediately see here is that the slopes are the same. In this particular case, for 2x minus 5, y equals 0, we get y equals 2 fifths x when it's in slope-intercept form. The slope is 2 fifths. For this equation, 6x minus 15, y equals negative 30. In slope-intercept form, it's y equals 2 fifths x plus 2. Again, the slope is 2 fifths. So these lines are parallel. So again, y equals 2 fifths x. And then we had y equals 2 fifths x plus 2. So as you know by now, again, if you know the slope and you have a point on the line, in this case we'll know our y-intercept, you can easily graph the line. So for this first one, we know it's a line that passes through the origin. The y-intercept would occur at 0, 0, so we'll start right there. And then we'll use our rise over run, our rise over run. So the slope is 2 fifths. That means I rise 2, 1, 2, I run to the right 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's right there. And I could also reverse that if I wanted to. I could put negative 2 over negative 5. Negative over negative is positive, so this is the same thing as 2 fifths. So I can fall to 1, 2, go to the left 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then let's just graph this line now. Okay, and now we want to graph the other equation, y equals 2 fifths x plus 2. So now we're going to have a y-intercept that occurs at 0, comma 2, so that's right there. And again, we have the same slope, so up to 1, 2, over to right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or I could go down to 1, 2, to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So when you look at the two lines on the coordinate plane, you can see that they kind of look like the same line. They have the same steepness or the same slope. They're just in different locations on the coordinate plane, right? One has a y-intercept at the origin. The other has a y-intercept at 0, comma 2. But the most important thing is to realize that no matter how far out we stretch our coordinate plane, no matter how far out we also extend our lines, they will never, ever, ever touch. They will never, ever touch. That's the point of parallel lines. They have the same slope and different y-intercepts, and so they will never intersect. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on parallel and perpendicular lines. All right, so we want to write the standard form of the equation of the line described. All right, so we're looking at a line that goes through the point negative 3, 1, and is parallel to y equals negative 1 third x minus 2. So let me try to explain this to you. I know you're going to get a problem like this in this section. And essentially, what you have to do is go through all the different forms of a line. You're going to start out by taking the information you're given, and you're going to try to put this in point slope form. Remember, this is the form that you use when you know one point, which we're given, and the slope, which we're going to determine based on this information. So this is y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Okay, so we have our given point. Our given point is negative 3 comma 1. So this serves as our x sub 1, y sub 1. So we could plug in here and here, but we're missing our slope m. Where we're going to get that information is from this. It says that it's parallel to this line here. Now remember, parallel lines have the same slope. The slope of this line is negative one-third. And so the slope of this line will also be negative one-third. So you see, that's what you're going to plug in here. Now, once you've gotten all this information, you can forget about this right here. You don't need that anymore. You're just using it to figure out what the slope's going to be. All right, so let's go through, plug in, and simplify. So we're going to have y minus y sub 1, which is 1, is equal to m, which is our slope, that's negative 1 third, times the quantity, we have x minus x sub 1, which is negative 3. Minus the negative is plus the positive, so plus 3. Now, this is your point slope form. You're not going to stop here, you're going to keep going. So now we're going to solve it for y and put it in slope intercept form. Okay. 
So the way we do that is we just simplify. So y minus 1 equals, we have negative 1 third times x, that's negative 1 third x. And then we have negative 1 third times 3. This would be negative, so I'm going to put minus. The 3's would cancel, so I'd basically have minus 1. Now I need to add 1 to both sides of the equation so y can be by itself. So that's gone. And I'll have y equals negative 1 third x plus 0, or you can just put y equals negative 1 third x. Now, the key thing to understand here is that this is slope-intercept form. If we went back and read the instructions, it specifically said write the standard form of the equation of the line described. So that means what we want to do is put this in standard form. Now, I know the standard form definition varies from textbook to textbook, from teacher to teacher, but generally when you're in high school, you're going to see ax plus by equals c, where a is greater than or equal to 0, a, b, and c are integers, and a and b are not both 0. So what I would do is I would move this over here. I would just add 1 third x to both sides of the equation. And remember, if I add 1 third x over on the right, I need to put a 0 because nothing else is going to be over there. So I'd have 1 third x plus y equals 0. Now, remember, I said that a and b couldn't be 0 at the same time. I didn't say anything about c, so this is legal. I also said that a, b, and c needed to be integers. 1 third is not an integer. So to fix that, I'm just going to multiply both sides of the equation by 3. 3 times 1 third is 1, so I would just have x, or 1x if you want to write that, plus 3 times y is 3y, and this equals 0 times 3, which is 0. So you get x plus 3y equals 0. So don't make the mistake of just writing x plus 3y. That's not an equation. There's no equal sign. That's just an expression, right? So you want equals 0. Got to make sure you have that. So this would be standard form. A, your coefficient for x is 1. B, your coefficient for y is 3. And C, which is a constant, is 0. So we've put this in standard form. A, B, and C are integers. A is greater than or equal to 0. And A and B are not both 0 because neither one of them are 0. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on Parallel and Perpendicular Lines. All right, so we want to write the standard form of the equation of the line described. So through the point 1 comma 5 and parallel to y equals negative 1 6 x minus 2. All right, so what we want to do is kind of go through and set up point slope form to start. So point slope form. In case you don't know, that's y minus y sub 1 is equal to m the slope times x minus x sub 1. Now. We're given the y sub 1 and the x sub 1. That's our point, right? It says it passes through the point 1 comma 5. So this is your x sub 1. This is your y sub 1. We're not given m, but because of the properties of parallel lines, we know that these two lines would have the same slope. And so m, for this line that we're going to write the equation for, is going to have a slope of negative 1 6. So m equals negative 1 6. And once you determine that information, just put a line through this, just so you know you're not going to use it again. You don't need any more information from that. We're taking the information we're given, and we're going to write the equation of the line in standard form. In order to do that, we need to first put it in point slope form, though. And so we're going to plug in. So I'm going to have y minus y sub 1, which is 5. This is equal to m, which we know is negative 1 6, times the quantity x minus x sub 1, which is 1. Now this is point slope form. Now we're going to solve for y and put it in slope intercept form. So y minus 5 is equal to negative 1 6 times x is negative 1 6 x. Negative 1 6 times negative 1. We know that's positive and we basically have 1 6. Now what I want to do to solve for y now is just add 5 to both sides of the equation. So add 5. And over here instead of adding 5 I'm going to add 30 over 6. 30 over 6 and 5 are the same value, so although they look different, I'm adding the same thing to both sides of the equation. So that's going to be gone, and I'll have y is equal to negative 1 6 x plus 1 plus 30 is 31, so that would be 31 over 6. So this is our equation in slope-intercept form. 
Slope intercept form again allows us to know the slope, which in this case is negative one six, and the y intercept. So this y intercept would occur at zero comma thirty one sixths. Now, it told us to put it in standard form. Standard form is ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers, a and b are not both zero, and a is greater than or equal to zero. So to kind of start that out, I would add one sixth x to both sides of the equation, and I'd have one sixth x plus y equals 31 over six. Now, one thing that's wrong here is that I don't have integers. And in order to get integers, I could just multiply both sides of the equation by six. That would clear my denominators. So let's multiply this side by six, and this side by six, six times one six is one. So I'd have x plus six times y is six y equals 31 over six times six would be 31. So now we have this in standard form, x plus six y equals 31. Again, where a, which is the coefficient of x is one, that's greater than or equal to zero, it's also an integer. B is six, that's an integer, and C is 31, that's an integer, right? So A, B, and C are integers, A is greater than or equal to zero, and A and B are not both zero, in fact, neither one is zero. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5, on parallel and perpendicular lines. All right, so we want to write the standard form of the equation of the line described. All right, so this line is going to pass through the point 4, comma, negative 5, and it's going to be perpendicular to this line here, y equals 8 fifths x minus 1. So a few different things. If I know a point on the line, which I'm given here, and I know the slope, which is not given, but I can figure it out through the information they're giving me, I can use point slope form. So point slope form. So that's y minus y sub 1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. Let me just kind of drag this down here. And let me go back up and kind of look at this a little bit. So we know a point on the line. So the point is 4 comma negative 5. So this is my x sub 1. This is my y sub 1. That's going to get plugged into the point slope form. But I don't know the m yet, right, the slope. But I can figure that out because, again, I'm given a line that is perpendicular to. Lines that are perpendicular have slopes whose product is negative one. So I can take this slope here, which is eight fifths, and multiply it by some unknown, might as well just call it z, and it should be equal to negative one. So I could divide both sides by eight fifths, or if I wanna do this kind of quicker, I can just say, okay, negative reciprocals, when multiplied together are negative one. So I can take this five and put it in the numerator, take this eight and put it in the denominator. I can make one of these negative. Let's just go with the numerator. And those would be negative reciprocals, and so those would multiply together and give us negative one. In other words, this would cancel with this and give me negative one. This would cancel with this and give me one. So I would have negative one. So my missing slope is negative five eighths. So m equals negative five eighths. Okay, so once I know that, I can just plug into the point slope form. And so I'd have y minus y sub one. y sub one is negative five, so y plus five is equal to m, which is negative five eighths, times the quantity x minus x sub one, which is four. So we have y plus five is equal to negative five eighths times x is negative five eighths x. Then we'd have negative five eighths times negative four. That's gonna be plus. The four would cancel with the eight and give me a two in the denominator. So this would be plus five halves. Now, one more step here. I'm going to solve this for y and put it in slope intercept form. So I'm going to subtract 5 away. And over here, instead of subtracting away 5, I'm going to subtract away 10 over 2, which is the same thing as 5, but it allows me to have a common denominator. So this is gone. I'll have y is equal to negative 5 eighths x. And then 5 minus 10 is negative 5 over 2, so minus 5 halves. All right, so now I want to put this in standard form, which in most high school textbooks will tell you it's ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers, a and b are not both zero at the same time, and a is greater than or equal to zero. So I would just add 5 eighths x to both sides of the equation. And so I will have 5 eighths x 
plus y is equal to negative 5 halves. So there's some problems here. a is greater than or equal to 0. That's OK. But I don't have integers for a and for c, right? These, these values here. So in order to get integers, I can just clear the denominators. The LCD here would be 8. So if I just multiply both sides of the equation by 8, I will be good to go. So 8 times 5 eighths x is just 5x plus 8 times y, that's 8y. And this equals, so now we'd have 8 times negative 5 halves. So this would be negative, and then 8 would cancel with 2 and give me 4. 4 times 5 is 20, so this would be negative 20. So this would be your standard form, again, according to most high school textbooks. And your definition of that might be different. Just follow that definition. So we have 5x plus 8y equals negative 20. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set number 19. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. All right, so we're going to start out with 5x minus 4y is less than 8. So the quick way to do this, as I showed you in the lesson, is just to solve the inequality for y. So we would subtract 5x away from each side. We'd have negative 4y is less than negative 5x plus 8. Now I would divide each side of the inequality by negative 4. And what that involves is I have to flip the direction of the inequality. Right now it's a less than, it's going to be a greater than. So this will be y because the negative 4 will cancel with the negative 4. It is now greater than, right, the symbol changed from a less than to a greater than. And then negative 5 over negative 4 is 5 fourths times x and then minus 2, right? 8 over negative 4 is negative 2. So once I have it in this format, it's very easy to do. All I need to do is the first thing is I'm going to graph the equation y equals 5 fourths x minus 2. This is known as the boundary line. Now the boundary line separates the solution region from the non-solution region. So the two scenarios would be if I have a strict inequality, the boundary line is not part of your solution, and so it's broken up to show that. It's kind of a dashed line. If you had a non-strict inequality, let's say this was a greater than or equal to, well, in that particular case, you would now have a solid boundary line, just like if you were graphing a linear equation in two variables. So let's go ahead and graph this y equals 5 fourths x minus 2. So my y-intercept will occur at 0, comma, negative 2. That's right there. And I'm going to use the rise over run. So my slope is 5 fourths, so I would rise 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I would run over 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. I could also fall 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and go to the left 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So now I'm going to draw my line. I'm going to draw it solid at first. Then I'm going to use my eraser to break it up. Okay, now I'm going to use my eraser to break it up. And again, the reason I do this is because this line is not part of the solution set. So if you have an ordered pair or a point that's on this line, it doesn't work in the original inequality. All right, so let's go back up. And we notice that we're dealing with a greater than right here. So if y is greater than, we shade above the line. If y is less than, we shade below the line. So because we're dealing with a greater than, we're going to want to shade above the line. So we're going to shade in this direction. And again, this is once you've solved for y. Don't look at the original inequality that we started with. Because you might say, oh, well, that's a less than. Well, you have to solve this for y first. Once you've solved it for y, and you replace that inequality with an equal sign to draw your boundary line, all you need to do after that is look at whether you have a greater than, or greater than or equal to, or a less than, or a less than or equal to. And that's how you decide how to shade. Again, if it's a greater than, or greater than or equal to, you're shading above the line. If it's a less than or a less than or equal to, you're shading below the line. Let's take a look at x is less than or equal to negative 7. So this is kind of a special case scenario. Very, very easy to do. 
you just start out by thinking about x is equal to negative 7. This is a vertical line, and we draw this by finding negative 7 on the x-axis and just drawing a vertical line. Now, for this particular problem, because this is a non-strict inequality, the boundary line is solid, okay, because it's part of the solution. So we just find negative 7 on our x-axis, and we draw a vertical line. Now, since this is a less than, I know it's less than or equal to, but since this is a less than, in terms of the x-axis, the x-axis is a horizontal axis. So when we think about less than, the numbers move to the left as they're getting smaller. So less than is going to the left. If I had a greater than, I'd go to the right. So if I'm shading on a less than, I want to shade everything to the left. And that would be x is less than or equal to negative 7. We'll look at one more. We have 4x minus y is greater than negative 5. So again, I just want to solve this guy for y. So I'm going to subtract 4x away from each side. I'm going to have negative y is greater than negative 4x minus 5. I'm going to divide both sides of the inequality by negative 1. And remember, if I do that, I've got to flip the direction here. Right now, it's a greater than. I need to make it a less than. So I'd have y is less than. Negative 4 over negative 1 is 4, and times x, negative 5 over negative 1 is 5, so plus 5. So y is less than 4x plus 5. So to get my boundary line, I'm going to graph y equals 4x plus 5. And pay attention to that symbol there. It's a strictly less than. So this is going to be a broken or dashed line. So again, y equals 4x plus 5. So my point is going to be the y-intercept 0, 5. And then my slope is 4. So that means rise over run is 4 over 1. So I'm going to go up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 over 1. Or I can go down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 to the left 1. So again, this was a strict inequality. And again, that's a broken or dashed line. So let me draw the line first. And now I'm going to come through with my eraser and just kind of break it up. Just let your teacher know that this boundary line is broken up or dashed. And you're telling her that it's not part of the solution. Now, go back up and see that, okay, once we've solved this for y, it's a less than. Don't worry about this one originally. You worry about after you solve for y. So y is less than, strictly less than, 4x plus 5. So that means we're shading below the line. So going this way. So this would be your graph for 4x minus y is greater than negative 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. All right, so we want to graph 5x plus 3y is greater than negative 9. So kind of the easy way I taught you to do this in the lesson is solve the inequality for y. So I would subtract 5x away from each side. And what I'd have is 3y is greater than negative 5x minus 9. So then I want y by itself. So I would divide each side by 3. So this would cancel. And I get y is greater than negative 5 thirds x minus 9 over 3 is 3. So I have a linear inequality in two variables that's solved for y. What I want to do to graph this is replace this inequality symbol, this greater than, with an equals. So I would graph the equation y equals negative 5 thirds x minus 3. Now specifically, when I graph the equation, I'm graphing something known as the boundary line. That line separates the solution region from the non-solution region. And if we have a strict inequality, like we have here, this is strictly greater than, we want a broken or dashed line to show that the boundary line is not part of the solution. So we're just going to graph y equals negative 5 thirds x minus 3, and we're going to use our eraser to kind of break the line up. So the first thing I would do is plot a point at the y-intercept, which is 0, negative 3. 
It's going to be right there. And then my rise over run, I have negative 5 over 3 as the slope. So drop 5, go down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, over to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. Over here, I could also reverse that. I could put 5 over negative 3. So I could go up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to the left 3. 1, 2, 3. All right, so graph this. And let's use our eraser now to break it up. That's all you need to do is just break up the line. And of course, you could draw it that way if you wanted to to start. But you're just showing whoever's grading your test or your homework that this line is not part of the solution. Right? It's a broken or dashed line. So once we've done that, we have one final step. And that step is just to shade the appropriate side of the line. So we do that based on the symbol that we have when it's solved for y. So since this is a greater than, we shade above the line. If it was a less than, we'd shade below the line. So I'm just going to shade everything above the line here. And there's your graph for 5x plus 3y is greater than negative 9. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. All right, so our problem is y is greater than negative 3. So fortunately, these are very, very easy to do with these special scenarios. So you recall how to graph y is equal to negative 3. This is a horizontal line, and basically we find negative 3 on the y-axis, the axis that's going up and down, and we draw a horizontal line. That's all we need to do. So to graph this to start, I would draw a horizontal line at y equals negative 3. And because this is a strict inequality, that line's going to be broken. Right? It's going to be broken or dashed because that boundary line that I'm drawing is not part of the solution. So here's negative 3. Okay, I'm going to use my eraser to break this up. Again, the main thing when you break up a line, when you have a broken or dashed line, just make it obvious that the line is broken. You want to show that this is not part of your solution. So now we want to shade the appropriate region. And how do we do that? Well, we have a greater than, so that means we want to shade above the line. So in terms of us having a horizontal line, I'm just going to shade up. So I would shade going up like this. Any ordered pair or any point in this region would satisfy that inequality. Okay, just shade going up. So this would be your graph for y is greater than negative 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. All right, so we want to graph 2x plus 3y is less than 9. Again, the first thing I want to do is solve this for y. So I would subtract 2x away from each side, and I would have 3y is less than negative 2x plus 9. Now to completely solve for y, I would divide both sides by 3, and I'm going to get y is less than negative 2 thirds x plus 3. Now once it's in this form, it's very easy to graph it. The first thing we have to always graph is something known as the boundary line. The boundary line separates the solution region from the non-solution region. It can be a solid line in the case of a non-strict inequality when the line is part of the solution, or it can be a dashed or broken up line when we have a strict inequality. That means the boundary line is not part of the solution. So here we have a strict inequality. So we're going to have a broken or dashed line. And basically all we need to do to graph the boundary line is replace this with an equal. So y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 3. So this is our boundary line. Let's go ahead and graph that. So y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 3. So the first thing I'm going to do is plot the point 0 comma 3. Right? That's my y-intercept. And then I'm just going to use my slope to find additional points. So rise over run. I've got negative 2 thirds as my slope. 
So I'd rise negative 2. So I'd fall 2, 1, 2, run 3. So 1, 2, 3. Rise negative 2, so fall 1, 2, run 3. So 1, 2, 3. I'd also get a point over here by just rising 2. So go up 1, 2, and going to the left 3. So 1, 2, 3. All right, now remember, because we had a strict inequality, this line needs to be broken up. Okay, so I'm going to take my eraser and break it up. Just show the teacher that this is not part of the solution, and that's good enough. So the next thing we want to figure out is whether to shade above the line or below the line. Now, once you've solved for y, you want to look at what your inequality symbol is. Here it's a less than. So if y is less than, you shade below the line. If y is greater than, you shade above the line. So this is a less than. We're going to shade below the line. So we come back here and we shade below the line. So this would be the graph for 2x plus 3y is less than 9. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. So we're going to take a look at x is greater than or equal to 1. So very, very easy to solve this type of problem. It's a special type of problem that you're going to get on a test for sure. And essentially you go about it the same way. The first thing you're going to do is graph your boundary line. So the boundary line, again, separates the solution region from the non-solution region, and it can be a broken or dashed line if you have a strict inequality, or a solid line if you have a non-strict inequality like we have here. So we know we're going to have a solid line, and to get it, we just replace this inequality symbol with an equal symbol. So we put x equals 1. So to graph that, I go to my coordinate plane, I find 1 on the x-axis, and I just draw a vertical line. Now once I've done that, again, when we think about where we're going to shade, since we have a vertical line, we're either going to shade to the right or we're going to shade to the left. Right? We're not shading up and down. So when we think about x values along the x-axis, they increase moving to the right. So if I want x to be greater than or equal to 1, I need to shade to the right of the line, right? Because that's how x increases in value. It goes to the right. If it was a less than, I'd be shading to the left. So I want to go back over here, look at my coordinate plane here, and I want to shade everything to the right. Everything going to the right. So this would be the graph for x is greater than or equal to 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on graphing linear inequalities in two variables. All right, we're going to take a look at 5x minus 3y is greater than or equal to 0. So again, the quick way to do this, we solve the inequality for y. So I'm going to subtract 5x away from each side, and I'm going to have negative 3y is greater than or equal to negative 5x. So to solve for y, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 3. And remember, if I divide by a negative, and I'm working with inequality, I've got to flip the direction of the inequality. So right now, this is a greater than or equal to. It's going to become a less than or equal to. So then this will cancel with this, and I'll have y is less than or equal to. Negative 5 over negative 3 is just 5 thirds times x. So now, what we want to do is graph the boundary line. Very easy to do. Just replace this symbol with an equals. So we'd have y equals 5 thirds x. Now the boundary line, again, is something that's going to separate your solution region from your non-solution region. And you have two scenarios. You have the scenario where you have a strict inequality. That boundary line is not part of your solution. So it's a broken or dashed line. And then you also have a scenario where you have a non-strict inequality. And in this case, your boundary line is a solid line. It's telling you that the line is part of your solution. So for this particular case, as I just said, this is a non-strict inequality. So we're going to graph y equals 5 thirds x as our boundary line, and it's going to be a solid line. So y equals 5 thirds x. 
So that line goes through the origin, right? Because my y-intercept, you can think of it as plus zero here. So zero comma zero is the y-intercept. So that's gonna go right there. And my slope is five thirds. So I would go up five, up one, two, three, four, five, to the right three. One, two, three, there's a point. I could also fall five and go to the left three. So one, two, three, four, five, to the left one, two, three. There's a point there. So again, I'm gonna graph the line and it's gonna be solid. Now, the final step is to figure out which side of the line to shade. Now, once you've solved for y, you look at what you have. If you have a less than, or in this case, a less than or equal to, you shade below the line. If you have a greater than or greater than or equal to, you shade above the line. Don't look at the original. Look at it after you've solved for y. Very, very important. So we have a less than or equal to here. So I'm going to shade everything below the line. So I'm going to shade this way. So there's your graph for 5x minus 3y is greater than or equal to 0. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set 20. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on introduction to functions. All right, so we want to determine if each is a function. And so we have our relation here. Remember, a relation is just a set of ordered pairs. And the ordered pairs we're given, we're given negative 7 comma negative 4, 3 comma 3, 1 comma 8, and negative 5 comma 3. So remember, for you to have a function, for each x, you can only have one y. So in other words, if I was to list my x values or my domain, for every x value I have, so I have an x value of negative 7, 3, 1, and negative 5, it has to be associated with one and only one y value. So my y values or my range would be negative 4, 3, 8, and then we have 3 again, so we don't need to list that twice. So negative 7 is associated with negative 4, and only negative 4. 3 is associated with 3, and only 3. 1 is associated with 8, and only 8. And then negative 5 is associated with 3, and only 3. And I know for some of you, you're saying, hey, what about the fact that your y value of 3 is linked up to two different x's? That's okay. You can have two different x's that associate with one single y. What you can't have is one x that's associated with or linked up with two different y's. In other words, if I said what y value corresponds to an x value of negative seven, you could clearly answer negative four. If I said the same question for three, you could say three. For one, it's eight. For negative five, it's three. So in this particular case, because for each x there's one y, we have a function. All right, let's take a look at another relation. So we have our ordered pairs here. We have 2 comma 1, 9 comma 11, 3 comma 4, and 9 comma 8. So our x values or our domain, we have 2, 9, 3, and then 9 again. So if you have duplicate x values and you have a different y value, you know you don't have a function. Okay, so we're going to go through it anyway. Then for the y values or the range, we have 1, 11, 4, and 8. So for each x, there can be only one y. So 2 is associated with 1, 9 is associated with 11, 3 is associated with 4, but then 9 is associated with 8. So this is why it's not a function. There's no clear association between the x value of 9 and a y value. If I said, hey, in this relation, if x is 9, what's y? You can't really give me an answer. You could say, well, it could be 11 or it could be 8. You can't give me a single number as an answer. So there's no clear association here, and so there's not a function. Not a function. Okay. For each x value, there can be only one y. And here we have an x value of 9 that corresponds to two different y values, so it's not a function. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have a relation with the ordered pairs negative 6 comma negative 2. 1 comma negative 15, 0 comma 5, and negative 6 comma negative 8. So again, you have a duplicate x value, and so you're not going to have a function. Right? But we can go through it again. 
the domain or the x values, so you have a negative 6, you have 1, and you have 0. I'm not going to list negative 6 again. And then for the range or the y values, we have negative 2, negative 15, 5, and negative 8. So again, for each x, there can be one y. So for negative 6, it corresponds to negative 2, but it also corresponds to negative 8. So that's where you have a problem. For each x, there can be one y. For this x, there's two y's that it's linked to. It's linked to negative 2, and it's linked to negative 8. Now, 1 is only linked to negative 15, and 0 is only linked to 5, but because this one fails, the whole thing fails. So this is not a function. All right, let's look at this picture real quick and see if we have a function. So you'll probably see something like this in your textbook. You might even get it on homework or a test. You see a picture that gives you the domain and the range, and you see some lines going from one to the other with an arrow at the end. So what we're saying is that this is a relation, and three corresponds to one. So in other words, that's just the ordered pair three comma one. And then we also have an ordered pair five comma six. Five corresponds to six. And then we also have the ordered pair seven comma seven. Seven corresponds to seven. And then finally we have the ordered pair two comma four. Two corresponds to four. So do we have a function here? Well, the answer is yes. For each x value, I have one and only one y value. Three is linked up to one, two is linked up to four, 7 is linked up to 7, and 5 is linked up to 6. So yes, this is a function. All right, let's take a look at this next problem. Very similar example. So we have our domain, again, the x values, and we have our range. And so this relation consists of the following ordered pairs. So we have negative 3, comma, 4. So negative 3, comma, 4. But then we also have negative 3, comma, 2. So negative 3, comma, 2. And that's a problem because for each x, there can only be one y value that's associated with it. Negative 3 is associated with or linked to 4, but it's also linked to 2. So again, that fails the function rule test, so this is not a function. But we're going to continue and put that we also have an ordered pair of 6, 8, and then 9, 14. But no, this is not a function. This is not a function. Again, for each x, you can only have one y. So for negative 3, it's associated or linked to two different y's, so it's not a function. So let's take a look at one more like this. Again, we have our domain and our range. And so for this relation, the set of ordered pairs, we have 6 that is linked up to 4. So that's the ordered pair 6, 4. We have 12 that's also linked up to 4. So that's the ordered pair 12, 4. We have 5 that's linked up to 9, so 5, 9. And then we have negative 8 that's linked up to 3. So negative 8, comma 3. So is this a function? Well, yes, it is. For each x or for each member of the domain, we have exactly one y or member in the range. So 6, the x value, is linked up to 4 and only 4. 5 is linked up to 9 and only 9. 12 is linked up to 4 and only 4. And I know that you might get confused because this 4 is associated with two different x's, but that's okay. For each x, there can be only one y. But a y value can be linked to more than one x. That's all right. It's all about having a clear association. If I say, hey, if I had an x value in this relation of 12, what would the y value be? Well, you could say 4. If I had an x value of 6, what would the y value be? Well, you could say 4. If we were to change this up, and let's say we add another number into this, let's say 15, and 12 is now associated with 15 also, and I added another ordered pair in here, which would be 12 comma 15, I no longer have a function. Because if I say, hey, I have an x value of 12 in this relation, what's the y value? You really can't give me a clear answer. You could say, well, it could be 15 or it could be four. There's no clear association. So in that particular case, it wouldn't be a function. But in our original example, before I modified it, we do have a function. So again, six is linked to four, 12 is linked to four, 5 is linked to 9, negative 8 is linked to 3, so it's a function. All right, now we're going to look at our coordinate plane, and we have some ordered pairs that are plotted for us, and we want to see if this relation is a function. And the way we're going to do this, we're going to use the vertical line test. So we're going to look at our coordinate plane, and we're going to just 
draw some imaginary vertical lines. We could draw some actual ones if we want. If I draw a vertical line at x equals negative 2, you'll see that it touches the ordered pair here, which is negative 2 comma negative 6, and the ordered pair here, which is negative 2 comma 3. So for each x, in this case the x is negative 2, you can only have one y value that it's associated with. In this case, the x value of negative 2 is associated with negative 6 and also 3. You can see that with your vertical line, and so this is not a function. Not a function. Here's another example, and for this one, if you went through and drew vertical lines, let's say I draw a bunch of vertical lines here. So I know all of those aren't perfectly straight, but in each particular case, they only strike one ordered pair. So this one strikes this one only, 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 and this one only. So when that occurs, you have a function. You have a function because for each x value that you have, it's associated with one and only one y value. Again, this is the vertical line test. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on Introduction to Functions. All right, so we want to determine if each is a function. And so we're given this relation here, which is just a set of ordered pairs. And what we're looking for is to see if we have any duplicate x values. So in this relation, we have the ordered pair negative 6, negative 3, 2, 4, 7, 1, and 8, 9. So I don't see any duplicate x values, so I know this is a function. But kind of to go through and explain it, think about your domain. The domain is the set of the x values. So you have negative 6, you have 2, you have 7, and you have 8. Now, to have a function for each x or for each member of the domain, it can be associated with or linked to exactly one y value. So your y values or your range, you have negative 3, you have 4, 1, and 9. So you have a one-to-one -one correspondence here. So negative 6 is linked to negative 3, 2 is linked to 4, 7 is linked to 1, and 8 is linked to 9. So for each x value you have, you have exactly one y value that it's linked to, so this is a function. All right, for the next one we have this relation that has the ordered pairs negative 2 comma 6, 3 comma 4, 3 comma negative 1, and 7 comma negative 11. So what you're looking for, what you're trying to see on these type of problems, you see that you have a duplicate x value, so 3 and 3. When you see that and you have different y values, it's not a function. You don't need to go through any you know, lengthy debate on it. Duplicate x values, different y values, not a function. Again, because there's no clear association between the x value of 3 and a y value. So if I go through here, again, the domain is the set of x values. I have negative 2, I have 3, and I have 7. My range or my y values, I have 6, I have 4, I have negative 1, and negative 11. So for each x, there can be only one y. So the x value of negative 2 is linked to 6. The x value of 3 is linked to two different y values. It's linked to the y value of 4. It's also linked to the y value of negative 1. So that's your problem. For each x, in this case that x value is 3, there can only be one y value that it's associated with. It's associated with two different ones, and so it's not a function. We could also say that 7 is associated or linked to negative 11, but again, it's not a function. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Introduction to Functions. Alright, so we want to determine if each is a function. So we have this relation here and it contains four ordered pairs. We have negative 1 comma negative 1, 3 comma 7, 8 comma negative 8, and 6 comma 4. So again, what we're looking for to determine if a relation is a function, in this format, we're just looking to see if we have duplicate x values. So we have negative 1, 3, 8, and 6. We don't have any duplicate x values, so we have a function. Remember, for you to have a function for each x value, you have to have one and only one y value. So for the x value of negative 1, it corresponds to a y value of negative 1 and that y value only. 
Same thing goes for three. Three corresponds to only seven, eight corresponds to only negative eight, and six corresponds to only four. So we do in fact have a function. All right, for the next one, we have a relation with the ordered pairs 12 comma three, six comma nine, nine comma six, and one comma four. So again, just look for duplicate x values. I have 12, six, nine, and one. I don't have any duplicate x values, so I know this is going to be a function. And again, for each x, there can be only one y that it's related to. So this 12, this x value, is related to or linked to 3. 6 is linked up to 9. 9 is linked up to 6, and that's an x value of 9 that's linked up to a y value of 6. 1 is linked up to 4. So for each x value, I have only one y value that it's associated with, so this is a function. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on Introduction to Functions. All right, so we're going to look at each picture here and we're going to determine if we have a function. So you'll probably see something like this in your textbook. So I want you to recall that the domain is the set of your x values and the range is the set of your y values. So you can kind of go through and put your relation together based on your picture here. And so we see that we have an x value of 2 that corresponds to a y value of 1. So that would be the ordered pair 2 comma 1. We have an x value of 17 that corresponds to a y value of 6. So that's the ordered pair 17 comma 6. We have an x value of 9 that also corresponds to a y value of 6. And then lastly we have an x value of negative 4 that corresponds to a y value of 8. Now if we look at this relation here either by looking at the ordered pairs or by looking at the picture we can tell that we have a function. So we have a function. And why is that the case? Well for each x value we're associated with one and only one y value. Two is associated with the y value of one. 17 is associated with the y value of six. Nine is also associated with the y value of six, but again, that's okay. Negative four is associated with the y value of eight. And for those of you who are a little confused about this right here, where we have two associations with that number six, that's all right. Each x has to correspond to one y. So 17 corresponds to only one y, that one y value is six. Nine corresponds to one y value, that y value is also six, that's okay. What isn't okay is if you have an x value that corresponds to more than one y value. So for example, if this picture was altered a little bit, and let's say that 17 also corresponded to something like 11, for example. So now this wouldn't be a function because the x value of 17 corresponds to 6 and also 11. But with our original example where we had 2 corresponding to 1, the order pair 2 comma 1, 17 corresponding to 6, the order pair 17 comma 6, 9 corresponding to 6, the order pair 9 comma 6, and negative 4 corresponding to 8, the order pair negative 4 comma 8, we do have a function. All right, so here's another example. We have our domain or our x values. We have our range or our y values. And so let's write out the ordered pairs here. So we have five that's associated with negative eight. And it's also associated with six. So that should be a red flag for you right away. Three is associated with one. And seven is associated with four. So this is not a function. This is not a function. And why? Well, looking at the ordered pairs, you can see that you have a duplicate x value. That's a dead giveaway. Looking at the picture, I see that the x value of 5 is linked to or associated with two different y values. So if I said, hey, I have an x value of 5 in this relation. What's the y value? You can't give me a clear answer. You would say, well, it could be negative 8, but it also could be 6. I'm not really sure which one you want. There has to be a clear association. I give you an x, you have to give me back a single y. There's not here, so it's not a function. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4 on introduction to functions. All right, so what we're going to do is look at our Cartesian coordinate plane here. And we notice that we have some ordered pairs that are already plotted for us. So let me circle them. For each x value, I can only have one y value associated with it. So if I drew a vertical line here, it would only intersect one ordered pair. So that's okay. 
So that vertical line would only intersect at this point right there. Then if I drew one here, it would only intersect here. If I drew one here, it would only intersect here. If I drew one here, it would only intersect here. And lastly, if I drew one here, it would only intersect here. So that's the vertical line test. And essentially what would happen is, let's say I had another ordered pair, I don't know, something like right here, for example. So that x value of seven would now be associated with a y value of negative six and also a y value of five, so it wouldn't be a function. It would fail the vertical line test, and that's how you would know. But originally, before I put that in, we did in fact have a function. So this is a function. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on introduction to functions. All right, so what we're going to do is look at a little exercise that shows us the vertical line test. So we have our coordinate plane here, and we have some ordered pairs that are plotted. We have one here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, here, and here. The first one that we draw a vertical line through, you see right away that you don't have a function. So if I draw a vertical line here, it intersects the graph in two places, there and there. And why is that a problem? Well, the x value of negative 3, and I know it's covered up by that, that line there, but the x value of negative 3 is corresponding to a y value of 2 and also a y value of 7. That can't be for a function, right? So this isn't a function. So if you draw vertical lines and it touches two or more ordered pairs, it's not a function, right? So if I drew a vertical line here, it would be okay. Here would be okay, here would be okay, here would be okay. But then over here, it would fail again. So over here, you touch twice again. So this is an x value of 6, and it corresponds to a y value of 1, and also a y value of negative 2. So this is not a function. This is not a function. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 21. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving systems of linear equations by graphing. All right, so we want to solve each linear system by graphing. And we're going to start out with the system that contains these two equations. 2x minus 2y equals negative 2, and negative 3x plus 3y equals 6. So hopefully you watch the lesson and you get the main idea here is that we're going to graph each equation kind of separately. And then we're going to look for the point of intersection. So at that point of intersection, that ordered pair there lies on both lines, and so it's a solution for the system. Remember, in order for an ordered pair to be a solution for the system, it has to simultaneously satisfy both equations. So it's got to work in this one and also this one. Now we've learned already that the quickest way to graph something is to solve the equation for y, put it in slope intercept form. Another thing that's going to help us with is to detect if we have a special case scenario. So for example, if we have two parallel lines, same slope but different y-intercepts, we know that we have no solution, right? Parallel lines don't intersect, and so there's no solution. The other thing we will detect is if we have the same exact equation, and in that case, there's an infinite number of solutions. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's solve this guy for y. So 2x minus 2y equals negative 2. I'm going to subtract 2x away from each side of the equation. We have negative 2y is equal to negative 2x minus 2. We're going to divide each side of the equation by negative 2. And I'm going to get that y is equal to x plus 1. Or if you wanted to write 1x plus 1 just to signify that the slope is 1, that's fine too. So y is equal to, let's go ahead and put 1x plus 1. All right, for the next one, we're going to also solve it for y. We have negative 3x plus 3y equals 6. I'm going to add 3x to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. I'll have 3y is equal to 3x plus 6. Divide each side by 3. And this is going to cancel. I'll have y is equal to, this cancels. I'll have 1x plus 6 over 3 is 2. So again, y equals 1x, and then the only part that's different here is this plus 2. So we can see that we're going to have the same slope, but different y-intercepts. So in this point, 
I could stop and just say that there's no solution. If I'm on a timed examination, I don't need to go through and graph this. I already know that these are going to be two parallel lines. Two parallel lines don't intersect, and so there's no solution for the system. But for the sake of completeness, because this is a tutorial video, I'm going to graph each and visually show you that there's no point of intersection. All right, so we have y equals 1x plus 1. So my y-intercept occurs at 0, 1, and my slope is 1. So up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, or down 1 left 1, down 1 left 1. Okay, for the next one, I have y equals 1x plus 2. And so the y-intercept there will occur at 0, 2. And again, the slope is 1. So up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. Or starting here, I could go down 1 to the left 1, down 1 to the left 1, down 1 to the left 1. Okay. So you can tell by looking at this that these are two parallel lines. They have the same slope or the same steepness, different y-intercepts. They're never going to intersect, and so there's no solution for that system. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have x minus 3y equals 6 and 4x plus 3y equals 9. So again, I'm going to solve each one for y. So for this one, I'm going to have x minus 3y equals 6. Go ahead and subtract x away from each side of the equation. I'll have negative 3y is equal to negative x plus 6. And then I'm going to divide each side of the equation by negative 3. That's going to cancel. I'll have y is equal to... I can basically put a phantom negative 1 there if I want to, right? It's always there, I just don't write it. So this is basically negative 1 over negative 3, which is 1 third. So 1 third x, and then minus, because I have a positive over a negative, 6 over 3 is 2. So this would be y equals 1 third x minus 2. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing for my next equation. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and just subtract 4x away from each side. That'll give me 3y is equal to negative 4x plus 9. Divide both sides of the equation by 3. And I'll just erase this. And I'll have y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 3. Right, 9 over 3 is just 3. So this is y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 3. All right, so to graph the first one, y equals 1 third x minus 2, your y-intercept occurs at 0 comma negative 2. And your slope is one third. So you'd go up one to the right, one, two, three. Up one to the right, one, two, three. Up one to the right, one, two, three. Or I could go down one to the left, one, two, three. Down one to the left, one, two, three. All right, for the next one, I have y equals negative four thirds x plus 3. So the y-intercept there is going to occur at 0, 3. And then my slope is negative 4 thirds. So down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. And there's going to be my point of intersection. So then again, down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so you can see the point at which they intersect that point there, which has an x location of positive 3, a y location of negative 1, so the ordered pair 3 comma negative 1, lies on both graphs, right? So it's a solution to both. So again, our solution as an ordered pair is 3 comma negative 1. So try it out. So in this equation, I'd plug in a 3 for x minus 3 times, I'd plug in a negative 1 for y, and this should equal 6. So we have 3... And then negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. That should equal 6. 3 plus 3 is 6. So that works out here. Then the next one that we're going to do, we have 4 times plugging in a 3 for x, plus 3 times plugging in a negative 1 for y, equals 9. 4 times 3 is 12. And then 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, so minus 3 equals 9. 12 minus 3 is 9. You get 9 equals 9. So that works out as well. So 3 comma negative 1, that ordered pair, is a solution for this system, again, because it satisfies both equations. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. We have 5x minus 4y equals 16, and we have y equals 1. So this one's very easy to graph, 
This one right here, I'm still gonna solve for y. So I'd have 5x minus 4y equals 16. I wanna subtract 5x away from each side of the equation. I'd have negative 4y is equal to negative 5x plus 16. Divide each side by negative four. That's gonna cancel. I'll have y is equal to 5 fourths x and then minus four, right? 16 over negative four is minus four. So this again is y equals 5 fourths x minus four. So let's take these down to the coordinate plane. To graph the first one, y equals 5 fourths x minus four. Very, very simple. So the y-intercept occurs at 0, comma, negative 4. And my slope is 5 fourths. So up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so let's graph that. Okay, and then I have y equals one. So how do you graph that? That's a horizontal line. You find one on the y-axis and you just draw a horizontal line. So without even drawing this, I know the point of intersection is gonna be right there at four comma one. But let's go ahead and graph this for the sake of completeness. All right, so again, we can obviously see that the point of intersection is right there. That's at the ordered pair four comma one. And I know that one is kind of covered up, but that's a one there. So four comma one. And again, we're gonna check it in the original equations. So the ordered pair is four comma one. So in the first one, we check it five times, plug in a four for X, minus four times, plug in a one for Y, equals 16. Five times four is 20, you get 20 minus four times one is four equals 16, obviously 16 equals 16, that works out. For the second one, you might not know how to check that. Well, we know that y equals one, yeah, y is one here, but what about four? What do I do with that? Remember, no matter what x equals, y is always one. And the way you can kind of write this to check it, remember your definition for a linear equation in two variables. You can have ax plus by equals c, where a and B are not both zero. But remember, A and B could be zero, it's just they can't both be zero at the same time. So what I can do is I can write zero X plus one Y equals one. And that's exactly what I have right here. Zero times anything, no matter what it is, is always zero, so this would just go away. So I could plug in a four for X, and I could plug in a one for Y, Zero times four is zero, plus one times one is one. You get one equals one. So yeah, that checks out also. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section one on solving systems of linear equations by graphing. All right, so we wanna just solve each linear system by graphing. We're gonna start out with x plus three y equals nine and two x minus y equals four. So the first thing I always do is solve each equation for y. That way I put it in slope intercept form. It makes it really, really easy to graph it. So let's take this guy right here, solve it for y. So x plus three y equals nine. We're gonna subtract x away from each side of the equation. I'll have three y is equal to negative x plus nine. I'll divide each side of the equation by three. And I'm gonna have y is equal to, this is negative, remember there's a one here, we just don't display it. Negative one third x plus nine over three is three. So this guy is gonna be y equals negative one third x plus three. All right, for the next one, I have two x minus y equals four. Solve this guy for y, I'm gonna subtract two x away from each side, and I'll have negative y is equal to negative two x plus four. So let's go ahead and divide both sides of the equation by negative one. Or you could multiply by negative one, doesn't really matter. You're just changing the sign of each term basically. So this would become y equals negative two over negative one is just two, then times x, then plus four over negative one, so that's just gonna be negative four. So this one becomes y equals two x minus four. All right, so let's go ahead and take these down to the coordinate plane. 
So I'm going to start out with y equals negative one-third x plus three. Let me scooch that down a little bit. y equals negative one-third x plus three. So the y-intercept will occur at zero comma three. And then my slope is negative one-third. So down one to the right, one, two, three. Down one to the right, one, two, three. Down one to the right, one, two, three. Let's go ahead and graph this guy. Okay, the next one is y equals 2x minus 4. So your y-intercept is going to occur at 0, negative 4. And your slope is 2. So up 1, 2 to the right 1. Up 1, 2 to the right 1. Up 1, 2 to the right 1. So there's your point of intersection. Up 1, 2 to the right 1. Again, there's your point of intersection. Let me highlight that. So that's an x value of 3, a y value of 2. So that's the ordered pair, 3, 2. So I always preach that you want to go back up and check. Make sure you got the right answer. So I'm just going to plug in a 3 for x and a 2 for y in each equation. Make sure that the left and the right side are equal. So we get 3, plug that in for x, plus 3 times y, plug in a 2 for y, equals 9. So 3 plus 3 times 2 is 6 equals 9. You would get that 9 equals 9, right? 3 plus 6 is 9. So it checks out in the first one. In the second one, we have 2x minus y equals 4. So I'm plugging in a 3 for x, so 2 times 3, minus 2 for y, minus 2, equals 4. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 minus 2 is 4. You get 4 equals 4, so that checks out there as well. So the ordered pair 3 comma 2 is the solution for this system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on solving systems of linear equations by graphing. All right, so we want to solve each linear system by graphing. And we have 2x plus y equals 3 and y equals negative 3. So kind of an easy one to do because this one right here is extremely easy to graph. So let's just look at this one right here. We're going to solve it for y. We have 2x plus y equals 3. To solve for y, I just simply subtract 2x away from each side of the equation and I get y is equal to negative 2x plus 3. So that puts it in slope-intercept form. So y equals negative 2x plus 3. And then this one is y equals negative 3. So these are each really, really easy to graph now. And I'm going to take them down to the coordinate plane. So my y-intercept on y equals negative 2x plus 3 would occur at 0, 3. So that's going to be right here. And my slope is negative 2, so I'd fall 2, 1, 2, and I'd go to the right 1. Fall 2, 1, 2, go to the right 1. Fall 2, 1, 2, go to the right 1. Fall 2, 1, 2, go to the right 1. Okay, then the next one I have is y equals negative 3. Super simple to graph that. You just go to negative 3 on the y-axis, and you draw a horizontal line. So before I even draw this, you can tell that the point of intersection is going to be right here. So if you're doing homework or you're doing a test, and I realize that if they're asking you to graph it, you probably have to turn that in. But if you were just solving something in general on your test, just put your solution as 3 comma negative 3 and move on. you got to try to learn how to save as much time as possible when you work these problems. So again, we know where the intersection was going to be. It's going to be right there. Again, that's an x value of 3 and a y value, I know you can't see it anymore, of negative 3. So 3 comma negative 3. So let's check our solution. And so in the first equation, plug in a 3 for x, so 2 times 3, plus plug in a negative 3 for y, so plus negative 3, should be 3. 2 times 3 is 6, plus negative 3 equals 3. Of course, 6 minus 3 or 6 plus negative 3 is 3. So this works out. Now, in the second equation, you really don't even need to look at anything other than the fact that y is negative 3. And that's what it is there. x can be anything. y always equals negative 3. And the way you show that to yourself mathematically, remember your definition for a linear equation in two variables is ax plus by equals c, where a and b are not both 0, but one of them could be 0. I could put a 0 as 
the coefficient for x. And for the coefficient of y, I could put a 1, and c could be negative 3. So those equations are the same. So if I plugged in a 3 for x there, I'd have 0 times 3 plus 1 times plug in a negative 3 for y. This should be equal to negative 3. Well, 0 times anything is 0, so that's gone. I'd have 1 times negative 3, that's negative 3, and that does equal negative 3. So it works out here as well. So the ordered pair 3 comma negative 3 is our solution for the system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 3 on solving systems of linear equations by graphing. All right, so we want to solve each linear system by graphing. We're going to look at 3x minus 2y equals negative 6, and also x plus 4y equals negative 16. So again, the easiest way to do this is to solve each equation for y, put it in slope-intercept form, make it really, really easy to graph. So I have 3x minus 2y equals negative 6. Subtract 3x away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 2y is equal to negative 3x minus 6. Divide each side of the equation by negative 2. And I'll have y is equal to negative over negative is positive, so 3 halves x. And the negative 6 over negative 2 is plus 3. So y equals... 3 halves x plus 3. All right, for the next one, I have x plus 4y equals negative 16. So x plus 4y equals negative 16. I'll subtract x away from each side. That's gone. 4y is equal to negative x, or I could put negative 1x, minus 16. Divide both sides of the equation by 4. So that's going to cancel. I'll have y is equal to negative 1 fourth x then minus 16 over 4 is minus 4. So y is going to be equal to negative 1 fourth x minus 4. All right. So let's copy this and take it down to our coordinate plane. All right, so the first equation, y equals 3 halves x plus 3. The y-intercept occurs at 0 comma 3. And your slope is 3 halves. So up 3, 1, 2, 3, to the right 2, 1, 2. I could also go up 1, 2, 3 to the right 2. Or I could go down 3, 1, 2, 3 to the left 2, 1, 2. All right, for the next one, I have y equals negative 1 fourth x minus 4. So our y intercept is going to occur at 0, comma, negative 4. And the slope is negative 1 fourth. So I'm going to go down 1 to the right 1, 2, 3, 4. Or I could go up 1 and to the left 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So that point right there, although it wasn't exactly on the line as I drew it, it should have been. That's part of human error, right? So I can do another point up 1 to the left 1, 2, 3, 4. And let's go ahead and graph that guy. Okay, so that's my point of intersection right there. So that point, that ordered pair, is going to lie on both lines. And so it's the solution to the system. And so our x location is negative 4, our y location is negative 3. So the ordered pair, negative 4, comma, negative 3. Let's go ahead and check this guy in each equation. So we have 3 times, in place of x, I'm going to plug in a negative 4, minus 2 times, in place of y, I'm going to plug in a negative 3, and this should be negative 6. So 3 times negative 4 is negative 12, Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6, so plus 6 equals negative 6, and it does. Negative 12 plus 6 is negative 6, so you get negative 6 equals negative 6, so that one works out. All right, so for the next one, we have x, which we're plugging in a negative 4 for, plus 4 times y, we're plugging in a negative 3 for that, equals negative 16. So I get negative 4, 4 times negative 3 is negative 12, so minus 12 equals negative 16. So yeah, that's true. Negative 4 minus 12 is negative 16. You get negative 16 equals negative 16. So it works out here as well. So negative 4 comma negative 3, that ordered pair is the solution for this system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4, on solving systems of linear equations by graphing. All right, so we want to solve each linear system by graphing. We have a pretty easy one to look at. We have x plus y equals negative 1, and we have x equals 2. Now, generally speaking, I solve my equations for y, put them in slope-intercept form to make them very easy to graph. So for this one, it's very easy to solve it for y. If I just subtract x away from each side of the equation, I can almost do that mentally. I can just subtract x from over here, 
it would go away. And I would have y is equal to, I would subtract x from this side, so negative x minus 1. Then for this one, I have x equals 2. You can't really solve that for y, but that's very easy to graph also. That's just a vertical line. So let's take these down to the coordinate plane. And so y equals negative x minus 1. You can write a 1 in there behind that negative to make it clear that my slope is negative 1. My y-intercept occurs at 0, comma negative 1, so that's right there. And my slope again is negative 1, so I'd go down 1 to the right 1, down 1 to the right 1, down 1 to the right 1, down 1 to the right 1. Okay, and then for x equals 2, I just find 2 on the x-axis, which is right here, and I draw a vertical line. Very, very easy. And we can already tell that the point of intersection is going to be right there. Let's go ahead and for the sake of completeness. Okay. All right. So again, the point of intersection is right there. So that's an x value of 2. That's an x value of 2 and a y value of negative 3. And again, the reason this is the solution for the system is because that point lies on both lines, right? It, it's where it intersects, so it lies on both lines. Therefore, it satisfies both equations, and it's a solution for the system. Okay, so 2 comma negative 3. I'm going to plug in a 2 for x, plus I'm going to plug in a negative 3 for y. And this should equal negative 1, and it does. You get negative 1 equals negative 1. And for the other one, it's easy to check. x equals 2. Does x equal 2? Yes, so it works out doesn't matter what the value of y is, because no matter what y is, x will always equal 2. Another way to think about that would be 1x plus 0y equals 2. It's the same equation as we have here, it's just written a little bit differently. Remember, our basic definition for a linear equation in two variables allows us to do that. ax plus by equals c, where a and b are not both 0, but 1 could be 0. So I could have b as 0, which is what I have in this case. So no matter what I plug in for y, I'm going to multiply it by 0, and it's going to go away. So if I plug in a negative 3 there, and I plug in a 2 for x, what's going to happen? Well, 1 times 2 is 2. 0 times negative 3 is 0, so that's gone. So I get 2 equals 2. And so they both check out. The solution for the system is the ordered pair 2 comma negative 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on Solving Systems of Linear Equations by Graphing. All right, so we want to solve each linear system by graphing. So we have 3x plus y equals 1 and negative 9x minus 3y equals negative 12. So the first thing I always do is solve each equation for y, put it in slope-intercept form, and make it nice and easy for me to graph it. So for this one, I have 3x plus y equals 1. If I just subtract 3x away from each side of the equation, I'll have y is equal to negative 3x plus 1. So this one, y is equal to negative 3x plus 1. Then for this one right here, I have negative 9x minus 3y is equal to negative 12. So I'm going to add 9x to both sides of the equation. And I'll have negative 3y is equal to 9x minus 12. I'm going to divide each side of the equation by negative 3. So I'll have y is equal to 9 over negative 3 is negative 3, so negative 3x. And then negative 12 over negative 3 is plus 4. So do you see a problem? We have y equals negative 3x plus 4. You should because these are parallel lines. Remember, if two lines have the same slope, different y-intercepts, they are parallel lines. Now, when we're talking about a system of linear equations, Parallel lines are never going to touch. They're never going to intersect. And so you're not going to have a solution, right? Because to get a solution, you need for the ordered pair to be on the line for this equation and this equation. And again, that's only going to happen if they touch. So for this type of system, we have no solution. So on a test, you can stop here, or if your teacher requires, go ahead and graph it. All right, so y equals negative 3x plus 1. So the y-intercept occurs at 0, 1, and the slope is negative 3. So down 1, 2, 3 to the right 1, down 1, 2, 3 to the right 1. 
For the next one, we have y equals negative 3x plus 4. So my y-intercept occurs at 0, 4. And the slope, again, is negative 3. So down 1, 2, 3 to the right 1. Down 1, 2, 3 to the right 1. Down 1, 2, 3 to the right 1. So now you can visually see that you have two parallel lines. I know the drawing isn't perfect, but you can see that the way they're drawn, at least, you have parallel lines. They have the same slope or the same steepness, and so they're never going to intersect, and so your system will not have a solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 22. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving systems of linear equations by substitution. So we just want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. So just in case you didn't watch the lesson, the main idea here is that you're going to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Now, I have this equation x minus y equals 10, and then I have 4x plus 4y equals 16. What your book's going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you, what your tutor's going to tell you, what your teacher's going to tell you, you want to look for a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1, and the reason for that is it's extremely easy to solve an equation for a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. So in this equation, x minus y equals 10, I have a coefficient of 1 here and negative 1 here. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this equation for x. So that's kind of the first thing you're going to do. So I would have x minus y equals 10. All I need to do is just add y to both sides of the equation. And I would have x is equal to y plus 10. 10. Now, once I've done that, once I've solved one of the equations for one of the variables, I'm going to plug in for that variable in the other equation. So let's say this is equation 1 and this is equation 2. So I solved equation 1 for x, so I'm going to plug in for x in equation 2. And what am I going to plug in? Well, x is equal to y plus 10. So I'm saying x is the same as y plus 10. So I can substitute this value in for this. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, if I plug in for x there, a y plus 10, that quantity, I would have a linear equation in one variable, and I can solve that. And I would have a value for y that works as a solution to the system. So let's go ahead and do that. Instead of x there, I'm going to have four times this quantity. So when you work with a quantity and you're multiplying, you've got to use parentheses. So 4 times the quantity, put in parentheses there, y plus 10, and then plus 4y equals 16. So now this is a linear equation of one variable. So 4 times y is 4y, plus 4 times 10, that's 40, plus 4y equals 16. 4y plus 4y is 8y, so this would be 8y plus 40 equals 16. I would subtract 40 away from each side of the equation, and I'll do that over here. I'll have 8y is equal to 16 minus 40 is negative 24. So we get 8y equals negative 24. Divide both sides of the equation by 8, and I get that y is equal to negative 3. So y is equal to negative 3. So once I have that value for y, I can plug it back into either of the original equations. And why is that the case? Well, if y equals negative 3, if that's the y value that works as the solution to the system, it's going to have to work in both equations. So therefore, I can plug it into either one. So if I plug it into the first one, I'd have x minus a negative 3, plug it in a negative 3 for y, equals 10. So minus a negative is plus a positive, so this is x plus 3 equals 10. Subtract 3 away from each side of the equation, and I get x is equal to 7. And there you go. It's that simple. This is the ordered pair, 7, comma, negative 3. Now, you always want to check your work. Make sure you got the right answer. Remember, this ordered pair has to be a solution to this equation and this equation. It can't just work in one. It has to work in both. So I'm going to plug in a 7 for x, so 7 there, minus, I'm going to plug in a negative 3 for y, minus a negative 3 is plus 3. This should equal 10, and it does. You get 10 equals 10. So this one, it checks out. Now for the second equation, we have 4 times x, so 4 times 7, plus 4 times y, so 4 times negative 3, and this equals 16. So 4 times 7 is 28, so that's 28. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12, so minus 12. 
and this equals 16. 28 minus 12 is 16, so you get 16 equals 16, and so it works out here as well. So our solution for this system is the ordered pair 7, negative 3. All right, for the next system, we have 6x minus 7y equals 7, and x plus y equals negative 1. Again, I want to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. So with this equation here, I have two variables that each have a coefficient of 1. So I can solve for either one of those. It'd be really, really simple. Let's just solve this one for y. So I would just subtract x away from each side, and I would have y is equal to negative x minus 1. And once I've done that, I'm going to plug in negative x minus 1, which is what y is equal to, or the same as, in for y in that first equation. Okay, so I'm going to plug in for this right here, giving me a linear equation in one variable, just the variable x. So I would have 6x minus 7 times. Again, I'm plugging in for y. I'm plugging this in for y. So this quantity, negative x minus 1, and this equals 7. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify. We have 6x, and then we have negative 7 times negative x. That's plus 7x. Then we have negative 7 times negative 1. That's plus 7. And this equals 7. And then 6x plus 7x is 13x plus 7 equals 7. And remember, if you see the same thing on both sides of the equation, you can get rid of it. Right? I could just put lines through and cross it out and say I have 13x is equal to 0. And we know x would be 0 there. So divide both sides of the equation by 13. x equals 0. All right, so again, x equals 0. And now I can plug that in to either of the original equations. So I can plug in a 0 for x here or here and find out what the value for y is. Let's go ahead and just plug it in here. So 6 times 0 minus 7y equals 7. So that's going to go away. I'll just have negative 7y equals 7. Divide both sides by negative 7. And we're going to get that y equals negative 1. So y equals negative 1. So that's the ordered pair, 0, comma, negative 1. So let's go ahead and check this guy. We'll have 6 times, plug in a 0 for x, minus 7 times, plug in a negative 1 for y, equals 7. So that's going to cancel. Negative 7 times negative 1 is 7, so you get 7 equals 7. So it works out there. Then the next one we have is x plus y equals negative 1. So x is 0 plus negative 1 equals negative 1. So negative 1 equals negative 1 is what you'd end up with, and so it works out there as well. So 0, comma, negative 1, that ordered pair is a solution for the system. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 6x plus y equals negative 4. We have 18x minus 3y equals 7. So again, I'm going to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Looks pretty easy to solve this one for y because the coefficient is 1. So if I bring this down here, I have negative 6x plus y equals negative 4. I just need to add 6x to both sides of the equation. And I'll have y is equal to 6x minus 4. So now that I have one of the equations solved for one of the variables, I'm just going to substitute or plug in 4y in the other equation. So I'm going to be plugging in 4y here. And I'm going to plug this in, right? this quantity 6x minus 4. So I would have 18x minus 3 times the quantity, plugging in for y there, that quantity 6x minus 4. And this should equal 7. So let's simplify. We'll have 18x minus 3 times 6x is 18x. And then negative 3 times negative 4 would be positive 12. And this should equal 7. So right away, you should notice that there's a problem. 18x minus 18x is 0. So I'm left with 12 equals 7. 12 equals 7. That's false. So if your variable drops out and you get some nonsensical statement, like 12 equals 7, for example, we know we have an inconsistent system and there's no solution. Right? These two lines are going to be parallel. Right? There's no solution here. No solution. And if you want to prove that to yourself, solve each one for y, and you'll see that you get the same slope but different y-intercepts. So again, those are parallel lines. They'll never have a point of intersection, so there'll be no ordered pair that lies on both lines, right? So there's no solution. And just for the sake of completeness, we could do that real quick. 
We already solved this one for y. We got y is equal to 6x minus 4. For this one, we'd have 18x minus 3y equals 7. Go ahead and subtract 18x away from each side. So I'm just going to write this as negative 3y is equal to negative 18x plus 7. Divide both sides by negative 3. And you get y equals, let me write it up here so it's next to this one, y equals negative 18 over negative 3 is 6, so 6x. And then plus 7 over negative 3, which would just be minus 7 thirds. So minus 7 thirds. So you can see you have the same slope here, same slope, but different y-intercepts. So those two lines are parallel lines. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 5x minus 7y equals negative 21. We have negative 7x plus 6y equals 18. Again, the first thing I want to look for is a variable with a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. We don't have that here. And so what we're going to end up having to do is just pick a variable that we think would be easy to solve for. I'm going to go ahead and just pick this equation. I'm going to pick y to solve for. So let's say negative 7x plus 6y equals 18. And I'm going to add 7x to both sides of the equation. So I'll get 6y is equal to 7x plus 18. I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 6. And I'm going to get y is equal to 7, 6x plus 3. All right, so since I solved for y in this equation, I'm going to end up plugging in for y in this equation. So here's where I want to, let me kind of erase this, but I'm going to plug in this right here, this 7, 6x plus 3 for y in this equation here, because y equals that. So what that would give me is 5x minus 7 times y. Again, y is this quantity, 7, 6x plus 3. This should equal negative 21. So I'll have 5x minus, we have 7 times 7, 6x. 7 times 7 is 49. So that would be 49 over 6 times x. And then minus 7 times 3 is minus 21. And this equals negative 21. Let me kind of erase this. And let me kind of scroll over a little bit. So when I look at this, I know that if I have negative 21 here, negative 21 here, I can just get rid of it from both sides, right? If I added 21 to both sides of the equation, this would go away and this would go away. So I'm going to put equals zero. And then over here, I have 5x minus 49 over 6 times x. Now I could get a common denominator here, or I could just multiply both sides of the equation by 6. And so 6 times 5x is 30x minus 6 times 49 over 6 would just be 49, and then times x, and this equals 0 times 6, which is 0. So I don't even need to go through and do the subtraction here. If, if these two result in a single variable term, and it's equal to 0, the only way that's possible is if x is equal to 0, right? So I know that x equals 0 at this point. But for the sake of completeness, 30x minus 49x is negative 19x, and that equals 0. We'll divide both sides of the equation by negative 19. And we get that x is equal to 0. So again, x equals 0. And now I can plug this back in for x in either of the original equations. doesn't matter which one. Let's go ahead and just use the first one. So 5 times x, 5 times 0, minus 7y equals negative 21. You can eyeball that and see that y would be 3, right? But let's go ahead and again, for the sake of completeness, this would be gone. You'll have negative 7y equals negative 21. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 7. That's going to cancel. I'll have y is equal to 3. So x equals 0, y equals 3. K is an ordered pair. This is going to be 0, comma, 3. So let's go ahead and check this. I'm going to plug in a 0 for x, so 5 times 0, minus 7 times, plug in a 3 for y, equals negative 21. 5 times 0 is 0, so that would go away. Negative 7 times 3 is negative 21. So you get negative 21 equals negative 21. So that does check out. All right, for the next one, we have negative 7x. So negative 7 times 0 plus 6y. So 6 times 3 equals 18. So that's going to go away. 6 times 3 is 18, so you get 18 equals 18. So that checks out as well.
All right, for the final problem, we're going to look at 12x minus 9y equals 30, and negative 4x plus 3y equals negative 10. Now, some of you right away will notice that there's a problem here. If you look at this first equation, let's call this equation 1, and you look at this second equation, let's call this equation 2, you'll notice that they're the same equation. If I multiply this equation by negative 3, right, both sides, what's going to happen is I would get this equation. So if you notice that and you verify it, you know that you have an infinite number of solutions. You can stop. You don't need to go any further because usually when you're doing homework or a test, you want to save as much time as possible. So if your teacher doesn't require you to show any work, just stop and say an infinite number of solutions. Now, if you have to go through the whole thing, you have to show enough work to prove that the equations are dependent. And so what I do is solve one of the equations for one of the variables. So let's just take this second equation, negative 4x plus 3y equals negative 10, and solve it for x. So I would have negative 4x plus 3y equals negative 10. I would subtract 3y away from each side of the equation. So negative 4x is equal to negative 3y minus 10. Divide both sides by negative 4. So I'm going to get that x is equal to negative 3 over negative 4 is 3 fourths times y. And then negative over negative is positive. And 10 fourths I could think of as 5 halves, right? Each is divisible by 2. So let's erase this real quick. And now I'm going to plug in for x in this first equation here. So I'm going to plug in this quantity, 3 fourths y plus 5 halves. I'm going to plug that in for x right there. So this is what I'm plugging in. So I'd have 12 times this quantity, 3 fourths y plus 5 halves, and then minus 9y equals 30. So what we're going to see is that the variable is going to drop out, and you're going to be left with a true statement. So 12 times 3 fourths, 12 would cancel with 4 and give me 3. 3 times 3 is 9, so I'd have 9y. So next we're going to have plus 12 times 5 halves. 12 would cancel with 2 and give me 6. 6 times 5 is 30. And then minus 9y equals 30. So you can see that 9y minus 9y is 0. So that's gone. So there's no more variable. And you're left with just 30 equals 30. Or I could subtract 30 away from each side and get 0 equals 0. doesn't matter. Either way, it's a true statement. All right, but this isn't what we're looking for. So if you see something like that, you know that you have dependent equations, meaning you have the exact same equation that's manipulated and presented in a different way, but it's the same. And so there's an infinite number of solutions for this type of system. So I'll just write infinite number of solutions. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on solving systems of linear equations by substitution. All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. So we're going to start out with 3x minus 4y equals negative 18, and negative x plus y equals 4. So your objective here is to solve one of the equations for one of the variables to start. Now, it's always easiest to start with a variable that has a coefficient of 1, that's the easiest, or negative 1, that's kind of the second easiest. So if I look at this equation here, I have a coefficient on y that's 1. So let's go ahead and just solve this equation for y. So I have negative x plus y equals 4. And so to solve for y, I just add x to both sides of the equation. And I end up with y is equal to x plus 4. So once I've done that, what I want to do is I want to substitute in for y in the other equation. So in other words, I solved this equation for y, so I want to substitute in for y in the other equation. Now what am I going to plug in for y? Well, I'm going to plug in this x plus 4, because that's what y is equal to. And when I do that, what's going to happen is I end up with a linear equation in one variable. It's a linear equation that just contains the variable x. I can solve for x, and I know what the answer is in terms of x for the system. All right, so let's go ahead and have 3x minus, we have 4 times y. Now I'm plugging in a quantity here, so 4 times the quantity x plus 4. I've got to put that in parentheses. And then this equals negative 18. All right, so we have 3x 
we have negative four times x, that's minus four x. And then negative four times four, that's minus 16. And this equals negative 18. So then three x minus four x would be negative x. So this is negative x minus 16 equals negative 18. Would add 16 to both sides of the equation. That's gonna cancel. And I'll have negative x is equal to negative 18 plus 16 is negative two. Now I don't have x by itself, I have a negative x. So what I wanna do is multiply or divide both sides of the equation by negative one. So let's multiply by negative one over here and by negative one over here. And you're gonna get that x is equal to the number two. All right, so again, x equals two. And once I found the value for one of the variables, I can plug that into either equation. Okay, it doesn't matter which one and I can solve for the other unknown. So the other unknown is y. I can plug in a two for x here, solve for y, or I can plug in a two for x here, solve for y. Again, it doesn't matter. So this one's a little easier to work with. Let's do that. So negative, and then for x, I'm plugging in a two, plus y equals four. Just add two to both sides of the equation, and you get y is equal to six. So x equals two, y equals six. That's my solution for the system. So the ordered pair two comma six. All right, so now we want to check this in both equations. So I have three times x, so three times two, minus four times y, four times six, should equal negative 18. So three times two is six, I'd have six minus, four times six is 24, equals negative 18, and it does. Six minus 24 is negative 18, so you get negative 18 equals negative 18. So this one works, and now we just need to check the other one. So we have negative x plus y equals four. So negative two, plug in a two for x, plus y, so plus six equals four, and it does. Negative two plus six is the same thing as saying what is six minus two? So that's four equals four. And so it works out here as well. So that ordered pair two comma six is the solution for the system. All right, what about this one? We have negative four x minus four y equals four, and I have y equals negative four. So this is kind of a tricky one, but really it's kind of easy. It's kind of both at the same time. So y equals four. That's already solved for y. Notice I don't have an x variable there. All I need to do is take this value here, this negative four, and plug it in for y here and see what would x need to be if y was negative four. So I'd have negative four times x minus four times plug in a negative four for y and this should equal four. So we'd have negative four x, negative four times negative four is 16, so plus 16 equals four. Subtract 16 away from each side of the equation. I'd have negative four x is equal to, four minus 16 is negative 12. Divide both sides by negative four, and you're gonna get that x is equal to, negative 12 over negative four is three. So x equals three, we know that y equals negative four. It has to because in this equation, y equals negative four no matter what the value of x is. So y is gonna equal negative four. So should this work in both equations? Well, of course it would. I just plugged in a negative four in the place of y in this first equation. So I know if y is negative four here, x is three. In this equation, y always equals negative four no matter what x is. x can be whatever y will always equal negative four. So let me show you how you could mathematically check that. So again, the ordered pair would be three comma negative four. Well, again, you could plug into the first one. So negative four times, for x I'm plugging in a three, and then minus four times, for y I'm plugging in a negative four, and this equals four. Negative four times three is negative 12. Negative four times negative four is 16, so plus 16 equals four. Negative 12 plus 16 is four, so you get four equals four. So that one checks out. All right, for the other one, y equals negative four. Again, no matter what the value is for x, y equals negative four. So you can just put a check mark there, or you could write it as zero x, so zero x plus y equals negative four. And this doesn't violate our definition of a linear equation in two variables. Remember, the definition when I first gave it to you was ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are real numbers, and a and b are not both zero. a is zero in this case, the coefficient of x, but b is not also zero, b in this case is one. So a and b are not both zero, just one of them is. 
So I could write this as a linear equation in two variables that way, and I can plug in a 3 for x, and I could plug in a negative 4 for y, and I'd get a true statement. 0 times 3 is 0, so I'd have 0 plus 1 times negative 4 is negative 4 equals negative 4, so that becomes negative 4 equals negative 4. So again, this is a true statement. So the ordered pair 3 comma negative 4 is a solution for this system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2, on solving systems of linear equations by substitution. All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. We're going to start out with 2x minus y equals negative 6, and x minus 2y equals negative 9. So the first thing we want to do is solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Now, I taught you in the lesson that it's easiest to look for a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. So we have a coefficient of 1 here and a coefficient of negative 1 here. Now it's easier to work with a coefficient of 1. That's kind of the easiest scenario. So I can solve this equation for x. I have x minus 2y equals negative 9. It's very easy. I just add 2y to both sides of the equation. All right, it's one single step. So you just have x is equal to 2y minus 9. Now. I solved this equation right here for x. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in for x in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in for x here, and I'm going to be plugging in 2y minus 9. So x is equal to that, x is the same as that, so that quantity will get plugged in there, and I'll have a linear equation in one variable. So I would have 2 times the quantity, 2y minus 9. Again, notice how I use parentheses for the quantity. 2 has to be multiplied by each term then minus y equals negative 6. All right, 2 times 2y is 4y, then minus 2 times 9 is 18, then minus y equals negative 6. So 4y minus y would be 3y, so I'd have 3y minus 18 equals negative 6. Then I would add 18 to both sides of the equation, and I would get that 3y is equal to negative 6 plus 18 is 12. All right, so the final step is to divide both sides of the equation by 3 and get that y is equal to 4. So y is equal to 4. Okay, so once we have a result for one of the variables, we can plug that in to either of the original equations and get the other unknown. So I can plug in a 4 for y here or here and solve for x. Looks like it's a little easier to do it here. So let's do x minus 2 times 4 plug in a 4 for y, equals negative 9. So 2 times 4 is 8, so I'd have x minus 8 equals negative 9. Just simply add 8 to both sides of the equation, and you're going to get that x is equal to negative 1. So this is the ordered pair, negative 1 comma 4. And of course we want to check our work, so we want to plug in a negative 1 for each x, a 4 for each y, and see if we get a true statement. So 2 times negative 1, Plug in a negative 1 for that x, minus, plug in a 4 for y, should be negative 6. So 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, so we get negative 2 minus 4 equals negative 6. Negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6, so you get negative 6 equals negative 6, so it works out there. Now for the next one, we have x minus 2y equals negative 9. So I'd have a negative 1 plugged in for x, minus 2 times y, plug in a 4 for y equals negative 9. So I'd have negative 1, 2 times 4 is 8, so minus 8 equals negative 9, and negative 1 minus 8 is negative 9, so you get negative 9 equals negative 9, so it works out there as well. So we can say now that negative 1 comma 4, that ordered pair, is the solution for this system. So for the next one we have negative 7x minus 8y equals 13, and negative x plus y equals 4. So again, if I'm going to solve one of these for one of the variables, I'm looking for a variable with a coefficient of 1, like I have here, or negative 1, like I have here. 1 is easier than negative 1. If I want to solve this equation for y, all I need to do is add x to both sides of the equation, and I'm done. Right? I would have y is equal to x plus 4. So once I've done that, I just want to substitute in for y in the other equation. So here's y. And I'm going to plug in an x plus 4, because that's what y is equal to. So I'm going to plug in that quantity there. I'll have negative 7x minus 8 
times this quantity, I'm going to make sure I use parentheses, x plus 4 equals 13. So negative 7x, negative 8 times x is negative 8x, so minus 8x. Negative 8 times 4 is minus 32, so minus 32. And this equals 13. So negative 7x minus 8x is negative 15x. Then minus 32 equals 13. So I'm going to add 32 to both sides of the equation. That's going to cancel. And I'm going to have negative 15x is equal to 13 plus 32 is 45. And then as a final step, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 15. And we'll have that x is equal to 45 over negative 15 is negative 3. All right, so x equals negative 3. So now that I have this, I can plug a negative 3 back in for x in one of the original equations. So let's go ahead and use the second equation because it's easier to work with. So we'd have minus, and then for x, I'm plugging in a negative 3. So minus a negative is plus a positive. So that's positive 3 plus y equals 4. All I need to do is subtract 3 away from both sides of the equation, and I'll get that y is equal to 1. Okay, so this is going to be the ordered pair, negative 3 comma 1. Let's go ahead and check this to make sure we got the right answer. Remember, this has to work as a solution to both equations. So we have negative 7 times x, so negative 7 times negative 3, minus 8 times y, so y is 1, equals 13. So negative 7 times negative 3 is 21, minus 8 times 1, 8 times 1 is 8, so minus 8 equals 13. So 21 minus 8 is 13, so you get 13 equals 13. So this does work as a solution in this first equation. Now for the second one, we have negative x. So remember, I'm plugging in a negative 3 for the x and have a negative out in front. Minus a negative is plus a positive. So this is plus 3 plus, for y I'm plugging in a 1, equals 4. So we know 3 plus 1 is 4, so you get 4 equals 4. So it works out there as well. So this ordered pair, negative 3 comma 1, is the solution for this system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on solving systems of linear equations by substitution. All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. All right, so we have 2x plus 4y equals 14, and then we have 6x minus 8y equals negative 18. So the first thing we want to do is solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Now, we always like to look for an equation with a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1, but in this case, we don't have that. So it looks like I can just solve for anything. And I'm just going to start out with this first equation. I'm just going to solve it for x. So we have 2x plus 4y equals 14. And I'm just going to subtract 4y away from each side. So I'd have 2x is equal to negative 4y plus 14. So then I divide each side of the equation by 2. And I would end up with x is equal to negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. So that's negative 2y plus 14 over 2 is 7. So now that I've solved this first equation for x, I can plug in for x in the second equation. So I can plug in for x here. And I'm going to plug in this right here, this quantity, negative 2y plus 7. That's what x is equal to. So I'm going to plug that in there. So I'm going to have 6 times this quantity, negative 2y plus 7. Again, remember to use parentheses then minus 8y equals negative 18. So 6 times negative 2y is negative 12y, plus 6 times 7, that's 42, then minus 8y equals negative 18. So negative 12y minus 8y is negative 20y, so this is negative 20y, and then plus 42 equals negative 18. All right, so now I'm going to subtract 42 away from each side of the equation, so that's going to cancel. And I'm going to have negative 20y is equal to negative 18 over negative 42 is going to give me negative 60. So now I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 20. And I'll get that y is equal to 3. Right? Negative 60 over negative 20 is 3. All right? So again, y equals 3. And then I'm going to plug in a 3 for y in either of the original equations. doesn't matter which one. And I'm going to solve for x. So let's go with the first one. We have 2x plus 4 times y, plug it in a 3 for y, equals 14. 
So then I'd have 2x plus 4 times 3 is 12 equals 14. Subtract 12 away from each side of the equation. I'd have 2x is equal to 14 minus 12 is 2. So then divide both sides of the equation by 2. We would get x equals 1. So y equals 3, x equals 1. That's the ordered pair, 1 comma 3. So of course we want to check this result in each original equation and make sure that that ordered pair, 1 comma 3, is a solution for the system. So then we have 2x, so 2 times plug in a 1 for x, plus 4y, plug in a 3 for y, equals 14. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 4 times 3, that's 12, equals 14. 2 plus 12 is 14, so you get 14 equals 14. So it works out here. For the next one, we have 6x, so again, x is 1, so 6 times 1, minus 8y, again, y is 3, so minus 8 times 3, is equal to negative 18. So 6 times 1 is 6, minus 8 times 3 is 24, this should equal negative 18, and it does. 6 minus 24 is negative 18, so you get negative 18 equals negative 18, so it works out here as well. So our ordered pair, 1 comma 3, is in fact the solution for the system. All right, for the next one, we're going to look at 6x minus 3y equals 9, and negative 2x minus 2y equals negative 6. So I'm going to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Again, I don't see any of the variables with a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. So I'm just going to go ahead and solve this one, the second equation, for x. So I'll have negative 2x minus 2y equals negative 6. Just add 2y to both sides of the equation. And I'll have negative 2x is equal to 2y minus 6. So now what I want to do is divide both sides of the equation by negative 2. And I'll have x is equal to 2 divided by negative 2 is negative 1. So that's negative 1 times y or just negative y. And then negative 6 over negative 2 is 3, so plus 3. So now I have that x is equal to negative y plus 3. So I'm going to plug that in for x in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in for x here, and this is what I'm going to plug in. So I'm going to plug in a negative y plus 3 there. So I'd have 6 times the quantity, negative y plus 3. Again, make sure you use parentheses. And then minus 3y equals 9. So 6 times negative y is negative 6y. Then 6 times 3 is 18, so plus 18. And then minus 3y equals 9. Negative 6y minus 3y is negative 9y. So plus 18 equals 9. Let's subtract 18 away from each side of the equation, and we'll have negative 9y is equal to 9 minus 18 is negative 9. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 9, and we're going to get y is equal to 1. So once we know that, we can plug a 1 in for y in any of the original equations. So I can plug a 1 in for y, I don't know, let's say here. The second equation is a little easier. So negative 2x minus 2 times 1 is equal to negative 6, so then negative 2x minus 2 times 1 is just 2, equals negative 6. Add 2 to both sides of the equation, and you're going to get that negative 2x is equal to negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 2, and you're going to get that x is equal to negative 4 divided by negative 2 is 2. So y equals 1, and x is going to equal 2. Okay, so this is the ordered pair, 2 comma 1. All right, so let's check this result, and we've got to check it in each original equation. So I'd have 6 times x, x is 2, minus 3 times y, y is 1, equals 9. 6 times 2 is 12, minus 3 times 1, that's 3. So 12 minus 3 needs to equal 9, and it does, right? You get 9 equals 9, so this is going to work out in the first equation. All right, for the second equation, we have negative 2x, so negative 2 times 2, minus 2 times y, so minus 2 times 1, should be equal to negative 6. So negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, minus 2 times 1 is 2, and this should be equal to negative 6. Negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6, so you get negative 6 equals negative 6, so it works out here as well. So our ordered pair 2 comma 1 is a solution for the system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Solving Systems of Linear Equations by Substitution.
All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. We're going to look at 4x plus 6y equals negative 6, and 12x plus 18y equals negative 8. So again, solve one of the equations for one of the variables. And so I don't see a variable with a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. So let's just choose the first equation, and let's just solve it for x. So I have 4x plus 6y equals negative 6. So I would subtract 6y away from each side of the equation, and I would have 4x is equal to negative 6y minus 6. Then I divide both sides of the equation by 4. That's going to cancel. I'll have x by itself, and it's equal to negative 6 over 4. That's negative. 6 is divisible by 2, and so is 4. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So then times y, and then minus. 6 over 4, again, is 3 halves, so 3 halves. So you've got that x is equal to negative 3 halves y minus 3 halves. So I'm going to plug this in for x in the other equation. So I'm going to be plugging in this right here. All right, so I'd have 12 times this quantity, negative 3 halves y minus 3 halves, then plus 18y, and this should equal negative 8. So 12 times negative 3 halves. 12 would cancel with 2 and give me 6. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. So I get negative 18y. And for a lot of you, you'll already see that you have a problem. Then you'd have 12 times negative 3 halves. 12 would cancel with 2 and give me a 6. 6 times 3 is negative 18. So this would be minus 18. Then plus 18y equals negative 8. So why did I say that you could see that there's already, already a problem? Well, I have negative 18y and positive 18y. Those are going to cancel. So I don't have a variable anymore. I'm just left with negative 18 equals negative 8. When you see something like this, a nonsensical statement, something that's false, your variable is gone, you have an inconsistent system, right? Your system just doesn't have a solution. These two lines, if you solve them both for y, you'd see that they're parallel lines. So for this type of system, there is no solution. Right, let's take a look at another one. We have 2x plus 3y equals 8, and 3x plus 3y equals 3. So again, I want to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. And I don't have a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1, but I can solve this one for x or y, and it'd be pretty easy. So let's go ahead and solve this one for y. So we'll have 3y is equal to, I'm just going to subtract 3x away from each side of the equation. So minus 3x over here, that would cancel, and then minus 3x over here, so I'd have minus 3x plus 3. Now I'm going to divide by 3 on each side of the equation, and I'm going to end up with y is equal to negative 3 over 3 is negative 1, so negative x, and then 3 over 3 is 1, so plus 1. All right, so now that I have y equals negative x plus 1, I want to plug in for y in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in here, and so this quantity right here is going to go in here. So I'd have 2x plus 3 times y, so 3 times this quantity, negative x plus 1 is equal to 8. So then what do I have? I have 2x plus 3 times negative x is negative 3x, so I can put minus 3x, and then 3 times 1 is 3, so plus 3 equals 8. So 2x minus 3x is negative x, and then plus 3 equals 8, so I can subtract 3 away from each side, so I'll get negative x is equal to 5. Now I don't want negative x, I want regular x, so I need to multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, I can divide by negative 1. Essentially, I'm just changing the sign of each term here. So instead of negative x, now I have x. Instead of 5, I now have negative 5. So x equals negative 5. And so once I have that, I can plug that back in for either original equation and find out what the value for y is going to be. So let's just use this first one. We have 2 times x, so 2 times negative 5, plus 3y is equal to 8. So 2 times negative 5 is negative 10, plus 3y equals 8. So add 10 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. We'll have 3y is equal to 8 plus 10 is 18. Divide both sides of the equation by 3. y is equal to 6. So the ordered pair here would be negative 5 comma 6. So let's check this in each original equation. So 2 times x, we'd have 2 times negative 5 plus 3 times y, we'd have 3 times 6. This should equal 8. So 2 times negative 5 is negative 10, 
plus 3 times 6, that's 18, equals 8. Negative 10 plus 18 is 8, so you get 8 equals 8. So it works out there. Then for the next one, we have 3x, so 3 times negative 5, plus 3y, so 3 times 6, should be equal to 3. So 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. And 3 times 6 is 18, so plus 18 equals 3. Negative 15 plus 18 is 3, so you get 3 equals 3. So it works out there as well. So negative 5 comma 6, that ordered pair is a solution for the system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5, on solving systems of linear equations by substitution. All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the substitution method. So we have negative 3x minus 4y equals negative 6, and we have negative 2x plus 2y equals negative 4. So the first thing we want to do is solve either of the equations for either variable doesn't really matter. Typically you want to look for a variable that has a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. We don't have that here, so I'm going to go ahead and just solve this second equation for x. So we have negative 2x plus 2y equals negative 4, and I'm just going to subtract 2y away from each side. We'll have negative 2x is equal to negative 2y minus 4. We're going to divide both sides of the equation by negative 2 we'll get x is equal to negative 2 over negative 2 is 1, so just 1y or y, and then negative 4 over negative 2 is plus 2. So now what we're going to do, we're going to plug in for x in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in for x, that's right here, and this is what I'm going to plug in, y plus 2. Again, x is equal to y plus 2, so that's what we're going to plug in for. it. So we have negative 3, times this quantity, y plus 2, make sure you use parentheses, minus 4y is equal to negative 6. So negative 3 times y is negative 3y, negative 3 times 2 is minus 6, and minus 4y is equal to negative 6. I already know that the answer here for y is going to be 0. How do I know that? Well, same thing on both sides of the equation so I can get rid of it. Right? If I added 6 to both sides, that would go away. What I'd be left with is negative 3y minus 4y. So I know those are going to be like terms and they're going to combine. So it's going to end up equaling 0. So the only way it can equal 0 is if y is 0. Right? So you can save yourself a little bit of time if you spot that. So negative 3y minus 4y is negative 7y. And again, it equals 0. Divide both sides by negative 7. You get that y equals 0. All right, so now that I have y equals 0, I can plug in for y in any of the original equations, and I can solve for x. So let's just go ahead and plug into the second equation. So we have negative 2x plus 2 times 0 equals negative 4. So negative 2x, we know that's going to just go away, equals negative 4. Divide both sides by negative 2, and you get that x is equal to 2. So the ordered pair here is 2 comma 0. All right, so let's check this in the original equations. So negative 3x, so negative 3 times 2, minus 4y, so minus 4 times 0, should be equal to negative 6. So I know this is going to go away. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, so this would check out. For the second one, we'd have negative 2 times x, so times 2, plus 2 times y, 2 times 0, equals negative 4. Again, this is going to go away. Negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. So this checks out as well. So that ordered pair 2 comma 0 is the solution for the system. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. We have 2x minus y equals negative 12. Then we have negative 8x minus 2y equals 12. So again, I want to solve one of the equations for one of the variables. Now, I usually look for a coefficient of 1 or negative 1. And I have a coefficient of negative 1 here. So let's solve this first equation for y. So we have 2x minus y equals negative 12. Just subtract 2x away from each side of the equation, and I'll have negative y is equal to negative 2x minus 12. If I multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, basically everything's going to be positive, right? This would be y equals 2x plus 12. All right, so once I've solved for y, I'm going to plug in for y in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in a 2x plus 12. That's going to go in right there. So I'd have negative 8x minus 2 times this quantity, 2x plus 12, and this is going to be equal to 12. All right, so we'd have negative 8x 
Negative 2 times 2x is negative 4x. Negative 2 times 12 is negative 24, so minus 24 is equal to 12. So then negative 8x minus 4x is negative 12x. Then minus 24 equals 12. Then I'd add 24 to both sides of the equation. And I'd have negative 12x is equal to 36. Divide both sides by negative 12. And I'll get that x is equal to negative 3. So x equals negative 3. And once I have that, I can plug it in for either x in either equation, solve for the unknown y. So let's go ahead and plug it into the first one. We'd have 2 times negative 3 minus y equals negative 12. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. I'd have negative 6 minus y equals negative 12. Add 6 to both sides of the equation. You'd have negative y equals negative 12 plus 6 is negative 6. Multiply both sides by negative 1. And you'd have that y is equal to 6. You can write the ordered pair as negative 3 comma 6. And again, I want to check this. So 2 times x or 2 times negative 3 minus 6, plugging it in for y, equals negative 12. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, so you'd have negative 6 minus 6 equals negative 12. And that's true. You get negative 12 equals negative 12. All right, for the next one, you have negative 8x, so negative 8 times negative 3, minus 2y, so minus 2 times 6, and this equals 12. So negative 8 times negative 3 is 24, and then minus 2 times 6 is going to be minus 12, and this equals 12. 24 minus 12 is 12, so you get 12 equals 12. So this works out as well. So that ordered pair there, negative 3 comma 6, is a solution for your system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set number 23. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. So we want to solve each linear system using the elimination method. So we're going to start out with an easy one. We have 5x minus 6y equals 8, and negative 4x plus 6y equals negative 4. So notice how in each case we have the equations written in standard form for us. So that's what we always want to do first. We want ax plus by equals c. So some number times x, plus or minus, it doesn't matter. Some number times y equals some constant. So that's what we have in each case. All right, so once we've done that, we want to look to see that one pair of variable terms have opposites for the coefficients. And we already have that here. We have a negative 6 as the coefficient for y here, and a positive 6 for the coefficient for y here. If we don't have that, we have to create it. And we'll see that in some future examples. But once we have it, all we have to do is add the two left sides of the equations together and set it equal to the sum of the right sides of the equations. So 5x minus 6y is going to be added to negative 4x plus 6y. And we can do that horizontally or we can do it vertically. A lot of students like to just add down. So 5x plus negative 4x is x. And then negative 6y plus 6y is you can put plus 0y, you can put plus 0, you can put nothing. It doesn't matter. It's really just kind of canceled out. So I can just put a line through it. And this is equal to, now we're going to sum the right sides. 8 plus negative 4 is 4. So I have found that x equals 4. So x equals 4. So once you know that, you can just plug a 4 back in for x in either equation. You'll find out what y is. So let's go ahead and plug it into the first one. We have 5 times 4 for x, minus 6y equals 8. 5 times 4 is 20, so I'd have 20 minus 6y equals 8. I'd subtract 20 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have negative 6y is equal to 8 minus 20 is negative 12. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 6. I'll have y is equal to 2. So y equals 2. So the solution here is the ordered pair 4, comma, 2. And we check by plugging back in for each original equation. right? So I'm going to plug a 4 in for x here and a 2 in for y here and see if the left and the right side are equal. And I'm going to do it in this equation as well. So let's start out with 5x, so 5 times 4, minus 6y, so 6 times 2, should be equal to 8. 5 times 4 is 20, minus 6 times 2, that's 12. That should be equal to 8, and it is. 20 minus 12 is 8. So you get 8 equals 8. All right, for the next one, we have negative 4x, so negative 4 times 4, plus 6y, so 6 times 2, equals negative 4. 
So negative 4 times 4 is negative 16, plus 6 times 2, that's 12, and this should equal negative 4. So negative 16 plus 12 is negative 4, so you have negative 4 equals negative 4. So it works out here as well. So this ordered pair, 4 comma 2, is in fact the solution for our system. All right, let's look at one that's a little bit harder. We have negative 4x plus y equals 9, and 8x plus 5y equals negative 11. So both equations are written in standard form, ax plus by equals c. And again, I'm using kind of a looser definition. I know in high school we get taught that a, b, and c need to be integers, a and b can't be zero, and a has to be greater than or equal to zero. But really there's a looser definition where a and b are not both zero, and a, b, and c are real numbers. So that's what we're kind of doing for these problems. So looking here, I don't see where any pair of variable terms is going to cancel out when I do my addition. The quickest way to do it, if you look at it, I have negative 4 and I have 8 as my coefficients for the variable x. If I multiply this equation by 2, right, both sides, then I would create a negative 8x here, and that would cancel with positive 8x here. So I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 2. And so 2 times negative 4x is negative 8x. 2 times y is plus 2y. This equals 2 times 9, that's 18. So now I'm working with these two equations. I can forget about this one for right now. So let me just line it out for right now so it takes it off your mind. So if I add now, I'm adding the left sides together. I'm setting it equal to the sum of the right sides. So 8x plus negative 8x or 8x minus 8x is 0. Then 5y plus 2y is 7y. And this equals negative 11 plus 18, which is 7. So divide both sides of the equation by 7, and you get y is equal to 1. So I can erase all this now. I don't need it anymore. Once I know that y equals 1, I can plug that into either equation for y and solve for the unknown x. So let's go with the first one. We have negative 4x plus plug in a 1 for y equals 9. Subtract 1 away from each side of the equation. I'll get negative 4x is equal to 8. Divide both sides by negative 4. And I get x is equal to negative 2. So this is going to be the ordered pair, negative 2, comma, 1. So to check this, I'm going to plug a negative 2 in for x and a 1 in for y and make sure the left and the right side are equal in each equation. So for negative 4x, I'd have negative 4 times negative 2 plus y. I'm going to plug in a 1 for y equals 9. So negative 4 times negative 2 is 8, then plus 1 equals 9. 8 plus 1 is 9, so you get 9 equals 9. So that checks out. Then for 8x plus 5y equals negative 11. So I'm going to plug in a negative 2 for x, so 8 times negative 2. Then plus 5 times plug in a 1 for y. And this equals negative 11. So 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. Plus 5 times 1 is 5 equals negative 11. And it does. Negative 16 plus 5 is negative 11. So you get negative 11 equals negative 11. So it checks out here as well. So this ordered pair, negative 2 comma 1, is the solution for our system. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 6y equals negative 11x minus 8, and 8x minus 4y equals 36. So the first thing I want to do before I do anything else is put both equations in standard form. So ax plus by equals c. So then this one is in standard form. This one's not. So what I'm going to do is I would add 11x to both sides of the equation. So I would have 11x plus 6y is equal to negative 8. So I'm going to look at these two equations now. Forget about this one for right now. Just line it out. And I'm looking to see if a pair of variable terms would have opposite coefficients. And right now, we don't have anything like that. So I can look at x, or I can look at y, and I can create opposite variable terms. So let's go with y, because it looks like it's a little easier to do. And basically, if I have negative 4, and I have 6, I can multiply the equation with negative 4 as the coefficient for y by 6. That's going to give me a coefficient of negative 24. I'm going to multiply this by positive 4. That's going to give me a coefficient of 24. So negative 24 and 24 are opposites. So when I add, those two would cancel each other, and my variable y would be eliminated. So I need to multiply this equation, this 8x minus 4y equals 36, 
by 6. So both sides need to get multiplied by 6. And so 6 times 8x is 48x. And then minus 6 times 4y, that's 24y. And this equals 36 times 6, that's 216. So let me erase this real quick. And I'm going to put an arrow. So the transformed equation is 48x minus 24y equals 216. So for the next one, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 4. And multiply this side by 4 and this side by 4. 4 times 11x is 44x plus 4 times 6y is 24y equals 4 times negative 8, that's negative 32. So I would get 44x plus 24y is equal to negative 32. So now I'm going to add the two left sides of the equations, set that equal to the sum of the right sides of the equations. So 48x plus 44x is 92x. Then negative 24y plus 24y, that's going to cancel. And this is equal to 216 minus 32, which is 184. So if I divide both sides of the equation by 92, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get that x is equal to 2. x equals 2. So x equals 2. And again, I can go back to my original equations now, plug in a 2 for x in either original equation, solve for the unknown y. So let's plug it into the first equation. So 6y is equal to negative 11 times 2 minus 8. So 6y is equal to negative 11 times 2 is negative 22 minus 8. And negative 22 minus 8 is going to be negative 30. Divide both sides of the equation by 6, and you get y equals negative 5. So this is the ordered pair 2 comma negative 5. All right, so let's check this. So I'm going to plug a 2 in for x and a negative 5 in for y. So 6 times y. So 6 times negative 5 is equal to negative 11 times 2 minus 8. 6 times negative 5 is negative 30. And this equals negative 11 times 2. That's negative 22 minus 8. So negative 30 is equal to negative 22 minus 8 is negative 30 also. So it checks out here. For the next one, we have 8x. So that's 8 times 2 minus 4y. So minus 4 times negative 5 equals 36. So 8 times 2 is 16. Negative 4 times negative 5 is plus 20. This equals 36. 16 plus 20 is 36, so you get 36 equals 36. So this one checks out as well. So this ordered pair 2 comma negative 5 is a solution for the system. All right, for the next one, we have 10x plus 10y equals 20, and 5x equals negative 5y plus 3. So this one's in standard form already. I'm going to rewrite this one as 5x. Add 5y to both sides of the equation, so plus 5y equals 3. Now I have my two equations, 5x plus 5y equals 3, and then 10x plus 10y equals 20. Now the next thing to do is to transform one or both of the equations so that one pair of variable terms have opposite coefficients. So I have 5y and I have 10y, I have 5x and I have 10x, Really, you can do the same thing. You can multiply both sides of the equation by negative 2 up here, and these two variables would drop out. And that's going to be a problem, and I'll show you why in a second. So let's say I multiplied both sides of this equation by negative 2. What's going to happen is I'm going to have negative 10x minus 10y is equal to negative 6. This equation is 10x plus 10y equals 20. Right, that one doesn't change. When I do my addition step, remember I add the two left sides together, set that equal to the sum of the right sides. Negative 10x plus 10x, that cancels. Negative 10y plus 10y, that cancels. So I just have 0 over here. This is equal to negative 6 plus 20, which is 14. 0 doesn't equal 14. This is false. So when you see something like this, remember it's an inconsistent system. You have no solution. Right? You have no solution. So if you were to solve each equation here for y, you would see that in slope-intercept form, you have the same slope in each case, but different y-intercepts, right? These two lines are parallel, right? So they're never going to intersect, and so you don't have a solution. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1. 
on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. All right, so we wanna solve each linear system using the elimination method. We're gonna take a look at 7x plus 10y equals four, and negative 2x minus 5y equals negative 14. So kind of the first thing is you wanna make sure the equations are written in standard form. So ax plus by equals c. So we have that, we have something times x plus something times y equals some constant. We have that here as well. So that's good to go. The next thing you wanna do is look to see if any of your variable terms have opposite coefficients. So in other words, here I have seven as the coefficient for x, here I have negative two, those aren't opposites. Here I have 10, here I have negative five, those aren't opposites. So what I wanna do if I don't have any opposites already, I wanna transform one or both of the equations to where at least one of those variables would drop out, so they have opposite coefficients. I can accomplish this easily by multiplying both sides of this equation by two, right? Because this variable here, y, has a coefficient of 10, so I have 10y. This one here is negative 5y. If I multiply this equation both sides by two, this would be transformed into negative 10y, and so when I added the two left sides together, they would drop out, right? and that's what I'm trying to do. This is the elimination method. So I'm gonna go ahead and multiply both sides of this equation by two. So two times negative two x is negative four x, then minus two times five y is 10 y, and this equals two times negative 14, that's negative 28. And I'll go ahead and write this other equation below it, seven x plus 10 y equals four. So once you've done that, all we need to do is add the two left sides together, set that equal to the sum of the two right sides. So negative four x plus seven x, that's three x, Negative 10y plus 10y, that's gonna cancel. And this equals negative 28 plus four, that's gonna be negative 24. All right, so the final step is to divide both sides of the equation by three. And we get x is equal to negative eight. So I'll write that up here that x is equal to negative eight. And once you have that, you can erase all this, you don't need it anymore. Since I know the value of x in both equations, I can plug that value, which is negative eight, in for either one and solve for y. So I'm gonna plug a negative eight into the first one. So seven times negative eight plus 10y equals four. Seven times negative eight is negative 56. So negative 56 plus 10y equals four. Add 56 to both sides of the equation. That's gonna be gone. I'll have 10y is equal to 60. Divide both sides by 10 and you get y is equal to six, right? 60 over 10 is six. So now we have our solution. It's the ordered pair negative eight comma six. And the last thing you wanna do is just check to make sure you got the right answer. So I'm gonna plug a negative eight in for x, so seven times negative eight, plus 10 times, plug in a six for y, and this should be equal to four. So seven times negative eight, that's negative 56, then plus 10 times six, that's 60, this should equal four, and it does, right? Negative 56 plus 60 is four. Four equals four, so it checks out there. Remember, it's gotta work for both, though. So we'll plug in negative eight in for x here. Negative two times negative eight minus, we have five times, plug in a six for y, equals negative 14. Negative two times negative eight is 16, minus five times six, that's 30. This should equal negative 14, and again, it does. 16 minus 30 is negative 14. So you get negative 14 equals negative 14. So it works out in each equation of the system. So this ordered pair negative eight comma six is the solution for the system. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section two on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. All right, so we wanna solve each linear system using the elimination method. We're gonna take a look at two x plus five y equals five and negative four x minus 10 y equals negative 10. You might have caught on already that these two equations are basically the same. If I take this equation and I multiply it on both sides by negative two, I would get this equation. So when you have something like this, remember the equations are dependent. They're the same equation. Right? It's just one is manipulated to look different. So you're gonna have an infinite number of solutions, but we're gonna go through it just in case you don't notice it right away and see what happens. So when I think about my first steps, I wanna make sure that everything's in standard form, and it is. 
we have AX plus BY equals C in each case. Then I want to look at the variable terms and see if any pair have opposite coefficients. So I don't have any that are, but I could easily transform this equation such that one, or in this case it's going to be both, variables would drop out. If I multiply this equation both sides by two, what's going to happen is instead of 2x, I'd have 4x. Instead of 5y, I'd have 10y. And instead of 5, I'd have 10. But when I do my next step, and I can kind of line this out, when I do my next step, negative 4x plus 4x is 0. Negative 10y plus 10y is 0. Negative 10 plus 10 is 0. So you get 0 equals 0, which is true. But again, if the variable has dropped out completely, not one of the variables, but both, and you're just left with a true statement, then you have a system that has dependent equations. And so we have an infinite number of solutions. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. All right, so we want to solve each linear system using the elimination method. And we have 8x minus 32 equals negative 8y. We have negative y minus 5 thirds x equals negative 32 thirds. So the first thing I want to do is put both equations in standard form. So again, that looks like this, ax plus by equals c. So for this one, we have 8x minus 32 equals negative 8y. I'm going to add 8y to both sides of the equation. So that's going to go away, It'll just be 0. So I would have 8x plus 8y, and I'm going to go ahead and just add 32 to both sides of the equation. So this would equal 32. Now for the next one, if I think about these each as plus negative, then I could just rearrange the terms as negative 5 thirds x plus negative y or minus y equals negative 32 thirds. Now. If you don't like working with fractions, you can just clear the fractions by multiplying both sides by 3. So multiply this side by 3, multiply this side by 3. So 3 times negative 5 thirds, the 3's would cancel. You'd have negative 5 and then times x, and then minus 3 times y is 3y, and then equals negative 32 thirds times 3 is negative 32. So now I've got each in standard form, and all I want to do now is look to see what would cancel if I did my addition. Well, nothing, right? So I need to transform one or both equations such that one pair of variable terms would be eliminated through addition, right? So I want opposite coefficients on one of the variables. So if I look at 8y and I look at negative 3y, if I multiply this equation by 3 and I multiply this equation by 8, what's going to happen is 3 times 8 is 24. 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. So those are opposites, and so that variable y will drop out. So then 3 times 8x is 24x, plus 3 times 8y, that's 24y. And this equals 3 times 32, which is 96. Over here, 8 times negative 5x is negative 40x. Then minus 8 times 3y is 24y. And then this equals negative 32 times 8, that's negative 256. Okay, so now let's do our addition. We add the two left sides together, set it equal to the sum of the two right sides. All right, so 24x minus 40x, or 24x plus negative 40x would be negative 16x. 24y plus negative 24y, that's eliminated. And this equals 96 plus negative 256. So that's going to be negative 160. Divide both sides by negative 16. That cancels, you get x is equal to 10. All right, so if x equals 10, you can plug that in for x in either original equation and see what the value of y is. So plug in a 10 here. We'd have 8 times 10 minus 32 equals negative 8y. 8 times 10 is 80, so I'd have 80 minus 32 equals negative 8y. What's 80 minus 32? Well, it's going to be 48. So I'd have 48 is equal to negative 8y. Divide both sides by negative 8. And you get that y is equal to negative 6. 
So that's the ordered pair, 10 comma negative six. So to check it, I plug in a 10 for each X and a negative six for each Y and make sure the left and the right side are equal. So eight times 10 minus 32 is equal to negative eight times negative six. Eight times 10 is 80, subtract away 32 equals negative eight times negative six is 48. So what's 80 minus 32? Well, that is 48. So 48 equals 48. So it checks out here. For the next one, I have a negative y. For y, I have a negative six. So it's minus a negative six, that's plus six. Then minus five thirds times x, for x I'm plugging in a 10. And this equals negative 32 thirds. Nothing I can cancel in this multiplication here. I'd have six minus, five times 10 is 50. So 50 thirds should be equal to negative 32 thirds. Now, if I want to, I can multiply both sides of the equation by three. Perfectly legal whether you have variables or not. But kind of an easier way to, would be to multiply this by three over three. So this would be 18 thirds. And then 18 minus 50 would be negative 32. So I would get negative 32 thirds equals negative 32 thirds. So then I can go back up here and say, yes, my solution, the order pair 10 comma negative six works in both equations of the system. So it is the solution for our system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. All right, so we wanna solve each linear system using the elimination method. And so we have seven Y plus 34 equals negative 12 X. And we have 20 plus eight Y equals negative nine X. So the first thing you wanna do is put each equation in standard form, AX plus BY equals C. So for this one, we have seven Y plus 34 equals negative 12 X. I would add 12 X to both sides of the equation and I would subtract 34 away from both sides of the equation. So this would cancel over here. And on the left side, I'd have 12 X plus seven Y. This would cancel over here. So equals negative 34. So what about the other equation? Let's write that in standard form too. So I can kind of do this over here. I can just add nine X to both sides. Or let me write this over here. And I can subtract 20 away from each side. And what's gonna happen is this is gonna cancel and this is gonna cancel. So I'll have nine X plus eight Y is equal to negative 20. All right, so now I'm looking to transform one pair of variable terms to where the coefficients are opposites, right? I don't have that right now, so I need to do that. So I have seven as my coefficient for y, eight for my coefficient for y there. You know, I can multiply one of these by a negative, and basically I could do negative eight times this equation, and then seven times this equation. So you'd have 56 as one coefficient, negative 56 as the other. Or if I'm working with X, I have 12 and I have nine. So I can multiply one of these by a negative, I could say negative nine here, the other one by 12. But there's a way to make it a little simpler. If you want, you can just find the least common multiple. So the least common multiple between 12 and nine, it's easy to find, it's three times three times four, right? So that's 36. So what I can do is transform both of these equations to where one of the equations has 36 X and the other one has negative 36 X, right? So when we do our addition step, they drop out. So I can multiply both sides of this equation by let's say negative three. And I'm gonna scooch this over just a little bit to the right. Give us a little room. I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by positive four. So that's gonna give me negative 36 X here and positive 36 X here. So negative three times 12 X is negative 36 X. And then minus negative three times seven Y is negative 21 Y. That's why I put a minus there. And so it's minus 21 Y. And then equals negative 34 times negative three is positive 102. Okay, over here I have four times nine X, that's 36 X. Four times eight Y, that's gonna be plus 32 Y. And then four times negative 20 is negative 80. So now what we wanna do is sum the left sides, set it equal to the sum of the right sides. So negative 36 X plus 36 X, that's gonna cancel or be eliminated. Negative 21 Y plus 32 Y, that's 11 Y. 
This equals 102 minus 80, that's gonna be 22. Divide both sides by 11, and I get y is equal to two. So once I know y equals two, I can plug that back in for the y in either original equation, find out what x is. So let's use the first one. We have seven times two plus 34 equals negative 12x. Seven times two is 14, so you have 14 plus 34 equals negative 12x. 14 plus 34, that's gonna be 48. And this equals negative 12x. Divide both sides by negative 12. And I'm gonna end up with x is equal to negative four. All right, so this will be the ordered pair, negative four comma two. All right, so now we wanna check it. So I'm gonna plug in a negative four for x and a two for y. So seven times two plus 34 is equal to negative 12 times negative four. Seven times two is 14, so you'd have 14 plus 34 is equal to, negative 12 times negative four is 48. So 14 plus 34 is 48, so you get 48 equals 48. So this one checks out. For the next one you have 20 plus eight times y, and for y we have two, is equal to negative nine times x, x is negative four. So for eight times two, that's 16. So you'd have 20 plus 16 is equal to, negative nine times negative four is 36. 20 plus 16 is 36, so you get 36 equals 36. So it checks out here as well. So that ordered pair, negative four comma two, is the solution for the system. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section five, on solving systems of linear equations by elimination. All right, so we wanna solve each linear system using the elimination method. So we have negative 30 plus six x is equal to negative 14 y. Then we have y is equal to negative 3 sevenths x plus 12 sevenths. So I'm gonna write each equation in standard form. So ax plus by equals c. So for the first one, I have negative 30 plus 6x equals negative 14y. So I would add 30 to both sides of the equation, and I would add 14y to both sides of the equation. So that cancels, and so did that. And so I'm gonna end up with 6x plus 14y is equal to 30. All right, for the other one, I would just add 3 sevenths x to both sides of the equation. So it would cancel over here and I would have 3 sevenths x plus y is equal to 12 sevenths. Now, if I wanna clear the fractions here, which a lot of you will like to do, just multiply both sides of the equation by seven. So seven times 3 sevenths is three, so you get three x plus seven times y, that's seven y. And this equals seven times 12 sevenths, which is 12. So now when we look at our equations, some of you can immediately see a problem, and this is gonna come with practice, but if you don't see it yet, that's okay. We wanna transform one pair of variable terms to where they're gonna be opposites. So in other words, either I want the coefficients for the x variable in each case to be opposites, or the coefficients for the y variable in each case to be opposite, doesn't matter. If I look at six and I look at three, the opposite of six would be negative six. So I could multiply this equation, both sides, by negative two, and let me kind of scoot this over a little bit. So multiply both sides by negative two, and you're gonna see a problem happens when we do that. So the top equation, I'm just gonna rewrite that real quick. It's six x plus 14y equals 30. For this one, negative two times three x is negative six x. Negative two times seven y is negative 14 y. And this equals 12 times negative two, that's negative 24. Remember, your next step is to add the two left sides together, set that equal to the sum of the right sides. Six x plus negative six x, that cancels or is eliminated. 14 y plus negative 14 y, that cancels or is eliminated. So you get zero over here, and this is equal to 30 plus negative 24, which is six. Zero doesn't equal six, this is false. This is an example of an inconsistent system. Again, we'd have two parallel lines, and so there's no solution. There's no solution. And if you wanna prove that to yourself, go back, solve each equation for y, put it in slope-intercept form, and you'll see that you have the same slope in each case, but different y-intercepts. So again, two parallel lines, they'll never intersect, 
And so the system will never have a solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 24. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on applications of linear systems. So we're going to jump right in and look at a few problems. So the senior class at Delton High rented and filled eight vans and nine buses with 311 students. Vance High rented and filled 11 vans and 16 buses with 511 students. So each van carried the same number of students and each bus carried the same number of students. And let me clarify that. We're not saying that each van and each bus carry the same number. We're saying that between all the vans that both high schools rented, they each carry the same number. So all the vans would carry the same number of students. Now, separately from this, each bus would carry the same number of students. So all the buses would carry the same number of students, but we're not saying that the number of students that a bus can carry and the number of students that a van can carry would be the same. All right, so then how many students were on each van and how many students were on each bus? So this is what we need to answer to get the problem correct. How many students were on each van and how many students were on each bus? So let's assign a variable to each of those unknowns. So let's let x equal the number of students on each van and then y can be equal to the number of students on each bus. So using these variables I'm going to set up two equations because I have two unknowns, set up a linear system, then I'm going to solve that and I'll know how many students were on each fan and how many students were on each bus. So if we read back through the problem, again we see that the senior class at Delton High rented and filled eight vans and nine buses with 311 students. So that's enough information to make one equation. So for Delton, I'm just going to put their name right here, they have eight vans. So eight vans. So I take the number eight, which is again the number of vans, times x, which is the number of students on each van, and that would give me the number of students traveling by van. So then we're going to add to this. We have nine buses that we rented, so nine times y, that's the number of students on each bus, and this 9y is going to represent the number of students traveling by bus. So if I sum these two amounts together, the number of students traveling by van and the number of students traveling by bus, I get all the students that went from Delton High on the trip and they tell me specifically in the problem that's 311. So this is equal to 311. Now I can do the same thing with Vance High. Vance High rented and filled 11 vans and 16 buses with 511 students. So I'm going to set up the same equation for Vance. So it's 11 vans for them, so 11 times x plus we had 16 buses for them, so 16 times y, and this equals, we said 511. So again, number of students traveling by van plus number of students traveling by bus gives us the total number of students Vance High brought, which in this case is 511. So now we have two equations and two unknowns, so we can solve our linear system and find out what x is and what y is. So we have 8x plus 9y equals 311. And then we have 11x plus 16y equals 511. So what method do we want to use here? We can use substitution or we can use elimination. I think most of you would prefer to do elimination. So just pick a variable that you want to eliminate. Let's say we want to eliminate the x variable. So I've got to transform both these equations to where these coefficients are going to be opposites. So in other words, if I have 8 and I have 11, I can multiply the equation, both sides, with 8 as the coefficient of x by negative 11. And then I can multiply the equation with 11 
as a coefficient of x, both sides by positive 8. This is going to give me negative 88. This is going to mean positive 88. And so they would cancel out when you do your addition. So we're going to multiply this equation, again, both sides by negative 11. And then we'll multiply both sides of this equation by 8. So first equation, negative 11 times 8 is negative 88 times x plus, we have negative 11 times 9, that's negative 99. So let me erase this and put minus 99, and then of course times y. And this equals 311 times negative 11, which is negative 3,421. All right, for the next one, I have 8 times 11, that's 88, then times x, so 88x. Then plus, we have 8 times 16, that's 128, so this would be 128y. And this equals 8 times 511, that's 4,088. So what's going to happen is when I add the two left sides together, this is going to cancel or be eliminated. I have negative 99y plus 128y, that's 29y. And this equals negative 3,421 plus 4,088 is 667. Divide both sides of the equation by 29, which is the coefficient of y. So this is going to cancel. We'll have y is equal to 23. But we're not done because we need to find the value for x. So let's erase everything. So we know y equals 23. We can plug this in for y in either equation and solve for x. So let's do it into the first one. So we'll have 8x plus 9 times 23. And this is equal to 311. So then we'd have 8x plus 9 times 23 is 207. And this equals 311. Subtract 207 away from both sides. That cancels. And we'd have 8x is equal to 311 minus 207 is 104. Divide both sides of the equation by 8, and you get x is equal to 13. So y equals 23 and x equals 13. Now, one of the things you might want to do when you first start out, write this as an ordered pair, 13 comma 23. Go back and plug in a 13 for x and a 23 for y in each equation, and make sure the left and the right side are equal. I'm not going to do it here in the interest of time, but I've already done it on my prep sheet, so I know it works out. Go ahead and pause the video, plug in a 13 for x and a 23 for y in each equation, and see that the left and the right side are equal. Now, once you've done that, go back up, and again, remember that x is the number of students on each van. So x was 13, so that means that each van holds 13 people. While we can say that each bus holds, remember y equals the number of students on each bus, and y was 23. So each bus holds 23 people. And with a word problem, you always want to go back and make sure it makes sense. So again, the senior class at Delton High rented and filled eight vans and nine buses with 311 students. So if you had eight vans, and in each van you had 13 students, so you'd have eight times 13, then plus you'd have nine buses filled with 23 students in each bus, so nine times 23. If you sum these two amounts together, you should get the total number of students that went, which is 311. And really, if you realize this, you're just checking the equation that I told you to check earlier. So if you've already done this, you can kind of skip it at this point and say, okay, I know it works out. So eight times 13 is 104, then plus. Nine times 23 is 207. And does this equal 311? It in fact does. 104 plus 207 is 311. So this works out, right? This first part checks out. Now let's look at the second part. Vance High rented and filled 11 vans. Remember, each van has 13 people. So you'd have 11 times 13. And 16 buses. Each bus holds 23 people. And this should sum to 511, the number of students they brought. 11 times 13 is 143. Then plus 16 times 23 is 368. And this equals 511. 
And if I sum 143 and 368, I do get 511. So the second part checks out as well. So we can say that each van holds 13 students and each bus holds 23 students. So Alyssa and Rob each improved their yards by planting hostess and ornamental grass. They bought their supplies from the same store. Alyssa spent $73.60 on five hostess and three bunches of ornamental grass. Rob spent $72.80 on six hostas and two bunches of ornamental grass. Find the cost of one hosta and the cost of one bunch of ornamental grass. So this is our goal. Find the cost, the cost of one hosta and the cost of one bunch of ornamental grass. So we're just gonna assign a variable to represent each one. So we're gonna let X be equal to the cost of one hosta and then we can say y is equal to the cost of one bunch of ornamental grass all right so let's go back and make two equations so that we can get a solution for X and for Y. All right, so we're told that Alyssa spent $73.60 on five hostess and three bunches of ornamental grass. So we can make that into an equation. We can take five times the cost per one hosta, which we represented with X, and add to that three times the cost of one bunch of ornamental grass, which we represented with Y, and set that equal to the cost that she spends on both, which is $73.60. So again, Alyssa buys five hostess and they're X dollars a piece. Then plus she buys three bunches of ornamental grass and they're Y dollars a piece. And when you sum the two amounts together, you have to get the total amount she spent, which was $73.60. So I'm gonna put 73.60. All right, now for Rob, he spent $72.80 on six hostess and two bunches of ornamental grass. So I can do six times X plus two times Y equals 72.8. So for Rob, again, he bought six hostess. So that's six times X. X is the cost per one hosta. Plus he bought two bunches of ornamental grass. So two times Y. Y again is the cost of one bunch of ornamental grass. And this equals the total amount he spent, which is $72.80, so 72.80. All right, so we have our two equations and two unknowns. So let's go ahead and solve this system. So we'll have 5x plus 3y equals 73.6. can leave the zero off, it has no value. And then 6x plus 2y equals 72.8. Again, leave the zero off, it adds no value. So if I wanna clear the equations of decimals, I can start by just multiplying both sides by 10. But because I wanna use elimination here, you can use substitution, but most of us like to use elimination. And because I'm gonna use it here, I'm gonna do everything in one step. So in order for me to eliminate a variable, I'm gonna to have to transform both of these equations such that one pair of variable terms will drop out when they're added, right? They have to be opposites. So I can do this with the variable X or with Y, doesn't really matter. Let's go ahead and work with Y. So what I'm gonna need to do, if I have three and I have two, one of them I'm gonna have to multiply by a negative, one is gonna be multiplied by a positive, but they're gonna be multiplied by the other. So I'll multiply three times two, and I can multiply two times negative three. This would give me six and negative six. So those would be opposites. And so when we do our addition, those two would cancel. All right. So because I want to clear both equations of decimals also, instead of multiplying this one by two, I can multiply it by 20. So 20 times 5x is 100x, plus 20 times 3y, that's 60y. And this equals, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to separate this up into 10 times 2. So I'm going to first multiply by 10. 10 times 73.6, this would just move one place to the right. So I'd have 736, and then I'd multiply that by two, and that would give me 1,472.
Now for this one, I wanted to multiply by negative three. But again, because I want to multiply by 10 to move the decimal point one place to the right, I'm going to take negative three, multiply by 10 and get negative 30. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by negative 30. And again, I'm going to write this as 10 times negative three over here. It's the same thing. 10 times negative three is negative 30. So I'm just breaking it up to make it easy to do that operation with the decimal point. So negative 30 times six X is negative 180 X. And then negative 30 times two Y is negative 60 Y. And you see we have opposite coefficients for our variable Y. And this equals 10 times 72.8 would be 728, right? This just moves one place to the right. And then times negative three. So that's gonna give me negative 2,184. All right, so I've cleared my equations of decimals and I've also transformed the equations to where one of the variables will be eliminated when we do our addition. So let's go ahead and add the two left sides together. 100x minus 180x would be negative 80x. 60y minus 60y, that would be zero. So we can just put a line through that. And this is gonna be equal to 1,472 minus 2,184 which is gonna be negative 712. So now I'm gonna divide both sides of the equation by negative 80. And I'll have X is equal to 8.9. Now in terms of dollars, that would be $8.90. But we haven't gotten to that yet. Let's erase everything. All right, so now I can just plug in for X in either of the original equations. So let's do five times 8.9 plus 3y equals 73.6. So five times 8.9 is equal to 44.5. And then plus 3y equals 73.6. We're gonna subtract 44.5 away from each side of the equation. So that's gone. I'll have 3y is equal to 29.1. And then as a final step, I'll just divide both sides of the equation by three. And I'll get y is equal to 9.7. So y equals 9.7. You could write this as an ordered pair, 8.9 comma 9.7. So we ended up with some decimals for our answer. It wasn't really something we could avoid. That's how the problem was set up. But I wanted to show you that you could clear the decimals while you're also transforming your equation. You could do that at one step. You could have left the decimals alone. It doesn't matter. If you're working with a calculator, again, as I told you a long time ago, it's just as fast, right? You don't even need to worry about clearing it. So this is our solution. X equals 8.9, Y equals 9.7. We got to make sense of that. So again, X was the cost of one hosta. So if we say X is 8.9, that's $8.90 in terms of dollars when we kind of translate that. So each hosta... has a cost of $8.90 while each bunch of ornamental grass has a cost of, and then for Y it was 9.7. So if we kind of translate that, it's gonna be $9 and 70 cents. So each hosta has a cost of $8.90, while each bunch of ornamental grass has a cost of $9.70. And again, you can go back to the problem and see if that's true. So Alyssa spent $73.60 on five hostas and three bunches of ornamental grass. Well, each hosta is $8.90. So five times 8.9 plus three which is the amount of bunches of ornamental grass she buys, times 9.7, right, they're $9.70 a piece, should be equal to 73.6, or you could put 73.60. You could add zeros on each one of these to keep it more in line with the problem. But remember, when you're working with decimals, if you erase this, it doesn't change the value of the number. So I just like to keep things simple. So I'm gonna have let me kind of replace these with some parentheses. Five times 8.9 is 44.5. Three times 9.7 is 29.1. This equals 73.6, and it does. 
If you add 44.5 and 29.1, you do get 73.6. So that tells me that my answer is in line with what the problem says. So Alyssa did spend $73.60 on five hostas and three bunches of ornamental grass, given the fact that each hosta was $8.90 and each bunch of ornamental grass was $9.70. Now let's check Rob's. So he spent $72.80 on six hostas. So six times, again, it's $8.90, so 8.9 for each hosta. Then plus two bunches of ornamental grass, so two times, it's 9.70 for each, so 9.7. And this should be equal to 72.8, because that's the pricey base, $72.80 for all of it. So six times 8.9 is 53.4, plus two times 9.7 is 19.4, this should be equal to 72.8, and it is. So we'd get 72.8 equals 72.8. So again, we've found that we have an answer that's consistent with our problem. So we know that each hosta has a price of $8.90, and each bunch of ornamental grass has a price of $9.70. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Applications of Linear Systems. All right, so we have a word problem here. So going down the river, a boat went nine miles per hour. Going up the river, it only went one mile per hour. Find the speed of the boat in still water along with the speed of the current. So if you've never seen a problem like this before, I need to explain a few things here. The first thing is that when we say we're going down the river, it means we're going with the current. So you can think about the current pushing on the boat and making it go faster. If you're going up the river, it means you're going against the current. You're fighting it, so you're gonna be going slower. Now, in these type of problems, we'll say that you have a speed for the boat in still water. So that's a speed if there was no current at all. And then you're gonna have a speed for the current. So the current is moving along at a certain speed. When you're going down the river, in order to get your speed, you're going to take the speed that the boat would go in still water, and you're going to add that to the speed of the current. So in other words, it would push on you and make you go faster by that amount. If you're going up the river and you're fighting the current, you would take the speed of the boat in still water, and then you would subtract away the speed of the current. We have two unknowns here. We have the speed of the boat in still water, and we have the speed of the current. So let's let x equal the speed of the boat in still water. And then we can say that y is going to be the speed of the current. And each of these is going to be in miles per hour. Okay, in miles per hour. Now since we have two variables here, we need to set up two equations. We're gonna set up a linear system. So let's go back up. So again, reading through this problem, we have going down the river, a boat went nine miles per hour. So I can make an equation out of that because X, which is the speed of the boat in still water, plus Y, which is the speed of the current. Remember, I'm adding the speed of the current because it's pushing on me, it's making me go faster. This is gonna be equal to nine. Remember, everything's in miles per hour. So the speed of the boat in still water in miles per hour is X. Then the speed of the current in miles per hour is Y. And if I sum these two amounts together, I get nine miles per hour, right? That's how fast I'm going when I'm traveling with the current or again, going down the river. All right, now going up the river, it only went one mile per hour. So now I have the speed of the boat in still water, which is X, and then I'm subtracting away the speed of the current because I'm fighting the current now. So I'm taking that away, so x minus y, and that's gonna be equal to one. And again, each is in miles per hour. So the speed of the boat in still water in miles per hour minus the speed of the current in miles per hour is gonna be equal to one mile per hour. So for this type of system, it looks like it's very easy to solve with elimination or substitution. Let's just go ahead and use elimination. So I'm gonna put a one here and a one here. So I realize I have opposite coefficients, right? I have plus one and minus one. Those two would cancel out. So if I add the two left sides together, x plus x is two x, y plus negative y would be zero, so this would be eliminated, 
and this would be equal to 9 plus 1, which is 10. Divide both sides of the equation by 2, and you get x is equal to 5. So remember, this is the speed of the boat in still water. So let's erase this real quick. And I can plug a 5 in for x in either of the original equations, find out what the value for y is. So let's plug it in there. So we'd have 5 plus y equals 9. Subtract 5 away from each side of the equation. And I'd have y is equal to 4. So that's the ordered pair 5 comma 4. And you can go ahead and check that in each original equation. Make sure that it works. And so you know that's the solution to the system. Now, we want to write a nice little sentence here and just say that the speed of the boat in still water was represented with x, so that's 5 miles per hour, while the speed of the current is 4 miles per hour. So let's check that real quick. Going down the river, a boat went 9 miles per hour. So again, that's with the current. So if the speed of the boat in still water is 5 miles per hour, and the speed of the current is 4 miles per hour, when you sum those two together, 5 plus 4 is 9. So that's consistent with the problem. Now going up the river, it only went 1 mile per hour. Now, if I'm going up the river, I'm fighting the current. So I'm going 5 miles per hour in still water. The current is 4 miles per hour. So 5 minus 4, I've got to subtract away what I'm fighting, would be 1. So that's also consistent with the problem. So we have the correct answer here. The boat is going to travel 5 miles per hour in still water. And the speed of the current is going to be 4 miles per hour. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Applications of Linear Systems. So Kristen's school is selling tickets to the annual talent show. On the first day of ticket sales, the school sold six senior tickets and two student tickets for a total of $100. The school took in $109 on the second day by selling five senior tickets and four student tickets. Find the price of a senior ticket and the price of a student ticket. All right, so the two questions we have to find the answer to, we have find the price of a senior ticket, so how much is a senior ticket, and also the price of a student ticket, so how much is a student ticket. So very easy to set this up. Let's let x equal the cost of one of them. So let's let x equal the cost, or you could say the price per senior ticket. And then we can have another variable like y be the cost per student ticket. Okay, so now if we go back through the problem, we have two scenarios of information that were given. So on the first day of ticket sales, the school sold six senior tickets and two student tickets for a total of $100. So that's enough to make an equation. So the cost per senior ticket is x. So if I sell six of them, the revenue from senior tickets would be 6x. Then we also sold two student tickets on that day. So the revenue from student tickets would be 2 times y. So I would sum 6x plus 2y. And this would give me the total amount of money that they took in that day. And it tells us that that amount of money is $100, so equals 100. So this is kind of the first scenario they gave us. Now the second piece of information they gave us is that the school took in $109 on the second day by selling five senior tickets and four student tickets. So we're going to do the same thing. So five senior tickets, so the revenue would be 5 times x, then plus four student tickets, so 4 times y, and now this equals 109. So we have our two equations that make up our system, and now we just want to solve it. So what method do you like to use? You can use elimination, you can use substitution. Let's go ahead and use substitution, because we've done elimination up to this point. So let's take this one, we're going to solve it for y. So we have 6x plus 2y equals 100. Subtract 6x away from each side of the equation. 
and I would have 2y is equal to negative 6x plus 100. Divide both sides of the equation by 2. And we'll have y is equal to negative 6 over 2 is negative 3. Then times x plus 100 over 2 is 50. So now remember with substitution, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in for y in the other equation. So I'm going to plug in right here. And this is what I'm going to plug in. So this is going in there. So we'd have 5x plus 4 times this quantity, that's what I'm plugging in for y, negative 3x plus 50. And this is equal to 109. So I'd have 5x plus, we have 4 times negative 3x, so that's minus 12x. And then 4 times 50 is 200, so plus 200. And this equals 109. So 5x minus 12x is negative 7x. And then plus 200. And again, this equals 109. So we'd subtract 200 away from each side of the equation. So that's going to cancel. And we'll have negative 7x is equal to 109 minus 200, which is going to be negative 91. So divide both sides of the equation by negative 7. And we're going to get x is equal to 13. But again, we're not done. We've got to plug 13 back into one of the original equations and find out what y is. And then we've got to answer this in a nice little sentence. All right, so we're going to plug a 13 in for x in one of the original equations. So let's do 6 times 13 plus 2y equals 100. 6 times 13 is 78. So I'll have 78 plus 2y equals 100. Subtract 78 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have 2y is equal to 100 minus 78 is going to be 22. Divide both sides of the equation by 2, and we get y is equal to 11. So x equals 13, y equals 11. And again, I'm not done. Remember, this is a word problem. I can't just put down x equals 13, y equals 11, and hand it in. So the ordered pair here is 13, 11. And again, to make sense of this, the cost per senior ticket was represented with x. So each senior ticket was $13. And each student ticket was $11. So is our answer in line with the information given in the problem? So again, Kristen's school is selling tickets to the annual talent show. On the first day of ticket sales, the school sold six senior tickets and two student tickets for a total of $100. Now again, we said that the senior tickets were 13 bucks a piece. So six times 13 is 78. So that means they would have gotten $78 from senior tickets. And then the student tickets were $11 each. So two student tickets times $11 each would have been $22. So if we sum these two amounts together, we do get $100. And that's the total that they say they got. So that part checks out. Now, the second piece of information we're given is that the school took in $109 on the second day by selling five senior tickets. Again, you'd have $13 per senior ticket. 5 times 13 is 65, so that's $65. And then four student tickets. So the student ticket is $11 a piece. So four times 11 is 44. So they made $65 from senior tickets and $44 from student tickets. If you sum these two amounts together, it should equal 109, and it does. So our answer is in line with the information given in the problem. Again, the cost of a senior ticket is $13, and the cost of a student ticket is $11. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on applications of linear systems. So a 40% fruit juice solution is going to be mixed with a 70% fruit juice solution to get 120 gallons of 50% fruit juice. How many gallons of each are needed? Well, you could solve this without using a system of equations. But since we're in that chapter, we're going to go ahead and just use a system. So the first thing I'm going to do is assign a variable to each of the unknowns. Now, I have the unknown, which is how many gallons of 40% fruit juice 
I'm going to use, and then how many gallons of 70% fruit juice I'm going to use. So again, let x equal the number of gallons of 40% fruit juice that will be used. So then y will be equal to the number of gallons of 70% fruit juice that will be used. All right, so let's set up two equations, right? We have two variables, so we're gonna set up two equations. So the first one would deal with the concentration. So 40% fruit juice is going to be mixed with 70% fruit juice to get, again, 120 gallons of 50% fruit juice. So what I know is that if I take 0.4, which is 40% as a decimal, and I multiply it times X, which is the number of gallons of 40% fruit juice that will be used, this would be the amount in gallons of pure fruit juice. Now, I'm gonna to add to this. I'm gonna do the same thing for this one. Instead of 70%, I'm gonna put 0.7, then times Y, and this is gonna be, again, the amount in gallons of pure fruit juice. So if I add those two amounts together, I should end up with the amount in gallons of pure fruit juice in my end mixture, right? Because that's where it came from. It came from these two inputs. So the final mixture is 120 gallons and it's 50% fruit juice. So 120 times 0.5, which we all know is 60. So you could leave it like that or you could just put 60. because you know, that's what it's going to be. And that's one of our equations. So we have 0.4x plus 0.7y equals 60. So in each case, it's just the amount in gallons of pure fruit juice for here here and then this is going to be the same thing because these two are gonna to have to sum to this, right? Because that's where the pure fruit juice came from, those two inputs. All right, so what's the other equation we can create? Remember, if we have two variables, we need two equations. So another thing you can say is that since we're talking about gallons, we have this first mixture that's X gallons. Okay, we don't know how many it's gonna be yet. We have a second mixture that's Y gallons. I don't know how much that's gonna be. We do know that they're gonna to sum to 120 gallons. So we know that X plus Y is gonna be equal to 120. So now we have our two equations with two unknowns. We have a system, and so we can solve it. So we have 0.4X plus 0.7Y equals 60. And if I want, I can multiply both sides of the equation by 10 and clear the decimals. So I would just move everything to the right, and this would be 600, right? So instead of 0.4, I get four. Instead of 0.7, I get 7. And instead of 60, I get 600. Right? I just multiply both sides of the equation by 10. And then the other equation is x plus y equals 120. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use substitution because I have x and I have y that both contain a coefficient of 1. So let's solve this one for y. So that would just be y equals, I would subtract x away from each side of the equation. So negative x plus 120. So now we would plug this in for y in the other equation. So you would have 4x plus 7 times, instead of y, I'd plug in negative x plus 120. This should equal 600. So I'll have 4x, and then 7 times negative x is negative 7x, so minus 7x. And then plus 7 times 120, that's 840. And this equals 600. So let's subtract 840 away from each side of the equation. So that's gone. And 4x minus 7x would be negative 3x. So negative 3x is equal to 600 minus 840 is negative 240. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 3. And this is going to cancel, and you'll get x is equal to negative 240 over negative 3 is 80. So again, x equals 80. And you can plug this into any of the original equations. This one's a little easier to work with, so plug in an 80 there, you'd have 80 plus y equals 120. You can eyeball that and see that y is 40, but let's go through the official procedure. So 80 plus y equals 120. Subtract 80 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. I'll have y is equal to 40. 
So again, as an ordered pair, that's 80 comma 40. So let's see if this is consistent with what's given to us in the problem. So a 40% fruit juice solution is going to be mixed with a 70% fruit juice solution to get 120 gallons of 50% fruit juice. So we know that the gallons add up. We have 80 gallons that's coming from the 40% fruit juice solution, and we have 40 gallons that's coming from the 70% fruit juice solution. So that adds up to 120 gallons. That's good to go. Now, in the end, I'm going to have 120 gallons that's 50% fruit juice. So I'll have 60 gallons of pure fruit juice. Now, that comes from the 40% fruit juice solution, and I'm using 80 gallons of that. So 80 times 0.4 is 32. So I get 32 gallons, again, of pure fruit juice. And then I add to that the amount of pure fruit juice I'm getting from this 70% fruit juice solution. And I'm using 40 gallons of that. And 40 times 0.7 would be 28, so plus 28 gallons. So if I take 32 gallons and I add 28 gallons to that, would I get 60 gallons? Well, yes, you would. 32 plus 28 is 60. So we see that our answer is consistent with what's given to us in the problem. Now, one more thing I want to address. A lot of you will say, well, you could have solved this problem without using a system. And I talked about that in the beginning. Remember, you can do this pretty easily by just letting x equal one of these. So you could say x is equal to the number of gallons of the 40% fruit juice used. So then we know that the total mixture is 120 gallons. So you could just say 120 minus X would be the number of gallons of 70% fruit juice used. And then you can set up a nice little equation. So let's go through and do that. So this is equal to the number of gallons of 70% fruit juice used. And so you could set up a, an equation that relates the concentration. So again, it would be 0.4 times x plus you'd have 0.7 times this quantity 120 minus x. And this should be equal to, again, 120 gallons is the end mixture and it's 0.5 or 50% fruit juice. So 0.5 times 120. You're relating the concentration. Again, this is pure fruit juice, pure fruit juice. And when you sum these two amounts together, you've got to get the pure fruit juice that's in the end mixture. So this would be 60. So you get 0.4x plus 0.7 times 120 is 84. And then minus 0.7 times x is 0.7x. And this equals 60. So then 0.4x minus 0.7x would be negative 0.3x. And I could subtract 84 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. You'll have equals negative 24 over here. Divide both sides by negative 0.3. That's going to cancel. And you'll get x is equal to 80. So we end up getting the same answer, just using a different method. So in this particular problem, you don't need to use a system we just used one because we're in this chapter on systems of linear equations. And again, x was the number of gallons of 40% fruit juice used. 80 gallons is what we found. We found 80 gallons before. 120 minus x, 120 minus 80 is 40. That's the number of gallons of 70% fruit juice used. Again, that's what we found before using our system of equations. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Applications of Linear Systems. All right, so two trains which are 420 miles apart travel towards each other. They meet each other after 3.5 hours. What is the average speed of each train if one is moving 30 miles per hour slower than the other? So I want you to recall that distance is equal to rate of speed times the amount of time traveled. So distance is equal to rate multiplied by time. So if I'm in a car and I'm going 30 miles per hour and I do this for four hours, my distance is 120 miles. I just multiply 30 times four is 120. Thinking about this, we need to first set up 
two variables to represent our two unknowns. We have the speed of the faster train in miles per hour, and then we have the speed of the slower train in miles per hour. So let's let x, let's let x equal the speed of the faster train. And this is in miles per hour. And then y can be equal to the speed of the slower train. Again, that's in miles per hour. Let's go back through the problem and see if we can set up some equations. So we have two trains which are 420 miles apart travel towards each other. They meet each other after 3.5 hours. Again, now the question is, what is the average speed of each train if one is moving 30 miles per hour slower than the other? So we know that the time for each train to travel is 3.5. So that's an important piece of information. So let me kind of make a little table here. Let me scoot this over just a little bit. And we have the slower train, which I'm going to put S period, T period. And then we have the faster train, which I'm going to put F period, T period. Now, the rate of speed for the faster train, we represented with X. The rate of speed for the slower train, we represented with Y. And the time that each one's going to travel is 3.5 hours. It tells us that in the problem. What about the distance? Well, remember, if I have a rate of speed and I have a time, I have a distance. All I have to do is multiply these two together. So the distance for the slower train is 3.5 times y. The distance for the faster train is 3.5 times x. Now, here's one thing that you might not have picked up on. The first equation we're going to write has to do with the total distance they both travel. So two trains which are 420 miles apart travel towards each other. They meet each other after 3.5 hours. So that means that the sum of their distances would be 420 miles. So we can use that to write our first equation. So I can say that the slower train's distance, which is 3.5y, plus the faster train's distance, which is 3.5x, this would sum to 420. Right? You can leave the miles off. Now we have two unknowns, so we need two equations to solve. Well, another piece of information we're given is that the slower train is moving 30 miles per hour slower than the faster train. So I can relate the speeds and make another equation. So x is the speed of the faster train, and x is going to be equal to y, which is the speed of the slower train, plus 30. Or you could have also written, you could have also written that y, the speed of the slower train, is equal to x minus 30, right? Either of those would be the same. And you can easily say, okay, add 30 to both sides of the equation, and I'm back to what I just had. I'd have x equals x equals y plus 30, right? Those are the two different ways to kind of set that up. So it would be really easy for me to use substitution here. And if you want, you can go ahead and clear the decimals from this equation before you start. What I do is multiply both sides by 10. And when I do that, this would move over one place to the right, this would move over one place to the right, and this would move over one place to the right, so I'd put a zero at the end. So I'd get 35y plus 35x equals 4,200. Now, this equation is already solved for x, so I'm just gonna plug in a y plus 30 in for x in the other equation. So I'd have 35y plus 35 times this quantity, y plus 30, is equal to 4,200. So 35y plus 35 times y is 35y, plus 35 times 30 is 1,050. This equals 4,200. So 35y plus 35y is 70y, and then plus 1,050, and again, this equals 4,200. So then subtract 1,050 away from each side of the equation. That's gone. We're going to have 70y is equal to 4,200 minus 1,050 is 3,150. Divide both sides of the equation by 70, and you get y is equal to 
45. So we're going to go back and plug in a 45 for y in one of the original equations. And remember, originally this was 3.5y plus 3.5x equals 420. If you feel comfortable with your work, you can leave it the other way. You just transformed it. It's, it's got the same solution, so it's, it's okay if you use that as long as you didn't make a mistake. So now take 45. It's easier to just plug it in here. You get x equals 45 plus 30. That will give you 75. So x is going to equal 75. So what does that tell us as far as our answer? Well, again, x is the speed of the faster train, and x is 75. And again, that's 75 miles per hour. Y is the speed of the slower train, and y is equal to 45. So the faster train traveled at 75 miles per hour, while the slower train traveled at 45 miles per hour. So is that consistent with the information given to us in the problem? Well, the first thing is let's check the distance. 75 times 3.5, so in other words, the faster train's going 75 miles per hour for 3.5 hours, that's 262.5 miles that it's gonna travel. Now the other train is slower, it travels 45 miles per hour for 3.5 hours, so it's gonna travel 157.5 miles. So the sum here should be 420. And it is. If you sum these two amounts, you get 420. That would be the sum of their individual distances. Remember, they started out 420 miles apart. So one of them goes this way and it travels, let's say the faster train, 262.5 miles. And let's say this is the meeting point. And the other one doesn't travel as far. This person only travels 157.5 miles. But again, if you sum the distances, you get a total distance here of 420 miles. So that part checks out. Now, the other piece of information we want to look at is that one is moving 30 miles per hour slower than the other. Yeah, we said that one, the faster train, was going 75 miles per hour, and then the other the slower train was going 45 miles per hour. Well, 45 miles per hour is 30 miles per hour slower than 75 miles per hour. So that's also consistent with the information given in the problem. And so we have the correct answer here. The faster train goes at an average speed of 75 miles per hour, and the slower train travels at an average speed of 45 miles per hour. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on Applications of Linear Systems. All right, so Farmer Bill's Produce Stand sells 20-pound bags of mixed nuts that contain 48% peanuts. So to make his product, he combines Crazy's Mixed Nuts, which contain 60% peanuts, and Clyde's Mixed Nuts, which contain 30% peanuts. How much of each does he need to use? So specifically, we're being asked how much, in terms of pounds, of Crazy's Mixed Nuts is he going to use? And how much, in terms of pounds, of Clyde's mixed nuts is he going to use? So let's let a variable like x equal one of those. And let's let another variable like y equal the other. So let's let x be equal to the amount in pounds of crazies mixed nuts used. And then we can say y is equal, again, to the amount in pounds of, in this case, it's going to be Clyde's mixed nuts used. So we have two unknowns, so we're going to need two equations to get a solution. And the first one can be really easy to set up. We know that the produce stand sells 20 pound bags. So what that tells me is that kind of an easy one to do would be X, which is the amount in pounds of Crazy's Mixed Nuts used, plus Y, 
which is the amount in pounds of Clyde's mixed nuts used, has to be equal to 20, right? Because I don't get anything from anywhere else. These are the two inputs in the final mixture. So the amount in pounds from Crazy's plus the amount in pounds from Clyde's has to equal 20. Now the other equation we can make based on concentration. So we know the end result is a 20 pound bag that's 48% peanuts. So it's a 20 pound bag and it's 48% peanuts. So as a decimal, that's 0.48. So if I multiply these two together, I get 9.6. So there's 9.6 pounds of peanuts. So this is pounds of peanuts in the final mixture. So this is equal to the amount of peanuts that comes from the crazy mixed nuts used plus the amount of peanuts that comes from the Clyde's mixed nuts used. We know Crazy's mixed nuts contain 60% peanuts and Clyde's mixed nuts contain 30% peanuts. So if I take 0 0.60 or 0.6 and I multiply it by X, this gives me pounds of peanuts. Same thing as I get over here in the end. And then I'm gonna add to that, I'm gonna do the same thing for Clyde's mixed nuts. So the concentration there is 30%, so 0.3 and then again times y. And so also this is pounds of peanuts. So I have pounds of peanuts that I'm getting from Crazy's Mixed Nuts plus pounds of peanuts that I'm getting from Clyde's Mixed Nuts. If I sum those amounts together, I get the pounds of peanuts that are in the final mixture. So here's our two equations, and I can just erase this now, I don't need it anymore. And feel free to multiply both sides of the equation by 10 to clear the decimals, and that will give me 96 is equal to, instead of 0.6x, you'd have 6x. And instead of 0.3y, you'd have 3y, so plus 3y. And again, all I did was multiply both sides of the equation by 10. So I have an ideal situation to use substitution. So I'm gonna solve this first equation for either x or y. Let's go ahead and just solve it for y. So if I have x plus y equals 20, and I solve it for y, just subtract x away from each side of the equation, and I'll have y is equal to negative x plus 20. And so I'm gonna plug this in for y in this other equation. So I'm gonna have 96 equals 6x plus, we have three times, in place of y, I'm gonna put this quantity, negative x plus 20. And so I'll have 96 equals, 6x plus, 3 times negative x is negative 3x, so I can put minus 3x. And then 3 times 20 is 60, so plus 60. So then 6x minus 3x is 3x, so this equals 3x plus 60, and this is 96 over here. So now subtract 60 away from each side of the equation, that's gone. 96 minus 60 is 36, so you get 36 equals 3x, divide both sides of the equation by 3, and you get 12 is equal to x. All right, so x equals 12, and I can plug that back into one of the original equations. And again, you had an original equation here with decimals, so 9.6 equals 0.6x plus 0.3y. Now, if you're comfortable with what you did in transforming the equation, you can keep it decimal free. It's all right, just as long as you didn't make a mistake there, because if you made a mistake, you're not gonna end up with the right answer for the problem. So if you don't really trust yourself, go back and do the original equations. All right, so x equals 12. I'm just gonna plug it into this one. I know this one's completely original. So we'd have 12 plus y equals 20. And of course, we can eyeball that and see y would be eight, but we'd subtract 12 away from each side of the equation. You'd have y is equal to 20 minus 12 is eight. So as an ordered pair, you'd have 12 comma eight. And again, to make sense of this, because it's a word problem, X is the amount in pounds of crazy mixed nuts used. So that means that he will use 12 pounds of crazy or crazies mixed nuts with, why is the amount in pounds of Clyde's mixed nuts used? So with eight pounds 
of Clyde's mixed dots. So again, you reread through the problem and make sure that your answer is consistent. So Farmer Bill's produce stand sells 20 pound bags of mixed nuts that contain 48% peanuts. So we said that he's getting 12 pounds from Crazy's mixed nuts and eight pounds from Clyde's mixed nuts. So 12 plus eight is 20. So that part checks out where he's got a 20 pound bag. Now it's 48% peanuts. Now we already know that 20 times 0.48 is 9.6. So there should be 9.6 pounds of peanuts in that final mixture or in the bag that he sells. So to make his product, again, he combines Crazy's Mixed Nuts, which contains 60% peanuts. So that one is, we're using 12 pounds and 60% of his peanuts. So that's 7.2 pounds of peanuts. So there's 7.2 pounds of peanuts. And then he's also using Clyde's Mixed Nuts, which we're using eight pounds of that. And that one's 30% peanuts. So eight times 0.3 would be 2.4. So this would be 2.4 pounds of peanuts. So yeah, that's consistent with our problem. If you take the pounds of peanuts that you get from Crazy's Mixed Nuts, which is 7.2, and you add that to the pounds of peanuts that we get from Clyde's Mixed Nuts, which is 2.4, you would in fact get 9.6 pounds of peanuts in the end mixture. So again, our answer is that this guy is going to use 12 pounds of Crazy's Mixed Nuts along with 8 pounds of Clyde's Mixed Nuts to get his final mixture, which is a 20-pound bag of Mixed Nuts that is 48% peanuts. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 25. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving systems of linear inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. And we're going to start out with 8x plus 3y is less than negative 3. And then also we have 2x plus 3y is less than 15. So what you want to do is graph each inequality separately, and then just look for the region of the coordinate plane where the two graphs overlap. So the easiest way to graph a linear inequality in two variables is just to solve it for y. So let's solve each for y here to start. So 8x plus 3y is less than negative 3. I would subtract 8x away from each side of the inequality. So that's gone. I'll have 3y is less than, we have negative 8x minus 3. And then I'm going to divide both sides of the inequality by 3. So this is going to end up being y is less than negative 8 thirds times x minus 3 over 3 is 1. And we'll take this down to the coordinate plane and graph it in a minute. Let's just solve this one for y first. So I'll just go ahead and subtract 2x away from each side of the inequality. That would cancel. I'd have 3y is less than negative 2x plus 15. Go ahead and divide both sides of the inequality by 3. And you'll get y is less than negative 2 thirds times x plus 15 over 3 is 5. All right, so let's take this down to the coordinate plane. Okay, so we have y is less than negative 8 thirds x minus 1. And let's go ahead and just graph that one first. So the first thing you want to do is graph the boundary line. So the way you do that is you just replace your inequality symbol with equals. So you would graph the line y equals negative 8 thirds x minus 1. Now, when you graph that guy, you want either a solid line if you're working with a non-strict inequality, so meaning you have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, or you want a broken or a dashed line if you have a strict inequality, which is what we have here, right? This is a strictly less than. So this will be a dashed line. So let's go ahead and graph it. We have a y-intercept that occurs at 0, comma, negative 1. And the slope is negative 8 thirds. Let me kind of scroll over. That'll be off the screen. So for negative 8 thirds, I would go down 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then I would go to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. So there's a point. And then I could also rise 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And to the left 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so remember, this is supposed to be a broken up line. So I'm going to take my eraser and kind of 
break it up, make it look dashed. And this tells us that the points on this line are not part of the solution. Now, if I look at my inequality, it's y is less than negative 8 thirds x minus 1. So for a less than or a less than or equal to, I want to shade below the line. So if we come back over to the coordinate plane, I'm going to shade below the line, so that means I'm shading this way. All right, so there's 8x plus 3y is less than negative 3, or as we worked with it as y is less than negative 8 thirds x minus 1. Okay, for the next inequality of the system, we have y is less than negative 2 thirds x plus 5. So let me kind of erase this. I don't need it anymore. So for this one, again, just replace your inequality symbol with equals and graph that line. So y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 5. And again, it's a strict inequality, so it's going to be a broken or dashed line. So my y-intercept occurs at 0, 5, so that's going to be right here. And then the slope is negative 2 thirds, so down 1, 2 to the right, 1, 2, 3. Down 1, 2 to the right, 1, 2, 3. Again, it's a broken up line, so let me take this and erase some stuff, make it look like it's dashed. And again, we do this because the points on that line are not part of the solution. All right, so the next thing is that this is also a less than. Y is less than negative 2 thirds X plus 5. So we would shade below the line. So I would shade below the line. So you have a pretty large area of overlap. And a lot of times with a graph, it's kind of hard to see where it actually is. But you can see anything right here and then going down this way, anything below that would be the overlap of the two graphs. So all of this area. And stuff like this, inside this area that's still white, it's part of the solution for one of them, but not both. So kind of this area right here is excluded from the solution for the system. So is this area up here. So if it's a solution region for one of them, but not both, it's not a solution for the system. And again, I tried to do the best I could. I went over the line in a few areas, but just pretend that I didn't. So anywhere where the two graphs overlap is a solution for your system. All right, for the next one, let's take a look at 3x plus 5y is less than negative 5. And then y is greater than negative 3 fifths x plus 6. So again, I like to solve these for y to start. This one's already solved for y, so I don't need to do anything there. For this one, let's just bring it over here and just solve it for y. So 3x plus 5y is less than negative 5. So let's subtract 3x away from each side of the inequality. So that's gone. I'll have 5y is less than negative 3x minus 5. We'll divide both sides of the inequality by 5. So that's going to cancel. And up here, I'm just going to write, we'll have y is less than negative 3 fifths x, and then minus 5 over 5, so minus 1. So let's go ahead and graph this. So y is less than negative 3 fifths x minus 1. So to graph the boundary line, we need to replace this with equals. So you'd have y equals negative 3 fifths x minus 1. And so the y-intercept occurs at 0, negative 1. The slope is negative 3 fifths, so down 1, 2, 3, to the right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Where I could go up 1, 2, 3, to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. And then remember, this is a strict inequality. So when I have a strict inequality, I want a broken or dashed line. So I'm going to use my eraser and break this up. So basically, the points on this line are not part of your solution. And then this is a less than, so I want to shade below the line. So I'm going to shade going this way. 
everything below the line. Okay. Now let's look at the other one. So we had y is greater than negative 3 fifths x plus 6. So y is greater than negative 3 fifths x plus 6. Again, to graph that boundary line, we want y equals negative 3 fifths x plus 6. Now I want you to notice something. Your slope here and here is the same. Remember, when you have two lines with the same slope and different y-intercepts, you have parallel lines. So we know our boundary lines here are parallel. So if that occurs, there's a chance that you won't have a solution. With a system of linear equations, you won't have a solution for sure. But with a system of linear inequalities, it doesn't mean that you won't have a solution. It means that it's possible you won't have a solution. And so I'll explain that more in a second. So let's go ahead and graph this guy. So the y-intercept's gonna occur at zero comma six. That's right there. And again, the slope is negative three-fifths. So down one, two, three, to the right, one, two, three, four, five. Or I could go up one, two, three, to the left, one, two, three, four, five. And again, this is a strict inequality. So we want a broken or dashed line. So I'm gonna go back and just kind of break this up with my eraser. Okay. So again, points on this line are not part of the solution. Now, this is a greater than. Y is greater than. So that means I shade above the line. So, uh-oh, there's going to be a problem, right? There's not going to be an overlap. So there's no solution here. Now, if this would have been a less than, and I would have shaded below the line, there would have been an overlap. It would have been anything that lied below this line because this would have kept coming down and down and down. So once it passed over this line, which is not part of the solution, then it would have crossed into an area where it's a solution for both. So when you have two parallel boundary lines, it's not necessarily true that you're not gonna have a solution, but there's the possibility for it like we have here. Here we don't have any area of overlap. This solution goes up this way. This solution goes down this way. So there's never going to be an overlap on this coordinate plane. And so for this particular one, there is no solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on solving systems of linear inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. And we're going to look at x plus 3y is less than or equal to 6, and x minus y is less than or equal to 2. So what I like to do is I like to solve each inequality for y. That makes it much easier for me to graph. I don't have to worry about any test points or anything like that. So let's go ahead and just solve this one for y to start. So we'd have x plus 3y is less than or equal to 6. And I want to subtract x away from each side of the inequality. This is going to give me 3y is less than or equal to negative x plus 6. And then I would divide both sides of the inequality by 3. So that's going to give me, this will cancel, I'll have just y, and then is less than or equal to, then negative x over 3, I could write that as negative 1 third x, and then plus 6 over 3, which is 2, so plus 2. All right, for this other one, to solve it for y, I would subtract x away from each side of the inequality. So that would cancel. I'd have negative y is less than or equal to negative x plus 2. Now I'm going to divide both sides of the inequality by negative 1. And remember, when I do that, I've got to flip the direction. So instead of this being a less than or equal to, it's going to be a greater than or equal to. So negative y over negative 1 is y. And this is greater than or equal to negative x over negative 1 is just x. And then 2 over negative 1 is negative 2. So this is y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. All right, so let's take these two guys down to the coordinate plane. All right, so remember, we start out by graphing the boundary line. So I'm going to start out with this guy right here. So to graph the boundary line, all I need to do is replace the inequality symbol with an equals. So I would have y equals negative 1 third x plus 2. Now, your boundary line is going to be a solid line if you have a non-strict inequality, like we have here, this is less than or equal to, or you'd have a dashed line if you had a strict inequality. But again, because we have a non-strict inequality, 
this is going to be a solid line and that tells us that the line is part of the solution. So y equals negative one third x plus two. So my y intercept occurs at zero comma two. So that's right there. And a slope of negative one third. So I would go down one and to the right one, two, three. There's a point. Down one to the right one, two, three. There's another point. Or I could go up one and to the left one, two, three. So there's a point. This inequality is a less than or equal to. If I have y is less than or y is less than or equal to, that just tells me I want to shade below the line. So the solution for this inequality would be shading below this line. These would be all the points that satisfy that inequality. And remember, because we have a solid line, that's part of our solution. Now, let's take a look at the next one. We have y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. Again, to do the boundary line, let me highlight this in a different color. To do the boundary line, you replace the inequality symbol with equals. So you'd have y is equal to x minus 2. And again, this is going to be a solid boundary line because it's, again, a non-strict inequality. So for y equals x minus 2, the y-intercept occurs at 0, comma, negative 2, which is right here. And the slope is 1. So I would go up one to the right one, 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 up one to the right one. That should be enough points. Okay, so now this is y is greater than or equal to, so we want to shade above the line. So let me choose a different color, and we're going to shade everything going above the line. Now, the solution for the system would be where the two graphs overlap. So I'm going to highlight that for you. It's kind of easy to find. It's going to be this section of the coordinate plane. And I know I'm not going to get perfectly inside the lines there, but you can see where I'm highlighting. This area right here. So this highlighted area is the region of the coordinate plane that satisfies both inequalities. Our x plus 3y is less than or equal to 6, and x minus y is less than or equal to 2. So this is the solution for the system. Again, it's where the graphs overlap. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on Solving Systems of Linear Inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. And we're going to look at x is greater than negative 1, and x minus y is less than or equal to 2. So this first one is very easy to graph. So I'm going to leave that one alone for right now. The second one, I want to solve it for y. I want to solve it for y to make it easy on myself to graph, and then figure out where the solution region is. So I'm going to subtract x away from both sides of the inequality, and I'm going to have negative y is less than or equal to negative x plus 2. Now I want to divide both sides of the inequality by negative 1. And what's going to happen is I'm going to have y. Because I divided by a negative, I've got to flip the direction of the inequality. Right now I have a less than or equal to. So if I change it, it's going to be a greater than or equal to. I just flip that inequality sign around. So then I have a negative x over a negative 1. That's just x. And then 2 over negative 1 is negative 2, so minus 2. So when I solve this for y, I get y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. All right, so let's take these two down to the coordinate plane. All right, so again, we have x is greater than negative 1, and we have y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. So the first thing I want to do is graph the boundary line. So to graph a boundary line, you replace the inequality symbol with equals. So for this one, it would be x equals negative 1. Now, your boundary line can be a solid line or it can be a dashed line. In this particular case, because we have a strict inequality, we want a dashed line, right? It's strictly greater than. And what that's telling us is that points on that line are not part of the solution. 
So to graph x equals negative 1, I just find negative 1 on the x-axis, and I draw a vertical line. And sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll draw a solid line and use an eraser to break it up. It doesn't actually matter. As long as you show your teacher or whoever's grading your test that you have a line that's kind of broken up or dashed, you're just saying that it's not part of the solution. Now, as far as shading goes, if x is greater than negative 1, that means we want to shade to the right. When we think about the x-axis, remember that's the horizontal axis, values increase moving to the right. So if we're saying that to satisfy this inequality, it has to be a value that's greater than negative 1, well, that occurs as we go to the right of negative 1. So I would shade this way, where the x values are greater than negative 1. Okay, so that's your solution for x is greater than negative 1. Now, the other inequality of the system, we have y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. So now you have a non-strict inequality. So when I draw my boundary line here, it's going to be a solid line because points on that line will satisfy the inequality. So to graph y equals x minus 2, my y-intercept occurs at 0, comma negative 2, which is right here, and my slope is 1. So I would go up 1 to the right 1, up 1 to the right 1, up 1 to the right 1, or I could go down 1 to the left 1, down 1 to the left 1, So when it's solved for y and you have a greater than or a greater than or equal to, that means you shade above the line. So I'm just going to go ahead and shade this way, above the line. Okay. Now for the solution for the system, you're looking for the area of the coordinate plane that satisfies both. So starting kind of right here and going down, and then this line's not included because remember the line doesn't satisfy that first inequality that we looked at. But then this line is, so then this line would be included. And I know it went over a little bit. So you're thinking about this area of the graph here. And although I'm highlighting only a section, remember this would continue forever and ever and ever. Although it's only part of the coordinate plane, numbers continue forever, so you would have an infinite area. Okay. So I've highlighted the best that I can the parts where the two graphs overlap. And that would be the solution for the system, right? It's the part where x is greater than negative 1 and also y is greater than or equal to x minus 2. So the area that I've highlighted, and again, I went over in a few areas, but again, just pretend that I didn't. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on solving systems of linear inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. We're going to take a look at x minus 2y is greater than 4, and also 2x minus 4y is greater than negative 8. So to make it easier myself, I like to solve each inequality for y. That's the quickest way for me to graph each of these. So let's bring this down here. And I have x minus 2y is greater than 4. I would subtract x away from each side of the inequality. So that would cancel. I'd have negative 2y is greater than negative x plus 4. Then I would divide both sides of the inequality by negative 2. Remember, because I'm dealing with dividing by a negative, I need to flip the direction of my inequality. So right now, this is a greater than inequality. If I flip that, then it would be a less than inequality. So this symbol here becomes a less than. All right, so now I have y is less than negative x over negative 2. We could write as 1 half x. And then 4 over negative 2 is minus 2. So I'm going to write over here that this is y is less than 1 half x minus 2. All right, for the next one, again, I want to solve for y. So I have 2x minus 4y is greater than negative 8. I will subtract 2x away from each side of the inequality. 
that's gone, I'll have negative 4y is greater than negative 2x minus 8. And I'm going to divide both sides of the inequality by negative 4. And again, because I'm dividing by a negative, I've got to flip the direction of my inequality. Right now, it's a greater than. If I kind of flip the direction, it's going to be a less than. Right, so this symbol is a greater than, goes to a less than. So I have y is less than, negative 2 over negative 4 is 1 half, and times x, negative 8 over negative 4 is positive 2, so plus 2. So I get y is less than 1 half x plus 2. Now, some of you at this point will already see that there's a potential problem. Let me erase this real quick. Now we're dealing with inequalities, so it's a bit different. But if these were equations and we had a system, we know that we wouldn't have a solution, right? And the reason for that is if I made each of these, again, equations, let's say these were equal to, well, I'd have two parallel lines, same slope, different y-intercepts, there'd be no point of intersection. Now, when you're working with inequalities and you have parallel boundary lines, you might get a solution and you might not. So you have to go through and work the problem. You can't just rule it out and say, okay, I have no solution. So let's take this down to the coordinate plane. So the first one we're going to graph, we have y is less than 1 half x minus 2. So remember, to graph this, the first thing I want to do is graph the boundary line. So I would graph y equals 1 half x minus 2. And this is a strict inequality, so this is going to be a dashed line. So I would find 0 comma negative 2 on my coordinate plane, that's right here. And the slope is 1 half, so I'd go up 1 to the right 2 up one to the right two, up one to the right two, up one to the right two, or I could go down one to the left two. And again, remember this was supposed to be a broken up line. So I'm gonna take my eraser and break it up so it looks dashed. And the reason we do that is we're just showing that points on this line are not part of the solution. Okay, now here comes the easy part, the reason we solve it for y. This is a less than here. If I have y is less than, that means I just shade below the line. So I would shade everything going this way. For the next one, we have y is less than 1 half x plus 2. So I would graph the boundary line y equals 1 half x plus 2. And again, it's going to be a dashed line because I have a strict inequality. So I'd find 0 comma 2 on the coordinate plane. It's right here. And again, I have a slope of 1 half. So up 1 to the right 2. Up 1 to the right 2. Up 1 to the right 2. Or down 1 to the left 2. Down 1 to the left 2. Okay, let me take my eraser and just break this up again. Looking at this, I have y is less than 1 half x plus 2. So the less than means I shade below the line. So I will, in fact, have a solution for the system here. If this had been y is greater than, and I'm shading above the line, there'd be no solution because you'd have below the line here, you'd have above the line here, there'd be no point of intersection anywhere in that coordinate plane. So in that particular case, no solution. In this case, you do have a solution. So let me highlight this in a different color blue. So I'm gonna shade everything below this line because it's a less than. Easy to see that the solution for the system here is actually just the solution for the first inequality. Y is less than 1 half X minus 2. Because any points in the solution region here also satisfy this inequality here. So that would satisfy both. So starting here, but not including that line. Remember, it's a non-strict inequality, so the line's not included. And then basically everywhere underneath. Everywhere underneath.
And I do the best I can with highlighting. I know I went over the line in a few places, but anywhere below that green line is going to be a solution for the system. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Solving Systems of Linear Inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. All right, so we have x plus y is greater than 3, and then we have x plus y is less than negative 2. So let's solve each one for y here. So for this one, again, I have x plus y is greater than 3. I would just subtract x away from each side of the inequality, and I'll get y is greater than negative x plus 3. So y is greater than negative x plus 3. For the next one, I could just subtract x away from each side, and I would have y is less than negative x minus 2. So there's each solved for y. Now one thing you might notice immediately, if we had equations here, I know we have inequalities, but if we had equations here, these would be parallel lines, right? Because the slopes are the same in different y-intercepts. So that could cause a problem if we're looking for a solution for a system. Not necessarily. If we had a system of linear equations and we had two parallel lines, we wouldn't have a solution for sure. But in the case of a system of linear inequalities, it's not necessarily true. We have to go through and graph it to see where we're at. All right, so let's start out by graphing y is greater than negative x plus 3. So again, I would take this and I would replace the inequality symbol with equals. So I would have y equals negative x plus 3. So then my y-intercept would occur at 0 comma 3. So that's right here. And my slope is negative 1. So I would go down one to the right one, down one to the right one, down one to the right one, or I could go up one to the left one, up one to the left one. All right, so remember when I graph my boundary line, I have two scenarios. I have a broken or dashed line for strict inequality, or then I have a solid line for a non-strict inequality. In this case, I have a strict inequality, so I want to have a broken or dashed line. I'm going to take my eraser and break this up a little bit. And again, the reason we do this is to show that this line is not part of the solution. So points on this line will not satisfy your inequality. All right, now y is greater than negative x plus 3. So when y is greater than or greater than or equal to, we shade above the line. So I would shade this way. Okay, now for the next one, we want to look at y is less than negative x minus 2. So again, I'll replace that less than with equals. So y is equal to negative x minus 2. And I graph that line. And remember, this is a strict inequality. So again, it's going to be a dashed line. So I'd find 0, comma, negative 2 on the coordinate plane. That's right here. And my slope again is negative 1. So I'd go down 1 to the right one. Down 1 to the right one. Down 1 to the right one. Or I could go down 1, 2 to the right 1, 2. Or I could go up 1, 2 to the left 1, 2. Up 1, 2 to the left 1, 2. Okay, so let me take an eraser and break this up. So when y is less than or when y is less than or equal to, we shade below the line. So we shade going this way. And we can see we have a problem. So there's no overlap between the two graphs, meaning there's no area of the coordinate plane that satisfies both inequalities. So for this particular situation, there's no solution. So again, when you have two inequalities that are going to have boundary lines that are parallel to each other, you might have a solution and you might not have a solution. In this particular case, there's no solution. And the problem we looked at in the last video, in section three, we had parallel boundary lines, but then we had a solution. 
So in other words, if I had one of these, let's say this second one, let's say this y is less than negative x minus two, let's say this was a greater than, let's say it was y is greater than negative x minus two, you would have had a solution because this would have been shading up and then anywhere that was past this blue line would have been a solution for the system because it would have worked for both. But because we have a less than here, we shade below the green line and we end up not having a solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on Solving Systems of Linear Inequalities. All right, so we want to graph the solution set for each system of linear inequalities. And we have x minus 2y is greater than 2. And then x minus 2y is less than or equal to 6. So I like to solve each one for y. So let's start out with this one right here. We have x minus 2y is greater than 2. I would subtract x away from each side of the inequality. That's gone. I'll have negative 2y is greater than negative x plus 2. Divide both sides of the inequality by negative 2. And of course, when I divide an inequality by a negative, I've got to flip the direction of the inequality. So this symbol right now is telling me that I have a greater than. So if I flip the direction of it, I would have a less than, right? So this inequality is now a less than. So we have y is less than, so negative x over negative two is one half x, and then two over negative two is minus one. So this is going to be y is less than one half x minus one. All right, for the next one, we have x minus two y, is less than or equal to six. So again, I can solve this for y. I can subtract x away from each side. That's gone. I'll have negative two y is less than or equal to negative x plus six. Now I wanna divide both sides of the inequality by negative two. That's gonna cancel. I'll have y. And then remember, I've gotta flip the direction of my inequality. Right now, this inequality is a less than or equal to so I'm gonna change this to a greater than or equal to inequality. So that symbol just gets flipped. So then negative x over negative two again is one half x. And then six over negative two is minus three. So we have y is greater than or equal to one half x minus three. So again, we've seen this in the previous two problems. When we go to graph our boundary lines, we have parallel lines. So parallel boundary lines tell us that we have the potential for no solution. It doesn't mean that we will, but just the potential for it. So let's take this down to the coordinate plane and see what's going on. All right, so for y is less than 1 half x minus one, let's drag this guy down here and put y equals 1 half x minus one, so we can draw our boundary line. Now this is a strict inequality, so this is gonna be a dashed boundary line. And so I'd graph y equals 1 half x minus one. The y-intercept occurs at zero comma negative one, that's right here, and the slope is 1 half. So up one to the right two, up one to the right two, up one to the right two, or I can go down one to the left two, down one to the left two. All right, so let me take my eraser and just break this up a little bit. Again, we're just showing that this line is not part of the solution. So if you have a point on that line, it will not satisfy that inequality. All right, so let's do some shading. Y is less than here. Remember, if you have Y is less than or you have Y is less than or equal to, you shade below the line. So I'm going to shade going this way. Okay, so that's done. Now the next thing I wanna do is graph this guy right here. So I have y is greater than or equal to one half x minus three. So the boundary line for that would be y equals one half x minus three. And now we have a non-strict inequality. So we want a solid boundary line. So I would go to zero comma negative three, it's right here. And then my slope again is one half. So I go up one to the right two, up one to the right two, up one to the right two, or I could go down one to the left two, down one to the left two. So 
So now where are we going to shade? We have a Y is greater than or equal to. So that means I shade above the line. So let's shade above the line. And you can see that you will have a solution. So let me highlight the solution region. So for the system, anywhere that's above this orange line here, including the orange line, because remember it's a non-strict inequality in that situation, anywhere above here, but below that blue line, below that blue line, I know I'm going over the line, but just bear with me. So that section of the coordinate plane there, that would be your solution for the system. Because anything below the orange line doesn't work for the second one. And anything above the dashed blue line doesn't work for the first one. So this area kind of in between the two lines and including that orange line, because that was a non-strict inequality, would be the solution for your system. So again, we've seen an example where we had parallel boundary lines, but we did get a solution for the system. So just keep that in mind that you do have to go through and graph them to see what you're gonna get. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 26. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we want to simplify, and we're going to start out with, inside of parentheses, we have negative y cubed times, we have negative yx squared, and this whole thing is raised to the third power. So remember, one of your power rules tells you that if you have a product that's raised to a power, you can raise each of the factors to that power. So I can break this up into, first off, I have a negative outside of this y cubed. Now, one thing that you're probably going to get confused on right away, remember, when you have negative 2 like this and it's squared, it's not the same or it's not equal to negative 2 inside of parentheses being squared. There's no parentheses around this negative y. So it's not negative y raised to the third power. So essentially, the way you treat this is as a negative 1 being multiplied by y cubed. And then times, we have a negative outside. Again, there's no parentheses, so I'm going to put another negative 1. And then times, we have y, and then times x squared. I'm going to be raising each of these to the power of 3. So that means negative 1 is going to get raised to the power of 3 y cubed is going to get raised to the power of 3. Negative 1, again, is going to get raised to the power of 3. y is going to get raised to the power of 3. And then x squared is going to get raised to the power of 3. So negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. That's negative 1. Then times, we have y cubed, and then that's cubed. So we use our power to power rule. That tells us to keep the base the same. So y is going to stay the same and multiply the exponents. So 3 times 3 is 9. Then we have negative 1 cubed again. We know that's negative 1. And then we have y cubed, so times y cubed. And then times we have x squared, and then that's raised to the third power, or that's cubed. So again, power to power rule. So we'll keep x, the base, the same. Multiply the exponents. 2 times 3 is 6. Now, negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. So this whole thing is going to be positive. The next thing is we have y to the ninth power times y cubed. So y to the ninth power times y cubed. And I know I can simplify that, and then times x to the sixth power. So y to the ninth power times y cubed. So what I can do is keep that base the same and add exponents. So 9 plus 3 would be 12. So this part would simplify to y to the twelfth power. And then we have times x to the sixth power. So I'm just going to write y to the twelfth x to the sixth. All right, now we're going to look at, inside of our parentheses, we have a to the fourth power, b cubed, times b a squared. Now, this whole thing is raised to the third power, or again, you could say that's cubed. So when you have a product that's raised to a power, remember, you can take this and raise each factor individually to that power. So what I'm going to have is, let me write these out separately. I have a to the fourth power times b cubed times b times a squared. 
Now I can go through before I even do this operation and I can simplify because I have A and I have A and then I have B and I have B or you can raise each individually to the third power and then simply, it doesn't really matter. You get the same answer either way. So what I'm gonna do is raise each to the third power So what do I get? a to the fourth power raised to the third power. a stays the same. Multiply x1. That's 4 times 3 is 12. Then times b to the third power raised to the third power. b stays the same. Multiply x1. That's 3 times 3 is 9. Then you have b to the third power. So times b to the third power. Then times a squared raised to the third power. We have a. That stays the same. 2 times 3 is 6. So now I can simplify further because in this case, in this case, I have the same base and I'm multiplying. So a to the 12th power times a to the 6th power, a stays the same, and we add exponents. So 12 plus 6 is 18. And then we're multiplying this by, we have b to the 9th power times b to the 3rd power, b stays the same, and we add exponents. 9 plus 3 is 12. So you end up with a to the 18th power, b to the 12th power. And again, there's other ways that you could have got to that answer. You could have simplified inside the parentheses first. Let's do it that way real quick. So the first thing I would do is, let's say I go and say, okay, well, a to the fourth power times a squared would be a to the sixth power. a stays the same, add exponents. Four plus two is six. Then b cubed times b would be b to the fourth power. Remember, when you have something and there's no visible exponent, it's understood to be 1. So this would be b to the power of 3 plus 1 or 4, and this whole thing is cubed. So now it makes it a little bit simpler for me because I have a to the 6th power that's cubed. So then that's a stays the same, 6 times 3 is 18. Then b to the 4th power, that's cubed, b stays the same, 4 times 3 is 12. Again, a to the 18th power, b to the 12th power. Let's take a look at this one. We have inside of parentheses u squared v cubed. Then this is squared, and we're multiplying by negative v u cubed. Okay, so let's work on this first. So power to power rule. I have u squared that's being squared. So u squared being squared, and we can write it like this to start to just make it clear. Then we have times v cubed, and that's being squared. We're multiplying it by, I have a negative out in front. So I can keep that as a negative out in front, or to make it clear, I can just write negative 1 times v times u cubed. So power to power rule here. u squared squared, keep u the same, and multiply exponents. 2 times 2 is 4. Then times. We have v cubed, and that's squared. Again, power to power rule. So v stays the same. Multiply exponents. 3 times 2 is 6. Then times, we have negative 1 times v times u cubed. Now we can use our product rule for exponents. So I have u to the 4th power times u cubed. So u stays the same, and we add exponents. 4 plus 3 is 7. Then next I have v to the 6th power times v. Now, again, if you don't have anything there, it's understood to have an exponent of 1. So that would be v to the power of 6 plus 1, which is 7. And then you have this negative 1. So I can write just a negative out in front, or I can write negative 1. It doesn't really matter. It means the same thing. So you end up with a negative u to the 7th, v to the 7th. All right, what if I had inside of parentheses 2ab to the 4th power times 2b squared times negative b to the 4th power, and this whole thing is squared? All right, so... Let's kind of break this down individually. So we have 2 times a times b to the fourth power times 2 times b squared times, now again, pay close attention here, you have this negative that sits out in front of b to the fourth power. There are no parentheses here. This is not like this. So when this occurs, just do yourself a favor and write times negative 1 times b to the fourth power. That way you don't make a silly sign mistake. Now, everything here is going to be raised to the second power. So I'm going to raise 2 to the second power, a to the second power, 
b to the fourth to the second power, two again to the second power, b squared to the second power, negative one to the second power, and b to the fourth to the second power. Now, two squared, I can keep that way, or I could write it as four, but really you're meant to combine these two together. So you think about this, the base is the same, which is two, and you add exponents, two plus two is four. Then here I have a squared, and there's no other a over here, so I'm just gonna write that. Here I have b to the fourth power, and then it's squared. So keep b the same, and multiply the exponents. So four times two is eight. And then I have b squared, and then that's squared, so keep b the same, multiply the exponents. Two times two is four. And then I'm gonna skip over this one for a second and just go to this one. So b to the fourth power, and that's squared. So keep b the same, multiply exponents. Four times two is eight. So now I have b to the eighth, b to the fourth, and b to the eighth. If I'm multiplying those together, I would just keep b the same and add the exponents. So eight plus four is 12, 12 plus eight is 20. So this would be b to the 20th power. And then I have this negative one here. Negative one is squared. The negative and the one are inside of parentheses. So that would be negative one times negative one, which is positive one. One times anything is just itself. So we leave this as our simplified answer. Two to the fourth power times a squared times b to the 20th. Some teachers might want you to evaluate two to the fourth power. I never would ask for that. I think that would be a perfectly acceptable answer. And again, another thing you could have done, to make this a little easier on yourself, is to simplify before you even did anything. So inside the parentheses, if I just said, okay, I have two and I have two. So I know that's going to be two to the second power, or I could put four. Really for the purposes of working with exponents, we put two to, two to the second power for right now. Then I only have one single a. I have b to the fourth power, I have b squared, and remember, I'm treating this negative as, as something separate. So b to the fourth power, b squared, and b to the fourth power. So four plus two is six, six plus four is 10. So b to the 10th power, and then I would just have this negative that I would put out in front as negative one times. So then enclose this inside of parentheses and say this is squared, and really just everything would be raised to the second power. So that negative one would be raised to the second power. The two squared would be raised to the second power. So two squared raised to the second power would be two. Two times two would be four. A would be raised to the second power, so that's A squared. And B to the 10th would be raised to the second power. So B stays the same, 10 times two is 20. So you'd get the same answer. Once you simplify this, negative one times negative one is one. You'd have two to the fourth power, A squared, B to the 20th. Now, one thing that some of you are gonna say is, hey, there was no parentheses around this. How did you get negative one squared inside of parentheses. Well, I have this number right here that actually is inside of this set of parentheses. The exponent is outside of that, okay? Where we run into problems if we have something like negative one squared like that. This number right here is to be squared. In other words, if I thought about this kind of more logically, Really, all this is saying is give me this twice. So I could write this as negative one times two squared times a times b to the 10th times itself again. Negative one times two squared times a times b to the 10th. So if I go through and simplify here, everything is just multiplication. So I can really just get rid of these parentheses. Just put some multiplication signs in to make that clear. Negative one times negative one is one. 2 squared times 2 squared is 2 to the 4th power. a times a is a squared. b to the 10th times b to the 10th is b to the 20th. So again, you get the same answer. 2 to the 4th power, a to the 2nd, or a squared, b to the 20th. So again, if I have negative 1, and it's inside of the parentheses here, it's telling me that I have two factors of that negative 1, just like I see here. Here's a factor, here's a factor. So please understand that. Very important to know moving forward. All right, what about 3x cubed y squared times negative x to the fourth y cubed? All right, so to simplify here, I have a three that's out in front. Nothing to really do with that. I have an x cubed, and then I have a negative out in front of an x to the fourth power. Again, this negative right here 
is not part of this deal. You can think of this as just negative one hanging out in front of x to the fourth power. That's what I'm gonna write, a big negative one there. So to simplify, x cubed times x to the fourth power is x to the seventh power. y squared times y cubed is y to the fifth power. And I basically have a negative one that's just multiplying all of them. So I can, I can put times negative one, or generally what we do is we just put a negative out in front. Because if I multiplied by negative one, it would just be negative. So negative three x to the seventh, y to the fifth. What about something like seven x over three y, and this is squared? Well, everything is gonna be squared. So the seven is squared, the x is squared, over the three is squared, and the y is squared. So seven squared, which you could write as 49 if you wanted to. So you think of this as 49 x squared over three squared, which you could say is nine y squared. Again, when I work in a section with exponents, I just kind of keep everything with exponents. Your teacher might want you to write it like this, 49 x squared over nine y squared. And moving forward, we're gonna write things in that manner. I just wanna kind of keep it that way because again, we're working with exponents. All right, let's take a look at one more. We have x cubed z to the fourth n squared over seven y cubed to the fifth, and then this is all raised to the seventh power. So everything is raised to the seventh power. So x cubed is raised to the seventh power. z to the fourth is raised to the seventh power. n squared is raised to the seventh power. And this is over seven, that's raised to the seventh power y that's raised to the seventh power, and q to the fifth power is raised to the seventh power. So x cubed to the seventh power is x to the 21st power, right? You take x and you leave it the same, multiply exponents, three times seven is 21. Then z to the fourth power raised to the seventh power, z stays the same, and then four times seven is 28. n squared raised to the seventh power, n stays the same, multiply exponents, two times seven is 14. This is over. We have seven to the seventh power. We have y to the seventh power. And then we have q to the fifth power raised to the seventh power. So q stays the same. Five times seven is 35. So we end up with x to the 21st, z to the 28th, n to the 14th, over seven to the seventh, y to the seventh, q to the 35th. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we wanna simplify. So for the first problem we're gonna look at, we have six to the fourth power times six cubed times six squared. So we're gonna use our product rule for exponents. So that tells us to keep the base the same, right? Because in each case you have a base of six, so keep that the same, and then just add your exponents. So you have an exponent of four plus an exponent of three, that will give you seven, plus an exponent of two, that would give you nine. So this would be six to the ninth power. All right, for the next one, we have n to the fourth power times n to the seventh power times n to the ninth power. So keep the base the same, which is n, and then just add the exponents. So four plus seven is 11, and then 11 plus nine is 20. So this would be n to the 20th power. All right, so for the next one, we have x to the fourth power, y to the fourth power, z to the fourth power. So one way we can rewrite this, we can notice that we have the same exponent in each case. So when you have a product and you have the same exponent in each factor, you can take kind of each part separately. So the X, the Y, and the Z, put those inside of a set of parentheses and then just raise this whole thing to the fourth power. These two would be the same. So X, Y, Z, inside of parentheses raised to the fourth power would be equal to or the same as x to the fourth power, y to the fourth power, z to the fourth power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section two on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we wanna simplify and we look at our first problem here. We have eight times and then we have x, y and then this is raised to the fifth power. Now notice only the xy inside of the parentheses is raised to the fifth power, not the eight. So we can kind of separate this a little bit to make it clear and say we have eight times inside of parentheses xy, this is raised to the fifth power. So then what I can do here is I can say I have eight times, 
I have a product raised to a power. So x is raised to the fifth power times I have y also raised to that power. And so we end up writing this as 8x to the fifth power, y to the fifth power. And there's going to be different situations that are going to come up where we have to start from this format and go to this format. And then sometimes we're going to have to start from this format and go to this format. So it's important to know that you can change back and forth between the two. What about x, y inside of parentheses squared, then times x to the fourth power? Well, again, I can raise each individually to the second power. So x to the second power, y to the second power. Then I'm multiplying this by x to the fourth power. And then with my product rule for exponents, I can kind of further simplify here. Keep x the same. And then I have an exponent of 2 and an exponent of 4. So I would add those. 2 plus 4 is 6. So it would be x to the sixth power and then times y squared. So we get x to the sixth, y to the second, or y squared. What about something like 5x over 3 inside of some brackets? And this is raised to the second power. Well, I can raise each individually to the second power. So 5 squared times x squared over 3 squared. And if you get this problem on a test, your teacher might want you to write 25x squared over 9. But I like to keep it using the exponents, especially when we're dealing with a chapter on exponents. But specifically, as you're moving forward, you're going to be getting values for things. So you're probably going to be writing it like this. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we're going to want to simplify. We're going to start out with x to the fourth power, y to the seventh power over z squared. So this is inside of brackets, and then we're cubing it, or we're raising it to the third power, however you want to say that. So each is going to be raised to the third power. So x to the fourth is raised to the third power. y to the seventh is raised to the third power. And then over z squared, that's also raised to the third power. So the power to power rule tells us we keep the base the same, multiply the exponents. So x to the fourth raised to the third power, keep x the same, multiply the exponents. 4 times 3 is 12. y to the seventh power raised to the third power, keep the base y the same, multiply the exponents. 7 times 3 is 21. Then over z squared raised to the third power, z stays the same, multiply exponents. 2 times 3 is 6. So you get x to the 12th, y to the 21st, over z to the 6th. All right, for the next one we have, inside of parentheses, negative 2 to the 4th power raised to the 5th power. This is kind of a trap question that you'll probably get on a test. You have to pay close attention to this negative here. When you see a negative and there's exponents involved, ask yourself the question. So forget about this part right here. Is that negative contained inside of a set of parentheses with regard to being raised to the 4th power? No, it's not. You really have negative... You can think of this as negative 1 times 2 to the 4th power, then this whole thing here is raised to the 5th power. All right, let me erase this and make that clear. This is different than if you had something that looked like this. If I had, let's say, negative 2, and this amount was raised to the 4th power, and then this whole thing was raised to the 5th power. Those two are different. So specifically what I have here is I have negative 1 times 2 to the 4th power, then this whole thing is raised to the fifth power. Now, I can simplify this using the power to power rule. So negative 1 is raised to the fifth power. So negative 1 is raised to the fifth power. And the negative 1 now being raised to the fifth power, you notice that there are parentheses here. So that's telling me I do have five factors of this negative 1. So now I can use some parentheses there. Then I'm multiplying this by 2 to the fourth power, and that's raised to the fifth power. So power to power rule there is 2, which is my base, stays the same, and then I multiply exponents. 4 times 5 is 20. So what I end up with here is negative 1 to the 5th power. We know that's negative 1. So that's negative. I won't write negative 1. I'll just write negative. Out in front of 2 to the 20th power. So again, this is a trap question that you'll get on a test. And again, just pay attention to this negative right here. You have this first exponent operation, 2 to the 4th power. So the negative here is not enclosed inside of a set of parentheses 
with regard to this exponent right here. It's not. It's only enclosed inside of these parentheses, which is with regard to this exponent operation here. So just pay very, very close attention to that. So for the next one, we have x to the fourth power, y cubed, times negative two x to the fourth power, y cubed. And then this whole thing is inside of parentheses and it's squared. Different ways you can do this. One way you can do it is you can simplify inside the parentheses first, and then you could use your power to power rule. Another thing you can do, and what I'm gonna do here, you can kind of individually use the power to power rule and then simplify in the end. So we would have x to the fourth power, and then that's gonna be squared, right? It's raised to the second power. Then times, we have y cubed, and that's squared. Then times, I have this negative two here. Very important that we think about signs when we're working with exponents. Now, the negative two is enclosed inside of these parentheses here. And I'm squaring that, which means that if I kind of pause from this for a second, if I come down here and I had x to the fourth power y cubed times negative two times x to the fourth power y cubed, this is squared so really all I'm doing is I'm taking this and I'm multiplying it by itself. So then you'd have x to the fourth power y cubed times negative two x to the fourth power y cubed times this again, x to the fourth power y cubed times negative two x to the fourth power y cubed. So I'd have negative two times negative two. So that's gonna end up being positive. So then let me erase this and we're gonna continue. So now I'd have that negative two, and that would be inside of a set of parentheses, and then it would be squared, and then I'd have x to the fourth power, and then that would be squared, and then y, which is cubed, would be squared. So x to the fourth power squared, again, keep the base x the same, multiply exponents, four times two is eight. y cubed is squared, so we keep y the same, multiply exponents, three times two is six, Negative two, that amount, the negative and the two, is squared. Negative two times negative two is four. So I can put four out in front. Or if you wanted to, you could actually leave negative two squared out in front since you're working with exponents. That would be fine as well. Then we have x to the fourth power, which is squared. Keep x the same. Multiply the exponents, four times two is eight. Then we have y cubed squared. So we have y, which stays the same, and then three times two is six. So now we just simplify further using the product rule for exponents. So four, I'm gonna leave that unchanged. X to the eighth times X to the eighth is X to the 16th, right? X stays the same and just add the exponents. Eight plus eight is 16. And then Y to the sixth times Y to the sixth is Y to the 12th, right? Y stays the same, add the exponents. Six plus six is 12. So I end up with four X to the 16th, Y to the 12th, or most people would accept negative two squared, written like that, times x to the 16th, y to the 12th. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we wanna simplify. So we have negative two y x squared times, inside of parentheses, negative two x squared y to the fourth power, and this is squared. All right, so this right here, I'm not gonna to touch for right now, negative two y x squared. For this one, I have a product here and it's raised to a power. So each factor individually, I can raise to that power. So I have negative two. And remember, you have to be careful with these signs when you work with negatives. This is inside of a set of parentheses here, this negative two. So negative two is squared. So I'm gonna put times negative two, that's squared. And then I have x squared and that squared. So x squared, that squared, and then y to the fourth power, that squared. So let's simplify. So I have negative two times y times x squared times negative two squared is going to be positive four. So I'll just go ahead and write that. And then I have x squared, that's squared. So keep x the same, multiply exponents. Two times two is four. Then I have y to the fourth power that's squared, keep y the same, multiply exponents, four times two is eight. So then equals. So now I have negative two times four, that's negative eight, so negative eight. Or you can also write this as negative two cubed, right, if you wanted to, because 
you have a negative 2 here, and then you have a negative 2 here that's squared. Now, I know that this negative 2 is not inside of a set of parentheses, but I could write it as negative 2, that quantity, to the first power, and it's the same thing. So combining those, I would have negative 2, that base, raised to the power of 1 plus 2 or 3. So I can write this quantity, negative 2 cubed, or again, I can just write negative 8. All right, so then I have y, and then I have another y here that's raised to the eighth power. So y stays the same, and then if it doesn't have an exponent, it's an exponent of 1. So 1 plus 8 is 9. Then I have x squared, and I have x to the fourth power. So put down an x, and then add exponents. 2 plus 4 is 6. So this is going to simplify to negative 8, y to the ninth, x to the sixth. All right, for the next one I have, inside of parentheses, negative b to the fourth times b squared, and then this is squared. All right, so again, we've got to pay careful attention to when we have negatives involved. There's all kinds of situations they're going to throw at you. So this negative right here is not being raised to the fourth power here. It's not inside of any parentheses there. The only parentheses it's inside of are these. So this negative will be squared. In the end, it's going to be a positive result anyway. But I want you just to pay close attention to these situations because they're going to throw a lot of trap questions at you like this in, this in this section. So then to simplify this, I can start out by saying, okay, I have negative 1. That's going to be squared. Then times I have b to the fourth power. That's going to be squared. And then I have b to the second power. That's going to be squared. Or I could have simplified in here first and say, okay, b to the fourth power times b squared is b to the sixth power. So basically I have a negative one times a b to the sixth power. And then this whole thing is squared. So really negative one times negative one is one. You kind of forget about that. And then b to the sixth power squared would be b to the twelfth power. So that's kind of the quick way to do it. And that's what you're going to be doing kind of as you get more practice and more comfortable with this. But for right now, I'll just break it up so you can see what I'm doing individually. So negative one squared again is one b to the fourth power squared is b, and then four times two is eight, so b to the eighth power, and then times b squared to the second power, keep b the same, two times two is four. So now I have b to the eighth times b to the fourth, keep b the same, add the exponents, eight plus four is 12, so again you get b to the 12th power. All right, for the last one we're gonna look at, we have ax squared over by to the fourth, and then this amount is inside of brackets, and it's raised to the third power, or again, we could say that's cubed. So what I'm going to do is take each individually and raise it to the third power. So a is raised to the third power, x squared is raised to the third power, over b, which is raised to the third power, and then y to the fourth power is raised to the third power. And then simplifying this, I get a cubed x squared to the third power is x to the sixth power. This is over. b cubed. And then y to the fourth power raised to the third power is y to the twelfth power. So I have a cubed x to the sixth over b cubed y to the twelfth. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on the product and power rules for exponents. All right, so we want to simplify. We have j times negative h cubed j to the fourth. This is inside of parentheses, and then it's cubed. So each inside of here is going to be cubed. So I would have j, that's cubed. I have this negative here, which I can think of as negative 1. That's going to be cubed. I have h cubed, which is going to be cubed. And then I have j to the fourth power, which is going to be cubed. And so j cubed stays as is. Negative 1 cubed would be negative 1. So you just put a negative out in front of here. h cubed cubed would be h to the ninth power. right? You keep the base the same, which is h, multiply the exponents. 3 times 3 is 9. Then the same thing for j to the fourth power raised to the third, or j to the fourth power cubed. j stays the same. 4 times 3 is 12. Now I can further simplify this because I have j and I have j. So if I'm multiplying here, same base, add the exponents. So negative, we're going to have j, 3 plus 12 is 15. So j to the 15th, and then h to the 9th. So again, negative j to the 15th, h to the 9th. All right, for the next one, I have x to the 5th power 
y to the ninth over 3, and then this is inside of brackets, and it's squared. So I'm just going to raise each to the second power. So x to the fifth raised to the second power, y to the ninth raised to the second power, over 3 raised to the second power. So x to the fifth raised to the second power, power to power rule, x stays the same, 5 times 2 is 10. y to the ninth power raised to the second power, again, power to power rule, y stays the same, 9 times 2 is 18. Then 3 squared, I can keep it as 3 squared, or I can write 9. Your teacher may prefer you to write 9. If I'm in a chapter or a section where I'm talking about exponents, I might leave it as 3 squared, just to show that I have 3 raised to the second power. But any way you write it, you have x to the 10th power, y to the 18th, over 9. All right, now we're looking at negative 2q times, inside of parentheses here, we have negative 2r q cubed, and that's raised to the fifth power. So then what I'm going to do is simplify this part first, and then I'll do some more simplification using my product rule for exponents. So I have a negative 2q times, I think about this negative as being raised to the fifth power. So negative 1 to the fifth power, and then times 2 to the fifth power, times r to the fifth power, times q cubed, hard to say, q cubed, raised to the fifth power. All right, so everything inside of here got raised to the fifth power, as it tells us with the power to power rule. So now, you can do some simplification. I have negative two, I'm gonna write this as negative one times two, times q, times negative one to the fifth power. That is negative one. So I'd have another negative one, those two would cancel out and it would become positive. And then times two to the fifth power, and then times r to the fifth power, and then times q to the third power, or q cubed, raised to the fifth power, power to power rule, so you'd have q raised to the power of three times five, or 15, and this equals, so this is basically two to the first power, times two to the fifth power, that's two to the sixth power. You have q times q to the 15th, that's q to the 16th, and then I have r to the fifth power. So my end result is two to the sixth power, or you could put 64 if you want, q to the 16th, r to the 5th. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set 27. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on integer exponents and the quotient rule. All right, so we just want to simplify. And let's start out with the first problem here. So we have negative, and then we have 4 raised to the power of 0. Notice how this negative is not inside of a set of parentheses then plus, now we have negative four. This is inside of parentheses, this is raised to the power of zero. So what we have here is we have negative one times four to the power of zero, plus we have a negative four, again, inside of parentheses, raised to the power of zero. So four to the power of zero is one, right? Any non-zero number that is raised to the power of zero is one. So I would have negative one, times one, plus I'd have negative four raised to the power of zero. Here, the negative and the four are both inside of parentheses, so this whole thing is equal to one. So what I have is negative one times one, which is negative one, plus one, and that's gonna equal zero. All right, for the next problem, I have v raised to the power of zero over negative v times negative v raised to the power of negative four, and then this whole thing is inside of brackets and it's raised to the power of three. Now you can do this two different ways. You could simplify what's in the brackets first, and then you could raise the result to the power of three, or you could individually use the power to power rule and raise everything to the third power. It doesn't really matter how you do it. It's a little easier for me to just kind of start out with what's inside. So V raised to the power of zero over negative V times negative V raised to the power of negative four. So just think about simplifying this first. Now, everything has the same base, but you have to pay close attention here. This negative is not inside of a set of parentheses. So really, I could rewrite this as v to the power of zero over negative one times v times negative one times v to the power of negative four. This negative one would cancel with this negative one and give me a one. So really, I could just erase this. I don't really need it. You could say I just have v times v 
to the power of negative 4. To do this operation in the denominator, remember this is v to the power of 1. So I'd write v to the power of 0 over v raised to the power of 1 plus negative 4, which equals v to the power of 0 over v to the power of 1 plus negative 4 is negative 3. Now, I know that v to the power of 0 is 1. But essentially what I could do, since the base is the same, I could just say, okay, I have v raised to the power of 0 minus a negative 3. Right? That's your quotient rule for exponents. So this ends up being v raised to the power of 0 minus a negative 3 is the same thing as 0 plus 3. So it's really v to the third power. Now, we're not done because remember, this is v to the third power, and then it's inside of brackets and it's cubed. So this ends up being v raised to the power of 3 times 3 or 9. Right, so v raised to the power of 9 is your simplified answer. All right, what about inside of parentheses, I have negative n raised to the power of negative 3, and then this whole thing is raised to the power of 0, then over n to the power of 0 times negative n raised to the fourth power. Now, this is pretty simple here because anything raised to the power of 0 is 1. So this whole thing is raised to the power of 0, so the numerator is 1 n to the power of 0 down here is 1, then times negative n to the fourth power. Now, I can think of this negative out in front here as negative 1. So I can write this as 1 over, I don't need this 1 times because 1 times anything is just itself. I'm going to treat this negative as negative 1 times n to the fourth power. And so we end up with, I'm just going to think of this as negative 1 over n to the fourth power. So now you can write it like that, or you could write it as negative 1 over n to the 4th, or you could write it as negative n to the power of negative 4. Remember, I can bring this into the numerator, but I've got to make the exponent negative, right? If I started out with, let's say, n to the power of negative 4, forget about the negative out in front for right now. If I write this over 1, I can drag this into the denominator, but I've got to make that exponent positive. So this becomes 1 over n to the fourth, right? That's what we talked about in the lesson. So the end result here could be any of these three. I could have negative 1 over n to the fourth. I could have negative 1 over n to the fourth. Or if your teacher allows you to do this, you could write it as negative n to the power of negative 4. Some teachers are going to say, write this without any negative exponents, you know, so on and so forth. It just depends on what your teacher wants you to do. All right, let's take a look at x to the power of 0, y to the power of negative 1, times, and then inside of parentheses here, I have 2x, y to the power of negative 1. This whole thing is raised to the fifth power. So x to the power of 0 is 1, times we have y to the power of negative 1, times everything in here is raised to the fifth power. So 2 is raised to the fifth power, x is raised to the fifth power, y to the power of negative 1 is raised to the fifth power, so this would be y to the power of negative 5. Now, I can see that I have the same base here and here. So then I can keep the base the same. So y is going to be raised to the power of negative 1 plus negative 5, which is negative 6. And then we have 2 to the fifth power, and then we have x to the fifth power. Now, to simplify this, I can bring this into the denominator. So this y would go down there, and I just need to change the sign of the exponent to do that. Now it's negative, it's going to be positive. And then I have 2 to the fifth power, in the numerator and x to the fifth power in the numerator as well. So I could leave it like this or I could write it as 2x like that, that whole thing raised to the fifth power over y to the sixth. Or some teachers will say, okay, you need to write it as 32, which is two to the fifth power times x to the fifth over y to the sixth. A lot of different ways to kind of write this. All right, for the next one we have inside of parentheses, negative two, x to the power of negative five, y to the fourth times x to the power of negative four, y squared, the whole thing, everything inside of the parentheses, is raised to the power of negative 1. So one way to start the problem off would be have 1 over this amount here. And you've dealt with that negative 1 for the exponent. Another thing you could do is just simplify inside first and then do that last. It doesn't matter how you do it, you get the same answer either way. So in other words, I can start out with negative 2 times x to the power of negative 5, y to the 4th and then times x to the power of negative 4, y squared. And I could just simplify this. I have the same base here, 
So I would have x to the power of negative 5 plus negative 4, that's negative 9. And then I have the same base here. So I'd have y to the power of 4 plus 2, that's 6. And then don't forget about the negative 2. Let's move this back a little bit so I can write negative 2 in there. So inside the parentheses, that's what I'd be dealing with. So I would have negative 2, x to the power of negative 9, y to the power of 6. And this is raised to the power of negative 1. So now I can use my power to power rule. And so negative 2 would be raised to the power of negative 1. That's inside of parentheses, so it would be negative 2 raised to the power of negative 1. Then times, I'd have x to the power of negative 9 times negative 1. So that's going to be positive 9. Then times, I'd have y raised to the power of 6 times negative 1, which is negative 6. So then negative 2 to the power of negative 1, I could write this as 1 over negative 2 to the power of 1, or just 1 over negative 2, or basically just negative 1 half. So negative 1 half. Then times, I have x to the ninth power. Then times y to the power of negative 6 is 1 over y to the 6th power. So this equals, the whole thing is negative. So I'm just going to put a negative out in front. We have 1 times x to the ninth times 1, which is just x to the ninth, over 2 times y to the 6th, 2y to the 6th. So negative x to the ninth over 2y to the 6th. All right, for the next one, I have 2m to the power of negative 1, n to the power of 0. This whole thing is squared, right? It's all inside of parentheses. This is over. We have m cubed, n cubed, p squared times negative 2, n squared, p squared. So I can start out by just using my power to power rule in the numerator. 2 would be raised to the second power, so 2 squared. And then times we have m to the power of negative 1. That's squared, so m stays the same. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. n raised to the power of 0 is raised to the power of 2. But remember, 0 times 2 is just 0. Anything raised to the power of 0 is just 1, right? So this is basically 1 raised to the power of 2, or 1 squared, which is just 1. So I can put times 1, or I can just leave it off. It doesn't really matter. This is over. I have m cubed. Nothing to combine with over there. So I'm going to write that out here, m cubed. I have n cubed, and I have n squared. So n would stay the same, and 3 plus 2 is 5. p squared and p squared. p stays the same. 2 plus 2 is 4. And then don't forget about this negative 2, which I'm going to write out in front. So then this equals, I have 2 squared. I have m to the power of negative 2 over, I'm going to write this negative 2 as negative 1 times 2, make it a little easier on myself, then m cubed, n to the fifth, p to the fourth. So what can I simplify? Well, I have m to the power of negative 2, and I have m cubed. So I can write that as m to the power of negative 2 minus 3, or m to the power of negative 5. This 2 squared here, I could simplify by thinking about this 2 down here. Really, I have 2 raised to the power of 2 minus 1. I have two factors of 2 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator. So really, one of those factors would cancel, and so I'd have 2 up here. So 2m to the power of negative 5 over, I have that negative 1 times n to the fifth, p to the fourth. So I can think about this negative 1 as just putting a negative out in front, or I can make it negative 2 in the numerator. doesn't really matter. Over, if I have m to the power of negative 5, I need to bring that into the denominator. So the m comes down. And when I cross the fraction bar, the negative 5 becomes positive 5. Then I have n to the fifth, p to the fourth. So that ends up being my answer. Negative 2 over m to the fifth, n to the fifth, p to the fourth. All right, for the last problem, I have negative a squared b to the power of negative 4, c squared times b cubed c to the fourth over Inside of parentheses, negative 2, a to the power of 0, b to the power of negative 4. And then all this in the parentheses in the denominator is squared. So let's think about the numerator first. What can we simplify here? Well, I have an a squared. I have b to the power of negative 4, and I have b cubed. So b would stay the same. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Then I have c squared, and I have c to the fourth. So c stays the same. 2 plus 4 is 6. Now this is over. I have my power to power rule here that I'm going to use to remove those parentheses. So negative 2, it's inside of parentheses here, it's being raised to the second power. Negative 2 is squared. 
a is raised to the power of zero. So that's really one. So it's really one squared. We don't really need to write that. So you can just kind of skip that over. Then you have b to the power of negative four, that's squared. b stays the same, negative four times two is negative eight. So I have a negative, and I'll just put that out in front. We have a squared. Again, b to the power of negative one, I could subtract away negative eight, right? Because I have b here and b here. So b to the power of negative one minus a negative eight, that's the same thing as negative one plus eight, and that's gonna be seven. So I get b to the seventh, and then c to the sixth over this negative two, this quantity is squared, that's four. So that would be four, and this has been taken care of. So really I'll write this a little neater. I'll put the negative out in front, put a squared, b to the seventh, c to the sixth over four. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section One on integer exponents and the quotient rule. All right, so we wanna simplify, and we're gonna take a look at, inside of parentheses, I have two x to the fifth power y cubed. This is all raised to the power of negative four. Then we're multiplying by negative two y squared. So we're gonna start out by simplifying this guy right here. So we're gonna use our power to power rule. So the way we do that is, everything inside here is raised to the power of negative four. So two is raised to the power of negative four, so that's two to the power of negative four. Then x to the fifth power is raised to the power of negative four. So the base x stays the same. So I'm gonna write x, and then I'm just gonna multiply the exponents. So five times negative four is negative 20. Then y cubed is raised to the power of negative four. So the base y stays the same. And then I'm gonna multiply the exponents. Three times negative four is negative 12. Then we're multiplying by, over here I have negative two times y squared. All right, so let's take a look at what we got here. So the first thing I notice is that I have a two, and I have a negative two, but really I could write this as two to the power of negative four times negative one times two, right? I just have a negative outside that two, so I could write negative one times two. Let me kind of reverse the order and put two times negative one like that. And so if I combine these through the product rule for exponents, the base two is the same. I would just add negative four plus one, that's negative three. So what I'd have is negative one times two to the power of negative three. Or I can write negative two to the power of negative three like that. The next I have x to the power of negative 20. Nothing I can do with that. I have y to the power of negative 12 and I have y squared. So y stays the same. And then we have negative 12 plus two, that's gonna be negative 10. So I can leave it like this, or your teacher might say, hey, I don't want you to write this with any negative exponents. So what I'm gonna end up with is essentially everything going from the numerator, right? I can think about this as over one, into the denominator. And remember, when I cross the fraction bar, I change the sign of the exponent. So here it's y to the power of negative 10. Here it's gonna be y to the power of positive 10. Here it's x to the power of negative 20. Here it's gonna be x to the power of positive 20. Here it's two to the power of negative three. When I drag it down there, I'm gonna put two to the power of positive three, or two cubed is just eight. You could write eight if you want. Now I have this negative that I left out in front because I'm just gonna write negative one up here in the numerator. Now let me erase all these arrows kind of so we can clearly see I have negative one over eight x to the 20th power, y to the 10th power. You could have changed that up a little bit. You could have put the negative down here if you wanted to. It doesn't matter, or you could have put the negative two to the power of three like that. Again, it doesn't matter. So I'm just gonna go with my original, negative one over eight x to the 20th power, y to the 10th power. All right, let's take a look at another one. I have inside of parentheses, two m cubed, n to the power of negative four. This is raised to the power of negative three. Then we're multiplying by negative two, m to the power of five, n to the power of zero. So let's start out with this guy right here. So Everything is raised to the power of negative three. So two is raised to the power of negative three. M cubed is raised to the power of negative three. So M stays the same. Three times negative three is negative nine. N to the power of negative four is raised to the power of negative three. So N stays the same. Negative four times negative three is 12. Then times I have negative two. Then M to the fifth power. And we know N to the power of zero is one. So I can put times one or I can just leave it off. Doesn't really matter. So if I look here, I can combine these. 
and I can combine kind of these, again, using that trick. So let's work on the m's. m to the power of negative 9 times m to the power of 5 is m to the power of negative 4. Right, because negative 9 plus 5 is negative 4. Then I have n to the power of 12. And then if I have 2 to the power of negative 3 and I have 2, right, I can think about this right here as times negative 1 times 2. Well, really, this is 2 to the first power, right? So 2 raised to the power of negative 3 plus 1 is 2 raised to the power of negative 2. And then don't forget that negative 1. I'll just put that out here in the front. And then again, if your teacher wants you to write this without any negative exponents, in the numerator, you'll just have negative, right, for the negative 1, n to the power of 12 over. In my denominator, I'm going to drag this into the denominator. I'm going to change the sign of the exponent. So m to the power of negative 4 will become m to the power of positive 4. And then 2 to the power of negative 2, I'll put 2 to the power of positive 2. Remember, if you drag something from the numerator into the denominator, you change the sign of the exponent. So the m to the power of negative 4 came from the numerator, went into the denominator, became m to the power of 4. 2 to the power of negative 2 came from the numerator, went to the denominator, became 2 to the power of 2. And I could further say this is negative n to the 12th power over 2 squared, that's 4m to the 4th power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on integer exponents and the quotient rule. All right, so we want to simplify. We have 2x squared times, inside of parentheses, 2x cubed times y to the power of negative 1. This whole thing in the parentheses is raised to the power of negative 3. So let's start out by simplifying what's inside the parentheses. So times 2 is raised to the power of negative 3. And then I have x cubed raised to the power of negative 3. So x stays the same. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. I have y to the power of negative 1, that's raised to the power of negative 3. y stays the same. Negative 1 times negative 3 is 3. So I have 2, and then I have 2 raised to the power of negative 3. So I can think about this as 2 to the first power. So product rule for exponents tells me I can do 2 raised to the power of 1 plus negative 3, which would end up being negative 2. Then I have x squared. So x squared, and I have x to the power of negative 9. So I'd have x raised to the power of 2 plus negative 9, or x raised to the power of negative 7. And then I just have y cubed. y cubed. So it's perfectly legal to keep this this way. Or if I wanted to write this using positive exponents, I could bring this into the denominator. So I would have y cubed in the numerator. 2 to the power of negative 2 can come down here. The only difference is this negative 2 has to be positive. I can drag something across the fraction bar, but the exponent has to change its sign. So it's negative here. When it goes into the denominator, it has to be positive. Same goes for x raised to the power of negative 7. It's negative here. comes down here. It has to be positive. So we end up with y cubed over 2 squared, or you could write 4, times x to the 7th power. All right, for the next problem, inside these brackets here, I have inside of parentheses in the numerator, negative 2n raised to the power of negative 4. That whole thing inside the parentheses is squared and times, we have n raised to the power of negative 4. This is raised to the fifth power, and it's over negative n cubed. Now, everything in the brackets here is raised to the fourth power. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with everything inside the brackets first, then take that result and raise it to this fourth power here. I'll do that last. So to begin in the numerator, I have negative 2 that's squared. So negative 2. That's squared, and it's inside of parentheses here, so it's going to be inside of parentheses here. Then I have n raised to the power of negative 4. That's squared. So n stays the same. Negative 4 times 2 is negative 8. Then times I have n raised to the power of negative 4. That's raised to the fifth power. So n stays the same. Negative 4 times 5 is negative 20. And this is over. You can write this as negative 1 times n cubed. Make it a little easier on yourself. So what can I simplify in the numerator here? Well, I know that n raised to the power of negative 8 times n raised to the power of negative 20 would be n raised to the power of negative 8 plus negative 20, which is negative 28. Negative 2, that quantity squared, is 4. So I can just write 4 here. If you want to leave it like this since we're working with exponents, I think that's fine for most people. Then this is over. I have a negative 1 times n cubed. 
So what I can do, quotient rule for exponents tells me that I can take n, I'm going to start by just writing the 4 there, I can take n, and I can subtract, I can take the exponent in the numerator, which is negative 28, and I can subtract away the exponent in the denominator, which is 3. Negative 28 minus 3 is negative 31. So this will end up being 4n to the power of negative 31 over negative 1, which of course we could write as negative 4 over n to the power of 31. Remember, it doesn't matter if I have a negative 1 down here, I can make the numerator negative or the denominator negative, as long as they're not both negative. So that's why I have negative 4 there. If I want to take n and bring it into the denominator, I've got to take the exponent and change the sign. So the sign here is negative, now it's positive. So this n came kind of across the fraction bar, came from the numerator into the denominator, and then this negative 31 now becomes positive 31. And so my answer becomes negative 4 over n to the power of 31. Now, we are not done. Remember, I just worked with what was inside the brackets here, this part. I still need to raise this to the fourth power. So let me erase everything. Let me erase everything and just keep my final answer there and say that this is equal to, we have negative 4 over n to the power of 31. So this is all raised to the fourth power. Look how easy this is going to be for us now. So I have negative 4. That amount, the negative and the 4, is going to be raised to the fourth power over n to the 31st power raised to the fourth power. So n stays the same. 31 times 4 is 124. So if you wanted to, again, work with exponents, you could kind of leave it like that. But a lot of teachers, again, some of them are going to want you to simplify it. Some of them won't. Negative 4 to the 4th power, you have a positive result, right, because you have an even number of negatives. So 4 to the 4th power would then be 256. So I get 256 over n to the 124th power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on integer exponents and the quotient rule. So we want to simplify. We're looking at negative. We have pqm squared times pq over. Inside of parentheses, we have 2m p squared q squared. Everything inside the parentheses is squared. So here's what we're going to do here. We keep the negative out in front and we're going to simplify in the numerator. p times p. Keep the base p the same and add the exponents. So this is really p to the first power and this is p to the first power. 1 plus 1 is 2. So this would be a 2. And then I have q. I have q and q. So again, q to the first power, q to the first power. Keep q the same, add the exponents, 1 plus 1 is 2. And then you'd have m squared. Over. I'm going to use my power to power rule to simplify here. I'd have 2 squared times m squared times p squared, which is squared, so p stays the same. Multiply the exponents, 2 times 2 is 4. Then q squared is squared, q stays the same, 2 times 2 is 4. So I have my negative, and then between the numerator and denominator, I each have a p variable. So what I can do is use my quotient rule for exponents, and I can have p raised to the power of 2 minus 4. 2, the exponent of the numerator, minus 4, the exponent of the denominator. Then I'm going to do the same thing for q. It's raised to the power of 2. Here it's raised to the power of 4. So I'm going to raise it to the power of 2 minus 4. And then I have m. That's raised to the power of 2 here, to the power of 2 here. Really, any non-zero number over itself is 1. So really, I can think about just canceling this here. We're writing it as m to the power of 2, which is the value in the numerator for the exponent, minus 2, which is the value in the denominator for the exponent, which we know is going to be 0. So then this is all over 2 squared. So what do we get? We know we have negative. p to the power of 2 minus 4 would be p to the power of negative 2. q to the power of 2 minus 4 is q to the power of negative 2. And then m to the power of 2 minus 2 is m to the power of 0. And again, this is over 2 squared, which you can write as 4. So then I'd have negative. I can just write the p in the denominator, and I can make the exponent positive. Right? If you drag something from the numerator into the denominator, you've got to change the sign of the exponent. So because it's in the numerator here and it's negative 2, when it goes into the denominator, it becomes a positive 2 for the exponent. Same thing goes for q. I can drag it into the denominator, but instead of being a negative 2, it's going to be a positive 2. 
m raised to the power of 0 is 1. And then I have a 4 here, which I'm going to put in front of the variables. So this ends up being negative, or I could write negative 1, over 4p squared q squared. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4 on integer exponents and the quotient rule. All right, so we want to simplify. We have inside of parentheses 2pn to the power of negative 1. And then everything in the parentheses here is raised to the power of negative 2. And times we have negative 2, pm squared n to the power of negative 2. And this is over m squared n squared. All right. So I'm going to start out by just using my power to power rule over here. So I would have 2 raised to the power of negative 2, p raised to the power of negative 2. And then n is raised to the power of negative 1. That whole thing is raised to the power of negative 2. So n would stay the same. And I'd multiply the exponents. So negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. And then times I have negative 2 times p times m squared times n to the power of negative 2. And this is over. We have m squared n squared. All right, so many different ways to simplify. Kind of the easy thing that I'm looking at here is that I have m squared here and m squared here. So rather than going through any kind of rules, I can just kind of cancel this with this and write a 1. And I also see that I have n squared and n squared. I can cancel this with this and write a 1. So, you know, save yourself a little bit of time with that, especially if you're on an exam. So then what that would simplify to, I would have 2 to the power of negative 2. And then I would have p to the power of negative 2. I would have negative 2. I would have p. I could put p to the power of 1. And then n to the power of negative 2. I can write this over 1 for right now. So what am I going to do? 2 to the power of negative 2 is the same as 1 over 2 squared. Then times p to the power of negative 2. And then p to the power of 1. That's p raised to the power of negative 2 plus 1, which is p raised to the power of negative 1. Then times I have just negative 2 then times n raised to the power of negative 2, which is 1 over n squared. One thing I can do is I can think about this negative 2 as negative 1 times 2 to the first power. And since I have the same base between here and here, what am I doing? I can take 1 and subtract away 2. And so I would end up with, I can kind of get rid of that and say, this is negative 1 times 2 raised to the power of negative 1. So to put all this together, I have 1 times p to the power of negative 1. So 1 times p to the power of negative 1, that's p to the power of negative 1, times negative 1, so negative 1, times 2 to the power of negative 1, 2 to the power of negative 1, times 1 again over n squared. So I can take both of these and drag them down here. I just need to change the sign of the exponents. So I would have negative 1 over this I'm dragging down there. So that would be p to the power of positive 1, and then times n squared, and then times 2 to the power of negative 1. Again, I can drag 2 down here, but I've got to change the sign of the exponent to positive 1. And then I can just write this as negative 1 over 2pn squared. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5, on integer exponents and the quotient rule. All right, so we want to simplify. So we have 2n p squared times m n to the power of 0 p squared times. Inside of parentheses, we have negative 2 p m to the power of negative 1 n squared. All this in the parentheses is now raised to the power of negative 1. And this is over. We have negative 2 p m squared n to the power of negative 2. And really, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. But I'm just going to start out. I'm going to keep this 2 here in the numerator. n times n to the power of 0 is just n, right? Because n to the power of 0 is 1. If you think about this, I have n to the power of 1 times n to the power of 0. So n stays the same. 1 plus 0 is 1. I still get n. Then I have m. And then I have p squared times p squared. So p stays the same. 2 plus 2 is 4. OK. Now over here, I'm using my power to power rule. So I have negative 2 raised to the power of negative 1. So times negative 2 raised to the power of negative 1. And then I have p raised to the power of negative 1, m to the power of negative 1 raised to the power of negative 1. So m stays the same. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Then n squared raised to the power of negative 1. So n stays the same. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So now down here in the denominator, negative 2 
and then we have p m squared n to the power of negative 2. So what can I simplify between numerator and denominator? I'm going to leave the 2s until last because I'm going to do a little trick with them. So I have n in the numerator. I have n to the power of negative 2 in the numerator. So let's go ahead and combine those first and then we'll figure this part out. So n to the first power times n to the power of negative 2. 1 plus negative 2 is negative 1. So this is n to the power. Let's go ahead and write it right here. I'm just going to erase this from here and put n to the power of negative 1. And then we have m and we have m to the power of 1. So this is the same, right? This is I could say this is m to the power of 1 also. So 1 plus 1 would be 2. So really this would be m to the power of 2. And then p to the fourth power times p to the power of negative 1. Really, I can think of this as p to the power of 4 plus negative 1, which is p to the third power. And now I have this negative 2 to the power of negative 1. So let's deal with this real quick. If I was to write this as negative 1 to the power of negative 1 times 2 to the power of negative 1, and I am allowed to legally separate it that way, well, I can say, okay, I have 2 to the power of 1 times 2 to the power of negative 1. Really, the 2s would just be canceling out because... 2 to the power of negative 1 is 1 half, and 1 half times 2 is equal to 1. So another way to think about that is 1 plus negative 1 is 0, 2 to the power of 0 is 1. So I can just erase these, just get rid of them. All right, so this is what's left. Now, to get to the final part, I have an n to the power of negative 1, I have an n to the power of negative 2. So that's going to be n raised to the power of negative 1 minus a negative 2. Then I have m squared and m squared. We know those would cancel, but officially it would be m raised to the power of 2 minus 2, right? 2 minus 2 is 0. Anything to the power of 0 other than 0 is 1. So I can just erase that. Then p cubed minus, I have in the denominator here, p to the first power. So p cubed minus 1. So that takes care of all of that. Now I also have this negative 1 to the power of negative 1. So I can just drag this down here and say this is negative 1 to the first power, right down here. So in my denominator, I can really think of this as having negative 1 times negative 1 times 2. And I've already taken care of the p, the m squared, and the n to the power of negative 2. So now my simplified answer is going to be n to the power of negative 1 minus a negative 2. Minus a negative 2 is plus 2, so this is n to the power of 1 or just n, then p to the power of 3 minus 1, so this is p squared, and this is over. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2. So I'll write this as p squared n over 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 28. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on scientific notation. All right, so we want to write each number in scientific notation. We're going to start out with 623,000. So this is really easy. We're going to first start out by generating a number here that's going to be multiplied by 10 raised to some power. So these are the two blanks that I basically need to fill in. Now the first thing I'm going to do to generate this number is move my decimal point immediately after the first non-zero digit in the number. And I'm starting from the left and I'm going to the right. So the first non-zero digit is the 6. And so I'd move my decimal point to right after that. So I would have 6 point two, three. Now there's zeros that come after the three. I could put zero, 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 but because I now have a decimal point here, the zeros don't add any value to the number, so I can delete them. So I have 6.23 times 10 to what power? Well, you count how many places you moved your decimal point. So I went one, two, three, four, five places to the left. So the number of places I moved it is five. That's the absolute value of the exponent. But does it need to be positive 5 or negative 5? Well, if I moved it to the left, that means to get back to the original number, I've got to go to the right. And so I need to have a positive 5 here. So let me erase this and put positive 5. Another way to think about this is that if your original number is bigger than this number that you form here, your exponent on 10 needs to be positive. If your original number was smaller than what you formed, then your exponent on 10 would need to be negative. So 623,000 in scientific notation is 6.23 times 10 to the fifth power. All right, what about 7,315,000? Again, all I want to do is set up this times 10 to something. 
So again, I'm going to put my decimal point immediately after the first non-zero digit. So immediately after that seven. So I'd have 7.315. And the zeros after the five, I can just delete them. I don't need them anymore. Then the 10, I'm raising that to some power. So I get that by counting the number of places I've moved my decimal point. So I went one, two, three, four, five, six places to the left. Now, do I want negative six or positive six? Again, if this number is bigger than the number that I formed here, I want a positive six because I want to end up moving this back to the right to get back to the original number. What about 0 0.0001709? Again, move your decimal point immediately after the first non-zero digit. So it's going to go right here. I'm coming from the left, moving right. That's the first non-zero digit. So 1.709, then times 10 to what power? Well, this time, remember, this right here is now bigger than this. So I'm going to have a negative exponent here because I'm going to want to move my decimal point to the left to get back to the original number. And I'm going to want to move it one, two, three, four places to the left. So this would be times 10 to the power of negative 4. So I'm going to end up with 1.709 times 10 to the power of negative 4. What about 0 0.0000000805? Well, this is going to end up moving over here to right after the 8. So I'd have 8.05 times 10 raised to what power? Well, this is going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 places to the right. So I'm going to put a negative 8 here because in order to take this number and get back to this number, I need to take this decimal point and go 8 places to the left. So I need a negative 8 as the exponent for 10 in order to do that. So I end up with 8.05 times 10 to the power of negative 8. Again, another way to think about it is if this number is larger than the original number, you need a negative exponent. If it's smaller than the original number, you want a positive exponent. All right, now we just want to write without exponents. So I have 7.51 times 10 to the third power. So I just take the 7.51, and I take the decimal point, and I move it three places to the right, because I have a positive 3 as my exponent for 10. So I'd go 1, 2, 3 places to the right, and end up with 7,510. What about 1.9 times 10 to the power of negative 5? Well, I'm going to take the 1.9, and then I'm going to move this decimal point five places to the left. So I'm going to put in four zeros here. So this can go one, two, three, four, five places to the left. And I'll end up with, let me erase that decimal point there, 0 0.000019. What about 3.798 times 10 to the 12th? So I'm going to write 3.798. This is going to go 12 places to the right, this decimal point. So I'm going to put in nine zeros here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then 12. So I'm going to get 3 trillion, 798 billion is my answer. All right, now I'm looking at 5.68 times 10 to the power of negative nine. So 5.68. So I'm just going to move my decimal point nine places to the left, right? Because I have a negative nine as the exponent on 10. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros in front of that five. So I can move the decimal point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places to the left. And I erased the zero accidentally. So I would have 0 0.000000568 as my answer. So now we're going to look at some more advanced examples. And you might see this at the end of your section on scientific notation. You have 2 times 10 to the 4th times 3 times 10 to the 7th. So two numbers in scientific notation, you're multiplying them together. Just multiply the numbers like 2 and 3 together first. And then you'd end up with 6 times 10 to the 4th times 10 to the 7th. We can combine with the product rule for exponents. The base 10 stays the same, and then 4 plus 7 is 11. So you get 6 times 10 to the 11th. And if I wanted to write that without exponents, I could just write a 6 and move my decimal point 11 places to the right. So 
I would put in 11 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So then comma, 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 and I'm going to end up with 600 billion as my answer. All right, what about 5 times 10 to the power of negative 6 over 2 times 10 to the power of negative 3? So what I would do here is think about 5 over 2 or 5 halves. You could write that as a decimal as 2.5. Then times, we have 10 to the power of negative 6 over 10 to the power of negative 3. So that's 10 raised to the power of negative 6 minus a negative 3. All right, that's your quotient rule. So negative 6 minus a negative 3 is negative 6 plus 3. So this ends up being minus 3 here. So then I would say 2.5 times 10 to the power of negative 3. This is going to go 1, 2, 3 places to the left. So I'll have 0 0.0025 as my answer. All right, next I'm looking at 8.3 times 10 to the fourth power. We're multiplying this by 1.1 times 10 to the power of negative 2. So I would do 8.3 times 1.1. So that's going to end up being 9.13 times, you have 10 to the fourth and 10 to the power of negative 2. So your base 10 stays the same, and then 4 plus negative 2 is 2. So you end up with 9.13 times 10 squared, and so this would end up being 913, right? Because this would just move one, two places to the right to give me, again, 913 as my answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Scientific Notation. So we're going to write each number in scientific notation. And we're going to look at 972 million to start. So I want to set up this as something times 10 to some power. That's scientific notation. And essentially what I'm going to do to get this part over here, I'm just going to look at the original number and I'm going to put a decimal point after the first non-zero digit. Starting from the left and moving to the right, I see I have a nine. That's a non-zero digit, so I'd move my decimal point immediately after that. So I'd have 9.72. Now, I have six zeros after the two. But once I transform it to this number, 9.72, I don't need the six zeros after the two because they don't add any value to the number, so I can just delete them. So then times 10 to what power? Well, we get that from how many places we move the decimal point in which direction we move it. So we went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places to the left. Now, if I move eight places to the left, to get back to the original number, I've got to go to the right. And if I'm moving to the right, I need a positive eight as my exponent for 10. So this is going to be 10 to the eighth power. So then 972 million is equal to 9.72 times 10 to the eighth power. Let's take a look at the next one. We have 0 0.0000162. So again, I want something times 10 to some power. So I'm gonna move this decimal point immediately after that first non-zero digit, so immediately after here. So this would be 1.62. Now my exponent on 10, again, I move the decimal point one, two, three, four, five places to the right. So do I want a positive 5 or a negative 5? Well, this number here is bigger than this original number. So I want a negative 5. I want a negative 5. And you can think about it like that, or you could say, okay, well, in order for me to go from this to this, I would have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places to the left. So in order to go to the left, I need a negative. So I end up with 1.62 times 10 to the power of negative 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on scientific notation. All right, write each number in scientific notation. So we have 5 quadrillion, 331 trillion. So to write this number in scientific notation, I'm going to set up something that looks like this, right? It's something times 10 to some power. Now, I get this first part over here by just placing the decimal point immediately to the right of the first non-zero digit. That's coming from the left and going to the right. So immediately after the five. So I'd have 5.331. Now I don't need to write all these zeros after that one because I have a decimal point there and after the one they would add no value. So I'd have 5.331 times 10 to what power? 
Well, I move my decimal point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 places to the left. So I would want a positive 15. And there's a few different ways you can think about that. Well, this number here is smaller than the original number. So I've got to multiply by 10 to the power of a positive 15 to get back because I want this moving to the right in order to get back to the original number. You could also just kind of eyeball it and say, well, if I went to the left, I need to go back to the right, multiply by a positive 15 to go back to the right 15 spaces. You know, any kind of way that you rationalize that and remember, you end up with 5.331 times 10 to the 15th power. All right, what about 0 0.000000000 0.00005037. So again, I want, this is gonna be something times 10 to some power. So this part right here, just move this decimal point immediately after the first non-zero digit. So I would have one point and then zero, five, zero, one, and I need to back this up a little bit, three, seven, okay, times 10 to some power. So where am I gonna get the power from? Well, this is going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places to the right. So my exponent is gonna be a negative nine. Because to get back to the original number, I need to go nine places to the left, right? I need to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that corresponds to an exponent of negative nine. So I get 1.050137 times 10 to the power of negative Nine. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on scientific notation. All right, we want to write each without using exponents. So I have 4.78 times 10 to the fifth power. So all I need to do here is just rewrite 4.78 and then move this exponent five places to the right, right? Because I have a positive five as my exponent on 10. So one, two, put three zeros here, three, four, five, places to the right, and I ended up with 478,000. What about 1.951 times 10 to the power of negative 10? So let's rewrite this, 1.951, and then this decimal point is gonna go 10 places to the left. Right, I have a negative 10 as my exponent on 10, so that corresponds to moving the decimal point 10 places to the left. So let me write in nine zeros, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and finally 10 places to the left. And I accidentally erased the zero. So I'd end up with 0 .000000000001951. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on scientific notation. So we wanna write each without using exponents and we have 3.18 times 10 to the power of zero. So this is about as simple as it can get because 10 to the power of zero is one. So this is basically 3.18 times one, which is just 3.18. What about 6.28 times 10 to the power of negative four? Well, I would just write 6.28 and I have an exponent on 10 that's negative four. So negative is telling me to go to the left and then by four spaces. I put in three zeros here. This is gonna go one, two, three, four places to the left. And so I'd end up with 0 0.000628. Hello and welcome to Algebra One, test section five on scientific notation. All right, we wanna write each without using exponents. So we're gonna look at 12 times 10 to the power of negative four times eight times 10 to the power of four. So I would multiply 12 times eight first. That's gonna give me 96. And then times 10 to what power, right? The same base here, just add exponents. Negative four plus four is zero. So 10 to the power of zero will be one. So this would basically be 96 times one, or just 96. All right, for the next one, let's look at 2.05 times 10 to the power of nine over 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative two. So 2.05 divided by 1.6, this is gonna be equal to 1.28125. Then times, we have the same base here of 10, 
And the quotient rule for exponents tells us we can take the exponent in the numerator, which is 9, and subtract away the exponent in the denominator, which is negative 2. So 9 minus a negative 2 is 9 plus 2, or 11. So let's just write this as 11. So I would just take this decimal point here, move it 11 places to the right. So 1.28125. So this would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I would put six zeros behind this 5. So then this would be 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 11. So put some commas in here. And I ended up with 128 billion, 125 million as my answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 29. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to state the degree of each polynomial and if it's a monomial, binomial, or trinomial. All right, so we're looking at p squared minus 4p minus 10. So how do we find the degree of the polynomial? Remember, the degree of the polynomial is equal to the largest degree of any term of the polynomial. So to find the degree of a specific term, you just sum the exponents on all the variables of that term. So for example, with this one, we just have the variable p. So it's very easy. So I have p squared, so that 2 there the degree of this term, p squared, is 2. Here I have a negative 4p. So I have p basically raised to the first power. So the degree of this term is a 1. Here I just have negative 10. If you have a constant term, the degree is always 0. Okay, it's 0. So if we look here, the highest degree is 2. So the degree, the degree of the polynomial is 2. And then it has three terms, one, two, three, and so it's a trinomial. For the next one, I have negative 7x to the sixth power plus 2x cubed minus 8x squared. So again, I look at the variables here. I have x to the sixth power, so the degree for this term is a 6. I have x cubed, so the degree for this term is 3. I have x squared, so the degree for this term is 2. So the degree for the polynomial is going to be 6. So the degree is 6. And then again, it has three terms, 1, 2, 3. So it's a trinomial. What about negative 3x cubed? Well, this one's real easy. I just have one term here. And the variable x is raised to the third power, so the degree is going to be 3. So the degree is 3. And then when we have a single term for our polynomial, that's known as a monomial. What about negative 6? Again, if you have a constant term, you could think about it as this number here times a variable, could be any variable you want it to be, it could be x or y or z or w, whatever, raised to the power of 0. And so you can see that 0 is the exponent on the variable, and so the degree is 0. So the degree is 0, and again, it's called a monomial. Right, A single term polynomial is a monomial. What about negative 2n to the 6th power minus 5n to the 4th power? So we have n to the 6th power, so this is a 6 here for the degree. We have n to the 4th power, so this is a 4 here for the degree. And so the degree for the polynomial is 6, and then it has two terms, so that's known as a binomial. All right, so now we're just going to have some practice with adding and subtracting polynomials. So let's start out with x to the fourth power plus 5x. We're adding to this 5x minus x to the fourth power. So I have x to the fourth power plus 5x plus 5x again minus x to the fourth power. All I want to do is combine like terms. So I have x to the fourth power and I have negative x to the fourth power. Those are going to cancel, right? So I can just kind of cancel those out. Say those are gone. I'm left with just 5x plus 5x. 5 plus 5 is 10. Keep the variable part the same, so this is 10x. 
All right, now we have p cubed minus 4p, and I'm subtracting away 2p plus 2p cubed. Again, for addition of polynomials, it's very, very simple. With subtraction, you have this additional step. So kind of the first polynomial, the one on the left, always stays the same. So it's p cubed minus 4p. The second polynomial, you're going to change the sign of each term inside, and then you're going to add. So in other words, this subtraction is going to become addition, and the 2p will become negative 2p. So, and then the 2p cubed will become negative 2p cubed. And again, an easy way to think about this, a lot of teachers will tell you, just put plus negative 1. When you see a negative outside of a set of parentheses, it's going to remind you that you're going to distribute this negative 1 to each term. And what that's going to do, it's going to change the sign of each term. So this was 2p, it became negative 2p. This was 2p cubed, it became negative 2p cubed. Once we've done that, we can just add, just like we had an addition problem. All right, so the first thing I'm going to combine, I have like terms here and here. So p cubed and negative 2p cubed, you think of this as a 1 for the coefficient. 1 minus 2 or 1 plus negative 2 is negative 1. So I'd have negative 1 p cubed, or of course you could just write negative p cubed, doesn't matter. And then I'd have negative 4p plus negative 2p. Negative 4 plus negative 2 is negative 6. So this would be minus 6, and then the variable p stays the same. So I'd have negative p cubed minus 6p as my answer. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have 10r to the fourth power plus 2r to the fifth power plus 8r cubed. And then again, we're subtracting away. We have 8r minus 13r to the fifth power plus 13r cubed. So again, if you ever see a subtraction sign or a negative sign outside of a set of parentheses, in order to remove the parentheses, you've got to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. So however you remember to do that. If you just make this a plus and you make everything the opposite in here, that's fine. But a lot of teachers will say, okay, make this a plus and put a negative one out in front of the parentheses so you remember to use your distributive property. So the first part is going to stay the same. We have 10r to the fourth power plus 2r to the fifth power plus 8r cubed. And then I'm going to use my distributive property and say, okay, well, negative one times 8r, I'm just changing the sign, that's going to be negative 8r. Then negative 1 times negative 13r to the fifth power, that's plus 13r to the fifth power. Again, just changing the sign. Then negative 1 times 13r cubed is going to be negative 13r cubed. Again, just changing the sign. Everything just changed. This was positive, now it's negative. This was negative, now it's positive. This was positive, now it's negative. So if you can do that, if you can remember to do that without putting that plus negative 1, you're fine. Just do that. So now, I'm going to combine like terms. And what do I have? So I have 10r to the fourth power and nothing to combine with that. So 10r to the fourth power. And then I have 2r to the fifth power and 13r to the fifth power. So I'm going to go plus, 2 plus 13 is 15. So this would be 15r to the fifth power. And then next I have 8r cubed and negative 13r cubed. So 8 minus 13 is negative 5. So then minus. 5r cubed, okay? And then the last thing I have is minus 8r. So minus 8r. Now, this is the answer, but it's not in what we call standard form. For standard form, you're looking for decreasing in terms of the degree of each term. So in other words, I would start with the highest degree. So I'm looking for the highest exponent on r. That occurs here. So I would have 15r to the fifth power. Then the next highest occurs here. So then I'd have plus 10r to the fourth power. Then I would have minus 5r cubed, then minus 8r. So in other words, everything is decreasing. So you have r to the fifth, then r to the fourth, then r to the r cubed, or r to the third power, and then r to the first power. There is no r squared, so we don't have to worry about that there. Again, it doesn't matter if you're skipping powers. It's just a matter of it has to be in decreasing order. So in standard form, our final answer is 15r to the fifth power plus 10r to the fourth power minus 5r cubed minus 8r. All right, now we're looking at 4v to the fifth power plus 3v squared plus 7, then plus negative 12v squared plus 2v minus 5. So I'm going to write 4v to the fifth power plus 3v squared plus 7 plus negative 
12v squared plus 2v minus 5. So let's combine some like terms here. So I have 4v to the fifth power, nothing to combine with that. So 4v to the fifth power. Then I have 3v squared. I can combine that with negative 12v squared. And again, the way I write this, sometimes it looks like a u, but these are v's. And so 3 minus 12, or 3 plus negative 12, is negative 9. So then minus 9v squared. Then next I have this 7, and I have a negative 5. So 7 minus 5 is 2, so plus 2. And then lastly I have plus 2v, and again that looks like a u. Plus 2v, nothing to combine with that. And again, if I want this in standard form, I want it in decreasing order in terms of the degree of each term. So I have v to the fifth, v squared. v to the first power should go over here, and the constant term should go at the end. So we can just erase this and this and put plus 2v, and then finally, and I wrote that looking kind of like a u again, so plus 2v, and then again plus 2. So that's going to be your final answer there. 4v to the fifth power minus 9v squared plus 2v plus 2, and that's in standard form. All right, now let's take a look at negative 5n squared minus 10n cubed minus 11n to the fourth power plus 5n squared plus 6 minus 9n cubed minus 12n squared minus 7 minus 10n cubed. All right, so let's take a look at this. So this first one here stays the same. So minus 5n squared minus 10n cubed minus 11n to the fourth power then plus, we have 5n squared plus 6 minus 9n cubed. So this is a plus sign, so this stays the same. That's okay. But once we encounter a minus sign, again, if I have minus in front of a set of parentheses, and I know for the sake of not everything fitting on my screen, if I put it horizontally, it doesn't look like it would normally, but this minus sign would be out here in front of a set of parentheses. If you have that, in order to write this, next to this with addition, you've got to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. So if I can remember to do that, I can just put, okay, plus negative 12n squared, and then plus seven, right, changing the sign, and then plus 10n cubed, and it's done. And once you get enough practice, that's what you're gonna do. But for right now, I know your teacher or your tutor, whoever you're working with, or even your textbook will say, okay, put plus, and then put negative one here and then distribute the negative one to each term so you'll remember to do it, right? A lot of students will forget and they just drop the parentheses and they end up with just subtracting away this first term and the rest of it is just wrong. So you have negative one times 12n squared, that's negative 12n squared. You have negative one times negative seven, that's plus seven. You have negative one times negative 10n cubed, that's plus 10n cubed. So once we get in this format, we just combine like terms. So I have negative five n squared, I have five n squared, I have, those two would cancel by the way, let me just cancel those out. I'd have negative 12n squared and that would be it. So it would just be negative 12n squared, right? Because these two were opposites and they canceled. And let me just put a dot next to that or I can line it out. Whatever you want to do to say, hey, I've used this, I'm moving on. Then for the next one, I have negative 10n cubed, I have negative 9n cubed, and I have 10n cubed. So again, these would cancel, right? Negative 10n cubed and 10n cubed, those are opposites. That would go away. Then I would just have negative 9n cubed. So minus 9n cubed. Let me kind of just line this out. And I'm not saying that this canceled. I'm just saying I've used it. And I don't want to have to think about it again. All right, then next I have a negative 11n to the fourth power. Nothing to combine with that. So negative 11n to the fourth power. I'm going to line that out. And then I have 6 plus 7, that's 13. Line those out. And then put plus 13. Okay. And, you know, for the sake of being complete, I can just erase all of these. I know I've used everything at this point, so I can just kind of put it back where it was. Again, I'm just doing that so that I know what I've used and what I haven't used. So now I have negative 12n squared minus 9n cubed minus 11n to the fourth power plus 13. So this is the correct answer, but it's not in standard form. Again, you want to write your polynomial in a manner where the term with the highest degree is on the left. And then the next highest degree follows that, and then so on and so forth. So negative 11n to the fourth power, that term has the highest degree, right? The degree is four. So that's going to be on the left. 
Then we're gonna follow that with minus nine n cubed, then minus 12 n squared, then plus 13. So now there's your answer in standard form. So negative 11 n to the fourth power, minus nine n cubed, minus 12 n squared, plus 13. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. We have 12 u cubed v, minus 13 u v to the fourth power, plus we have negative 14 u to the fourth power v squared, plus five u cubed v plus three u. And then we're subtracting away, we have negative eight u plus three u v to the fourth power. So I'm gonna start out with this first polynomial. We have 12 u cubed v minus 13 u v to the fourth power. Now I'm adding the next polynomial, so I don't have to change anything. I can just kind of drop the parentheses. So minus 14u to the fourth power v squared plus 5u cubed v. Let me make that look a little better. And then plus 3u. Now for the next one, I'm subtracting away this polynomial. So remember, if I'm subtracting something away, I can add the opposite. So essentially I'm putting plus and then a negative one out in front because in order to drop the parentheses, I've got to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. I'm subtracting away the negative eight u, so that's got to become positive eight u, and I'm subtracting away the three u v to the fourth power, so that's got to become a negative three u v to the fourth power. So to do that, I put plus negative one. Again, I want to use that for now, just as a reminder to change each term's sign. So negative one times negative eight u. That would be positive eight u. Negative one times three u v to the fourth power. That would be negative three u v to the fourth power. So again, if you have a negative outside of a set of parentheses, to kind of drop the parentheses, you've got to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. I can't say that enough. All right, so now once I've done that, I just need to combine like terms. So if I look here, I have 12 u cubed v. Do I have that anywhere else? So it's here and it's here and not anywhere else. So 12 plus five is 17. So I would have 17 u cubed v. And I'm just gonna put a little line through these because I've used them. I'm, I'm not saying they're canceled out or anything like that. So please don't confuse what I'm doing here. I'm just using this as a method to keep track of what I've done. So then next I come across this negative 13u v to the fourth power. So these are like terms, this negative 3u v to the fourth power. So negative 13 minus three is negative 16. So minus 16u v to the fourth power. So let me line these out now. The next thing I come across is negative 14u to the fourth power v squared. Nothing to combine with that. So let me just write it, negative 14 u to the fourth power v squared, and line that guy out. Then lastly, I'm gonna deal with three u and eight u. Those are like terms, three plus eight is 11. So this would be plus 11 u. Now, this is the answer, 17 u cubed v minus 16 u v to the fourth power minus 14 u to the fourth power v squared plus 11 u, but it's not in standard form. So to put it in standard form, again, you wanna take the term with the highest degree, put it all the way to the left, then the next highest degree, then the next, and so on and so forth. So if I look at the degree on each one, I'm just gonna sum the exponents, right, if there's more than one variable. So this one, I have a three, and then I have an understood exponent here of a one. Three plus one is four. So the degree here is four. Here the degree is five, one plus four is five. Here the degree is six, four plus two is six. Here the degree is one. So what I would do is I would take the term with the highest degree, which is this one, and put it first. So negative 14u to the fourth power v squared. That's my first guy. Then minus, now I'm looking at this one. So I have negative 16u v to the fourth power. And then now I'm looking at this one. So plus 17u cubed v, okay? And now I'm looking at the final one, which is plus 11u. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're going to begin today 
with k cubed minus 2k squared, and then we're subtracting away 4k cubed minus 2k. So again, if you're subtracting polynomials, what you want to do is write the first polynomial. So we have k cubed minus 2k squared. And then I want to change the subtraction to addition. And then I want to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses. So 4k cubed would be negative 4k cubed. Negative 2k would be plus 2k. Now, another way you can do this, and what a lot of teachers will tell you, is if you see this minus sign outside of a set of parentheses, just put plus negative one. Then use your distributive property to distribute the negative one to each term. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna change the sign of each term. So instead of 4k cubed, you're gonna get negative 4k cubed. Instead of negative 2k, you're gonna get positive 2k. Now once this is done, we can just add. And the way we add polynomials is we just combine like terms. So if I have k cubed and negative 4k cubed, those are like terms, right? Same variable raised to the same power. So this is basically a coefficient of one. This is a coefficient of negative four. So you add the coefficients, you keep the variable part the same. One plus negative four is negative three. So this would be negative three K cubed. And then I don't have any more like terms. So I have minus two K squared plus two K. And that's it, that's all I can do. So my answer here is negative 3k cubed minus 2k squared plus 2k. And again, because there's no more like terms, I can't simplify this any further. All right, for the next one, we have 3p cubed minus 5, and then we're subtracting away 3p cubed plus 4. So again, the first polynomial is going to stay the same. So 3p cubed minus 5. I have this subtraction sign here. So I'm going to write it as plus negative 1. And so I'm going to distribute this negative to each term inside the parentheses. So negative 1 times 3p cubed, that would be minus 3p cubed. Then negative 1 times 4 would be minus 4. And now I just want to combine like terms. 3p cubed and negative 3p cubed are like terms. And they happen to have opposite coefficients. So when you add them together, they would cancel. So this would cancel with this. That's gone. I'm just left with negative 5 minus 4, and that's negative 9. So this simplifies to just negative 9. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. And so we have 5x plus 3 plus 1 plus 3x. So all we want to do here, we can go ahead and just remove the parentheses here. We just have straight addition. So 5x plus 3 plus 1 plus 3x. Essentially, I'm just going to combine like terms. That's how I'm going to add my polynomials. So 5x and 3x are like terms. Same variable, raised to the same power. So I just add the coefficients and leave the variable part the same. So 5 plus 3 would be 8, and then the variable x would stay the same. And then I have 3 and I have 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. So this would become 8x plus 4. All right, next I have 3n cubed plus 9n squared plus 14. Then plus, I have negative 4 plus 12n to the fourth power minus 12n squared. So we're going to have addition here. So I'm just going to kind of just rewrite everything. So 3n cubed plus 9n squared plus 14. And then we have plus, I have negative 4, plus 12n to the fourth power minus 12n squared. So just combine like terms here. So I have 3n cubed. Anything that I can combine that with, no. So 3n cubed. And every time I use something, I'm just going to line it out, or I could make a little kind of dot underneath it. That would be fine. doesn't really matter what you do. Just some kind of way to say, hey, I've already, I've already used that. Then I have plus 9n squared. Well, I can combine that with negative 12n squared. These are like terms. So the coefficient 9 plus the coefficient negative 12 would be negative 3. So this would be minus 3 and then the variable part n squared stays the same. Okay, so let me put some dots underneath each one to say, hey, we've used that. And then next I have 14 plus negative four. So these are obviously like terms, They're just constants. So 14 plus negative four is 10. So plus 10, plus 10. And then lastly, I have plus 12n to the fourth power. Nothing to combine with that, so we just rewrite it. 
So this is your answer, 3n cubed minus 3n squared plus 10 plus 12n to the fourth power. But it's not written in what we call standard form. For standard form, what you want is you want the polynomial to be written where the term with the highest degree is kind of first or all the way to the left. Now the degree of the term is found by looking at the exponent on the variable. So in this case, the exponent is a three, so the degree is a three. The exponent is a two, the degree is a two. There is no variable here, so typically what we'll just say is the degree is zero, right, for any constant, and then here the exponent is four, so the degree is four. So if I was to look at these numbers here, what's the highest? Well, it's four. So this is gonna be my leading term then when I write the polynomial. So it'll be 12 n to the fourth. Now the next highest value is three. So now I'm gonna put plus three n cubed. Then the next one is a two. So I'm gonna put minus three n squared. Then the last one, I have a zero, so plus 10. So now here's your answer written in standard form. 12 n to the fourth power, plus 3n cubed minus 3n squared plus 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we have 7m to the fifth power plus 6m cubed plus 14m to the fourth power. Then we're adding to this negative 3m to the fifth power plus 9m to the fourth power minus 11m cubed. So when you're adding two polynomials together, essentially you're just combining like terms. So let me just rewrite the first polynomial, 7m to the fifth power plus 6m cubed plus 14m to the fourth power, then plus, just write our second polynomial, so negative 3m to the fifth power plus 9m to the fourth power minus 11m cubed. And when you start getting a lot of terms involved, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of organize this. You can reorder this to where the terms that are like terms are next to each other, that's fine. Or you can just kind of, you know, as you go, just kind of mark things out to say I've used it. So I'm gonna do it the, the second way. So I'm gonna start out with 7m to the fifth power. Where's my like terms? So I have this one, I have negative 3m to the fifth power, nothing else. So I would combine these two by adding the coefficients and leaving the variable part unchanged. So seven plus negative three is four. And then the variable part m to the fifth power, we don't touch that. And then let me just throw an equal sign here. And kind of moving on now, I have six m cubed. Do I have anything else I can combine with that? Well, yes, I do. I have this guy over here, negative 11 m cubed. So these are like terms, six plus negative 11 is negative five. So then minus five M cubed. So these little dots are now telling me that I've used this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I have these two left. And those are gonna be like terms. So let me kind of combine those. I have 14 M to the fourth power and nine M to the fourth power. So those are like terms. 14 plus nine is gonna give me 23. So this is plus 23 M to the fourth power. Now this answer is fine, 4m to the fifth power minus 5m cubed plus 23m to the fourth power, but it's not in standard form. Remember for standard form, you want the term with the highest degree to be all the way to the left, then the next highest degree, then the next, so on and so forth. So these would have to switch positions, right? This degree is three, this degree is four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this as 4m to the fifth power, plus 23m to the fourth power minus 5m cubed. That way it's in standard form. Again, this answer is not wrong, it's just not in standard form. So in standard form, your complete answer is 4m to the fifth power plus 23m to the fourth power minus 5m cubed. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have 5b cubed minus 14b squared minus 6b plus we have 3b plus 6b squared plus 7b cubed. All right, so again, I'm just going to kind of drop the parentheses, write everything out, and just kind of combine like terms. That's all we need to do here. So 5b cubed minus 14b squared minus 6b plus 3b plus 6b squared plus 7b cubed. So if I look here, what do I have that are like terms? I have this one and this one. 
So 5b cubed and 7b cubed. 5 plus 7 is 12. So this would be 12b cubed. Then I have negative 14b squared and I have 6b squared. Negative 14 plus 6 is negative 8. So this would be negative 8b squared. And then I have negative 6b and I have plus 3b. Negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3, so minus 3b. So I end up with my answer. 12b cubed minus 8b squared minus 3b. And it is in standard form. Right? The degree of this term is 3, the degree of this term is 2, and the degree of this term is 1. So it's in descending order. So again, 12b cubed minus 8b squared minus 3b is your answer in standard form. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're going to look at negative 4x to the 4th power y plus 10xy to the 4th power. Then we're subtracting away. We have negative 2xy squared minus 12x squared minus 4x to the 4th power y minus 14xy to the 4th power. And then we're subtracting away 14x squared minus 9x to the 4th power y. So again, when you're subtracting polynomials, it's really not more difficult than adding. You just have to change the sign of each term for the polynomials that are being subtracted away. So for example, the first polynomial here, the one all the way on the top, or if I could write this horizontally, if I had enough space, it would be all the way on the left. That stays the same. So negative 4x to the fourth power y plus 10xy to the fourth power. I'll leave that unchanged. If I have a minus sign outside of a set of parentheses, I've said this a lot of times, I'm gonna keep saying it, I just need to change the sign of each term inside the parentheses, and then I can just combine like terms. Now, there's a number of different ways you can do that. You can just change the sign of each term. That's fine. You could just say, okay, well, this is negative, so now it's going to be positive. This is negative, so now it's going to be positive. This is negative, so now it's going to be positive. This is negative, so again, now it's going to be positive. Or a lot of teachers will recommend putting a plus and then a negative one outside of the set of parentheses. And that negative one outside of a set of parentheses is going to remind you to use the distributive property to distribute the negative one to each term. And what does multiplying by negative one do? It just changes the sign, right? So if I multiply negative one times negative two xy squared, I would get positive two xy squared. Negative one times negative 12 x squared would be positive 12 x squared, you know, so on and so forth. As I multiply by negative one, I get to change the sign of that term. And then once I've done that, I can just drop the parentheses. Okay, so continuing. I have a minus sign out in front of these parentheses. So again, I'm just gonna change the sign. So let me put plus negative one, and let me do it that way. So negative one times 14x squared is minus 14x squared. And then negative one times negative nine x to the fourth power y is plus nine x to the fourth power y. Okay, so now that we've set everything up, now we just combine like terms. Okay, we're good to go. So I have here a negative 4x to the fourth power y. And I also see that, let's see, that's here and here. So I've got three of those guys. But for us, the negative 4x to the fourth power y and the 4x to the fourth power y, those would cancel. Those would be gone. So I'd just be left with this right here, the 9x to the fourth power y. And a lot of times I'll line stuff out just to remind myself that I used it. And again, something that I'm really bad about, I keep forgetting to put equal sign up here. Let me put this equals up here. Kind of continuing, I'm gonna line these out. I know these were lined out because they canceled. I'm gonna line stuff out just to say I've used it, right? So I know where I am. Now I'm gonna look at 10xy to the fourth power. So I've got this guy and I've got 14xy to the fourth power and that's it. So if I combine those two, I would get plus 24xy to the fourth power. Again, I'm gonna line these out. I know they're not canceled. I'm just saying that I've used them before and I don't need to use them again. All right, now the next thing I have, 2xy squared, and I don't see that anywhere else, so I can just go ahead and copy it. So plus 2xy squared. And for the final thing, I have 12x squared and negative 14x squared. So if I do 12 plus negative 14, that's negative two. So I would end up with minus two x squared, okay? So let me erase all the lines. And again, I just did that to kind of remember what I used and what I didn't. The only thing that actually canceled here was the four x to the fourth power y. 
and the negative 4x to the fourth power y. Those had opposite coefficients. So this happens to already be in standard form for us. The degree of this term here is 5, right? You sum the exponents. This is 4, this is 1, so this would be a 5. This one here would also be a 5. This one would be a 3, and this one would be a 2. So we end up with 9x to the fourth power y plus 24xy to the fourth power plus 2xy squared minus 2x squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on adding and subtracting polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. We're going to look at x cubed y to the fourth power minus 7. Then we are subtracting away 6x cubed y to the fifth power minus 11 plus 10y to the fifth power minus 5x squared y squared. Then we're subtracting away negative 9x cubed y to the fourth power plus 11y to the fifth power. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, we're just going to copy this first part here. So x cubed y to the fourth minus 7. All right, now I'm subtracting away this polynomial. It's very long, but the main thing you need to realize is that if you're subtracting something away, you can add the opposite of it. So how do we do that? Well, there's a number of different ways. Kind of the most popular is to put plus and then make this a negative one out in front of the parentheses. And then the negative one out there will be distributed to each term. Essentially, all you need to do is change the sign of each term. And that's just a convenient way to remember how to do that. So negative one times six X cubed Y to the fifth power is negative. 6x cubed y to the fifth power. The negative 1 times negative 11 is positive 11. The negative 1 times 10y to the fifth power is negative 10y to the fifth power. The negative 1 times negative 5x squared y squared is positive 5x squared y squared. So again, we just change the sign of each term inside the parentheses, and then we can just add. We have to do this one more time, though, because we have another minus out in front of these parentheses. So I can put plus negative 1. And so negative 1 times negative 9x cubed y to the fourth is going to be plus 9x cubed y to the fourth. And then we have negative 1 times 11y to the fifth. So that's minus 11y to the fifth. Let me put my equal sign here before I move on. So now we just want to combine like terms. So I'm starting out here, I have x cubed y to the fourth. Anything that we have like terms with that? Well, we have this here and this here, 9x cubed y to the fourth. So you would add coefficients. I have a coefficient here of one, right? It's kind of an invisible coefficient, but it's there. And a coefficient here of nine. One plus nine is 10. So this would be 10x cubed y to the fourth. The next I have a negative seven. I have a 11. That's the only other constants I have. So negative 7, okay, negative 7 plus 11 would be 4. So let's put plus 4. Then next I have a negative 6x cubed y to the fifth. So do I have any like terms with that? I don't. So let's go ahead and write that. So minus 6x cubed y to the fifth. And then next I have negative 10y to the fifth. Any like terms with that? Yes, I have negative 11y to the fifth. So if I sum those, negative 10 plus negative 11 is negative 21. So then I would have, I would have negative 21y to the fifth. Then the next one, or the last one that we have, is just this 5x squared y squared. Nothing to combine with that, so I just put plus 5x squared y squared. Okay, so here's our answer but it's not quite in standard form. So to put a polynomial in standard form, we have to put the term with the highest degree all the way to the left or in the first position. Then we'd follow that with a term that has the next highest degree and so on and so forth. Well, we look at the exponents on the variables. And in the case of more than one variable, you would sum the exponents. So for example, here I have a three and a four. So the degree here is seven. Here I don't have any variable, so we can think of this as a degree of zero. Here I have three and five, three plus five is eight. Here I have five, right, just one variable, so I, it's real simple, I just look at the variable, okay, it's a five there, so that's the degree. And then for this one, I have x squared, y squared, so two plus two is four. So when I look at this, to write it in standard form, the term with the highest degree is this one. 
So that's going to lead us off. We have negative 6x cubed y to the fifth power. And then plus the term with the next highest degree is this one. We'll have 10x cubed y to the fourth. And we just continue. So then we'd have this one next. So minus 21y to the fifth power. And then we'd have this one plus 5x squared y squared. And then we'd have this one plus 4. So there's your answer in standard form. Negative 6x cubed y to the fifth power plus 10x cubed y to the fourth power minus 21y to the fifth power plus 5x squared y squared plus 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set 30. In this video we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on multiplying polynomials. All right, we want to find each product and we're going to start out with a really simple one. We have negative v times 6v minus 6. So recall to multiply these two polynomials together, we just have a monomial times a binomial here. I'm just going to use our distributive property. So I'm going to take this negative v and I'm going to multiply it by 6v to start. So I'd have negative v times 6v and then you can do minus negative v times 6. Negative v times 6. Now another thing you can do, you can always just include the sign in other words, you can just make this a negative 6, so you can kind of simplify this a little bit and say, okay, this is just plus negative v, negative v times negative 6. You can do that as well. You get the same answer either way. All right, so negative v times 6v. Basically, you think about this as negative 1 times 6, that's negative 6, and then v times v is v squared. Then I'll have negative v times negative 6. Negative times negative is positive. And v times 6 is just 6v. So then plus 6v. So there's my answer. Negative 6v squared plus 6v. All right, what about 4 times 5b plus 2? Well, again, I'm just going to use my distributive property. 4 times 5b would be 20b. Right? 4 times 5 is 20, and then b comes along for the ride. And then plus, next I'm going to have 4 times 2, and we know 4 times 2 is 8. So this ends up being 20b plus 8. What about just having a negative out in front of a set of parentheses? Well, we know from our previous lessons that if we have a negative outside of a set of parentheses, in order to remove the parentheses, we've got to change the sign of each term inside of the parentheses. One way you can think about this is just, let's say this is a negative 1. Okay, that negative out there could just be negative 1. Well, then we could distribute the negative 1 to each term. So negative 1 times negative 3n is positive 3n. Then negative 1 times positive 7 would be negative 7. So I could write 3n minus 7 as my answer. All right, now let's look at multiplying two binomials together. And in order to do this, you're going to multiply each term of the first polynomial by each term of the second polynomial. And in the next lesson, when we get to talking about FOIL, you're going to see a quicker and easier way to do this. But for right now, I'm just going to take 8n, and I'm going to multiply it by 3n minus 3. So 8n again, times 3n minus 3, and then plus, next I'm going to have 7 times 3n minus 3. So 8n times 3n, 8 times 3 is 24, n times n is n squared. 8n times negative 3, that's going to be negative 24n, and then plus 7 times 3n is 21n, and then 7 times negative 3 is negative 21, so minus 21. So now we're going to look at this as 24n squared. I have like terms here. I have negative 24n and I have 21n. If I combine those through addition, I'm going to end up with negative 3n and then minus 21. And so there's my answer. 24n squared minus 3n minus 21. What about 4x minus 7 times 4x plus 1? Again, I'm going to take each term from the first polynomial multiply it by each term from the second polynomial. So I'll do 4x times 4x plus 1. So 4x times 4x plus 1. And then plus, next I'm going to do negative 7 times this 4x plus 1. So negative 7 times this 4x plus 1. So 4x times 4x is 16x squared. 16x squared. Then plus 4x times 1, that's 4x. And then next I have negative 7 times 4x, so that's minus 28x. And then lastly I have negative 7 times 1, that's minus 7. So we have 16x squared plus 4x minus 28x 
is going to be negative 24x. So I'll put minus 24x, and then lastly, minus 7. So our answer here is 16x squared minus 24x minus 7. All right, what about something like this? We have negative 3 halves k plus 1 times negative 7 halves k plus 1. So kind of tedious when you deal with fractions, but you basically approach it the same way. I'm going to take this term right here and multiply it by this guy over here. So I'm going to have negative 3 halves k times negative 7 halves k plus 1. And then plus, I'm going to take 1 and multiply it by this guy. So 1 times negative 7 halves k plus 1. So negative 3 halves k times negative 7 halves k. We kind of write that out. Negative 3 halves k times negative 7 halves k. And then next I'd have plus negative 3 halves k times 1. Negative 3 halves k times 1. So let me kind of do this right here and I'll erase as I go. So negative 3 times negative 7 would be 21. 2 times 2 would be 4. Right? Nothing I can really cancel there. So this would be 21 fourths and then k times k is k squared. So this would be 21 fourths k squared. And then negative 3 halves k times 1 would just be negative 3 halves k. So minus 3 halves k. And then over here, 1 times anything is just itself. So I can just write minus 7 halves k and then plus 1. Right? 1 times this would be this. 1 times this would be this. All right, so any like terms I can combine. Well, yeah, I have them right here. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to have 21 fourths k squared, and then negative 3 halves k minus 7 halves k. Well, I have a common denominator of 2, so that's going to stay the same. And I have negative 3 minus 7, that's negative 10. So I'd have minus 10 halves k, but 10 halves is 5. So basically, this is just minus 5k, and then plus 1. So we end up with 21 fourths k squared minus 5k plus 1. All right, for the next one, I have a binomial times a trinomial. So I have 6x plus 1 times 6x squared minus 2x minus 7. So again, I'm going to take each term from this first polynomial and multiply it by each term of the second polynomial. So I'm going to do 6x times 6x squared minus 2x minus 7, and then plus 1 times 1 times 6x squared minus 2x minus 7. So 6x times 6x squared is going to give me 36x cubed. 6x times negative 2x is going to give me minus 12x squared. 6x times negative 7 is going to give me minus 42x. And then 1 times anything is itself. So this is basically plus 6x squared minus 2x and then minus 7. I'm right? just copying each one because 1 times 6x squared would just be 6x squared. 1 times negative 2x would be negative 2x. And 1 times negative 7 is just negative 7. All right, one times anything is just itself. All right, so let's look to combine like terms now. So I've got 36x cubed, nothing I can combine with that. I've got a negative 12x squared and a 6x squared. That would be negative 6x squared. And I've got negative 42x and minus 2x. So this would be minus 44x. And then lastly, minus 7. So we end up with 36x cubed minus 6x squared minus 44x minus 7. All right, now we have 6x squared plus x minus 5 being multiplied by 6x squared minus 7x plus 6. So a trinomial times a trinomial. So as we get bigger and bigger, we're just making the work more tedious, right? It's not any more difficult. So all I'm going to do is take each term from the first polynomial, multiply it by each term of the second polynomial. So in other words, 6x squared is going to get multiplied by this whole thing here. And I'm not going to write it out. I'm just going to kind of do it. So 6x squared times 6x squared would be what? That would be 36x to the fourth power. Then 6x squared times negative 7x, that would be minus 42x cubed. Then 6x squared times 6 would be plus 36x squared. And then we have x times this guy. So x times 6x squared is plus... 6x cubed, x times negative 7x is minus 7x squared, and then x times 6 is going to be plus 6x. Now lastly I have this negative 5 that I'm going to multiply by this guy. So negative 5 times 6x squared is negative 30x squared. 
negative 5 times negative 7x is plus 35x. And then lastly, negative 5 times 6 is minus 30. So we're not done. We have to combine like terms. I have 36x to the fourth power. Nothing I can combine with that. I have negative 42x cubed, 6x cubed. If I combine those, I'm going to end up with negative 36x cubed. Then I have 36x squared and negative 7x squared and negative 30x squared. So if I look at 36x squared and negative 30x squared first, that would give me 6x squared. And then 6x squared minus 7x squared would be negative, negative x squared. And then lastly, I have 6x and I have 35x. So if I combine those two, that's going to give me 41x. So plus 41x. And then lastly, minus 30. Minus 30. So we end up with 36x to the fourth power minus 36x cubed minus x squared plus 41x minus 30. All right, for the next one, I have negative 4 times 3n squared plus n plus 8 times 8n plus 2. So you'll recall from basic multiplication that I can multiply in any order. So I can multiply negative 4 times this guy and then take that product and multiply it by this guy, or I can multiply these two together and then multiply that by negative 4 or whatever you want to do. All right? If I have 3 times 7 times 3, I can do 3 times 7, that's 21. 21 times 3 is 63. I could do it like that, or I could you know, change it up and do 3 times 3 first, then times 7, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 times 7 is 63, you know, so on and so forth. So I'm just going to go in order, kind of left to right. So I'm going to do negative 4 times 3n squared. That's going to give me negative 12n squared. Then negative 4 times n, that's going to be negative 4n. And then negative 4 times 8 would be minus 32. So I'm going to have this guy times this guy. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take each term from here and multiply it by this. So I'd have negative 12n squared times 8n plus 2. And then I would have negative 4n times this guy. So I'm going to put plus and then negative 4n out here times this 8n plus 2. And then lastly, I'm going to put plus and I'm going to have negative 32 times this guy. So plus we have negative 32 times... Let me kind of write this down here to be a little easier. Negative 32 times this guy, 8n plus 2. All right, so negative 12n squared times 8n. We're going to start out with that. Negative 12 times 8, we know that's negative, And 8 times 12 is 96. So negative 96, n squared times n is n cubed. Negative 12n squared times 2 is negative 24n squared. Then I move on to negative 4n times 8n. So that's negative 32n squared. Then negative 4n times 2 is negative 8n. And then negative 32 times 8n is negative 256n. And then negative 32 times 2 is minus 64. All right, so we're going to end up with negative 96n cubed. Negative 24n squared minus 32n squared is negative 56n squared. And the negative 8n minus 256n, that's going to be negative 264n. And then lastly, minus 64. So we end up with negative 96n cubed minus 56n squared minus 264n minus 64. I can multiply in any order. So I can multiply these two together first. And take that product and multiply it by this, or I can multiply these two together first, or I can multiply these two together first. It, it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to go left to right. So I'm going to multiply these two together first. So I'm going to take 2k, this guy right here, and I'm going to multiply it by this polynomial here. So 2k times 3k would be 6k squared. 2k times negative 1 would be negative 2k. Then I'm going to multiply 3 times this guy here. So 3 times 3k is plus 9k. 3 times negative 1 is minus 3. So then that's taken care of. So now we're going to take this guy right here and we'll multiply it by this guy right here. Negative k plus 5. And before I move on, I can simplify in here first. Negative 2k plus 9k is going to give me 7k. So let me write this as plus 7k. 
that's going to reduce some of my work. All right, so I'm going to take each term here and multiply it by this. So 6k squared times negative k would be negative 6k cubed. Then 6k squared times 5 would be plus 30k squared. Then we do 7k times this guy. So plus 7k times negative k, that's going to be negative, and then 7k squared. Then 7k times 5, that's going to be positive 35k. And then lastly, I have negative 3 times this guy. So negative 3 times negative k is plus 3k. Negative 3 times 5 is minus 15. All right, so now we just want to simplify. So I've got negative 6k cubed. I've got these two like terms here. I've got 30k squared and negative 7k squared. That would give me plus 23 k squared. And then I've got 35k and 3k. That would give me plus 38k. And then lastly, I have minus 15. So minus 15. So I've got negative 6k cubed plus 23k squared plus 38k minus 15. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 1 on multiplying polynomials. All right, so we want to find each product. We're going to start out with negative 4a times negative 7a plus 6. So recall to do this, we're just going to use our distributive property. So I'm going to take negative 4a and I'm going to multiply it by each term inside the parentheses. So negative 4a times negative 7a, negative times negative is positive, 4 times 7 is 28, a times a is a squared. The next I'm going to do negative 4a times 6, negative times positive is negative, 4 times 6 is 24, and we just have the a that comes along for the ride. So our answer here is going to be 28a squared minus 24a. All right, next I have negative 2 times negative 4n minus 6. Again, I'm just going to use my distributive property. So negative 2 times negative 4n, negative times negative is positive, 2 times 4 is 8, so this would be 8n. And then next I'd have negative 2 times negative 6, and that's going to be positive 12. So this is going to end up being 8n plus 12. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 2 on multiplying polynomials. All right, so we want to find each product. And I have 8b cubed times, we have 8b minus 4. So all I'm going to do is use my distributive property here. So I'm going to take 8b cubed, I'm going to multiply it by 8b. 8 times 8 is 64. b cubed times b is b to the fourth power. And then next I'm going to take 8b cubed, multiply it by negative 4. So I'd have minus, right, because positive times negative is negative. 8 times 4 is 32. And then b cubed. So I end up with 64b to the fourth power minus 32b cubed. All right, let's take a look at 4n minus 4 multiplied by negative 7n minus 6. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take each term from the first polynomial and multiply it by each term of the second polynomial. So I'll just take 4n and multiply it by the second polynomial. So we'll do 4n times negative 7n minus 6. And then I'll have negative 4 times, okay, plus we'll have negative 4 times negative 7n minus 6. So 4n times negative 7n would be negative 28n squared. 4n times negative 6 would be negative 24n. And then next I have negative 4 times negative 7n, so that's plus 28n. And then negative 4 times negative 6 would be plus 24. Now I'm not done because I need to combine like terms here. I have negative 24n and positive 28n. And if I combine those two, I get 4n. So I'll end up with negative 28n squared. And then again, plus 4n. And then plus 24. So negative 28n squared plus 4n plus 24 is my answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on multiplying polynomials. All right, so we want to find each product. And I'm going to take a look at negative 5n plus 5 times negative 8n plus 4. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each term of the first polynomial and multiply it by each term of the second polynomial. So I'm going to set this up as negative 5n, this first term of the first polynomial, times the second polynomial. So negative 5n 
times negative 8n plus 4. So then plus, now I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to take 5, the second term of the first polynomial, and multiply it by the second polynomial. So we'd have 5 times this negative 8n plus 4. So negative 5n times negative 8n, that's 40n squared. Then negative 5n times 4, that's going to be minus 20n. And the next I have 5 times negative 8n, that's going to be minus 40n. And then I have 5 times 4, that's going to be plus 20. Now I just need to combine like terms here. I have negative 20n and negative 40n. That's going to be negative 60n. So we're going to have 40n squared minus 60n and then plus 20. All right, for the next one, we have some fractions involved, and it makes it a little bit more tedious, but again, you use the same process. So we have 5 halves r minus 5 halves times 5 halves r minus 10 thirds. So again, I'm going to take this right here, and I'm going to multiply it by this whole thing here. So I'd have 5 halves r multiplied by 5 halves r minus 10 thirds. And then I would take this negative 5 halves, and again, I'd multiply it by this guy here. So I put plus, and then I have negative 5 halves multiplied by 5 halves r minus 10 thirds. All right, let's scroll down, get a little room going. So 5 halves r times 5 halves r. 5 times 5 is 25, and 2 times 2 is 4. r times r is r squared. For the next one, I have 5 halves r times negative 10 thirds. So I know that's negative, and then I can think about cross-canceling this 2 with this 10. Right, so 10 divided by 2 is 5. So I would have 5 times 5, that's 25 over 3, and then, of course, times r. And then next we move on down here. We have negative 5 halves times 5 halves r. So negative times positive is negative. 5 times 5 is 25. 2 times 2 is 4. Right, so this would be negative 25 fourths r. Then lastly, I have negative 5 halves times negative 10 thirds. Negative times negative is positive. And then, again, I can cross-cancel this 2 with this 10. That would be 5, so I would have 5 times 5, that's 25 over 3. What am I going to end up with here? I have 25 fourths r squared. Here I need to combine like terms, but i got to have a common denominator. So to do that, I would multiply, let me kind of move this, let me kind of scooch this over a little bit. Multiply this by 4 over 4, and I'd multiply this by 3 over 3. So 25 times 4 is 100. So this would be minus 100 twelfths r. And then this guy, 25 times 3 is 75, so then minus 75 twelfths r. And then lastly, plus 25 thirds. So we get 25 fourths r squared. Negative 100 twelfths r minus 75 twelfths r is negative 175 r over 12, or negative 175 twelfths r, however you want to think about that. And lastly, plus 25 thirds. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on multiplying polynomials. All right, so we want to find each product. So we have 8p squared plus 3p minus 1 being multiplied by p squared plus 5p plus 5. So I'm going to take each term from the first polynomial and multiply by each term of the second polynomial. So the way I'm going to set that up is I'm just going to take 8p squared, multiply it by this guy, and because it would be so long and drawn out, I'm just going to kind of do it and write down the result as we go. So 8p squared times p squared would be 8p to the fourth power. Then 8p squared times 5p would be plus 40p cubed. Then 8p squared times 5 would be plus 40p squared. Then I'd move to the next term. I have 3p here. So I'm going to multiply that by this guy as well. So 3p times p squared is plus 3p cubed. 3p times 5p is plus 15p squared. 3p times 5 would be plus 15p. Then lastly, I have this negative 1. I'm multiplying negative 1 by this polynomial here. Remember, you multiply by negative 1, you're just changing the sign. So negative 1 times p squared is minus p squared. Negative 1 times 5p is minus 5p. And then negative 1 times 5 would be minus 5. So now all we need to do here is just combine like terms. So I have 8p 
to the fourth power, I have 40p cubed and 3p cubed. So that would be plus 43p cubed. I have 40p squared, 15p squared, and negative p squared. So 40 plus 15 is 55, then minus 1 would be 54. So this is plus 54p squared. And then we have 15p minus 5p. So 15p minus 5p, that's plus 10p. And then lastly, we have minus 5, so minus 5. So 8p to the fourth power plus 43p cubed plus 54p squared plus 10p minus 5 is my answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on multiplying polynomials. All right, so we want to find each product. And we have one that's going to be a little bit tedious, but we're going to take it step by step. Basically, all we want to do is multiply two of these polynomials together first. And then once we have that product, multiply it by the third one. Now, it doesn't matter which two you start with. Remember, if I have something like 6 times 5 times 3, I can do this in any order. 6 times 5 is 30, 30 times 3 is 90. Or I could flip this around and say, okay, what is 3 times 5 times 6? 3 times 5 is 15, 15 times 6 is also 90. However you want to do it, you get the same answer. So it's the same when we work with polynomials as well. Multiplication has a property that is called commutative. The order is not important. So let's just multiply these two together first, since they're next to each other, and then we'll take this product, we'll multiply it by this. So in order to do that, I need to multiply each term from this polynomial by each term of this polynomial. So I'm just gonna start out by taking this 2x squared and multiplying it by this entire polynomial. So 2x squared times 2x squared is 4x to the fourth power. 2x squared times 2x is plus 4x cubed. 2x squared times 1 is plus 2x squared. Now I'm going to move on to this term right here, which is negative x. And again, I'm going to multiply by the whole polynomial. So negative x times 2x squared is negative 2x cubed. Negative x times 2x is negative 2x squared. Negative x times 1 is minus x. And then I have one more term here. I have this 3. That's going to be multiplied by, again, 2x squared, so that's 6x squared, so plus 6x squared. And then 3, that's multiplied by 2x, so that's plus 6x. And then 3, that's multiplied by 1, so that's plus 3. So now, I'm going to combine like terms. 4x to the fourth power, nothing I can combine with that. And let's see, 4x cubed minus 2x cubed, that is 2x cubed, so plus 2x cubed. 2x squared minus 2x squared, those would cancel. And then I'd be left with 6x squared, so plus 6x squared. And then negative x plus 6x is plus 5x, and then plus 3. So the product of these two polynomials is going to be this. And all I have to do now is multiply it by this guy right here. So let me erase this. I don't need any of this anymore. We're going to say this is equal to this guy right here drag this up here, times this guy right here, negative 5x minus 1. So again, I need to multiply each term of this polynomial by this polynomial, and however you want to do that. If you want to say, okay, each term here times each term here, or if you want to say each term here times each term here, you get the same answer either way. So let me just do it this way. Let me take each term here, multiply it by each term here. So we would have 4x to the fourth power times negative 5x. That would be negative 20x to the fifth power. Then 4x to the fourth power times negative 1 is minus 4x to the fourth power. Okay, moving on. So now 2x cubed times negative 5x would be negative 10x to the fourth power. 2x cubed times negative 1 would be minus 2x cubed. Then now we move to this one. 6x squared times negative 5x is minus 30x cubed. 6x squared times negative 1 is minus 6x squared. Then move on to this one, 5x times negative 5x is minus 25x squared. And then 5x times negative 1 is minus 5x. Then on to this one, 3 times negative 5x minus 15x. And then 3 times negative 1 is minus 3. All right, so now all we want to do is combine like terms. So we have 
negative 20x to the fifth power. We have negative 4x to the fourth power minus 10x to the fourth power. That's minus 14x to the fourth power. I have negative 2x cubed minus 30x cubed. That's minus 32x cubed. I have negative 6x squared minus 25x squared. That's negative 31x squared. Negative 5x minus 15x is minus 20x. And then lastly, minus 3. So my answer here is negative 20x to the fifth power minus 14x to the fourth power minus 32x cubed minus 31x squared minus 20x minus 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set 31. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on FOIL. All right, so we want to use FOIL to find each product. So I'm going to take a look to start at 2x minus 7 times x minus 6. So I want you to recall that FOIL, the F stands for first. So I'm going to multiply the first term of this binomial times the first term of this binomial. So 2x times x would be 2x squared. Then the O in FOIL stands for outer. So the outer term here times the outer term here. So 2x times negative 6 is minus 12x. Then the I in FOIL stands for inner. So the inner term here times the inner term here. So negative 7 times x would be minus 7x. And then the last one we have is L. That stands for last terms. So the last term here times the last term here. Negative 7 times negative 6 is 42. So now we just have to combine like terms and we're done. So we have negative 12x minus 7x, that's negative 19x. So I'm going to end up with 2x squared minus 19x plus 42 as my answer. All right, let's take a look at 7m minus 5 times 5m minus 7. So again, I'm going to use my FOIL. I'm going to do the first terms. So 7m times 5m, that's 35m squared. I'm going to do my outer terms. So 7m times negative 7, that's going to be minus 49m. I'm going to do my inner terms. So negative 5 times 5m, that's minus 25m. Then I'm going to do my last terms. So negative 5 times negative 7, that's plus 35. So now all I need to do is combine like terms here. So what I'm going to do is have 35m squared negative 49m minus 25m is going to be negative 74m and then plus 35. So again, that final answer is 35m squared minus 74m plus 35. So let's take a look at 8p plus 5 times 2p minus 2. So the first terms, we're going to do 8p times 2p. That's going to be 16p squared. My outer terms, 8p times negative 2, that's minus 16p. My inner terms, 5 times 2p, that's plus 10p. And then my last terms, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. So I'm going to combine like terms here in the middle. I would have 16p squared. Negative 16p plus 10p would be minus 6p, and then minus 10. So again, the final answer here, 16p squared minus 6p minus 10. All right, let's take a look at 4n plus 7 times 8n plus 7. So again, I'm going to do my first terms. So 4n times 8n is 32n squared. My outer terms, 4n times 7 is 28n. My inner terms, 7 times 8n is 56n. And then my last terms, so 7 times 7, that's 49. So I'm going to have 32n squared. And then 28n plus 56n would be 84, so plus 84n, and then plus 49. So my final answer here is 32n squared plus 84n plus 49. All right, what about 5k plus 8 times 4k minus 5? So I'm going to multiply my first terms together. 5k times 4k would be 20k squared. Then I'm going to do my outer terms. So 5k times negative 5 would be minus 25k. Then my inner terms, 8 times 4k would be plus 32k. Then my last or final terms, 8 times negative 5 is negative 40. So I'm going to have 20k squared. Negative 25k plus 32k would be plus 7k. 
and then minus 40. So 20k squared plus 7k minus 40. For the next one, I have 8a minus 7b times negative 2a plus 6b. So we're going to multiply first terms together. 8a times negative 2a, that's going to be negative 16a squared. Then I'm going to have 8a times 6b, that's going to be plus 48ab. Then I'm going to have negative 7b times negative 2a, that's going to be plus 14ab. And then I'm going to have negative 7b times 6b, that's going to be negative 42b squared. So combine like terms in the middle. 48 plus 14 would be 62. So this would end up being negative 16a squared plus 62ab minus 42b squared. All right, let's take a look at negative m minus 3n times 5m minus 4n. So again, we want to do the first terms. So negative m times 5m, that's negative 5m squared. We want to do our outer terms. So negative m times negative 4n, that's plus 4mn. We want to do our inner terms. So negative 3n times 5m, that's minus 15mn. Then I want to do my last term. So negative 3n times negative 4n, that's plus 12n squared. So combine like terms in the middle here. I'll have negative 5m squared. 4mn minus 15mn would be negative 11mn and then plus 12n squared. So my final answer is negative 5m squared minus 11mn plus 12n squared. All right, for the next one, I have negative 5x plus 5y times negative 7x minus y. So I want to do my first terms. So negative 5x times negative 7x, that's 35x squared. I want to do my outside terms, negative 5x times negative y, that's plus 5xy. I want to do my inside terms, 5y times negative 7x is minus 35xy. And then lastly, I want to do my last terms, 5y times negative y, that's negative 5y squared. So combine like terms here in the middle, we would have 35x squared, and then 5xy minus 35xy would be minus 30xy, and then minus 5y squared. All right, for our final problem, we have 8a minus 5b times negative 3a plus 5b times a minus b. So I can't use FOIL for the whole thing here. Remember, FOIL is only used for the product of two binomials. So I can multiply two together using FOIL, and it doesn't matter which two. And then when I'm done, I've got to multiply that product by the remaining binomial. So let's go ahead and just multiply these two together using FOIL. So let's start out with our first terms. 8a times negative 3a is negative 24a squared. Our outside terms, 8a times 5b would be plus 40ab. Our inside terms, negative 5b times negative 3a would be plus 15ab. And then our last terms, negative 5b times 5b would be minus 25b squared. So combine like terms here in the middle, 40ab plus 15ab would be 55ab. So let's erase this and put plus 55ab. And then we'll kind of drag this over a little bit, kind of tighten this down. And put parentheses around it, and then it's being multiplied by a minus b now. So now I'm just going to take each term of this polynomial and multiply it by each term of this polynomial. So negative 24a squared times a is negative 24a cubed. Then next, negative 24a squared times negative b is plus 24a squared b. I'm going to do that with this guy. 55ab times a is plus 55a squared b. 55ab times negative b is minus 55ab squared. I'm going to do that with this guy. Negative 25b squared times a is minus 25ab squared. Then negative 25 times negative b is plus 25b cubed. So now I'm done. I just need to combine like terms. And what do I have here? So I have 24a squared b. I have 55a squared b. Nothing else that would be like terms with that. 
So 24 plus 55 is 79. So I'd write this first one, negative 24a cubed. And then the second one, again, that was plus 79a squared b. Then next, if we look, we have this negative 55ab squared. We have negative 25ab squared. Okay, those are like terms. Negative 55 plus negative 25 would be negative 80. So this would be minus 80ab squared. And then lastly, I have this plus 25b cubed. Nothing to combine with that. So my answer here is going to be negative 24a cubed plus 79a squared b minus 80ab squared plus 25b cubed. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on FOIL. So we want to use FOIL to find each product. So we're going to look at 3n minus 5 times 4n plus 5. So remember to use FOIL. First off, you have to have two binomials that you're multiplying together. That's what we have here. And we're just going to start out by using the F for first. So your first terms in each binomial will be multiplied together. So the 3n will be multiplied by the 4n. So that's 12n squared. Then the O in FOIL stands for outer terms. So 3n times 5, that's plus 15n. Then the I stands for inner terms. So negative 5 times 4n, that's minus 20n. And then the L stands for last terms. So minus 5 times 5, negative times positive is negative, 5 times 5 is 25. So now we just have to combine like terms here. So I'm going to have 12n squared, 15n minus 20n is minus 5n, and then minus 25. So I end up with 12n squared minus 5n minus 25 as my answer. All right, next I want to look at 5m minus 4 times 4m plus 4. So if I do the first terms, 5m times 4m would be 20m squared. My outer terms, 5m times 4 would be plus 20m. My inner terms, negative 4 times 4m would be minus 16m. And then my last terms, negative 4 times 4 would be minus 16. So we'll end up with 20m squared. 20m minus 16m is 4m, so plus 4m, and then minus 16. So again, my final answer here, 20m squared plus 4m minus 16. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on FOIL. All right, so we want to use FOIL to find each product. So we're going to start out by looking at 2x plus 5 thirds times 9 fourths x plus 1 fifth. So remember, when you use FOIL, you got to be talking about multiplying two binomials together. So this is a binomial, this is a binomial. So we're multiplying two of those together, so we're good to go. Now, FOIL is just an acronym. It stands for the F, first terms. So I'd start out by multiplying 2x times 9 fourths x. Now, this 2 here would cancel with this 4. This would cancel with this. This would be a 2. So this would basically be x times 9 halves x, which would be 9 halves x squared. Now, after I'm done with that, the O stands for outer terms. So that's 2x times 1 fifth. So that'd basically be plus 2 fifths times x. Then the i stands for inner terms. So 5 thirds times 9 fourths x. So then 9 would cancel with the 3 and give me a 3 here. So you'd have 5 times 3 or 15. 15x 15 over 4. Then you'd have the l. That stands for last term. So you'd have 5 thirds times 1 fifth. The 5 would cancel with the 5. So you'd basically just have 1 over 3 or 1 third. So the first thing I need to do here before I continue is get a common denominator going so I can combine these like terms in the middle. If I have a denominator of 5 and a denominator of 4, the LCD is going to be 20. So I can multiply this guy by 4 over 4 and multiply this guy by 5 over 5. So what I'm going to have is 9 halves x squared plus 4 times 2 is 8 over 4 times 5, that's 20, times x plus 5 times 15, that's 75, over 5 times 4, that's 20, times x, plus 1 third. So now I can combine like terms. We have a common denominator here of 20. So I'll have 9 halves x squared plus 8 plus 75 is going to be 83, so plus 83 over 20 times x. 
Now, 83 and 20 don't share any common factors, so that's how we're going to leave it, and then plus one-third. So your answer here is 9 halves x squared plus 83 over 20x plus one-third. All right, for the next one, I have negative 11 thirds x plus 12 fifths times 5x plus 5 halves. All right, so for FOIL, the first terms, negative 11 thirds x times 5x, nothing's going to cancel there, so it'd just be negative 55 thirds x squared. Then my outside terms, negative 11 thirds x times 5 halves. And again, nothing's going to cancel, so I would put negative 55x over 6. Then my inside terms, 12 fifths times 5x. So something would cancel here. The 5 would cancel with the 5. So I would basically have 12 times x or just 12x. And then lastly, I would do my L or my last terms. 12 fifths times 5 halves, the 5s would cancel, and 12 would cancel with 2 and just give me a 6. So this would just be plus 6. All right, so I still need to combine like terms in the middle. And to do that, I've got to have a common denominator. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have negative 55 thirds x squared, and then minus 55 over 6 times x, plus, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply 12 by 6 over 6, and then times x, and then plus 6. So let's just do this right here. 12 times 6 is 72. So this would be 72 over 6 times x. So continuing, I would have negative 55 thirds x squared. Then negative 55 plus 72 would be 17. So that would be plus 17 over 6, that common denominator times x, and then finally plus 6. So that's your answer there. Negative 55 thirds x squared plus 17 6 x, then finally plus 6. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on FOIL. All right, so we want to use FOIL to find each product. So again, remember, when you're using FOIL, you're finding the product of two binomials. So we have a binomial here times a binomial here, so we're good to go. So FOIL stands for first terms. So we're going to multiply 4m times negative 4m. That's negative 16m squared. Then we're going to multiply the outer terms, right? The O stands for outer terms. So 4m times 4n. So that's plus 16mn. Then we're going to do the inner terms, right? That I stands for inner terms. So minus 7n times minus 4m. That's plus 28mn. Then we're going to do the L. The last term, so negative 7n times 4n, that's negative 28n squared. So I just combine like terms in the middle here. I'm going to have negative 16m squared. 16mn plus 28mn would be 44, so plus 44mn, and then minus 28n squared. So once again, the answer here is negative 16m squared plus 44mn minus 28n squared. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative x plus 7y times negative 4x minus y. So again, I want to multiply the first terms together to start. So negative x times negative 4x. Those are my first terms. So that's positive 4x squared. Then I want to do my outside terms. Negative x times negative y. That's plus xy. Then I want to do my inside terms, 7y times negative 4x. That's minus 28xy. Then I want to do my last terms, 7y times negative y. That's minus 7y squared. Now all I need to do is just combine like terms. If I have xy by itself, that's the same as just 1xy. So essentially I'm going to have what? I'm going to have 4x squared. 1 minus 28 is negative 27, so minus 27xy and then minus 7y squared. So once again, my answer here is 4x squared minus 27xy minus 7y squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on FOIL. All right, we want to use FOIL to find each product. So we're going to start out with 8x minus 8y times 3x minus 2y. So remember, to use FOIL, you've got to have the product of two binomials, which is what we have here. So FOIL, it starts off with the F. That's the first terms. So 8x times 3x. 8 times 3 is 24. x times x is x squared. Then you're going to do your O, your outside terms. 
8x times negative 2y. That's minus 16xy. Then you're going to do your i, your inside terms. Negative 8y times 3x, so that's minus 24xy. Then you're going to do your l, your last terms. Negative 8y times negative 2y, that's positive 16y squared. So this is going to be 24x squared. Negative 16xy minus 24xy is going to be negative 40xy and then plus 16y squared. So my final answer here is 24x squared minus 40xy plus 16y squared. All right, for the next one, I have 3m minus 5n, and this is multiplied by negative 5m plus 3n. So we're going to, again, start out with the f in FOIL, the first terms. 3m times negative 5m, that's negative 15m squared. The o in FOIL, that's the outside terms, so 3m times 3n, that's plus 9mn. Then the inside terms, the i, the negative 5n times the negative 5m, that's plus 25mn. Then the l, the last terms, negative 5n times 3n, that's minus 15n squared. So now I just want to combine like terms in the middle. I'm going to end up with negative 15m squared. 9mn plus 25mn is 34. So plus 34mn, and then minus 15n squared. So my final answer here is negative 15m squared plus 34mn minus 15n squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on FOIL. All right, so we want to use FOIL to find each product. And we have one that's kind of tedious here. We have 3x minus 3y times 8x minus 5y times 2x minus 2y. Now you can't use FOIL to get the answer to this problem other than to get some of the answer, right? You can't use it to get the whole answer. FOIL is specifically used to multiply two binomials together. So for this type of problem, I need to multiply two of them together, doesn't matter which two, and then take that product and multiply it by the third. So I can do it for the first step, but once I have a kind of polynomial that's not a binomial, times a binomial, I can't use FOIL anymore, okay? So let's go ahead and just multiply these two together using FOIL, and then we'll complete the final step just by multiplying each term of the first polynomial by each term of the second polynomial. So we'll start out with the F or first term. So 3x times 8x is 24x squared. Then the outside terms, 3x times negative 5y, that's minus 15xy. Then the inside terms, the i, the negative 3y times 8x, that's negative 24xy. Then the l, or the last terms, negative 3y times negative 5y, that's plus 15y squared. Now I'm going to combine like terms here. Negative 15xy minus 24xy is going to be negative 39xy. So this is negative 39xy. Let me tighten this down. Okay, so now this is a polynomial. It's called a trinomial because it has three terms. That's going to be multiplied by this binomial. Now, I cannot use FOIL for this. Please don't make that mistake. It's only for the product of two binomials. So if I multiply these two together, it would be fine. Or if I multiply these two together or, you know, these two or wh whichever two you want to multiply together, you can use it for that step. But once you get it into something that looks like this, You've got to kind of do it the slow, tedious method. So I'm going to take each term of this polynomial and multiply it by each term of this polynomial. Okay, so 24x squared times 2x is going to be 48x cubed. Then 24x squared times negative 2y is going to be negative 48x squared y. Now I'm moving on to this term. I'm going to have negative 39xy times this polynomial. Let me scroll down and get a little room going. So negative 39xy times 2x is going to be negative 78x squared y. Then negative 39xy times negative 2y is going to be positive 78xy squared. Then lastly, I'm going to take 15y squared and multiply it by this polynomial. 15y squared times 2x is plus 30xy squared. Then 15y squared times negative 2y 
is minus 30y cubed. So now all I need to do is just combine like terms. So 48x cubed, nothing to combine with that, so I'm just gonna rewrite it. And then I'm looking for x squared y, which I have here and nowhere else. So negative 48x squared y minus 78x squared y. We know that's negative. What is 48 plus 78? Well, that's 126. So this would be negative 126x squared y. And now we're gonna move on to xy squared, which I have here and here. So I've got 78 and I've got 30. So if I had 78 and 30, I'm gonna end up with 108. So this is plus 108xy squared. Then lastly, I'm gonna have this minus 30y cubed. All right, nothing to combine with that. So my end result or my final answer is 48x cubed minus 126x squared y plus 108xy squared minus 30y cubed. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 32. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on special products. All right, so we're gonna jump right in and look at an example here. So I have 10x minus 2y, and this is squared. So without using FOIL, we can get an answer for this just by using our general formula. So in case you didn't watch the lesson or in case you forgot it, remember, if you have something like x minus y, and this is squared, this is gonna be equal to the first term squared, so x squared, minus, right, minus, we have two times the first term times the second term, so two times xy, and then plus the last term or the second term squared, so plus y squared. So if we kind of follow this formula up here, I have the first term squared, so 10x, both the 10 and the x, make up that first term. So if I'm squaring that, that would look like this. So 10 squared is 100, and then x squared is just x squared. So this would be 100x squared. Then minus. The next thing we would have is two times the first term times the second term. So let's do the number parts first. Two times 10 is 20, 20 times two is 40. Then we have x times y, so 40xy. And then lastly, I have this final term, right? In this case, that's y, and it becomes squared. So here I have 2y, so that's going to be squared. So plus 2y, that's going to be squared. 2 squared is 4, y squared is just y squared. So this is plus 4y squared. So we end up with 100x squared minus 40xy plus 4y squared. And again, on the first one, I'm just gonna kind of show you this using FOIL that we got the correct answer. So I can just take this here, kind of go the slower way, and I can expand this to 10x minus 2y times 10x minus 2y, and I'll show you that I'll end up with the same result. So for the first terms, 10x times 10x is 100x squared. For the outer, 10x times negative 2y is negative 20xy. For the inner, negative 2y times 10x is negative 20xy. And then for the last, negative 2y times negative 2y is plus 4y squared. So if I combine like terms here, I'm gonna end up with 100x squared minus 40xy plus 4y squared, which is exactly what I got up here. 100x squared minus 40xy plus 4y squared. All right, let's take a look at another one. I have negative 4y minus 7x, and this is squared. So again, just remember your general formula. And the more you kind of write this out, the better you're going to get at this, the more you're going to remember it. So it's the first term squared, so x squared, minus 2 times the first term times the second term, so minus 2xy, and then plus the second term squared, so plus y squared. And again, the only difference between this one and the one where you have x plus y, that quantity squared, is the minus sign. So this one would be x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Right? That's the only difference is that minus sign there. So following this formula, if we look at that, what we're going to have is the first term squared. So that negative 4y is squared. The negative 4y is squared. So negative 4 squared, remember that's inside of parentheses, 
that's going to be 16. And then y squared is y squared. So this is 16 y squared. Then we're going to have minus, right? If you have a minus here, that becomes in front of the second term. We're going to have two times negative 4y times 7x. So if I look at the number parts, I have negative 2 times negative 4 times 7. So negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. 8 times 7 is 56. So because of this sign right here, this is going to end up being a plus. And this is only happening because I have a negative right there. Right? Two negatives are going to make a positive. So this is going to be plus 56 and then times xy. So plus 56 xy. Then lastly, I'm going to have this term here, 7x squared. So plus 7 squared is 49, x squared is x squared. So I end up with 16y squared plus 56xy plus 49x squared. All right, what about 9x plus 10y, this quantity squared? Well, again, if I think about the formula for this, it's x plus y, this guy squared is x squared, so your first guy squared, plus 2 times the first term times the second term, so 2xy plus the last term, or the second term, squared. So following that, the first term squared, 9x squared, is 81x squared. Right, Both the 9 and the x are squared. Then 2 times the first term times the second term. So 2 times 9 is 18. 18 times 10 is 180. And then times xy. And then lastly, I have this second term that's squared. So the 10 and the y are both squared. 10 squared is 100. And then y squared is just y squared. So I end up with 81x squared plus 180xy plus 100y squared. All right, the next one we're going to look at, we have some fractions involved. So we have negative 1 fourth x minus 13 ninths y cubed, and this is squared. So again, just think about your general formula here. So if you have x minus y, this being squared, again, it's the first term squared minus 2 times the first term times the second term, so xy, and then plus the second term squared, so plus y squared. So if I follow that up here, I have negative 1 fourth x, that's going to be squared. So let me just write negative 1 fourth x squared. Because this has a lot of fractions involved, I'm just going to write everything out and then I'll go back and do the calculations. Then I have minus 2 times the first term times the second term, so minus 2 times the first term is negative 1 fourth x times the second term, which is 13 ninths y cubed. Then lastly, we're going to have plus, and I'm going to kind of drag this down here because it won't fit, 13 ninths y cubed, that's going to be squared. So let's go through and kind of crank this out down here. So negative 1 fourth x is squared. So negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. 4 times 4 is 16. So this is 1 16th. And then x raised to the second power is just x squared. And then next I have a negative times another negative. So we know the end result is going to be positive. And then this 2 would cancel with this 4 and give me a 2. So I'd basically end up with 13 over 18. So plus 13 over 18. And then I'd have x times y cubed. So 13 eighteenths xy cubed. And then lastly, plus 13 squared is 169, 9 squared is 81, and then y cubed is raised to the second power. That's going to be y to the sixth power. All right? Keep y the same, 3 times 2 is 6. So I end up with 1 16th x squared plus 13 18ths xy cubed plus 169 over 81 y to the sixth power. And again, go back through and expand this out and multiply and see that you do get the same answer. All right, let's take a look at another one. This is a different type of problem. So this type of problem involves having, let's say, x plus y times x minus y. So you have the same term in the first position of each binomial and the same term in the second position of each binomial. The difference is the sign. And what happens when you FOIL this guy, the two middle terms drop out. So we end up with the first term squared minus the second term squared. Right? If I was to go through and do FOIL here, x times x is x squared. x times negative y is negative xy. y times x is plus xy. 
and then y times negative y is minus y squared. These middle two terms drop out, and you're just left with the first term, x, that's going to be squared, minus the second term, y, that's going to be squared. So following this, if I just take my first term, which is 10m, and I square it, 10 squared is 100, m squared is just m squared, and I subtract away the second term squared, so 7 squared is 49, n squared is just n squared, I've got my answer. This is 100m squared minus 49n squared. All right, let's take a look at another one. I have negative 4x squared plus 6y times negative 4x squared minus 6y. So again, same thing in the first position and same thing in the second position. They differ by the sign, okay? So again, I'm going to take whatever's first and I'm going to square it. So it's negative 4x squared, and I'm going to square this guy. Now, negative 4 times negative 4 is 16, and then x squared raised to the second power is x to the fourth power. So this is 16. This is 16, x to the fourth power, and then minus, I take whatever second, and I square that. So 6y squared. 6 squared is 36, and then just y squared. So you get 16x to the fourth power minus 36y squared. So the next one I'm going to look at is 9x minus 6y to the fourth power times 9x minus 6y to the fourth power. So I have the same thing here and here, and the same thing here and here, but my signs aren't different. I have minus and then minus. So really all this is is an expansion of 9x minus 6y to the fourth power squared. Right? It's just written differently to try to trip you up. Right? So if you have a kind of a section in your book on this, which I'm sure that you do, and you get a test, your teacher might throw this at you as kind of a wrench, right? Really all you're looking for is the formula for this guy, which we already know is the first guy squared. So 9x squared would be 81x squared minus, right, because they have a minus sign there, two times the first term times the second term. So two times nine is 18. 18 times six is 108 then times x, then times y to the fourth. So times x, y to the fourth. And then lastly, I'm going to have plus. I'm going to take the second term and square it. So 6y to the fourth power squared. 6 squared is 36. y to the fourth power squared is y to the eighth power. So I'm going to end up with 81x squared minus 108xy to the fourth plus 36y to the eighth power. Again, this is kind of a trap question that you might see on the test. All right, now let's talk about a binomial that's cubed. And this is the harder one to remember. So if I have something like x plus a, and this is cubed, the first thing that you need to remember is you have the first term and the second term that are going to be cubed. Those are going to be in your results. So you're going to have x cubed, and then down here you're going to have a cubed. And you have two other spots that you need to fill in. Now. Remember that your exponent is a 3. So you're going to have a 3 here and a 3 here. Each term here is going to go in here, but they're each going to be squared once. So I kind of start with the first term and say, okay, well, I'm going to have x squared, then a. Okay, this is squared already. Then the next one, I'm going to have x times a squared. So each one was squared once. The x was squared once here, and the a was squared once here. So that's kind of how I remember it. And I don't know how you're going to remember it. It's kind of up to you to develop that method. Maybe you see a different video and somebody else says something that just, you know, resonates with you. But this is how I always remembered it. So for this one here, this x plus 9, this quantity cubed, follow this format. So I know I'm going to have the first one cubed. I know I'm going to have the second one cubed. Now I'm going to have two spaces that I need to fill in. I know that because my exponent is a 3, I'm going to have a 3 here and a 3 here. Now, I know that, again, take this one and square it once, multiply it by this one. Then the other one is going to have 9 squared, right? So it's going to have x not squared, 9 squared. And let me go through and simplify because we have some numbers involved. So we have x cubed plus 3 times 9 is 27, so 27x squared plus 9 squared is 81, 81 times 3 is 243, so 243x. Then lastly, plus 9 cubed, which is 729. So I get x cubed plus 27x squared 
plus 243x, plus 729. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 2x plus 3y, this is cubed. So again, I'm going to take the first one and I'm gonna cube it. So 2x is gonna be cubed, plus blank, plus blank, plus, I'm gonna take my final one and cube it. 3y is gonna be cubed. Now again, my exponent is a three, so that's how I remember. This is a three here and three here. Then I remember that each term goes in, but they're each squared only once. So in other words, 2x can be squared the first time, and then 3y just goes in. Then in the second round, 2x is not squared, but 3y is. Okay, that's how I remember it. So then 2x cubed, 2 is cubed, that's 8, and then x cubed, plus, if I square 2, that's 4. So I would have 4, and then x squared is x squared. So I'd have 3 times 4, which is 12, times 3 is 36, and then x squared y, and then plus, here I have 3y squared, so 3 squared is 9, y squared is y squared, of course. So 9 times 2 is 18, 18 times 3 is 54. So 54xy squared, and then plus 3 cubed is 27, so that's 27y cubed. So I end up with 8x cubed plus 36x squared y plus 54xy squared plus 27y cubed. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on special products. All right, so we want to find each product using the special products formulas. So we're going to start out with 8a minus 5, this quantity squared. So you'll recall from the lesson that if we have something like x minus y, this quantity squared, we have a general formula for that. So it's the first term, which in this case is x, is going to be squared. Then minus, we have two times the first term times the second term. So two times xy, then plus the second term squared, so plus y squared. So kind of following this format here, I would have the first term squared, so 8a squared. And a common mistake is just to have 8 and then a squared. You've got to square the 8 and the a. That's why I put it inside of parentheses. So I'm going to evaluate this and just say it's 64, which is 8 times 8, a squared. Then I have a minus. Then next I'm going to have two times the first term, which is 8a, times the second term, which is 5. So 2 times 8 is 16. 16 times 5 is 80. So this would be minus 80a. Then lastly, I have plus the second term squared. 5 squared is 25. So I end up with 64a squared minus 80a plus 25 as my answer. All right, for the next one, I have 2 plus 3n, that quantity squared. So it's similar to the last formula we looked at. The only difference is all the signs are going to be plus. So if I have something like x plus y squared, I take the first term and square it, so x squared, then plus 2 times the first term times the second term, so 2xy then plus the last term or the second term squared, so plus y squared. So everything is a plus there. So for this one, the first term squared, 2 squared would be 4. Then plus, I would have 2 times the first term times the second term. So 2 times 2 is 4, times 3 would be 12, then times n would be 12n. Then plus, you'd have the last term or the second term squared, so 3n squared, the 3 and the n are both squared. 3 squared is 9, n squared is just n squared. So I ended up with 4 plus 12n plus 9n squared. And I'm going to rewrite that as 9n squared plus 12n plus 4 so that the polynomial is in standard form. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on special products. All right, so find each product using the special products formulas. All right, so we have 3 fifths n plus 1 fourth, and this is squared. So this is a binomial squared, so it's going to follow this format of x plus y squared. So I would have the first term x squared plus 2 times the first term times the second term, so x times y, so 2xy plus the second term squared, so y squared. So just follow that same format here. You have your first term which is 3 fifths n, that's going to be squared. 
So you've got to square the 3 fifths, which would be 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25, and then n squared. Then you're going to have 2 times 3 fifths n times 1 fourth. So 2 times 3 fifths times 1 fourth times n. And I can cancel this 2 with this 4, and that would give me a 2. So I ended up with 3 over 5 times 2 or 10. So this is 3 tenths n. Then lastly, I have this second term squared. So plus, if I square 1 fourth, 1 squared is 1, 4 squared is 16. So I get 9 20 fifths n squared plus 3 tenths n plus 1 16th. All right, for the next one, we're going to look at 7 fourths x minus 5 fourths, and this is squared. So now this is a little bit different because it's got a minus sign in it. So the formula is very much the same. It just accounts for that minus sign there. So kind of the second term has a minus sign. So I would have the first term, which is x as squared. Then instead of plus, I now have a minus, and then 2 times first term times the second term, so 2xy and then plus the second term squared, so plus y squared. So we're doing the same thing here. The first term is squared. So 7 fourths x squared. 7 squared is 49, 4 squared is 16, x squared is just x squared, then minus. I'm going to have 2 times this first term times the second term. So the first term is 7 fourths, 7 fourths x times 5 fourths. So I can cancel this 2 with this 4, and I'll get a 2 there. 7 times 5 is 35, over 2 times 4 is 8. So this would be 35 eighths x. So minus 35 eighths x. Then lastly, I have this second term squared. So 5 fourths squared would be 25 over 16. So I get 49 sixteenths x squared minus 35 eighths x plus 25 sixteenths. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on special products. All right, so we want to find each product using the special products formulas. So we're going to look at 6 plus 4v times 6 minus 4v. So notice that we have the same thing in the first position of each, and we have the same thing in the second position of each. Where we differ is the signs. We have a plus and then a minus. So this is something like x plus y times x minus y. And if we use FOIL here, we'll get x squared minus xy plus xy minus y squared. So what happens is the middle two terms drop out, right? They're going to cancel. And you're left with the first term squared minus the second term squared. So that's all I'm going to do here. This is referred to as the difference of two squares. All I'm going to do here is just take the first term, which is 6, and I'm going to square it. So that's 36. Then I'm going to subtract away the second term squared. So 4v squared would be 16v squared. I'm just going to reorder it to put it in standard form. So that's negative 16v squared plus 36, and that's my answer. So now we're looking at 4x minus 2 times 4x plus 2. Again, the same thing in each first position and the same thing in each second position. We differ with the signs here. So the middle terms would drop out in FOIL. So what you end up with is the first term squared. So 4x squared would be 16x squared minus the second term, which is 2 here, squared. 2 squared is 4. So this ends up giving me 16x squared minus 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on special products. All right, so we want to find each product using the special products formulas. All right, so we're going to take a look at 2x cubed minus 3y squared times 2x cubed plus 3y squared. So notice that you have the same term in the first position here and here, and the same term in the first position here and here, but what differs is the sign. You have minus and you have plus. So this follows the format of x plus y times x minus y. And you could switch that up. You can make this minus and this plus. It doesn't matter. When you go through and FOIL this guy, x times x is x squared. x times y is plus xy. Negative y times x is minus xy. And then negative y times y is minus y squared. Your two middle terms are going to drop out, right? They cancel. So you're left with x squared minus y squared 
which is basically the first term squared minus the second term squared. So kind of following this format, if I just take my first term, which is 2x cubed, and I square it, and then I subtract away my second term, which is 3y squared, and I square it, I'll have my answer. So 2 squared is 4, x cubed squared is x to the 6th power. Right, because you have x, that's my base, it stays the same. 3 times 2 would be 6. Then minus. Now we have 3y squared and that's squared. So 3 squared is 9. And then y squared squared is y to the 4th power. Right, y stays the same. 2 times 2 is 4. So you end up with 4x to the 6th power minus 9y to the 4th power. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have negative 7u plus 9v times negative 7u minus 9v. So negative 7u, negative 7u. Then we have 9v, 9v. The difference is the signs, plus and then minus. So again, just take your first term, whatever it is, in this case it's negative 7u, and square it. Then subtract away your second term, whatever that is, in this case it's 9v, and square it. So negative 7 squared is 49, u squared is just u squared, minus 9 squared, that's 81, and then v squared is just v squared. So you get 49u squared minus 81v squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on special products. So we want to find each product using the special products formulas. We're going to start out today with a binomial that's cubed. So we have 8b minus 3, and that's cubed. So let's take a look at the special products formulas for the cube of a binomial. So you have kind of two of them that you work with. You have x plus a cubed, and then you have x minus a cubed. Now the first one's easier to remember because all the signs are positive. So you get four terms out of this guy. So the first one and the last one, super easy to remember. It's just the first term cubed, and all the way down here, you're going to have the last term cubed. So let me throw in some plus signs. And then you're going to have two other terms. Now, to start off those two other terms, remember that your exponent is a 3. So you're going to have a 3 as kind of the leading coefficient there. And that's going to be multiplied by other stuff, so it might not end up as the 3. But all you're going to do is you're going to multiply by each term here. It's just that... One of them is going to be squared in each case, and the other one's not going to be. So in other words, I can take x, my first term, and square it. The other one's not going to be, so times a. In this case, x is not going to be squared, but the other one, a, is going to be. So we have x cubed plus 3x squared a plus 3xa squared plus a cubed. Now, with the one with subtraction in it, it's a little bit more difficult. The terms are the same, so I can just copy this. In front of the second and the fourth term, you have a minus sign. So really the only plus sign you're going to have, or the only visible plus sign you're going to have, obviously this is plus but it's, it's not shown, is in front of your third term. So if you want to remember that only this guy is going to have a plus in front of it, or if you want to remember that the second position and the fourth position kind of have a minus sign in front of it, you know, whatever works for you. But to kind of duplicate this, we're going to be using this one, so I'm going to have four terms. So one, two, three, four. And I know that in front of the second one and the fourth one, I have minus signs and I have a plus sign here. I know that my first and my last position result from me taking each term, like the first term for the first position is just cubed. So 8b cubed, 8b cubed. And then for the last one, it's the last one cubed, so 3 cubed. My exponent is a 3, and so I remember to put a 3 here and a 3 here. And then I'm multiplying that 3 by each term. But one of them is going to be squared in each case. So I'm going to square 8b in the first case, then times 3. And then I'm going to square 3 in the second case, so 8b, and then times 3 squared. I know this is kind of getting jammed, but... So now I'm just going to erase the formula just so it's out of my way. Just kind of do some simplification. So 8 cubed is 8 times 8, that's 64. 
times 8 again, that's 512. And then b cubed is just b cubed. And then minus, you'll have 3 times 3, that's 9, times the result of what? You have 8b squared. So 8 squared is 64. 64 times 9 is 576. So you'd have 576 and then times b squared, then plus. Now I've got three times eight, and then I've got three squared there. Three squared is nine, so nine times three is 27, and then 27 times eight is 216. So this would be 216 times b. And then lastly, we have minus three cubed, which is 27. So I get 512 b cubed minus 576 b squared plus 216 b, minus 27. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 1 4 z squared plus 2 fifths y, and then this quantity is cubed. So now that I have a plus involved, it's really easy. So I've got four terms, all have plus signs. And let's take a look at it. Remember, the first term is gonna be cubed. So 1 4 z squared, that guy is gonna be cubed. The last term is gonna be cubed. So 2 fifths y, that's going to be cubed. And then for the two ones in the middle, remember, you think about your exponent. I have a three there. So three times each term. But remember, one of them is going to be squared in each case. So three times, I'm going to have one-fourth z squared squared in the first scenario times two-fifths y. In the second scenario, I'm going to have one-fourth z squared times two-fifths y. And then this is squared now. And I forgot to put my three here. Remember, three is multiplied by each in the middle. It's kind of like, the way I remember this is, when I have my formula x plus y, this quantity squared. Remember, I did x squared plus two. Right? I think about that two from this exponent right here. So two xy plus y squared. Well, it's the same thing here. The two ones in the middle, I just think about that exponent here. Remember, I have to multiply three by each term, just like I did here. I multiply two by each term. But the only difference is, in each case, one of those terms has to be squared. If you just remember that, you're good to go because this formula and this formula are not that far apart in terms of what you need to remember. It's just remembering that you need to square one of them in each case. So once you've kind of set this up, it's really easy to do. So 1 fourth cubed would be 1 over... 4 times 4 is 16, 16 times 4 is 64, so 1 64th. z squared cubed would be z to the 6th power. Then we're going to have plus. I have 1 4th z squared squared. So 1 4th squared is going to give me 1 over 16. So this would be 3 times 1 over 16 times 2 fifths. And of course we have z squared squared, that's z to the 4th power, y. So what can I cancel here? Well this 2 with this 16, this would give me an 8. So I basically have 3 over 40, so 3 over 40 times z to the fourth power y. Let me scroll down and get a little room going. Then plus, over here I have 3 times 1 fourth, so that's 3 fourths z squared. I have 2 fifths that's squared, so that's times 4 over, 5 squared is 25, then times y squared. So I can cancel this 4 with this 4, and I'd have 3 over 25, 3 over 25, z squared, y squared. And then lastly, I have 2 fifths y cubed. So 2 cubed is 8, 5 cubed is 125, and then times y cubed. So it gets a little messy with fractions, but can you imagine if you had to go through and expand this and you know try to find the answer the long way? I mean, it would just take forever and ever and ever. And all this simplification you do, you have just more and more room for mistakes. So that's why it's just so crucial to memorize these formulas. It's going to make it much faster for you to do on a test. So our final answer here is 1 64th z to the 6th power plus 3 40ths z to the 4th power y plus 3 25ths z squared y squared plus 8 over 125 y cubed. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 33. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we just want to perform each division. We're going to start by looking at 4x cubed plus 16x squared plus 4x divided by 8x squared. 
So to divide a polynomial by a monomial, all you do is first start out by just setting this up as a fraction. So we have 4x cubed plus 16x squared plus 4x divided by 8x squared. So essentially we can just think back to when we work with fractions. This is essentially just a common denominator. So all I need to do is split this up. So I'll have 4x cubed over the common denominator of 8x squared plus 16x squared over the common denominator of 8x squared plus 4x over the common denominator of 8x squared. So once we break it up into little pieces like this, we just simplify each part and we report our answer. So 4 divided by 8, you think about 8 canceling with 4 and have a 2 down here. And then x cubed over x squared would be x to the first power, right? So this would cancel out and this would just be a 1. So for the first part, I would have x over 2, then plus. For the next part, I have 16 over 8. 16 divided by 8 is 2. And I have x squared over x squared, which is 1, right? That's going to cancel completely. So this is plus 2, then plus. For the next part, I have 4 over 8. So this would cancel with this and leave me a 2 down here. And then x over x squared. So this would cancel out. So now the numerator is a 1, right, because everything canceled. And then the x squared is going to become x to the first power. So this becomes 1 over 2x to the first power, or just 2x. So my answer here is x over 2 plus 2 plus 1 over 2x. Now we're going to do this for the first one. We're not going to do it for every one. But essentially, I want to show you that you can check your answer. Remember, with division, if I have something like 20 divided by 5 equals 4, I can take my result, the quotient, which is this in this case, multiply it by the divisor, which is this in this case, and I should get my dividend, right? which is this in this case, the numerator from the fraction we created. So I'm going to multiply this again by this 8x squared, and that should give me 4x cubed plus 16x squared plus 4x. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So 8x squared times x over 2. The 8 would cancel with the 2 and give me a 4. And then x squared times x is x cubed. Then plus. 8x squared times 2 is 16x squared. Then plus, I have 8x squared times 1 over 2x. The 8 would cancel with the 2 and give me a 4. x squared over x is x. So I get 4x cubed plus 16x squared plus 4x which again is exactly what I had here, 4x cubed plus 16x squared plus 4x. All right, let's take a look at another one. I have a to the fifth power, n to the fourth power, plus 12a cubed, n cubed, minus 12an squared, and this polynomial is divided by 6a cubed, n. So again, I'm just going to split this up. So I'm going to write it as a to the fifth power, n to the fourth power, over 6a cubed, n, plus 12 a cubed n cubed over 6a cubed n minus 12a n squared over 6a cubed n. So if I look at the first part here, I don't have any coefficients out here on the numerator. So really I'm just working with the variables. So a to the fifth power over a cubed, this is going to cancel and this is going to become a squared. n to the fourth power over n, this is going to cancel, this is going to become n cubed. So this is going to be a squared times n cubed. And then this is over. I still have this 6 down here. So then plus. Next I have 12 over 6. So 12 divided by 6 is 2. a cubed over a cubed, that's going to cancel. And n cubed over n, this is going to cancel and this will become n squared. So basically I have 2n squared, so plus 2n squared. And then I'm going to have a minus. We have, again, 12 over 6, which we know is 2. We have a over a cubed. So this a is going to cancel, and this will become a squared down here. Then I have n squared over n. So this n is going to cancel, and this will be n to the first power. So what I'm going to have here is minus 2 n to the first power, or just 2n, over a squared. So my answer is a squared n cubed over 6 plus 2n squared minus 2n over a squared. All right, so what about 4v cubed plus 16v squared minus 4v divided by negative 4v? So again, I take each term from the polynomial and divide it by the monomial. So I'm going to set this up as 4v cubed over negative 4v. 
plus 16v squared over negative 4v minus 4v over negative 4v. And for the sake of the sign, you could put plus and then make this negative because you know negative over negative is going to be positive. So make it a little easier to deal with that sign. All right, so let's tackle this part by part. So we know in the first case, 4 over negative 4 is negative 1. And then v cubed over v, this is going to cancel and this has become v squared. So the first part here is negative v squared. Everything in the denominator canceled, so it would just be 1. Then next I'm looking at 16 over negative 4. So this would cancel with this and leave me a negative 4. And then v squared over v, this is going to cancel and this is going to be v to the first power. So I'm going to have minus 4v. And then next I have negative 4v over negative 4v. That's 1. So this cancels completely and becomes 1. But make sure you write 1. I've seen students just kind of cancel that out and just report this as their answer. No. If you have a number divided by itself, 5 over 5, that's 1. That didn't just go away. So this has to be plus 1 here. So I get negative v squared minus 4v plus 1. All right, for the next one, I have 5x cubed a squared over 4 minus 2xa over 5 plus 3. And this is divided by 15xa. All right, so let's go ahead and start out with 5x cubed a squared over 4. And then we're dividing this by 15xa. So one cool thing you can do is you can just multiply this by 1 over 15xa. And where does that come from? Well, again, if I would have written this as over 15xa over 1, I would take the first part and leave it unchanged, and then I multiply it by the reciprocal, which is 1 over 15xa. Right, So that's where I'm getting that from. So then minus, next I'd have 2xa over 5. And again, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of this guy, so 1 over 15xa. Then lastly, plus, I have 3. And that's going to be divided by 15xa. Okay, so again, let's take this on piece by piece. So if I look at the first part here, I know the 5 would cancel with the 15. So this is going to cancel with this and leave me a 3. This is going to cancel with this. This is going to be a 2 here. And then this is going to cancel with this. It's going to be a 1 there. So what I'm going to have is an x squared times a, or x squared a, over 4 times 3, or 12. Then minus. For the next one here, no numbers that I can cancel. My x's would cancel, and so would my a's. And I would end up with 2 over 5 times 15, or 75. So this would be 2 over 75. And then next I'd have plus. I have 3 over 15. This would cancel with this and leave me a 5. The numerator is now a 1. So I'd have 1 over 5xa. And so that's my answer. x squared a over 12 minus 2 over 75 plus 1 over 5xa. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. We're going to start out with 32b cubed plus 4b squared plus 32b. This is divided by 8b. So to divide a polynomial by a monomial, all we need to do is divide each term of the polynomial by the monomial. So let's just kind of set this up as 32b cubed plus 4b squared plus 32b all over 8b. Right? We set up the division like that. So in fractional form, we can easily see that we can break this up because we have a common denominator. Right? So we could write this as 32b cubed over 8b plus 4b squared over 8b plus 32b over 8b. And now I can take this on part by part. 32 divided by 8 is 4. b cubed over b is b squared. So this is going to cancel. This will be b squared. So let me put equals. Let me kind of scroll down, have some room. So my numerator for the first guy is going to be 4b squared. Then next I have 4b squared over 8b. This 4 is going to cancel with this 8 and leave me a 2 down here. b squared over b is b. So this is going to cancel with this. So I'll have b. So this will be plus b over 2. And then lastly, I have 32b over 8b. So 32 would cancel with 8 and give me a 4. b over b is 1. So this is plus 4. And so our solution here is 4b squared 
plus b over 2 plus 4. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at negative 18a to the fourth power plus 2a cubed minus 18a squared. And this is divided by negative 6a cubed. So again, I'm going to set this up as each term of the polynomial divided by this monomial. So I'll have negative 18a to the fourth power over negative 6a cubed plus 2a cubed over negative 6a cubed minus 18a squared over negative 6a cubed. All right, so negative 18 over negative 6. So this is going to cancel and become 3. Then a to the fourth power over a cubed. This is going to cancel. This will be a to the first power. So in the numerator there, you just have a 3a. The denominator is canceled out. And then for 2a cubed over negative 6a cubed, the a cubes are going to cancel. 2 over negative 6 is negative 1 third. Right? This would cancel with this and give me a 3. So this is going to be minus 1 third. And then for this one, I can think about this as instead of minus, plus negative. So negative 18 over negative 6, this is going to cancel and become 3. A squared over A cubed, well, this is going to cancel out, and this is going to be A to the first power. So I'll have plus 3 over A. So I get 3A minus 1 third plus 3 over A. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. We're going to start out with 12R to the fifth power minus 4R to the fourth power plus 2R cubed. And this is divided by 4r squared. So if I'm dividing a polynomial by a monomial, all I need to do is divide each term of the polynomial by the monomial. So we would set this up as 12r to the fifth power over that monomial, 4r squared, then minus, or you could put plus negative, whichever you prefer, 4r to the fourth power over 4r squared, then plus, you're going to have 2r cubed over 4r squared. So now I just look at it part by part. So I have 12 over 4. 12 divided by 4 is 3. And then r to the fifth power over r squared is r cubed. Right? This is going to cancel. This will be r cubed. So I'll have 3r cubed. Then I'll have minus. I have 4 over 4. That's going to cancel and become 1. And then r to the fourth power over r squared. This will cancel out completely and this will be a 2. So this is then minus r squared. Then lastly, I'll have plus 2 over 4. This will cancel with this and leave me a 2. r cubed over r squared. This is going to cancel and leave me a 1 here. So this will be r to the first power over 2. So my answer here is 3r cubed minus r squared plus r over 2. All right, for the next one, you have negative 3n cubed plus 18n squared minus 6n. And this is divided by negative 6n cubed. So again, I'm going to take each term of the polynomial and divide it by the monomial. So I'm going to have negative 3n cubed over negative 6n cubed plus 18n squared over negative 6n cubed minus 6n over negative 6n cubed. And I think because you have a minus over a negative or negative over negative, however you want to think about that, just write this as plus negative. Right? It's going to make it easier when you get to that part. All right, so if I look at this, negative 3 over negative 6. We know that's positive. And then 3 would cancel with the 6 and leave me a 2 here. The n cubed would cancel with the n cubed. So I'd end up with 1 over 2 or just 1 half. Then next, I have 18 over negative 6. I know that's negative. 18 divided by 6 is 3. And then n squared over n cubed, this is going to cancel, and this is going to be n to the first power. So I'll have minus 3 over n. Then next, I have negative 6n over negative 6n cubed. So again, negative over negative is positive. 6 over 6, that's 1. Then this n would cancel with one of the factors of n cubed. So this would become n squared. So what I'd have is, since the numerator is canceled, it would be a 1. So 1 over. In the denominator, I just have n squared. So I'm going to have 1 half minus 3 over n plus 1 over n squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. We're going to start out by looking at 2x to the fifth power y cubed plus 8x to the fourth power y squared minus 4x cubed y 
divided by negative 2x squared y squared. So to divide a polynomial by a monomial, I just divide each term of the polynomial by the monomial. So in other words, I'd start out with 2x to the fifth power y cubed, and I would divide that by negative 2x squared y squared. Then plus, I'd move to the next term, which is 8x to the fourth power y squared, and I would divide that by the monomial, negative 2x squared y squared. And then lastly, I have minus, so I can put plus negative 4x cubed y over again that monomial, which is negative 2x squared y squared. And now we're gonna attack this thing part by part. So if I start out with this first piece here all the way on the left, two over negative two is negative one, and x to the fifth power over x squared is x cubed, right? This is gonna cancel, so this is gonna be x cubed. And then y cubed over y squared, this is gonna cancel, and this will be y to the first power. So we're gonna have basically a negative, right? Because we have that negative one, x cubed y, and then everything in the denominator is canceled out, right? You could write it over one if you wanted to, or just negative x cubed y. So then the next thing you have is plus. Now I have eight over negative two, so eight over negative two, that's gonna cancel, leave me a four here, but this is negative, so I might as well just write it as negative four, right? I can just kind of line that out. Then I have x to the fourth power over x squared. Well, this is gonna cancel out with two factors of this, so this will be a two now. And then y squared over y squared will cancel completely. And so I'll have plus negative 4x squared, or I can just write minus 4x squared, however you want to write that. And then lastly, I have negative 4 over negative 2. That's positive 2. And then x cubed over x squared, this is going to cancel. This will be x to the first power. y over y squared, this is going to cancel. This will be y to the first power. So I'll end up with plus, right, the negative over negative canceled, 2x over y. So my answer here is negative x cubed y minus 4x squared plus 2x over y. All right, for the next one I have negative 15a to the fourth power b to the seventh power minus 20a squared b to the sixth power plus 5ab cubed minus 4. This is divided by negative 20a squared b. So again, each term of that polynomial, each term up here is going to be divided by this monomial here. So I'll have negative 15, a to the fourth power, b to the seventh power, over negative 20, a squared b. And then I have minus, so I can write plus negative, 20, a squared b to the sixth power, again over negative 20, a squared b. And then plus, next I'm going to have 5, a, b cubed, over negative 20, a, squared b. And then lastly, I have minus 4. So I'm going to put plus negative 4 over, again, negative 20 a squared b. All right, so again, let's tackle this piece by piece. So I'm going to start out with this negative 15 over negative 20. Negative over negative is positive. What's 15 over 20? Well, each is divisible by 5. 15 divided by 5 is 3. 20 divided by 5 is 4. So that's going to give me 3 fourths. Now, a to the fourth power over a squared. This is going to cancel, and this is going to be 2. b to the seventh over b, this is going to cancel, and this is going to be 6. So I will have 3 a squared b to the sixth power over 4. Then for the next part, I have negative over negative again, so that's going to be positive. 20 over 20 is going to cancel. a squared over a squared is going to cancel b to the sixth power over b, this is going to cancel, and this is going to be a 5. So this is plus b to the fifth power. Then for the next one, I have positive over negative. So I know this is going to end up being negative. 20 divided by 5 is 4. So this would cancel with this and leave me a 4 down here. If I have a and I have a squared, so this would cancel out with one of the factors of a squared. So I would just have a to the first power down there. And then this would cancel with one of the factors of b cubed. So this will now be b squared. So everything in the numerator canceled except for b squared. In the denominator, remember I had a negative, but I already wrote a minus sign there, so that's good. So I have 4 and then a to the first power. So it's minus b squared over 4a, or I could have put plus negative b squared over 4a, or I could write plus b squared over negative 4a, whatever you want to do. I prefer to just put the minus sign out in front. 
All right, then for the last part here, I have a negative four over a negative 20. So the negatives are gonna cancel. 20 divided by four is five. So this will go away. I'll put a one there. This will be a five. So what I'm gonna have is plus one over five a squared b. So this gives me my answer of three a squared b to the sixth power over four plus b to the fifth power minus b squared over four a plus one over five a squared b. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. So let's take a look at 3 fifths x to the 7th power y cubed minus 2 sevenths x to the 4th power y squared plus 2 thirds xy minus 3. And this is divided by 4xy to the 5th power. So one thing we're going to do here, since we have fractions involved in our polynomial here, Remember, if I have a fraction like, let's say, 1 half, and I divide it by, let's say, a number 5. Really, all I'm going to do is write this as 5 over 1, so this will be 1 half, this stays the same, multiply by the reciprocal of this, which is 1 fifth. That's all I'm going to do here. I'm just going to multiply everything by the reciprocal. As a first example, let's say I had 3 fifths x to the 7th power y cubed, and this is divided by 4xy to the 5th power. Well, I could write this over one. This would end up being multiplied by one over four x y to the fifth power. So I'm just gonna start out by doing it that way. We know that's the end result. So I'm gonna take and say this is three x to the seventh power y cubed over five, and I'm gonna multiply by one over four x y to the fifth power. Then I'm gonna have minus, so I can put plus negative, two x to the fourth power y squared, over seven, again, I'm multiplying by this one over four x y to the fifth power. Then next I'm gonna have plus two x y over three times one over four x y to the fifth power. Then lastly I have minus three. So I'm gonna put plus, I'm gonna have negative three times one over four x y to the fifth power. All right, so let's attack this problem piece by piece now. And I'm going to start out right here. So what can I cancel? Well, I can't cancel any of the numbers. So really, I'm just looking at the variables. So x to the seventh over x, this would cancel. This would become x to the sixth power. y cubed over y to the fifth power, this would cancel. This would become y squared. So I would end up with 3x to the sixth power in the numerator for that one over... 5 times 4, which is 20, so 20y squared. All right, then plus. For the next part here, I have negative 2x to the 4th power y squared over 7, and then I'm multiplying by 1 over 4xy to the 5th power. This will cancel with this and leave me with a 2, but I still have this negative out here. So instead of writing plus, I can just lead this off with a minus, and that takes care of that negative right there. Let me just draw a little arrow up there. So we don't forget. So x to the fourth power over x, this is gonna cancel, this is gonna be x cubed. And then y squared over y to the fifth power, this is gonna cancel, this is gonna be y cubed. So again, I already accounted for the negative, I have that minus sign out there. So in my numerator, I just have an x cubed, everything else is canceled. In the denominator, I'll have seven times two, which is 14 times y cubed. So 14 y cubed. Then moving on over here, I have 2xy over 3 times 1 over 4xy to the fifth power. This is going to cancel with this and leave me a 2. This will cancel with this, and this will cancel with one of these. So the numerator is just going to be a 1. So plus, that'll be a 1, over 3 times 2 is 6, and then times y to the fourth power. All right, then lastly, I have negative 3 over 4xy to the fifth power. Nothing I can cancel there. I just put negative 3 over 4xy to the fifth power. So I have my answer. 3x to the sixth power over 20y squared minus x cubed over 14y cubed plus 1 over 6y to the fourth power minus 3 over 4xy to the fifth power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on dividing polynomials by monomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. We're going to look at negative 4 fifths x cubed y squared plus 8 thirds x squared y minus 12x. And we're dividing this by 20x to the ninth power y to the seventh power. 
So the first thing I want you to know is if you're dividing a polynomial by a monomial, all you need to do is divide each term of the polynomial by the monomial. So you just kind of set this up like this. You'll take this first term, negative 4 fifths x cubed y squared, and you would divide it by this. Now, if I'm dividing something that's already a fraction, the easiest way to do it, because if I set this up like this, let's say divided by 20x to the ninth power y to the seventh, I'd put it over one, and then recall this would stay the same, and I'd multiply it by the reciprocal of this. So I'm just gonna start out by doing it that way. So I'm just gonna multiply this by the reciprocal, one over 20x to the ninth power, y to the seventh power. And just a little quicker to write it like that from the onset. All right, the next you're gonna have plus, you have eight, x squared y over three. And again, I'm gonna multiply it by the reciprocal of this, one over 20x to the ninth power, y to the seventh. And then lastly, you have minus 12x. So I'm gonna write that down here, minus 12x. And I'm just gonna write that over 20x to the ninth power, y to the seventh. And you can do this the same way as this if you want, but if you multiply negative 12x times one over 20x to the ninth, y to the seventh, you'd end up with just that, right? So might as well start out with that anyway. All right, so now that everything's set up for us, let's just go through and take this piece by piece. So the first piece here, I've got a negative four over a 20. So this four would cancel with this 20 and leave me a five. The negative is still there though, so remember that. Then you have x cubed and you have x to the ninth power. So this would cancel out, this would be x to the sixth power. y squared would cancel out, this would be y to the fifth power. And so what I'd have here is a negative one over five times five, which is 25, times x to the sixth power, times y to the fifth power. The next I'm looking at eight and I'm looking at 20. Both have a common factor of four. So divide this by four, you get two. Divide this by four, you get five. Then x squared over x to the ninth power, this would cancel, this would be x to the seventh. Then y over y to the seventh, this would cancel, this would be y to the sixth. So I'd basically have two in my numerator over in my denominator, three times five is 15. Then I'd have x to the seventh power, y to the sixth power. Then lastly, I have a negative divided by a positive. That's gonna give me a negative. And then 12 over 20. If I think about that, they're each divisible again by four. 12 divided by four is three. 20 divided by four is five. Then this x would cancel out completely and this would be x to the eighth power. And so what I'd have is minus, to account for that negative, three over five times x to the eighth power, y to the seventh power. So I get negative one over 25 x to the sixth y to the fifth, plus two over 15 x to the seventh y to the sixth, minus three over five x to the eighth y to the seventh. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Practice Set 34. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on dividing polynomials. All right, so we just wanna perform each division. We're gonna start out by looking at seven k cubed minus 39 k squared plus 34k minus eight, and this is divided by 7k minus four. All right, so we're gonna set this up kind of the same way we would with a long division of whole numbers, All right? This guy is gonna go, as we say, underneath the house. So we'll do 7k cubed minus 39k squared plus 34k minus eight. Again, that's gonna go underneath. And then off to kind of the left over here, let me kind of do that a little better. Off to the left over here, we're gonna have seven K minus four. Remember, this guy right here is called your dividend. So that's what goes under your house. This guy right here is called the divisor. That's what goes to the left. So once you have your problem set up, it's really easy to get started. You just wanna think about the leading term into the leading term. So how many times will seven K go into 7k cubed. Or in other words, what you're asking is, what is 7k cubed divided by 7k? Well, if I look at this, I can divide seven by seven and get one, and then k cubed over k, this is gonna cancel with this and become a two, right? So you end up with just k squared. Now, in a lot of cases, people just tend to write k squared like this. 
We want to maintain place value here. So you have a place for your k cubed, k squared, k, and then kind of k to the power of zero or just a constant, right? So we want to place it on top of this because that's where the k squared is. So I'm going to put k squared. And now we're going to multiply. Okay, so we're going to multiply k squared by the whole thing. When we did the division part, we just did the leading term and the leading term. When we do the multiplication part, it's by the whole thing. So that's one thing you need to remember. So k squared multiplied by 7k is 7k cubed. Then k squared multiplied by negative 4 is minus 4k squared. Now we're subtracting this whole thing away. So what I do is I put my parentheses there and I put a subtraction sign. And remember, if I have a negative out in front of parentheses, what can I do? I can just change the sign of each term inside so this would be negative and this would be positive. So then 7k cubed minus 7k cubed would be zero. Negative 39k squared plus 4k squared would be negative 35k squared. And then I'd bring down my next term. So plus 34k. Then the process starts all over again. So I'm going to do leading term into leading term. So what is negative 35k squared divided by 7k? Well, negative 35 over 7 is negative 5, right? This is going to cancel with this and give me a negative 5. And then k squared over k would be k. So this would be negative 5k. And then I'm going to write minus 5k right there in the answer. And I'm going to multiply. So remember, when you multiply, you're multiplying by the whole thing. So negative 5k times 7k is negative 35k squared. The negative 5k times negative 4 is plus 20k. Okay, we're going to subtract this whole thing away. So remember, you put the parentheses around that. Put your minus sign out there. So to remove the parentheses, just think about changing the sign of everything. So instead of this being negative, it will be positive. This was positive. I just made it negative. All right, so now negative 35k squared plus 35k squared, that's 0. 34k plus negative 20k, or 34k minus 20k, that is going to give me 14k. And then lastly, I'm going to bring down this negative 8, so minus 8. And then one more time, we're going to do leading term into leading term. So 7k into 14k. So in other words, what is 14k divided by 7k? Well, that's 2, right? Because if I look at this, 14 divided by 7 is 2 k over k is going to cancel and become 1. So this is just 2. So I'm going to write plus 2 here. And then 2 times 7k is 14k. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. Something minus itself is 0, but for the sake of completeness, again, let's put the parentheses and let's put the minus sign there. Scroll down and get a little room going. So to remove the parentheses here, I'm going to make this first one negative and the second one positive. 14k minus 14k is 0. Negative 8 plus 8 is 0, so there's no remainder here. So I get my answer here, and it's k squared minus 5k plus 2. So if I want to check this, remember, if I'm doing division, all I need to do is take the quotient, multiply by the divisor, and it should give me the dividend back. So let's check this first one. We have k squared minus 5k plus 2, and this is multiplied by 7k minus 4. So what I'm going to do is... Just take each term from here, multiply by each term here. So k squared times 7k is 7k cubed. k squared times negative 4 is minus 4k squared. The next I have negative 5k. So negative 5k times 7k would be negative 35k squared. Negative 5k times negative 4 is plus 20k. The next I have 2. 2 times 7k is plus 14k. And then 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. So what like terms do we have here? We have 7k cubed that is not going to be combined with anything. I have negative 4k squared and negative 35k squared. That can be combined to be negative 39k squared. Then I have 20k and 14k. That can be combined to be 34k and then minus 8. So we get 7k cubed minus 39k squared plus 34k minus 8 which is exactly what we started out with up here. Again, if you take the quotient, you multiply by the divisor, you should get the dividend back. All right, let's take a look at another one. 
we have 2a cubed minus 6a squared minus 28a minus 16. This is divided by 2a plus 4. So again, I'm going to set this up. My dividend goes underneath the house. So 2a cubed minus 6a squared minus 28a minus 16. That goes under the house. And then this 2a plus 4 goes off to the left. So again, leading term, leading term into leading term. So what is 2a cubed divided by 2a? Well, we know these twos are going to cancel. And then a cubed over a is a squared. So if I get a squared, where am I going to write it? I'm not going to write it here over the a cubed part. I'm going to write it here over the a squared. So that's where it's going to go, a squared. All right, now the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply a squared by each term here. a squared times 2a is 2a cubed. Then a squared times 4 is plus 4a squared. And then I'm going to subtract this away. Put parentheses around it. Put your minus out in front. Now, that reminds me that I've got to change the sign of each to remove the parentheses. So this would be a minus, and this would be a minus. So now I can get rid of this. I can just add. 2a cubed plus negative 2a cubed, or 2a cubed minus 2a cubed is 0. Negative 6a squared minus 4a squared is going to be negative 10a squared. And then bring down the next term. So bring down the negative 28a. And now again, I'm thinking about the leading term into the leading term. So what is negative 10a squared divided by 2a? Well, I know that negative 10 over 2 is negative 5, and a squared over a is a to the first power. So I just get negative 5a, so negative 5a, and then we're going to multiply. Let me erase all this. So negative 5a times 2a is negative 10a squared. Negative 5a times 4 is minus 20a. And I'm subtracting this whole thing away. So again, I put my minus sign out front of the parentheses. And what I want to do here is change this to plus, this to plus, and I can remove all that. So I'm just going to add here. Negative 10a squared plus 10a squared is 0. Negative 28a plus 20a. That's going to give me negative 8a. And then just go ahead and bring down the negative 16, so minus 16. So one final time, we're going to do leading term into leading term. So what is negative 8a divided by 2a? Well, this negative 8 will cancel with 2 and give me negative 4. a over a is 1. So basically, you get minus 4 here. And then we multiply. Negative 4 times 2a is negative 8a. Negative 4 times 4 is negative 16. We know that anything minus itself is 0. So if I put the parentheses out here, put negative out in front, this becomes plus, this becomes plus. I can erase this. Negative 8a plus 8a is 0. Negative 16 plus 16 is 0. So what I'm looking at for my answer is a squared minus 5a minus 4. So again, if you wanted to check to make sure that you got the right answer, I'm not going to do it for the sake of time. You just multiply this guy right here by this guy right here. You're taking your quotient, multiplying it by your divisor, and that should give you the dividend back. Right? Just like if I had 8 divided by 4 equals 2, you know, you're taking your quotient and you multiply it by the divisor. So in other words, 2 times 4 should give me 8 back, and it does. And it's going to be the same thing here. The quotient times the divisor will give you the dividend back. All right, let's take a look at some that are going to have remainders involved. So we have 5n to the fifth power plus 25n to the fourth power, plus 10n cubed, minus 40n squared, minus 15n plus 11. This is over 5n plus 5. So again, this part right here, the top part, is the dividend. This part right here, the bottom part, is the divisor. This is the same thing as if I wrote this, and then a division sign, and then this. Right? It's the same. So what I want to do, again, is set this up in long division format. So this top part, 5n to the 5th power plus 25n to the 4th power plus 10n cubed minus 40n squared minus 15n plus 11. And this is going to be underneath the house. Let me make that a little better. And then off to the left, I'm going to have 5n plus 5. 
Again, the first thing I'm going to do is leading term into leading term. So what is 5n to the fifth power divided by 5n? Well, we know that the fives would cancel, and n to the fifth power over n is n to the fourth power. So I'm not going to write that over this. I'm going to write it over this, because that's where my n to the fourth power is. So now I'm going to multiply. So n to the fourth power times 5n is going to be 5n to the fifth power. n to the fourth power times 5 is plus 5n to the fourth power. So then I'm going to subtract. So what I'm going to do to remove these parentheses, I'm going to make this a minus. I'm going to make this a minus. And then I can remove all that. All right, so 5n to the fifth power minus 5n to the fifth power is 0. 25n to the fourth power minus 5n to the fourth power is 20n to the fourth power. Go ahead and bring this next guy down here. So we're going to have plus 10n cubed. And then we're going to repeat the process. So we're going to do leading term into leading term. So what is 20n to the fourth power over 5n? Well, 20 over 5 is 4. This is going to give me 4. n to the fourth power over n. This is going to cancel with this and give me a 3 up here. So that would be 4n cubed. So plus 4n cubed. Let's scroll down just a little bit here. And now 4n cubed times 5n is going to give me 20n to the fourth power. 4n cubed times 5 is going to give me plus 20n cubed. And we're going to subtract this guy away. So remember, we're going to put our parentheses out here. So minus, put the parentheses out there. And then you're going to change the sign of each term. So minus and minus. And then you can erase this. So 20n to the fourth power minus 20n to the fourth power is obviously 0. 10n cubed minus 20n cubed is minus 10n cubed. Bring down this next guy. So we have minus 40n squared. And then we repeat the process. We're going to do leading term into leading term. So what is negative 10n cubed over 5n? Well, if I divide negative 10 by 5, I get negative 2. And then n cubed over n, this is going to cancel, and this will be n squared. So I get negative 2, negative 2, n squared. And now we multiply. So negative 2n squared times 5n is negative 10n cubed. Negative 2n squared times 5 would be negative 10n squared. And again, we're subtracting this away. So if I have minus out in front of the parentheses, to remove the parentheses, I've got to make this plus and this plus, and then we can get rid of this. So then negative 10n cubed plus 10n cubed is 0. Negative 40n squared plus 10n squared is going to be negative 30n squared. I'm going to bring down this term now, so minus 15n. And again, we want to do leading term into leading term. So what is negative 30n squared over 5n? Well, negative 30 divided by 5 is negative 6. n squared over n is just n. So this would be minus 6n. So minus 6n, that goes up here. And then we're just going to multiply. So negative 6n times 5n is negative 30n squared. Negative 6n times 5 is minus 30n. And again, we're going to subtract. And then change this to plus, and this to plus, and then we can remove all this. Negative 30n squared plus 30n squared is 0. Negative 15n plus 30n is 15n. So this is 15n. And I'm going to bring this last guy down here, this 11, so plus 11. And then again, leading term. We just change colors here. Leading term into leading term. So everybody can see that that would be 3, right? 5n goes into 15n three times, but we can write it out here. 15n over 5n. Obviously, this would cancel with this and give me a 3, and then this is going to cancel. So this is plus 3 right here. All right, so we're going to multiply. 3 times 5n is 15n. So this is 15n. And then 3 times 5 is 15, so plus 15. Okay, so this is going to go off the screen because i got to scroll down a little bit. So then I'm going to subtract all this away. So basically what that means is what? I'm going to have negative 15n minus 15. And so 15n minus 15n is 0. 11 minus 15 is negative 4. So this is your remainder. Okay, that's your remainder. So let me erase everything. So I'm going to put equals. 
and then we'll bring this over. So you have this guy with a remainder of negative four. But really the way you write this as, the negative four is just divided by this. So you just put plus, put negative four over five n plus five, and that's your answer. Now, the way you check this, I want you to think about when you checked your division of whole numbers when you had a remainder. So let's say I had something like 39 divided by four. Four didn't go into 30, four went into 39 nine times, nine times four is 36, subtract and you get three. Well, what I could do is I could take nine and multiply it by four, right? This is the quotient, this is the divisor. That would give me 36, and then I would add to that the remainder, and that would give me the dividend back. That's how I would get to 39. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this part right here. I'm gonna multiply it by this, and when I'm done, I'm just gonna add that negative four in, and I'm gonna be right back to this. And I'm only gonna do this once because it's super, super time consuming, right? So what I'm gonna do is have 5n plus five multiplied by n to the fourth power plus four n cubed minus two n squared minus six n plus three. When this is finished, I'm gonna add negative four and I'm gonna get this. So let's go through and crank this out. So then 5n times n to the fourth power would give me 5n to the fifth power. 5n times 4n cubed would give me plus 20n to the fourth power. 5n times negative 2n squared would give me minus 10n cubed. 5n times negative 6n would give me minus 30n squared. 5n times three would be plus 15n, then plus. We have five times n to the fourth power, that's five n to the fourth power. Then five times four n cubed is plus 20 n cubed. Five times negative two n squared is minus 10 n squared. Five times negative six n is minus 30 n. And then five times three is gonna be 15. So combine like terms here, you'll have five n to the fifth power, plus you've got 20 n to the fourth power, five n to the fourth power, that's 25 n to the fourth power. You've got negative 10 n cubed and 20 n cubed. That's plus 10 n cubed. You've got negative 30 n squared and negative 10 n squared. That's minus 40 n squared. Then you've got 15 n minus 30 n. That's minus 15 n. And then lastly, plus 15. So if I look at this right here and I look at this right here, they're not the same they differ by this negative four. So if I added that in, this plus 15 here, 15 plus negative four would be 11. So I would have five n to the fifth power plus 25 n to the fourth power plus 10 n cubed minus 40 n squared minus 15 n plus, again, if I added negative four, that remainder, it would be plus 11, right? As it stands, because I just multiplied these two together, I got plus 15, but again, if I put this in there, plus negative four, 15 plus negative four is 11, and that would give me exactly what I have right here. The five n to the fifth power plus 25 n to the fourth power plus 10 n cubed minus 40 n squared minus 15 n plus 11. So that's what you need to do. You multiply the divisor by the quotient, and when you're done, you take that remainder part, that part you got at the very, very end, and you add it to this, okay, you add it to this, and then you're gonna end up with your dividend back. Again, if I added negative four to this, I would end up with 15 minus four and I would get 11 there. That would give me exactly this back. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 14m to the fourth power plus 4m to the fifth power plus 13 plus 2m cubed plus 16m minus 64m squared over 4m minus six. So the first thing is this isn't in standard form, right? You want it in kind of the order of descending power. So when I write this, I wanna put 4m to the fifth power plus 14m to the fourth power, then next plus 2m cubed, then minus 64m squared, then plus 16m, and then plus 13. Let me move this down just a little bit. Then over here to the left, I want 4m minus six. Everything's gotta be in descending order of powers. 
So once you've got that, again, it's leading term into leading term. So 4m to the fifth power divided by 4m. But you see the 4s would cancel. m to the fifth power over m is m to the fourth power. So that's going to go right here. right? It doesn't go all the way to the left. It goes right here over the m to the fourth power. And then once that's done, we're going to multiply. So m to the fourth power times 4m is 4m to the fifth power. m to the fourth power times negative 6 is minus 6m to the fourth power. Now we're subtracting this away. So again, at this point, I feel that you might be comfortable doing this. I'm going to change the sign of everything that's being subtracted away. So this will be a minus and this will be a plus. No need to put the parentheses there, right? So once you feel comfortable, go ahead and take that additional step away. But again, just realize that that could cost you a correct answer if you do it wrong. So then 4m to the fifth power minus 4m to the fifth power is going to be zero. 14m to the fourth power plus 6m to the fourth power is 20m to the fourth power. And then the next thing I'm going to do is pull down this 2m cubed. And again, we're going to do leading term, leading term into leading term. So what is 20 m to the fourth power over 4m. Well, we know that this is going to cancel with this and give me 5. This will cancel with this and give me an m cubed here. So 5m cubed. So plus 5m cubed. And let's go ahead and multiply. 5m cubed times 4m is 20m to the fourth power. 5m cubed times negative 6 is minus 30m cubed. Now, again, to use a little shortcut, we're subtracting this whole thing away. So this is going to be a minus and this is going to be a plus. Everything that's just subtracting away, you've got to change the sign of it. So instead of positive 20m to the fourth power, I've got negative. Instead of minus 30m cubed, I've got positive. So now I can just add 20m to the fourth power minus 20m to the fourth power is 0. 2m cubed plus 30m cubed is 32. 32m cubed. Bring down the next guy. So minus 64m squared. And again, leading term into leading term. So leading term into leading term. Well, 32 divided by 4 is 8. And then m cubed over m is m squared. So this would be plus 8m squared. And we multiply. 8m squared times 4m, again, is 32m cubed. 8m squared times negative 6 is minus 48m squared. So then I'm subtracting this whole thing away, so this becomes minus, this becomes plus. So 32m cubed minus 32m cubed is 0. Negative 64m squared plus 48m squared is going to give me negative 16m squared. All right, so now I'm going to bring down my next term, which is going to be this guy right here. So plus 16m now. And again, I'm just going to do leading term into leading term. So I want to take a look at what is negative 16m squared over 4m. What is that? Well, I know that negative 16 over 4 is negative 4, and m squared over m is just m. So this would be minus 4m. And if I take negative 4m and I multiply it by 4m, I'm going to get negative 16m squared. Negative 4m times negative 6 is going to be plus 24m. So again, change the sign of everything because you're subtracting it away. So this becomes plus, and then this guy becomes minus. So now we can add negative 16m squared plus 16m squared at 0. 16m minus 24m, this is going to be negative 8m. I'm going to bring down this last guy, this 13. So plus 13. And I'm running out of room here, so let me kind of scroll down a little bit. So one final time here, we're going to look at leading term into leading term. So if I have negative 8m, and I divide that guy by 4m, what's that going to be? Well, we can easily see that negative 8 over 4 is negative 2, and m over m is going to cancel. So this is minus 2 up here. And so negative 2 times 4m is going to be negative 8m. So negative 8m. And negative 2 times negative 6 is going to be plus 12. So then we're subtracting this thing away. So this becomes positive and this becomes negative. Negative 8m plus 8m is 0. 13 minus 12 is 1. So this is my remainder, the number 1. We're going to write equals and then plus 
1, that remainder, over the divisor. So over 4m minus 6. And again, if you want to check this, go ahead and take this part right here, the divisor, multiply it by this part. Okay. When you're done, add this part, the number 1, and that will take you back to this right here, the dividend. Go ahead and try that on your own. I'm not going to do it in the interest of time, but pause the video and try it on your own, and you will see that you get this back exactly. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on dividing polynomials. So we want to perform each division, and we're going to take a look at b cubed plus 6b squared plus 10b plus 8, and this is divided by b plus 4. So again, to set this up, this guy right here, the dividend, is going to go, as we say, underneath the house. So b cubed plus 6b squared plus 10b plus 8. So that goes underneath. Let me make that a little better. And then out to the left, my divisor, b plus 4. So the first thing we're going to do is go leading term into leading term. So what is b cubed divided by b? Well, we know that this is going to cancel with one of the factors of b up here. So this would give me a b squared. Now, where am I going to write that answer? I'm not going to write it over here. I'm going to write it over the b squared. So I'm going to put it right here. And let's erase all this real quick. And now we're going to multiply. So b squared times b is b cubed. Then b squared times 4 is plus 4b squared. Now I want to subtract away this polynomial. So I can put parentheses out in front, put this minus sign here, but realize that all I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to really just be changing the sign of each term here. So this would be negative, and so will this one. And then I can just add. b cubed minus b cubed is 0. 6b squared minus 4b squared is going to be 2b squared. 2b squared. And then bring down the next term, which is 10b. And now I'm going to repeat the process. So I'm going to go leading term into leading term. So what is 2b squared over b? Well, this b is going to cancel with a factor of b up here. So I get 2b. So plus 2b. And then again, I'm going to multiply. So 2b times b is 2b squared. Let me just erase this real quick. And then 2b times 4 is plus 8b. Again, if I'm subtracting away this whole polynomial, I don't just put a minus sign out in front here. I've got to change the sign of each term. So that's a minus, and then that's a minus. So now 2b squared minus 2b squared is 0. 10b minus 8b is 2b. So this is 2b. Let me scroll down and get a little bit more room going. And now I bring down the next term, which is plus 8. And then again, I want to do leading term into leading term. So what is 2b over b? Well, that one's easy. The b is going to cancel with the b, and I'll just have 2. So I'll put plus 2 here. And let me just erase all this. And then I'm going to multiply. 2 times b is 2b. And then 2 times 4 is plus 8. We know that anything minus itself is 0, right? So I don't, I don't have to go through at this point. I can just put a line through and just put 0. But for the sake of completeness, this would become negative. And this would become negative, right? Because we're subtracting the whole thing away. So we just change the sign of each term. So 2b minus 2b is 0. 8 minus 8 is 0. So you have no remainder here. And our answer is b squared plus 2b plus 2. Now let me erase this real quick. So again, if you want to check this, remember, if you take your quotient and you multiply it by your divisor, you should get your dividend back. So let's see if we do. So if we have b plus 4 and we multiply it by b squared plus 2b plus 2, what are we going to get? Well, b times b squared is b cubed. b times 2b is plus 2b squared. b times 2 is plus 2b. And then 4 times b squared is plus 4b squared. And then 4 times 2b is plus 8b. And then lastly, 4 times 2 is plus 8. So if I combine like terms, I have b cubed, nothing to combine with that. I have 2b squared and I have 4b squared, that's plus 6b squared. I have 2b and 8b, that's plus 10b. And then I have plus 8. 
that's exactly what I have right here as the dividend. B cubed plus 6B squared plus 10B plus 8. That's what I get when I multiply my quotient by my divisor. And so I know I have the correct answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on dividing polynomials. All right, we want to perform each division. So we have x cubed plus 11x squared plus 35x plus 20. And this is divided by x plus 4. All right, so let's set this up as x cubed plus 11x squared plus 35x plus 20. And that goes underneath the house. And then off to the left, we have x plus 4. Remember, this is your dividend, right? This is your dividend, and this is your divisor. This is your divisor. So once we've set this up, we just start out by saying leading term into leading term. So x goes into x cubed. So that's x cubed over x. And the result from that, we already know, would be x squared, right? This would cancel with one of these. So we'd have x squared. And we want to write that over this place right here, the 11x squared. So this is where this is going to go. And then we want to multiply. And we want to multiply by the x and the 4. So x squared times x is x cubed. And then x squared times 4 is plus 4x squared. Now I'm going to subtract this whole thing away. So to do that more quickly, I'm just going to change the sign of each term. So this is going to be a minus, and this is going to be a minus. And so x cubed minus x cubed is 0. 11x squared minus 4x squared is 7x squared. So this would be 7x squared. And then I want to bring down this 35x here. So plus 35x. And now I want to start the process over. So I want to say leading term into leading term. So 7x squared over x is equal to what? Well, this x is going to cancel with one of these. So this will just be 7x. So plus 7x. All right, now I want to multiply. So 7x times x is 7x squared. 7x times 4 is plus 28x. And again, I'm subtracting this whole thing away. So I just want to change the sign of each term. So this would become minus, and this would become minus. If you're not good at remembering that, again, the key is to put parentheses around it, put a minus sign out in front, so you remember to change the sign of each term. Okay, that, that's what I did when I started out. I just did that until I could remember that each term had to have its sign changed. So once you have that down, you're good to go. So 7x squared minus 7x squared is 0. 35x minus 28x is going to be 7x. So this is going to be 7x. Then we want to bring down this plus 20 here. And again, we're going to repeat the process. So leading term into leading term. So what is 7x over x? 7x over x. Well, we know that the x's would just cancel. And I'll be left with the number 7. So plus 7. And then we want to multiply. 7 times x is 7x. And then 7 times 4 is plus 28. And we're subtracting this away. So this is going to become a negative, And this is going to become a negative. So 7x minus 7x is 0. 20 minus 28 is negative 8. So this right here, because there's no more numbers to bring down, is called the remainder. This is your remainder. So let me erase everything. So for my answer, with the remainder, we just put plus negative 8 over the divisor, which is x plus 4. Now, if I want to check this, there's two different ways you can kind of do it. The first thing you can do is you can just take this part right here and multiply it by this part right here. And when you're done, just add negative 8 to that result. Okay, that's going to give you this back if you got the right answer. The other thing you can do is you can just multiply this by this whole thing. Right? You can just multiply that times that. And what's going to happen, the x plus 4 is going to cancel with the x plus 4 here. And it's basically the same thing as if you did what I just said. Right? So either way you do it, you'll get the same result. So let's go ahead and just kind of do it the first way because it's a little, a little simpler. We're going to do x squared plus 7x plus 7. And then we're going to multiply that by x plus 4. And when we're done, we're going to add negative 8 to that. And we should get this back. So x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times 4 is plus 4x squared. 7x times x is plus 7x squared. 
Seven X times four is plus 28 X. Then I have seven times X, that's plus seven X. And then seven times four, that's plus 28. All right, so to combine like terms, I have X cubed and then plus four X squared plus seven X squared is 11 X squared. And then 28 X plus seven X is gonna be 35 X. And then lastly, I have plus 28. Now, if I look at this right here, and I look at this right here, everything is the same except for this right here, this 28. Here I have 20, and what's the reason for that? Well, remember, I have this negative eight that I need to add to this. So 28 plus negative eight would give me that 20 there, so those would match completely. Hello, and welcome to Algebra One, test section three on dividing polynomials. All right, so we're gonna look at eight V to the fourth power minus 30 V cubed plus 58 V squared plus 26 V minus 48, and then this is over 8v minus 6. All right, so let's set this up. Remember, this top part here is the dividend. So that's going to go, as we say, underneath the house. So we'll have 8v to the fourth power minus 30v cubed, then plus 58v squared plus 26v minus 48. And then in the denominator, the 8v minus 6, this is the divisor. So this goes off to the left, so 8v minus 6. So now that this is set up, we're ready to divide. So we're going to start out with leading term into leading term. So what is 8v to the fourth power over 8v? Well, the 8s are going to cancel, and then this v will cancel with one of the v's up here. So that's V cubed as the answer. And then make sure to write that over the V cubed here. So this is gonna go right there. All right, so let's erase all this and we're gonna multiply. V cubed times eight V is eight V to the fourth power. V cubed times negative six is minus six V cubed. And then we're subtracting away this thing. So that means I'm gonna change the sign of each term. So this will be minus and then this will become plus. And now we can just add. So 8v to the fourth power minus 8v to the fourth power is zero. Negative 30v cubed plus 6v cubed is going to give me negative 24v cubed. And then I would bring down the next term, so plus 58v squared. And then I would start the process over. So I wanna go leading term into leading term. So we'd have negative 24v cubed over 8v. And so negative 24 divided by eight is negative three. And then V cubed over V is V squared. So then this is gonna end up being negative three V squared. So minus three V squared. And then we're gonna multiply. Let me erase this real quick. So we're gonna multiply negative three V squared times eight V. That's negative 24 V cubed. Then negative three V squared times negative six. That's positive 18 V squared. Now again, because I'm subtracting this away, I've got to change the signs. So this would be a positive, and then this would become a negative. So negative 24v cubed plus 24v cubed is zero. 58v squared minus 18v squared is 40v squared. And then let's bring down the next term. And then again, what I want to do is I want to go leading term into leading term. So what is 40V squared over 8V? Well, this 40 is gonna cancel with this eight and give me a five. V will cancel with one of the V's up here. So I'll have five V. So this would be plus five V. And then again, I wanna multiply. So let me erase all this real quick. Five V times eight V is 40 V squared. Five V times negative six is minus 30 V. And we'd subtract this away. So again, I'm gonna change the sign of each term. So this will be minus, this will be plus. 40V squared minus 40V squared is zero. 26V plus 30V is gonna be 56V. And then bring down the next term here, so minus 48. And now I'm looking at, once more, leading term into leading term. So we'd have 56V over 8V. And 56 divided by eight is seven, V over V is one. So this is just plus seven. 
All right, so now we want to multiply one last time. 7 times 8v is 56v. Then 7 times negative 6 is negative 42. And because I'm subtracting this guy away, I want to change the sign of each term. So this is going to be a minus and this is going to be a plus. So 56v minus 56v is 0. Negative 48 plus 42 is negative 6. So this negative 6 part right here is the remainder. So let me erase everything. So then for my answer, let me kind of move this over a little bit. We have a remainder of negative 6. So I can put plus negative 6 over the divisor of 8v minus 6. Now, if I want to check this, I'm going to multiply this part right here. Just exclude the remainder. This part right here times this part right here. So quotient times divisor. When I'm done, add that remainder in, just the negative 6 part. Okay, that's all you need to do. That will give you this back right here. So let's go ahead and check that out. So we have 8v minus 6, and we're multiplying this by v cubed minus 3v squared plus 5v plus 7. And then when we're done with this, we're going to add negative 6, and we'll get right back to this. So 8v times v cubed is going to give me 8v to the fourth power. 8v times negative 3v squared is negative 24v cubed. 8v times 5v is plus 40v squared. Then 8v times 7 is going to be plus 56v. All right, moving on, we have negative 6 times v cubed. That's minus 6v cubed. Then negative 6 times negative 3v squared. That's plus 18v squared. Then negative 6 times 5v. That's going to be negative 30v. Then lastly, negative 6 times 7 would be minus 42. Now, if I combine like terms here, I'm going to have 8v to the fourth power, negative 24v cubed, and negative 6v cubed would combine to give me negative 30v cubed. 40v squared plus 18v squared would combine to give me 58v squared. Then negative 30v plus 56v would be plus 26v. And then the last thing I have here is minus 42. So let me write that down here. That's minus 42. Now, if I look at this part right here, this, and let me kind of rewrite this. 8v to the fourth power minus 30v cubed plus 58v squared plus 26v minus 42. It's the exact same thing as this, except for this minus 42. Here I have minus 48. So the difference is that remainder there of negative 6. If I subtract away 6, I'm going to get that negative 48 there. So let's just do that as a final step here. So I would take this guy here, this 8v to the fourth power minus 30v cubed plus 58v squared plus 26v minus 42, and then I would subtract away that 6. So minus 6, and then that's going to give me once I combine like terms here, my original dividend, which was 8v to the fourth power minus 30v cubed plus 58v squared plus 26v and then minus 48. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on dividing polynomials. All right, so we want to perform each division. So we're taking a look at 23 minus 13x squared plus 7x to the fourth power plus 14x minus 48x cubed, and this is over negative 6 plus 7x. So the first thing you need to do is rearrange each polynomial in standard form, right? So you want it in descending order of power. So in other words, in the numerator here, I want 7x to the fourth power, and then minus 48x cubed, and then minus 13x squared, and then plus 14x, and then I want plus 23. So I've got to the fourth power, cubed, squared, to the first power, and then no power. Then in the denominator, I would just rearrange these and put 7x minus 6. Okay, so once I've done this, now I just set this up in the usual way. This top part, the dividend, goes underneath the house. So 7x to the fourth power minus 48x cubed minus 13x squared, plus 14x, plus 23. All right, so this part right here goes out here, 7x minus 6. So we're going to start out 
by asking leading term into leading term. So what is 7x to the fourth power over 7x? So this is going to cancel. This 7 is going to cancel with this 7. And then x to the fourth power is going to cancel with x. So this will cancel with this, and this will be cubed. So I'll have x cubed right here. And so x cubed times 7x is 7x to the fourth power. x cubed times negative 6 is minus 6x cubed. And I'm subtracting this guy away. So I can put parentheses around it, put the minus out in front. Or once you've kind of realized what you need to do, just change the sign of each term that's being subtracted away. So this would be minus and this would be plus. And you just go through and add. So 7x to the fourth power minus 7x to the fourth power is 0. Negative 48x cubed plus 6x cubed is going to give me negative 42x cubed. And now I want to bring down the next term, which is negative 13x squared. And then I'm just going to continue with my division. So I'm going to go leading term into leading term. So 7x goes into negative 42x cubed. So that's negative 42x cubed over 7x. And so this would cancel with this and give me a negative 6. And then this would cancel with this and give me x squared. So that's minus 6x squared. And then we would multiply. So we'd have negative 6x squared times 7x. That's going to give me negative 42x cubed. Then negative 6x squared times negative 6 is positive 36x squared. Now I'm subtracting this guy away. So I want to change the sign of each term. So this will become positive, and then this will become negative. So if I add here, negative 42x cubed plus 42x cubed is 0. Negative 13x squared plus negative 36x squared is negative 49x squared. And then I just bring down the next term. So bring down the plus 14x. And then again, I'm looking at leading term into leading term. So what is negative 49x squared over 7x? This would cancel with this and give me a negative 7. And then x would cancel with one of these factors of x here. So this would just be x. So I'd have negative 7x. So let me write minus 7x here. And then I want to erase all this and multiply. So negative 7x times 7x is negative 49x squared. Negative 7x times negative 6 is plus 42x. Now, again, I'm subtracting this whole thing away. So I want to change the sign of each term. So this would be positive and this would be negative. So negative 49x squared plus 49x squared is 0. 14x minus 42x is negative 28x. Then we want to bring down this 23 here, so plus 23. And then one last time, we want to say leading term into leading term. So what is negative 28x over 7x? Well, this negative 28 would cancel with 7, giving negative 4. x would cancel with x. So this is just minus 4 here. So then negative 4 times 7x is negative 28x. Then negative 4 times negative 6 is plus 24. Again, I'm subtracting this guy away, so I want to change the sign of each term. So then this would be positive, and this would be negative. So negative 28x plus 28x is 0, and then 23 minus 24 is negative 1. So this is my remainder here. There's nothing else to bring down. So negative 1 is the remainder. So let me erase everything. All right, so then I have this guy right here, x cubed minus 6x squared minus 7x minus 4, and then plus your remainder, which is negative 1 over that divisor of 7x minus 6. Now, to check this, again, you want to take this part right here, the divisor, multiply by this part right here, which is the quotient, and when you're done, you add that negative 1. Okay, that's going to give you this back. So let's go ahead and just do that. So we'd have 7x minus 6 times x cubed minus 6x squared minus 7x minus 4. So what are we going to get? 7x times x cubed is 7x to the fourth power. 7x times negative 6x squared is minus 42x cubed. 
7x times negative 7x is negative 49x squared. Then 7x times negative 4 is minus 28x. Then negative 6 times x cubed is minus 6x cubed. Negative 6 times negative 6x squared is plus 36x squared. Negative 6 times negative 7x is plus 42x. Then negative 6 times negative 4 is plus 24. All right, so let's combine like terms and see what we get. So we'd have 7x to the fourth power. Nothing I can do with that. I'd have negative 42x cubed and negative 6x cubed. That's minus 48x cubed. Then I'd have negative 49x squared plus 36x squared. That's going to give me negative 13x squared. Then next I have 42x minus 28x, which is plus 14x. And then lastly, I have plus 24. Now, if you look at this, everything is the same as up here, except for this. You have 23 here, you have 24 here. And the reason for that is that remainder there, that negative 1 that we got at the end of the division. If I added negative 1, or if I subtracted away 1, I would in fact get that 23 there. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on dividing polynomials. All right, we want to perform each division. We're going to look at negative 20x to the fourth power, minus 3x cubed, minus 11x squared, minus 13x plus 24. And this is divided by 5x squared plus 2x minus 3. So again, your dividend here, as they say, goes under the house. So this is negative 20x to the fourth power minus 3x cubed minus 11x squared minus 13x plus 24. And then your divisor here is going to go off to the left. So we have 5x squared plus 2x minus 3. So once we have everything set up, we're just going to go leading term into leading term. So what is what is negative 20x to the fourth power over 5x squared? Well, negative 20 over 5 is negative 4, and then x to the fourth power over x squared, this is going to cancel, and this is going to be x squared. So I'd have negative 4x squared, and where am I going to write that? Am I going to write that here? No. Am I going to write that here? No. I'm going to write that over where I have an x squared term, right? So I'm going to put negative 4x squared here, and then I'm going to multiply. So when I multiply, I multiply by everything. Negative 4x squared times 5x squared is negative 20x to the fourth power. Negative 4x squared times 2x is negative 8x cubed. Negative 4x squared times negative 3 is positive 12x squared. Now, I am subtracting this whole thing away. So each sign is going to change. So this will be positive, this will be positive, and then this will be negative. Now I can just add negative 20x to the fourth power plus 20x to the fourth power is 0. Negative 3x cubed plus 8x cubed, that is going to give me 5x cubed. Negative 11x squared minus 12x squared is going to give me negative 23x squared. And then I bring down my next term, which is negative 13x. So again, I want to do leading term into leading term. So what is 5x cubed over 5x squared? We know the 5s would cancel, and then x cubed over x squared is just x. So this is going to be plus x, and then I'm going to multiply. So x times 5x squared is 5x cubed. Then x times 2x is plus 2x squared. Then x times negative 3 is minus 3x. So if I'm subtracting this whole thing away, again, i got to change the sign of everything. So this will be minus, this will be minus, and this will be plus. So 5x cubed minus 5x cubed is 0. Negative 23x squared plus negative 2x squared. That's going to give me negative 25x squared. Negative 13x plus 3x is negative 10x. And then I bring down my next term, which is plus 24. All right, so the next thing we want to do again is leading term into leading term. So we'd have negative 25x squared over 5x squared. So then what we're looking at here is this x squared is going to cancel out completely. And then negative 25 over 5 is negative 5. So this would be minus 5. 
And then again, we're going to multiply. So negative 5 times 5x squared is negative 25x squared. Negative 5 times 2x is minus 10x. And then negative 5 times negative 3 is positive 15. So again, I'm subtracting everything away here. So I want to change all the signs. So this will be plus, plus, and this will be minus. So negative 25x squared plus 25x squared is 0. Negative 10x plus 10x is 0. And then 24 minus 15 is 9. So this guy is my remainder. So let's go ahead and erase everything and write our answer. All right, so this is equal to this. And then remember, the remainder is 9. So we write that as plus 9 over the divisor. 5x squared plus 2x minus 3. So again, to check this, I take this guy right here, the quotient, and I multiply by this guy right here, the divisor, then I add that 9, that remainder, and I should get the dividend back. So let's go ahead and check that out. So we would have 5x squared plus 2x minus 3 times negative 4x squared plus x minus 5. Let me scroll down and get some room. So 5x squared times negative 4x squared, that's going to give me negative 20x to the fourth power. Then 5x squared times x is plus 5x cubed. Then 5x squared times negative 5 is minus 25x squared. Next, I have 2x times negative 4x squared. That's negative 8x cubed. Then 2x times x is going to be plus 2x squared. Then 2x times negative 5 is minus 10x. Then we have negative 3 times negative 4x squared. That's plus 12x squared. Then negative 3 times x is minus 3x. Then negative 3 times negative 5 is plus 15. So if we combine like terms here, we're going to have negative 20x to the fourth power. 5x cubed minus 8x cubed is going to be minus 3x cubed. Negative 25x squared plus 2x squared plus 12x squared. Well, 2 plus 12 is 14. So negative 25 plus 14 is negative 11. So this would be negative 11x squared. And then next I have negative 10x minus 3x. That's negative 13x. And lastly, I have plus 15. So this is exactly what we had as our dividend. The only difference is this part right here. And remember, I had a 9 as a remainder. So if I just added 9, if I added 9 there, this would end up being plus 24, and that would give us our dividend back. So that's how you go about checking something like that, and it shows us that we do, in fact, have the correct answer here. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 35. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we want to perform each division, and we're going to start out with 2x cubed minus 14x plus 5, and this is divided by 2x minus 2. So recall that if I have a polynomial with missing terms, like I have here, I have an x cubed, but I don't have an x squared, what I do is I write 0 as the coefficient for that missing term. So when I write this, I'll have 2x cubed plus, I'll put a 0 in front of x squared, because I have a missing term of x squared, and then minus 14x, and then plus 5, right? Starting with the highest power, which is you have an x cubed there, you've got to go in descending order. So you've got to have an x squared and an x to the first power, and so now I have all of those. All right, so now this is going to be divided by, the divisor here is 2x minus 2, not missing anything there, and so I can start the division. So leading term into leading term. So what is 2x cubed over 2x? Well, the 2s are going to cancel. That's going to be 1. And then x cubed over x, this is going to cancel, and this will be x squared. So I'll have x squared here, and then I'm just going to multiply. So x squared times 2x is 2x cubed. x squared times negative 2 is minus 2x squared. Now I'm subtracting this guy away. So I'm going to change the sign of this guy to minus. I'm going to change the sign of this guy to plus. 2x cubed minus 2x cubed is 0. 0x zero squared plus 2x squared is 2x squared. Bring down the next term. This is minus 14x. And now I'm going to do leading term into leading term. So we would say 2x squared over 2x. The 2s would cancel. x squared over x. This is going to cancel with this, and this will be x to the first power. And so I'm going to put plus 
x to the first power here, and I'm just going to multiply. So x times 2x is 2x squared. x times negative 2 is minus 2x. So remember, I'm subtracting this guy away. So this is going to become minus, and this is going to become plus. 2x squared minus 2x squared is 0. Negative 14x plus 2x is going to give me negative 12x. Bring down this 5 here, so plus 5. And then I'm going to say 2x goes into negative 12x how many times? Well, we know the x's are going to cancel, and negative 12 over 2 is going to be negative 6. So this would be minus 6 here. Then negative 6 times 2x is negative 12x. Negative 6 times negative 2 is plus 12. Now, again, I'm subtracting this guy away. So this becomes plus, and then this becomes a minus. So then negative 12x plus 12x is 0, and then 5 minus 12 is going to give me a remainder of negative 7. So I'm going to write my answer here. Let me erase all this. So I'll put equals. Let me kind of move this over. We have x squared plus x minus 6, and then plus that remainder, which is negative 7. I'm going to write that over the divisor of 2x minus 2. Now, to check this, remember, you have a remainder involved. It's a little bit more complicated. You can take this whole thing and multiply it by this, just like it is. Or if you want, you can just multiply this part right here by this right here, and then just take this guy and add it to the result, and you're going to get this back. So let's go ahead and just multiply this part times this part. So that's going to give me x squared plus x minus 6 times 2x minus 2. When I'm done, I'm going to add negative 7. So this is going to be x squared times 2x, that's 2x cubed. x squared times negative 2, that's minus 2x squared. x times 2x is plus 2x squared. x times negative 2 is minus 2x. Negative 6 times 2x is minus 12x. And then negative 6 times negative 2 is plus 12. So if I combine like terms here, I can see that I'm going to have 2x cubed Negative 2x squared plus 2x squared, that's going to cancel. Negative 2x minus 12x is negative 14x, and then plus 12. So if I look at this right here, and if I go back up, let me kind of erase all this real quick. If I go back up here, and I look at this, and I look at this, everything's the same except for this last number. I have a 12 here, and I have a 5 here. Well, the difference is I have that negative 7. Right, if I subtract 7 away from this guy, if I say, what's this guy minus 7? Well, that's going to be equal to 2x cubed minus 14x plus 5, which is exactly what we had here as our dividend. Uh, let's take a look at another one. We have 27x to the 5th power minus 3x to the 4th power plus 42x cubed minus 13x squared plus 8x minus 12. And then we're dividing this by 3x squared plus 4. All right, so let's get started with our dividend. We have 27x to the fifth power minus 3x to the fourth power plus 42x cubed minus 13x squared plus 8x minus 12. Not missing anything there. I have x to the fifth power, x to the fourth power, x cubed, x squared, x to the first power. Good to go. For my divisor, though, I am missing an x to the first power. I have 3x squared plus 4, so I need 3x squared plus 0x, just putting a 0 as the coefficient of the missing term, and then plus 4. And now we're good to go. So now I'm going to go leading term into leading term. So 27x to the fifth power over 3x squared. This is going to cancel with this and give me a 9. x to the fifth power over x squared is going to be x cubed. So this would be 9x cubed, so 9x cubed, and then I'm going to multiply. 9x cubed times 3x squared is 27x to the fifth power. 9x cubed times 0x is plus 0x to the fourth power. 9x cubed times 4 is plus 36x cubed. Now I'm subtracting this away, so I'm going to change all my signs. This will be minus... And these two will be minus. So 27x to the fifth power minus 27x to the fifth power is 0. Negative 3x to the fourth power minus 0x to the fourth power is just simply negative 3x to the fourth power. 42x cubed minus 36x cubed is going to be plus 6x cubed. 
we're going to bring down this next guy, which is negative 13x squared. So now leading term into leading term. I'm looking at negative 3x to the fourth power over 3x squared. So these threes are going to cancel. I'll just be left with negative 1. x to the fourth over x squared, this is going to cancel. This is going to be a 2. So I'll just have negative x squared. So I'll just have minus x squared here. And I'm just going to multiply. Negative x squared times 3x squared is negative 3x to the fourth power. Negative x squared times 0x is minus 0x cubed. Negative x squared times 4 is minus 4x squared. All right, so now let's go through, and we're going to change the sign of each term that's being subtracted away. Remember, we're subtracting this whole thing away, so this will be plus, plus, and plus. So negative 3x to the fourth power plus 3x to the fourth power is 0. 6x cubed plus 0x cubed is 6x cubed. Negative 13x squared plus 4x squared is negative 9x squared. Let's bring this guy down here, so plus 8x. And again, leading term into leading term. So 6x cubed over 3x squared. Well, we know that this is going to cancel with this and give me a 2. And then this would cancel out with this and give me x to the first power. So I'd simply have plus 2x. All right, so let's multiply now. 2x times 3x squared is going to give me 6x cubed. 2x times 0x is going to give me plus 0x squared. 2x times 4 is plus 8x. All right, so now we're going to subtract the terms away. Right, We're subtracting all these away, so minus, minus, and minus. So 6x cubed minus 6x cubed is 0. Negative 9x squared minus 0x squared is negative 9x squared. And then 8x minus 8x is 0x, so plus 0x. Go ahead and bring this next guy down, this negative 12. And again, leading term, 3x squared, into leading term, negative 9x squared. So what is negative 9x squared over 3x squared? Well, we know that negative 9 over 3 is negative 3. x squared over x squared is 1. So this is just minus 3 here. And let's go ahead and multiply. Negative 3 times 3x squared is negative 9x squared. Negative 3 times 0x is just 0x. So let's just put plus 0x. And then negative 3 times 4 is minus 12. So I'm subtracting this thing away. So let's change the sign of each term here. So this would be plus, And you can think about this as minus, And then this is plus. So negative 9x squared plus 9x squared is 0. 0x minus 0x, or 0x plus 0x, doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, if 0 is multiplied by something, it's 0. So this is basically 0 plus 0, or 0 minus 0, at 0. Negative 12 plus 12 is 0, so this is 0, and there's no remainder. And now let's just check our result. So we have 9x cubed minus x squared plus 2x minus 3. We're going to multiply this by 3x squared plus 4. So 3x squared times 9x cubed is 27x to the fifth power. 3x squared times negative x squared is minus 3x to the fourth power. 3x squared times 2x is plus 6x cubed. 3x squared times negative 3 is minus 9x squared. Then next I have 4 times 9x cubed, that's plus 36x cubed. 4 times negative x squared, that's minus 4x squared. 4 times 2x, that's plus 8x. 4 times negative 3 is minus 12. So what are my like terms here? I have these two, these two, and then that's it. So 27x to the fifth power minus 3x to the fourth power. And then 6x cubed plus 36x cubed, that's plus 42x cubed. And then negative 9x squared minus 4x squared, that's minus 13x squared. And then plus 8x minus 12. And that's exactly what you started out with right there as your dividend. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we just want to perform each division. We're just going to take a look at one problem. We have x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3. This is divided by x minus 1. So if you'll notice here in your divisor, you have an x cubed, an x squared, 
but you don't have an x to the first power. So when this occurs and you're doing division, you need to use zero as kind of a placeholder. So I would write this as x cubed minus 4x squared plus 0x. Remember, 0 times anything is just 0. And then plus 3. Now, for my divisor, I'm not missing any terms. So I'm just going to go ahead and write x minus 1 out here. And I'm going to start just like I normally would, leading term into leading term. So x cubed over x, x cubed over x, we know that would be x squared, right? So I'm gonna put an x squared right here, and I'm gonna go ahead and multiply. x squared times x is x cubed, x squared times negative one is minus x squared. Remember, we're subtracting this guy away, so this becomes minus and this becomes plus. x cubed minus x cubed is zero, negative four x squared plus x squared is going to give me negative three x squared, Go ahead and bring down this plus 0x. And again, do leading term into leading term. So what is negative 3x squared, negative 3x squared over x? Well, the x squared would cancel with the x. And just leave me an x to the first power up here. So we just have negative 3x. So minus 3x. Let's go ahead and multiply. Negative 3x times x is minus 3x squared. Negative 3x times negative 1 is plus 3x. And then I'm going to subtract here. And remember, all I'm going to do is just change the sign. So this is going to be plus, and this is going to be minus. So negative 3x squared plus 3x squared is 0. 0x minus 3x is negative 3x. Bring down the 3 here, so plus 3. Now I have leading term into leading term. So I would have negative 3x over x. So negative 3x over x. And so this would cancel with this and become a 1. And so I would just have minus 3. So now I'm going to multiply. Negative 3 times x is negative 3x. Negative 3 times negative 1 is plus 3. So I'm subtracting the same thing away from itself. We know that's going to be 0. right? But officially, this would become minus and this would become plus. Negative 3x plus 3x is 0. 3 minus 3 is 0. So that's a 0 there. No remainder. Let's go ahead and check this guy real quick. And to check it, I'm going to take x squared minus 3x minus 3 and multiply it by x minus 1. So x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times negative 1 is minus x squared. Negative 3x times x is minus 3x squared. Negative 3x times negative 1 is plus 3x. Then negative 3 times x is minus 3x. And negative 3 times negative 1 is plus 3. So now what I want to do is combine like terms. So I have x cubed. I have negative x squared minus 3x squared. That's negative 4x squared. I have 3x minus 3x. That's going to cancel and become 0. And then I have plus 3. So x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3. That's exactly what I had for my dividend. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we want to perform each division. And what I'm looking at here, I have 8x cubed plus 61x squared minus 9. This is divided by 8x minus 3. So if you'll notice here, I have x cubed, I have x squared, but I don't have an x to the first power. So all we do when we set up our division, we'll have 8x cubed plus 61x squared plus... I'm going to put a 0 as the coefficient for x to the first power because I'm missing an x to the first power. So put a 0x and then minus 9. Then I have 8x minus 3 over here. And once I've set this up that way, I can just go ahead and divide like I normally would. So leading term into leading term. What is 8x cubed divided by 8x? 8 over 8 is 1. x cubed over x is x squared. So this is x squared. x squared times 8x is 8x cubed. x squared times negative 3 is minus 3x squared. And then we would subtract this guy away. So remember, I've got to change the sign. So this becomes minus and this becomes plus. 8x cubed minus 8x cubed is 0. 61x squared plus 3x squared is 64x squared. Go ahead and bring down this plus 0x. And again, leading term into leading term. So if I have 64x squared over 8x, 64 divided by 8 is 8 x squared over x is x, so this is plus 8x. 
Now we're multiplying. 8x times 8x is 64x squared. 8x times negative 3 is minus 24x. And of course, I'm subtracting this guy away. So this becomes minus and this becomes plus. So 64x squared minus 64x squared is 0. 0x plus 24x is 24x. Bring down that final term there, minus 9. Let me scroll down and get a little bit of room. So again, leading term into leading term. 24x divided by 8x, we know that would be 3, right? 24 divided by 8 is 3. x over x is 1. So this is just plus 3. So 3 times 8x is 24x. And then 3 times negative 3 is minus 9. And of course, if I subtracted this away, I would get 0, right? This would become minus. This would become plus. 24x minus 24x is 0. Negative 9 plus 9 is 0. So there's no remainder. All right, so I just want to check to make sure I got the right answer. So again, I'm going to multiply this quotient by the divisor, that's gonna give me the dividend. So if I have 8x minus three, and I multiply it by x squared plus 8x plus three, 8x times x squared is 8x cubed. 8x times 8x is plus 64x squared. 8x times three is plus 24x. Then I have negative three times x squared, that's minus three x squared. Negative three times eight x, that's minus 24 x. Negative three times positive three is minus nine. So I'm gonna end up with eight x cubed, 64 x squared minus three x squared is plus 61 x squared. 24 x minus 24 x is zero, so we just have minus nine. So eight x cubed plus 61 x squared minus nine. That's exactly what we started out with as our dividend. So we know we have the correct answer. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section three and when dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we just wanna perform each division. So I have 6p cubed minus 43p squared plus 45, and this is divided by 6p minus seven. So I'm gonna set this up. Again, my dividend here is 6p cubed minus 43p squared, but then I'm missing the p to the first power. So I'm gonna put plus zero p. Remember, zero times anything is just zero. So I'm not really changing the value here. I'm just kind of rewriting it with a placeholder in here. So then plus 45. And so that's set up. And then over here, I just have 6p minus 7. Everything else is the same, right? I just do leading term into leading term. So if I do 6p into 6p cubed, I would get p squared, right? 6 over 6 is 1. p cubed over p is p squared. So then multiply, p squared times 6p is 6p cubed. p squared times negative seven is minus seven p squared. And then I'm subtracting this guy away. So what I wanna do here is make this minus and this plus. 6p cubed minus 6p cubed is zero. Negative 43p squared plus seven p squared is negative 36p squared. So this is negative 36p squared. Go ahead and bring down the next term, plus zero p. So now I'm going leading term into leading term. So if I have negative 36p squared over 6p, I know that this is gonna cancel and become negative six. P squared over p will just be p. So I get negative 6p, so minus 6p, and I multiply. Negative 6p times 6p is gonna be negative 36p squared. Negative 6p times negative seven is plus 42p. All right, so let's go ahead and subtract. So this is going to be a plus, and then this is going to be a minus. Negative 36p squared plus 36p squared is zero. Zero p minus 42p is negative 42p. Go ahead and bring down this plus 45 here. And again, I'm gonna go leading term into leading term. So what is negative 42p over 6p? So this is gonna cancel with this and give me a negative seven. P over P is one. So this is gonna be minus seven here. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply. Negative seven times six P is negative 42 P. Negative seven times negative seven is plus 49. So I'm subtracting this guy away. So again, what that means is this is gonna be plus, this is gonna be minus. So if I look at this now, negative 42 P over 42 P is zero. 45 minus 49 is negative four. So let me erase all this. So this equals, and this should have been p squared, minus 6p minus seven. And then the remainder 
that I got was negative 4. So we're going to write that as plus negative 4 over that divisor of 6p minus 7. So again, when you check something with a remainder, it's a little bit more complicated. Again, I can take this whole thing and multiply it by this, or I can multiply this part, kind of the quotient, by this, but then I need to add this part to the result. So let's do it that way, because that's a little easier. So we'll do p squared minus 6p minus 7 times 6p minus 7. When we're done, we'll add a negative 4, and we should get this back. So p squared times 6p is going to give me 6p cubed. p squared times negative 7 is minus 7p squared. Negative 6p times 6p is negative 36p squared. Negative 6p times negative 7 is plus 42p. Negative 7 times 6p is minus 42p. Negative 7 times negative 7 is plus 49. So 6p cubed, I've got negative 7p squared minus 36p squared. That's negative 43 p squared. These are going to cancel, 42p minus 42p, so then plus 49. So let me copy this part right here. All right, so if I had 6p cubed minus 43p squared plus 49, and I added to that that negative 4, that's going to give me 6p cubed minus 43p squared plus 45, again, which is what my dividend was when I started. So I know I have the correct answer of p squared minus 6p minus 7 plus this negative 4 over 6p minus 7. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we want to perform each division. So we have 3x to the fifth power plus 5x to the fourth power minus 2x cubed minus 36x squared minus 60x plus 24. This is divided by x cubed minus 12. So in the dividend, we are good to go. We have x to the fifth power, x to the fourth power, x cubed, x squared, and x. In the divisor, though, we're missing some terms. So let's go ahead and write this real quick. So we have 3x to the fifth power plus 5x to the fourth power minus 2x cubed minus 36x squared minus 60x and then plus 24. All right, so for x cubed minus 12, I'm missing x squared and I'm missing x. So I'm going to put x cubed plus 0x squared plus 0x and then minus 12. So again, I'm using these as placeholders so I can represent the x squared and the x. Those are two missing terms there. All right, so let's go ahead and start in the usual way. We have a leading term of x cubed into a leading term of 3x to the fifth power. So I know that that would be 3, and then x to the fifth power over x cubed is x squared. So we would have 3x squared, then 3x squared times x cubed is 3x to the fifth power. 3x squared times 0x squared is, we can put plus 0x to the fourth power. 3x squared times 0x is plus 0x cubed. 3x squared times negative 12 is minus 36x squared. All right, so let's go through and subtract. So I'm subtracting this whole thing away. So I'm going to change the sign of each term. So this would be negative. This would be negative. This would be negative. This would be positive. All right, so 3x to the fifth power minus 3x to the fifth power is 0. If I do 5x to the fourth power minus 0x to the fourth power, this is 5x to the fourth power. If I do negative 2x cubed minus 0x cubed, that's minus 2x cubed. So negative 36x squared plus 36x squared will give us 0x squared. So I'm going to put plus 0x squared and then bring this guy down to have minus 60x. Okay, so again, leading term into leading term. So 5x to the fourth power over x cubed. I know that's going to be a 5, so plus 5. And then x to the fourth power over x cubed is just x. So 5x times x cubed is 5x to the fourth power. 5x times 0x squared is plus 0x cubed. 5x times 0x is plus 0x squared. 5x times negative 12 is minus 60x. So I'm subtracting this guy away. And what's going to happen is, again, I'm going to change the sign. So this is going to change, that's going to change, that's going to change, and that's going to change. 
So 5x to the fourth power minus 5x to the fourth power is 0. Negative 2x cubed minus 0x cubed is negative 2x cubed. 0x squared minus 0x squared, we can put plus 0x squared. Negative 60x plus 60x is plus 0x. Go ahead and bring down that 24, so plus 24. And then one last time, we're going to do leading term into leading term. So I know that negative 2x cubed over x cubed would just be negative 2, so minus 2. So negative 2 times x cubed is negative 2x cubed. Negative 2 times 0x squared is minus 0x squared. Or you could put plus 0x squared. It really doesn't matter. Then negative 2 times 0x, you could put minus 0x. Or again, plus 0x. doesn't matter. And then negative 2 times negative 12 would be plus 24. So you have the same thing subtracted away from itself. You know that's going to be 0. right? If I go through and change the signs here, and this would be minus. So negative 2x cubed plus 2x cubed is 0. 0x squared plus 0x squared is obviously 0. 0x plus 0x is 0. And then 24 minus 24 is 0. So this is 0. So it's telling me I don't have a remainder here. This is equal to that. And again, if we want to check it, we'll take x cubed minus 12. Multiply that by 3x squared plus 5x minus 2. So x cubed times 3x squared is 3x to the fifth power. x cubed times 5x is plus... 5x to the fourth power. Then x cubed times negative 2 is minus 2x cubed. Then negative 12 times 3x is going to be minus 36x squared. Then negative 12 times 5x is minus 60x. Then negative 12 times negative 2 is plus 24. And if you look at this answer here, it's exactly what I started with as my dividend. 3x to the fifth power plus 5x to the fourth power minus 2x cubed minus 36x squared minus 60x plus 24. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on dividing polynomials with missing terms. All right, so we just want to perform each division. We're going to take a look at negative 10x to the fourth power plus 6x cubed minus 4x squared plus 8x minus 2. And then we're dividing this by x cubed minus 12. So we're not missing any terms in the dividend, but we're missing the x squared and the x to the first power in the divisor. So for my dividend... I'll just go ahead and write negative 10x to the fourth power plus 6x cubed minus 4x squared plus 8x minus 2. For my divisor, I'm going to put x cubed plus 0x squared plus 0x and then minus 12. So I put in a 0 as the coefficient for each missing term. All right, I was missing an x squared, so I have 0x squared. I was missing an x to the first power, so I put plus 0x. Once you set this up, the division is no different. I still do leading term into leading term. So what is x cubed into negative 10x to the fourth power? Well, you'd have negative 10, and then x to the fourth power over x cubed is x. So this would be negative 10x, and then I would multiply. Negative 10x times x cubed is negative 10x to the fourth power. Negative 10x times 0x squared is going to be minus... 0x cubed. Negative 10x times 0x, you could put minus 0x squared. And then negative 10x times negative 12 would be plus 120x. So I'm going to subtract this whole thing away. So I'm going to be changing the sign of each. So this will be plus, 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 and then this will become a minus. All right, so now negative 10x to the fourth power plus 10x to the fourth power is 0. 6x cubed plus 0x cubed is 6x cubed. Negative 4x squared plus 0x squared is minus 4x squared. 8x minus 120x is going to be negative 112x. And then go ahead and bring down this negative 2 here. So again, leading term into leading term. So we know that 6x cubed over x cubed would just be 6. So we put plus 6 here. And then we multiply. 6 times x cubed is 6x cubed. 6 times 0x squared, we'll put plus 0x squared. 6 times 0x, we'll put plus 0x. And then 6 times negative 12, we'll put negative 72. All right, so this will become minus, 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 and then plus. 6x cubed minus 6x cubed is 0. Negative 4x squared minus 0x squared is negative 4x squared. Negative 112x minus 0x is minus 112x. 
and then negative 2 plus 72 is going to give me plus 70. So this is your remainder, negative 4x squared minus 112x plus 70. So let's erase all this, and let's put that this is equal to negative 10x plus 6, negative 10x plus 6, and then plus my remainder. So plus, you have a remainder of negative 4x squared minus 112x plus 70 over x cubed minus 12. So again, checking things with a remainder is a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to multiply this guy right here by this guy right here. And then when I'm done, I'm going to add this part right here, and I should get the dividend back. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to do x cubed minus 12 times negative 10x plus 6. So let's go ahead and use FOIL because we have two binomials. x cubed times negative 10x is negative 10x to the fourth power x cubed times 6 is plus 6x cubed. Negative 12 times negative 10x is plus 120x. Then negative 12 times 6 is minus 72. So let's take this result here. We have negative 10x to the fourth power plus 6x cubed plus 120x minus 72. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to it the remainder. So this top part up here, this minus 4x squared minus 112x plus 70. So let me scroll this up a little bit. So what's that going to give me? Well, negative 10x to the fourth power, that's going to stay as it is. 6x cubed, that's going to stay as it is. I have negative 4x squared, that's going to stay as it is. I have 120x and I have a negative 112x. So if I add those together, I would get 8x. So plus 8x. Then I have negative 72 plus 70, that's minus 2. So I have my dividend back. Negative 10x to the fourth power plus 6x cubed minus 4x squared plus 8x minus 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 36. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on finding the GCF. Again, this is known as the greatest common factor. All right, so we just want to find the GCF for each group of terms. We're going to start out with 18x, 27x cubed, and 21x cubed y. So for out of the first one, I'm going to do the number part the slow way. So I'm going to use a factor tree for each kind of number here. So 18, we could do as 6 times 3. 3 is prime, I'll circle that. For 6, that's 2 times 3. Both 2 and 3 are prime, so I'm going to circle those. And then for 27... I know that's 3 cubed, right? I could start out with just 9 times 3, and 3 is prime, I'll circle that. And then for 9, 3 times 3. 3 is prime, so I'll circle both of those. And then lastly, I have 21. So 21, 7 times 3, right? Both of those are prime. So when I think about the GCF for these three numbers, obviously it's going to be a 3, right? If I look at this, that's the only number that's common to all the prime factorizations, right? I have a two here, no two here, here. I have a seven here, no seven here, here. I have a three in everything, but again, I only have one three here. So that's gonna be my GCF. That's the largest number that each number of the group is going to be divisible by. So for the number part, for the number part, I'm going to say the GCF is going to be 3. And then for the variable part, what are we going to put? Well, we look at the variables, and it's a little bit easier to figure out what that part's going to be. The first thing I'm going to ask myself is, does that a variable occur in each term of the group that we're looking at? I have an X here, here, and here. So I know I'm going to have an X here. Now the question is, what's the exponent going to be on that variable? You want to use the smallest exponent that occurs in any member of that group. Here I have x to the first power, so that's a 1. Here I have x cubed, so that's a 3. Here I have x cubed again, so that's a 3. So the smallest exponent is a 1. And the reason you go with the smallest exponent because that's the smallest number of factors of that variable that you're going to have, and so that's what's going to be common to everything in that group. So this would be 3x... And then I have another variable here, y, but it's not common to everything, so it doesn't go into the GCF. So the greatest common factor here 
or 18x, 27x cubed, and 21x cubed y would just be 3x. All right, for the next one, I have the greatest common factor of 2xy, 4x, and then 8. So looking at the number parts, that's pretty easy to tell that it's going to be a 2. Everything's divisible by 2, and I have only a 2 here, right? 2 is a prime number, so I can't really factor that. So I have 2, I have 2 times 2, and I have 2 times 2 times 2. So the number part would just be 2. And then for the variable part, you're not going to get one, right? Because you have x here and here, but no x here. You have a y here, but not here or here. So the greatest common factor would just be 2. For the next one, I'm looking at the GCF of 10y squared z to the 12th, 25yz squared x, 5y squared z squared x, 30y squared z squared x squared. Okay, so for the number part, it's pretty simple. I have a 10, a 25, a 5, and a 30. So kind of the smallest number here is a 5. 5 is a prime number. If everything is divisible by 5, that's your GCF. 30 is divisible by 5, it's 5 times 6. 25 is divisible by 5, it's 5 times 5. 10 is divisible by 5, it's 5 times 2. So the GCF here, at least the number part, is a 5. That's very, very simple. When we look at the variable part, you think about what variables are common to everything. Well, I see a Y here, 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 and here. So I know I'd have a Y in here. Now, what's the smallest exponent on any y in that group? Here it's y squared, y to the first, y squared again, y squared. So the smallest exponent is a 1, so it's just a y. Then I have z to the 12th, z squared, z squared, and z squared. So z appears everywhere, and the smallest exponent is a 2, so I'll put in a z squared. And then I also have an x that occurs here, here, and here, but there's no x in this first term. So x is not going to go in the GCF because it's not common to everything. And so my greatest common factor is 5yz squared. For the next one, I want to find the GCF of 40m to the fifth power n squared, 60m cubed n squared, 30m squared n. So what am I looking at here? The number part, the number part is pretty easy. Everything is divisible by 10, right? So this is 4 times 10. This is 6 times 10. This is 3 times 10. Now, if I was to further break everything down, I could see I have 3 here. This could be written as 3 times 2, but then 4 is 2 times 2. So you have a problem. If I look at 2, it's not common to everything. And so the greatest common factor is just going to be 10, right? Because I don't have anything else besides that 10 here that is common to everything. Okay, so let's just get rid of that. So the GCF, the number part, would be a 10. And then for the variable part, I have m to the fifth power, m cubed, and m squared. So m squared, right? The smallest exponent would be a 2. Then I have n squared, n squared, and n. Smallest exponent is a 1, so it's just going to be an n. So the greatest common factor here is 10m squared n. For the next one, we want the GCF of 18q to the sixth power r. 20q cubed, r to the 6th power, 16q to the 5th power, r squared, p squared, and 10q cubed, r cubed, p squared. So for the number part, for the number part, let's see. 18 is divisible by 2. I'm going to do 2 times 9. 20 is divisible by 2. That's 2 times 10. 16 is divisible by 2. That's 2 times 8. 10 is divisible by 2, it's 2 times 5. Now, starting with this one, is anything else divisible by 5? This is not. And so at that point, you can kind of say the greatest common factor, the number part, is just going to be a 2. Because that's the only thing that's going to be common to everything. All right, so once we've got that out of the way, let's look at the variable parts. So we have q to the 6th power, q cubed, q to the 5th, q cubed. So q cubed is going to go in there. The smallest exponent on q is a 3. Then I have r, r to the sixth, r squared, and r cubed. So the smallest exponent is a 1, so I'm just going to put an r there. And then I have this variable p. I have p squared here and also here, but it's not common to everything, so it doesn't go in the GCF. So we end up with 2q cubed r. Okay, for the next one, we want the GCF of 33, j to the seventh, k cubed h, 
21 j k to the fifth h squared, 9 j cubed k cubed h, 12 j k to the fourth power. So I want the GCF here. All right, so if I look at the number parts, I have 33, 21, 9, and 12. So right away, I can tell that's going to be 3, right? I'm going to put a 3 here. And let me explain. I can easily see that everything's divisible by 3. 33 is 3 times 11. 21 is 3 times 7. 9 is 3 times 3. 12 is 3 times 4. Now, just start out with something like 3 times 7. So 7 here. Is anything else divisible by 7? No. So you can just move on and say, okay, I know everything has a 3 in common, and that's it. Right, so the number part is just a three. It's just that simple. All right, so moving on to the variables now, I see that I have j to the seventh, j, j cubed, and j. So the smallest exponent is going to be a one, and so I'm just going to put a j in. Then for k, I have k cubed, k to the fifth, k cubed, k to the fourth. Smallest exponent is going to be a three, so this will be k cubed. And then I have h h squared h but no h here so h is not going to go in the gcf and so my greatest common factor here is 3j k cubed all right let's take a look at the last one we have the gcf of 45 x to the fifth power y z squared 15 x to the fourth power y z squared 30 x cubed y z to the fourth 60 x cubed y z to the fifth all right, so for the number part, again, it's kind of easy to eyeball that. You can tell right away that everything is divisible by 15. Right? That's the smallest number of the group, and everything's divisible by it, so that's going to be the GCF. Right? This is 15. This is 15 times 2. This is 15 times 4. And this is 15 times 3. Right? So the GCF there is just going to be 15. Okay, so when we think about the variable parts... I have x to the fifth power, x to the fourth power, x cubed, and x cubed. So the smallest exponent is a 3, so we'll put x cubed in. Then I have y, 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 and y. So it's just going to be a y. Smallest exponent is a 1. And then z squared, z squared, z to the fourth, and z to the fifth. So it's going to be z squared. Right? The smallest exponent is a 2. So my greatest common factor is 15 x cubed y z squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on finding the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to find the GCF for each group of terms. We're going to start out today by looking at the GCF for 28x squared y cubed, 21x squared y, and then 70x squared. So let's look at the number part first. So if I kind of look at these three numbers, 28, 21, and 70, Right away, I can tell that they're each going to be divisible by 7. So let's say 28, we'll write that as 7 times 4, 21, 7 times 3, and 77 times 10. Would there be any other common factors other than 7? Well, no, there's not. And one quick way to do that, if I look at 7 times 3. So think about, would any of these other numbers have 3 as a factor? This one wouldn't. 4 is 2 times 2. This one wouldn't. 10 is 5 times 2. So once you eliminate this one, you can eliminate everything else and say that 7 is the only factor that's common to everything. And so 7 is going to be the number part of the GCF. Okay, so the next thing you're looking at is the variable parts. So I have an x squared, an x squared, and an x squared. So x squared will go in, right? That's common to everything. Then I have y cubed, I have y, but I don't have a y here. Because it's not common to everything, you can't put a y in your GCF. And so the greatest common factor here is just 7x squared. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at the GCF of 90a cubed b cubed, 10a to the fourth power b squared, and then 20a squared b squared. So again, the first thing I want to do is look at the number part. So I can tell right away that it's going to be 10. And how can I tell that? Well, this is a 10 right here. And then everything else is divisible by 10. This is going to be 10 times 2. And then this is going to be 10 times 9. So that one's pretty simple, right? So the number part is just 10. All right, so after we find that, let's think about the variable part. So I have a cubed, a to the fourth, a squared. So a is common to everything. And then you always want to use the exponent that's the smallest. 
So a squared, the two is the smallest exponent. So that's what's going in because that's what's common to everything. Then I do the same thing for B. I have B cubed, B squared, B squared, smallest exponents of two. So I'm gonna have B squared. So my greatest common factor here is 10 A squared, B squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section two on finding the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. So we wanna find the GCF for each group of terms. And we're gonna start by taking a look at the GCF of 12 Y Z cubed. 48y squared x squared z, 28y cubed, 48y to the fourth x. All right, so I'm just going to begin by looking at the number part for the GCF. And I see that I have 12 here, 48, 28, and 48. So if I just kind of eyeball that, I know everything is divisible by 2. This would be 2 times 6. This would be 2 times 24. This would be 2 times 14, and this would be 2 times 24 again. So everything would also be divisible by 4. So I could rewrite this. This is 4 times 3. This is 4 times 12. And of course, so is this one. They're the same number. And then this is 4 times 7. But nothing else would be common, right? This 3 is common here, but not here. And then, so once we've eliminated that one, we could say that four is the number part for the GCF. Now, the next thing we're looking at is the variable part. So we have a Y here, Y squared, Y cubed, Y to the fourth. So the smallest exponent on Y is one. So we just put a Y to the first power, just Y. Then I have Z cubed, Z, no Z, no Z. Not common to everything, so it doesn't go in. I have an x squared here and I have an x here, but I don't have an x here or here, not common to everything, so it doesn't go in. And so my greatest common factor here is gonna be 4y. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section three on finding the GCF, again, otherwise known as the greatest common factor. All right, so we just wanna find the GCF for each group of terms. We're gonna start out by taking a look at the GCF of 36 x y to the eighth, z to the sixth, 24xy, z to the 11th, 42xy to the 4th, z to the 7th, 30xy, z to the 6th. All right, so let's take a look at the number part of the GCF first. So if I think about this, what stands out right away is the number 6. Each is divisible by 6. This is 6 times 6. This is 6 times 4. This is 6 times 7. This is 6 times 5. So looking at that, I know the number part is 6. How do I know that? Well, if I take something like, let's say six times seven. Well, thinking about the seven, because I've already accounted for the six there, six is common to everything. If I just erase the six from each one, what's common to everything now? Well, nothing, right? So five is not common to everything. It's not common to anything else. Seven's not common to anything else. Four, really you can think about as what? Two times two. Well, two is common to this, but it's not common to anything else. So you can stop once you have figured out that nothing else is going to be common. I right? just put your answer down. All right, so we figured out that six is the number part. What about the variable part? Okay, so we have variables of x, y, and z. So I have x to the first power, x to the first power, x to the first power, x to the first power. So x to the first power is common to everything. I have y to the eighth, y, y to the fourth, and y. So when I have a variable like y and the exponents are different in each case, I want the smallest exponent possible. So this is the exponent one, this is the exponent one, and so I'm gonna use y to the first power or just y, right? That's what's gonna be common to everything. Then I have z to the sixth, z to the 11th, z to the seventh, z to the sixth. So the smallest exponent on z is the six, and so I'd have z to the sixth power. So my GCF, my greatest common factor here is 6xy, z to the sixth power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on finding the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we're gonna find the GCF for each group of terms. So let's take a look at the GCF of 60x to the fourth power, y to the ninth, z cubed, 120x to the ninth power, y cubed, z squared, 
50x to the fourth power y cubed z cubed, and then 150x to the fifth power y cubed z squared. So my GCF, what's the number part going to be? Well, all of these numbers are divisible by 10. So this is 6 times 10, 12 times 10, 5 times 10, 15 times 10, right? Because every one of them ends in a 0, so it's easy to spot. Now, if I eliminated 10, let's get rid of the 10. What's left that's common? Nothing, right? It's There's nothing. So 5 is common to the 15 over here, right? 15 is 5 times 3, but it's not common to anything else. So once I've done that, if this is eliminated, none of this other stuff's going to be common to everything else. And so I can just erase all these and say my GCF is 10 for the number part. Now, if I think about the variable part, all I want to do is make sure that the variable is involved in each term. And then I want to use the smallest exponent that occurs on any of those terms. So if I have x to the fourth here, x to the ninth, x to the fourth, and x to the fifth, the smallest exponent is 4. So I put x to the fourth. Then I have y to the ninth, y cubed, y cubed, and y cubed. The smallest exponent is a 3, so I put y cubed. Then I have z cubed, z squared, z cubed, and z squared. Smallest exponent is a 2, so I'll put z squared. So I end up with 10x to the fourth power, y cubed, z squared, as my greatest common factor. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on finding the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to find the GCF for each group of terms. So I'm looking for the greatest common factor for 18j cubed k to the fifth, 72jk cubed h to the fourth, 24j squared k cubed, and 66jk squared h. So what is the GCF here? Let's just start out with the number part. So I see 18, 72, 24, and 66. What jumps out at me right away is the number 6, right? This is 6 times 3. This is 6 times 12. This is 6 times 4. And this is 6 times 11. So the GCF will be 6, right, as far as the number part. Again, you can look at one of these, let's say 11, right, if I took the 6 away. Is 11 common to anything else? No, it's not. So if I get rid of this, I know that the only thing that was common to everything was 6. And so I've found the number part. I'm done. Now I move on to the variable part. So for the variable part, I've got a j, a j, a j, and a j. So I'm looking for the smallest exponent, j cubed, j to the first power, j squared, and j to the first power. So that would be a 1. So I just put a j. The next one I see is k. So I got k to the fifth power, k cubed, k cubed, k squared. Smallest exponent is a 2. And so I'm going to put k to the second power, or k squared. And then the next variable that's involved is an h. But I don't have an h here. I have h to the fourth, no h, and an h. It's not common to everything, so it's not going in the GCF. So my greatest common factor here is going to be 6jk squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 37. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on factoring out the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to factor out the GCF for each. So we're going to start out with 10x squared plus 6x. So the first thing you want to do is identify the greatest common factor. So what is the GCF here? Well, if I look at the number parts, I have 10 and I have 6. So each one's divisible by 2, right? This one is 2 times 3. This one is 2 times 5. So the greatest common factor is going to be a 2. Now for the variable part, I have x squared and I have x. So the smallest exponent on the variable x is a 1. So it'll just be x there. And so the greatest common factor is a 2x. All right. So once we have that, what we're going to do is we're going to pull a 2x out from each term, and we're going to place it outside of the parentheses. So I kind of showed you two ways to do this in the lesson. The first thing you could do is we could write 10x squared as 5 times 2 times x times x, then plus we could write 6 as 2 times 3 times x. And I think about this as I'm circling the GCF, 
and here it would be kind of not next to each other, but I'm pulling this out and setting it in front of a set of parentheses here. So this 2x would be out in front, and what's inside of the parentheses is what's left. So I have a 5 times an x, or 5x, and then plus what's left here is just a 3. And you can check this using your distributive property. 2x times 5x is 10x squared, 2x times 3 is 6x, so you get 10x squared plus 6x. Kind of the more traditional way to do this, you can put this as equal to, put your GCF out in front, and then use division to find out what you would have inside. Remember, division is the opposite of multiplication. So if I divide 10x squared by 2x, I would get what? 10 divided by 2 is 5, x squared over x is x. So I'd have 5x there. So the division allows me to get 5x. If I reverse that and do multiplication, I would get 10x squared back, right? 2x times 5x is 10x squared. And then I would do that with the other term involved too. So plus, I would do 6x over 2x. 6 over 2 is 3, x over x is 1, so plus 3. So 2x times the quantity 5x plus 3 is our answer here. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have 8n to the 6th power plus 2n to the 4th power. So again, what's the GCF? Well, I know that if I look at the number parts, it's going to be 2. Right? I have 2, and then I have 8, which is 2 times 2 times 2. So the number part is 2. For the variable part, I have an n in each case. Here's to the 6th power. Here's to the 4th power. You use the smallest exponent on n. So this would be n to the 4th power. So my GCF is 2n to the 4th power. So now, I pull this out front. And I'm going to have two terms inside of my parentheses. And all I do to get these two terms is I take each term and I divide it by the GCF. So 8n to the 6th power divided by 2n to the 4th power. 8 would cancel with 2 and give me 4. n to the 6th power over n to the 4th power is n squared. So this would be 4n squared. And then plus, the next thing we'd have is 2n to the 4th power over 2n to the 4th power. So this is where students make a mistake. They don't end up putting anything there. They go, oh, that canceled out. Remember, anything other than 0 over itself is 1. So this cancels with this and gives me a 1. So I've got to write a 1 here. And think about why that makes sense. If I go back and I multiply, 2n to the 4th power times 4n squared does give me 2 times 4 is 8, n to the 4th power times n squared is n to the 6th power. So that's going to work out. If I multiply 2n to the 4th power times nothing, I couldn't get this back. I have to have a 1 here, 2n to the 4th power times 1 gives me 2n to the fourth power. So pay close attention to something like that when you're doing your homework or you're on a test. So our answer here is 2n to the fourth power times the quantity 4n squared plus 1. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 20r cubed plus 15r squared. So the GCF here, for this one we have what? We have 5 times 4. For this one we could do 5 times 3. Right, obviously the number part, the GCF is going to be a 5. And then for the variable part, it's going to be R squared. So 5R squared is the GCF. Again, pull that guy out in front. And inside the parentheses here, I'm going to have two terms. So if I took 20R cubed, 20R cubed, and I divided it by 5R squared, this would cancel with this and give me a 4. This would cancel with this and give me r to the first power. So this would be 4r to the first power, or just 4r. And then for the next term, I have 15r squared over 5r squared. So we know that 15 over 5 is 3, r squared over r squared is 1, so this is just plus 3 here. So we get 5r squared times the quantity 4r plus 3. Okay, for the next one we're looking at 28m squared n plus 63mn minus 49n. So for the number part, the GCF is going to be 7, right? 28 is 7 times 4, 63 is 7 times 9, 49 is 7 times 7. So for the number part, it is 7. Now for the variable part, everything does not have an m, so that's not going to go in. Everything does have an n n, n, and n. And in every case, it's n to the first power, so that just goes in. 
So the GCF here is 7n. So let's put equals. We'll put 7n out in front. So we're going to have three terms here. We're going to have a term here, a plus, a term here, and then a minus, and then a term here. So let's figure out what's going to go on these blanks. So we're going to take each term and divide it by the GCF. So 28 m squared n divided by 7n. We can cancel the 28 with the 7 and get a 4. m squared is not going to cancel with anything. There's no m in the denominator. But the n will cancel with the n here. So what I'm going to have is a 4m squared. All right, for the next one, we have 63, 63. M n. Again, this is divided by the GCF of 7 n. 63 over 7 is 9, and then n over n is 1, so you'd have 9 m. So 9 m. And then minus, the next thing we have is 49 n. 49 n over 7 n. And we can see 49 over 7 is 7, n over n is 1. So this would be minus 7. So my answer here is 7 n times the quantity. 4m squared plus 9m minus 7. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 42xy cubed plus 28x squared y cubed plus 21x cubed y to the fourth power. So what's the GCF here? What is the GCF? Well, again, if I look at this, for 42, it's, let's do 6 times 7. 28 is 7 times 4. 21 is 7 times 3. You're going to get really good at looking at numbers and saying, well, it's probably going to be this, right? So I noticed right away that 7 was common to everything, and nothing else is going to be common, right? So we know that the number part is a 7, and so let's erase that. And then the variable part, everything has an x. The smallest exponent is a 1, so it's just x. Then everything has a y. The smallest exponent is a 3, so y cubed. This is equal to, so we'll put 7xy cubed times, you'll have three spaces, right, for the three terms. So plus, plus, kind of in that. So now we're going to take each term and just divide it by the GCF. So 42xy cubed divided by 7xy cubed. So 42 over 7 is 6, x over x is 1, y cubed over y cubed is 1. So we'll just have 6 there, right? So this will just be the number 6. Then for the next term, I have 28 x squared y cubed divided by the GCF, 7xy cubed. And 28 divided by 7 is 4. x squared over x is x to the first power. y cubed over y cubed is 1. So this would be 4x. And then one last time. We have 21 x cubed y to the fourth over 7 x y cubed. So we're going to cancel the 21 with the 7 and get a 3. x cubed over x is x squared. y to the fourth power over y cubed is y to the first power. So this would end up being 3x squared y. So my answer here is 7x y cubed times the quantity 6 plus 4x plus 3x squared y. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have negative 56m to the fifth power p squared q squared minus 16m cubed pq cubed plus 48m cubed pq squared plus 64m squared pq squared. So what's the GCF here? So I'm looking at, and I'm going to exclude the negatives here. I'm just going to think about the number parts in terms of absolute value. 56, 16, 48, and 64. Well, I know that everything there is divisible by 4, right? So I found that from 16, I think about 4 times 4. 4 times 4. 48 is 4 times 12. 64 is 4 times 16. And then 56 is 14 times 4. Now, everything there, if you look at it, is also divisible by 8, right? This would be 8 times 7. This would be 8 times 2. This would be 8 times 6. And then this one would be 8 times 8. Now, if it was just this 3 involved, you could do another 2, right? You could go to 16. 
but you have this over here. It's 8 times 7. So another factor of 2 is not common to everything because of this guy. So the GCF, at least the number part, will be 8. And then when we think about the variable part, let's erase all this. You have M, 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 and M. The smallest exponent is a 2, so M squared. You have P, 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 and P. Smallest exponent is a 1. You have Q, 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 and Q. Smallest exponent is a 2, so Q squared. All right, so we found our GCF. So now let's pull this guy out. So we're going to put equals 8 M squared P, Q squared. And we're going to have four terms. So minus, and then a term, plus, a term, plus, a term, and then close parentheses. Okay. So the way we're going to find each space here is we're going to take this term and we're going to divide it by the GCF. So negative 56m to the fifth power p squared q squared divided by 8m squared p q squared. Okay, so let's divide this out. Negative 56 over 8 is negative 7. m to the fifth power over m squared is m cubed. p squared over p is p to the first power. Q squared over Q squared is 1. So what we're going to end up with is negative 7 M cubed P. So negative 7 M cubed P. Now the next thing we're going to look at, let's erase this. We have negative 16 M cubed P Q cubed. All right, so negative 16 over 8 is negative 2 m cubed over m squared, this would be m to the first power, p over p would cancel, q cubed over q squared would be q to the first power. So this would be negative, and I've already accounted for the sign there, right? So I don't need to account for the sign again. It's not minus a negative, I've already accounted for that. So it's negative 2 m to the first power, q to the first power. So negative 2 m q. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at 48m cubed pq squared over 8m squared pq squared. So what's going to cancel? This will cancel with this and give me a 6. This will cancel with this and give me m to the first power. These cancel and these cancel. So I'll have 6m. So plus 6m. So then next, 64m squared pq squared over, you have 8 m squared p q squared. All right, so 64 over 8 is 8. m squared over m squared is 1. p over p is 1. q squared over q squared is 1. So just plus 8 here. All right, so we're done. So we've written this as 8 m squared p q squared times the quantity negative 7 m cubed p minus 2 m q plus 6 m plus 8. Now one thing I want to draw your attention to, sometimes... Again, I talked about this in the lesson. You might not want to factor the actual GCF. You might want the negative of it. And if you do that, you're just changing the signs. So if I did the negative of this, I get negative 8m squared pq squared. All the signs in here would just change. This would be plus, plus. This would be minus and minus. So sometimes your teacher is going to ask you for the negative of the GCF, or sometimes that's what you're going to need to factor out to accomplish the problem you're working on. So let's change this back to what it is. This is plus, minus, this should be minus, plus, and plus. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, on factoring out the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to factor out the GCF for each. And I'm going to start out with negative 2x minus 2. So the first thing I need to do is actually find the GCF. So what would the GCF be here? So I look at these two terms, I see that I have an x in one case, not an x in the other. So it's just going to be a number. So I have negative 2, and really I can think about this as negative 2 as well. But think about the greatest common factor. Think about negative 2 as negative 1 times 2. And again, I have negative 1 times 2. So looking at these factors here, 2 is actually the greatest common factor. Negative 2 is a common factor, but it's just not the largest one. So the greatest common factor is 2. Now, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to factor this guy out. 
So I'll put a two outside of the parentheses, and then I'm gonna divide each term by that GCF and place it inside the parentheses. So I'd have negative two X divided by two. That's gonna give me negative X. And then minus, I'll have two over two, which we know is one. Now, in some cases, you're gonna factor the negative of the GCF. You might wanna kinda of clean this up inside and you might wanna say, you know, negative two X minus two is equal to negative two times, and then the signs in here would just change. This would be X plus one. This is not truly factoring out the GCF, but again, sometimes, Moving forward in algebra, you're going to want to do this because you're going to need to to solve a problem. All right, for the next one, I have negative 20n to the fifth power plus 15n cubed. So if I look here, again, I want the GCF to start. For the number parts, it's pretty easy. If I think about this as just 20, not negative 20, I think about 5 times 4, right? It's divisible by 5. I notice 15 is also divisible by 5, so I do 5 times 3. Now, it's easy to see the GCF, at least the number part, is a 5, right? A common factor of 3 is not shared by each, so it's just going to be that 5 there. For the variable part, I have n to the 5th and n cubed, so the smallest exponent is a 3, so it's going to be n cubed. All right, so now I have my GCF. I'm just going to pull it out. So outside the parentheses and then inside the parentheses, I'll have two terms. And to get those two terms, I just divide each term by the GCF. So I'd have negative 20n to the fifth power over 5n cubed. And negative 20 over 5 is negative 4. n to the fifth over n cubed is n squared. So in this first slot, I'd have negative 4n squared. In kind of the second spot, again, I just take this 15n cubed. And I divide it by 5n cubed. And so 15 over 5 is 3, n cubed over n cubed is 1. So this right here is plus 3. So I'll get 5n cubed times the quantity negative 4n squared plus 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on factoring out the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to factor out the GCF for each. And we're going to start with 12n squared minus 9. So kind of the first thing we do is find the actual GCF. So what is that? So looking at the two terms, this one has an n squared. There's no n here, so there's not going to be a variable involved. So just look at the number parts. I have 12 and I have 9. Each is divisible by 3, right? This is 3 times 4. This is 3 times 3. So the GCF would be just 3. So now all I want to do is just pull out a 3 from each term and place it outside of a set of parentheses. So all I have to do to get what's inside the parentheses now is divide the term by 3, right, the GCF. So 12n squared over 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4, so I would get 4n squared. And then for the next one, I have 9 over 3, and we know that's 3. Right? When I reverse this, if I was to use the distributive property, I would get this back, right? 3 times 4n squared is 12n squared and then minus three times three, that's nine. So my answer here is three times the quantity, four n squared minus three. All right, the next one is 64 x cubed y squared plus eight x squared y squared plus 16 y squared. All right, so what's the GCF here? What is the greatest common factor? All right, so if I look at the number parts, I have 64, eight, and 16. Well, everything is divisible by 8, and 8's the smallest number, so it's going to be 8, right? This is 8 times 8, this is 8, this is 8 times 2. So 8 is the number part. Now, for the variable part, not everything has an x, so that's not going to be involved. Everything does have a y squared, so that's going to go in. So my GCF is going to be 8y squared. So this will be equal to, we put 8y squared out in front. Inside the parentheses, we're going to have three terms. So to fill in those blanks, I just take each term and divide it by the GCF. So 64x cubed y squared divided by 8y squared. This is going to cancel with this and give me 8. x cubed is not going to cancel with anything. There's no x in the denominator. y squared over y squared is 1. So this would be 8x cubed. Then for the second spot, 
I have 8x squared y squared over, again, 8y squared. So this 8 over 8 is 1. y squared over y squared is 1. So I'll just have x squared there. So plus x squared. And then for the last part, I have 16y squared over 8y squared. So then 16 over 8 is 2. y squared over y squared is 1. So this right here is going to be plus 2. All right, so our answer here is 8y squared times the quantity 8x cubed plus x squared plus 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on factoring out the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so factor out the GCF for each. I have negative 63x to the fifth power y minus 21x cubed y squared plus 28x squared. So just looking at the number parts here for the GCF, and don't think about this as negative 63, just think about all the numbers as if they were positive. So what I noticed right away is all the number parts are divisible by seven, right? This is seven times nine, this is seven times three, this is seven times four. So knowing that, I can see that the GCF, the number part would be a seven. So the other thing we wanna think about is the variable part. We have x to the fifth power, x cubed and x squared. Smallest exponent on x is a two, so it would be x squared. And then I don't have a y that's common to everything, so I just don't put that in. So my GCF is seven x squared. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull that out in front of a set of parentheses. And I have three terms involved, so I put three spaces. And the way I get the terms inside the parentheses, I just take each term here and I divide it by the GCF. So I would just take negative 63 x to the fifth power y and divide it by seven x squared. And so we divide negative 63 by seven, you get negative nine. Then x to the fifth power of x squared, this cancels with this, you get x cubed. And so I would have negative nine x cubed y and then minus, the next one I'd have is 21, 21 x cubed y squared over seven x squared. So then 21 over seven is three, x cubed over x squared, this is gonna cancel this to be x to the first power. So we'll have three x y squared. And then for the last one here, we have 28 x squared over seven x squared. So 28 over seven is four, x squared over x squared is one, so you just get plus four. All right, so my answer here is what? It's seven x squared times the quantity, negative nine x cubed y minus three x y squared plus four. All right, for the next one, I have 27 x to the fifth power y to the fourth minus three x y plus nine x. So what is the GCF? Well, here it's kind of easy for the number part because if you think about this as three, I know it's a negative out in front, but just think about this as three. You have nine, you have 27. Everything there is divisible by three. Three is the smallest number, so that's the GCF. For the variables, we have X and we have Y, but Y is not common to everything, only X is. You have X, X, and then X to the fifth. So I'm just gonna put X to the first power, or again, just X there. So the GCF is three X. So let's put this outside. Let me kind of drag this down a little bit, get a little bit more room. And I'll have space, minus, space, plus, space, and then close parentheses. So again, the way we get the terms inside, we take this and divide it by this. So 27x to the fifth power, y to the fourth, over 3x. 27 over 3 is 9. x to the fifth power of x is x to the fourth power, and then y to the fourth power. So this would be... 9x to the fourth power, y to the fourth power, and then minus, the next thing we have is 3xy over 3x. So the three x's are gonna cancel out. And we're gonna just have y, so minus y. And then the next one I have is 9x, so I have 9x over 3x. And so what are we gonna have? Nine over three is three, x over x is one, so plus three. All right, so our answer here is 3x times the quantity, 9x to the fourth power, y to the fourth power, 
minus y plus 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on factoring out the GCF. Again, this is the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to factor out the GCF for each. So we're looking at 72 h cubed j squared k squared plus 6 h cubed j k squared minus 54 h squared j k squared plus 48 h squared j k. So first, what is the GCF here? Well, if I look at the smallest number involved, I see it's a 6. Everything's divisible by 6, so that's the number part for the GCF. So for the variable part, everything does have an h. The smallest exponent's a 2, so that's h squared. Everything does have a j. The smallest exponent is a 1, so that's j. And then everything does have a k. The smallest exponent's a 1, so that's just k. So then this is equal to, I'm going to put 6 h squared j k. All right, so the outside of parentheses, and then I have four terms. One, two, three, four. So again, the way I get the terms inside the parentheses, I take each term and I divide it by the GCF to see what should be in each position. All right, so I'd have 72 h cubed j squared k squared over 6 h squared j k. 72 divided by 6 is 12. And then h cubed over h squared is h. j squared over j is j. k squared over k is k. So this is going to be 12 h j k. Then plus. For the next one, we're going to have 6 h cubed j k squared over 6 h squared j k. So the 6s would cancel. h cubed over h squared, this would cancel and I have h to the first power. j's would cancel. k squared over k, this would cancel. I'd have one left here with that. So what I'd have is I'd have h times k. So h k. All right, then next I'm looking at, I've already accounted for the negative, so I'm just going to write 54 h squared j k squared over 6 h squared j k. So I know that 54 over 6 is 9, h squared over h squared is 1, j over j is 1, k squared over k, this would cancel, this would be k. So I would have 9k. Then lastly, I would have 48 h squared j k over 6 h squared j k. So 48 over 6 is 8. h squared over h squared is 1. j over j is 1. k over k is 1. So this is just plus 8. So I have my answer here. We have 6 h squared j k times the quantity 12 h j k plus h k minus 9 k plus 8. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on factoring out the GCF. Again, that's the greatest common factor. All right, so we want to factor out the GCF for each. We have negative 121x to the fifth power zy plus 33xz cubed y plus 77x squared z squared plus 22xz. So what is the GCF here? What is the greatest common factor? For the numbers, I immediately notice that everything's divisible by 11, right? Forget about this negative here. If I had positive 121, that would be 11 times 11. For 33, it's 11 times 3. For 77, it's 11 times 7. For 22, it's 2 times 11. So everything is divisible by 11. Nothing else I can really do. So the GCF, at least the number part, is 11. All right, so let me erase this. And let's think about the variable part. So I've got an x in each case, and the smallest exponent's a 1. So that goes in like that. Let me scroll down a little bit, get a little room going. Then I have a z in each case, smallest exponent's a 1. I don't have a y in each case. I don't have a y here, and I don't have a y here. So that's not going to go in. So the GCF is 11xz. Now, let's set this up. We're going to put 11xz out front. Put our parentheses, and then we're going to have 1, 2, 
three, four spaces inside. And to get these kind of blanks filled in, we just take each term and divide it by the GCF. It's just that simple. So I would start with negative 121, x to the fifth power, z, y, over 11xz. So we know that negative 121 over 11 is negative 11. x to the fifth power over x is x to the fourth power. z over z is 1. So this would be negative 11, negative 11, x to the fourth power, y. For the next term, we're looking at 33. 33 x z cubed y over 11 x z. 33 over 11, 33 over 11 is 3. x over x is 1. z cubed over z is z squared. So this is going to be 3 z squared y. All right, for the next one, I have 77 x squared z squared over 11 x z. Okay, so 77 over 11 is 7 x squared over x is 1. And then z squared over z is z to the first power. So I would get 7xz. All right, one last one to do. I know this stuff is tedious. 22xz over 11xz. That one's easy, it's just 2, right? These are going to cancel. 22 over 11 is 2, so I get plus 2 here. So my answer is 11xz times the quantity negative 11x to the fourth power y plus 3z squared y, plus 7xz, plus 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 38. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. We're going to start out by looking at 2p cubed minus p squared plus 6p minus 3. So remember, when you factor by grouping, the first thing you want to do is rearrange the terms into two groups so that each group has a common factor. And that common factor might happen to be one or negative one. So what I like to do is just look at the order that it's in when it starts out. So in other words, set this up as two groups of two like this. So the first two terms and then the second two terms. Now I think about what I could pull out from each. If I look at the first two terms, I could pull out a common factor of p squared. If I look at the second two, I could pull out a common factor of 3. So if I did this, would I get a common binomial factor? Because that's what I'm trying to pull out in the end. Well, let's see. So if I had a p squared out in front, I would have 2p cubed over p squared. That would be 2p. Then minus p squared over p squared is 1. Then plus, if I pulled out a 3 from this group, I would have 6p over 3, that's 2p, then minus 3 over 3 is 1. So I have a common binomial factor here of 2p minus 1. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. So once I have that, all I'm going to do is pull it out. So in other words, I'm going to factor out the common binomial factor. So let me put parentheses around the whole thing and show you that, okay, if I pulled out this guy and this guy and put it out in front, I'd have 2p minus 1 times what's left inside the parentheses. So in other words, this would be gone because I pulled it out. I just have a p squared and then plus, if this was gone, I'd have a 3. So I get 2p minus 1, that quantity, times p squared plus 3, that quantity. And just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show you through using FOIL that I get the exact same polynomial that I started with. 2p times p squared is 2p cubed. 2p times 3 is plus 6p. Negative 1 times p squared is negative p squared. And then negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. So I have 2p cubed plus 6p minus p squared minus 3. And the only difference between this and this is the order. right? If I rearrange these terms, I put minus p squared plus 6p, I'd have the exact same thing as what I started with here. 2p cubed minus p squared plus 6p minus 3. Let's take a look at another one. We have 4x cubed plus 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. So again, I want to arrange this into two groups so that each group has a common factor. Now, again, that common factor might be 1. So I'm going to look at the first two here as a group. I could pull out a 2x squared. 
With the second two, I can't do anything other than pulling out a one or a negative one. But let's just put one for right now. And if I look at this, I've already done a lot of problems like this in my life, so I can see already that that's gonna work out. You might not know, so you might have to do some trial and error. You might have to just go through and say, okay, if I did it this way, would I get a common binomial factor? If you don't, you just have to rearrange the terms through kind of a process of elimination until you do. All right, so for this one, if I pulled out a 2x squared, I'd have 2x squared out in front. 4x cubed divided by 2x squared is 2x, and then plus 2x squared over 2x squared is 1. And then for this one, I'd have plus. If I pulled a 1 out, in other words, put 1 out in front of a set of parentheses and just put this inside, 2x plus 1, you can see that I have a common binomial factor of 2x plus 1. And this is just a neat little trick, right? You multiply 1 times anything, you just get that back. So I can put a 1 out in front of 2x plus 1, I get 2x plus 1 back when it's multiplied. So now, to factor out the common binomial factor, again, this is going to go out in front of a set of parentheses. So 2x plus 1, and then inside these parentheses, I'll have what's left. I'll have 2x squared plus, I have a 1 over here. So 2x plus 1, that quantity, times 2x squared plus 1, that quantity, those two, when multiplied together, would get me back to 4x cubed plus 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 3xy plus x minus 21y minus 7. So again, I'm going to look at the first two here as a group and the second two as a group, see if that would work. So from the first two, I can only pull out an x. From the second two, I have a choice of pulling out a 7 or a negative 7, right, depending on what I need. Now, the one thing that you'd think about right away, everything in this first group is positive. So if I pulled out a negative 7, that would make everything in this group positive. So I probably want to do that, right? That's what's going to get me to a common binomial factor if one exists. So let's put equals. I'm going to pull out an x from the first one. And what's left is a 3y plus x over x is 1. So you want to make sure you're at 1 there. Because when I go back, if I use my distributive property, if I multiplied x times 1, I would get back to x. Okay, then I'm going to pull out a negative 7. So plus negative 7. And we're going to multiply this by, we have negative 21y divided by negative 7. That's 3y. And then I have negative 7 divided by negative 7. That's 1. So plus 1. And you can see you get a common binomial factor of 3y plus 1. Now, if I want to pull this guy out, again, I'm going to place this in front of a set of parentheses. So we're going to get 3y plus 1 times what's left here is x. And then what's left here is minus 7. So we'll put minus 7. And so we have the quantity 3y plus 1 times the quantity x minus 7. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 24uv minus 120u cubed minus 28v plus 140u squared. So the one thing you want to pay attention for, and I talked about this in the lesson, if you notice that you can pull something out before you even start, you need to do it to avoid additional factoring in the end. I notice right away that all the numbers here are even. So I know they're divisible by 2. But they're also divisible by 4. Right? This is 6 times 4. This is 30 times 4. This is 7 times 4. And then this is 35 times 4. So I would pull out that 4 to start, put it out in front of a set of parentheses, and I would have 6uv minus 30u cubed minus 7v plus 35u squared. And then I just work inside the parentheses just as I normally would if I didn't pull something out to start. So I can think about these first two as a group and the second two as a group. So for the first two, I would pull out a 6u. For the second two, I would pull out, you can do either a negative 7 or a positive 7. So it's just going to depend. So let's start out with a positive 7 and see where that gets us. Now, one thing you would note is that this term here, the second term, is negative. The second term here is positive. So we're probably going to have to pull out a negative 7. But let's just do positive 7 just to start with that, and then we'll go back and do negative 7 if we need to. All right, so we're going to have the 4 out in front, 
and then I'll have a 6u times, if I took a 6u out here, I just have a v, and then minus, if I took a 6u out here, I would have a 5u squared, and then I'm pulling out a positive 7, so plus, I'm going to do positive 7, so this would be negative v, and then this would be plus 5u squared. Okay, so what do we see here? I have a positive v and a negative v. I have a negative 5u squared and a positive 5u squared. So my original assumption was correct. What we need is a negative 7, right? Because if I pull out a negative 7 here, if I make this plus negative 7, every sign in here is just going to change. So this would be positive, this is positive, and then this would be negative, and this is negative. So now we have a common binomial factor a common binomial factor of v minus 5u squared. And we can just pull that guy out. Okay, so when we do that, I'm going to still have that 4 out in front. Then I'm going to have my v minus 5u squared. And that's going to be multiplied by, I'd have a 6u. This was pulled out. And then plus, or you can put minus, doesn't matter. You'd have negative 7. And then this was pulled out. So close parentheses. So you get 4 times the quantity, v minus 5u squared, times the quantity, 6u minus 7. And again, if you didn't do this to start, if you didn't pull that 4 out when you first started, you would have additional factoring to do at this step. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So one thing you would notice right away is that everything is divisible by 5. This is 5 times 10. This is 5 times 2. This is 5 times 4. This is 5 times 5. So I can rewrite this with a 5 out in front. I'm just going to factor that out. This would be 10aw minus, this would be 2xk, plus, this would be 4ak, minus, this would be 5xw. Now, again, I can start out with these first two and these last two, put those into two groups, see what I get. So what's common here is a 2. What's common here... Well, I don't have anything other than 1 or negative 1. So we know that's not going to work. You can eyeball that and see it's not going to work. If I pulled a 2 out from here, I would have 2 times 5aw minus xk. Since I'm only pulling out a 1 or negative 1, this isn't going to work. So I've got to try a different grouping. So I can rearrange the terms and see what I can put next to each other. And let's try putting, since this has a w and this has a w, Let's do it this way. Let's do 5 times the quantity. We'll put 10aw minus 5xw, and then we'll do minus 2xk and plus 4ak. Again, sometimes you're going to have to rearrange this to get it to work. So if I look here now, I'll have, I can pull out a 5w, or I can pull out a negative 5w, just depending on what I want to do. And from here, I can pull out a 2k, or again, I could pull out a negative 2k. Now, because this sign is negative and this sign is positive, I've got to make one of these negative in order to make this work. Let's just start out with them both positive and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, so if I pull out a 5w here, what's left inside? I'll have a 2a minus just x. Okay, so then plus, I'm pulling out a 2k here. And then inside the parentheses, I'll have a negative x, and then I'll have a 2a, so plus 2a. So do I need to pull out a negative of either one of these as I made that assumption earlier? No, I do not. So the reason for that is, if you look, you have the same thing, it's just in a different order. You have positive 2a and positive 2a. And then over here you have negative x and you have negative x. You have the exact same thing, you just need to change the order which is legal. I can switch the order and put this as 2a minus x, just as it is over there, and no need to pull out a negative for either one of these. A lot of times when you look at it, again, if you see one is negative and one is positive, you will need to do that. But in this case, because the order right, of the terms, the way that they've ended up, you didn't actually need to do that. So you start out with them as positive, see if it works out. If it doesn't, you start switching things around, start changing around signs. 
you, you know you're close if you got one as so in other words if i had something like this was positive and this was negative and then this was negative and this was positive you know you could just do a sign change right you could pull out a negative from one of those and go ahead and get that fixed but in this case we get positive 2a minus x in each case and so we pull that out that's our common binomial factor let me kind of close the parentheses here because so I've got this set here and then I've got the intercepts. So let's put equals. And again, pulling this out, this 2a minus x, we're going to put that outside of the parentheses. So I'm going to have 5 times we'll have 2a minus x, right? We're pulling that guy out. And then what's left? We're going to have 5w plus 2k. And again, if you go through and multiply all these together, you'll get that original polynomial that you started with, which was 50AW minus 10XK plus 20AK minus 25XW. All right, let's look at one final problem. So we have 100A squared U to the fourth power plus 25AU squared BV squared plus 20A squared U squared V squared plus 125AU to the fourth power B. All right, so what's common to everything before we even start? Well, I know 100, I can think of as what? It's 5 times 20, and 20 is 5 times 4. So let's put 5 times 5 times 4. This is 5 times 5. This is 5 times 4. So I already have enough information, right? The greatest common factor here in terms of the number part is going to be a 5. But I can pull out some variable parts as well. So I would have equals 5. This has an a, 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 and a. So now I could use that. Smallest exponent is a 1. And then everything also has a u. u to the fourth, u squared, u squared, and u to the fourth. So u to the second power or u squared. So what's going to be left inside? I'd have 20 a u squared plus 5 the a's would cancel, the u squareds would cancel, so b, v squared, plus 4, a, u squareds would cancel, v squared, plus 25, a over a is 1, u to the fourth over u squared is u squared, and then b. All right. So now, if we look at this, I can, again, look at the first two terms as a group, and the second two terms is a group. Can I pull anything out? I can pull out a 5 only from the first group. And from the second group, it doesn't look like I can pull anything out other than 1 or negative 1. But if I pull out a 5 from here, this would be 4AU squared. And that's not going to work with this. If I pull out a 5 here, it's just going to be BV squared. So this grouping is not going to work. So we need to reorder this. So let's do 5AU squared times, if I look for kind of like variables, let's put 20AU squared plus 25U squared B plus 5BV squared plus 4AV squared. Okay, let's see what this yields. So if I look at this group and I look at this group, what's common here is a 5U squared What's common here is v squared. So if I pulled this out, I would have 4a, and that's what I would have if I pulled out a v squared. So that part's good. If I pull out 5u squared here, I would have a 5b. If I pulled out a v squared here, I would have 5b. So that's exactly what I want to do. Okay, so we have 5au squared. I'm pulling out a 5u squared from this, so this is going to be 5u squared. This would be 4a plus 5b, okay? Then over here, I'm pulling out a v squared. So this would be 5b plus 4a. So we could reorder the terms. I could switch this to 4a plus 5b. 4a plus 5b. And again, we'd have a common binomial factor here, 4a plus 5b, 4a plus 5b. Okay, so if I pulled this out, 
I'd have my 5a u squared times, we'd have 4a plus 5b, and then times 5u squared plus v squared. So now we have it factored. We have 5a u squared times the quantity 4a plus 5b times the quantity 5u squared plus v squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. So let's take a look at n cubed minus 4n squared plus 3n minus 12. So the first thing I want to do is set this up as two groups of two terms each where each group has a common factor. And that common factor might have to be 1 or negative 1. So if I look at kind of the way it's set up now, let's say I put these two into a group and these two into a group. And I said, okay, well, the common factor here would be n squared, and the common factor here would be 3. So if I pulled that out, so if I had n squared times, what would be left in this group? Well, it would be n minus 4. And if I pulled out a 3 here, I'd have plus 3 times n minus 4. So doing this yields a common binomial factor, this n minus 4. And we can further pull this out, further factor this, and just say, okay, if I pulled out n minus 4, it would be multiplied by, so I pulled it out from here, I'd have n squared, plus, I pulled it out from here, I'd have 3. So I'd have n minus 4, that quantity, times the quantity n squared plus 3. And if I used FOIL here, I would get exactly back what I started with. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 5b cubed plus 4b squared plus 20b plus 16. So again, I want to look at two groups of two where each group has a common factor. So if I start out with the way they're arranged now, I can see that I could pull out a b squared from this, and I could pull out a 4 from this. So let's set that up. If I pulled out a b squared from the first two, I'd have a 5b plus a 4. If I pulled out a 4 from here, I'd have a 5b plus a 4. So again, a common binomial factor, which is what we're looking for. So we're going to pull this guy out. We're going to pull this guy out. Set it in front of some parentheses, so 5b plus 4. And then what's left? Well, I'd have b squared, this was pulled out, plus a 4, right? This was pulled out. So you get 5b plus 4, that quantity, times the quantity b squared plus 4. And again, if you do FOIL on this, if you multiply these out, you're going to end up with this back, right? This four-term polynomial, 5b cubed plus 4b squared plus 20b plus 16. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. And we're going to start out with 120xy minus 160x minus 48y plus 64. So if I look at this, before I even start, I notice that all the numbers here are even. So I know they're divisible by 2, but additionally I notice that they're all divisible by 4. And then also they're divisible by 8. So I could pull out an 8 before I begin. So 120 divided by 8 is 15. So 15xy minus 160 divided by 8 is 20. So 20x minus 48 divided by 8 is 6. So 6y plus 64 divided by 8 is 8. So now inside the parentheses, I would work just like I normally do. Let's set these two up as a group and these two up as a group. And what I'm looking to see here is what can I pull out of each group? So in the first group, I could pull out what? I could pull out a 5x. In the second group, I could pull out a 2. So what would that give me if I did that? Well, in this one, let's put equals here. I'd have my 8 out in front. I'd have 5x times. I would have 3y minus, if I look at this one, I would have 4. Then over here, if I pull out a 2, I'd put plus 2. I'd have a negative 3y, and then I would have plus 4. Now, if I look at this, I have 3y here, I have negative 3y here. I have negative 4 here, I have positive 4 here. So I have the same thing, just different signs. So I can fix that by just making one of these negative. So if I just factored out a negative 2 instead, 
if I said plus negative 2 here, I would just change the sign of each term. So this would be plus 3y, this would be minus 4, and so I would match this completely. I would now have a common binomial factor, a common binomial factor. So let's pull that guy out. So we're going to pull this out. I still have my 8 out in front, and then I have my 3y minus 4, and then what's left? I'd have 5x, and I'd have plus negative 2 or just minus 2. So my answer here is 8 times the quantity 3y minus 4 times the quantity 5x minus 2. And again, if you were to check this, just multiply everything together, and you should get this back exactly. The 120xy minus 160x minus 48y plus 64. All right, let's look at the next one. We have 4mn minus 12m minus 10n plus 30. All right, so if I look at this, I know that everything is divisible by 2. So I can start by just pulling that out. So 2 times, we'd have 2mn minus 6m minus 5n plus 15. And again, if you don't do that when you start, when you get to kind of your last step where you report your answer, you're going to have something else you can factor out. So you won't have factored it completely. And if you leave it like that, if you don't factor it completely, your teacher is going to, at minimum, take some points off on your test. All right, so if I look at this the way it is, again, if I set this up as a group and this up as a group, well, I could pull a 2m out from here, and I could pull out a 5 from here. So that would give me 2 times, in here I'd have 2m times n minus 3. And then if I pulled out a 5, so plus 5 times, you would have negative n plus 3. And again, it's the same situation as before. You have n here, negative n. Negative 3, positive 3. So to go ahead and just change this sign to negative, this can be plus now, and this can be negative. So now it matches completely. We have n minus 3, we have n minus 3. So a common binomial factor. And we could just pull that guy out. So we'll pull this guy out. We'll have 2 times n minus 3, the common binomial factor, times 2m minus 5. So again, 2 times the quantity n minus 3 times the quantity 2m minus 5. And again, if you wanted to check this, you could multiply all this together, and you would see that you get the original polynomial back, which is 4mn minus 12m minus 10n plus 30. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. We're going to take a look at 75BC minus 27X squared D plus 45BD minus 45X squared C. So before I even start, I notice that everything here is divisible by 3. This is 3 times 25. This is 3 times 9. This is 3 times 15, and so is this. So if I pulled out a 3 to start, I'd have 3 out in front of a set of parentheses, and I'd have 25BC minus 9x squared D plus 15BD minus 15x squared C. So now if I look at kind of the way it's laid out now, let's say these were the first group, and then these were the second group. What can I pull out of that first group? Well, variable-wise, nothing. Number-wise, nothing. 25 is 5 times 5. 9 is 3 times 3. So really just 1. Over here, I could pull out a 15, and that's really it. I could pull out a 15 or a negative 15. I can't really do anything else. If I pulled out a 15, I'd have BD minus X squared C. That's not going to do anything with this over here. I need a common binomial factor. So we've got to rearrange the terms. So let's try to put where we have the variables that are common next to each other. So let's do three times. We'll do 25BC plus 15BD and then minus 9X squared D and then minus 15X squared C. So if I look at this now, for the first group, I could pull out a 5b. So that would leave me with 5c plus 3d. In the second group, I could pull out a 3 or a negative 3 if I wanted to. So let's say 3x squared. Now, 
the signs over here are all positive, so I know I have to pull out a negative 3x squared. So if I do that, I'd have 3d plus 5c. It's exactly what we have here, it's just in a different order. So let's go ahead and execute that. So we're going to do 3 times, I'll have 5b pulled out of the first group, so that would be 5c plus 3d. And then in the second group, I'm going to pull out a negative 3x squared. And so again, that's going to give me a positive 3d plus, because I'm pulling out a negative and this is negative, it's going to be a 5c. And again, I can rearrange these terms to where it looks the same as this over there, but they're already the same. Right? The commutative property of addition tells us that the order that we add in does not affect the result. So once I see that, I have a common binomial factor, I can just pull that guy out. So I'd have 3, and then I'd have times, we have 5c plus 3d, and then times, I have a 5b left, and then minus 3x squared. Okay, so that's our answer. 3 times the quantity 5c plus 3d, that was the quantity 5b minus 3x squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. And we're going to start out by looking at 24n squared mc minus 75n cubed k plus 60n squared mk minus 30n cubed c. So before I kind of get started here, you might want to notice that everything is divisible by a 3, right? 24 is 3 times 8. 75 is 3 times 25, 60 is 3 times 20, and then 30 is 3 times 10. Then additionally, everything here has an n, and the smallest exponent is a 2. So I can pull out a 3n squared from everything before I even begin. So let's start out by doing that. So let's do 3n squared times, in here, 24 divided by 3 is 8, n squared over n squared is 1, so you'd have 8mc minus 75 divided by 3 is 25, n cubed over n squared is n, and then times k, and then plus 60 divided by 3 is 20, n squared over n squared is 1, and then mk. Okay, then we have minus 30 over 3 is 10, n cubed over n squared is n, and then we have c, and then close the parentheses. Okay. So I'm going to put equals, and if I look inside now, so 3n squared, I'm going to start out with these two as a group and these two as a group. So if I look, 25 I know is 5 times 5, and 8 is 3 factors of 2, 2 times 2 times 2. Nothing I can really do there other than a 1. This is mc and this is nk, so that's not really, there's nothing I can really pull out other than a 1. For this one I could pull out a 2, and that's it. So if I pulled out a 2 from here, I'd have 10mk, and I'd have 5nc. Th that's not going to work. I'm looking to pull out a common binomial factor in the end. So this grouping does not work, so I need to change it up. So let's put 8mc next to 20mk, and let's put negative 25nk next to negative 10nc. So what can we do here? Well, with this one, I could pull out a 4m, so that would leave me with a 2c and a 5k. Over here, I could pull out, let's do a negative 5n, so that would leave me with 5k and a 2c. So that's exactly what we want to do. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's put equals. So I have my, again, 3n squared. And I'm pulling out, again, a 4m. So inside, the 8 divided by 4 would be 2. m over m is 1, so 2c. Then plus 20 divided by 4 is 5. m over m is 1. And then k. So then in this one, I'm going to pull out a negative 5n. So I'm going to put plus negative 5n. And then times, this is 5 and then k. And then this is plus, negative 10 over negative 5 is 2, n over n is 1, so I'd have c. So now I can see that I have a common binomial factor. It's 2c plus 5k. 
And I know here it says 5K plus 2C, but again, you can reorder that. Remember, addition is commutative, so I can just change the order around here, and it's the same thing, right? It's 2C plus 5K. Okay, so once we've done this, let's factor out this common binomial factor. So I'm going to have 3N squared times the common binomial factor, which is 2C plus 5K. Then times, I'd have 4M minus 5N. And it's just that simple. We have 3N squared times the quantity 2C plus 5K times the quantity 4M minus 5N. And again, if you wanted to check this, multiply this all together, and you'd end up with your original four-term polynomial back, which was 24N squared MC minus 75N cubed K plus 60N squared MK minus 30N cubed C. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on factoring by grouping. All right, so we want to factor each by grouping. And we're going to take a look at 72XY plus 64N to the fourth power plus 96XN cubed plus 48NY. So you'll notice here before you even start, everything is divisible by 8. This is 8 times 9. This is 8 times 8. This is 8 times 12. And this is 8 times 6. So I can pull out that 8 before I start. It's going to save me a little bit of work in the end. So again, this would be 9xy plus 8n to the fourth power plus 12xn cubed. And then lastly, plus 6ny. So again, I want to set this up into two groups of two terms each. And I always just start out with looking at the first two and the final two. See if I can get anything out of there. If you look here, they don't have any variables in common. For the numbers, 9 is 3 times 3. 8 is 3 factors of 2. Nothing I can really do other than 1 or negative 1. Here it's going to be, I can pull out a 6, and that's it. So if I pulled out a 6 here, I'm really going to have what? I'm going to have a 2xn cubed plus ny. I'm not going to have a common binomial factor, so this isn't going to work. So I need to change this up, and if I put these two next to each other, they have a common factor of 3x. If I put these two next to each other, they have a common factor of 2n. So let's go ahead and do that and see what we get. So we have 8 times the quantity. I'm going to have 9xy plus 12xn cubed plus 8n to the fourth power plus 6ny. Let's get a little room going. So if I look here again, if I pulled out a 3x... That would leave me with a 3y, and it would leave me with a 4n cubed. If I pulled out a 2n, that would leave me with a 4n cubed, and it would leave me with a 3y. So the same terms. They're not going to be in the same order, but it's the same terms, right? We're adding addition is commutative. I can just switch the order. It's going to be the same. So let's go ahead and pull those out. So we would have, again, 8 times, inside of parentheses, 3x times, you'd have your 3y plus 4n cubed. Then plus, I'd have my 2n outside, and inside I'd have 4n cubed plus 3y. So again, all I have to do is change the order of one of these, or you can leave it as it is, it doesn't matter, right? It's addition, it's commutative. You know, this 3y plus 4n cubed is the same as 4n cubed plus 3y. But for most students, they like it to be the exact same. So 3y plus 4n cubed, switch the order. You're legally allowed to do that. And so you have a common binomial factor here. We're going to pull that guy out. So we'd have 8 times that common binomial factor, 3y plus 4n cubed, times what's going to be left? I have 3x plus 2n. And again, if you go through and multiply this out, you would get exactly the four-term polynomial that you started with, the 72xy plus 64n to the fourth power plus 96xn cubed plus 48ny. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 39. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of 1. All right, so we want to factor... And we're going to start out with n squared minus 7n minus 30. 
So in case you didn't catch the lesson, basically what you're doing here is you're taking a trinomial with a leading coefficient of one. So in other words, something like this, ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, the coefficient for the x squared term is a one. So you'll notice that the coefficient for n squared here is a one. If you don't have a visible coefficient, it's understood to be one. So what we're doing is we're taking this guy and we're writing it as the product of two binomials. Okay, two binomials. Now the first one's a given. If the leading coefficient is one, well then I have n squared here. This will be n and this will be n. Right? Remember when we do FOIL, we do first times first. n times n would be n squared. So we always know that when that one's kind of a given. The second thing you need to figure out is what's gonna go here and here. And the way you determine that is you find two integers whose sum is b and whose product is c. So in other words, we're looking for two integers whose sum is the coefficient on the n to the first power or the x to the first power or whatever variable you're working with. So in this case, that's gonna be negative seven, and then whose product is the constant, c. In this case, that's negative 30. So give me two integers whose sum is negative seven and whose product is negative 30, and you could write those in right there, and you will have factored this. So to do this, we're just gonna think about the factors of 30. Forget about the fact that it's negative for right now. So you have one and you have 30, and there's no way to really make that to where it's gonna to sum to negative seven. So you kind of move on. So you'd have two and you'd have 15. Not any way you can make that sum to negative seven. So we'd say three and 10. So now three and 10, if I think about the signs here, I know because this sign here is negative, positive times negative is negative, right? So I need one of these to be positive, one of these to be negative. If I had a negative 10 and I had a positive three, Negative 10 plus positive 3 is negative 7. Negative 10 times positive 3 is negative 30. So we found our two integers, and we can just write them in. So negative 10 and positive 3. And it doesn't matter which order you write it in. You could have put, you know, positive 3 here and negative 10 here. Doesn't matter. Okay, let's erase all this real quick. And let's check. n times n is n squared. The outer n times negative 10 is negative 10n. The inner 3 times n is plus 3n. And then for the last, 3 times negative 10 is minus 30. So I'd have n squared. The middle terms, we can combine like terms. Negative 10n plus 3n would be negative 7n. And then I have minus 30. So you can see it's this negative 10 plus the positive 3. Those two integers, what we're looking for, right? They sum to give us negative 7 and they multiply to give us negative 30, right? So we get n squared minus 7n minus 30, which is what we started with in the beginning. All right, let's take a look at v squared plus 5v minus 6. So again, I'm going to set this up with my parentheses. If I have v squared, I know this position is a v, and this is a v. That's a given, right? If your leading coefficient is 1, very, very easy. Right? If this was x squared, I'd have x and x. If it was y squared, I'd have y and y. If it was z squared, I'd have z and then z. Very, very easy. All right, then I just need to figure out what goes here and what goes here. Again, give me two integers whose sum is 5, whose product is negative 6. So I think about the factors of 6. I have 1 and 6. I have 2 and 3. So I know that I need one of them to be positive and one of them to be negative because the product is negative, right? Remember, a plus times a minus gives me a minus. So if I alternate the signs here, I know that two and three are not gonna work because if one of them is positive and one of them is negative, it's never gonna sum to a positive five. So I can throw that out right away. So it's gotta be that I've gotta work out a combination with one and six. So because I have a positive five here, I'd want a positive six and a negative one. Positive six plus negative one would give me a positive five. So that checks out. Positive six times negative one would give me a negative six. So that checks out. So we have positive six and negative one. And again, the order doesn't matter. You could write it either way. Let's erase this and we'll check that real quick. So V times V is V squared. 
v times negative 1 is minus v, 6 times v is plus 6v, and then 6 times negative 1 is minus 6. So if I think about this as negative 1v, these two integers here, again, they sum to give me this, that term in the middle. Right? If I combine like terms there, I'd have v squared plus 5v, right? negative 1 plus 6 is positive 5, so I get plus 5v, and then minus 6. So they sum to give you the middle term, and they multiply to give you the final term. Negative 1 times positive 6 is negative 6. All right, let's take a look at n squared minus 4n minus 5. Again, I'm going to set up my parentheses here. And if I have n squared to start, I have n here and n here. I just need to figure out what's going to go here and here. So again, give me two integers whose sum is negative 4 and whose product is negative 5. So just think about the factors of 5. So I have 1 and I have 5. That's kind of it because 5 is a prime number. I mean, you could play around with some negatives of that, but really 1 and 5 is all you got. So if I think about, okay, this has to be negative. So then it has to be a negative times a positive. Okay, so 1 negative, 1 positive. If this is negative 4, then I would want negative 5 and I would want positive 1. Negative 5 plus 1 would give me negative 4. Negative 5 times 1 would give me negative 5. So that's what I'm looking for. Minus 5 and then plus 1. And again, if we want to check that real quick, n times n is n squared. The outer n times 1 is plus n. The inner negative 5 times n is minus 5n. And then the last negative 5 times 1 is minus 5. If you combine like terms in the middle, you get n squared minus 4n. Again, you have 1 and you have negative 5. Those sum to give you that middle term. 1 plus negative 5 is negative 4, and then you have that variable n, and then they also multiply together to give you that final term, the minus 5, right? 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. So you get n squared minus 4n minus 5. Again, that's what you started with. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have n squared minus 16n plus 64. So again, I'm going to set this up real quick. I have n squared, so I want n and n. Now, I'm looking for two integers whose sum is negative 16, whose product is 64. So if I think about 64, I have 1 times 64. That's not going to work. I have 2 times 32. That's not going to work. I have 6 plus 4 is 10. That's not divisible by 3. So I have 4 times 16. And that's not going to work. Not divisible by 5, not divisible by 6, not divisible by 7. We have 8 times 8. And that would work if you play with the signs. 8 times 8 would be 64, but again, this has to be negative here. So I would need two negatives or two positives to get this result here. Right? If you have a product that's positive, it's either two negatives or two positives. Right? It can't be a mixture of signs. So knowing that, I've got to go with two negatives because the sum is negative. So I go negative 8 and negative 8. Negative 8 plus negative 8 is negative 16. Negative 8 times negative 8 is positive 64. So negative 8 and negative 8. And you'll find out in one of the future lessons that we can really write this as what? It's n minus 8, that quantity squared. We've already seen this before when we talked about special products. But we're going to see stuff like this. And we're going to learn how to factor these scenarios right away when we see them. And we'll see that two lessons from now. So if we want to check this, again, we remember our formula from special products. We have the first guy squared, and then minus two times, two times, the first guy times the last guy. So two times eight is 16, times n is 16n. And then plus the last guy squared, eight squared is 64. So n squared minus 16n plus 64. Again, that's what you started with. All right, for the next one, I have x squared plus 7x plus 56. So again, let me set this up. And I'm looking for two integers where the sum is 7, the product is 56. So I'm looking for these two spots here. So let's think about the factors of 56. You've got 1 and 56. You've got 2 and 28. None of those are going to work. 56, 5 plus 6 is 11. 11 is not divisible by 3, so this is not divisible by 3. It's divisible by 4, though. It's 4 times 14, and that's not going to work. And then we also have what? We have 7 times 8. 
And that's really it. Not divisible by 9, not divisible by 10. You can keep going, but that's all the factors you're going to get for 56. So what can we combine together to get a sum of 7 and a product of 56? Well, nothing. Both these signs are positive, so no negatives are going to be involved here. So 1 plus 56 would be 57. 2 plus 28 would be 30. 4 plus 14 would be 18. 7 plus 8 would be 15. There's, there's nothing we can do here. This polynomial is prime. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 5k squared plus 20k minus 225. So like I told you in the lesson, if you're on a section in your textbook and you're talking about the leading coefficient being 1 and it's not, that's a hint that you need to do some additional work. And basically all you need to do is pull out a common factor of 5 to start. So if I do that, I'll have k squared plus 4k minus 225 divided by 5 is 45. And so once I've done that, I'm just factoring what's inside the parentheses. So rewrite the 5 times your two sets of parentheses. And again, if I have k squared there, I know the first thing is k, and then the first thing over here is k also. And again, I just need to find these two missing parts right here. So give me two integers whose sum is positive 4 and whose product is negative 45. So for 45, I've got 1 and 45. That's not going to work. Not divisible by 2. It's divisible by 3. It's 3 times 15. That's not going to work. It's not divisible by 4. It is divisible by 5. It's 5 times 9. And we could make the signs work out there. So if I had a positive 9 and a negative 5, 9 minus 5 would give me 4. 9 times negative 5 would give me negative 45. So plus 9 and negative 5 is exactly what we're looking for. And again, if you want to check that, k times k is k squared. k times negative 5 is minus 5k. 9 times k is plus 9k. And then 9 times negative 5 is negative 45. So if I combine like terms here in the middle, again, I would get k squared plus 4k minus 45. And then if I multiplied by 5, 5 times k squared is 5k squared. 5 times 4k is 20k. And 5 times negative 45 is negative 225. So we get exactly back what we started with. All right, let's take a look at one that's a little bit more complex. We saw an example of this at the end of our lesson. We have 4x squared plus 44xy plus 40y squared. So the very first thing before we start, you notice that you have two variables involved. So you might be thinking, well, what do I do here? It's no more difficult. I have, before I even begin, a 4, a 44, and a 40. Everything's divisible by 4, so let's get that out of the way first. So pull the 4 out. You'll have x squared plus 11xy plus 10y squared. So when I set this up, now all I'm looking for is I'm looking for two terms, I would say, where the sum is 11y and the product is 10y squared. That's the only difference. The first part here, it's still x squared, so it's going to be x and it's going to be x. I want a sum now of 11y and I want a product of 10y squared. So in other words, the variable that's not first, so the y is kind of the second one that you see, that one you're going to kind of treat like if it was a constant, like it's just being multiplied by the 11, right? So that's, you don't really think about it as a variable. You just kind of think about it as part of what you're gathering. And you can leave it off to the side. If you work the number part out, you're going to get the right answer just by putting a y in there. And let me show you that. Let me just kind of work with the numbers and we'll throw the y in at the end. So if I wanted a product of 10 and a sum of 11, how would I go about getting that? Well, 10, you have 1 times 10, and you have 2 times 5. It's obviously going to be 1 times 10. Right? It's really easy. So if I had a 1 and a 10, that would work out. Just throw the y in there. So plus 1y, or just y, and then plus 10y. And if you multiply these together, you're going to get exactly back to what you started with. And let me show you that. So x times x is x squared. 
x times 10y is plus 10xy. y times x is plus xy. And then y times 10y is plus 10y squared. Now remember, this is all being multiplied by 4. So combine like terms here in the middle. I'd have 4 times inside of parentheses x squared plus 11xy plus 10y squared. And then simplify one more time. 4 times x squared is 4x squared. 4 times 11xy is plus 44xy. And then plus 4 times 10y squared is 40y squared. So you can see you get 4x squared plus 44xy plus 40y squared. That is exactly what you started with. So again, the key here is just to think about the y, that second variable that you see, is kind of like a constant. You could just think about the number parts and get that straight and throw the y in kind of in the end when you're setting this up and then it'll work itself out, right? Because you'll have whatever the coefficient is times y and then whatever the coefficient is times y. So those two would work itself out to give you that middle part. Then the y times the y would give you the y squared part that you need. So you really only need to work out the number parts. All right, so we're going to look at one that's just like the one we just saw. So we have 5x squared plus 10xy minus 400y squared. First thing I'm going to do is pull that 5 out that's common to everything. So I'll have x squared plus 2xy minus 80y squared. And then I'll set this up as 5 times. We'll have these two binomials here. Now the first term inside the parentheses is x squared. So obviously this would be x and this would be x. Now, how do I get these two parts right here? Again, don't think about the y. Don't let this trip you up. Really, I could just throw the y in here. All I'm looking for is the coefficients for those two y's, right? y times y would be y squared. So I know I would have that part down. And then once I'm summing everything, if I can get this number right, then everything will work itself out. So I'm looking for two integers whose sum is 2, whose product is negative 80. So if I think about the factors of 80, I've got 1 and 80. That's not going to work. I've got 2 and 40. That's not going to work. Not divisible by 3. I've got 4 and 20. That's not going to work. I've got 5 and 16. That's not going to work. Not divisible by 7. I've got 8 and 10. That will work. So if I had a positive 10 and a negative 8, it's exactly what I want, right? So a positive 10 and a negative 8. Positive 10 plus negative 8 would give me positive 2. Positive 10 times negative 8 would give me negative 8. Remember, the y times the y would give you the y squared. And then 10y minus 8y would give you the 2y that you're looking for. I know there's an x involved here, but because it's getting multiplied all around, the x will be in there. All right, so let's go ahead and foil that guy. And I seem to have erased my y and my minus. All right, so if I do x times x, that's x squared. If I do x times negative 8y, that's negative 8xy. If I do 10y times x, that's plus 10xy. If I do 10y times negative 8y, that's negative 80y squared. So to simplify this, I'd have 5 times x squared. I have the negative 8xy plus 10xy. That's plus 2xy. And then minus 80y squared. So I'd have 5 times x squared. That's 5x squared. Then plus 5 times 2xy. That's 10xy. And then minus 5 times 80y squared. That's 400y squared. So 5x squared plus 10xy minus 400y squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of 1. All right, so we want to factor, and we're looking at v squared plus 11v plus 30. So I'm going to take my trinomial here, and I'm going to factor this into the product of two binomials. And I know that since this is v squared here, this first term here will be v, and this first term here will be v. All I need to figure out is what goes here and what goes here. And the way I figure that out is I find two integers whose sum is 11 and whose product is 30. So I would think about just the ways that I could multiply two integers together to get 30. All right, I have 1 and 30. I have 2 and 15. I have 3 and 10. I have 5 and 6. 
Now with five and six, you can think about, okay, five plus six would give me 11. Five times six is 30. So that's what I'm looking for. So I would put positive five and positive six. And if you check that, you'd see that you'd get this back. V times V is V squared. V times six is plus six V. Five times V is plus five V. So six V plus five V is 11 V. So it gives you that middle term. And then five times six is 30. So you get V squared plus 11 V plus 30 back, which is the trinomial we started with. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have X squared minus three X minus four. So again, I'm gonna factor this into the product of two binomials. And my first term, since this is X squared, will be X. And my first term here will also be X. And again, I'm just trying to find out what goes here and here. So to do that, I want two integers whose sum is negative three and whose product is negative four. So if I think about the ways to get four, I have one and four and I have two and two. So I'm gonna to have to go with one and four. Two and two will not work. So I play with the signs. Remember, if you have a product that's negative, you have to have one positive and one negative, okay? So if I had a negative four and a positive one, negative four plus positive one would give me a negative three, and negative four times positive one would give me a negative four. So I want x minus four and x plus one. Now again, if you wanna check this, just go ahead and do FOIL. X times X is X squared. X times one is plus X. Negative four times X is minus four X. So if you had plus X and minus four X, those would combine together to give you negative three X, your middle term here. And then negative four times one would be negative four. So you get X squared minus three X minus four, just like you started with. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section two on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of one. All right, so we want to factor, and we're gonna take a look at x squared minus four x minus 28. And again, we're gonna take this trinomial and we're gonna factor it into the product of two binomials. So x squared here, I know that's gonna factor into, we'll have an x here and an x here. All we need to really figure out is what's gonna go in this position and this position. And the way you figure that out is you find two integers whose sum is negative four and whose product is negative 28, right? So sum to that coefficient of the middle term and the product is the constant term at the end. So I would just think about positive 28 for a minute. Forget about the fact that it's negative. Just think about the factors of 28. You've got one and 28. Well, there's no way with signs to make that be negative four. Okay, so then you've got two and 14. No way to make that negative four then it's not divisible by three. You could do four and seven. There's no way to make that negative four. So then you move on, it's not divisible by five. It's not divisible by six. We know it's divisible by seven, we already did that. So at this point, we're out of factors. So because nothing would work out to sum to give me a negative four and multiply to be negative 28, what's gonna happen is this polynomial is considered prime. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have x squared plus 15x plus 44. Again, I'm gonna factor this into the product of two binomials. So my first two spots, I have x squared, so it's gonna be x and then x. And then I have two positives there. So I know this will be plus and then plus. So what other information do I need? Well, I need two integers whose sum is 15, whose product is 44. So if I think about 44, it's one times 44, it's two times 22, not divisible by three, it's four times 11. Now, four plus 11 is 15, four times 11 is 44. So there's my two integers. So x plus four times x plus 11. And if we go through and use FOIL, we can prove that this is true. x times x is x squared, x times 11 is 11x, four times x is 4x, so 11x plus 4x is 15x, and then four times 11 is 44. So you would get x squared plus 15x plus 44 back. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of 1. All right, so we just want to factor and we're looking at 2x squared plus 16x plus 24. And again, when you look at these to start, if you see something that can be pulled out, so in other words, I have a 2, I have a 16, and I have a 24, well, I know everything's divisible by 2, so I can pull out a 2 to start. So we do that, two comes out here and then we'd have x squared 
plus 8x plus 12. And then I would factor what's inside the parentheses here. So two times, I'm gonna set this up as the product of two binomials. And I know that if I have x squared, I'd have x and I'd have x. So now I just need to figure out what's gonna go here and here. And to figure that out again, all you're looking at, you want two integers whose sum is eight, whose product is 12. You think about the factors of 12, you have one and 12, and then you have two and six. Now two plus six gives me eight, two times six gives me 12. So that's what I'm looking for, right? I want plus two and plus six. So two times the quantity x plus two times the quantity x plus six. And again, if you wanna check this, just use your foil. x times x is x squared. x times six is plus six x. Two times x is plus two x. So six x plus two x is plus eight x. And then two times six is 12, so plus 12. And if I multiplied this by two, I would get exactly this back. Two times x squared is two x squared. Two times eight x is 16 x and two times 12 is 24. All right, let's take a look at it all. So what if I had 3m squared minus 18m minus 81? So again, I have this three that's common to everything here. So let's pull that out to start. So I'd have three out in front of the parentheses and then m squared minus 18 divided by three is six, so 6m minus 81 divided by three is 27. Okay, so now I'm gonna set this up as three times the product of two binomials. So I have m squared there, so m here and m here. And again, all I need to do is figure out what goes here and what goes here. And I'm looking for a sum of negative six and a product of negative 27 from two integers. So for 27, it's pretty simple, right? You can only really do nine times three or one times 27. We know that it's gonna have to be nine and three, but with the signs here, you've gotta make it work out. If you want a negative product, it's gotta be one positive and one negative. Now, I see that I have a negative six here, so I'd want a negative nine and a positive three. Negative nine plus three gives me negative six. Negative nine times three gives me negative 27. So I want minus nine and plus three. And then once again, if you wanna check this, use your foil. M times M is M squared. M times three is plus three M. Negative nine times M is negative nine M. So three M minus nine M is minus six M. And then negative nine times three is negative 27. If I multiplied this by three, I would get back to this. Three times M squared is three M squared. Three times negative six M is negative 18 M. And three times negative 27 is negative 81. So I'd get the three M squared minus 18 M minus 81 back. And that's what I started with. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of 1. All right, so we want a factor and we have 2x squared plus 14xy minus 36y squared. So the first thing is don't let this scare you. It has two variables in it, but one of them you're not going to worry about. Okay, so the first thing, everything is divisible by 2. So let's go ahead and just pull that out to start. So we have the 2 out in front and then x squared plus 7xy minus 18y squared. So once I've done that, now I'm gonna have two times the product of two binomials. Now, I have x squared here, same thing. I'm gonna put an x here and an x here. When I have that additional variable in here, when they throw that at you, I know if I'm gonna end up with a y squared, I've gotta have a y here and a y here. Just put those in, and then work out the number parts, just like you normally would. So I want a sum of seven and a product of negative 18. So what two integers would give me that? Well, if I think about 18, I've got one times 18, I've got two times nine, and I could stop there. If I want positive seven, I could do positive nine and I could do negative two. Positive nine plus negative two is positive seven, and then positive nine times negative two is negative 18. So I'm just gonna write plus nine y and minus two y. Now, once I've done that, I can check and see that, again, the outer terms here, you'd have negative two x y. The inside term here, you'd have nine x y. So those two combine together to give you seven x y. And then the final terms, nine y, negative two y, that's gonna give you your negative 18 y squared. 
So that's what you're looking for. So don't get too panicked when you see two variables involved. It's not any more difficult. So if I check this, again, x times x is x squared. For the outer, x times negative 2y is plus negative 2xy. For the inner, 9y times x is plus 9xy. And then for the last, 9y times negative 2y is minus 18y squared. So if I combine like terms here, I would have x squared plus 7xy minus 18y squared. Now, if I multiplied this by 2, 2 times x squared would be 2x squared, 2 times 7xy would be 14xy, and then 2 times negative 18y squared would be negative 36y squared, and so we have exactly the trinomial that we started with. Again, 2x squared plus 14xy minus 36y squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient of 1. All right, so we want to factor, and what we have is 6x squared plus 36xy plus 30y squared. So the first thing I'm going to do is pull that 6 out, right? That's common to everything. So pull the 6 out, and I'll have x squared plus 6xy plus 5y squared. So we've seen stuff like this before with two variables involved. It's no more difficult. I'm going to put the 6 out in front, and I'm going to make two sets of parentheses, so that I can multiply this by two binomials. And so if I have x squared here, I'd have x here and x here. If I have y squared, forget about the five for a second, if I have y squared, I know that this term here comes from the multiplication of this times this. So I've gotta have a y here and a y here. That must be there. Now, all I need to think about now is the number parts, right? So what two integers multiply together to give me five, and sum to give me six. Well, five and one. I don't need to go through that because five is a prime number. It's really just one times five. So if I did plus one y or plus y, and I did plus five y, that would give me exactly what I needed. So you could check this with FOIL. x times x is x squared plus the outer, x times five y is plus five xy. The inner, we have y times x, that's plus xy. And then the last, y times 5y is plus 5y squared. So if you combine like terms right here, you'd have plus 6xy. And if I multiply this by 6, I'd have 6 times x squared, that's 6x squared. I'd have 6 times 6xy, that's 36xy. I'd have 6 times 5y squared, that's 30y squared. So I would get my original trinomial back, 6x squared plus 36xy plus 30y squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 40. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. So remember, we learned two methods to do this. We're going to start out, we're asked to factor using grouping. So that's what we're going to do. So to do this method, remember, the first thing I want to do is I want to find two integers whose product is AC. So remember, when we look at this, this is A, this is B, this is C, right? It's AX squared plus BX plus C. So A is the coefficient for the squared term. In this case, that's 5. And C is the constant term. In this case, that's negative 28. So 5 times negative 28 is equal to negative 140. So we're looking for two integers whose product is negative 140 and whose sum is 31. So what are some factors of negative 140? And let's just think about positive 140 for now. Well, this isn't something we work with a lot, but basically you'd have what? You'd have one in 140. That's obviously not gonna work. No combination's gonna give you 31. You'd have two and 70. That's not gonna work. Let's see, one plus four is five. Five plus zero is still five. It's not divisible by three. It's gonna be divisible by four because the last two digits would be 40. So this is four times 35. So that would work out, right? If we had a negative four and a positive 35, that would work out. So there's my two integers. So we want positive 35 and negative four. And I know in kind of the last lesson, right? In lesson 39, we were done once we found these two integers. But here it's a little bit more complex. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use these two integers to rewrite this middle term. 
So we're gonna have 5x squared plus 35x minus 4x minus 28. All I did was I rewrote the middle term. I have not changed the value of this polynomial at all. Now it's just a polynomial in four terms. And so we're gonna use a technique to factor it called grouping. So remember, to do this, we just pull what's common out of each group. So this is a group, and this is a group. The greatest common factor here was 5x. Then the greatest common factor here would be 4. But I'm gonna go ahead and pull that negative out too. So I'm gonna do negative 4. So this would give me 5x out in front of parentheses. You'd have x plus 7. And then if I pull out a negative 4, I'd have x plus 7. So you can see you have a common binomial factor there of x plus 7. And so if I factor that guy out, I would have x plus 7 times what's left. I'd have 5x. What's left over here? Just minus 4. So I've factored this into x plus 7 times 5x minus 4. So let me erase all this. And I'll write this answer up here. This is x plus 7 times 5x minus 4. And if you'd like, you can check it. And let me erase all this. So x times 5x is 5x squared. Then x times negative 4 is negative 4x. 7 times 5x is 35x. So 35x minus 4x is 31x. And then 7 times negative 4 is negative 28. So we've correctly factored this 5x squared plus 31x minus 28 as the quantity x plus 7 times the quantity 5x minus 4. All right, for the next one, I have 5n squared minus 32n minus 21. So again, two integers whose product is 5 times negative 21 or negative 105 and whose sum is negative 32. So if I think about the factors of positive 105, I've got 1 times 105. It's not divisible by 2. 1 plus 0 plus 5 is 6. It's divisible by 3. It's 3 times 35. That would work if we played with the signs, right? If I did negative 35 and positive 3. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll have negative 35 and positive 3. So we'll say this is equal to 5n squared, then minus 35n, then plus 3n, then minus 21. Okay, so now I can factor by grouping. In this first group, I have a 5n, and in the second group, I have a 3. So if I pull those out, what am I going to have? I'll have 5n times n minus 7, and then plus, if I pull out a 3, I'll have n minus 7. So if I factor out the common binomial factor here of n minus 7, I'm going to end up with 5n plus 3 times n minus 7. So that's the factored form here. So 5n plus 3, let me erase all this, again, times n minus 7. So let me erase everything here. And again, if you want, you can check. It's always nice to check. So 5n times n is 5n squared. 5n times negative 7 is negative 35n. 3 times n is plus 3n. So negative 35n plus 3n is negative 32n. And then 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. So you get 5n squared minus 32n minus 21 back. And so we've correctly factored this, again, the quantity 5n plus 3 times the quantity n minus 7. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 24x squared minus 18xy minus 27y squared. The first thing I notice here is that there's a common factor of 3. So let's pull that out to start. So 3 times, we'd have 8x squared minus 6xy minus 9y squared. Now the next thing, you have to remember that if you have two variables involved with this setup here, you're going to treat one of them kind of like as if there were a constant. So in other words, when I go to get my AC, I'm going to multiply 8 times this negative 9y squared, the whole thing. So that would be negative 72y squared. And then for my B term, I'm looking at negative 6y. So I'm treating that y as if it was part of the coefficient of x. Right? I'm just treating it like that. I know it's a variable, but I'm treating it like it's a coefficient. What two integers, we know the variable part, what two integers would multiply together to give us negative 72 and sum to negative 6? The variable part will just be y. y times y give you y squared. That's kind of obvious. So if I think about the factors of 72, I've got 1 times 72. 
I've got 2 times 36. I've got 3 times 24. I've got 4 times 18. I've got 6 times 12. Now, 6 and 12 I can make work if I had negative 12 and positive 6. So if I had negative 12y and positive 6y, that would work. They multiply together to give me negative 72y squared, and they sum to negative 6y. So that's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to rewrite this middle part here. Let me kind of erase this. I'm going to rewrite this middle part. 3 times 8x squared minus 12xy plus 6xy. Again, if I sum those two amounts together, I get this back, minus 9y squared. So I'm just going to use my factoring by grouping. And I'm just going to do that down here. So if I had 8x squared minus 12xy, what could I pull out of there? I could pull out a 4x. And then if I had plus 6xy minus 9y squared, what could I pull out of that? Well, I could pull out a 3y. So what this would give me here, I would have 4x times, I would have 2x minus, if I pulled a 4x out from that, I'd have 3y. And then from over here, I'd have plus, 3y would get pulled out, so I would have 2x minus 3y. So we have a common binomial factor of 2x minus 3y, so if we pull this guy out, you'd have 4x plus 3y times 2x minus 3y. So let's go ahead and rewrite all this. So this equals, again, we have the 3 out in front, and then in the parentheses we have 4x plus 3y, and then times, in another set of parentheses, 2x minus 3y. And again, if you want to check this, 4x times 2x is 8x squared. So that gives me that back. 4x times negative 3y is negative 12xy. So that gives me that back. 3y times 2x is going to give me 6xy. It gives me that back. You combine like terms there, you're going to get that, negative 6xy. And then 3y times negative 3y is negative 9y squared. Again, if you take this, which is what I just got, multiply it by 3, you're going to get 24x squared minus 18xy minus 27y squared. All right, now let's factor using reverse FOIL. All right, so we have 5x squared minus 37x minus 24. So reverse FOIL. So I set up my parentheses here. I have a prime number here that's the coefficient for x squared. So it's going to make it a little easier for me. So let's begin with 5x and x. And then I know I have negative 24 here. So this times this has to give me negative 24. So what are the possibilities for that? Well, we have 1 times 24. We have 2 times 12. We have 3 times 8. We have 4 times 6. No other factors for 24. Now, when you consider the fact that this is negative, you've got to alternate all the signs. So this could be negative 1 times 24, or it could be 1 times negative 24. It could be negative 2 times 12, or it could be 2 times negative 12. It could be negative 3 times 8, or it could be 3 times negative 8. It could be negative 4 times 6, or it could be 4 times negative 6. So all these different possibilities. So we can kind of think about, okay, 5 times something plus 1 times something would have to be equal to negative 37, right? So let's just consider the number parts. So if I did negative 1 and positive 24, or if I did the reverse of that, 24 and negative 1, would that work? Well, this would be negative 5, and this would be 24. So that's not going to work. This would be 120, and this would be negative 1. So you can eliminate this. That's not going to work. All right, now let's reverse that and use different signs. Didn't mean to erase that. So if I use different signs here, so this is negative, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive. So 5 times 1 is 5. 1 times negative 24 is negative 24. So 5 plus negative 24 is negative 19. That's not going to work. 5 times negative 24 is negative 120. 1 times 1 is 1. That's not going to work. So this is eliminated. So now let's try 5 times negative 2 
and 1 times 12. Then we could reverse that and put 12 here and negative 2 here. And let's do the other scenarios. Kind of speed this along. So I would flip that and say positive 2, negative 12, and negative 12, positive 2. So this would be negative 10, and this would be 12. So that's not going to work. This would be 60 and negative 2. That's not going to work. This would be 10 and negative 12. Not going to work. This would be negative 60, and this would be 2. So none of these scenarios would work, so we can just line this all out. Let's erase all this. Okay, so now I'm looking at negative 3, positive 8, or 8 and negative 3. And I could flip that around and say I'm looking at positive 3 and negative 8, or negative 8 and positive 3. So this is negative 15, and this is 8. That's not going to work. So 5 times 8 would give me 40. 1 times negative 3 would be negative 3. Now, this would work if the signs were reversed. So in this scenario, 5 times negative 8 is negative 40. 1 times 3 is 3. That would give me negative 37. So that's going to be my winner, right? So 5 needs to be multiplied by negative 8. So negative 8 needs to be over here. And then 1 needs to be multiplied by 3. So 1 is here. 3 will go here. And that will give me the winning combination. So I can erase all this now. All right, so now I can check it. 5x times x is 5x squared. The outer, 5x times negative 8 is minus 40x. The inner, 3 times x is plus 3x. And the last, 3 times negative 8 is negative 24. So these would combine to be 5x squared minus 37x minus 24, which is exactly what we start with right there. All right, let's look at one more. So we have 8r squared minus 2r minus 10. And I'm going to go ahead and just pull the 2 out to begin. So that would be 4r squared minus r minus 5. All right, so let's go ahead and just set this up. And now, what are we thinking about? We're just thinking about this 4r squared minus r minus 5. So what could give me 4r squared? Well, the first thing I would think about is 2r times 2r. And then what could give me negative 5? Well, basically just 5 and 1. So different possibilities of that. So I could do times 5 times negative 1. Or I could do times negative 5. And I could do times positive 1. And that's basically it. So 2 times 5 is 10. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. That's not going to combine to give me negative 1. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. 2 times 1 is 2. Again, not going to combine to give me negative 1. So that's not going to work. Let's try 4r times r. So 4 times 5 is 20. And then 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. So that's not going to work. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. And then 1 times 1 is 1. So that neither one of those would work. But we could switch the order around. So we could do 4r times negative 1. And we could do r times 5. Would that get me anywhere? 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, and then 1 times 5 is 5. If I did the reverse of that, so in other words, if I did 4r times 1, and I did r times negative 5, that would work, right? Because 1 times negative 5 is negative 5, and 4 times 1 is 4. 4 plus negative 5 is negative 1. So that's what I'm looking for right there. So let me erase all the rest of this. All right, so I want... 4r, and I want r, and I want 4r to be multiplied by 1. So this is going to be plus 1, and I want 1r, or r, to be multiplied by negative 5. So this is minus 5, and let's go through and crank this out. So 4r times r is 4r squared. 4r times 1 is plus 4r. Negative 5 times r is minus 5r, and then negative 5 times 1 is minus 5. If I combine like terms here, I would get 4r squared minus r minus 5. That's exactly what I have right there. If I just multiply by 2, I'm going to get back to 8r squared minus 2r minus 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. All right, so we want to factor using grouping. All right, so let's take a look at 3a squared minus 28 minus 100. Now, typically, we use a 
to denote the coefficient of the squared variable. So ax squared plus bx plus c. And we'll say in this scenario we want two integers where the product is a times c. In this case, the a is the coefficient on the variable a squared. So it's 3 times negative 100 or negative 300. So we want a product of negative 300 and a sum of b. In this case, that's negative 20. So this is the one we want the product, and we want a sum of negative 20. Okay, so what two integers can we think of that fulfills this requirement? Well, for 300, forget about the negative. You'd have 1 times 300. No way that's going to work. We have 2 times 150. That's still too far away. We have 3 times 100. Not going to work. We have 4 times 75. Not going to work. 5 times 60, not going to work. We have 6 times 50, not going to work. Not divisible by 7, not divisible by 8, not divisible by 9. It is divisible by 10. 10 times 30 is obviously 300. That would work, right, if we get the signs right. If I had a negative 30 and a positive 10. So a negative 30 and a positive 10. So we're going to use that to rewrite this middle term, and then we're going to factor using grouping. So we want... 3a squared minus 30a plus 10a minus 100. Now I'm going to factor this using grouping. So from these first two, I can pull out a 3a. That would leave me with a minus 10. From the second two, I can pull out a 10. So plus 10 times a minus 10. So I have a common binomial factor here of a minus 10. And I could pull that out if I wanted to. And I would get what? I would get a minus 10 times what's left? 3a plus 10. And I've factored this trinomial. I get a minus 10 times 3a plus 10. And you could check it. a times 3a is 3a squared. a times 10 is plus 10a. Negative 10 times 3a is negative 30a. So if you combine like terms there, you get negative 20a. And then negative 10 times 10 is negative 100. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2, on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. All right, so we want to factor using grouping. So we have 15n squared minus 95n plus 100. So the first thing here is that everything is divisible by 5. So let's go ahead and pull that out to start. And so I'd have 3n squared minus 19n plus 20. And now when I look at inside the parentheses, I want to think about 3n squared minus 19n plus 20. I want two integers whose product is 60, right? 3 times 20 is 60, and whose sum is negative 19. So I want the product, again, to be a times c, the coefficient for the squared term times the constant. So that's 60. And then the sum is negative 19. It's the coefficient for the variable that's raised to the first power. So how do I get that? So if I look for factors of 60, and I know they have to end up being negative, let's think about them as positive to start. So 1 times 60, 2 times 30, 4 times 20, 5 times 12. None of those are going to work. So if I think about factors of 60, and I know in the end they have to both be negative, so I can have a negative sum and a positive product. 1 times 60... I've got 2 times 30, and I've got 3 times 20, then we'd have 4 and 15. Well, if I get the signs right, that would work, right? Negative 4 and negative 15 would give me a sum of negative 19 and a product of positive 60. So we're going to use that to rewrite our middle term. Okay, so we're going to have 5 times inside here, 3n squared minus 15n minus 4n plus 20. This is equal to, now I'm going to use factoring by grouping, so 5 times, from this first group, the 3n squared minus 15n, I can pull out a 3n. So what's left in there is an n minus 5. In the second group, I can pull out a negative 4. That's going to leave me with n minus 5. So my common binomial factor is n minus 5. And if I factor that guy out, what am I going to have? I'm going to have 5 times 
n minus 5 times 3n minus 4. And we could check it if you want. n times 3n is 3n squared. That's that. n times negative 4 is negative 4n. Negative 5 times 3n is negative 15n. So negative 15n minus 4n is negative 19n. So that's that. And then negative 5 times negative 4 is 20. So that's that. So if I take this and I multiply it by 5, I get back to this. 15n squared minus 95n plus 100. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. All right, so we want to factor using grouping. So we have 18b squared plus 15b minus 12. So the first thing you should notice is that everything is divisible by 3. So let's pull that out to start. So we would have 6b squared plus 5b minus 4. So if I'm trying to factor the inside here, just think about 6b squared plus 5b minus 4. Again, I want two integers whose product is 6 times negative 4 or negative 24 and whose sum is 5. So this would be the product and this would be the sum. So what are the factors of 24? Well, you got 1 and 24, you've got 2 and 12, you've got 3 and 8. Now, 3 and 8 looks like that I can make that work. If I had a negative 3 and a positive 8, that would give me what I need. So let's use that, and we're going to rewrite the middle term here. So we're going to write this. Let me kind of erase all this, and I'm going to include this 3 that's outside now. We're going to write this as 6b squared plus 8b minus 3b minus 4. And because we're factoring by grouping here, we might need to rearrange this. But let's see if we can make it work as it is. So let's put equals 3 times. In the first group, I can pull out a 2b. So 2b. That would leave me with 3b plus 4. Now, in the second group, if I pull out a negative 1, I'll get exactly 3b plus 4. So I have a common binomial factor of 3b plus 4. And if I pull that guy out, what I'm going to have is 3 times 3b plus 4 times 2b minus 1. So that's exactly my factor form. And again, if you want to check this, 3b times 2b is 6b squared. 3b times negative 1 is negative 3b. 4 times 2b is plus 8b. So if you combine like terms there, you get 5b. And then 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. So this right here gives me this back. If I multiplied by 3, I would go back to this, 18b squared plus 15b minus 12. So we see that we have the correct factored form 3 times the quantity 3b plus 4 times the quantity 2b minus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. All right, so we want to factor using reverse FOIL. And we have 8k squared minus 42k plus 10. And the first thing we should notice here is that everything's divisible by 2. So I can just pull that out. So I'd have a 2 out here, and then 4k squared minus 21k plus 5. So I'm just trying to factor the inside here now. So let's set this up as 2 times... And I'll set up my parentheses for my two binomials. Now, if I'm thinking about 4k squared, I could do 2k times 2k. So then when I look at this plus 5 here, think about the factors for 5 now. You've got 1 and 5, and you've got negative 1 and negative 5. Now, if I did 2k times positive 5, and I did 2k times positive 1, why would that be a problem? Well, I'm never going to get a middle term that's negative. So I've got to think about the other possibility, which is both of these being negative, right? Negative times negative is positive. So if I did this, I'd get negative 10k. And if I did this, I'd get negative 2k. But that's not going to work because I need negative 21k. So what else could I try? Well, I could erase this and I could try 4k and I could try k. Right, 4k times k is 4k squared. So if I did 4k times negative 5, I'd get negative 20k. If I did k times negative 1, 
I'd get negative K and that would work, right? I'd have negative 20K plus negative K, that's negative 21K. And so let's write out, let's do 4K and let's do K. And remember 4K is being multiplied by negative five. So it's gotta go over here because the outer terms get multiplied. And then K is being multiplied by negative one. So that's gonna go right here because the inner terms get multiplied. And then of course, if you wanna check it, if you wanna check it, 4K times K is 4K squared. 4K times negative five is minus 20K. Negative one times K is minus K. And then negative one times negative five is plus five. So if I combine like terms here, I would get 4K squared minus 21K plus five, which is exactly what I have right there. If I multiplied by two, right, I have that two out in front, I would get back to this, 8K squared minus 42K plus 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on factoring trinomials with a leading coefficient that is not equal to 1. All right, we want to factor using grouping. So we have 54x squared minus 336xy plus 72y squared. So the first thing you should notice is that everything is divisible by 2, but also it's divisible by 3, right? 5 plus 4 is 9, 3 plus 3 is 6, 6 plus 6 is 12, 7 plus 2 is 9. So everything's also divisible by 3. Remember, if something's divisible by 2 and also divisible by 3, it's divisible by 6. So that's what we can pull out. So 54 would be 9 times 6, so this would be 9x squared. 336 is 56 times 6, so 56xy. And then 72 is 12 times 6, so 12y squared. Now, once we've done that, we just proceed in the normal way. So I'm just thinking about what's inside the parentheses now. So I want two integers whose product is nine, the coefficient of x squared, times this term right here. We have a y squared there. We're gonna include the whole thing. So nine times 12 is 108. And then you have the y squared. And then the sum has gotta be negative 56, exclude the x, you'd have y. So negative 56 y. So give me two terms whose sum is negative 56 y and whose product is 108 y squared. So if I think about 108, I know I have one times 108, that's not gonna work. I have two times 54. I could make that work with the signs. If I did negative two and negative 54, that would work. So I just gotta remember to include the y. So I would have, let's put equals, six times, remember I'm gonna rewrite this middle term. So nine x squared minus, I'm gonna do 54 x y, and then minus, I'm gonna do two x y, and then plus 12y squared. Let's erase this real quick. All right. So now, if I look to factor by grouping inside, the 9x squared and the 54xy, I could pull out a 9x. So that would leave me with x minus 6y. From here, if I wanted to, I could pull out a negative 2y. And that's going to leave me with an x minus 6y. You can see I have a common binomial factor here of x minus 6y. And so if I factor that guy out, I'm going to have 6 times 9x minus 2y times x minus 6y. Just that simple. And if you want to check this, just go ahead and do FOIL on this. And then once you're done, multiply everything by 6 and you'll get back to 54x squared minus 336xy plus 72y squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set 41. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on special factoring rules. All right, so we wanna factor, and we start out with r squared minus 25. So remember, if we have something where we have a square and a square, so we have r squared, that's r times r, and then 25 is five times five. So we can do this as the difference of two squares, right? So recall that formula is if you see something like x squared minus y squared, you can factor this into what's squared here. So the x is squared. So x goes here and it goes here. So it goes in the first position of each. And then the second thing that's squared goes in the second position of each. 
and then you just alternate your signs. You have a plus and a minus. And we know from our special products formulas that this goes back to this, right? Because the first two, x times x is x squared, the outer and the inner would cancel, right? You'd have minus xy and then plus xy. And then the last, y times negative y is negative y squared. So using that same kind of format, I'm going to set this up. I know my signs are different. So the first thing that's squared, which is r, goes in the first position of each. The second thing that's squared, which is 5, right? We could think about this as 5 squared, like this, is going to go in the second position of each. So I get the quantity r plus 5 times the quantity r minus 5. If I multiply these two together using FOIL, I would get r squared minus 25. What about b squared minus 1? Well, it's the same thing. I have something that's squared, so b is squared, and then I have 1. I can think of this as 1 squared is equal to 1, right? 1 times 1 is 1. So I could write this as, again, using that formula, the signs are going to alternate. The first thing that's squared goes in the first position of each. So b goes here and here. The second thing that's squared goes in the second position of each. So I can factor this as b plus 1, that quantity, times the quantity b minus 1. So let's take a look at 50b squared minus 32. So you might look at these and say, well, what integer multiplied by itself would be 32? Well, I can't think of one, so this is not the difference of two squares. Well, you'd be wrong. The reason you could still use it is we have a common factor of 2 that we can still pull out. So if I did that, I would have 25, which we know is 5 times 5, b squared minus 16, which we know is 4 times 4. So now we can use the difference of two squares to factor what's inside the parentheses. We have 2 times 25b squared. We know that's 5b, that amount squared. So I'm going to write 5b in my first position of each. The signs would be different. And then for 16, we know that's 4 squared. So I'm going to put 4 here and here. And so we end up with 2 times the quantity 5b plus 4 times the quantity 5b minus 4. All right, so let's take a look at another one. So we have 18v squared plus 24v plus 8. So this is obviously not the difference of two squares. It must be something else. Now, remember, we have something that looks like this. If we have x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, this can be factored into x plus y, that quantity squared. Right? We saw this when we used our special products formulas. We have the first guy here that's squared plus 2 times x times y, the first position times the second position, and then plus the last guy, which is y squared. So to think about using this formula, the first thing I would look at is this and this, and I would see if they were squares. Now, 8, I can't think of any integer that would multiply by itself to give me 8. Same thing with 18. One thing I would notice right away is everything's divisible by 2. So let's pull that out first and see if that gets us somewhere. If I pull it out, I'd have 9v squared plus 12v plus 4. Now we can see that we do have something that matches this. So 9v squared is 3v squared, and then 4 is 2 squared. So all I need to check is that this middle term is 2 times what's being squared in the first position times what's being squared in the last position. So 2xy here. Here it will be 2 times 3v times 2 should give me 12v. So 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 2 is 12. v comes along for the ride, so we do get 12v there. So I can go ahead and factor this using this formula. 2 goes out in front, and then whatever's in the first position that was squared, so that's 3v in this case, plus whatever's in the second position that's squared, that's 2 in this case, and then we square this guy. So we have 2 times the quantity, 3v plus 2, and that's squared. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 16a squared plus 80a plus 100. So I'm going to show you one of the mistakes you might make if you do something like this. So the thing we notice right away is, okay, 16a squared, I could write this as 4a, that squared. 100, I could write that as 10 squared. So you can kind of use that formula if you want to because 2 times 10 is 20. 20 times 4a is 80a. So everything checks out. So we can go ahead and say, okay, the first thing, which is 4a, that first thing that was squared, 
plus the last thing that squared, which is 10, and then that quantity squared. Now, if I was to turn this in, and I would say this is factored, would it be correct? Well, no, it wouldn't be because forget about the squared here. Let's write this as 4a plus 10 times 4a plus 10. If I look at this binomial here and here, there's additional stuff that I can pull out. 4 and 10 are both divisible by 2. So really, I'd have to pull a 2 out from each one. So if I did that, what would happen is this would be 2a and this would be a 5. The 2 would go out here. This would be a 2a and this would be a 5. And that 2 would get multiplied by this 2 and give me a 4. So I would have 4 times the quantity 2a plus 5 times the quantity 2a plus 5 or 4 times the quantity 2a plus 5 squared. Now, let me show you how you could have also gotten that with less work. Again, when you first start a problem, I want you to look to see, can I pull anything out? Is there anything common? Well, yeah, there's a 4 that's common to begin with. So this is going to save me time. Pull out the 4. I'll have 4a squared plus 20a plus 25. And now I would check it again. I would say, okay, well, if this is 2a that amount squared, and this is 5 squared, so they're both squares, the next thing I want to do is see if that middle term is 2 times the first thing squared times the last thing squared. So 2 times 2a is 4a, 4a times 5 is 20a, which is my middle term, so everything checks out. So I can go ahead and write it as 4 times, we'll have this guy, the first thing that's squared, plus the last guy that's squared, and this whole quantity is squared, and this is exactly what I got here, but look how much faster it was, right? You don't want to ever have to do additional factoring because you leave yourself open to get the wrong answer on a test. You might just forget to do it. All right, so let's take a look at 150n squared minus 60n plus 6. So I have a minus sign here, so this follows the format of what? This is the x minus y, that quantity squared. Remember, this turns into x squared minus... We got the minus there, 2 times x times y, then plus y squared. So it's the same thing, you just have that minus sign instead of the plus. So the first thing I notice in this, other than the fact that it's got a minus sign, everything's divisible by 2, right? They're all even numbers. So if everything's divisible by 2, and also it looks like everything is divisible by 3. 1 plus 5 plus 0 is 6, 6 plus 0 is 6, and then 6. So Everything's divisible by 6, and that's because everything is divisible by 2 and 3. So if I took a 6 out to start, 150 divided by 6 is 25, then n squared, then minus 60 divided by 6 is 10, then n, then plus 6 over 6 is 1. Okay, so we look at this now, and we see that, okay, 25n squared, yeah, that's 5n, that amount squared. 1 is 1 squared. So if I look at this also, I want to check the middle term. So is it 2 times this, which is 5n, times this? 2 times 5n is 10n, and then 10n times 1 is 10n. So yes, that checks out. Now, with the sign being here, remember, when I use my formula, that sign in the middle is going to be negative. So I'm going to have my 6 out in front. Let me just kind of scooch that down a little bit. And the first guy is going to be what's squared first. So that's 5n. And then the second guy is what's squared last. So that's 1. And then this quantity here is squared. So 6 times the quantity 5n minus 1. And then that is squared. Okay, let's take a look at 125x squared plus 216x to the fifth power. So I noticed that x squared is common to both. So let's just go ahead and pull that out to start. So I would have x squared times 125 plus 216x cubed. So this is the sum of two cubes, right? Because this right here is 5 cubed. And this right here, 216 is 6 cubed. And x cubed is obviously x times x times x. So I could put 6x, that amount cubed. The formula, if you have the sum of cubes, so x cubed plus y cubed. Remember, the first signs you deal with are the same. So x plus y. Then you have x squared. The next time you think about signs, they're going to be different. So this one's going to be a minus, then xy, then plus y squared. Remember, this one's always plus. So the only two signs you have to think about, this one's the same, 
this one's different. Okay, that's always going to be the case. So when we set this up, let's put equals. We'll put our x squared here. And then we'll put our two sets of parentheses. Let's go ahead and just get the signs. So we know that this one's going to be plus. It's the same. This one's going to be minus, And this one's going to be plus. Let me kind of drag this out a little further. And so let's put our terms in now. So it's x and y. Here we're representing that with 5 and 6x. So 5 would go here and 6x would go here. And then here we'd have 5 squared, and we'd have 5 times 6x, that's 30x. And then we'd have 6x squared, which would be 36x squared. So we'd write this as x squared. And if you want, you can change the order around so that the polynomials inside are in standard form. That's fine. You would have 6x plus 5 times, you could flip the order around on this, 36x squared minus 30x plus 25. Right, 5 squared is 25. So close parentheses there, and you're done. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Special Factoring Rules. All right, so we want to factor. We're going to take a look at x squared minus 25. So at this point, you should realize that this is the difference of two squares. Right, so x squared, we just think about it as x times x. That's, again, just x squared. And then 25 is what? That's 5 squared. So to factor this, we use our formula. So we set this up into the product of two binomials. And we have different signs. We have a plus and a minus. And then whatever squared in the first position, in this case, that's x. We have x squared. That goes here and here. And then whatever squared in the second position, in this case, that's 5, goes here and here. So we get the quantity x plus 5 times the quantity x minus 5. And the reason this works out for us is because if we did FOIL, the outer, which would be negative 5x, plus the inner, which would be 5x, would cancel. So we're just left with the first terms and the last terms from FOIL, right? x times x is x squared. Then 5 times negative 5 is negative 25. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have x squared minus 100. So it's the same thing. We have the difference of two squares. This is x squared, and 100 is 10 squared. So we can write this out. Again, set up your parentheses here. You know you have plus and minus for the signs. Whatever is squared first goes here and here. Right? We have x squared, so it goes here and here. It's the first position of each. Then whatever is squared second, in this case that's 10, goes in the second position of each. So here and here. And again, we have x times x, that's x squared. The outer, negative 10x, and the inner, plus 10x, would cancel. And then the last, positive 10 times negative 10, would give me negative 100. All right, let's take a look at one more. We have p squared minus 1. So I know this is the difference of two squares. I have p that's squared, and I have 1 that's squared. 1 times 1 is 1. So again, I can set this up in my sleep at this point. I have my two sets of parentheses. I have a plus and a minus. So what's squared first, which is p, it's going to go here and here, first position of each. What squared second is going to go here and here, right? That's 1. So that goes here and here. And so we get the quantity p plus 1 times the quantity p minus 1. Again, the first terms, p times p, would give me p squared. The outer, negative p, and the inner, plus p, would cancel. And then the last, 1 times negative 1, would be negative 1. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Special Factoring Rules. All right, so here we have 8n cubed minus 18n. So when I first look at this, I see the 3, and I ask myself, do I have the difference of two cubes? Well, no, I don't, because there's not a cubed over here. So then I think, okay, well, do I have the difference of two squares? Well, nothing is squared from what I can see, but I notice that I have an n here and an n here. I know it's n cubed, but they both share an n. So I can pull that out. I can pull that out. They're also both even numbers, so I can pull out a 2. And what I get is 4n squared minus 9. Now what's inside of parentheses is the difference of two squares. I can see that 4n squared would be 2n, that amount squared, and 9 is obviously 3 squared. So I can use my formula for this. Make sure to write the 2n out in front. Don't forget about that. And then I'll set up my parentheses. I'll have a plus and a minus. So whatever is squared first, that's 2n in this case, goes in the first position of each. 
Whatever squared second, that's three in this case, goes in the second position of each. So I get 2n times the quantity 2n plus 3 times the quantity 2n minus 3. And again, if you want to check this, just use your FOIL. So your first terms, 2n times 2n, would be 4n squared. That's what you have there. Your outer and your inner would cancel. You'd have negative 6n and plus 6n. That would cancel. And your last, 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. So you get 4n squared minus 9. Then if you multiply it by 2n, you'd get this back. 8n cubed minus 18n. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 3x squared plus 36x plus 108. So this looks like we have something of this format. Remember, if we see x plus y, that quantity squared, this turns into x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. We refer to this as a perfect square trinomial, right? So is this a perfect square trinomial? Well, for that to occur, you check the two on the end first. Is this a square and is this a square? Well, three is a prime number. The only thing I can really do to get three is one times three. Really all I'm thinking about here is, all right, if that's not a square, could I pull anything out of everything to where it turns into that? Well, everything's divisible by three here. So let's pull that out and we get what? We get x squared, which is a square, plus 12x plus 108 divided by three is gonna be 36 which is also a square, right? It's six squared. So now we have something we can work with. So we have three times, inside of parentheses, x squared plus 12x plus 36. So once you've verified that this is a square and this is a square, then you need to look at the middle term. So is the middle term two times, what would it take to get this squared? It would be x, so two times x times what it would take to get this squared, so two times x times six. So 2 times 6 is 12, 12 times x is 12x, so that checks out. So we can write it using this formula. So we'll have a 3 out in front, and then we'll have the x, because that's what's squared first, plus the last guy that was squared, so 6 is squared, so the plus 6, and this is squared. So 3 times the quantity, x plus 6 squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on Special Factoring Rules. All right, so we want to factor... We're going to take a look at 49r squared minus 84r plus 36. So the first thing I'm thinking about is, is this a perfect square trinomial? So are these positions here squares? So this is 7r squared, and this is 6 squared. So that checks out. Then if I took 2 and multiplied it by 7r times 6, would I get 84r? 2 times 6 is 12, 12 times 7 is 84, and then r would come along for the ride, so that would be 84r. So then I can follow this format here. Remember, if I have x minus y, that quantity squared, this is x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. So I'm taking this and going this way. That's what I'm doing here. So I'm going to take this. So whatever is squared in the first position, that's 7r here, is going to go here, so that's 7r, then minus whatever squared in the last position, so here that 6, is going to go here. So I'd have 7r minus 6, that quantity, would be squared. All right, let's take a look at 196n to the fourth power plus 56n cubed plus 4n squared. So the first thing I notice is that I have n squared, n cubed, and n to the fourth power. So I could pull out an n squared, and everything is also divisible by 4. So I could pull out, before I even begin, a 4n squared. So 196 divided by 4 is 49, so this would be 49. And then n to the 4th over n squared is n squared. 56 divided by 4 is 14, so that would be plus 14. n cubed over n squared is n. And then plus 4n squared over 4n squared is 1. So is this inside of the parentheses a perfect square trinomial? Again, you got to start out by looking at the n points. So 49n squared, that's 7n that amount squared, and then 1 would be 1 squared. So yeah, that checks out. Then i got to take 2 and multiply it by 7n, that's 14n, and then by 1, that's still 14n, so that part checks out. So I can factor this as, remember, if I have x plus y, that quantity squared, this is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. At this point, you should be able to do that in your sleep. So I want to reverse that and go this way. So I'll have my 4n squared out in front, and I'm just looking at, okay, whatever squared here in the first position 
That's going to go there. So 7n is what's squared here to give me 49n squared. So that's going to go here, 7n, then plus. In my last position, it's whatever was squared in the final position. Here that's 1. 1 was squared to give me 1. So that's going to go right there. And then this quantity is squared. So you get 4n squared times the quantity 7n plus 1 squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on special factoring rules. All right, so we want to factor, and we're taking a look at 7b squared minus 70b plus 175. So when I look at my endpoints here, that's what I always want to check to see if I have a perfect squared trinomial. I don't see anything, well, I know b squared is a square, but 7, I can't think of any integer that multiplies by itself to give me 7. So I might be tempted to say this is prime, but I notice something right away. This is 7. This is 70. I know that's divisible by 7. Is 175 divisible by 7? Yeah, it is. It's 25 times 7. So I could factor a 7 out, and I'd have b squared minus 10b plus 25. And look, the inside now is a perfect squared trinomial. You look at your endpoints. This is a square, and this is a square, right? This is 5 squared. I could write this as b squared. The only other thing to check is that middle term. So is 2 times b times 5 going to give me 10b? Well, yeah, it does. 2 times 5 is 10. 10 times b is 10b. So now I can factor it using that formula that we all learned. Again, if I have x minus y, that quantity squared, it's x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. So all I need to do is reverse that. So this would be equal to, I've got a 7 out in front. Don't forget that. And then I've got a set of parentheses. And don't forget that this is going to be a minus. I'm going to put my minus there, and it's going to be squared. So what goes here and here? Well, the first thing that it took to make a square. So b squared is composed of b times b. So I want b, right? Because b times b would give me b squared. And then what gave me 25? Well, it was 5 squared. So 5 is going to go here. And I'm done. So 7 times the quantity, b minus 5 squared. All right, let's take a look at 216u cubed plus 1. So is this the sum of two cubes? Well, yes, it is. If I think about 216, it's 6 cubed. 6 times 6 is 36. 36 times 6 is 216. And then u cubed is obviously a perfect cube. So we'll write this as 6u cubed. And then for 1, 1 cubed is obviously still 1. So to set this up, remember, if I looked at something that looks like this, x cubed plus y cubed. Remember, it's x, the first sign is the same, so plus y times x squared. The next sign you think about is opposite, so this is plus, this is minus. So then xy, and then this one's always plus, and then y squared. So for this one, I'm going to have 6u, 6u in the first position, Remember, the sign is always the same to start, and then plus 1, and then times, you're going to have 6u, that amount, squared now. Okay, this x, which is what is cubed here, is squared. So if I squared 6u, I would get 36u squared. So let's write that, 36u squared, and then minus. Remember, my signs are going to alternate there. The first one is the same, the next one I think about is different. Now, what's going to come? It's x times y. So it's whatever this is that's cubed times whatever this is that's cubed. So 6u times 1 is just 6u. And then this sign is always plus. And then it's going to be whatever's in this position that's cubed is going to be squared now. So 1 squared is just 1. So my answer here is the quantity 6u plus 1 times the quantity 36u squared minus 6u plus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on special factoring rules. All right, so we want to factor. We're start by taking a look at 375x minus 24x to the fourth power. So what can we do here? I don't see anything that stands out right away other than the fact that each has an x that's common. Is anything else common? Well, 3 plus 7 is 10, 10 plus 5 is 15, 2 plus 4 is 6, so they're each divisible by 3. So let's pull out a 3x, and 375 divided by 3 is 125. 
x over x is 1. So it would be 125 minus 24 divided by 3 is 8. x to the fourth over x is x cubed. So now I can see I have the difference of two cubes. And what I want to do here, again, if I have x cubed minus y cubed, this sets up to what? The first sign is the same, so x minus y. Then we'll have x squared. The next sign I think about is different, so that's a plus. So then x, y, and then this one's always a plus, and then y squared. So if I think about what makes up 125, it's 5 times 5 times 5, so it's 5 cubed. And then 8, I know that's 2 cubed, and x cubed is x times x times x. So 2x, that's cubed. So let's use this information to set this up. We're going to have 3x out in front. And then we know we're going to have a minus here, right? It's the same sign as we start with. And then we're going to have a plus and a plus. Okay, so let's fill in the blanks. So whatever is cubed first, so that's 5, is going to go here. It's going to go here and be squared. 5 squared is 25. And it's going to be multiplied by this guy, the 2x. So that would be 10x. Then whatever goes in the second position that's cubed, that's 2x, is going to go here. And it's also going to go here and it's going to be squared. 2 squared is 4. x squared is x squared. So this would be plus 4x squared. So we're looking at 3x times the quantity 5 minus 2x times the quantity 25 plus 10x plus 4x squared. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 125nx to the 6th power plus 64ny to the 6th power. So what can we pull out here to start? This is prime factorization of 5 cubed. This right here would be 2 to the 6th power. So no numbers, only a variable of n. So let's pull n out. And I'd have 125x to the 6th power plus 64y to the 6th power. And so these are perfect cubes, right? This is 5x squared. If I cubed this, remember, 5 cubed is 125. x squared cubed keeps x the same. Multiply exponents. 2 times 3 is 6. And then this right here, 64 is 4 cubed y to the sixth power, just like over here, would be y squared, that amount cubed. So if I had 4y squared, that cubed, I would get 64y to the sixth power. So let's set up our formula here. If we have x cubed plus y cubed, this is the sum of two cubes. This is x plus y. Remember, the sign is the same to start. Then x squared, this one's going to be different, so it's minus, and xy and plus y squared. This one's always plus. So following this format, I have an n out in front, and then I have in this position, let me just set up the parentheses, I have a plus, a minus, and a plus. I've dealt with my signs. So in this position, I have whatever was cubed first, that's 5x squared. Then in this position, whatever was cubed second, so 4y squared. Then in this position, I have Whatever was cubed first, I'm going to square it. 5 squared is 25. x squared is x to the fourth power. Then minus. We have x times y. So we have this guy, whatever was cubed, times this guy, whatever was cubed. 5 times 4 is 20. And then x squared times y squared is x squared y squared. So x squared y squared. And this is plus. Let me kind of move these down a little bit. Just move them over. So then close my parentheses over here. For the last one, I'm looking for y squared. So it's this last thing that was cubed is going to be squared. So 4y squared will be squared. 4 squared is 16. y squared is y to the fourth power. So we have n times the quantity 5x squared plus 4y squared times the quantity 25x to the fourth power minus 20x squared y squared plus 16y to the fourth power. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 42. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving quadratic equations by factoring. All right, so we want to solve each quadratic equation by factoring. So we're going to start by looking at k squared minus 5k plus 4 equals 0. So when we start out, we always make sure that this is in standard form. So again, that's ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. 
That's exactly what we have here. We have our squared variable, we have our variable to the first power, and then kind of our constant, and it's equal to zero. So this matches this format. And so once we have that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna factor the left side. We have a trinomial here. We're gonna factor this into the product of two binomials. We're gonna set that equal to zero. So I know I'll have k here and k here. I'm just gonna fill in the blanks here and here. So give me two integers whose product is four and whose sum is negative five. Well, because the signs are different, I've gotta think about, okay, if I'm gonna have a product that's positive, and a sum that's negative, I'm working with two negatives. Because negative times negative is positive, negative plus negative is negative. So then, if I think about the factors of four, it could be one and four, or because we're thinking about negatives, it'd be negative one and negative four, and that would work. Right, you could also do negative two and negative two, but that wouldn't work, because negative two plus negative two would be negative four, we need negative five. So negative one and negative four, again, negative one times negative four, is positive four, negative one plus negative four is negative five. So once we've factored this into the product of two binomials, we use our zero product property. Remember, if you have something like AB is equal to zero, then it must be true that A is equal to zero, or you could say B is equal to zero, or A and B, are both equal to zero, right? Either one of these is zero, because zero times anything is zero, or both are zero. So we're gonna apply that same logic here. We have these two factors that are being multiplied together. The quantity k minus one, so we're gonna set that equal to zero. And then the quantity k minus four, so we're gonna set that equal to zero. So we can add one to both sides here. I'd get k is equal to one. I'd add four to both sides of the equation here. I'd get k is equal to four. So we get that k is equal to one, or k is equal to four. And we're gonna check each of these in the original equation and see if those solutions are valid. So if I plug in a one for k, I would have one squared minus five times one plus four equals zero. 1 squared is 1, so I'd have 1 minus 5, that is negative 4, and then plus 4 would be 0, so you'd get 0 equals 0, so yeah, this one checks out. Then also I would check k equals 4, so k equals 4, 4 squared is 16, 16 minus 5 times 4 is 20, so 16 minus 20 would be negative 4. So you'd end up with negative four plus four equals zero. So yeah, that, e that is zero equals zero. So this works out as well. So we can say k equals one or k equals four. And I showed you in the lesson a kind of new way to write your solution using a solution set notation. And basically you make some set braces and we'll put one comma four, the two solutions in there kind of close that off. And either way is acceptable. In Algebra 1, we typically will use this. As we get into Algebra 2 and College Algebra, we're typically gonna use this format. What about something like p squared plus three p equals 10? So the first thing I wanna do is put this in standard form. So ax squared plus bx plus c, this equals zero. So my constant term here is on the wrong side of the equal sign, right? I want it on the left, so I need to move it over here and put it behind that 3p. So I would just subtract 10 away from each side. And when I do that, I'm gonna have p squared plus 3p minus 10 is equal to zero. So then I'm gonna factor this left side here, it's a trinomial, I'm gonna factor it into the product of two binomials. So p goes here and p goes here. And I need two integers whose sum is three whose product is negative 10. So that's pretty easy. You could do positive five and negative two, right? Five times negative two is negative 10. Five minus two is three, so that works out. All right, so now we're gonna set each factor here equal to zero. So P plus five, that quantity, that's a factor, right? It's multiplying by the other factor, the quantity P minus two. So this factor is equal to zero or We'll also set this p minus two, that factor equal to zero, and we'll solve for each. So this is minus five here and here, 
and you'll get P is equal to negative five. This is plus two here and then here. So you get P is equal to two. So again, I'll put P is equal to negative five or P is equal to two up here and let's check. Okay, so I'm gonna substitute a negative five in here and here. Remember, if P is squared, I want whatever P is to be squared. P here is negative five. So the negative and the five are squared. So I'm plugging that in. So that's squared plus three times negative five equals 10. Negative five squared is 25. And then plus three times negative five is negative 15. So 25 minus 15 equals 10. So that checks out, 10 equals 10. So this is true. And then I wanna plug in a two also and see what we get. So two squared is four, plus three times two, that's six. Four plus six equals 10, 10 equals 10. So that works out as well. So you get P equals negative five or P equals two. And again, if you wanna write this in solution set notation, you could write negative five comma two. All right, so here we have one that looks kind of challenging. We have three X squared equals 12. So how do I get in this format of AX squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Well, the first thing I could do is I could subtract 12 away from each side. So I have three x squared minus 12 equals zero. Now, does this match this? But one thing I want you to remember is that in the lesson I told you that b could be equal to zero. So I could have three x squared plus zero x minus 12 equals zero. So these two are the same, right? So we just erase that and put it in a simpler format of three X squared minus 12 equals zero. Now, you might be saying, how in the world am I gonna factor this? You wanna think about what you can pull out and just, if you see that three is common and you get a problem like this, go ahead and pull it out to start. So I can say three times X squared minus four and this equals zero. Now, do you remember that this is the difference of two squares? X squared minus four is two squared. So I can write this as three times x plus two times x minus two, and this equals zero. So now I can set each factor that has a variable in it equal to zero. Now three is a factor also, it's three multiplied by the quantity x plus two multiplied by the quantity x minus two. I'm not gonna set three equal to zero, it doesn't have a variable in it, it wouldn't make any sense, right? I need to get my solutions by setting x plus two equal to zero, solving for that unknown x, and then x minus two equal to zero, and solving for that unknown x. So I would subtract two away from each side here, and I would get x is equal to negative two, and I would add two to both sides of the equation here, and I would get x is equal to two. So I would get x equals negative two, or I would get x equals two. Now let's check each of these proposed solutions in the original equation. All right, so what I wanna do here, I wanna do three times, I'm plugging in a negative two for x, and that's gonna be squared, and this should be equal to 12. Negative two squared is four, three times four is 12, so this would work out. And then I would erase this and just put a two, but negative two squared and positive two squared are gonna give me the same result. So I know that this one will work out also, right? Two squared is four, four times three is 12. So x can be negative two or positive two. And again, using solution set notation, negative two comma two inside of those set braces. And so either way you wanna display this, again, x is negative two or x is positive two. All right, for the next one, I have n squared plus four n equals negative four. And so what I wanna do, again, I wanna think about first putting this in standard form. So n squared plus four n, all I'm gonna do is add four to both sides of the equation. So plus four equals zero. And then one of the things you might notice right away before you even think about factoring the left side here, this is a perfect square trinomial. So remember, if you have a perfect square trinomial, you can factor it using that formula. Remember, if I saw something like x squared plus four x plus four, I know that this is equal to x plus two, that quantity squared. So all this is gonna be is n plus two, that quantity squared, and this is equal to zero. So let me erase this real quick. And if you wanted to prove that to yourself, well, you could you could expand this out and use FOIL. N plus two over here equals zero. 
n times n is n squared. Then n times 2 is 2n. 2 times n is 2n. So 2n plus 2n is 4n. And then 2 times 2 is 4. Right? So if you see that and you notice it, use your formula. It's going to speed up your factoring. So now in this particular case, I only have one possible solution. Right? Because I have the same factor that's repeated. I have n plus 2 times n plus 2. Right? Those two quantities being multiplied together. It's only got one potential solution. n plus 2, if I set that equal to 0, well, n is going to equal negative 2. So n here would equal negative 2. That's my only possible solution because I have a duplicate factor. So if I plug in a negative 2 for n, what would I get? So negative 2 squared plus 4 times negative 2 equals negative 4. Negative 2 squared, that quantity, right, I have the negative and the 2, that's 4. So I'd have 4. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8, so minus 8 equals negative 4. Yeah, that's true. 4 minus 8 is negative 4. So you get negative 4 equals negative 4. So yes, this works out. n does equal negative 2. Let's erase this real quick. And even though it's just one single value, you can still use your solution set notation if you just want to start getting comfortable with it. So you can just put negative 2 inside of set braces, and you're done. All right, for the next one, we have p squared is equal to 2p plus 15. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to put this in standard form. So p squared, I'm going to subtract 2p away from each side, so it's going to be minus 2p. And I'm going to subtract 15 away from each side, so it's going to be minus 15. And this will be equal to, since I subtracted away 2p and I subtracted away 15, I'll have a 0 over here. Now, what I want to do next, again, is factor the left side. So p squared minus 2p minus 15. So give me two integers whose sum is negative 2 and whose product is negative 15. So if I think about 15, just forget about the negative for a minute. I've got 1, 15. I've got 3 and 5. Now if I arrange 3 and 5 to where I have negative 5 and positive 3, that would work. So I want positive 3 and negative 5. So now that I've got that situated, all I need to do is take each factor, set it equal to 0. So the quantity p plus 3, so p plus 3, that equals 0. Or p minus 5, that equals 0. I would subtract 3 away from each side of the equation, and I get p is equal to negative 3. Then or, I add 5 to both sides of the equation, I would get p is equal to 5. So p equals negative 3, or p equals 5. All right, so the next thing I want to do is just check the result. So if I plugged in a negative 3 for p, I'd have the quantity negative 3, right? The negative and the 3 would be squared. This would be equal to 2 times negative 3, then plus 15. Negative 3 squared, that is 9. This is equal to 2 times negative 3, that's negative 6. Negative 6 plus 15 is 9. So you get 9 equals 9. So the first one checks out. Then for the next one, we got p equals 5. So let's plug in a 5 here and here. So 5 squared is 25. And this is equal to 2 times 5 is 10. So you get 10 plus 15. So 10 plus 15 is 25. So you get 25 equals 25. So yeah, this works out as well. So this is also a solution. So again, in solution set notation, we could write negative 3 comma 5. And again, p equals negative 3 or p equals 5 is our solution. All right, let's take a look at another one. So again, the first thing I want to do is put this in standard form. So I'm just going to move this over here. So I'm going to subtract 2 away from each side of the equation. So minus 2 and minus 2. So I would have 35x squared minus 75x and then plus 40 equals 0. Now you might notice that everything is divisible by 5. So go ahead and pull that out. So I would have 5 times, inside of parentheses, 7x squared minus 15x plus 8, and this is all going to be equal to 0. So if I factor what's inside of parentheses, what am I going to have? Well, I've got to use the factoring by grouping or the reverse FOIL. So I need two integers whose product is 56 and whose sum is negative 15. So for 56, I've got 1 times 56, I've got 2 times 28, I've got 4 times 14, not divisible by 5 or 6, and I've got 7 times 8. Now, 7 and 8 would work if I made them both negative, because negative 7 plus negative 8 is negative 15. Negative 7 times negative 8 would give me positive 56. 
So that would work. Let's do negative 7. So we'll have 7x squared minus 7x and then negative 8. So then minus 8x and then plus 8. Okay, this equals 0. We're going to use factoring by grouping here. I'm going to have 5 times the quantity. I'll pull a 7x out of the first group. So 7x out in front and then you'll have x minus 1 inside. Out of the second group, I will pull out a negative 8. So minus 8 will give me an x minus 1, and then this equals 0. So then we have 5 times the quantity. You'll have the common binomial of x minus 1. That's going to get pulled out. So you'll have x minus 1 times the quantity 7x minus 8. Okay, this all equals 0. And so using my zero product property, again, I'm not going to set 5 equal to 0. I have three factors here. I have 5, I have the quantity x minus 1, and I have the quantity 7x minus 8. So I'm not going to set 5 equal to 0, but I'm going to set these two factors with variables in it equal to 0. So x minus 1 equals 0, or 7x minus 8 equals 0. So to solve this, I would add 1 to both sides of the equation, and I would get x is equal to 1. To solve this, I would add 8 to both sides of the equation. I would have 7x is equal to 8. And then I would divide both sides of the equation by 7, and I would get x is equal to 8 sevenths. So x equals 1 or x equals 8 sevenths. So we're going to plug a 1 in for x, and we're also going to plug in an 8 sevenths. So let's go ahead and do that. So we would have 35 times 1 squared, that would just be 35, minus 75 times 1, that would just be 75, plus 42 equals 2. So 35 minus 75 would give me negative 40. If I did negative 40 plus 42, I would get 2. So 2 equals 2. So this works out right here. And then for the next one, you would have 35 times 8 sevenths squared. So if I square 8 sevenths, 8 squared is 64. And 7 squared is going to give me 49. But before I do that, remember, I could write it like this, and I could cancel a factor of 7 here with this, save myself a little bit of work and write this as 5. So really I'd have 5 times 64, which is 320 over 7. Okay, then next I have minus 75 times 8 sevenths. Now 75 is not divisible by 7, and 75 times 8 is 600. So I'd do 600 over 7, and then we have plus 42. Might as well get a common denominator going. So what's 42 times 7? That would be 294, and then over 7, and this should be equal to 2. Now, 320 minus 600 is negative 280. Then if I add 294, that's 14. So I get 14 over 7, which is 2. So 2 equals 2. So yeah, this checks out as well. So I get x equals 1, or x equals 8 sevenths. Again, using solution set notation, we could write this as 8 sevenths, comma, 1 inside of the set braces. And again, x equals 1 or x equals 8 sevenths. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 1 on solving quadratic equations by factoring. All right, so we want to solve each quadratic equation by factoring. And we're going to take a look at v squared minus 4v minus 5 equals 0. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that it's in standard form. So remember, this is ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And this is already in standard form. This already matches this description. So once we've done that, all we need to do is factor the left side, set it equal to 0. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to factor the left side, set it equal to 0. And so we know this would be v here and v here. And if I have two integers that sum to negative 4 and have a product of negative 5, what would they be? Well, it would be a positive 1 and a negative 5, right? Positive 1 and negative 5. 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. So that works out. Now we're going to use our zero product property. So remember, that's if you have a times b, and that's equal to 0, then either a is 0 b is 0, or a and b are both 0. So what I'm going to do is use that property to say, okay, if the quantity v plus 1 times the quantity v minus 5 is 0, then either this factor, v plus 1, is equal to 0, 
or this factor, v minus 5 is equal to 0, or they both are. So all I need to do is solve each of these for v, and I'll have two potential solutions to check. So I'm going to subtract 1 away from each side of the equation here. I'll have v equals negative 1. I want to add 5 to both sides of the equation here, and I'll have v is equal to 5. So I get v equals negative 1, or v equals 5. So let's check these in the original equation. So if I plugged in a negative 1 for v, I'd have the quantity negative 1 squared, right? I'm plugging in a negative 1 for v, so that's why I'm using parentheses, minus 4 times negative 1, minus 5 equals 0. So it started out with negative 1 squared, that's 1. And then we'd have negative 4 times negative 1, that's positive 4. And then minus 5 equals 0. So now 1 plus 4 is 5, 5 minus 5 is 0. So we get 0 equals 0. So this first guy is going to check out. V is equal to negative 1. Now let's check out the second guy where V is equal to 5. Okay, V is equal to 5. So 5 squared is 25. And then minus 4 times 5 is 20. Then minus 5 should be equal to 0. 25 minus 20 is 5. 5 minus 5 is 0. So you get 0 equals 0. And so I'm going to check mark this one as well. So v is equal to negative 1 or v is equal to 5. And as I taught you in the lesson, you could also write this in solution set notation with your set braces. And inside, you have negative 1, 5. All right, what about b squared minus 2b plus 1 is equal to 0? So it's already in standard form, so we just need to factor the left side. And one thing you might notice right away is this is a perfect square trinomial. So if I factored this, I know it would be what? It's b minus 1 squared, right? This quantity squared. Or I could write b minus 1 times b minus 1, right? Those two quantities. So this equals 0. And since I have the same thing here, I'm only going to have one potential solution. So it would just be b minus 1 equals 0, one of these. Because if I had a times a equals 0, I have the same thing times itself. I basically have a squared equals 0. And so I know that a has to be 0 in that case for that to be true. So it's the same thing here. It's not like I have two different scenarios. I only have one. So I would add 1 to both sides of the equation. Now we get b equals 1. And that's my solution, right? b is equal to 1. Let's erase this. And we will check it. So if I plugged in a 1 there, I'd have 1 squared minus 2 times plug in a 1 there plus 1 equals 0. 1 squared is 1, so you'd have 1 minus, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 equals 0. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, so you get 0 equals 0. So yeah, this is true. B does equal 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2, on solving quadratic equations by factoring. All right, so we want to solve each quadratic equation by factoring, and we're going to start out with v squared plus 40 equals 13v. So we want to start out by putting this in standard form. So we want ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So to get this in standard form, I just need to move this over here. And so what I do is I would just subtract 13v away from each side of the equation. So minus 13v and then minus 13v. So I would write this as v squared minus 13v plus 40 is equal to 13v minus 13v is 0. Okay, let's erase this. Now I want to factor the left side and set this equal to 0. So we know this is going to be the product of two binomials. This will be equal to 0. And I know this will be v, and this will be v. So how do I get these two parts here? Well, I'm looking for two integers whose sum is negative 13 and whose product is 40. So if I think about that, for 40, I have what? I have 1 times 40. I have 2 times 20. Not divisible by 3. I have 4 times 10. I have 5 times 8. Now, 5 and 8, I could make that work. If I had negative 5 plus negative 8, that's negative 13. Negative 5 times negative 8 is 40. So negative 5 and then negative 8. Now, what I want to do, I want to use my zero product property. So that tells me if I have two numbers, let's say a and b, and they're multiplied together and they equal zero, then a can be zero or b can be zero or they're both zero. It's got to be one of those scenarios, right? Because if you get zero as a result, it means one of those at minimum had to be zero. 
So we use that same principle here. One of these factors, I have the quantity V minus 5, and I have the quantity V minus 8. One of them has to be 0. So to figure this out, we set each factor equal to 0. So V minus 5, that's going to be equal to 0. And then we can say or V minus 8, we set that equal to 0. We solve each for V. So plus 5, plus 5, we'll get V equals 5. Or we'll add 8 to each side here, we'll get V equals 8. So V equals 5 or V equals 8. Okay, so let's check this guy now. So I'm going to start out by plugging in a 5 for each V. So I would have 5 squared plus 40 is equal to 13 times 5. 5 squared is 25, so I'd have 25 plus 40 is equal to 13 times 5 is 65. 25 plus 40 is 65, so you get 65 equals 65. So the first guy checks out. Let's check out the second guy. So let's erase this and this. And I'm going to plug in an 8 here and also here. So 8 squared is 64, so I'd have 64 plus 40. And then 13 times 8 would be 80 plus 24. That's 104. So 104. And then 64 plus 40 is also 104, so you get 104 equals 104. So this checks out as well. So we get V equals 5 or V equals 8. And again, as I showed you in the lesson, you could write this in solution set notation as put your set braces, 5 comma 8, kind of close that up. So again, V equals 5 or V equals 8. All right, for the next one, we have K squared plus 10 is equal to negative 7K. So let's add 7K to both sides of the equation. So we would have K squared plus 10 plus 7K is equal to zero. And I'm going to rearrange the order here because remember, we want this to be AX squared plus BX plus C. I want it to look like that and then equals zero. Same thing as if you had standard form for a polynomial, right? You want descending order of power. So K squared, then K to the first power, then your constant. All right, so let's factor the left side here and set that guy equal to zero. So I'd have K and K. So give me two integers that sum to 7 and have a product of 10. That's easy. That's 5 and 2. And so I'm going to set each one of these equal to 0. So k plus 5, set that equal to 0. And then also we'll set k plus 2, that equal to 0. And then I can eyeball this and see that the answer would be k equals negative 5 or k equals negative 2. Right? But for the sake of completeness, let's subtract 5 away from each side. Again, k equals negative 5, or let's subtract 2 away from each side, k equals negative 2. So k equals negative 5, or k equals negative 2. All right, so let's check each one now. So if I plug in a negative 5 for k, I'd have negative 5 squared plus 10 is equal to negative 7 times negative 5. Negative 5 squared is 25, so 25 would be added to 10, that's 35. Negative 7 times negative 5 is 35, so the first one checks out. The second one, k equals negative 2. Let's plug in a negative 2 in each position. So this will be here and here. Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 10 is 14. Negative 7 times negative 2 is also 14, so this one checks out as well. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on solving quadratic equations by factoring. All right, so we want to solve each quadratic equation by factoring. And we're going to start out with 7x squared equals 28x minus 28. And remember, we want to start by putting the equation in standard form. So I want ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. So that means I'm going to subtract 28x away from each side of the equation and add 28 to both sides of the equation as well. So minus 28x minus 28x, plus 28, and plus 28. Right, it's going to go on this side. So I'd have 7x squared minus 28x plus 28, and this would be equal to 0. Right? 28x minus 28x is 0. Negative 28 plus 28 is also 0. So let's erase this real quick. And when I look at this, it looks like one of the harder type trinomials to factor. But then I start thinking about this. I can pull a 7 out from everything. And if I do that, I'll have 7 times x squared 
minus 4x plus 4. And put equals 0. And I know that this is a perfect square trinomial. It's going to be really easy to factor this. So it's going to be 7 times x minus 2, that quantity squared, or I can put 7 times, we have x minus 2 times x minus 2, and again, this is equal to 0. So in most situations, when we use something called the zero product property, we end up with two potential solutions. Here I just have x minus 2 that's duplicated. Normally when we talk about the zero product property, you see me write, okay, a times b is equal to 0, and I'll tell you that either a has to be 0, or b has to be 0, or both a and b are 0. Right? If you multiply something by zero, you get zero. So one of those has to be zero, or they're both zero. In this particular case, you look at your factors. Seven can't be zero. You're only thinking about things that have a variable involved. X minus two could be set equal to zero. So X minus two could be set equal to zero. But the other thing is X minus two. So if I get a solution for this one, it's also a solution for this one. They're the same. So I just have one potential solution here. So I add two to both sides of the equation and we'll get x is equal to 2. So let's plug that in and check. So we'd have 7 times 2 squared equals 28 times 2 minus 28. So 2 squared is 4. 7 times 4 would give me 28. And this is equal to 28 times 2 is 56. 56 minus 28 is 28. So 28 equals 28. So yes, this is the solution. And again, if you want to write this in solution set notation, just throw your 2 inside of some set braces. Either way, you can show that x is equal to 2. All right, so now let's look at 5a squared equals 15a. And again, I want this to look like this. ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So I could subtract 15a away from each side of the equation. And I get 5a squared minus 15a is equal to 0. Now, you might think that... Okay, this has three terms on the left side. This has two. I could put plus zero over here. That could be my C term, but I don't need to do that, right? If I simplify it, it just go back to this. So let's erase this real quick. And now you might say, well, how am I going to go about factoring the left side? That's not a trinomial. Well, always think about what you can pull out. And if you have a prime polynomial, something that can't be factored, then you're not going to be able to solve a quadratic equation using this method. But in most cases, if you're on this section, they're not going to give that to you. So there must be some trick. So I know that 5a is common. So let me pull that out. So I pull out a 5a. And then what's left is a minus 3. So if these are my two factors, I could set each one equal to 0. I could say, okay, well, 5a is equal to 0. Or we could have this quantity a minus 3 is equal to 0. Right? And I take the parentheses away and I could solve that by adding 3 to both sides of the equation. So this is a is equal to 3. And over here, this one's obvious. a would be 0, right? If I divide both sides by 5, I would get a is equal to 0. So we get a is equal to 0, or a is equal to 3. So if we wanted to check this, again, we'd plug a 0 in for each a. Plug a 0 in here and here. We know we get 0 equals 0. That's easy enough to check. You can just eyeball that. If I plugged in a 3 here, I'd get 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times 5 is 45. So that would be 45. And over here, 15 times 3 is 45. 45 equals 45. So that works out as well. So A is equal to 0 or A is equal to 3. Again, in solution set notation, this is 0, comma 3 inside of set braces. So either way you want to display it, A equals 0 or A can also be 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on solving quadratic equations by factoring. Alright, so we're going to solve each quadratic equation by factoring. And we're going to take a look at 6x squared plus 23 is equal to 19x plus 8. So the very first thing we want to do is we want to put this in the format of ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. All right, this is the standard form. So what I do here is subtract 19x away from each side, and I'd also subtract 8 away from each side. So when I do that, I'll have 6x squared minus 19x, and then I have 23 minus 8. That's going to give me 15, so plus 15. And then this equals 0. I can erase all this, and I can erase this. So now it's in standard form, and all I want to do is I want to factor the left side and set it equal to 0. 
Now this one's a little bit more difficult to factor because the coefficient on the squared variable is not one. So I taught you in a previous lesson how to factor these. You can use reverse FOIL or you can use kind of factoring by grouping. I like to use factoring by grouping, so let's go ahead and do that. So I want two integers whose product is six times 15 or 90. and whose sum is negative 19. Now if I have a positive product and a negative sum, it must mean that I have two negatives involved. So let's think about absolute values for a second. For 90, the factors would be one times 90, that's not gonna work, two times 45, that's not gonna work, three times 30, that's not gonna work, it's not divisible by four, five times 18 would not work, six times 15 would not work, not divisible by seven, not divisible by eight, it is divisible by nine, and 90 divided by 9 would be 10. So 10 and 9 would work. If I did negative 10 and negative 9, negative 10 times negative 9 is positive 90. Negative 10 plus negative 9 is negative 19. So let's go ahead and use that to rewrite the middle term. So we'll have 6x squared minus 10x minus 9x plus 15 equals 0. So I'm going to factor this by grouping. In the first group, I can pull out a 2x. And that will leave me with 3x minus 5. In the second group, I'm going to pull out a negative 3. And that's going to leave me with 3x minus 5. So the common binomial factor is 3x minus 5. So we're going to factor that out. And so what I'll have is 3x minus 5 times 2x minus 3. And again, this equals 0. So now we're at the stage where we can use our zero product property. So recall that tells us that if we have two numbers and they're multiplied together to give a zero, then one of those numbers has to be zero at minimum, right? One of them can be zero or both of them can be zero. So formally, we generally see a times b is equal to zero. And we'll say, okay, a times b can equal zero if a is zero or b is zero or both a and b are zero. So here, following that same format, the quantity 3x minus 5 times the quantity 2x minus 3 is equal to 0 if 3x minus 5, this is equal to 0, or 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. So let's solve each one for the x value that would make that particular binomial equal to 0. So for this one, I would add 5 to both sides of the equation. I would get 3x is equal to 5, divide both sides by 3 you get x is equal to 5 thirds. For this one, I would add 3 to both sides of the equation. I would get 2x is equal to 3. Divide both sides by 2. You get x is equal to 3 halves. So what I have is x equals 5 thirds or x equals 3 halves. So let's check each one and see if they work. So we will have 6 times, plug in a 5 thirds for x, and this is squared, plus 23 is equal to 19 times 5 thirds plus 8. So if I start off with 5 thirds squared, I would have 6 times 25 ninths. Now I can cancel a common factor of 3, so this would be 2 and this would be 3. So I'd end up with 50 thirds. So 50 thirds, then plus 23 equals if I have 19 times 5, that's 95, so this would be 95 over 3, then plus 8. Now, I can get common denominators, or I can just multiply everything by 3. So in other words, if I multiply, since it's an equation, if I multiply everything by 3, according to the multiplication property of equality, I'm still good to go. So if I multiply this by 3, I'd get 50. Then plus, if I multiply 23 by 3, I'd get 69. This should be equal to, if I multiply this by 3, I get 95. If I multiply this by 3, I get 24. So, 50 plus 69 is 119. Is equal to, 95 plus 24 is also 119. So you get 119 equals 119. Scroll back up here, and we could say that x equals 5 thirds is a true solution. All right, now let's check 3 halves. So 3 halves squared is going to be 9 fourths. So you'd have six times nine fourths, can cancel a common factor of two. So this would be three and this would be two. 
So what I'd have is 27 halves. So 27 halves plus 23 is equal to, for this one, 19 times 3 is 57. That over 2, so 57 halves plus 8. So again, I can get common denominators going, or I can just multiply everything by 2. So if I multiply this by 2, I get 27. If I multiply this by 2, I get 46. If I multiply this by 2, I get 57. If I multiply this by 2, I get 16. So 27 plus 46 is 73. And 57 plus 16 is 73 as well. So again, this right here, x equals 3 halves, is also a solution. So I can also write this in solution set notation. So inside of set braces, I can write 3 halves, comma, 5 thirds. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 5 on solving quadratic equations by factoring. All right, so we want to solve each quadratic equation by factoring. So we're looking at 19x squared minus 180x minus 160 is equal to negative 6x squared. So the first thing we want to do is write each equation in standard form. So that looks like this. We have ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. So I'm going to add 6x squared to both sides of the equation. And what that's going to give me is 25x squared minus 180x minus 160 is equal to 0. So I notice right away that everything's divisible by 5. So let's pull that out. And I'll have 5x squared minus 36x minus 32. Okay, this is equal to 0. And now I want to factor what's inside. So let's go ahead and factor this. So I want two integers whose product is 5 times negative 32, which is negative 160. This is my product. And whose sum is negative 36. This is my sum. So let's think about the factors of 160. So it's obviously not 1 times 160. It's not 2 times 80, but 4 times 40. We could make 4 and 40 work if the signs were right. If I had negative 40 and plus 4, that would work. So I'd have 5x squared minus 40x plus 4x minus 32. Let me erase this. I don't need this anymore. And this is equal to 0. So now I'm going to factor by grouping. So I'd have 5 times inside of parentheses here. If I pulled out a 5x from the first group, I would have x minus 8. Then plus, if I pulled out a 4 from the next group, I would have x minus 8. This equals 0. And so now I can pull out the common binomial factor of x minus 8. And I'd be left with 5x plus 4. Okay, this equals 0. So then now once I'm in this stage, each factor would be set equal to 0. Now 5 wouldn't be set equal to 0 because obviously 5 isn't equal to 0, but each factor with a variable would be set equal to 0. Remember the zero product property. If I have a times b and this is equal to 0, then it's got to be true that either a is equal to 0, b is equal to 0, or both a and b are equal to 0. Well, in this case, it's got to be true that x minus 8 is equal to 0, or 5x plus 4 is equal to 0. So for this one, I just solve by adding 8 to each side of the equation, and I'll get x is equal to 8. Very, very simple. For this one, I'll subtract 4 away from each side. I'll get 5x is equal to negative 4. Divide both sides of the equation by 5, and I'll get x is equal to negative 4 fifths. So you get x is equal to 8, or x is equal to negative 4 fifths. All right, so let's check each one now. So we would have 19 times, plug in an 8 for x, so that's squared, minus 180 times, plug in an 8 for x, minus 160, and this equals negative 6, plug in an 8 for x, and then it's squared. All right, so 8 squared is 64. Then 64 times 19 is 1,216. So let's write 1,216. Then minus 180 times 8 is 1,440. Then minus 160. This is equal to 8 squared is again is 64. And 64 times negative 6 is negative 384. So if I just go left to right, 1,216 minus 1,440 is negative 224. And then if I subtract away another 160, 
I will in fact get negative 384. So I get negative 384 equals negative 384. And so we can say that x equals eight is a true solution. All right, for the next one, I have x equals negative four fifths. So I would have 19 times, you've got negative four fifths squared, then minus 180 times negative four fifths, then minus 160 is equal to negative six. Again, plug in for x, so times negative four fifths, and this is going to be squared. All right, so negative four fifths squared is going to be 16 20 fifths. So you'd have 19 times 16, which is 304 over 25. Here you've got negative times negative, that's positive. I know that 180 is divisible by five, it'll give me 36. So I ended up with 36 times four, which is 144. So this is a plus 144. And then I have minus 160. Now, because there's a fraction involved here, to make this easier, let me just perform this operation. 144 minus 160 is just negative 16. So I'm gonna put minus 16 here. This is equal to, over here if I square this, I'm going to get 16 over 25. So negative six times 16 over 25. Negative six times 16 is equal to negative 96. You'd end up with negative 96 over 25. So there's two things I can kind of do here. I can get a common denominator going and perform the subtraction or I can multiply both sides by 25. Same thing either way. If I multiply both sides by 25, I'm gonna have 304 minus 25 times 16 is 400 is equal to negative 96. And you'll see 304 minus 400 is negative 96. So you get negative 96 equals negative 96. If I had got a common denominator going, it's the same thing really. Multiply this by 25 over 25, you could end up with 400 over 25. And basically I'd have negative 96 over 25 is equal to negative 96 over 25. So if we scroll back up, we could say x equals negative four fifths is a solution. We could write this in solution set notation, negative four fifths comma eight. So either way you wanna display it, your answer is x equals eight or x is equal to negative four fifths. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Practice Set 43. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on introduction to rational expressions. All right, so we wanna start out by finding the restricted values for each rational expression. So remember, when we first look at rational expressions, there's kind of two things that you're gonna be asked to do. One of those things is gonna to be to find the restricted values, and the other is going to be to simplify. So to find the restricted values, essentially all you need to do is take your denominator, in this case that's x squared plus six x plus eight, and you want to set it equal to zero. So why would you wanna do that? Remember, we cannot divide by zero. So if I find values for x that when substituted back in result in a value of zero, that means the denominator would be zero and division by zero again is undefined. So we go through this process to find what values of x would be restricted. So what I wanna do is just factor the left side here. Set that equal to zero. So I know I'd have x here and x here. And this one's easy. I need two integers whose sum is six and whose product is eight, and that would be four and two. So now I set each factor individually equal to zero. So x plus four is equal to zero, and then x plus two is equal to zero. And I can just subtract four away from each side of the equation. I get x equals negative four, or I subtract two away from each side of the equation, I get x is equal to negative two. Now I do wanna check these real quick, so let me put x equals negative four, or x equals negative two. I'll erase all this. If I plug in a negative four for x, I'd have 16 plus a negative 24 plus eight equals zero. 16 plus eight is 24, 24 minus 24 is zero, so that checks out. If I plugged in a negative two, negative two squared is four, then negative two times six is negative 12, so minus 12 plus eight equals zero. That works out as well. Four plus eight is 12, 12 minus 12 is zero. So those check out. So we have found two values for x that when substituted in for x result in zero, right? Because if I plugged in a negative four here 
and I evaluated, I would have a denominator of zero. That's not allowed, we can't divide by zero. So x cannot be negative four or it can't be negative two. If I plug in a negative two for x, I also get a value of zero, so or negative two. All right, let's take a look at one more of these. Again, it's a very easy concept. You get a problem and you just look at the denominator, you set it equal to zero, and you solve that, and the solutions are gonna be your restricted values, right? Because those values for that variable are gonna make the denominator equal to zero. So negative six x squared plus 29 x minus 30, set this equal to zero. This one is a little bit harder to factor. Let's go ahead and start by pulling out a negative one. It just makes it easy if your leading coefficient is positive. So what I'm gonna do is, again, pull out a negative one. This will be six x squared minus 29 x plus 30, and this equals zero. And this doesn't affect anything. I can pull out a negative one if I want. I could factor it like this. Just makes it a little easier for me. So I want two integers whose product is 180 and whose sum is negative 29. So for 180, I could do one times 180, two times 90, three times 60, four times 45, five times 36. Then I could also do six times 30, not divisible by seven or eight, is divisible by nine. It is nine times 20. And that would work out. I could do negative nine and negative 20. That would give me a sum of negative 29. Negative nine times negative 20 would give me a product of 180. So let's go with that. All right, so let's erase everything. And we're gonna rewrite that middle term and use factoring by grouping. So we'll have six X squared minus nine X minus 20x plus 30. Okay, close parentheses, equals zero. Factoring this by grouping, the first group here, I can pull out a 3x. So that would leave me with a 2x minus a 3. In the second group, I can pull out a negative 10. So put negative 10 here, and that would leave me with a 2x minus a 3. Okay, close parentheses and get equals zero. So we'd have negative one times, we'd have three X minus 10 times two X minus three. Of course, this equals zero. And of course, now we wanna set each factor equal to zero. So negative one, I don't need to worry about setting that equal to zero. It's gotta be a factor with a variable in it. So I'd have three X minus 10, set that equal to zero. And then also two X minus three, set that equal to zero. So I'd add 10 to both sides of the equation. That's gone, I'll have three X is equal to 10. Divide both sides by three, I'll get X equals 10 thirds. So then, or over here, add three to both sides, I'll get two X is equal to three. Divide both sides by two, and I'll get X is equal to three halves. So X equals 10 thirds, or X equals three halves. So we have X is equal to three halves, or x is equal to, again, 10 thirds. So we're gonna plug those in for the variable x in the denominator here and see if we get a result of zero. So we'd have negative six times three halves squared. If I square three, I get nine. If I square two, I get four. Now I can cancel a common factor of two between six and four. This would be two and this would be three. So negative three times nine is negative 27. So this would be negative 27 halves. Okay, then plus, I've got 29 times three halves. So that would just be 29 times three, which is 87, so it'd be 87 halves. And then minus 30, I can write that as 60 over two if I want. So I wanna see if this is equal to zero. You can see that it is, negative 27 minus 60 would be negative 87. So negative 87 halves plus 87 halves would be zero. So that works itself out. And then for the other one, we have 10 thirds. So we have negative six times 10 thirds squared, so that would be 100 over nine. Again, I can cancel here. Cancel common factor of three. This would be two, and this would be three. Negative two times 100 would be negative 200 thirds. So you'd have negative 200 thirds. And then we have plus 29 times 10 thirds. So we'd have 29 times 10, that's 290 
over 3. And then minus, you have 30 here. To get a common denominator, 30 times 3 is 90, so I'd have minus 90 thirds. You can see that would work out as well. Negative 200 minus 90 is negative 290. So negative 290 thirds plus 290 thirds is also 0. So you found your restricted values. X cannot be 3 halves, and X can also not be 10 thirds because if you plug those values in for X, you get a denominator of 0, and division by 0 is not allowed. So X cannot be 3 halves or 10 thirds. All right, so now we want to practice kind of the other topic that you learn when you start working with rational expressions, and that's to simplify. So what you do here is you factor the numerator and denominator completely, and then you cancel common factors. That's all you're doing. So it's just like simplifying a fraction. So x minus 4 over 2x squared minus 8x. So I just look to see when I start what I can factor. So from here, I can pull out a 2x. So what would that leave me with? Well, if I pull out a 2x from here, I would have x minus, if I pull out a 2x from here, I would have 4. So I have a common factor of x minus 4 in the numerator and denominator. When I cancel everything from the numerator, I write a 1. Right? You could have thought of that as 1 times x minus 4. And what I'm left with here is a 1 over a 2x. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 4n squared minus 2n over 10n. So again, I just want to factor everything completely first. So in the numerator, I can see that I can factor out a 2n. And that would leave me with a 2n minus a 1. In the denominator, I have 10n. So I could factor this and write 5 times 2 times n, or 5 times 2n if I want. So 2n times 5. It's pretty obvious what they want you to cancel. They want you to cancel this 2n here. That's a common factor. And what you're left with is 2n minus 1 over 5. All right, let's take a look at one that is a little tricky. We have x minus 5 over 5 minus x. So you might see this on your test, on your homework, and say, what am I going to do? I can't factor anything here. So you might just say, okay, well, there's, there's nothing I can do. Move on and say that one's, that one's as simple as it can go. Well, no, that's wrong. These are actually opposites. If you see something that kind of looks like this, you want to say, okay, what if I factored out a negative 1 from here? So to do that, let's write this as 5 times negative 1 times negative 1. Remember, negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. 1 times 5 is 5. That gets me back to that. Instead of minus, I'll put plus negative 1 times x. So if I pulled out a negative 1, that would look like this. I'd have negative 1 outside of a set of parentheses. So I pulled that out from here and here. So what's left is 5 times negative 1 or negative 5. And then in here, just plus x. Now if I reverse the order of this, which is legal in addition, I would have x minus 5. So what I have is I have x minus 5 over... Let me kind of erase this because I'm bumping into this. Negative 1 times x minus 5. So when you see something like this, they're opposites, and they cancel and become negative 1. In other words, I can cancel this with this, and I'd have 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have k squared minus 17k plus 72 over k squared minus 18k plus 80. So again, I just want to factor the numerator and denominator. So in the numerator, I'm looking for two integers whose sum is negative 17 and whose product is 72. Well, negative 9 plus negative 8 would be negative 17, and negative 9 times negative 8 would be 72. So negative 9 and negative 8. This is over. Here I have k squared minus 18k plus 80. So I'm looking for two integers whose sum is negative 18 and whose product is 80. Now, one clue, if I just think about this real quick, I know that one of these should be involved. 99% of the time, they're setting this up to where something's going to cancel for you. So I know I'm either going to have a k minus 9 or a k minus 8 down here somewhere. And looking at this, I know that if I did k minus 8 times k minus 10, that would work out. Negative 10 plus negative 8 is negative 18. Negative 10 times negative 8 is 80. So I can cancel this with this, right? Cancel a common factor of k minus 8. And what I'm going to have is k minus 9 over k minus 10. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 15a squared minus 35a over 10a squared minus 10a. So in the numerator, I'm going to factor out a 5a. That's going to leave me with 3a 
minus 7. In the denominator, I'm going to factor out a 10a. And that's going to give me a minus 1. So obviously, I can't cancel this, but I can cancel between the 5 and the 10. I know that this and this each share a common factor of 5. So 10 divided by 5 will be 2. So this is going to be a 1, and this is going to be a 2. And then a over a is 1. So essentially, what I'm going to end up with is 3a minus 7 over 2 times the quantity a minus 1. All right, let's kind of wrap this up with kind of a harder one. So we have 3x squared plus 14x minus 5 over 2x squared plus 5x minus 25. So again, let's factor each one completely. And each of these is going to require us to either do grouping or reverse FOIL. So let's kind of drag these down and just factor them individually. So if I need two integers whose product is negative 15 and whose sum is 14, well, let's see, I can do positive 15 and negative 1. So that's 3x squared plus 15x minus x minus 5. So if I factor this by grouping, in the first group I can pull out a 3x. So 3x, I'll have x plus 5. In the second group I can pull out a negative 1. I'll have x plus 5. And so what this becomes, and I'll just drag this up here, this will become 3x minus 1 times x plus 5. Okay, for the next one, I have 2x squared plus 5x minus 25. So give me two integers whose product is negative 50 and whose sum is 5. So I could do positive 10 and negative 5. That would work out. So we'd have 2x squared plus 10x minus 5x minus 25. If I factor this by grouping, in the first group, I can pull out a 2x, so that would give me x plus 5. In the second group, I can pull out a negative 5, that would give me x plus 5. So what this ends up being, and I'm just going to write this up here, this will be 2x minus 5 times x plus 5. And we can cancel a common factor of x plus 5. And what do I end up with? I end up with... 3x minus 1 over 2x minus 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1, one introduction to rational expressions. Okay, so we want to find the restricted values for each rational expression. And when we talk about finding the restricted values, we're specifically referring to the fact that the denominator can never be 0. Right? We know we can't divide by 0, it's undefined. So how do we find that? Well, for something like v minus 8 over v squared plus 14v plus 40. So all we need to do is set the denominator equal to 0. So v squared plus 14v plus 40. If I set this equal to 0 and I get the solutions for v, what does that mean? It means that I have found values for v that when plugged in give me 0. So if I plug something in for v and it gives me 0, I have division by 0 and that's undefined. So any value for v that is a solution to this equation is a restricted value for this rational expression. So we're going to solve this by factoring. So if I factored this, I'd have v here and v here. And they give me two integers whose sum is 14 and whose product is 40. So we could do 10 and 4. So v plus 10 times v plus 4. And then we'd set each factor individually equal to 0. So we'd have v plus 10 equals 0 or v plus 4 equals 0. You can eyeball that and see that the answers would be negative 10 or negative 4. But for the sake of completeness, subtract 10 from each side of the equation. You get v equals negative 10. So v equals negative 10. Or over here, subtract 4 away from each side of the equation. You get v equals negative 4. So or v equals negative 4. Then I can erase this real quick, and you can check v squared plus 14v plus 40 to make sure that these values for v result in this expression here being equal to 0. So you can put equal 0, or you can just see if it equals 0. But if I plugged in a negative 10, I would square it, I'd get 100. Then 14 times negative 10 is negative 140. 
and plus 40 equals zero. You can see that works out. 100 plus 40 is 140. Subtract away 140, you get zero. So this one works out. If I looked at negative four, negative four squared is 16, and then negative four times 14 is negative 56, and then plus 40 equals zero, and that works out as well. 16 plus 40 is 56, 56 minus 56 is zero. So both of these are valid solutions. And now I can just say that my restricted values for this rational expression would be negative 10 and negative four. So V cannot be negative 10 or negative four. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have X cubed minus three X squared plus seven over X squared minus 19 X plus 90. So again, all I need to do if I'm asked to find the restricted values, just take the denominator, so x squared minus 19x plus 90, set it equal to zero, find the solutions for that, and that's your restricted values. So if I factor this, if I factor this, I'll have x here and here, and I need two integers whose sum is negative 19 and whose product is positive 90. That's going to be negative 10 and negative 9. So we'd set each factor individually equal to zero. You can eyeball that and see it would be x equals 10 and x equals nine. I think it's easy to see. But again, for the sake of completeness, let's go through everything. So add 10 to both sides of the equation, you get x equals 10. Or add nine to both sides of the equation, you get x equals nine. So if we check this and it works out, the restricted values would be 10, and again, nine. So if I plug in a 10 here, I'd get 100, right? 10 squared is 100. And then I'd have 19 times 10, that's 190, so minus 190. And then plus 90 equals zero. You see that works out. If I sum these two, I get 190. Subtract away 190, I get zero. So then checking x equals nine, if I plug in a nine here, I'd have 81, then minus 19 times nine is 171 and plus 90 equals zero. 81 plus 90 is 171. 171 minus 171 is zero. And so they both check out here. And we can say that our restricted values, again, would be 10 and nine. So X cannot be 10 or nine. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Two on Introduction to Rational Expressions. All right, so we're just gonna look at one problem here. I just want to find the restricted values for each rational expression. So we look at 3n squared minus 9n minus 17 over 3n squared plus 11n minus 42. So kind of a simple process. The restricted values have to do with the fact that you can't divide by zero. So in other words, what I'm looking for here are values of n that create a denominator of zero. So if I plugged in some value for n, I evaluated and I got zero, that would be a restricted value. So how do we go about figuring this out? Well, what we do is we just set the denominator equal to zero, and we find out what values of n satisfy the equation. Because if they satisfy the equation, and this is equal to zero, well then I know that those are restricted values. So I would start out by factoring this, and I'm gonna need to use factoring by grouping or reverse FOIL here. So I'm gonna use factoring by grouping. So three times negative 42 is negative 126. So I'm looking for a product of negative 126 and a sum of 11 from two integers. So if I take 126 and I think about its factors, it's obviously one times 126. It's two times 63, be three times 42. It's not divisible by four or five, it's six times 21. It's divisible by seven, it's seven times 18. Now I can make that work. If I take positive 18 and negative seven, I've got the two integers I need. So I'm gonna rewrite this as three n squared plus 18 n plus negative seven n, or I can just write minus seven n, minus 42 equals zero. From the first group, I'm gonna pull out a three n, and so that's gonna leave me with n plus six. From the second group, I'm gonna pull out a negative seven. That's gonna leave me with, again, n plus six. This equals zero. And so I'll end up with three n minus seven times 
times n plus 6, and this equals 0. So now all I need to do is set each factor individually equal to 0. So 3n minus 7 equals 0. Add 7 to both sides of the equation. I get 3n equals 7. Divide both sides by 3, and I get n is equal to 7 thirds. So then or, we also have the n plus 6 equals 0. Subtract 6 away from each side, and we get n is equal to negative 6. So my restricted values here would be 7 thirds or also negative 6. Now let's check each one in the original denominator and see if we get the result of 0. All right, so we have 3n squared plus 11n minus 42. Again, put that equal to 0. And our solutions were 7 thirds. And also we had a solution of negative 6. So if I plugged in a 7 thirds for n, in the first spot I would square it. So 7 squared is 49, 3 squared is 9. So you'd have 3 times 49 ninths. You'd obviously be able to cancel 3 here with a factor of 3 down here. So this would be 49 thirds. So then plus, you have 11 times 7 thirds. That would be 77 thirds. And then minus, you'd have 42. Now you want to get a common denominator going. And so 42 times 3 is 126. So this would be 126 over 3. This equals 0. And so if I had 49 and 77, I get 126. So I'd have 126 thirds minus 126 thirds. So that would be 0. All right, the next one is negative 6. So if I squared that, I'd get 36. 36 times 3 is 108. So 108 plus 11 times negative 6 is negative 66. So I can put minus 66 and then minus 42 equals 0. If I do negative 66 minus 42, I get negative 108. Negative 108 plus 108 is 0. So both of these are valid solutions. So then for our restricted values, we can say that n cannot be, cannot be, 7 thirds or negative 6. Because again, if I plug in a 7 thirds for n, or I plug a negative 6 in for n, I'm going to end up with a 0 in my denominator, and division by 0 is not allowed. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on Introduction to Rational Expressions. All right, so we want to simplify here. And so to simplify a rational expression, all you want to do is factor the numerator and denominator completely and then cancel any common factors between the numerator and denominator. So in the numerator here, I have 20. In the denominator, I have 10x minus 25. I can factor 20 down into the product of prime numbers, but generally speaking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by factoring my denominator here and see what I can pull out. It looks like I can just pull out a 5. So this would be 5 times, inside of parentheses, 2x minus 5. And so up here, all I'm going to do is write this as 5 times 4. I could write it as 5 times 2 times 2, but what's the point, right? I don't have any common factors of 2 to cancel. And so I would cancel this 5 with this 5, and I'd be left with a simplified rational expression that is 4 over 2x minus 5. And so we're done here. We don't have anything else that we can cancel. Now, a lot of students, when they first start out, they think for some reason they can cancel a common factor of 2 here. So they'll say, okay, this is 2 and this is canceled, this is 1, and so my final answer is 2 over x minus 5. No, this is wrong. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? It's wrong because we cancel common factors. When we look at this, I have the number 4 over 2x minus 5. This is a sum. You can think about this as plus negative 5 here. Nothing's being multiplied here. In this case, I have 5 times the quantity 2x minus 5. There's multiplication involved. Here I have 5 times 4. So I'm canceling common factors. Another way to think about this is if I had something like, you know, a times b over a. I'm multiplying here, so I can cancel the common factor of a. But if I saw something like a plus b over a, I'm not multiplying anywhere. So I can't go through and just say, okay, well, I have a here and a here. I'm just left with b. That doesn't work, right? It's that's not valid. So our final answer here is 4 over 2x. You can put minus 5 or plus negative 5. Either way, it's the same. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have n squared minus 7n minus 8 over 8n plus 8. So for this guy right here, I could factor the numerator into the product of two binomials. So I'd have an n here and an n here. And 
two integers that would sum to negative 7 and multiply to negative 8? Well, yeah, that would be negative 8 and positive 1. Negative 8 times 1 would be negative 8. Negative 8 plus 1 would be negative 7. And then over in the denominator, I have an 8 that's common to each, so I can pull that out. And I have 8 times the quantity n plus 1. Now, again, this is multiplication here. I'm multiplying 8 by this quantity n plus 1. I'm multiplying the quantity n minus 8 times the quantity n plus 1. So that's why I'm able to cancel. So this factor of n plus 1 can be canceled with this factor of n plus 1. And what I'm left with here is n minus 8 in my numerator over 8. And again, there's nothing else I can cancel. I can't go through and cancel this 8 with this 8. There's no more factors here. Right? I could write this as this times 1. But that's it, right? There's nothing else I can do. And so I'm left with n minus 8 over 8. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Introduction to Rational Expressions. All right, so we just want to simplify. And we're taking a look at 12n squared plus 6n over 18n squared plus 42n. So essentially all I want to do, just like if I was working with fractions, I want to factor the numerator and denominator completely, and then look to cancel any common factors that I might have. So in the numerator, I can see that I have an n that's common to each, and also a 6 that's common to each. So I'm going to pull out a 6n. And so this first term here, 12n squared divided by 6n, would be 2n. And then plus, I'd have 6n divided by 6n, which would be 1. And then this is over. In the denominator here, I have 18n squared plus 42n. So what's common each? I know an n would be. Then for the number part, I know 18 is what? It's 3 times 3, which is 9, times 2. Then for 42, I know it's 14 times 3. So 3 times 7 times 2. So what's going to be common here is 3 times 2, or 6. So again, I can pull out a 6n. So 6n comes out. 18n squared divided by 6n is going to be 3n. Then plus 42n divided by 6n would be 7. So I can see that I have a common factor of 6n. Again, this is multiplication here. So these are factors. So this factor of 6n would cancel with this factor of 6n. And that would leave me with a simplified rational expression that's 2n plus 1 over 3n plus 7. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So we have m squared minus 9, and this is over m squared plus 7m minus 30. So in the numerator, you would notice that that's the difference of two squares, right? m squared minus 9. So this is m minus 3, that quantity, times m plus 3, that quantity. Whenever you see a binomial with a subtraction sign, Always think to yourself, this might be the difference of two squares, something you want to check for. Okay, then this is over. I have m squared plus 7m minus 30. So if we can factor this, I need two integers whose sum is 7. Okay, so the sum would be 7. And then a product, okay, a product of negative 30. So just thinking about factors of 30, right off the top of my head, I think about 10 and 3. Now, if I had positive 10 and negative 3, that would work. Because if I have positive 10 minus 3, that's going to give me a positive 7. And if I have positive 10 times negative 3, that's going to give me a negative 30. Okay, so now we can see we have a common factor here of m minus 3. So I can cancel this one with this one. And what I'm left with is a numerator that's m plus 3. So m plus 3. And then this is over a denominator that's m plus 10. So m plus 10. So once again, this rational expression is going to simplify to m plus 3 over m plus 10. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on introduction to rational expressions. All right, so we want to simplify. And we're looking at 5x squared minus x minus 4. And this is over 5x squared minus 5. So what we want to do here. In the numerator, there's nothing common that I can pull out. But in the denominator, I could start out by just pulling out a 5, and I would have x squared minus 1. Now, in the denominator, continuing there, that's the difference of two squares. 
So I can write this as, we'll have our numerator up here. Let me just copy the numerator. I have 5x squared minus x minus 4. The denominator, I'm going to write 5 times, this is x plus 1 times x minus 1. So that part's done. For the numerator, it's a little bit more complicated. We have one where we need to use reverse FOIL or factoring by grouping. So if I multiply 5 times negative 4, I get negative 20. So I would need two integers whose product is negative 20 and whose sum is negative 1. So then for 20, really I would just think about 5 and 4. If I get the signs right, I'd use negative 5 and positive 4. So I'm going to write this as 5x squared minus 5x plus 4x, then minus 4. And then I can factor this by grouping. So I'd have 5x being pulled out. So this would leave me with x minus 1. Then plus, I'm going to pull out a 4. And this would be x minus 1. This is over. 5 times we have x plus 1 times x minus 1. So this is equal to, if I pull out the common binomial factor of x minus 1, I'll have 5x plus 4 times x minus 1 over 5 times x plus 1 times x minus 1. And we can all see that we can cancel a common factor of x minus 1 between numerator and denominator. And so my simplified rational expression here is going to be 5x plus 4 over 5 times the quantity x plus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 44. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're going to start out today with 16k plus 64 over 8 divided by 10k squared plus 40k over 3k squared. So remember, when we're multiplying and dividing with rational expressions, it's the same rules, it's the same procedure, it's the same process as we use when we're multiplying and dividing with fractions. So nothing is any different here. So in other words, if I'm dividing here, I just take the first rational expression and leave it as it is. So 16k plus 64 over 8. I multiply by the reciprocal of the second rational expression. So to get the reciprocal, I just take the denominator and put it in the numerator. And I take the numerator and put it in the denominator. So now I would just multiply. Now, kind of the second thing is, remember when we work with fractions, we would do a lot of canceling before we'd actually do our multiplication. So we're going to factor some things here to see what we can cancel. Then we're going to cancel common factors between numerator and denominator of each, and we're going to cross cancel. And then we're going to do our multiplication in the last step so that our answer is already simplified or, again, reduced to its lowest terms. Okay, so if I look at this, in my numerator here, I can pull out a 16. So let's do that, and I'd have a k plus 4. I can just leave that 8 there. I don't really need to do anything with that. And times, I have 3k squared. Nothing I can do with that. Then for this one, I can pull out a 10k. So if I pull out a 10k, I would have k plus 4 here. And now I can think about what I can cancel between numerator and denominator. What I notice right away, right off the bat, is that I have a common factor of k plus 4 that can be cross-canceled. Now, another thing I can do, I can cancel between the 16 and the 8. 16 divided by 8 is 2. So this would cancel, and this would be a 2. And I can cancel between 2 and 10. Each is divisible by 2. 10 divided by 2 is 5. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So notice that this entire rational expression here has been canceled out. So this is now a 1. Now over here, I still have some stuff I can cancel because I have k squared and I have k. So I can cancel one factor of k here with this k here. And basically all I have is 1 times 3k over 5. So that's just 3k over 5. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at p squared plus 6p minus 7 over 4p times 1 over p squared minus 49. So you want to factor everything again so you can see what's going to cancel. So in the numerator here, I'm going to take this trinomial. I'm going to factor it into the product of two binomials. So give me two integers whose sum is 6 and whose product is negative 7. Well, if I did positive 7 and negative 1, so p plus 7, and then p minus 1. Then in the denominator here, 4p, not going to do anything with that. You could write 2 times 2 times p if you wanted to, but it's a little bit unnecessary. So then times, we have 1 over p 
p squared minus 49. And a lot of you won't notice right away until you work enough problems that that is the difference of two squares, right? p squared is p times p, and then 49 is seven times seven. So this is what? This is p plus seven, that quantity, times p minus seven, that quantity. Now, what can I cancel? Nothing between numerator and denominator here, nothing between numerator and denominator here, but I can cross cancel a common factor of p plus seven. So that can be canceled. And so what we'd have is in the numerator, p minus one times one is p minus one over, I've got four p times p minus seven. So four p times this quantity p minus seven. And in a lot of cases, your teacher will accept this as the answer. In some cases, they want you to go through and use your distributive property. So we can show that answer as well. So we'd have p minus one over, 4p times p is 4p squared, and then minus 4p times seven is 28p. So you'd have p minus one over 4p squared minus 28p. All right, so let's take a look at 2n plus two over 2n minus four. And this is divided by 25n plus 15 over 5n plus three. All right, so again, we're using division. So we wanna take the first rational expression multiply by the reciprocal of the second. So just gonna kind of factor as I go. So two n plus two is two times the quantity n plus one. And then two n minus four, I can pull out a two from that as well. And so I would have n minus two. This is times, I'm gonna write five n plus three in the numerator up here. And then over here, 25 n plus 15, I could pull out a five from that and I'd have five n plus three. What can I cancel? Well, I can see that between the numerator and denominator here, I can cancel a common factor of two. And I can see that between the numerator and denominator here, I can cancel a common factor of five n plus three. Remember, I could write this as five n plus three, that quantity times one. So I'm canceling a common factor. So what I'm left with here is simply n plus one times one, which is n plus one, over n minus two times five, or five times the quantity n minus two. And again, for the sake of completeness, if you wanted to, your teacher might ask you to multiply five times n is five n, minus five times two, that's 10. So you get n plus one over five n minus 10. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have five x minus two over four x minus 20. This is multiplied by four x plus 16 over 20 x squared minus eight x. In the numerator up here, nothing I can really factor out. So five x minus two. In the denominator down here, I can pull out a four. So that would give me x minus five. Then times up here, I can pull out a four. That would give me x plus four. Then down here, I can pull out a four x. That would give me five x minus two. So what can we cancel here? Well, we can cross cancel this five x minus two with this five x minus two. And I can cross cancel this four with this four, or I can just cancel this four with this four. It doesn't really matter. So I'll cancel these. And anything else I can cancel doesn't look like it. So my numerator is just gonna be x plus four. And my denominator is gonna be four times x or four x times this quantity x minus five. And again, your teacher might let you leave it like this, or he or she might ask you to do the distributive property in the denominator. So you'll have x plus four over four x times x is four x squared. And then four x times negative five is minus 20 x. So x plus four over four x squared minus 20 x. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 15 a squared minus 35 a cubed. This is over a plus four. And then this is divided by 49a squared minus 7a minus 6 over 7a squared minus 19a minus 6. So again, we have division involved. So I'm going to, again, take the first one, multiply the, by the reciprocal of the second one. So from the numerator of the first rational expression, I can factor out a 5a squared. And that's going to leave me with 3 minus 7a. And then down here, I have a plus 4. Nothing to really factor out from there. Then I'm multiplying by the reciprocal of this. So that would be 7a squared minus 19a minus 6 over 49a squared minus 7a minus 6. So let's put our equal sign here. 
And let's factor these each individually and see what we get. So for 7a squared minus 19a minus 6, give me two integers whose product is negative 42 and whose sum is negative 19. So I would think about 21 and 2. So if I had negative 21 and positive 2, that would work. So negative 21 and positive 2. All right, so let's factor a 7a out of this first group. That gives me a minus 3. Let's factor a 2 out of the second group. So that would give me a minus 3 as well. And what's this going to give me? Well, a common binomial factor of a minus 3 can be pulled out. And this is times 7a plus 2. All right, so let's erase all this. We'll erase this and we'll put the quantity a minus 3 times the quantity 7a plus 2. All right, so now let's take a look at 49a squared minus 7a minus 6. So give me two integers whose product is negative 294 and whose sum is negative 7. So for 294, we don't really work with that a lot. So let's look at some factors using a factor tree. So I know it's divisible by 2. It's also divisible by 3. So it's got to be divisible by 6. 294 divided by 6 would be 49. So 49 times 6. Now, that's not going to get me close to negative 7, even if I played with the signs, obviously. So let's keep going. So this would be 7 times 7. This would be 3 times 2. And these are all prime. So what combination could I do? Well, I could do 21 times 14. That would work out. So if I did a negative 21 and a positive 14. So I would do 49a squared. Again, a negative 21a. Then plus 14a then minus 6, and from the first group I could pull out a 7a, so that would leave me with 7a minus 3. From the second group I could pull out a 2, so that would leave me with 7a minus 3. So the common binomial factor here is 7a minus 3, so that quantity, and then times 7a plus 2. So let's erase this, and let's throw in we have 7a minus 3, that quantity, times 7a plus 2. Okay, so let's erase everything, and let's focus on what we can cancel now. So looking at kind of the easy one, the factor of 7a plus 2 here with the factor of 7a plus 2 here, that's gone. Now, I don't have a 5 or an a squared to cancel with over here or over here. So nothing I can really do, and I see a lot of students Try to go, okay, well, I can cancel this with this. No, you can't do that. It has to be a factor. Remember what we mean when we say factor. When we say factor, in other words, these are multiplied together. This is a factor, that quantity 7a minus 3, and this is a factor, this 7a plus 2. Those are factors. This right here, this a plus 4, this is addition. If I did this, the whole thing is a factor, right? This is a factor, and this is a factor. But I can't just take part of that and say, okay, well, I'm just going to cancel the A part with this right. It doesn't work that way. Everything, the A plus the 4, that whole quantity, is the factor. So please don't make that mistake. I see it all the time. All right, so the next thing I can really cancel, and this one isn't very obvious, if I look at 3 minus 7A and I look at 7A minus 3, those are opposites. Okay, so if you notice something that has the same terms, but the signs are different, then you know they're opposite. So in other words, here I have positive 7a, here I have negative. Here I have positive 3, here I have negative. So it's the same terms involved, but the signs are different. One of the things I can do to show this to you, instead of writing 3, I can write negative 1 times negative 1 times 3. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. 1 times 3 is 3, so that's the same thing as 3. So then we have minus 7a, and I'm going to put plus negative 1 times 7 times a. Okay, I can factor out a negative 1 from here. So let's circle a negative 1 here and here, and let's pull that guy out. So I'd have a negative 1 out here, and what would happen is this would get removed, 
And so it would be equal to, you'd have negative one times, negative one times three, which is negative three, plus seven A. If I just reordered the terms, I would just have negative one times seven A minus three. So seven A minus three is the same as seven A minus three. So if you canceled those two between the numerator and the denominator, all you'd have left is a negative one. So in other words, if I cancel this with this, I can put a negative out in front here, I can put a negative one here, it doesn't matter where it goes. But essentially you're just canceling those and the result is a negative one. And again, the reason for that is because they are opposites. It's the same as if I had something like five over negative five or you know, 10 over negative 10, 10 over negative 10. They cancel, it's gonna be equal to negative one. Right, same thing. All right, so once we've got past that, there's nothing else that we can really cancel. So I'll have 5a squared times this quantity, a minus three. This is over. We have a plus four times one times negative one. So I'm just gonna put a negative one out in front of a plus four, and then that's it. So we can go through and use our distributive property if we're told to. So 5a cubed minus 15a squared over negative one times a is negative a, negative one times four is minus four. So 15a cubed minus 15a squared over negative a minus four, or if you wanted to, you could write this as 5a cubed minus 15a squared. And instead of writing negative a minus four, instead of applying the negative to that, you could have put it just a negative out in front, and you could write this as a plus four. Remember, if I have fractions, I can do, you know, four over negative one is equal to negative four over positive one. It's also equal to a negative out in front of four over one. All the same form. So you have a lot of ways to manipulate this just as you did with fractions. It's the same rules that are going to apply. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have one over three n minus four times three n squared plus eight n minus 16 over n plus two. So for kind of this first part here, one over three n minus four, nothing I can really do with that. Then for this one right here, three n squared, three n squared plus eight n minus 16. We'll factor that in a minute. And then this is over n plus two. Okay, so for three n squared plus eight n minus 16, can you give me two integers whose product is negative 48 and whose sum is positive eight? So for 48, you've got one times 48, two times 24, three times 16, four times 12. Looks like that would work. So if I did negative four and positive 12. So let me write this as three N squared plus 12 N minus four N minus 16. So in the first group, I can pull out a three N and I'll have N plus four. In the second group, I can pull out a negative four and I'll have N plus four. So I've got a common binomial factor of n plus four. So I can pull that out. And this can be multiplied by three n minus four. Okay, so it's clear what we can cancel here. It's kind of a simple one. We can cancel this factor of three n minus four with this factor of three n minus four. So this becomes one over one or just one. And then over here, I just have n plus four over n plus two. So one times anything is just itself. So this is just n plus four over n plus two. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section one, on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. All right, so we wanna perform each indicated operation. We're gonna take a look at five n squared over n plus seven times four over five n cubed plus 25 n squared. So the first thing I wanna think about is what can I cancel, right? I wanna cancel before I go through and multiply. So in order to do that, I wanna kind of factor things in such a way to where I can see what would cancel. So in other words, for here, 5n squared, yeah, I could sit there and write 5n times n if I wanted to, but it doesn't do me a whole lot of good, so I just write 5n squared. You wanna factor, but you don't necessarily have to factor completely, just to a level that shows you what can be canceled. For the denominator here, it's n plus seven. Can't really do anything with that. And times we have four over. For five n cubed plus 25 n squared, I can pull out a five n squared. So then what's left inside is going to be an n plus a five. 
Now, the only thing I can cancel here is going to be this 5n squared here with this 5n squared here. So this would be a 1, and you could put a 1 here. And then I could just multiply. 1 times 4 is 4. And then over, n plus 7 times n plus 5. So you could use FOIL for that. n times n is n squared. The outer would be 5n. The inner would be 7n. So that's plus 12n. And then the last, 7 times 5 is 35. So what I get here is 4 over n squared plus 12n plus 35. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have x squared plus 3x plus 2 over 3x plus 3. And this is multiplied by x plus 8 over x plus 2. So if I factor in the numerator up here first, give me two integers whose sum is 3 and whose product is 2. That's pretty simple. The two integers that we want would be 2 and 1. Right, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3. So plus 1 and plus 2. Over, for this one here I have 3x plus 3. Well I could pull a 3 out and I'd have x plus 1. Now what can I cancel between numerator and denominator here? Before I even go over here, I can see that I can cancel this with this. Now I'm multiplying by, I have x plus 8 over x plus 2. Now, nothing I can cancel between numerator and denominator here, but I can cancel this with this. And what I'm going to be left with is a numerator of x plus 8 over a denominator of 3. Right? Everything else has canceled. So again, final answer here, x plus 8 over 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Multiplying and Dividing Rational Expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're looking at 9r cubed minus 9r squared over 15 minus 15r. And this is divided by 2r plus 3 over 10r plus 15. All right, so for kind of the first one here, the first rational expression, we're going to leave that just as it is. Now I'm going to factor it just so that we can see what we can cancel in a minute. So I can pull out a 9r squared. And that would leave me with r minus 1. Then over here, I can pull out a 15. So if I pulled out a 15, I would be left with 1 minus r. Now, I can do some canceling here, but I'm not going to do that yet because this is one that needs to be explained. So then, remember, if you're dividing with fractions, the first one stays the same, and then you multiply by the reciprocal of the second. So it's the same with rational expressions. This 10r plus 15 would go in the numerator. I can factor out a 5. So this 5 would come here, and then I would have 2r plus 3. Now, this 2r plus 3 would come into the denominator down here. And now I can look and see what I can cancel. So the obvious ones, 2r plus 3 with 2r plus 3, and then the 9 with a 15, each is divisible by 3. So this would be 5, and this would be 3. Now, we could also cancel this 5 with this 5. And so this is completely canceled. This is now all 1. Now, one that is not so obvious is r minus 1 over 1 minus r. Those are opposites. It's just like if I had 5 over negative 5. If they cancel, you're going to get negative 1, right? And the way you can tell is if you have the same terms but different signs. In other words, you have r here, negative r. Negative 1, positive 1. So same terms but different signs. I could rearrange this and write this as negative r, negative r plus 1 if I wanted to. Now, one cool trick that you can do, let's look at this like this. If I had r minus 1 over negative r plus 1, I could pull a negative 1 out of this. So in other words, if I factor out a negative 1, I would have a negative 1 out here, and then I'd have r minus 1 inside, and then you could just cancel. You cancel this with this, and you just see that you had a negative 1 left. So if I cancel this with this, I'm going to get a negative 1. It doesn't matter if you put it up here or down here. Remember, with fractions, you can put the negative in the numerator or the denominator. It doesn't matter as long as you don't put it in both. All right. So now we're going to continue. And so 3 times negative 1 is negative 3 times r squared would be negative 3r squared. 
And that's all you're going to have. This is completely canceled, and then this is canceled down here. So I just have a negative 3r squared. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're looking at 6x squared minus 4x minus 10 over 25 minus 9x squared divided by 2x plus 2 over 3x squared minus 10x minus 25. So I want you to recall that when you divide with rational expressions, it's the same thing as if you're dividing with fractions. So the first one or the one on the left stays unchanged and we multiply by the reciprocal of the one on the right. So I'm gonna kind of set this up and as I'm setting it up, I'm just gonna factor. So the first one here for six X squared minus four X minus 10, I could pull out a two and I'd have three X squared minus two X minus five. And I could further factor that. And so let me do that down here. If I had three X squared minus two X minus five, I would look for two integers whose product is negative 15 and whose sum is negative two. Well, I could go with a negative five and a positive three. So negative five and positive three. So plus three X minus five X minus five. Now I can factor this by grouping. So in the first group, I could pull out a three X and I'd be left with X plus one. For the second group, I could pull out a negative five and I'd be left with again, X plus one. So my common binomial factor here is x plus one. So this is gonna be three x minus five times x plus one. So I'm gonna replace this with three x minus five times x plus one there. So now that that's factored, let's take a look at this denominator here. So at first glance, it doesn't seem like you can do anything. You have 25 and you have nine. You don't see a variable involved there. So 25 is five times five, nine is three times three. You're thinking, well, I can't really factor that. You gotta pay attention to these things. This is the difference of two squares. Remember, 25 is five squared and nine X squared would be what? It would be three X squared. So it's the difference of two squares. So this could factor into five plus three X times five minus three X, okay? So keep that in mind when you're looking at stuff. If you see something that is the difference of two squares, you know you need to go ahead and factor it because the way they write these problems, it's probably gonna end up having one of its factors as something you're gonna need to cancel in order to simplify. All right, so now we're multiplying by the reciprocal of this. So in the numerator, I'm gonna have this three X squared minus 10 X minus 25. And let's try to factor that real quick. So three X squared, minus 10x minus 25. Well, I can think about negative 15 and positive five. So I could do three x squared minus 15x plus five x minus 25. And then when I factor this guy, from the first group, I could pull out a three x. So that would leave me with x minus five in the second group, I could pull out a five. So that would leave me with X minus five again. So the common binomial factor is X minus five. So this would be three X plus five times X minus five. Let's copy that real quick. So we have three X plus five, that quantity times X minus five, and this is over. Remember, we're taking the reciprocal of this guy. So this went into the numerator. This is gonna go in the denominator. So two X plus two, I could pull a two out and I would have X plus one inside. Now I've factored everything. And so I'm just looking to see what I can cancel. So I can cancel this two with this two. I can cancel this X plus one with this X plus one. So if I look at X minus five, I don't have anything else I can cancel with that. So I'm gonna just put a little dot next to that just to say I can't do anything with that. If I look at three X plus five and I look at five plus three X, those are the same, right? I could reorder that. And that would say three X plus five as well. Remember, addition is commutative, so the order is unimportant. So you might see something like that to trip you up. Same factor, right? So those can be canceled. Now, here's the tricky one. You have three X, negative three X. You have negative five, positive five. Those are opposites. Just like if I had negative six over six, if I canceled them, I'd get negative one, right? To show you that, if you had three X minus five over, five minus three X. 
let's say that I pulled out a negative one from here. So how would I go about doing that? Well, let me kind of erase it and show you in a different way. Let's say I had negative one times negative one times five minus, or I could put plus negative one times three X. If I pull out a negative one here and I put it out here, what would happen is these would all get erased, right? Because I pulled them out. So I'd be left with negative one times five or negative five plus three X. So that's the same thing as here. I have negative five plus three X. It's just in a different order. So I could rearrange it to three X, three X minus five. And then look, if I cancel this now, this with this, just left with that negative one. Again, when you see something like that, same terms, but different signs. So three X and negative three X, negative five and positive five, those are opposites. And so just something you have to pay attention for because it's easy to kind of miss that again, when you're doing your homework or a test and your teacher's going to mark it wrong, right? So this would cancel with this and give me a negative one. So all I really have left is negative one times the quantity X minus five. So I could write negative out in front of the quantity X minus five, or I could use the distributive property and go negative X plus five, either way. So negative X plus five is my answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. We have r plus 8 over 3r plus 9 times 6r squared plus 30r plus 36 over 2r squared minus 6r minus 20. So before we kind of multiply here, we want to simplify by factoring everything and then seeing what we can cancel. So the r plus 8 can't really do anything with that. The 3r plus 9, I could pull out a 3. This would be r plus 3 inside the parentheses. Then times, from this guy right here, I can pull out a 6. So I'd have r squared plus 5r plus 6. Now I can factor that further. If you give me two integers, that sum to 5 and multiply together to give me 6. Well, that's 2 and 3. So I would do r plus two times r plus three. So r plus two, that quantity, times r plus three. And then down here, I can pull out a two, and I would have r squared minus three r minus 10. So give me two integers whose sum is negative three and whose product is negative 10. We can go with negative five and positive two. So it'd be r minus five, that quantity, times r plus two. Okay, so let's see what we can cancel here before we multiply. So I can cancel this with this. I can cancel this with this. I can cancel six divided by three is two, or I could do six over two would give me three, and then three over three is one. So this is canceled, that's a one. This is canceled, that's a one. So really all I'm left with, I have an R plus eight here, and I have an R minus five here. So let's go ahead and just write those over each other. So you'll have r plus eight in your numerator over r minus five in your denominator. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section five on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. All right, so we wanna perform each indicated operation. Looking at two x squared plus 10 x plus eight over two x plus two. This is divided by 56 x cubed plus 24 x squared over 14x squared plus 6x. Again, if you're dividing with rational expressions, it's the same thing as if you were dividing with fractions. Keep the leftmost or the first rational expression the same, multiply by the reciprocal of the second one. So the way I'm gonna set this up, I'm gonna have this first guy here, 2x squared plus 10x plus eight. So let's go ahead and factor this as we go. Pull out a two, we'll have x squared plus five x plus four. Now give me two integers whose sum is five and whose product is four, and you could do four and one, right? So x plus four, that quantity, times x plus one. Now the next guy in the denominator, two x plus two, I can pull out a two, and I'd have x plus one there. Now we're gonna multiply by the reciprocal of this guy. So that means that the denominator here is gonna be my numerator here. So I know I can pull out a two x, and that would leave me with 7x plus 3. Now, in my denominator, it's going to be my numerator from up here. So 56x cubed plus 24x squared. I can pull out an 8x squared 
And that's going to leave me with a 7x plus a 3. And then we can cancel some stuff. We can see x plus 1 over x plus 1. We can see 7x plus 3 over 7x plus 3. We can see that we can cancel this 2 with this 2. And then 2 with 8 would give me 4 down here and 1 here. And then I can cancel this x with one of the factors of x squared. So that would be x to the first power. So this is canceled out. Put a 1 here. This is canceled out. I'll put a 1 there. And I'll have an x plus 4 in my numerator. So this is x plus 4. In my denominator, I'm going to have a 4x. So my answer here is x plus 4 over 4x. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 45. This video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on finding the LCD for a group of rational expressions. All right, so we just want to find the LCD. So let's start out with 6x squared minus 1 over 8x plus 16. And then we have 13x to the fourth power plus 8 over x squared plus 3x plus 2. So essentially, all we need to do is factor each denominator completely. So for this one, I can pull out an 8. So I would have 8 times x plus 2. And then for this one, I could factor this to, I know I'd have an x here and here. Two integers whose sum is 3 and whose product is 2 would be 2 and 1. So now I'm going to look at each factorization here, and I'm looking for stuff that's common. So if I have, in other words, this quantity x plus 2 here and here, when I build my LCD, I'm only going to put in the largest number of repeats between any of the factorizations. So I would only put one of those in there. So I'd put in, let me kind of slide this down a little bit. I'd put in one x plus two. That's it. I don't need to put in this one and this one. It only occurs once in each. So I just put in one here. Then I'm going to put in x plus one. And I'm going to put in eight. All your factors are going to go in. It's just if you have something that's a duplicate, in other words, it occurs here and here, you only want to put the largest number of repeats that occurs in any of the factorizations. So, for example, if I would have had, let's say, another factor of x plus 2, then I would have 2 here and 1 here. So when I build the LCD, I would put 2 in, right? Not 3. But in this particular circumstance, we had 1 here and 1 here. So in either factorization, we only had 1. So when we build this guy, we only put 1 in. So the LCD is 8 times the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 1. And generally speaking, when we talk about LCDs, we leave them in factored form, right? We don't need to go through and multiply everything together. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have negative 3x to the seventh power plus 5 over 3x squared plus 5x minus 2. And then we have 11x to the fourth power minus 3 over 6x squared minus 20x plus 6. So to factor this one, nothing to pull out the start. Give me two integers whose product is negative 6 and whose sum is 5. So I could do positive 6 and negative 1. So I'm going to use that to rewrite this. So I'm going to have 3x squared plus 6x. And then I'll do minus x and then minus 2. So I'm going to factor by grouping. So in the first group, I can pull out a 3x. So I can pull out 3x and I'd have x plus 2. And then from here, to get an x plus 2, to get a common binomial factor, it's obvious I need to pull out a negative 1. If I pull out a negative from each one, I put a negative one out in front, and I'll have a positive x plus a positive 2. So I have that common binomial factor there of x plus 2. So essentially what I'm going to end up with, let me just kind of erase all of this. I don't need it anymore. This is going to factor into, we have 3x minus 1, that quantity, times the quantity x plus 2. Now moving on to this one, before we even start, we can pull out a 2. So I can pull out a 2, and I would have 3x squared minus 10x plus 3. So give me two integers whose product is 9 and whose sum is negative 10. We well, could do negative 9 and negative 1, right? Negative 9 times negative 1 is going to give me positive 9. Negative 9 plus negative 1 is negative 10. So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm just going to work on the inside. I don't need to worry about the 2. So 3x squared, I'm going to do minus 9x minus x plus 3. And so from this first group, I can pull out a 3x, and that will give me x minus 3. Then from the second group, if I pull out a negative 1, I'm going to get a common binomial factor of x minus 3. 
So now I know what this is going to be. Let me erase the inside of this real quick. I know that I'm going to have 3x minus 1, and then the other one's going to be x minus 3. Let me kind of close this down. Okay, so let's erase all this. And now for our LCD, again, we're looking at the factorizations. So I have 3x minus 1 here, and I have 3x minus 1 here. So it occurs once here, once here. When I build my LCD, I just need one of those. I don't need two. Then I have x plus 2. Then I have x minus 3. So everything goes in, and then I have a 2. So let me kind of squeeze that in down here. And that's my LCD. 2 times the quantity 3x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 3. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 12x squared minus 7x minus 1 over x squared minus 81. And then we have 3x to the ninth power minus 19 over 2x cubed plus 10x squared minus 72x. So this one's easy to factor. It's the difference of two squares. It's x plus 9 times x minus 9. Then this guy right here, I can pull out a 2x before I start. And I'll have x squared plus 5x minus 36. And they give me two integers whose sum is 5 and whose product is negative 36. I know I can do 9 minus 4 and get 5. So it looks like that would work. I just need to play with the signs. So if I did positive 9 and negative 4, that would work. So I want x plus 9, x plus 9, times x minus 4. So now if I look here, I have x plus 9 and I have x plus 9. So that's only going to go in once when I build my list. So my LCD is going to be x plus 9, that quantity, times x minus 9, that quantity, times x minus 4, that quantity, and then I have a 2x. Let me kind of slide everything down. So I'm going to throw that 2x in there. And so my LCD here is 2x times the quantity x plus 9 times the quantity x minus 9 times the quantity x minus 4. All right, let's take a look at another one. We have 9x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 2x minus 35. We have 4x cubed plus 7 over x squared plus 3x minus 40. And then we have 8x to the 7th power minus 13 over x squared minus 2x minus 15. All right, so let's factor each one. So for this one... We know it's x and then x. So two integers whose sum is 2, whose product is negative 35. So if I do positive 7 and negative 5, that would work. Then for this one, I need two integers whose sum is 3, whose product is negative 40. So let me think about that. I could do 1 times 40, no. 2 times 20, no. 4 times 10, no. 5 times 8, yes. So if I did a positive 8 and a negative 5, that would work out. All right, for this last one over here, we have x and then we have x. So then I'm looking for two integers whose sum is negative 2 and whose product is negative 15. So I could do positive 3 and negative 5. 3 plus negative 5 is negative 2. 3 times negative 5 is negative 15, so that would work out. All right, so when we build our LCD, Let's look at everything here. So the first thing I always look at, I just, I just look at duplicate factors, so I only list them once. So x minus 5, x minus 5, x minus 5. So nothing else is repeated, really. So I'm just going to throw one of those in there, because the largest number of repeats in any of the factorizations here is just, is just 1. So I just put one of those in when I build my LCD. Then x plus 7 goes in, x plus 8 goes in, and then x plus 3 goes in. So the LCD here is x minus 5, that quantity, times the quantity x plus 7, times the quantity x plus 8, times the quantity x plus 3. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. I saved the best for last. So negative 2x squared minus 5 over 5x squared minus 20x plus 15, and then 10x to the 4th power minus 7 over 3x squared minus 3, and then 9x to the 5th power minus 17x to the 4th power minus 2 over 30x squared plus 15x minus 315. All right, so for the first denominator, 5x squared minus 20x plus 15, I could pull out a 5 to start. That would give me x squared minus 4x plus 3. Now give me two integers whose sum is negative 4 and whose product is 3. Well, I could do negative 3 and negative 1. So x minus 3, that quantity, times x minus 1. Now, 
Moving on over here, we know we can pull a 3 out to start, and I would have x squared minus 1. Now, a lot of you will stop there. Remember, 1 is a perfect square, so in other words, 1 times 1 gives me 1. So I have the difference of two squares here. So I can further factor this into x plus 1, that quantity, times x minus 1. Okay, for the last denominator here, looks kind of complicated. Let's scroll down and get a little room going. I notice that everything ends in a 0 or a 5. So that means they're all divisible by 5. Now, they're also all divisible by 3. This is 3 plus 0, that's 3. 1 plus 5 is 6, that's divisible by 3. 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 plus 5 is 9, that's divisible by 3. So if a number is divisible by both 3 and 5, it's divisible by 15. So that means I could pull a 15 out to start. So then this would be 2x squared plus x, and then minus 315 divided by 15 would be 21, 21. Okay, so now I need to get two integers whose product is negative 42 and whose sum is going to be 1. So if I think about 42, the thing that comes to my mind is 6 and 7. I don't need to make a factor tree because 6 times 7 is 42. Those are able to be different by 1 if I have a positive 7 and a negative 6. So let's use that to rewrite this. So we're going to do 15 times, we have 2x squared plus 7x minus 6x minus 21. Now, because we're factoring by grouping, let me switch that order. So let me write minus 6x over here. Let me write plus 7x here. It makes more sense so things can be in common. Let's put equals. And now in the first group, I can pull out a 2x. That'll leave me with x minus 3. In the second group, I'm going to pull out a 7. And that, again, will leave me with x minus 3. So let me close parentheses there. The common binomial factor is x minus 3. So I have 15 times x minus 3 and then times 2x plus 7. All right, so let's erase all this stuff. We have what we need. All right, now for the LCD, Again, if anything's repeated, we're only going to put the largest number of repeats. So I know I have an x minus 3 here and here. Only one occurs in each factorization. I also see that I have an x minus 1 here and here. If we think about the number parts, I have a 3 here and I have a 5 here. And what is 15? It's 5 times 3. So when I build this LCD, the number part will be what? It's 5 times 3 or 15. Because these two each have a 5 in it. I'm only going to put the largest number of repeats from that, so I'd put 1 5 in. These two each have a 3. Largest number of repeats is 1, so I'd put 1 3 in. 5 times 3 is 15. So we put 15 in. Then I have my x minus 3. That only goes in once. I have one occurrence here, one here. Then I'd put in my x minus 1. That only goes in once. I have it here and here. Then I have my x plus 1. And then I have finally my 2x plus 7. So my LCD here is 15 times the quantity x minus 3, times the quantity x minus 1, times the quantity x plus 1, finally times the quantity 2x plus 7. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on finding the LCD, the least common denominator, for a group of rational expressions. All right, so we want to find the LCD. And we're looking at 4n plus 1 over 5n squared minus 20n. And we're also looking at 3n over n squared minus 16. So the first thing we want to do is factor each denominator completely. So if I look at this one, I could pull out a 5n. That would leave me with n minus 4. If I look at this one, it's the difference of two squares, right? n squared minus 16. 16 is what? It's 4 squared. So this is n plus 4, that quantity, times n minus 4, that quantity. And then when I build my LCD... I put each factor in here. Remember, these are factors. This is a factor, this is a factor, this is a factor, this is a factor. So everything's going to go in. The only thing that doesn't go in, or the only exception to the rule, if we have something that's a duplicate factor, meaning it appears in more than one factorization, we put the largest number of repeats between the factorizations. So 
In this case, we have n minus 4, that quantity here, and also here. In each case, it only occurs once. So when I build my LCD, I would only put one of those in there. So 1n minus 4. Then n plus 4, I'll throw that in there. And then 5n goes in there. So I get 5n times the quantity n minus 4 times the quantity n plus 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on finding the LCD or a group of rational expressions. All right, so we just want to find the LCD. We're going to take a look at, we have 5x over 4x plus 8, and then we also have negative 2 over x squared plus 3x plus 2. So to find the LCD, the least common denominator, remember we want to find the LCM, the least common multiple, of the two denominators. So to do that, we want to start by just factoring each one. So for this guy right here, I notice that there's a 4 that's common to each term. All right, I got a 4 here, and then I've got 8, which is 4 times 2. So if I pulled a 4 out, here I would just have an x, and then plus, here I would have a 2, right? 8 divided by 4 is 2. Now if I factor this guy right here, I've got x squared plus 3x plus 2. So that's going to factor into two binomials. So this will be x, and this will be x. And then give me two integers whose sum is 3, and whose product is 2. Well, that would be positive 2 and also positive 1, right? 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 times 1 is 2. Now, when we go to build our list for the LCD, what we're going to throw in there is each factor. The only exception to this is if we have a duplicate factor. If we have a duplicate factor, as I've said in every video, you put the largest number of repeats between any of the factorizations. So, for example, we have the number 4, right? 4 is a factor. 4 doesn't appear in this factorization over here, so we're just going to throw it in here. Then we have x plus 2. That's a factor. We have it here, and then we also have it in this factorization over here. So it's a duplicate factor because it occurs in each factorization. But it only occurs once in each. It occurs once here and once here. So the common mistake is when you're building this list to put it in twice. They'll go, okay, well, I want x plus 2 that quantity times x plus 2 again. That's wrong. That's going to give you a common denominator, but it won't be the least common denominator. We want to find the least common denominator to save ourselves some work. So, again, I can't say this enough. We only want to put one factor of x plus 2 in here because the largest number of repeats between either factorization for that factor x plus 2 is 1, right? It occurs once here and once here. So now once we're past that, we look at the only other factor that we didn't deal with, and that's x plus 1, that quantity. We just throw that in there. It's not anywhere else, so we don't need to do anything other than that. And so we have our LCD. It's 4 times the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on finding the LCD, again the least common denominator, for a group of rational expressions. All right, so we want to find the LCD. And we're looking at 8x minus 7 over 12x plus 60. We're looking at 17x to the fourth power minus 5 over x squared plus 5x. And we're looking at 13x cubed minus 4x plus 19 over x squared plus 10x plus 25. So to find the LCD, what we want to do is factor each denominator to start. So for this first one here, I could pull out a 12, and I would have x plus 5 inside. For this one right here, I could pull out an x, and that would give me an x plus 5. And then for this one right here, I could factor it into the product of two binomials. So I'd have x here and x here. So give me two integers whose sum is 10 and whose product is 25. Well, that's easy. It's 5 and 5. So x plus 5 and x plus 5. Now, when we build our LCD, we're going to put in each factor. The exception is if I have a factor that's common to more than one factorization, I'm going to put in the largest number of repeats between any of those factorizations. So in this one, we have x plus 5 here and here, and then we have two of them here. So the largest number of repeats is x plus 5 times x plus 5, or two of those. So when I build my LCD, I would put in x plus 5, that amount, that quantity, squared, or I could write it out. I could put x plus 5, that quantity, times x plus 5, either way. The main thing is to understand that I'm not putting four of those in there. I know I have four total, but the largest number of repeats between any of the factorizations is two. I have one here, 
one here. So two there, one there, one there. Largest number of repeats is two. So when I build my LCD, I put in two. Now, every other factor has got to go in. Now, X is a factor. That's got to go in. And 12 is a factor. That's got to go in. So let me scooch this down a little bit. And I just want this part. And I'm going to write 12X here. And I'm going to rewrite X plus 5 times X plus 5. So that's my LCD. I would have 12X times the quantity X plus 5 times, again, the quantity X plus 5. Or you could write 12X times the quantity X plus 5 squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on finding the LCD, the least common denominator, for a group of rational expressions. All right, so we just want to find the LCD. And we're going to look at x minus 7 over 6x squared plus 7x minus 3. And then also 12x to the fourth power plus 1 over 12x cubed plus 14x squared minus 6x. All right, so we want to factor each denominator to start. And for this one... I need two integers whose product is negative 18 and whose sum is 7. So if I think about 18, I'm going to think about 2 and 9. So if I do positive 9 and negative 2, that would work. So I'm going to write this as 6x squared, and then plus 9x, and then minus 2x, and then minus 3. So if I pull out a 3x to start from the first group, I would have 2x plus 3. And then if I pull out a negative 1 from here... I would have 2x plus 3. So the common binomial factor here is 2x plus 3. So we would pull that out, and we would have 3x minus 1, that quantity, times 2x plus 3. So this right here is, again, 3x minus 1. We're multiplying this by 2x plus 3. Now over here, for this denominator, 12x cubed plus 14x squared minus 6x, I could pull out a 2x to start, and I would have 6x squared plus 7x minus 3. And what I notice is that this is the same thing as this, right? Once I've kind of taken out that 2x. So I know what this factors into. It factors into this because I just did that. So I'll have 2x times, we have 3x minus 1, and then times 2x plus 3. Now, when I build my LCD, what I want to do is I want to put in each factor now, when I have a duplicate factor, meaning it occurs in more than one factorization, I put the largest number of repeats between any factorization. So in this particular case, I have 3x minus 1 and 3x minus 1. So that occurs once in each, so I would just put 1 in when I build my LCD. Same thing goes for this 2x plus 3. Okay, the 2x plus 3 here and here. One occurrence for each, so I'm just going to throw 1 in here. And then I have the 2x, right? So the 2x goes in there. And so my LCD is 2x times the quantity 3x minus 1 times the quantity 2x plus 3. And again, the reason for that is once I pulled a 2x out from here, I had basically the same thing as this over here. So, of course, it's just going to be 2x times this guy, which is 3x minus 1 times 2x plus 3. So that's how I got my LCD. Again, 2x times the quantity 3x minus 1 times the quantity 2x plus 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on finding the LCD for a group of rational expressions. All right, so we want to find the LCD. So what we have here, we have 5x to the fourth power minus 4 over 12x squared minus 31x plus 7. We have negative 3x to the fifth power plus 7x squared minus 11 over 40x squared minus 50x minus 15. And then we have 7x to the seventh power over 16x squared minus 20x minus 6. All right, so the first thing we want to do is just factor everything. So for this guy right here, going to be kind of tedious to factor it. Let's do it down here so we can get a little room going. So 12x squared minus 31x plus 7. So give me two integers whose product is going to be 84. So 84 for the product. And then a sum of negative 31. So for 84, I've got 1 times 84. I've got 2 times 42. I've got 3 times 28. Now, if I had negative 3 and negative 28, that would work, right? Negative 3 plus negative 28 is negative 31. Negative 3 times negative 28 is positive 84. So we're going to rewrite this as 12x squared. And then I'm going to put minus 3x and then minus 28x and then plus 7. 
So out of this first group here, I could pull out a 3x, and I'd have 4x minus 1. From the second group, I could pull out a negative 7, and that would leave me with 4x minus 1. So there's a common binomial factor there of 4x minus 1. So what we'd have is the quantity 3x minus 7 times the quantity 4x minus 1. So let's copy this and bring it back up to the top. Okay, now for this one, I could pull out a 5 before I even start. Pull out a 5 and I'd have what? I'd have 8x squared minus 10x minus 3. And then I'd factor the inside here. So if I think about two integers whose product is negative 24 and whose sum is negative 10, that's pretty easy. You just use 12 and 2. So I could do negative 12 and positive 2. So 8x squared minus 12x plus 2x and then minus 3. And from this first group here, I could pull out a 4x. And that would leave me with 2x minus 3. And then from here, I already have a 2x minus 3, so just put a 1 there. 1 times anything is itself, so 1 times 2x minus 3. So now the common binomial factor is 2x minus 3, so let's erase this. So we'll put 5 times, we have 2x minus 3. Then times, we have 4x plus 1. Let's erase all this. And now we can move on down here. We have 16x squared minus 20x minus 6. And before we start, we could pull a 2 out from everything. So if I pulled a 2 out, I would have 8x squared minus 10x minus 3. Now, don't keep going. You just saw that over here, right? I just pulled out a 5, and I had what? I had 8x squared minus 10x minus 3. So this is going to factor the same way as that because it's the same thing. So I already know what that factors into, so I can erase this. I can just say, okay, well, it's going to be 2 times 2x minus 3 times 4x plus 1. All right, so when I build my LCD, very, very simple. Every factor that I created here is going to go in there. What I'm looking for is the exception to that. If I have a duplicate factor, so in other words, if I have a factor that occurs in more than one of the factorizations, I'm only going to use the largest number of repeats between any of the factorizations. So, for example, with 2x minus 3, it occurs here and here. Now, there's two of them, but it occurs once in each factorization, so I'm only going to throw one in when I build my LCD, just one. Same thing goes with 4x plus 1. I'm just going to throw one in because I have one here and one here, right? So the largest number of repeats is one, so we just put one in. So 4x plus 1 goes there. And then what else do I have? I have a 3x minus 7. And I have a 4x minus 1. So also a 4x minus 1. And then numbers, I have a 5 and I have a 2. Don't forget about those. 5 times 2 is 10. So my LCD here is 10 times. We have 2x minus 3, that quantity, times the quantity 4x plus 1, times the quantity 3x minus 7, times the quantity 4x minus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 46. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on adding and subtracting rational expressions. Okay, so we just want to perform each indicated operation. So we're going to start out with r minus 4 over 2r times the quantity 5r plus 3, then minus 6r minus 4 over 2r times the quantity 5r plus 3. So we have kind of an easier problem here because we already have a common denominator of 2r times the quantity 5r plus 3. So all we need to do is subtract numerators. Now, pay attention here. If I'm subtracting this whole thing away, I've got to put parentheses around this guy because I want to subtract away the 6r and the negative 4. Very, very important. So let's, let's write this as r minus 4, then minus, and inside of parentheses, 6r minus 4. And then over, we have 2r, again, times the quantity 5r plus 3. So this equals, we have r minus 4, I'm going to distribute this minus to each term inside the parentheses. So I'd have minus 6r and then plus 4. Right? I just change the sign of each term. Then over, again, 2r times the quantity 5r plus 3. This is equal to, so I'd have r minus 6r, that's negative 5r. And then I would have negative 4 plus 4, that's 0. So I just have negative 5r here, so negative 5r over. 2r times the quantity 5r plus 3. 
Now, I can cancel a common factor of r. I can cancel this r with this r. Remember, this is multiplication here, so I can always cancel common factors, okay? So then what I'm left with in the end is a negative 5 in my numerator over 2 times the quantity 5r plus 3 in my denominator. Again, don't make the mistake of going, okay, well, I can also cancel this with this. No, you cannot. You have to cancel factors. This is all multiplication here. I'm multiplying 2 times r times this quantity 5r plus 3. So everything here is a factor. So r is a factor and negative 5 is a factor here. So that's why I can cancel those two. I can't go in here. This is not a factor, this 5r here. The 5r plus 3 is a factor. The whole thing is a factor and 2 is a factor there. So these are factors. So pay close attention to that. I don't want you to make a silly mistake and say, okay, well, I can cancel this with this. Again, you cannot. You cancel common factors. So we end up with negative 5 over, again, 2 times the quantity, 5r plus 3. All right, let's take a look at another easy one. We have x plus 6 over the quantity 5x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 4. Then I'm adding to this x minus 5 over the quantity 5x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 4. So again, if I have a common denominator already, I just need to add the numerators. And to make this kind of simple, let's just add x plus x, that's 2x. And then 6 minus 5 is going to be 1. So I have 2x plus 1. And this is over the quantity 5x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 4. Nothing I can really do to simplify this any further. 2x plus 1, that can't really be factored. And then I don't have anything down here that's a 2x plus 1. Again, this is 2x plus 1, that quantity. If I had a 2x plus 1 down here, I could cancel it. But I don't have that, so I can't do anything. Again, the common mistake is for students to go, okay, well, I can cancel this 2 with this 4. You, you can't do that. It's got to be a common factor, okay? So again, 2x plus 1 over the quantity 5x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 4. All right, so let's take a look at another one. I have 3x minus 2 over 5x plus 3, that quantity, times the quantity 2x minus 1, then minus 6x minus 7 over the quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 5. So for my LCD, I have 2x minus 1 here and here. So I only need to put it in once. So 2x minus 1. Then I have this times 5x plus 3. Then I have times x plus 5. This is one of those ones that's kind of tedious because I have so many things I have to do here. So to crank this out, from this guy, I would multiply by what it's missing. right? So I would multiply top and bottom here by x plus 5. I'm just going to write the LCD in the end as the denominator. So let me just work with the numerators. So 3x minus 2 would be multiplied by x plus 5. Then I would subtract away. And I'm putting my brackets there because I don't want to forget that I'm subtracting away this whole thing here. So whatever goes inside. Now, for this one, what I'm missing from the LCD is a 5x plus 3. So I would multiply the top and bottom by 5x plus 3. I'm just going to do it to the numerator for right now. So 5x plus 3 times 6x minus 7. Okay. So now I'm going to write this over the LCD. So this is 2x minus 1. We have that quantity times 5x plus 3. That quantity times the quantity x plus 5. Okay, so once we have that, we can go through and do our multiplication in the numerator. So 3x times x is 3x squared. The outer would be 15x. The inner would be minus 2x. So 15x minus 2x is 13x. So plus 13x. Negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. Then I'm subtracting this whole thing away. 5x times 6x is 30x squared. 5x times negative 7 is minus 35x. 3 times 6x is plus 18x. If I combine like terms here, I get negative 17. So that would be minus 17x. And then the last one, 3 times negative 7 is negative 21. Okay. Again, this is all over. We have 2x minus 1, that quantity, times 5x plus 3. That quantity times x plus 5. Okay. So these three quantities multiplied together. All right, so I'm going to remove the brackets here, and all I'm going to do is just change the sign of everything. So if I erase this, 
This would be negative, this would be positive, and this would be positive. Just change the sign of each term. Now I can combine like terms. So 3x squared minus 30x squared is going to be negative 27x squared. 13x plus 17x is plus 30x. Negative 10 plus 21 is plus 11. Okay, this is all over. Again, that common denominator, quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity 5x plus 3 times the quantity x plus 5. Okay. So can we factor this? Well, can you give me two integers whose product would be what? Negative 297 and whose sum would be 30. So let's make a factor tree for 297. We don't work with that very often. So for 297, I could factor this into 11 times 27. We know that 11 is prime. 27 is basically 3 cubed, right? I could do 9 times 3, and 9 is 3 times 3. So what we'd have here, we'd have 1 times 297. That obviously wouldn't work. I would have 3 times 99. That wouldn't work. I would have 9 times 33. That wouldn't work. And I would have 27 times 11. And that's not going to work either. So I'm out of things that I could use here. And so none of these would work. So this is prime up here. So this would be our final answer. Negative 27x squared plus 30x plus 11 over the quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity 5x plus 3 times the quantity x plus 5. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have z plus 3a over c squared plus 2za plus a squared plus z minus a over z squared plus 4za plus 3a squared. So this is probably something that you get in algebra 2. It's not very common in algebra 1 where you have more than one variable involved. But to get your LCD, it's no more difficult. Okay, I kind of gave you an easy one. Factoring something with two variables is the same as factoring something with one variable. I'm going to show you the little trick here. And we talked about this when we learned how to factor, but you may have forgotten it. If I have ax squared plus bx plus c, and a is 1. So let's say a equals 1. When I factor this, I want two integers whose sum, I have x here and x here, but two integers whose sum is b, sum is b, and whose product is c. Okay, and I place those results in here and here, and I've factored that trinomial. In this case, you have a z squared to kind of start it off. So I'm treating z squared like x squared. Any other variable that presents itself, in this case, that's going to be a. Let me highlight that in a different color. I'm going to treat that here as it's part of the coefficient, right? So it's 2a as the coefficient of z. And then here I'm going to treat it as the constant term. So in other words, b here is 2a, and c here is going to be a squared. It's very, very simple. So all I want to do is replace this formula and say that I want a sum of 2a, so I want a sum of 2a and a product of a squared. And that's very, very easy to get. Let me erase this real quick. If I started out by just saying, OK, well, I know this is z here and z here. Well, a sum of 2a and a product of a squared, that's just a and a, right? a times a is a squared. a plus a is 2a. So plus a and plus a. And now some of you see that this right here is a perfect square trinomial, right? It follows that formula. I have the first guy that's squared. Then I have two times the first guy times the second guy, so two times z times a. And then I have the last guy squared. It's a perfect square trinomial. So it factors into z plus a, that quantity squared. Now for this one, I'm going to follow the same formula. Again, very, very simple to factor. z here and z here. And then I want two terms whose sum is 4a. I'm treating 4a as the coefficient for z. So I want a sum of 4a. And I want a product of 3a squared. Product of 3a squared. Well, I can do 3a times a. 3a plus a is 4a. 3a times a is 3a squared. So plus 3a and then plus a. Very, very easy overall. Again, it looks complicated when you first start out. You're like, oh, I have two variables involved. What am I going to do? But it's, 
it's really, really simple if you know how to apply the proper technique, just like anything else in math. So now I can just get my LCD going. So I have Z plus A here, here, and here. Again, you look at the factorizations. You go with the largest number of repeats. I have two factors of Z plus A here and one here. So it's going to go in twice. And then I have a Z plus 3A. Z plus 3A. So that's my LCD. It's basically the quantity Z plus A squared and then times Z plus 3A. So let's erase this real quick. What I'm missing over here, if I think about these numerators, I would have Z plus 3A. I would be multiplying the numerator denominator by what I'm missing. I am missing the Z plus 3A. So I'm going to multiply this by Z plus 3A. And that gives me Z plus 3A, that quantity squared. And then plus, over here, I have the Z minus A. I would be multiplying by what I'm missing over here, which would be another factor of Z plus A. So another factor of Z plus A. So once I've done this, I can just write this over the LCD, which again is the quantity Z plus A times the quantity Z plus A again times the quantity Z plus 3A. Okay, so let's erase this. We don't need it anymore. And let's do some multiplication in the numerator. So I know this is the quantity Z plus 3A squared. The formula for that is simple. It's the first guy squared plus two times the first guy times the second guy. Two times three is six. Six times Z times A is six ZA. And then the last guy squared. Three A squared is nine A squared. Okay, very, very simple. And then we have plus. Over here we have the difference of two squares. So this would be what? Z squared minus a squared. Okay, very, very easy to do. If you spot these patterns, that's where it saves you a lot of time. Okay, then again, this is over. That z plus a, that quantity, times z plus a, that quantity again. Or you could write z plus a, that quantity squared, whatever you want to do. And then times z plus 3a, that quantity. And then I just want to simplify in the numerator. So I see z squared plus z squared, that's 2z squared. Then I have plus 6za. And then I have 9a squared minus a squared, that's plus 8a squared. Then this is over. Again, we have z plus a, that quantity, times that quantity again, z plus a, then times the quantity z plus 3a. Okay. So now, can I factor this numerator? Well, I know I can pull a 2 out of here. So 2 times, we'd have z squared plus 3za plus 4a squared. Can I factor it further? Let me write this again. Well, can you give me two terms whose sum is 3a and whose product is 4a squared? Well, you won't be able to do that because of the signs. Just think about the integer part. So if you think about 4, I can either do 1 and 4. 1 times 4 is 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. And I can't make anything negative because they're both positive. I'd have to have two positive signs. So that wouldn't work. Then I have 2 and 2, right? 2 times 2 would be 4, but 2 plus 2 is also 4, not 3. So we won't be able to factor this any further. And so the simplified form of this is 2z squared plus 6za plus 8a squared. Or the numerator could be written like this, 2 times the quantity z squared plus 3za plus 4a squared. And then over the denominator of the quantity z plus a, that's squared. You've got two occurrences of it. And then times the quantity z plus 3a. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on adding and subtracting rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. We're going to look at v minus 3 over 3 times the quantity 5v minus 2, then minus v plus 1 over 3 times the quantity 5v minus 2. So we already have a common denominator here of 3 times the quantity 5v minus 2. So all we need to do is subtract numerators. Now, what you want to pay attention for, I'm subtracting this whole thing away over here. Okay, so this numerator minus this whole other numerator. So I want to use parentheses when I set this up. So v minus 3 minus, inside of parentheses, I'm going to put v plus 1, then over 3 times the quantity, 5v minus 2. Okay, so to remove the parentheses, I want to change the sign of each term. So I'd have v minus 3, then minus v, then minus 1. Okay, then over 
three times the quantity, 5v minus 2. So then now I can just simplify. v minus v is 0. And then negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. So I'd have negative 4 over 3 times the quantity, 5v minus 2. Nothing I can do to really simplify further here. So that's my answer. Again, negative 4 over 3 times the quantity, 5v minus 2. All right, so let's take a look at another one. So we have x plus 1 over the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 7. Then plus, we have x plus 3 over the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 7. So what we want to do, again, we have a common denominator already of the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 7. So I want to add my numerators, put the result over the common denominator. So x plus x would be 2x, and then 1 plus 3 would be 4, so plus 4. Put that over your common denominator of the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x plus 7. Now I could factor this numerator. If you notice, each has a 2 that's common, right, each term there. So I could pull that out, and I'd have x plus 2, and I can see that I can cancel a common factor of x plus 2, that quantity, between numerator and denominator. Remember, this is multiplication. So this is multiplication also. So I can cancel this with this. Those are each factors, so they can be canceled. So what I'm going to have is a 2 over x plus 7. So x plus 7. And that is my final answer. There's nothing else I can do to simplify. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on adding and subtracting rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we have p minus 4 over, we have 2 times the quantity 2p plus 5, then plus. We have 2p minus 3 over 2 times the quantity 2p plus 5. Okay, so we have a common denominator here, so it's really simple. We just need to add the numerators, place the result over the common denominator. So p plus 2p would be 3p. Negative 4 plus negative 3 is negative 7, so I'm going to put minus 7. And then over that common denominator of 2 times the quantity 2p plus 5. I can't factor the numerator here, so this is as simple as it's going to get. Again, 3p minus 7 over 2 times the quantity 2p plus 5. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 6n plus 5 over the quantity 3n minus 1 times the quantity 5n plus 2. Then minus, I have n plus 3 over the quantity 3n minus 1 times the quantity 5n plus 2. Okay. So we have a common denominator. All I need to do is subtract the numerators. Now, pay attention. You have a minus sign here. I'm subtracting the whole numerator away. Okay, so it's this numerator minus this whole numerator. So the quick way to do that is to just change the sign of each term that's being subtracted away. So I would write 6n plus 5. I'm subtracting away n, so minus n. I'm subtracting away 3, so minus 3. Kind of the other way to do that, to remind yourself, is just to put a minus sign out in front of some parentheses, and inside you put n plus 3. Again, you're kind of distributing this to each term. So you're changing the sign of each term inside the parentheses, and so you end up with, again, negative n minus 3. Okay, so this is all over that common denominator of 3n minus 1, that quantity, times the quantity 5n plus 2. So now I can just combine like terms in the numerator. 6n minus n is 5n, so 5n. Then 5 minus 3 is 2, so plus 2. So this is over. Again, we have 3n minus 1, that quantity, times the quantity 5n plus 2. Now, if I put this in parentheses and I put times 1, it's completely obvious that we have a common factor of 5n plus 2, right, that quantity. Again, these are factors. This is multiplication here. This quantity, 3n minus 1, is being multiplied by this quantity, 5n plus 2. This quantity, 5n plus 2, is being multiplied by 1. So I can cancel those common factors. So what I'm left with is a 1 in my numerator, and in the denominator, a 3n minus 1. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on adding and subtracting rational expressions. So we want to perform each indicated operation. We're going to take a look at 4n over n minus 2 minus 2n minus 1 over 4n minus 8. So the first thing we got to do is get a common denominator going. And we want to just find the LCD, the least common denominator. So what we're going to do for that is factor each denominator. Now n minus 2, I can't factor that. So I'm just going to throw that in there. And then 4n minus 8, I can factor that into 4 times the quantity n minus 2. 
So you can see that the LCD would be what? It would be four times the quantity n minus two. You've got that here and here, so only one goes in, and then I've only got a four here, so that goes in as well. Now, this denominator here is already equal to the LCD, so I don't need to touch this rational expression. What I do need to do is change this rational expression into an equivalent rational expression where this is its denominator. So I do the same thing as when I work with fractions. So I'm gonna take 4n over n minus two, and I'm gonna multiply this by what I'm missing from the LCD, which is four, right? If I multiply the denominator down here by four, I would have a denominator of four times the quantity n minus two. But to make it legal, I've gotta also do it to the numerator. Remember, four over four is one, I'm just multiplying by a complex form of one, but I'm not changing the value. Okay, then minus, this isn't gonna change at all, so two n minus one. I'm just gonna write the denominator in its factored form, four times the quantity n minus two. Okay, so let's go down here. I can erase this, we know what the LCD is. Four n times four is 16 n. And then we're subtracting away two n minus one. So if I'm subtracting this whole thing away, I wanna put it inside of parentheses. Okay, this is over, four times the quantity, n minus two. So to remove the parentheses, I wanna change each sign inside of the parentheses. So I would have 16n minus two n plus one. Okay, distribute that negative to each term. Very, very important. Then over, again, four times the quantity, n minus two. So to combine like terms here, 16n minus two n is 14n. So I would have 14n plus one over four times the quantity n minus two. Now there's nothing else I can do to simplify. I can't factor 14n plus one. I could write four as two times two, but it's just not gonna do me any good. Again, please don't make the mistake. I see this all the time. Students will go, okay, I got 14 and four. I divide 14 by two, I get seven. Four by two, I get two. No, that's wrong, right? You have to cancel factors. So in other words, these are factors. Four is a factor, and the quantity n minus two is a factor. So if I had a four up here that was multiplying something else, or if I had a two that was multiplying something else, or if I had the quantity n minus two that was multiplying something else, I could cancel. But I don't have any of those, so I don't have a common factor, so I can't do anything. This is simplified. So again, 14n plus one over four times the quantity n minus two. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have five over two m plus three plus four over five m plus four. So my LCD, since I can't factor any of these denominators, would just be the product of the two. So the LCD is gonna be here, two m plus three, that quantity, times the quantity five m plus four. Now what I'm gonna do is multiply each rational expression by the other rational expressions denominator so that I have a denominator in each case that is the LCD. So let's put this equals. I'm gonna put five times. Now this denominator is two m plus three. So I'm gonna be multiplying by five m plus four, that quantity. I would do it to the top and the bottom and that would give me the LCD as the denominator. So I'm not gonna write that. I'll just write my denominator in the end. Then plus, I would have four times. This one is five m plus four. So I would be multiplying the top and bottom by two m plus three. So I'm gonna multiply this by the quantity two m plus three. And this is over. In both cases, you'd end up with the LCD as your denominator. So we use that as the common denominator of the quantity 2m plus 3. Again, times the quantity 5m plus 4. Okay, so now 5 times 5m is going to give me 25m. 5 times 4 is 20. Plus 4 times 2m is 8m. 4 times 3 is 12. So if I combine like terms here, 25m plus 8m is 33m. So let's write 33m. And 20 plus 12 is 32, so plus 32. And over that common denominator, again, of the quantity 2m plus 3 times the quantity 5m plus 4. I can't really do anything to factor this. Again, we're looking to cancel common factors. So my simplified answer is 33m plus 32 over the quantity 2m plus 3 times the quantity 5m plus 4. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on adding and subtracting rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. 
So we have 3x squared minus 5x minus 7 over 2x squared minus 2. Then plus, we have 4x squared minus 3x plus 8 over 5x plus 5. So the first thing we want to do is get a common denominator here. And to find our LCD, we're going to factor each denominator. Now the first one, I know I can pull out a 2. So if I pull out a 2 there, I'd have x squared minus 1. And then again, if you see a binomial with a minus sign, check for the difference of two squares x squared is a perfect square, it's x times x, and 1 is a perfect square, it's 1 times 1. So this would further factor into the quantity x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 1. Now for this guy over here, I can pull out a 5, and I can see that I would have x plus 1 inside the parentheses. So building my LCD, I have x plus 1 here and here, so I'm only going to use that once. So I'd have 2 times 5, that's 10, then times x plus 1, then times x minus 1, right, those two quantities. So let me just write this where both denominators are in factored form. So we'd have 3x squared minus 5x minus 7 over, this one factored is what? It's 2 times the quantity x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 1. Now the LCD is 10 times those two, so all I would need to do is multiply this numerator and denominator by 5, then plus, over here, I have 4x squared minus 3x plus 8. And in my denominator, I have 5 times the quantity x plus 1. So I need to multiply this guy by, I'm missing a 2, right, because this is 5. So I need 5 times 2 to get to 10. And I'm missing an x minus 1, that quantity. So 2 times the quantity x minus 1 is what I need. All right, so let's go ahead and crank this out. So I need to make sure I multiply 5 by each term here. 5 times 3x squared is 15x squared. 5 times negative 5x is minus 25x. 5 times negative 7 is minus 35. Now, over here, I have two factors. And what I can do is I can multiply 2 times x to give me 2x, and then multiply 2 times negative 1, that's negative 2. So let's write this slightly different as 2x minus 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply each term by this 2x minus 2. So I would have plus 4x squared times the quantity 2x minus 2. So let's crank that out real quick. 4x squared times 2x would be 8x cubed. 4x squared times negative 2 would be minus 8x squared. So let's erase this and put this up there. So plus 8x cubed and minus 8x squared. All right, so now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. So I would have negative 3x times that quantity 2x minus 2. So negative 3x times 2x would be negative 6x squared. Negative 3x times negative 2 would be plus 6x. And then I could do that one more time. So I'd have 8 times the quantity 2x minus 2. 8 times 2x is 16x, so plus 16x. And then 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. So let me combine like terms here real quick, and then we'll write that over that common denominator. So I have 15x squared, I have negative 8x squared, and I have negative 6x squared. That would give me just x squared, right? Because this is negative 14x squared. Negative 14x squared plus 15x squared is 1x squared. So let's erase this and this and this. All right, so the next thing I see, I have negative 25x, I have positive 6x, and I have positive 16x. So if I do 6 plus 16, that gives me 22. 22 minus 25 is negative 3. So this would be minus 3x, minus 3x. Let's erase that. And then I have negative 16 minus 35. That's negative 51. So let's write minus 51. And let's move this 8x cubed out to the front. Nothing I can do to combine that with anything. And this is over that common denominator, again, which was 10 times the quantity x plus 1, times the quantity x minus 1. Now, can I factor this? We would have to use something like factoring by grouping because we have a four-term polynomial. From the first group, I could pull out an x squared. So I'd pull out an x squared, and I'd have 8x plus 1. In the second group, I could pull out a negative 3. So negative 3 comes out. I would have x, and you've already failed, but for the sake of completeness, plus 17. So you're not going to end up with a common binomial factor. So this is going to be our simplified answer. 
8x cubed plus x squared minus 3x minus 51 over 10 times the quantity x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on adding and subtracting rational expressions. All right, so we want to perform each indicated operation. So we're looking at 7x over x squared plus 3x minus 3x over x squared minus x plus 2x minus 5 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. All right, so the first thing we got to do is get a common denominator going. So for the LCD, we want to factor each denominator completely. So for the first one, I would pull out an x, and I would have x plus 3. For this one, I would pull out an x, and I would have x minus 1. And then for this one, I would factor it into the product of two binomials. This is x, and this is x. Two integers that sum to 2, multiply to negative 3. So we would do positive 3 and negative 1. So positive 3 and negative 1. So what I see is that I have x plus 3 here and here. So let's put that in for the LCD. It only occurs once in each factorization, so it only goes in once here. I have x minus 1 here and here, so it only goes in once. And then I have x. I have that here and here, so that goes in once as well. I kind of slide that down a little bit so I can fit that in front. So the LCD is x times the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. Let me just kind of move this down a little bit. So I would say that this is 7x. Now what would I need to multiply numerator and denominator by to get a denominator of an LCD? If this is the factored form, I'm missing this x minus 1. So this would be multiplied by x minus 1. Then minus, remember I'm subtracting the whole thing away. So whatever I end up multiplying 3x by, I've got to subtract all that away. So let's put it inside a bracket so we don't forget. Now if I look at this denominator, I have x and I have x minus 1. I'm missing that x plus 3. So let's do 3x times that quantity, x plus 3. Then if I look at this over here, I have x plus 3, that quantity, times x minus 1, that quantity. I'm missing the x. So this 2x minus 5 would be multiplied by x. And then all this would be over the LCD, right? In each case, once I do those calculations, I would have the LCD as my denominator, and so I could just write it all over the same common denominator. So x times the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. Okay, so we're done with this. And let's just go through now and do some simplification. 7x times x is 7x squared. 7x times negative 1 is minus 7x. So inside the brackets here, 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times 3 is plus 9x. Now, I'm subtracting away what's inside the brackets. So what I want to do is distribute that negative to each term. So this would now be minus, and so would this. Then I have plus, x times 2x is 2x squared, and then x times negative 5 is minus 5x. Now, what can I combine here? I've got 2x squared, I've got negative 3x squared, and I've got 7x squared. So 2 plus negative 3 is negative 1, negative 1 plus 7 is 6. So I would erase, let's erase all these, and just make this a 6 here. And then negative 7x minus 9x minus 5x. Negative 7 minus 9 is negative 16. Negative 16 minus 5 is negative 21. So this is minus 21x. And this is over, again, that LCD, which is x times the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. Can I do anything to simplify? Well, actually I can here. Each term here has a common factor of 3x. So if I pulled that out, I would have what? I would have 2x minus a 7. And this is over. We have x times the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. Again, these are factors. This is multiplication here, multiplication here, and here. So each one here, this is a factor, this is a factor, this is a factor, this x is a factor, this is a factor, and this is a factor. So I can cancel common factors. So I can cancel this x with this x, and what I'm left with is 3 times the quantity 2x minus 7, or I could say 6x minus 21, it doesn't matter, over, the x has been canceled, so just the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. And just for the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and write this as 6x minus 21, Again, over the quantity x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 1. 
Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 47. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on complex fractions. All right, so we want to simplify each. We're going to take a look at 25 over m squared plus 3m, and then this is over 1 over m. So with a complex fraction, you're looking at a fraction that contains another fraction in its numerator, its denominator, or both the numerator and the denominator. So in this particular case, you can kind of think about this as the numerator, the numerator of the complex fraction. And then you can think about this as the denominator, the denominator of the complex fraction. And this right here would be your main division bar. Okay, remember, when we work with fractions, it's the numerator divided by the denominator. So here's your numerator or the complex fraction, and that's divided by your denominator. So this is your main division. And it might help you out, I said this in the lesson, when you first begin to kind of write this as, let's say, 25 over m squared plus 3m divided by 1 over m. This is the more traditional way that we've seen it kind of in pre-algebra. I know we didn't have variables then, but, you know, in pre-algebra and kind of you know, things that led up to this point. But moving forward, we're going to be working with it in this format, so it's best to kind of get used to it now. So let me just kind of erase this real quick. And I'm going to copy the problem again down here. So again, 25 over. I might as well factor this now because I know I'm going to have to. m squared plus 3m, I'd pull an m out, and I'd have m plus 3. And this is over. 1 over m. Okay, so when I look at this, again, I gave you two methods to kind of simplify a complex fraction when we looked at our lesson. The first method was to simplify the numerator and the denominator separately, then to do the main division. The second method had to do with multiplying the numerator and denominator of the complex fraction by the LCD of all fractions involved. Now, let's look at the LCD method kind of in the last part of our practice set, let's do kind of the simplify the numerator and the denominator separately, then perform the main division kind of right now. So all I would do here is just perform a division. This numerator right here is as simple as I can get it. This denominator here is as simple as I can get it. So I would simply say I have 25 over m times the quantity m plus 3. And I have it in factored form. You're going to see why that makes sense in a second. Then I'm multiplying by the reciprocal of this guy, which is m over 1. Now, why did I do that? Remember, when you divide with fractions, you take your fraction, and up to this point, that was the fractional on the left, and you multiply it by the reciprocal of the fraction on the right. But really, it's just thinking about multiplying by the reciprocal of the fraction that we're dividing by. I'm dividing by this fraction, so I multiply by its reciprocal. If I set it up like this, Again, it would be obvious to you that this guy gets flipped into that position. Again, you just got to start thinking about it in this new kind of format. Okay, so once we have it set up, just look to see what you can cancel. And I can cancel this M with this M. Again, that's why I factored that. And what I'd be left with is 25, 25 over M plus 3. So nice and simple. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have three halves over x plus 1 over 4. So again, I like to identify the main division. This is the numerator. This is your numerator. This is your main division. And then this is your denominator. So the numerator is as simple as I can make it. I can't do anything else with 3 halves. Let's just write it. Then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of that denominator. Now, can I do anything to make that denominator simpler? I cannot. So flip the guy, 4 would come into the numerator, and then x plus 1 would go into the denominator. I look to see what I can cancel. I can cancel a factor of 2 between the numerator and the denominator. So I would have 3 times 2, or 6, over x plus 1. All right, let's look at one that's a little bit more tedious. We have 4 over... We have 8 thirds minus 3m over 8. Now, it helps for me 
if I write everything as a fraction. So although 4 doesn't look like a fraction, I could rewrite this as 4 over 1 over 8 thirds minus 3m over 8. I remember when I used to struggle with this as a student, I used to write everything in fractional form, and it just made more sense to me. Now, 4 over 1 is as simple as we can make it, so I can just rewrite that. But for this guy right here, I can do some more in terms of simplification. I could get a common denominator going and do the subtraction. So if I have 8 thirds minus 3m over 8, 3 is a prime number, and 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. So the LCD would be 8 times 3, or 24. So I would need to multiply this by 3 over 3, and this by 8 over 8. And that would give me 64 minus 9m over 24. So can I do anything with this? Well, no, it looks like that's as simple as I can make it. So this right here would turn into this. Now, again, if I'm taking this and dividing by this guy, that means I want to multiply by the reciprocal of this, okay? So just flip it. So 24 will go into the numerator, and then 64 minus 9m will go into the denominator. Okay, so is there anything I could do to cancel anything at this point? Well, no, there's not. So I'm just going to go through and do the multiplication. So 4 times 24 is 96. So we put 96 over. 1 times 64 minus 9m is just 64 minus 9m. So I'd put negative 9m out in front and then plus 64. And there's nothing else we can do to simplify here. So we just get 96 over negative 9m plus 64. All right, so here's one that would benefit from the LCD method. So I'm going to show you both here, and then we're going to use the LCD method kind of moving forward. Let's do the traditional way that we've been doing up to this point. So I would simplify the numerator and denominator separately. So that means I've got to get a common denominator here. So for the numerator of the complex fraction, I'd have 16 over x plus y squared over 16. The LCD for these two would be 16x. So I'd multiply this by 16 over 16. I'd multiply this by x over x. And what I'd get is 16 times 16 is 256. And then plus, we'd have xy squared. And this is over the common denominator of 16x. OK. Now, for the denominator here, and I'm going to do my multiplication in the last step. So let me just write this over. Just keep the division for now. x over 2 minus y over 4. The LCD between these two would be 4. Right? I have 2, and then I have 4, which is 2 times 2. So I would need to multiply this by 2 over 2. So I would have 2x minus y, 2x minus y, over 4. Okay, so now let's go through and set up our multiplication. This guy right here stays the same. So 256 plus xy squared. And if it makes you feel more comfortable, you can reverse the order of that and say I have xy squared plus 256. Does not matter. And then over 16x. Now I'm multiplying by, I'm dividing by this. So I'm multiplying by the reciprocal of this. So this would be a 4 up here, and then a 2x minus y here. And what I can see is that I can cross cancel a factor of 4 between here and here. So that's a 1, and this is a 4. And so what I'm going to end up with is xy squared plus 256 in the numerator over 4x times the quantity 2x minus y in the denominator. And if your teacher makes you, or if you want to just to get some practice, you can go through and use your distributive property and write this as xy squared plus 256 over 8x squared, right, just multiplying those two, minus 4xy. Let me show you the LCD method, and I'll show you that it's actually a little bit faster. So for the LCD method, you have to think about the complex fraction kind of in pieces. What I want to do is I want to find the LCD for all the denominators involved. So I want to go into the numerator of the complex fraction, and I want to think about the denominators involved. I would have an x, and I would have a 16. Then I want to go into the denominator of the complex fraction, and again, I want to think about the denominators involved. So I'll look at the 2 and the 4 there. So the denominators I'm working with, I'm thinking about 2, 4, 16, 
and then X. Now it's easy to get the LCD here because if I think about 16, it's what? It's two to the fourth power or two times two times two times two. Then we just have a two and a four. So the number part is a 16 and the variable part is just an X. Now, all I need to do once I've found the LCD is multiply the numerator and denominator of the complex fraction. So this is the numerator of the complex fraction. This is the denominator of the complex fraction by that LCD. Again, that's legal because 16X over 16X is one. So I'm just multiplying by one. So when I use my distributive property here, what you're gonna see is in each case, something is going to cancel and your denominators are gonna drop out. In this case, the X would cancel with this X here. In this case, the 16 would cancel with the 16 here. So 16X times 16 over X would basically be 16 times 16, or it would give me 256. Then 16X times Y squared over 16, the 16s would cancel and you'd have X times Y squared. So this would be plus XY squared, and then it's over. Do the same thing over here. And now in each case, this two would cancel and I would have an eight, right? 16X times X over two, the two would cancel and I would have eight X times X, which would be eight X squared. And this particular case, 16X times Y over four, 16 would cancel with four and give me four, so I'd have four times XY. So this would be minus four XY. So you have your answer there and look how quick that was. The longest part of this process is just finding the LCD. So again, we end up with 256 plus XY squared. And you could reverse that if you want and say, I have XY squared plus 256, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then over, 8x squared minus 4xy. All right, let's take a look at one more. Really, this isn't a complicated thing. It's just something that can get kind of tedious. So we have v plus 1 over 4 minus 2v minus 2 over v plus 1. And then this is over v minus 1 over v plus 1. And then we're subtracting away 2 over v plus 1. So again, for your LCD method, you want to identify what your denominators are. So in this case, that's a 4 here, a v plus 1 here, a V plus one here, and a V plus one here. So pretty easy, it's just four times the quantity V plus one. Four times the quantity V plus one. Okay, now what I wanna do when I set this up, I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator of the complex fraction by the LCD. So I have four times the quantity V plus one over four times the quantity V plus one. So let me erase this real quick. And then if I use my distributive property here and I multiply this times this, what's gonna happen is my fours are gonna cancel. So what I'd have is V plus one, which is right here, times V plus one. So that's V plus one, that quantity squared. So V plus one, that quantity squared, then minus, let me kind of erase this real quick. We would do the same thing here, but in this particular case, the V plus one would cancel with the V plus one. So I'm left with four times the quantity two V minus two. So four times the quantity two V minus two. Now, very important, I am subtracting this away. So I am subtracting away this whole result here. Go ahead and put some brackets there. I still do this to this day so that you don't make a silly sign mistake. So then this is gonna be over. So I'm using my distributive property down here too. And the V plus ones are gonna cancel and I'll have four times the quantity V minus one, and then minus, I'm gonna put some brackets here, again, so I don't make a sign mistake. Same thing over here, this times this, the V plus one is gonna cancel again with the V plus one. So I have minus two times four or eight. All right, so let's kind of scroll down here and see if there's anything we can do to simplify further. Now, in this form right now, it's kind of hard to see what you have. So let's, let's just kind of write this, we have V plus one, that quantity squared. And let's write it out. V plus one, that quantity times V plus one. So now minus, and then I'm gonna put inside the brackets, four times two V is eight V, and then four times negative two is negative eight. Now, to remove the brackets, I change the sign of each term. So this becomes minus, and this becomes plus. Again, I still use that to this day because it's just a very, very good strategy to make sure 
that you're not making a silly sign mistake. All right, so let's look at the denominator now. So I have four times the quantity V minus one, and then I'm subtracting away eight. So at this particular point, four times the quantity V minus one minus eight. It doesn't look like we can do anything, but I wanna push this a little further and see what we can get. So if I went through and I did FOIL on this guy, we know the formula for that, it's V squared and then plus 2V plus 1, and we have minus 8V, and we have plus 8. If I combine like terms here, these two would combine to give me a negative 6V, and these two would combine to give me a 9. So let's go ahead and write that. So we'd have V squared minus 6V plus 9. So V squared minus 6V plus 9. So that's my numerator. Now before I go any further, can I factor that? Well, yeah, I can factor that into V minus three, that quantity squared. V times V is V squared. The outer would be negative three V, the inner would be negative three V, that would be negative six V. And then the last, negative three times negative three is nine. So that factors. Now, if I do four times V, I get four V. Four times negative one is negative four, and then I have minus eight. Negative four minus eight is negative 12. So I would have four V minus 12 here, and I can pull out a four from that. And what I would have is a V minus a three. And voila, we look and see that we have a common factor of V minus three. So I can cancel this with this. And what I'm left with here is a V minus three over a four. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section One on complex fractions. All right, so we want to simplify each. We're looking at 3 over m and then over 5 thirds. So this is a very, very easy example. For our complex fraction here, we just basically have a division problem, right? We have 3 over m basically divided by 5 thirds. So we could write this as what? 3 over m divided by 5 thirds like that. And then it's obvious what we need to do. We need to take this first fraction, 3 over m, and multiply it by the reciprocal of the second one, 3 over 5. But if we don't want to do that anymore, if we don't want to rely on that anymore, we've kind of got to get used to this kind of format. So I have the fraction that is in the numerator, that's just going to start out and be unchanged, and I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction in the denominator, what we are dividing by. We're dividing by 5 thirds, Take the reciprocal of that, we get 3 fifths. So now I just do the multiplication. 3 times 3 is 9. And this is over 5 times m, which is just 5m. Nothing I can do to simplify. So this is just simply 9 over 5m. Let's take a look at another one. So we have 4 over x minus 5. And this is over 2 over 25. So again, this is your division right here. So you have the numerator of the complex fraction, 4 over x minus 5 that is divided by the denominator of the complex fraction, which is two over 25. So take that numerator, leave it as it is, four over x minus five. It's already as simple as it can get, and multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator of the complex fraction. That's what we're dividing by. The reciprocal of two over 25 is 25 over two. Right? I can't make that any simpler. So now I look to cancel common factors before I multiply. I can cancel a common factor of two between here and here. So that would be two and that would be one. And I'd have two times 25 or 50 over x minus five times one or just x minus five. So I get 50 over x minus five. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section two on complex fractions. All right, so we wanna simplify each. And I'm taking a look at 20 over we have 16 over x squared plus 25 over four. So what we wanna do here, you have two kind of main methods to simplify a complex fraction. You can simplify the numerator and denominator separately and then do the main division. So in other words, I would take and simplify this part and this part separately, and then I would do a division. Or I could find the LCD for all the denominators involved and then I can multiply the numerator and denominator of the complex fraction 
by that LCD and I would have my answer. So let's go ahead and just stick with kind of the first method that I talked about for this problem. And then kind of in the next few problems, we'll take a look at the LCD method. So for this one, 20 is already simplified. But when I'm working with fractions, I personally like to make everything a fraction. And we can make 20 into a fraction by putting 20 over one. Then this would be over. We need to simplify this. We'd have to have a common denominator. And I have x squared and I have 4 as my denominator. So the LCD would just be 4x squared. So that means I'd have 16 over x squared. That would get multiplied by 4 over 4. Then plus 25 over 4. That would get multiplied by x squared over x squared. 16 times 4 is 64. So this would be 64. And then over... 4 times x squared is 4x squared. And then over here, we'd have plus 25 times x squared. That's 25x squared. And then 4 times x squared is 4x squared. So that would be a common denominator there. So I'm bringing this up into the denominator for the complex fraction. So I would have, I'm going to flip the order, 25x squared plus 64. Let me kind of erase all this. It would be over 4x squared. Now, before I go any further, is there anything I can do to simplify? Well, no, there's not. This I can't really factor. If I had a minus sign there, it would be a, the difference of two squares, but I don't have that. Not really anything I can do. So this is as simple as I can make this. So then I would have 20 over 1 times the reciprocal of this, right? Because I am dividing. This guy right here stays the same. And then what I'm dividing by, I multiply by the reciprocal of that. So 4x squared is going to come up into the numerator. And then 25x squared plus 64 is going to go into the denominator. So all I can do is just multiply 20 times 4x squared. That's going to give me 80x squared. And again, this is over 25x squared plus 64. And there's not really anything I can do to simplify here. I can't factor anything out of the denominator. 64 is 2 to the 6th power. And 25 is 5 times 5, and then x squared is x times x. So there's nothing that I can really factor out. So I'm left with 80x squared, again, over 25x squared plus 64. All right, so we have 4 ninths minus 4 over x, and this is over x. So for the last time, let's just use that same method here. I'm going to write this as x over 1. And to get a common denominator here, it would just be 9x. So I'd multiply this by 9 over 9, and this by x over x. So I would have 4x minus 36 over 9x, and this is over x over 1. So I would leave this first guy unchanged. So 4x minus 36 over 9x, and I would multiply by the reciprocal of this guy. The reciprocal of x over 1 is 1 over x, and what would that give me? Well, I'd basically just have a 9x squared down here in the denominator. In the numerator... I would just have 4x minus 36 times 1. That's 4x minus 36. Nothing else I can really do here. I could factor out a 4 from here, but it's not going to do me any good. So in other words, if I took a 4 and factored it out, I would have x minus 9 here. But down here, I'd still have 9x squared. Nothing to cancel between numerator and denominator. So either way you want to report your answer as 4x minus 36 over 9x squared or as 4 times the quantity x minus 9 over 9x squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on Complex Fractions. All right, so we want to simplify each. So we have 16 over x minus 6, and this is over 4 ninths minus 16 over x minus 6. So for this particular problem, I'm going to use the LCD method. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the LCD of all the denominators involved. So this denominator here here and here. So really I have a 9 and I have an x minus 6. So it's just 9 times the quantity x minus 6. That will be the LCD. So once I have that, I would multiply that LCD times the numerator and the denominator of the complex fraction. So in other words, this would get multiplied by this. The x minus 6 would cancel here and here. And I'd be left with 16 times 9, which is 144. This is over 
I'm going to do the same thing here, but I'm going to use my distributive property twice, once for here and then once for here. So in the first instance, the nine would cancel, right? This nine would cancel with this, and I would have four times the quantity x minus six, and then minus, I've got to do it again here. Now in this case, the x minus six would cancel, and I'd have 16 times nine again, which is 144. Now let me go through and simplify this. I have 144 as my numerator, four times x is four x, minus four times six is 24, and then minus 144. Negative 24 minus 144 is negative 168. So minus 168. And what we can do here is we can factor that denominator. We can factor a four out of it. That would leave me with x minus 42. Now in the numerator 144, if I divide that by four, I'd get 36. So I can write this as four times 36, and I can cancel this common factor of four between numerator and denominator, and I am left with 36 over the quantity x minus 42. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on complex fractions. All right, so we wanna simplify each. So we have four over a plus two, minus b plus one over a minus two. And then this is over, we have a minus two over a plus two, and then minus a minus two over two a plus four. So when we're looking at a complex fraction like this, again, we have two methods that we use to simplify it. And we're gonna use our LCD method here. So we wanna start by just finding the LCD for all the fractions that are involved in the complex fraction. Now, that means I'm gonna look at the denominator of a plus two, the denominator of a minus two, the denominator of a plus two again, and then this denominator two a plus four, which factors into two times the quantity a plus two. So pretty easy to get the LCD. If I look here, really I have a plus two here, here, and here, and it only occurs once in each. So I'm just gonna throw one of those in there. Then I have this factor of a minus two, only occurs here, so I'm just gonna throw it in there. And then I have this factor of two that is in the factored form of two a plus four, right? It turns into two times the quantity a plus two. So let's throw that two in there as well. And so my LCD is two times the quantity a plus two times the quantity a minus two. Now once you've found your LCD, what you're gonna do is you're gonna multiply the numerator and the denominator of that complex fraction by your LCD and all the denominators are gonna drop out. So in other words, when we think about the complex fraction, this is your numerator. This is your denominator. So what I'm gonna do again is I'm gonna take that LCD and I'm gonna multiply it by the numerator and the denominator. So I'll have two times the quantity A plus two times the quantity A minus two. This will be over two times the quantity a plus two times the quantity a minus two. And again, same value over itself, just a complicated form of one. So if I'm multiplying by one, I'm not changing the value. So that's why it's legal. Okay, so let's erase this. And we're gonna multiply here. And you're gonna see all your denominators are gonna drop out. So this is gonna get multiplied by this. And what's gonna happen is the denominator here, a plus two is gonna cancel with this a plus two here. And I'm basically gonna have two times four or eight times that a minus two. So eight times the quantity a minus two. And then I have that minus there, so let's write minus. And then whenever I put a minus and I'm doing operations like this, I like to put brackets or parentheses, something that reminds me that I'm subtracting everything away. So let me put some brackets there and I'll close them off in a minute. So let me just erase this and this and let's go ahead and use our distributive property here. And what's gonna happen is, in this case, the a minus two is gonna cancel with the a minus two here. And what I'm gonna have is two times the quantity, a plus two, times this quantity here, b plus one. b plus one. Okay, so we're done with the numerator. Let's scroll down. We do the same thing to the denominator of the complex fraction. So this is gonna get multiplied by this, and we can see that this will cancel with this, right? The a plus twos are gonna cancel. 
and I'm going to have a 2 times the quantity a minus 2 times the quantity a minus 2 again. So this is over. We have 2 times the quantity a minus 2 times the quantity a minus 2 again. Then I have a minus, so I'll put minus there. And again, I like to use brackets there, or you can use parentheses, whatever you want to do. And I'm going to do my distributive property for this right here. And in this particular case, remember, in factored form, this is 2 times the quantity a plus 2. So this would cancel with this, and I'm left with a minus 2 times a minus 2. So a minus 2 times a minus 2. Okay, so now what we want to do is simplify. Now, I know a lot of you will make that common mistake that I keep talking about in every video where you go through and say, okay, well, I can cancel this with this and this with this, and this is a 4. Remember, you can't do that unless you have straight multiplication. We don't have that in this case. We have subtraction here, right? We have 8 that's multiplied by the quantity a minus 2. Then we're subtracting away 2 times the quantity a plus 2 times the quantity b plus 1. So we don't have straight multiplication, right? We don't have straight factors in the numerator and straight factors in the denominator where we can go through and start canceling. So what we can do is we can just simplify, and then when we're done simplifying, we can see if we can factor and then cancel. And I know it sounds extremely tedious, and a lot of times it really is, but it's just what we have to do. So 8 times a is 8a, and then 8 times negative 2 is minus 16. And then I have this minus sign out here, so let's, let's put minus and then inside the brackets. Let's do a 2 outside of parentheses, and then we'll use 4 here. a times b is ab. The outer would be a, so plus a. The inner would be plus 2b. And then the last 2 times 1 is plus 2. Close the brackets there. So 2 times ab would be 2ab. 2 times a would be plus 2a. 2 times 2b would be plus 4b. And then 2 times 2 would be plus 4. Let's erase this. And then before I even write this up here, I know that I'm subtracting away everything in here. And this is what would be in here. So if I take these brackets away, I change the sign of each term. So the 2ab would become negative, the 2a would become negative, the 4b would become negative, and the 4 would become negative. Now, before I move on, can I do anything to make this simpler? Well, yes, I can. I can combine negative 16 and negative 4, and then I can also combine 8a and negative 2a, and that's going to be it. So 8a minus 2a is 6a. Let's put 6a here, and let's just erase this. And then negative 16 minus 4 is negative 20. So let's put negative 20. And we'll kind of scooch this down. So we've got 6a minus 2ab minus 4b minus 20. Now, a lot of people like to factor things, and you can see that if you wanted to, you could pull a 2 out from here. So let me just write this as 2 times the quantity 3a minus ab minus 2b minus 10. And then close parentheses. Let me kind of scooch this down a little bit. All right, so looking at the denominator now, do we notice anything that would help us out? Well, the thing that stands out to me is I have 2 times this a minus 2 times a minus 2, and then I'm subtracting away a minus 2 times a minus 2. So essentially what I'm having here is one of these guys, right? One of them. Because 2 times this certain quantity minus basically you could say 1 times that same quantity would be 1 times that quantity, right? 2 minus 1 is 1. And there's a few different ways you can go about proving that to yourself. One of the ways is you could factor out the a minus 2, that quantity squared, and what you'd be left with, if I factored that out, I'd have a minus 2, that quantity squared, times 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1, so I'd be left with 1 times the quantity a minus 2 squared. Right? That's what I'm going to end up with. We can also go about showing you this the long way. I know my formula for this from the special products lesson that we did. This would be what? a squared 
minus 2 times a times 2, which is 4a, and then plus 2 squared, which is 4. Now, I'm subtracting away this guy. So I'm subtracting away a squared minus 4a plus 4. And again, we all know what this is going to turn out to be. It's going to turn out to be a squared minus 4a plus 4. You're going to have 2 of something minus 1 of that same thing. That's 1 of that same thing. Okay, but we'll go through it again the long way. This would be 2a squared minus 8a plus 8 minus a squared plus 4a minus 4. And again, all I did was I used my distributive property to change the sign of each term there. So if we combine like terms, 2a squared minus a squared is a squared. And then negative 8a plus 4a is negative 4a. And then 8 minus 4 is 4. So what do we get? We get one of these. Again, just like I said. So let's erase this. And I just point these things out to you so that, you know, you end up being able to breeze through some of these questions you get on your test. A lot of tests are meant for you to know these formulas and know these tricks and techniques, especially something like the SAT, because they give you a limited amount of time and they might say break it down to where you only have 45 seconds a question. So you've got to use these strategies to kind of get through those. All right, now I can factor this. We know that it factors into this, a minus two, that quantity times a minus two again. The question is, can I further factor this, what's inside the parentheses here? And the answer to that is no. If I wanted to factor a four term polynomial, I'm gonna use grouping. But the thing that should jump out to you is that you can't get the signs right. It's impossible. Because I have a positive here, a negative here, a negative here, and a negative here. So no matter what I do, the signs would never yield a common binomial factor. And so we can write our answer as two times the quantity 3a minus ab minus 2b minus 10 over the quantity a minus two times the quantity a minus two or the quantity a minus two squared, however you wanna say that. Your teacher might want you to write it this way, 6a minus 2ab minus 4b minus 20 over a squared minus 4a plus four. Again, it's just a matter of what instructions you're given. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section five on complex fractions. All right, so we wanna simplify each. We're gonna take a look at n minus one over four minus n plus two over n plus one. And then this is over n plus two over two n plus two minus n plus one over two. Now we're gonna use the LCD method here. So the LCD method. And how do we go about doing that? Well, what we're gonna do is we're going to find the LCD of all the denominators involved. So this denominator is four, this one is n plus one, this one is two, and this one is two n plus two. But notice that this one would factor into two times the quantity n plus one. So if I look at each denominator, this four is really what? If I factor that as two times two. Again, to build an LCD, you look at each factor and you throw it in there but you only throw it in there the largest number of times it occurs between any of the factorizations. So if I have a two here, a two here, and two factors of two here, the largest number of repeats is two occurrences of two, which is here, two times two is four. Then I have n plus one here, and here only occurs once in each case, so I'm only gonna throw one in when I build my LCD. So the LCD is four times the quantity n plus one, just that simple. Now, what we're gonna do in the second step here, I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator of the complex fraction by the LCD. So four times the quantity n plus one over four times the quantity n plus one. And again, this is just a complex form of one, nothing else. So all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna multiply each term in this numerator by this and then each term of the denominator as well. So four times the quantity n plus one times n minus one over four. We know that this four would cancel with this four. And essentially all I'm gonna have, let me put equals over here, is n minus one, that quantity, times n plus one, that quantity. That's what's left. Then minus, I'm gonna do the same thing over here. So this is gonna get multiplied by this. And we can see that this would cancel with this so that n plus one, that common factor would cancel, and I would have four times the quantity, n plus two. And again, if you wanna use brackets here, you can, 
just to kind of remind yourself that, you know, once you're done simplifying here, you need to subtract everything away. I'm going to kind of do that in the next step. So now I'm moving down to the denominator. So I'm multiplying this by this. So now in this case, remember this denominator factors into two times the quantity n plus one. And so I can cancel the n plus one with the n plus one and one factor of two with this two. And so what I'm left with is two times the quantity n plus two. Two times the quantity n plus two. All right, so let's erase that and that and that. And then one more time, I'm gonna multiply this by this. So this would cancel with this and give me a two. So I'd have minus n plus one times n plus one. So n plus one, that quantity squared, and then times two. Now let's scroll down now, and see what we got. So I'm gonna simplify this and see what we can do. So if I look at this one, this is the difference of two squares. It's pretty easy. That's n squared minus one. And that's why we study these formulas because we get to a test we see something like that and we, bam, we're done, right? It's just that quick. Then over here I have minus four times n is four n, and this is where I'm gonna use my brackets. And then four times two is eight, so plus eight. I wanna make sure that I subtract this whole thing away, whatever it is. In this case, I wanna subtract four n plus eight. So if I subtract away four n, I get minus four n. And if I subtract away eight, I get minus eight. Now, is there anything that I can do to simplify? Yeah, I can combine negative one and negative eight, that's negative nine. So let me put minus four n minus nine. And just for completeness, can I factor this further? Can I get two integers whose sum is negative four and whose product is negative nine? Well, for nine, you really just have one and nine. You can't make that work with the signs. And you have three and three, can't make that work with the signs. So this is prime, so we can't do anything with this. All right, so down here, I have two times n, that's two n, plus two times two, that's four. Then I'm subtracting this whole thing away. Remember that, don't just say you have a negative two. Now, one of the things you could do is you could take that negative two and distribute to everything. That would be fine as well, but let's not get to that. Let's just keep it nice and simple, do the operations and then just apply the negative. Okay, so n plus one, that quantity squared, we know the formula for that already. That's gonna give me n squared plus two times this times this, so two n plus this guy squared, which is one. So two times n squared is two n squared, two times two n is four n, and two times one is two. So now I'm subtracting everything away. So this would be minus, minus, and minus. All right, so is there anything I can do to simplify now? Well, I have two n and negative four n, and then I have four and negative two. So let's go ahead and simplify that. So I'm gonna write my numerator again. I got n squared minus four n minus nine. The denominator, I'll have that negative two n squared. Let's put that out in front. And then two n minus four n is minus two n. And then four minus two is gonna be plus two. So given the fact that we've already determined that we can't factor the top, if we're on a timed exam, we don't wanna go through and factor the bottom because we know nothing's gonna cancel. Now, in some cases, your teacher might say, okay, I want everything to be factored as much as possible when you report your answer so that you can prove to me that nothing can be canceled. Okay, some teachers will say that, some textbooks will ask you to do that, some tests will specify for you to do that. So if that's the case, follow those instructions. But otherwise, you would stop here and just report your answer, right? You're basically done. Now, it's interesting to note that you could pull out a negative two from this, and you would get n squared plus n minus one, right? Negative two times n squared is negative two n squared. Negative two times n is negative two n, and then negative two times negative one is plus two. All right, but once I get to that, can I do anything with the inside there? Well, no, because I, I can't find two integers whose sum is one and whose product is negative one, right? To get a product of negative one, I need one times negative one and that sums to zero, so that's not gonna work. So essentially we have our answer as n squared minus four n minus nine 
over negative 2n squared minus 2n plus 2. Or again, if your teacher wants you to factor the denominator, you could put the denominator as negative 2 times the quantity n squared plus n minus 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 practice set 48. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we want to solve each equation. And we're going to start out by looking at 1 over x minus 2 plus x plus 3 over x squared minus 2x. And this is equal to 1 over x. All right, so in case you didn't watch the lesson, in order to solve an equation like this, we think back to when we solved linear equations in one variable with fractions. If you didn't want to work with the fractions in that case, I taught you that you could multiply both sides of your equation by the LCD, the least common denominator, of all the fractions involved in that equation. If you did that, you would clear all the fractions out of the equation, and you would no longer have to worry about them being in that equation. We're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to look at our denominators that are involved. Here we have an x minus 2. Here we have x squared minus 2x. I'm going to factor that. I'm going to put that as x times the quantity x minus 2. And then here I just have x. So if I look at the three denominators involved, and I want to find my LCD, Again, we know how to find an LCD at this point. You know, if you don't, I encourage you to stop, go back to the lesson where we learned that, watch that first, because you're gonna be far behind if you start trying to pick it up here. So we just wanna look at what factors we have. So I have a factor of X minus two. I'll throw that in there. I have the same factor of X minus two here. It occurs once here and once here, so it only needs to be in here once. Then I have this x that's here and here. It only occurs once in each, so when I build my LCD, I only need to put it in there one time and one time only. All right, so let me write the x there. So my LCD is gonna be x times the quantity x minus two. So once we've found that, what we wanna do is we wanna multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD so that we will clear our equation of the denominators. So I'll have x times the quantity x minus 2 times, inside the brackets, 1 over x minus 2 plus x plus 3 over, and I'm going to write this in factored form, x times the quantity x minus 2, and then equals 1 over x times x times the quantity x minus 2. And notice how I try to leave everything in factored form just so I can see what's going to cancel. Right? You don't want to have to multiply things together, then go back and factor again. It's just a lot of extra work. So I'm going to start out by using my distributive property here. If I multiplied x times the quantity x minus 2 times 1 over x minus 2, these would cancel. This x minus 2 here would cancel with this x minus 2 here. And I'm left with x times 1, or just x. Now let me erase this because I'm going to do that again. So I'm going to use my distributive property over here as well. And so in this case, what's going to cancel is x with x and x minus 2 with x minus 2. So everything is canceled completely, and I'm just left with the x plus 3. So I'm going to put plus x plus 3. And then when I look over here, I have my equals. I have x, and I have x, so that's going to cancel. And I'm left with the x minus 2 times 1, which is just x minus 2. All right, so now let's just solve this equation. Very easy to do at this point. x plus x is 2x. Then plus 3 is equal to x minus 2. I can subtract x away from each side of the equation. And I will have x plus 3 is equal to negative 2. Then I can subtract 3 away from each side of the equation. That's going to cancel. And I'll have x is equal to negative 5. Okay, so that's my solution. And let's erase everything and we want to check. Let me stick that right there, x equals negative 5. And why would you want to check this here? Well, not only to make sure that you got the right solution, when you work with rational expressions, remember, you can never, ever, ever divide by 0. So if you get a value for your variable as a solution, and you plug it in for that variable in the equation, and the denominator becomes 0, you have to reject that solution. Okay, you cannot have a solution that makes the denominator equal to zero. Remember, you can never, ever, 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 ever divide by zero. So very important that you check that. 
So let's plug in a negative 5 here, and here, and here, and here, and see if the left and the right side are equal. So over here, 1 over negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7. So 1 over negative 7, I can put negative 1 over 7. That's the same thing. Then for this one, and I forgot to say that I'm plugging in a negative 5 here also, I'd have negative 5 plus 3, which is negative 2. So I have plus negative 2 over negative 5. That amount is plugged in for x, so that whole thing is squared, the negative and the 5. That's 25. And then I'm subtracting away 2 times negative 5, or I can think about it as negative 2 times negative 5, which is positive 10. So we know that 25 plus 10 is 35. Okay, so before I continue and do anything over there, I can multiply this over here by 5 over 5. So I'd have a common denominator, and this would end up being negative 5 over 35 plus negative 2 over 35. Negative 5 plus negative 2 is negative 7, so I'd have negative 7 over 35. So let's write that. Negative 7 over 35. Now we can simplify this. 7 divided by 7 is 1. 35 divided by 7 is 5. Okay, so I'd end up with negative 1 fifth on this side. Now over here, if I plug in a negative 5, I have 1 over negative 5, which I can just write as negative 1 over 5 as well. So the left and the right side are equal, and so we know we have the correct solution. x is equal to negative 5. Now, again, notice how none of my denominators became 0 when I plugged in a negative 5 for x something you need to watch out for. All right, let's take a look at one that's a little harder. We have p squared minus 3p plus 2, and this is over 4p minus 32, plus p squared plus 5p over 4p minus 32, and this is equal to 1 over 2p minus 16. So I want to start out again by finding the LCD. So what is the LCD here? Well, I'm going to factor 4p minus 32 into 4 times the quantity p minus 8. This is the same thing, 4 times the quantity p minus 8. And this is going to be 2 times the quantity p minus 8. So you can see that the LCD is pretty easy. Here I have a 2, here I have a 4, here I have a 4. So you kind of think of it as everything has two factors of 2 except for this guy. You go with the largest number of repeats between any factorization. So the number would be 4. And then everything has a p minus 8, one copy. So one copy goes in when we build the LCD. So 4 times the quantity p minus 8 is the LCD. Now I'm going to multiply this by both sides of the equation. And I hope I can fit this on the screen. Let's try. So 4 times the quantity p minus 8 times inside the brackets. I have p squared minus 3p plus 2. p squared minus 3p plus 2 over... And I'm going to write that denominator in factored form so I can see what's going to cancel. 4 times the quantity p minus 8. And then plus, I have p squared plus 5p. And this is over. Again, 4 times the quantity p minus 8. And this is equal to, we have 1 over 2p minus 16. So 1 over, we'll factor that, 2 times the quantity p minus 8. This is multiplied by 4 times the quantity p minus 8. Okay, I know that when I distribute this here and here, in each case, this is going to cancel with this and this. So what I'm going to be left with is just what's in the numerator. So I would have p squared minus 3p plus 2 plus, over here, p squared plus 5p. Now before I go any further, I can simplify. p squared plus p squared is 2p squared. Negative 3p plus 5p is 2p, so plus 2p plus 2. Okay, and then we have equals over here. I have 4 times the quantity p minus 8 being multiplied by 1 over 2 times the quantity p minus 8. This would cancel, and then 1 factor of 2 would cancel between there, so I'd be left with just 2 times 1 or 2. Now, what I can do is I can subtract 2 away from each side of the equation, that's gone, and that's gone. And what am I going to have? Remember, this is an equation, so this side's going to equal something. 2 minus 2 is 0. 
and this is equal to 2p squared plus 2p. You might be thinking, well, I don't know how to do anything with that. Well, yeah, you do. I've taught you this in a previous lesson. Factor out the 2p. So if I factor out a 2p, I will have p plus 1, and this equals 0. Now, can I solve this? Absolutely. I can use my zero product property. I have 2p times the quantity p plus 1, and that's equal to 0. So I can set each factor equal to 0, because one of them has to be equal to 0 in order to get 0 as a result. So I set 2p equal to 0. Obviously, p has to be 0 in that case. And then I say or, I set p plus 1 equal to 0. In this case, p has to be equal to negative 1. So p is 0 or p is negative 1. So again, p is equal to 0 or p is equal to negative 1. So we need to check both because remember, we got to make sure that we're not going to get 0 as a denominator when we plug this guy in. So if I start out up here, 0 squared is 0, and then minus 3 times 0 would be 0, so 0 minus 0 is 0. I would just have a 2 in the numerator there. 4 times 0 is 0, so then minus 32. So I could put minus 2 over 32. Of course, that's going to reduce to 1 over 16, and then it's negative, so negative 1 over 16. Okay, then plus. Then over here I have 0 squared plus 5 times 0. So the numerator is 0. And remember, if I have 0 as my numerator and my denominator is non-zero, the result is 0, right? 0 divided by any non-zero number is 0. So this would be 0 over 4 times 0 is 0, so negative 32. So 0 over, again, any non-zero number is 0, so we can just erase this. Now over here I have 1 over... 2 times 0 is 0, so 1 over negative 16, which is the same thing, right? I can move this negative up into the numerator, so this solution right here checks out. All right, let's check negative 1 now. So for negative 1, I have negative 1 squared, that's 1. Then I'd have negative 3 times negative 1, that's plus 3, and then plus 2, over 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, and then minus 32, that's negative 36. So if I simplify this before I move on, 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 plus 2 is 6. So I get 6 over negative 36. So I'm going to leave this in this format. I know I could reduce it to negative 1 sixth, but I'm going to need it for this next step. So then I have plus. Negative 1 squared is 1. Then plus, we have 5 times negative 1, that's negative 5. Then this is over. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Negative 4 minus 32 is negative 36. So you see why I didn't simplify that there. I wanted to have a common denominator. So 1 plus negative 5 is negative 4. Now, if I have a negative over a negative, that's a positive. So this becomes plus over plus. Now, I can take this and move it up here. So it's negative 6 over 36 now. Negative 6 plus 4 is negative 2. So I would have negative 2 over 36 or negative 1 over 18. Now over here I have 1 over, you have 2 times negative 1, that's negative 2. So negative 2 minus 16 is negative 18. And again, I can move this up here if I want to and say this is negative 1 over 18. So p equals negative 1 is a valid solution as well. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 2z over z squared minus 1 minus 3 over z plus 1 is equal to 1 over z minus 1. So again, I want to find my LCD, my LCD. And if I look at the denominators here, this right here, z squared minus 1, we ought to know by now that's the difference of two squares. That's z plus 1, that quantity, times z minus 1, that quantity. So essentially I have z plus 1 here and z minus 1 here, and then here I have z plus 1 times z minus 1. So the LCD is just z plus 1 times z minus 1. Super easy. All right, so now I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by the LCD. So for 2z over, and I'm going to leave this in factored form, z plus 1, that quantity, times z minus 1, that's going to be multiplied by the LCD. So z plus 1, that quantity, times z minus 1. And then we're going to do minus, let me try to fit this on the screen this way, z plus 1, that quantity, times z minus 1, that quantity, times 3 over z plus 1, 
and then I have equals one over z minus one. Again, times we have z plus one times z minus one. Okay, fit it all on the screen. So this is gonna cancel with this and I'll have two z, then minus. This is gonna cancel with this. I'll have three times the quantity z minus one. And then equals, this is gonna cancel with this. I'll have z plus one, right? One times anything is itself. Okay, so now to solve this, I'll have two z, negative three times z is negative three z, and then negative three times negative one is plus three. And this equals z plus one. So two z minus three z is negative z. So I'll have negative z here, plus three equals z plus one. I'm going to subtract three away from each side, and I'm gonna subtract z away from each side. So that's gonna cancel and that's gonna cancel. And I'll be left with negative 2z is equal to negative 2. Divide both sides of the equation by negative 2, and I get that z is equal to 1. Okay, so let's erase everything, and we'll go back up and check this. Okay, so z equals 1 is our proposed solution. Now, some of you will already see a problem with that. If I plug the 1 in here, what would I have? 1 minus 1 is 0. I can't divide by 0. So if you see that right away, you just stop and say there's no solution. There's no solution. You have to reject z equals one. If I put it in here, it'd be a problem as well. One squared is one, one minus one is zero. Can't have that. Here it would be fine, one plus one is two, but it doesn't matter. If one of your denominators ends up being zero, you have to reject that solution, okay? You can't have that. All right, let's take a look at the last one. We have k minus seven over k squared plus k. This is equal to seven k minus 21 over k cubed minus k squared minus 2k, then minus 1 over k squared minus 2k. So let me factor all these denominators. This guy would factor into k times the quantity k plus 1. This guy right here, if I factored out a k to start, I'd have k squared minus k minus 2. Now, can I factor that further? Are there two integers whose sum would be negative 1 and whose product would be negative two. Well, I could do negative two and positive one. So that means I could factor this into k minus two times the quantity k plus one. Then for this one, this factors into k times the quantity k minus two. Okay, so our LCD is gonna be a little bit more complex here. The first thing I notice is that we have a k here, here, and here. It occurs in each one, but it only occurs once in each one. So I'm only gonna put one in here. Then I have a k plus one here, and here only occurs once in each. So I'm just gonna throw one in here. Then lastly, I have this k minus two here, and here only occurs once in each, so you guessed it, I'm gonna put one factor in when I build my LCD. So the LCD is K times the quantity K plus one times the quantity K minus two. Okay, so let's multiply both sides of this equation by this. And I doubt I could fit this on the screen, but I am going to try to do something a little different. So what I would have is, let's do it one at a time. Let's do K minus seven over K times the quantity k plus one. So that's this guy right here. And I'd be multiplying this by the LCD. So k times the quantity k plus one times the quantity k minus two. So what would cancel in this case is this with this, and I'd be left with k minus seven times k minus two. Now this is equal to, so let me erase this, and I'm gonna do the next one. So I would multiply this guy, 7k minus 21 over k times the quantity k minus two times the quantity k plus one times k times the quantity k plus one times the quantity k minus two. Now everything's gonna cancel here. This is gonna cancel with this and I'm left with simply 7k minus 21. Then for the last one, I have that minus out in front. Let me just put that there. I'm gonna put some brackets to say whatever's included in there is gonna be subtracted away. Okay, so I would have one over K 
k times the quantity k minus 2. And this is multiplied by k times the quantity k plus 1 times the quantity k minus 2. All right. So let's cancel this with this and this. And I'll just have k plus 1. So k plus 1. And again, I put it inside of brackets because I've got to subtract away the k and the 1. So that's going to remind me to do that. All right. So now let's go through and do some simplifying. So for FOIL here, I'd get k squared. The outer would be minus 2k. The inner would be minus 7k. So that would be minus 9k if I combine them. And then the last, negative 7 times negative 2 is plus 14. And this equals, we have 7k minus 21. And then I'll have a negative k and then a minus 1. So the next thing I want to do, 7k minus k is 6k. So this is 6k. Negative 21 minus 1 is minus 22. So minus 22 here. We would subtract 6k away from each side of the equation. And that's gone. We would add 22 to both sides of the equation. That's gone. So this side's going to be 0. 14 plus 22 is 36. Negative 9k minus 6k is negative 15k. So I would get k squared minus 15k plus 36. Now, in order for us to be able to solve this, we have to be able to factor it. And I, I say that because I have not taught you the quadratic formula yet. So if you know that from outside my course, that's great. You could use that. But because I haven't taught that to you yet, we are limited in what we can solve. So I gave you a problem that you could factor. So in this particular case, you need two integers whose sum is negative 15 and whose product is 36. So I put k and k. For 36, I've got what? 1 and 36. I've got 2 times 18. I've got 3 times 12. That would work, right, if I had a negative 3 and a negative 12. So minus 3 and minus 12. So that works out. Set each factor individually equal to 0. So k minus 3 equals 0 or k minus 12 equals 0. And we know our solutions would be 3 and 12, right? Add 3 to both sides, k equals 3. Or add 12 to both sides, k is equal to 12. So again, we want to check this. And it's kind of a tedious process, but unfortunately, it's something we need to do. And we want to just plug a 3 in for k to start. So 3 minus 7 is negative 4 over 3 squared is 9 plus 3 would be 12. Let's just leave it as it is for now. We'll simplify later. Over here, 7 times 3 is 21. 21 minus 21 is 0. So I know that as long as this doesn't result in 0, the result here will be 0, right? 0 divided by any non-zero number is 0. So this here, 3 cubed is 27. Then minus 3 squared is 9. Then minus 2 times 3 is 6. So I basically have 27 minus 15 which is 12. So I'd have 0 over 12, which we know is 0. Then I'm subtracting away. I have 1 over k squared. I'd have 3 squared, that's 9, minus 2 times 3, which is 6. 9 minus 6 is 3. All right. So given the fact that this is 0, I can erase it. I have negative 1 third over here. If I simplify this, divide 4 by 4, I get 1. Divide 12 by 4, I get 3. So you get negative one-third equals negative one-third. So we are good to go. All right, let's take a look at the next one. So now I want to check 12. So 12 minus 7 is 5. And then over 12 squared is 144. Then plus 12 is 156. So this should be equal to 7 times 12 is 84. If I subtract away 21, I get 63. And this is over 12 cubed which is a big number, 1,728, minus 12 squared, which is 144, minus 2 times 12, which is 24. So 1,728 minus 144 is 1,584. If I subtract away 24, I get 1,560. Okay, then minus, I have 1 over, again, 12 squared is 144, and then minus 2 times 12 is 24. So if I subtract 144 minus 24, I get 120. Now, 
156 is not divisible by 5, right? How do I know that? Because the final digit is not a 0 or a 5. So I cannot simplify this any further. So all I can do is work on this side and see what I can get. So to get a common denominator here, I can just check to see if 1,560 is divisible by 120. And it is. It's 13 times 120. So I can just multiply this by 13 over 13. And so what I'd have is 63 minus 13 over 1,560. So 63 minus 13 is what? That's going to give me 50. So 50. Now, how do I reduce this quickly? I have a zero at the end here and here. So remember, if you cancel a zero at the end of each number, you're removing a factor of 10. So I can just erase that, and I have 5 over 156 here, 5 over 156 here. And so we can go back up here and say that this k equals 12 is also a valid solution. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're going to take a look at 3 over x minus 1. And this is equal to x plus 5 over 2x squared minus 2x minus 5x minus 10 over x. So the whole goal here when you're solving equations with rational expressions, you want to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, the least common denominator, and that's going to clear all the denominators involved. So there's one additional step that you have to do with these problems. I always tell you to check your work anyway, but with these you have to check to make sure that your solution does not make your denominator equal to zero. Remember, we can never divide by zero, so we have to guard against that. All right, so the first thing we want to do is find our LCD. So our LCD. So let's factor each denominator. We've got x minus 1. That's not going to factor. Then I've got 2x squared minus 2x. I could factor that into 2x times the quantity x minus 1. And then I've just got an x here. Now, when I think about this, I see that I have an x here and an x here. So when I put that in the LCD, I'm just going to put 1 in there. I only have one 2, so let me put a 2 and then only one x. Not two of them, just one. And then additionally, I also have an x minus 1 here and here. Only occurs once in each, so when I build my LCD, I'm just going to throw it in there once. Okay, so now that I have my LCD, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD. Remember, the multiplication of property of equality allows us to do that and preserve our solution. Okay, so I'm going to have 2x times the quantity x minus 1, and I'm going to multiply this by 3 over x minus 1. And I'm going to do this part by part and put my answer underneath because it's just simply not going to fit on my screen. So if I multiply this, this is going to cancel with this, and I'll have 2x times 3, which is 6x. So let me just scroll down, and I'm going to put 6x here. And then this would be equal to, let me scroll back up. So I'm going to erase this now. So now I'm going to multiply by this next part here, which is x plus 5 over, I'm going to use the factor denominator, 2x times the quantity x minus 1. And I always use the factored version just so I can know what's going to cancel. Right? In this particular case, the whole thing is going to cancel, and I'm left with just x plus 5. Okay, now I have that minus, so let me put that there. And then whatever I'm subtracting away, I want to put it in parentheses, right? Because I'm subtracting the whole thing away. So let me set up some parentheses here. And let me erase this. I'm going to do one last multiplication. I'm going to multiply by 5x minus 10 over x. Okay, so we can see that the x would cancel with the x. And I'm left with basically 2 times the quantity x minus 1 times we have 5x minus 10. Now, one thing I could do to make this easy on myself, I could factor out a 5 from here, and that would give me what? x minus 2. So times 5 times the quantity x minus 2. And so 5 times 2 would be 10. So I'd put a 10 in here, and then times the quantity x minus 1, and then times the quantity x minus 2. Okay, let me use green to kind of close that off. And let me just scroll down here now. All right. So now my main focus is just to simplify this. I'm going to have 6x on the left is equal to x plus 5 minus. 
the result of this. So let me do FOIL first. X times X is X squared. The outer would be minus 2X. The inner would be minus X. And the last would be plus 2. And then I'd be multiplying 10 by each term, right? So I would have, and let me put this inside of parentheses, 10 times X squared, that's 10X squared. And then 10 times negative 2X, that's minus 20X. And then 10 times negative X, that's minus 10X. And then 10 times 2, which is 20. Okay, so let me erase this. And again, the purpose of the parentheses, I am subtracting away the whole result from this. This is the result here. So I've got to make sure that I subtract everything away. You put parentheses up, and then when you take your parentheses away, you're reminded that, hey, I've got to change the sign of each term. So I take these away, and I go, okay, this is minus, this is plus, this is plus, and this is going to be minus. So now I can just combine like terms. So on this side, I have, I have x, 20x, and 10x. And then I also have, let me kind of do this in a different color, 5 and negative 20. And so that's what I'm going to be combining here. So let me write 6x again. And this equals x plus 20x plus 10x would give me 31x. And then I would have minus 10x squared. And then 5 minus 20 is negative 15. Okay, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. Now in this case, because I'm going to have a quadratic, let me go ahead and subtract 6x away from each side. So that's going to cancel and give me a 0. And this will be equal to, I'll have negative 10x squared. 31x minus 6x is 25x, so plus 25x. And then minus 15. Okay. So one thing you might want to do, you might not like having a leading coefficient that's negative. Recognize that you have a little trick you can use. You can multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. If I multiply 0 by negative 1, I still get 0. If I multiply negative 10x squared by negative 1, I get 10x squared. If I multiply 25x by negative 1, I get negative 25x. And then if I multiply negative 15 by negative 1, I get plus 15. Okay, so now that we have that, how do we go about solving this equation? Well, because we haven't gotten to the end of Algebra 1 where I talk about the quadratic formula, I've only given you quadratic equations that you can solve by factoring, right, using the zero product property. So this one is factorable. So let's go ahead and set that up. So this is equal zero. And if you want the equal zero on the right-hand side, that's fine. We can switch it up. I know that's more traditional. So we can do 10x squared minus 25x plus 15 is equal to zero. And then I could factor out a five to start. So let's do that. Five times the quantity 2x squared minus 5x plus three. And this is equal to zero. Now, give me two integers whose product is 2 times 3, or 6. So this is the product I'm looking for. And whose sum is negative 5. This is the sum I'm looking for. Well, if I do negative 2 and negative 3, that would work. So let's set this up. We're going to factor by grouping. So we'll have 2x squared inside minus. I'm going to go ahead and do 2x, and then minus 3x, and then plus 3. This is equal to 0. Let me just scroll down a little bit. So from the first group here, I could pull out a 2x. So I would have 2x out in front, and then I would have x minus 1 inside. And then from the second group, I could pull out a negative 3. That's going to give me x minus 1 inside. So I have my common binomial factor of x minus 1. Let's highlight that real quick. So we're going to be pulling that out. So I'll have 5 times the quantity x minus 1 times the quantity 2x minus 3. And this is equal to 0. So now we solve this by setting each factor with a variable equal to 0. So I can set x minus 1 equal to 0. And I can say or 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. So let's solve each equation here. So I add 1 to both sides here. I get x equals 1. Okay, then or I add 3 to both sides of the equation here. That cancels. I'll have 2x equals 3. Divide both sides by 2. I'll get x is equal to 3 halves. So I get x equals 1 or x equals 3 halves. But again, you're not done. In a lot of cases, we kind of stop, we report our answer, and we say, hey, we're done. You know, if I don't feel like checking it, I just kind of move on to the next problem. You have to check these because you might get a solution that makes your denominator 0. Again, you can't have that. 
So let me erase everything. We're gonna go all the way back up to the top. All right, so again, x equals one or x equals three halves. Okay, so now I wanna plug in a one for each x. Now, right away, you see that there's a problem. If I plug a one in here, I'm gonna get one minus one, which is zero. So I've gotta reject this answer. Nope, can't use it, say reject. That is not a valid solution because when I plug it in, it results in a denominator of zero. And it doesn't matter if it works here. If it fails in one of them, you can't use it. And it would actually fail here too. It would give you a denominator of zero there also. But if it fails in any of them, you gotta reject it. So let's move on to x equals three halves now. So if I plug in a three halves for x, I would have three over three halves minus one. So let's kind of simplify this as we go. So one, I'm gonna write as two over two. So I have a common denominator. I would have three minus two, which is one over the common denominator of two. So this is basically what? Three over one divided by one half. So this is three over one times two over one. So this is six. So I'm gonna have six over here. And this is gonna be equal to, I'm plugging in a three halves up here. So again, I'm kind of doing this as I go. So three halves plus for five, I'm gonna multiply by two over two and write 10 over two. So this would be 13 halves. So 13 halves. And then this is over. I'm gonna square three halves. That would give me nine fourths. And I'm multiplying that by two. And then I'm subtracting away two times three halves. So before I go canceling anything, let me just cancel this with this and get nine halves. So I'd have nine halves minus six halves. Nine minus six is three, so I'd have three halves there. So we'd have 13 halves over three halves. So this would be equal to 13 halves times two thirds. And the twos would cancel out and you'd have 13 over three. So let's write 13 over three. And then we're gonna have minus, we're gonna have minus. We have five times three halves minus 10 over three halves. So five times three is 15. This would be 15 halves. I could write 10 as 20 halves. So this would end up being negative five halves. So negative five halves over three halves. So it'd be negative five halves times two thirds. So again, the twos are gonna cancel and I'd have negative five over three. So minus negative five over three. We know that minus a negative is plus a positive. 13 plus five is 18, so I would have 18 thirds and we all know that 18 divided by three is six. So we do get that six equals six. So not only does this not make any of the denominators zero, it also has the left side equaling the right side. So it is a valid solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Two on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we wanna solve each equation. So we have one minus, we have four over x squared plus four x. And this is equal to x plus two over x plus four. So the whole deal with solving an equation with rational expressions, you want to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD for all the denominators involved. That's gonna clear the denominators and give you a nice clean equation to solve. But one thing that you have to do is you have to check each solution that you get and make sure that it doesn't result in your denominator being zero. Okay, so that's the main thing. So if I look here for my denominators, I have this denominator here which is x squared plus four x. If I factored that, I'd pull out an x and I would have x plus four. And if I look over here, I just have x plus four. So my LCD would simply be x times a quantity x plus four, right? I have an x plus four here and here, just one is gonna go in. And I have that x that's only here, so that's gonna go in. Now, once I have that, I'm just gonna multiply both sides of the equation by that. And all my denominators are gonna drop out. Just like we saw at the beginning of Algebra 1 when we cleared our equation of fractions. Okay, so let's say we do x times the quantity x plus 4. And I'm multiplying this by 1 minus, let me put this in brackets, 4 over x squared plus 4x. And this is equal to, let me kind of drag this up a little bit. I have x plus 2 over x plus four. 
And this is multiplied by, again, the LCD, which is X times the quantity X plus four. So when I use my distributive property here, I'm gonna have X times the quantity X plus four times one. Anything times one is just itself. So I would have X times the quantity X plus four, and then minus, I have that minus sign there. Now next, I wanna use my distributive property again. And so I have X times the quantity X plus four times four over X squared plus four X. Now it helps if you leave your denominators in factored form so that you can see what would cancel. Again, in factored form, this is X times the quantity X plus four. So this exactly matches that, and so they're gonna cancel out. What I'm gonna be left with is just a four, right? That's all I'm gonna have, so I have minus four. Okay, then equals. If I look over here, this is gonna cancel with this, right? The X plus fours are gonna cancel, and I'm left with X times X plus two. So I have X outside of parentheses, and in the parentheses, just X plus two. So now we have a nice, clean equation, very easy to solve. All I'm gonna do is use my distributive property, x times x is x squared, then plus x times four is four x, then minus four, and this equals, x times x is x squared, then x times two is plus two x. Okay, so I'm gonna subtract x squared away from each side of the equation. So then that's gonna cancel, and that's gonna cancel, and I'm gonna subtract two x away from each side of the equation. So that's gonna cancel, and I can add four to both sides of the equation. So what I'm gonna have, four X minus two X is two X, and this is gonna be equal to, I'll have a four over here. Divide both sides of the equation by two, and I get X is equal to two. All right, so let's erase everything and we'll go back up and check. And we're checking to make sure that the denominator does not become zero when we plug a two in for X. But noticing that we have a plus here and a plus here, we can already see that that's not gonna happen. But we're gonna go through the motions anyway, just to get some practice. So we're gonna have one minus, we have four over, two squared is four, plus four times two is eight. So this would be four over 12. Now I could reduce that, but I'm gonna hold off for a second. And I'm gonna write this as 12 over 12. And so 12 minus four is eight. So I would have eight over 12. I would have eight over 12. And if I wanna reduce that, each is divisible by four. Eight divided by four is two. 12 divided by four is three, so this is two thirds. Now over here, two plus two is four, and two plus four is six. If I then simplify this, four divided by two is two, six divided by two is three, so I do in fact get that two thirds equals two thirds. So again, not only did I not get a denominator of zero when I plugged in a two for each x, I also get the left and the right sides being equal, so x equals two is a valid solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Three on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we wanna solve each equation and we wanna look at n minus one over n plus five. And this is equal to one over n squared plus n minus 20 plus n plus three over n squared plus n minus 20. So when we encounter an equation with rational expressions, what we wanna do is multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD for all the denominators involved, and that's gonna clear all the denominators from your equation, okay? It's the same thing as we did when we worked with equations with fractions at the very beginning of Algebra 1. All right, so to get the LCD, the first thing I'm gonna do is just factor each denominator. So n plus five, that's not gonna factor. If I have n squared plus n minus 20, this can be factored, so I'd have an n here and an n here. So give me two integers whose sum is one, and whose product is negative 20. Well, you could do positive five and negative four. So plus five and negative four. And this is the same thing over here. So this would be n plus five, that quantity, times n minus four, okay, that quantity. So my LCD is very, very simple. My LCD is gonna be what? Well, I have an n plus five here, here, and here. It only occurs once in each. So I'm only gonna put one in when I build my LCD. Then I have an n minus four here and here. Again, just gonna put one in when I build the LCD. All right, so n plus five, that quantity, times n minus four, that quantity, that is the LCD. So now I'm gonna multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, and I'm gonna clear all the denominators. Now, it's too much to fit on my screen, so I'm just gonna do part by part. Let me kinda drag this up to the top here. I'm gonna start out with n plus five, 
times n minus 4 times this guy on the left, which is n minus 1 over n plus 5. So what we can do here is cancel this with this, right? two common factors. What I'm going to be left with is n minus 4, that quantity, times n minus 1. So let me kind of scroll down. I'm going to write this answer below. So n minus 4, again, that quantity, times n minus 1, that quantity. Okay, and then we had an equal sign. So let me write that down here. I'm going to put equals. Let me scroll back up now. And I'm going to just erase that. And we're going to do the next part, which is this part right here. So I'm going to have 1 over... And I'm going to write the denominator in factored form, which is n plus 5 times n minus 4. Now, what we can see is that the denominator is the same thing as the LCD. So this is going to cancel with this. This is going to cancel with this. And I'm just left with 1. So in this space right here where it says equals, I'm going to just put a 1 there. Then the next thing I would have is a plus. So let me go ahead and write that. I'm going to put a plus here. And then I've got one more multiplication to do. So let me erase this and this. And I've got n plus 3 in the numerator over the quantity n plus 5 times the quantity n minus 4. Okay, so again, I have a denominator that matches the LCD. So this is going to cancel, and this is going to cancel, and I'm going to have n plus 3. So then over here, I'm going to write n plus 3. All right, so now to simplify, I'm going to use FOIL here n times n is n squared, the outer would be minus n, the inner would be minus 4n, so that's going to be negative 5n, and then the last negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4, this equals 1 plus n plus 3, which we could simplify to n plus 4. So we're going to have a quadratic equation here, and again I keep saying this, I'm only going to give you quadratic equations at this point that you can factor. So let's go ahead and set this up as everything on the left, and then equal to 0. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to subtract n away from each side of the equation, and I'm going to subtract 4 away from each side of the equation. So this is going to cancel and just become 0 over here on the right. On the left, I'm now going to have n squared, negative 5n minus n is negative 6n, and then 4 minus 4 is 0. So I have n squared minus 6n equals 0. So I'm going to factor the left side, and so to do that, I would pull an n out, and I would have n minus 6, and this equals 0. And then I'm going to use my zero product property. So each factor, right, this is a factor, and then this is a factor. I'm going to set it equal to 0, and I'm going to solve. So n equals 0. That's already solved. n, n can be 0. That's a solution. Then or n minus 6 equals 0. I add 6 to each side of the equation, and I get that n is equal to 6. So there's my two proposed solutions, n equals 0 or n equals 6. Now, it's very important that you check these. You have to make sure that none of your proposed solutions makes any of your denominators equal to 0. If they do, you have to reject that proposed solution. So let's erase everything and go back up to the top. So again, we get a solution of n equals 0 or n equals 6. So let's go ahead and start by plugging in a 0 here, 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 here here, here, and here. So 0 minus 1, starting out at the top left, 0 minus 1 is negative 1 over 0 plus 5 is 5. This should be equal to 1 over 0 squared is 0, plus 0 is 0, and then minus 20. So minus 20, and then plus 0 plus 3 is 3 over, these would both be 0, and then minus 20. So I have a common denominator right now of negative 20, so I can add numerators, 1 plus 3 is 4. So I would have 4 over negative 20, or I could write that as negative 4 over 20, doesn't matter. And then if I reduce this, 4 divided by 4 is 1, and 20 divided by 4 is 5. So I do get negative 1 fifth equals negative 1 fifth. So this is a valid solution, and none of the denominators became 0. So that's okay. All right, so the next thing I want to do is plug in a 6. So I would have 6 minus 1, which is 5, over 6 plus 5, which is 11. This should be equal to 1 over 6 squared is 36, plus 6 minus 20. So 36 plus 6 is 42. 42 minus 20 is 22. So this is 22 here. 
and then plus, 6 plus 3 is going to give me 9, and this is over, 6 squared is again 36, 36 plus 6 is 42, 42 minus 20 is 22. So if I add here, 1 plus 9 is 10, I'd have 10 over 22, 10 over 22, and if I divide each here by 2, I'm going to end up with 5 over 11. So I get 5 elevenths equals 5 elevenths. So again, none of my denominators became 0, and the left and the right sides are equal. So n equals 6 is also a valid solution. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 4, on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we want to solve each equation. So we have 4 over m plus 1 plus m over m minus 5. And this is equal to 4. So when you solve an equation with rational expressions involved, what you want to do is you want to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD of all the denominators involved, and that's going to clear the denominators from your equation. So it's the same thing as we experienced at the beginning of Algebra 1 when we cleared our equation of fractions. So for my LCD, it's pretty simple. I have m plus 1 as this denominator and m minus 5 as this one. The product of the two would be the LCD. So let me write that the LCD is the product of the two, which is m plus 1, that quantity, times m minus 5, that quantity. So let me set this up. I'll have m plus 1, that quantity, times m minus 5, and then times, let me put this inside of brackets, 4 over m plus 1, plus m over m minus 5, close the brackets, and then this is equal to, we'll have 4 times, Again, we have that quantity m plus 1 times the quantity m minus 5. Let's scroll down and get some room going. So let's go ahead and multiply now, and I'm going to use my distributive property. So this is going to get multiplied by this. And we can all see that the m plus 1 would cancel here and here, and I would be left with 4 times the quantity m minus 5. Okay, then I'm going to do that again. So let me erase this, and I have this plus sign here. And again, I'm going to use my distributive property again. And so now what I'm going to have is m minus 5 canceling here and here. And I'll have m times the quantity m plus 1. Then this equals. Over here, I just have 4 times the quantity m plus 1 times the quantity m minus 5. So now I don't have any more denominators. And I'm going to go through and just simplify. So 4 times m is 4m. Minus 4 times 5, that's 20. Then plus, we have m times m, that's m squared. Then m times 1, that's m, so plus m. And I could simplify here before I kind of move on. We could write this as m squared plus 5m minus 20. Okay, this equals over here. And then here I have m times m, that's m squared. The outer would be minus 5m. The inner would be plus 1m, so that would be minus 4m. And then the last, 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. And then this is multiplied by 4. So let's put equals here. 4 times m squared is 4m squared. 4 times negative 4m is minus 16m. And then 4 times negative 5 is minus 20. Okay. So if I see the same thing on each side of an equation, I can get rid of it, right? Because if I added 20 to both sides, if I said plus 20 here and plus 20 here, it would cancel from each side. Now the next thing is I can add 16m to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. Let me kind of scroll down and get a little bit more room. And then I can subtract 4m squared away from each side of the equation. So that's gone. And I'll put it over here. And so this side is canceled and I'm going to put a 0. So on this side, m squared minus 4m squared is negative 3m squared. And then 5m plus 16m is plus. 21m. So now, in order to solve this, I'm going to factor the left side. I notice I can pull out a negative 3m, so that would leave me with an m here, and then minus a 7 here. Okay, this equals 0. So now I would set each factor equal to 0, so negative 3m equals 0. We divide both sides by negative 3, and we get that m is equal to 0. So then we have or, we also have this other factor, which is m minus 7. We set that equal to 0. We add 7 to each side of the equation, and so we get or m can also be 7. Now, the key thing here is we've got to check these solutions 
and make sure that they do not give us a denominator of zero in our original equation. So let's erase everything. We're gonna go back up to the top. So again, we had that m was equal to zero or m was equal to seven. All right, so we're gonna plug in a zero here, here, and here and see what we get. So over here on the left, four over zero plus one, zero plus one is one, four over one is just four, and then plus, if I plug a zero in here, and a zero in here, I would have zero over negative five. Zero over any non-zero number is zero. So this would be four plus zero or just four, and this is equal to four, so that checks out. Right? We don't get a denominator that's zero, and the left and the right sides are equal, so we're good to go there. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is check seven. So I'm gonna plug a seven in here, so I would have four over, seven plus one is eight, so I could write that as one half, right? Four over eight is one half. Then plus, I'd have seven over, seven minus five is two. So if I do one half plus seven halves, I'm gonna get eight halves, which is four. So I get four equals four. And so this checks out again, no denominators were equal to zero, left and the right sides are equal, so we're good to go. M can equal zero here, or M can also equal seven. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section five on solving equations with rational expressions. All right, so we wanna solve each equation. So we have one over r squared minus five r plus six plus one, and this is equal to r over r minus three. So when I have an equation that has rational expressions involved, what I wanna do is I wanna multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD for all the denominators. So this is the same thing as we did back at the beginning of Algebra 1, where we clear our equation of fractions. So if I look at this real quick, I see this denominator is r squared minus 5r plus 6. I can factor that into, I know I'd have an r here and an r here, give me two integers whose sum is negative 5, and whose product is six, that'd be negative two and negative three. And so for the LCD, for my LCD, I would have what? I have an R minus three here, and I have an R minus three here. So that's gonna go in there. And then I'd have an R minus two in there. So it's just this denominator here, which is R minus two, that quantity, times R minus three. So once I have my LCD, what I wanna do is multiply both sides of the equation by that LCD, and that's gonna clear all my denominators. So let me take this r minus two, again, times r minus three, and multiply it by, inside of brackets here, I'm gonna do one over, I'm gonna write this in factor form, r minus two times r minus three, and then we have plus one over here, and this equals, we have r over r minus three, and this is times, let me kind of scooch this over just a little bit. Again, r minus two times r minus three. Okay, so over here, I'm gonna use my distributive property and I can see that this is gonna cancel with this and I'm just gonna have a one. Now I'm gonna use my distributive property again and I have just a one there. So it'll be one times this. So it'll just be plus that quantity r minus two times the quantity r minus three. Now, because I'm gonna to have to simplify this, I might as well just write it out while I know it. r squared minus five r plus six. And then we kind of move on to this side over here. So we put our equals here. So now on this side, I would cancel this with this, right? Those factors of r minus three would cancel. And I would simply have r times the quantity r minus two. Okay, so now I would simplify on the left. One plus six is seven, so this is r squared minus 5r plus 7, and this equals r times r is r squared, then r times negative 2 is minus 2r. If I subtract r squared away from each side, remember, if I have the same thing on each side of the equation, I can just get rid of it. Then if I add 2r to both sides, that's going to be gone. So the right side here is going to be 0. So the left side of this is going to be negative 3r, plus seven, and again, this is equal to zero. So to solve this, I'm just gonna subtract seven away from each side, and I'll have negative three r is equal to negative seven, divide both sides by negative three, and I'll have r is equal to seven thirds. All right, so the main thing here is that once you get your solution, 
you've got to go back into your original equation and check to make sure that it doesn't make any of your denominators equal to zero when you plug it in. So as long as it doesn't do that, and the left side equals the right side, you have the correct solution. So let's go ahead and erase everything. So then again, I'm going to plug in a 7 thirds for r. So I would have 1 over 7 thirds, that would be squared, then minus 5 times 7 thirds, then plus 6, then plus 1. This is equal to 7 thirds over 7 thirds minus 3. So for this one, let me simplify this denominator first. 7 squared is 49, 3 squared is 9. So this would be 1 over, I would have 49 over 9, then minus. 5 times 7 is 35 over 3, then plus 6. Now if I want a common denominator here so I can do this addition, I need to multiply this by 3 over 3 and this by 9 over 9. So 35 times 3 is 105. So this would be 105 over 9. And 6 times 9 is 54. So this would be 54 over 9. So 49 plus 54 is 103. And then 103 minus 105 is negative 2. So this ends up being negative 2 over 9. So negative 2 over 9. Now. If I have 1 divided by this, let's write this as 1 over 1 divided by negative 2 over 9. And so we see that this would transform into 1 over 1 times, take the reciprocal of this, 9 over negative 2. So you'd have negative 9 halves there. Let's erase everything and just write that. So negative 9 halves plus 1, so I could write that as 2 over 2. So negative 9 plus 2 is negative 7, so this becomes negative 7 halves. So that's what the left side is going to be. So on the right side now, let's look at this denominator here. If I multiply this by 3 over 3, I'd have 9 here, so 7 minus 9 would be negative 2, so this would be negative 2 thirds. So I'd have 7 thirds divided by negative 2 thirds, so that's 7 thirds times the reciprocal of this, which is 3 over negative 2. The threes would cancel, and I'd have 7 over negative 2. So this equals 7 over negative 2 or negative 7 over 2, doesn't matter. So the left and the right side are equal, and none of the denominators became 0 when I plugged in the 7 thirds. So I can say my solution, which was r equals 7 thirds, is correct. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 49. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on applications of rational expressions. All right, so the first problem we're going to look at today has to do with rate of work, or some people call it a work rate problem. Basically, in most of these scenarios, you're looking at how long it takes for two or more people to complete one job. So in this particular case, we have that Mary can pick 40 bushels of apples in seven hours. Steve can pick the same amount in nine hours. How long would it take for them to pick 40 bushels of apples if they work together? So the way you set this problem up, and they're very, very easy once you've done a couple of them, you think about each person's individual contribution in a one-hour period. Now, that would change if you had a different unit for time. If it was you know, days you were looking at, you'd say a one-day period. If it was weeks, one week. If it was minutes, one minute. So it's one unit of the given time. In this case, it's hours. So we're going to think about how much can Mary do in one hour? Well, if a completed job is to pick 40 bushels of apples... In one hour, she can do one-seventh of that. Then for Steve, he does it in nine hours, so in one hour, he can do one-ninth of that. So let me kind of scroll down here real quick. I'm going to write this right here and say, okay, in one, in one hour, we have that Steve and Mary. Okay, Mary and then Steve. We know that Mary does one-seventh of the job. And we know that Steve does one ninth of the job. So what we want to do here is figure out in an hour, how much of the job do they complete if they're working together? We would just sum their individual contributions, right? We would say, okay, well, to figure out what they do together, one seventh plus one ninth is going to be equal to what? Get a common denominator going. So I would have nine plus seven over 63. So together they would give us 16 over 63, that amount of the job completed in one hour. 
let's erase this real quick. And let's just put this right here. So in one hour, 16 over 63, this is the amount completed in one hour. Right, and that's with both of them working. Now, what I'm missing here is I need a variable that represents the amount of hours that it's gonna take for both of them to complete the job. So let's go back up and let's assign a variable. Let's just use X, because that's easy. A lot of people in these problems like to use T because it represents time. Let's just use X and say this equals the number of hours for both to complete the job. And again, the job is to pick 40 bushels of apples. So let me scroll back down now. So if I have, let me kind of get this on the screen, 16 over 63 as the amount that's completed in one hour, and I multiply this by X, which is the amount of time. So this is the amount of time. And again, this is in hours to complete the job. What would I get? Well, I would get one, right? I would get one completed job. So to solve this type of equation, it's very, very, very easy. 16 over 63 X equals one. I multiply both sides by the reciprocal. So I multiply this by 63 over 16, I multiply this by 63 over 16. And what's gonna happen is this is gonna cancel and I'll have X is equal to 63 over 16. Now, in terms of numbers that we work with every day, it's not very useful. I worked 63 over 16 hours. What is that? So if you divide them, you end up with 3.9375 hours. So let's go back up to the top and we're gonna answer this and say, it takes 3.9375 hours for both Mary and Steve to complete the job. Or again, if you wanted to write 63 over 16 hours, that doesn't matter. It's going to be correct either way. So now we wanna think about checking this. Again, let me kind of scroll down for a minute. And let me kind of erase some of this. So let's think about this for a second. We're just gonna think logically. Mary does one seventh of the job in an hour. If I multiply by 63 over 16, well, I know that 63 divided by seven is nine, so this would be nine sixteenths. So that means if she works at this rate for 63 over 16 hours, she does nine sixteenths of the job. Now for Steve, if he works at his rate for the same amount of time, he's gonna contribute, this cancels with this and gives me a seven, so I would have seven sixteenths of the job from him. If I add those two amounts together, seven plus nine is obviously 16, 16 over 16 is one, so I would get one completed job. So this does make sense and we do have the right answer. All right, so let's take a look at another work rate problem, or again, rate of work problem. So we have that working alone, Sam can harvest the field in four hours. One day his friend Julio helps him and it only takes 2.4 hours. How long would it take for Julio to do it alone? So what we're given here is we're given Sam's kind of rate of work. We know it takes him four hours to do a job. We're not given any information about Julio individually. It doesn't say, well, if he worked by himself, he could do the job in this many hours. What we are given is some information about if they work together, it would take this many hours. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take the information given and figure out Julio's rate of work so that we can answer this question of how long it would take for Julio to complete this job alone. So this is an hour, so again, I'm gonna say in one hour, I know that Sam can complete one fourth of the job. Now, I don't know that same information for Julio. So let's write Julio, and let's let a variable, again, in this scenario, a lot of people like to use T. I like to just stick with X, it's very generic. Let's let X 
be equal to Julio's time, of course this is in hours, to complete the job. So from this, what I can say is that in one hour, Julio would complete one over X, because again, it takes some X number of hours to complete the job. If X was nine, for example, I'm not saying it is, but if it was, he would do one ninth of the job. If X was 20, he would do one twentieth of the job, you know, so on and so forth. So one over X of the job is what he would complete. Now, if I sum their individual contributions, what I'm gonna get, I would have one fourth plus one over x. And to get a common denominator here, I'm gonna multiply this by x over x, and this by four over four. So that's gonna give me what? x over four x plus four over four x, which is basically what? x plus four over four x. So in one hour, the two of them combined are gonna give us x plus four over four x. That amount of work. All right, so this is the amount of the job that's completed in one hour. Okay, again, this is their rate of work in an hour. I'm gonna write this x plus four over four x. In the problem, it told us that when they work together in 2.4 hours, they accomplish the job. So in other words, I should be able to multiply this by 2.4, right, because this is what they accomplish in one hour, times 2.4 should give me one completed job. Now, because we're dealing with fractions here, let's convert 2.4 into a fraction. We know that this is 2, 0.4 is 4 over 10, so 4 tenths, 2 and 4 tenths. So I can simplify 4 tenths into 2 fifths, and then 5 times 2 is 10, 10 plus 2 is 12, so this is 12 fifths. This is 12 fifths. Okay, so now let's multiply this. And I can see that 12 times x would be 12x. And then plus 12 times four, that's 48. And this is over five times four x, that's 20x. And this is equal to one. I can multiply both sides of the equation by 20x. And let me do that over here. 20x over here. That's gonna cancel this with this. And times 20x over here. Let me scroll down a little bit more. So what I'm gonna have is 12x plus 48 is equal to 20x. I can subtract 12x away from each side of the equation. That's gonna get canceled. And we'll have 48 is equal to 8x. Now we know here we can divide both sides of the equation by eight and get that six is equal to x. All right, so if six is equal to x or x is equal to six, however you wanna think about that, that means that it takes Julio six hours to complete the job alone, because that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're gonna answer this and say it takes six hours for Julio to complete this job alone. And does that make sense? Well, let's test it. Sam can harvest the field in four hours. So that means his rate of work in an hour, he would do one fourth of it. Julio, we now know does this in six hours. So in an hour, he would do one sixth of it. So if I combine these two, the LCD would be 12. So multiply this by three over three, this by two over two, and I would get three plus two or five over 12. So I would get five twelfths. This is how much of the job that's completed in one hour, okay, when they're both working together. Now it says they complete this in 2.4 hours when they work together. So multiply that by 2.4. As a fraction, we know this is 12 fifths already. And we can see this is gonna be equal to one, right? One completed job. This cancels with this, this cancels with this. So we get one equals one. Another way you can think about that is you can think about, okay, Sam, who's doing one fourth of the job in an hour, multiply that by 12 fifths, the number of hours they would have to work together. This cancels with this and gives me three. So he would do three fifths of the job. And then for the other guy, he's one sixth times, again, 12 fifths, cancel this with this and get two, and you have two fifths. So three fifths plus two fifths, 
again, equals one. So however you want to think about that, the time it takes for Julio to complete the job by himself is going to be six hours. So let's wrap up the practice set and look at one that involves the distance formula. So we have that Mike can fly his plane 300 miles with the wind in the same amount of time as it takes to fly 100 miles against the wind. If the wind speed is 50 miles per hour, how fast is the plane in still air? Let's make a little table here. And we have two scenarios. It's with the wind and against the wind. So let's kind of scroll down and we'll have with the wind. And then we'll have against the wind. Okay, so for these two scenarios, we wanna think about, again, the distance formula, which is distance is equal to rate times time. But I taught you in the lesson, it doesn't have to be represented in this way. You could solve for rate or you could also solve for time. So let me erase the equals. We'll just have the three components here. I'll erase that multiplication and let's do this. So we're gonna fill out the information we get for each one. So with the wind, what's our distance? Well, it tells us that he can fly his plane 300 miles with the wind in the same amount of time as it would take to fly 100 miles against the wind. So the distance we're putting in here with the wind is 300, against the wind is 100. So with the wind, 300, against the wind, 100. Now, as far as the rate of speed, all it tells us is that the wind speed is 50 miles per hour. And in this case, the question is how fast is the plane in still air? So let's assign a variable like x. So let's let x be equal to the speed of the plane in still air. So if I am going with the wind, I'm going to add the wind speed, right? Because the wind is at my back. It's pushing on my plane. It's making me go faster. So I would have a speed of X, again, that represents the speed of the plane in still air, plus 50, which is the wind speed. So with the wind, my rate is X plus 50. Now against the wind, I still have that speed in still air, but now I'm fighting the wind, so I'm subtracting 50. So I would have X minus 50. So now that I have my distance and my rate, it doesn't tell me anything about the time, other than the fact that these two times are going to be equal. But remember, I can solve my distance formula four times. So if I have distance is equal to rate times time, I can isolate T by dividing both sides of the equation by R and get distance over rate. So if I take this distance over this rate, I get a time. So the time here would be 300 over X plus 50. And the time here would be 100 over X minus 50. And in the problem, it's gonna tell us that these two times are the same, and so we can set them equal to each other and solve for x, right, and get our unknown. So if I have 300 over x plus 50, and I set this equal to 100 over x minus 50, the shortcut to this is just to cross multiply, right? Because if I say, okay, let's get the LCD here, the LCD is what? It's gonna be x plus 50, times x minus 50. So if I multiply this side of the equation by x plus 50 times x minus 50, what's gonna happen? Well, this is gonna cancel with this, and I'm gonna multiply 100 times the quantity x plus 50. I could've did the same thing by just cross multiplying this by this. Right? It's the same thing that's gonna happen. The same thing would be over here. If I multiply this by this over here, so x plus 50 times x minus 50, What's gonna happen is this is gonna cancel with this and this is gonna multiply this. I could have did the same thing by saying X minus 50 times 300. So in this scenario, we can just cross multiply and save ourselves a little bit of time. So let me just erase this real quick. We're gonna just cross multiply. All right, so this times this is equal to this times this. So 100 times the quantity X plus 50 is equal to 300 times the quantity x minus 50. All right, 100 times x is 100x, plus one times five is five, you've got one, two, three trailing zeros. 300 times x is 300x, and then minus 300 times 50, three times five is 15, 
you've got one, two, three trailing zeros. Okay, so to solve this equation, I can subtract 100x away from each side. So this is gonna cancel, and then I can add 15,000 to each side. That's gonna cancel. Okay, so I'm gonna have 20,000 over here on the left is equal to 200x. Divide both sides by 200. And I'm gonna cancel this with this, this with this. And essentially I'd have 200 divided by two, which is 100. So x is gonna be equal to 100. All right, so let's see if that makes mathematical sense. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just answer it and say that the plane travels 100 miles per hour in still air. And to check it, again, to see if it makes sense, it says that his plane can fly 300 miles with the wind in the same amount of time as it takes to fly 100 miles against the wind. So if it's going 100 miles per hour in still air and the wind speed is 50 miles per hour, well, 100 plus 50 is 150. So when he's going with the wind, he's going at 150 miles per hour. Now to go 300 miles, obviously that's two hours. If he's flying against the wind, would he only go 100 miles? Well, yeah. If the speed of the plane in still air is 100 miles per hour, and we subtract 50 miles per hour for the wind speed, well, 100 minus 50 is 50. 50 times two hours gives me 100. So he would go 300 miles in two hours traveling with the wind, and it would only go 100 miles in two hours traveling against the wind. So our answer here is correct. The plane travels 100 miles per hour in still air. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on Applications of Rational Expressions. All right, so the problem we're going to look at today is a rate of work problem, or again, work rate problem. So working alone, Adam can tar a roof in five hours. Jay can tar the same roof in eight hours. How long would it take to tar the same roof if they worked together? So the first thing we want to do is think about each person's work rate. So how much can they accomplish per one unit of the given time? So in this case, we're dealing with hours. So what we would say is in one hour, in one hour, we have Adam who can tar a roof in five hours. So one hour would be one fifth of that roof. So for Adam, in one hour, he does one fifth of, we'll say the job. Then the other guy, which is Jake, he's gonna work at a slower pace. So he takes eight hours to tar the same roof. So in an hour, he's done one eighth of the job. All right, so once we know the individual contributions, what we wanna do is sum them together. So in other words, Adam does one fifth of the job in an hour, Jake does one eighth of the job in an hour. How much would they do together in an hour? So we would say one fifth plus one eighth. Multiply this by eight over eight. Multiply this by five over five. So you would get eight over 40 plus five over 40, which is 13 over 40. So they do 13 over 40, that fractional amount of the job in one hour when they work together. So let me erase all this. And I'm just going to put that fraction, 13 fortieths. So this is the amount completed in one hour. So the next thing we need to think about is a variable. Now we need a variable to represent the total amount of hours that it's going to take for Adam and Jake to complete this job. So we can say, let's let X equal the number of hours for both to complete the job. So if I take the amount completed in one hour and I multiply by the number of hours it takes to complete the job, I'm going to get one, right, for one completed job. So once you set this thing up, 
it's very, very easy to solve. You just multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal. So multiply this by 40 over 13, this by 40 over 13. Obviously, this is gonna cancel, and I get x is equal to 40 over 13. So that's how many hours it takes for both of them working together to complete the job. In this case, that's to tar the roof. So we're gonna write that it takes, and 40 over 13 is not something that's you know, very helpful as a decimal. It's about 3.08 hours if you wanted to do an approximation. But let's just be precise and say it takes 40 over 13, that number of hours, to complete the job. And if you want to check this, all you would do is take that fraction and multiply it by their individual contributions in an hour. So in other words, we know that Adam does one-fifth of the job in an hour. So if I take one-fifth and I multiply it by 40 over 13, so this is how much he accomplishes in an hour, this is how long they're going to work, right? So this right here, 5 and 40, those would each have a common factor of 5, so this would be 8 thirteenths. So what's going to happen is Adam is going to accomplish 8 thirteenths of that job in that amount of time. Now for the other guy, he does 1 eighth of the job in an hour. So same scenario for him, multiply it by the number of hours they work, divide 8 by 8 you get 1, 40 by 8 you get 5, so he accomplishes 5 thirteenths of that job in that amount of time. So in that amount of time, you've got one guy that does 8 thirteenths of the job, another guy that does 5 thirteenths of the job. You add those two amounts together and you get 13 over 13 or one completed job. So we know we have the correct answer here. Again, it takes 40 over 13, that number of hours, to complete the job when Adam and Jake are working together. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on applications of rational expressions. All right, so working alone, it takes Ryan nine hours to stock and zone the canned soup aisle in a grocery store. Caesar can perform the same task in 11 hours. How long would it take if they work together? So again, this is a work rate problem or a rate of work problem, however you wanna think about that. And essentially what you wanna look at is how much they individually contribute to the process in a given one unit of time. So the unit of time here is hours. So in one hour, what would Ryan contribute? In one hour, what would Caesar contribute? That's how you wanna start this process. So in one hour, what would Ryan do and what would Caesar do? Okay, so let's go back up to the problem. It says it takes Ryan nine hours to complete the job and Caesar 11 hours to complete the same job. So in one hour, Ryan is one ninth finished, right? He's done one ninth of the job. So one ninth of the job. And in one hour, Caesar has done one eleventh of the job. So working together, I can sum these individual contributions. So one ninth plus one eleventh, multiply this by 11 over 11. Multiply this by 9 over 9. So this over here is going to be 11 plus 9 over 99. So 11 plus 9 is 20, so you get 20 over 99. Okay, so this is how much they complete in a one-hour period. Now, we need to figure out, let me just write this, 20 over 99. So this is the amount completed in one hour. So we need to figure out how many hours it's gonna take for them to finish this job. To do that, we need to assign a variable. A lot of people in these cases will use T for time, but I just use X. So let's let X be equal to the number of hours it takes for both of them to complete the task. So number of hours to complete, we'll say the job. So if I take the amount that's completed in one hour and I multiply it by X, which is the number of hours, I should get what? I should get one completed job, just the number one. Now to solve this type of equation, it's very, very easy. Let me just kind of erase this real quick. 
all I'm going to do is just what? I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal. So multiply this by 99 over 20. Multiply this by 99 over 20. And essentially, this cancels, and I get x is equal to 99 over 20. So that's the number of hours it takes for Ryan and Caesar to stock and zone that aisle if they're working together. So let's go back up, and we'll answer this by saying it would take 99 over 20, that number of hours, to complete the job. And again, that's with them both working together. Now, if you want to check this, just think about the fact that, okay, you have 99 over 20. That's how many hours it takes. Now, in that number of hours, 99 over 20, I've got Ryan that in each hour that he works completes one ninth of the job. So over this time period, what's his contribution? Well, this would cancel with this and give me 11. So it would be Ryan does... 11 twentieths of the job in this time period. Now do the same thing for Caesar. His is going to be 1 over 11, so we're going to cancel this with this and get a 9 here. So for Caesar, in that time period, he does 9 over 20 of the job. If you had 11 20 and 9 20 which is the amount they individually complete in that time frame, 99 over 20 hours, you get 1, right? 11 plus 9 is 20, 20 over 20 is 1. So you get one completed job. So our answer here is correct. It would take 99 over 20 hours to complete the job. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on applications of rational expressions. All right, so a boat that can go 102 miles downstream, and again, downstream is with the current. So the current is helping you. It's pushing on your boat, making you go faster. So in the same amount of time that it can go 78 miles upstream, so upstream is fighting the current. You're going against it. The current is making you go slower. If the current speed, so the speed of the current, is 4 miles per hour, how fast does the boat travel in still water? So let's go ahead and make a little table to organize our information. So we have downstream, and then we have upstream. Okay, so when we work with a motion word problem, we have what? We have distance equals rate times time. So we have distance, we have rate of speed, and we have time. So let's fill in the blanks here. So for downstream, let's go up to the top. In the information we're given about downstream, the boat can go 102 miles downstream in the same amount of time that it can go 78 miles upstream. So in the space for distance, for downstream, I'm going to put 102. For upstream, I'm going to put 78. So 102 and then 78. So then for the rate of speed, because I'm not given a rate of speed, other than to say that the speed of the current is 4 miles per hour, I'm going to introduce a variable. I'm going to let x equal what we're looking for, which is the speed of the boat in still water. For the rate, if I'm going downstream, I have the speed of the boat in still water. So if there was no current at all, plus the current is helping me because I'm going with the current. The speed of the current is 4 miles per hour. So I would take x, again, the speed of the boat in still water, and add to that 4. That's the additional miles per hour I'm going to go because I'm going with the current. So x plus 4 would be the speed of this boat when it's going downstream. So this is x plus 4 here. And by the same logic, if I'm going upstream... I'm taking the speed of the boat in still water, which is x, and now I'm subtracting away 4 miles per hour because I'm fighting the current. So this is x minus 4. Now for time, we're not given any explicit information other than to say that the times are equal. right? It says a boat can go 102 miles downstream in the same amount of time that it can go 78 miles upstream. But I want you to recall that you can manipulate the distance formula. So distance equals rate times time. If I have two of them, I can get the answer for the other. So in other words, if I divide this side by r and this side by r to isolate t, 
This is going to cancel with this, and I'll have t is equal to d over r. So my time would be equal to the distance, which in this case is 102, divided by my rate, right, which in this case is x plus 4. My time here would be 78, which is the distance, over x minus 4, which is my rate. Now, it told us that the two times were equal. And so I can set these two equal to each other, and I can solve for x, my unknown. So I would have 102 over x plus 4, and this is equal to 78 over x minus 4. In order to solve this, the easiest thing to do here is to cross multiply. So I can take this denominator and multiply it by this numerator, and set it equal to this denominator times this numerator. If you think about it, if you use the LCD method that we learned in the last lesson, where we multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, you're doing the same thing. The LCD here is the quantity x plus 4 times the quantity x minus 4. If I multiply this side by that, the x minus 4 would cancel, and you'd have 78 times x plus 4, which is exactly what you're going to get by cross-multiplying. This is equal to, over here, Again, if you use the LCD method, the x plus 4 would cancel, and you'd have 102 times the quantity x minus 4. So you get the same thing by cross-multiplying. Again, this is just a faster method to do it. Okay, so 78 times x is 78x, plus 78 times 4, which is 312. This is equal to 102 times x, which is 102x, minus 102 times 4, which is 408. Okay. So now if I add 408 to each side of the equation, this is going to cancel. And then if I subtract 78x from each side of the equation, that's going to cancel. And what I'm going to have here is 720 is equal to 24x. Now if I divide both sides of the equation by 24, I'm going to end up with x is equal to 30. So let's go back up. Remember, x was the speed of the boat in still water. So we would say that the boat travels 30 miles per hour in still water. Now let's check that. So a boat can go 102 miles downstream in the same amount of time that it can go 78 miles upstream. And it's telling us the current speed is 4 miles per hour. So what we do is revisit our equations that's already perfectly set up for us. So I know that time is equal to distance divided by rate. So if I plug in a 30 here and I get 34, 102 divided by 34 is 3. So that means in 3 hours, traveling at 34 miles per hour, this boat is going to go 102 miles. Now in this particular case, the boat is going slower because it's going upstream. It's fighting the current. 30 minus 4 would be 26. So is 78 divided by 26 3? Yes, it is. This is also 3. So you can see the time is the same in each case. If you are on a boat and it's going 26 miles an hour for 3 hours, you're going to go 78 miles. That's completely consistent with the information given to us in the problem where it tells us that it takes the same amount of time to go 102 miles downstream as it does to go 78 miles upstream. Okay, so we can say that the boat travels 30 miles per hour in still water. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Applications of Rational Expressions. All right, so let's look at a motion word problem. So a plane goes 1,290 miles with the wind in the same amount of time as it goes 1,210 miles against the wind. If the wind speed is 8 miles per hour, how fast does the plane travel in still air? So it's a typical motion word problem you're going to get when you're dealing with applications of rational expressions. What you want to do, let's just set up a little table and organize our thoughts. So we have two scenarios here. We have with the wind and against the wind. Let's kind of scroll down here and say we have a scenario with the wind. And then we have a scenario that's against the wind. So we have distance, we have rate, and we have time. Right? With a motion word problem, you have 
distance equals rate times time, or you can solve for R, or you could solve for T, whatever you need to do. But typically we want to list what the distance is, what the rate is, and what the time is, so we can get an equation going. So let's go back up to the top and try to fill this guy in. All right, so when we're going with the wind, it tells us the distance is 1290 miles. Against the wind, it's 1210. So I'm gonna put 1290 and 1210. All right, now for my rate of speed, it doesn't explicitly give me one. All it tells me is the speed of the wind, which is gonna add or subtract based on the scenario that I'm in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assign a variable like X to represent the speed of the plane in still air. So let's let X equal the speed of the plane in still air. Okay, so now that we've done that, we have two scenarios. One is when we're flying with the wind. So if I'm flying with the wind and I have a wind speed of eight miles per hour, whatever the speed of the plane would be in still air, I've got to add eight to that because the wind is helping me. It's pushing on me to make me go eight miles an hour faster. So I would have X plus eight as my speed in that scenario. So my rate is X plus eight here. And by the same logic, if I'm going against the wind, I'm now gonna have X, which is the speed of the plane in still air, minus eight, so minus the wind speed because I'm now fighting the wind. All right, now for time, Again, I'm not given any information about time other than to say that the two times are gonna be equal. So what I need to do here is get the time from the distance and the rate, right? Because if we take D is equal to R times T, I could solve for T by dividing both sides of the equation by R and isolating T. So this would cancel with this, and I would have time is equal to distance over rate. So my time is the distance, which is 1290, over the rate, which is x plus eight. My time here is the distance, which is 1210, over the rate, which is x minus eight. Now, we are told that the times are gonna be the same. A plane goes 1290 miles with the wind in the same amount of time as it goes 1210 miles against the wind. So what that means is I can set these two times equal to each other, and I can solve for x, to figure out what that is, right? That's gonna tell me the speed of the plane in still air, and that's what I need to answer my question. So 1290 over X plus eight is equal to 1210 over X minus eight. Now in all these scenarios that I've talked about, I told you that it's easier just to cross multiply. I can take this, multiply by this, and it's equal to this multiplied by this. You can use the LCD method, works just fine, but realize that cross multiplying is basically the same thing, it's just much quicker. So if you wanna pause the video and use the LCD method, you're gonna find out that when you unpause the video, you're right at where we got to by using cross multiplying. All right, so we'll have 1290 times the quantity X minus eight. This is equal to 1210 times the quantity X plus eight. Let me just scooch this down. So 1290 times X is 1290X, then minus 1290 times eight, which is 10,320. This equals 1210 times X, which is 1210X, and then plus 1210 times eight, which is 9,680. So then I can add 10,320 to each side of the equation and then I could subtract 1,210X from each side of the equation. So then what's this gonna give me over here? I would have 80X, 80X is equal to 9,680 plus 10,320, which is 20,000. Okay, so divide both sides of the equation by 80. And this is gonna cancel with this and I'll have X is equal to 20,000 divided by 80 is 250. So X equals 250. So let's go back up to the top. So X represents the speed of the plane in still air. So the plane travels at 250 miles per hour in still air. Now, to check this, 
we go back and think about our distance formula. So here it's solved for time for me. So these two times are supposed to be the same. So let me erase this and this and plug in a 250 in each case. So 250 plus 8 is 258. So 1,290 divided by 258 is 5. So that tells me that this plane, when it's flying with the wind, it's going 258 miles per hour for 5 hours, and it does travel 1,290 miles. Now over here, we're flying against the wind. 250 minus 8 is 242. So 1,210 divided by 242 is 5 also. So again, this tells me that this plane traveled for 5 hours at 242 miles per hour, and it went 1,210 miles. The two times are the same. To go the set distances that it says in the problem, it says in the first case, with the wind, it went 1,290 miles. In the second case, it said it went 1,210 miles. So this is consistent with the information given to us in the problem. And so we know that the speed of the plane in still air is going to be 250 miles per hour. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on applications of rational expressions. Okay, so working together, Mike and Steven can build a home in five weeks. Had he done it alone, it would have taken Steven 12 weeks. How long would it take Mike to do it alone? So this problem is a little bit different than what you would see on a typical work rate problem. What we've got to do, again, we think about one unit of time. In this case, our time is in weeks. So in one week, in one week, what does each person accomplish individually? Well, what we're told here is that Stephen can build a home by himself in 12 weeks. So in one week, he's 1 12th completed. So in one week, Stephen has completed 1 12th of the job. Okay. Now, what about this other guy, this Mike fellow? Well, we don't know how much of the job he's completed individually because we're not given that information, right? We are only told that if they work together, they can build the home in five weeks. And then we're told what Steven's work rate is, but we're not given any information about Mike individually. So we can let a variable like X represent the amount of time that it would take Mike to perform this job which is building a home by himself. So for X, it's the amount of time or the amount of weeks for Mike to build the house. So if Mike builds the house in X number of weeks, that means that in one week, he's completed one over X, whatever that number is, that amount of the house. So I'm gonna put one over X here. So one over X of the job. And just think about that. If I had X equal to nine, for example, he'd have done one ninth of the job. If it was 18, he'd have done one eighteenth of the job, so on and so forth. So if I combine these two amounts together, I'm gonna to have one twelfth plus one over X, and I would get a common denominator by multiplying this by 12 over 12, and this by x over x. And so what I'm gonna have is 12 plus x, 12 plus x, or you can put x plus 12, doesn't matter, x plus 12, over, we have 12 times x in each case, so just 12x. Okay, so that's what we have here for the two of them working together. This is what they accomplish in one week. Let me kind of drag this up here. This is what they accomplish in one week. Now, we know that together, they would have to work for five weeks to complete one job. So if I took x plus 12 over 12x and I multiply it by five, I should get one because that's one completed job, right? And five is what's given to us in the problem. Again, up here, it says that they can build a home in five weeks, again, if they're working together. So all I need to do now is just solve this equation and I'll figure out what x is. All right, so let me multiply here. Five times x is five x, plus five times 12, that's 60. This is over 12 x, and this equals one. So if I multiply both sides of this equation by 12 x, 
This is going to cancel with this. And what I'm going to have is 5x plus 60 is equal to 12x. Now, I'll subtract 5x away from each side of the equation. Let me scroll down a little bit. This is going to cancel. And I'm going to have 60 is equal to 7x. Divide both sides by 7. And you're going to get that x is equal to 60 over 7. All right, so x is 60 over 7. So we'll just answer this and say that it would take Mike Sixty over seven weeks to build the house alone. So to check this is pretty easy. Remember, it takes Stephen twelve weeks to build a house. So in one week he's done one twelfth. So one twelfth of the house is done per week, and we're told in the original problem that they do this for five weeks when they work together. So 1 12th times 5 is 5 twelfths. So that means he does 5 twelfths of the house himself. And again, this is for, let me label this, Stephen. For the other guy, he completes a house by himself in 60 over 7 weeks. I know this is kind of a difficult number to come up with, but where did the 1 12th come from? We said that Stephen could finish a house in 12 weeks, so we kind of took the reciprocal of 12 and said, well, 1 over 12 is what he can do in one week. If I use the same logic here and took the reciprocal of this, in one week, Mike could do 7 sixtieths of that house. Okay, so let's erase this real quick. And then I want to multiply this by 5, which is what I did over here. This is the amount of time they use when they work together. This over this is going to give me a 12 here and a 1 here. So that means that Mike does 7 twelfths of the house, this is Mike, in 5 weeks. Whereas Stephen does 5 twelfths of the house in 5 weeks. And you can see that that's mathematically correct, right? 5 twelfths plus 7 twelfths equals 1 completed house. So our answer here is correct. Mike takes 60 over 7, that number of weeks, to complete the house by himself. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 50. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on direct variation. So for the first problem, if y varies directly with x, and x equals 3 when y equals 7, find y when x equals 9. So for these type of problems, all we need to do is start out by writing our direct variation equation. So we know that's y is equal to k which again is the constant of variation, times x. Then what we're going to do is we're going to plug in our starting information. So what it tells us is that if y varies directly with x and x equals 3, so I'm going to plug in a 3 for x, when y equals 7, so when y is 7, so we would stop there and we would find out what the value is for k. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's drag this up here. We'd have 7 is equal to, I'm going to plug in a 3 for x, and then times k, divide both sides of the equation by 3, so I can isolate k, and I'm going to end up with k is equal to 7 thirds. Now once I have this information, I can solve the problem that they're giving me because it says find y when x equals 9. So all I need to do is substitute in now and multiply. So again, if we have y equals kx, I'm plugging in a 7 thirds now for k, and I'm plugging in a 9 for x. So let's do that over here. So I'd have y is equal to 7 thirds times 9. We can see that 9 would cancel with 3 and give us 3. And 3 times 7 is 21. So we would get y is equal to 21. So that's going to be our answer. y is equal to 21 when x is equal to 9. All right, let's take a look at another one. So if y varies directly with n squared and y equals 588 when n equals 14, we want to find y when n equals 4. So this is an example that deals with direct variation as a power. So your formula for that is y is equal to k, again, the constant of variation, times x to the nth power. Now, they've kind of thrown a wrench at you because generally you deal with y and x, here they've kind of thrown in an n, and it further complicates things because 
the exponent on the x variable is generally described using that n. But all it is here is just going to substitute a few things around. So y now varies directly with n squared. So let's just write y equals k times n instead of x. And we know n is raised to the second power. So the exponent, I'm just going to put a 2. Now, it gives us the further information. It says that y equals 588. So y is 588 when n is 14. So when n is 14. So the first thing we're going to do is just plug this in. And we're going to figure out what k is. Then we'll solve this part. So 588 is equal to 14 squared times k. So if I square 14, I get 196. So I'd have 196 k. So obviously I want to solve for k. And to do that, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 196. And what's going to happen is this would cancel with this. I'd have k on the right side of the equation by itself. And then 588 divided by 196 is going to give me 30. So I get k is equal to 3. So now that I know that, I can solve the problem they give me, which is to find y when n equals 4. So if I go back to this original equation here, I want to find y. So y equals, I know what k is now. k is 3. So that's simple enough. Plug that in. And I know that n is going to be 4 in this scenario. So it's going to be 4 and it's going to be squared. So 4 squared. If I square 4, I get 16. So this would be y equals 3 times 16. 3 times 16 is 48. So y equals 48. So there's your solution there. Again, y is going to be 48 when n equals 4. All right, so let's look at a word problem now. And we didn't see any of these in the lesson, but we're going to kind of just work our way through them. So the interest earned on a CD, that stands for Certificate of Deposit, varies directly with the rate of interest. If the yearly simple interest earned is $855, when the interest rate is 5.7%, find the yearly simple interest if the rate increases to 6.4%. So this is a direct variation problem. So let me kind of go down here and jot down a few things. So typically we think about what? We think about y is equal to k, that constant of variation, times x. Now I'm going to show you that this is related to what's known as the simple interest formula. Now I know that you guys haven't seen simple interest problems yet. Maybe some of you would have got those in the beginning of Algebra 1 when we talked about you know, applications of linear equations. But for most of you, you get these in Algebra 2. And by that time, you will have memorized this formula, which is I is equal to P times R times t, where i is the amount of simple interest earned. So I'm going to put simple interest earned. p is the principal. This is the principal. And that's spelt differently than principal, like these are my principles. This is a different type of principal, right? So you spell it differently. And then R is your interest rate, your interest rate. And this is expressed as a decimal. So I'm going to put as a decimal. So in other words, if I had an interest rate that was 5%, in this formula I would put 0 0.05, right? I would convert it. And then T is equal to time. T is equal to time. Now, in this particular scenario, we're talking about one year. So the time is going to be 1. So if I plug a 1 in, and I'm doing a multiplication, 1 times anything is just itself. So I can kind of get rid of this for now. I don't even need to think about it. Now, what's going to happen is, if I go back up and read through this, I can show you how this relates to direct variation. So the interest earned on a CD varies directly with the rate of interest. So that means that as the rate of interest goes up or it increases, the amount of simple interest that you would earn is going to increase. If I put money in the bank and I'm getting a certain percentage to start, if they increase my percentage, I'm going to get more interest earned. If they decrease my percentage, I'm going to earn less interest, right? That's very, very easy to understand. 
So it's telling us at first, the yearly simple interest earned is $855. And this is when the interest rate is 5.7%. So if I come back down here, you can see that simple interest earned takes the place of Y. So in this particular case, it's gonna be $855 in this scenario. So 855, and this is equal to, they're giving me an interest rate of 5.7%. So I would write 0.057 to express that as a decimal, right? Because if I had 5.7%, we remember from pre-algebra, to convert this to a decimal, this goes one, two places to the left, and I just delete my percentage sign, so I get 0 0.057. Okay, so that's that should be clear. And then times P the principal. And what we need to do is solve for P, because that's our unknown. We don't know how much money we invested. So let's divide this by 0 0.057 and this by 0 0.057. Let's see what we get for P. So P is going to equal 15,000. So 15,000. All right, so once we know that, you can erase this, you don't need it anymore. We wanna answer the question, so let's go back up. So we wanna find the yearly simple interest if the rate increases to 6.4%. So it's the same amount of money invested. So we have I is equal to, now I know the principal is 15,000, so it's $15,000 times, they're giving me this new rate, and it's increased to 6.4%, so as a decimal, that's 0 0.064. So all I gotta do is multiply these two together and I have my answer. So if I multiply 15,000 times 0 0.064, I'm gonna end up with 960. So I get 960 is equal to I. So that's my yearly simple interest earned if I'm investing $15,000 at a rate of 6.4%. And you can see that that's higher than the $855 that I earned when the rate was 5.7%. So as I increased the interest rate, given the same amount of principal, obviously the amount of interest that was earned is going to go up. And by the same logic, obviously if I decrease the rate of interest, the amount of interest earned at the end of the year would go down. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. So the number of watts of power generated by a wind turbine varies directly with the cube, that's raising something to the third power, of the wind speed in miles per hour. So we have W, which stands for watts of power generated, and this is equal to K, which is the constant of variation, times X, which is the wind speed in miles per hour, raised to the third power, because we said it was cubed. And I'm just gonna copy that real quick. We had that W was equal to K times X cubed. So if 5,145 watts are produced when the wind is blowing at 70 miles per hour, how many watts are produced when the wind blows at 31 miles per hour? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in for that W, 5,145, and I'm gonna plug in for the X, 70. So I'm gonna solve for the K. So what I'm gonna have is 5,145 is equal to 70 cubed, and that's gonna give me 343,000. And then this is multiplied by K. Now I need to solve for K. So what I'm going to do is just divide both sides of the equation by 343,000. And this is going to cancel with this, and I'll have K on the right side by itself. All right, so to reduce this fraction, what I can do is I can either type it into a calculator and go 5,145 divided by 343,000. As a decimal, it's 0 0.015. If you want to leave it as a fraction, this is divisible by 1,715. So if I divide this by 1,715, I'm going to end up with 3. If I divide this by 1,715, I'm going to end up with 200. So this fraction will reduce to 3 over 200. So three over 200, so you could either write K equals 0 0.015, or you could write K equals three over 200, however you wanna do it. I think it's probably easier in this scenario to just leave it as a decimal. So let's just erase this, leave it as a decimal. If you wanna leave it as a fraction, that's fine with me. You get the same answer either way. 
And so now we got to deal with this scenario. How many watts are produced when the wind blows at 31 miles per hour? So we have W is equal to, we know what K is, that's 0 0.015. And we know that X is going to be 31 now. So 31, and that's cubed. So if I cube 31, that's 29,791. So this is 29,791. This is multiplied by 0 0.015. So that would give me watts produced of 446.865. So again, this is how many watts are gonna be produced when the wind is blowing at 31 miles per hour. And that should make sense because when the wind is blowing at 70 miles per hour, we had more watts produced. As the wind slowed down and went down to 31 miles per hour, we produced less watts. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on Direct Variation. So if y varies directly with x and y equals 30 when x equals 7, we want to find y when x equals 2 thirds. So the first thing we're going to do is just write our direct variation equation. So it's y equals k, the constant of variation, times x. The next thing we're going to do is plug in the information they're giving us to find out what k is. So they're giving us the fact that y equals 30, so y equals 30 when x equals 7. So we can use that to find a value for k. So we'd have 30 is equal to 7k. Divide both sides of the equation by 7, and I'm going to find out that k is equal to 30 over 7. All right, so now that I know what the value is for k, I can deal with this scenario that says we want to find y when x equals 2 thirds. Okay, so I want to find y, and we know that k is 30 over 7. Just plug that in for the k, and we know that x in this case is 2 thirds. So what I'm going to do, I can cancel this 3 with this 30. This will be 10. So I'll have 10 times 2, which is 20, over 7. So 20 sevenths is my answer for y. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Direct Variation. So if q varies directly with z, and q equals 9.45 when z equals 3.5, Find Q when Z equals 7.3. So typically we deal with Y equals K times X, right? So Y varies directly with X. And in this case, Q is now taking the place of Y. So we'd have Q is going to vary directly with Z. So we'd have Q equals K Z. Now they're giving us some starting values to find K. So we know that 9.45 is the value for Q when Z equals 3.5. So we can use this to find K. So let's drag this over here. I'll have 9.45 is equal to 3.5 times K. I would divide both sides of the equation by 3.5. This would cancel with this. On the right side, I just have K. On the left side, 9.45 divided by 3.5 is 2.7. So I have a value for k. And we're going to use that to find q when z equals 7.3. We have q is equal to k, which we know is 2.7. That is multiplied by z, which we know is 7.3 here. If I multiply 2.7 times 7.3, I get 19.71. So q in this scenario is going to be equal to 19.71, again, when z is equal to 7.3. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on Direct Variation. So if y varies directly with x to the fourth power, and y equals 3,888 when x equals 6, we want to find y when x equals 3. So let's just start out by writing our direct variation equation for this scenario, which is y equals k times x. In this case, we normally put n, but in this case, we know it's to the fourth power, so let's put to the fourth power. And we know that to find k, we're going to plug in these starting values. They give us 3,888 here, and they give us a 6 to plug in here. So we're going to find k here. 
So again, 3,888 is equal to six to the fourth power, which is 1,296 times K. All I have to do here is just divide both sides of the equation by 1,296. This is gonna cancel with this, and I'll have K is equal to 3,888 divided by 1,296, which is three. Okay, so we get K equals three. So now we wanna use that to find Y when X equals three. So I know that I would have Y is equal to, K in this case is three, X in this case is also three. So we'd have three to the fourth power. And really to make that simple, this is really three to the first power times three raised to the fourth power. So it's nothing more than three to the fifth power, which is 243. So this is 243. And so that is your value for Y. Let me just write this over here. Y equals 243 when X equals three. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section four on direct variation. All right, so we're gonna take a look at an easy word problem. So Hooke's law for an elastic spring tells us that the distance a spring stretches varies directly with the force applied. So you can kind of think about this formula as D standing for the distance. This is the distance. K is your constant of variation, just like it always is. And F is the force applied. This is the force applied in pounds. So in pounds. So let's use this formula for a problem that we're gonna look at. Now let me just write that again. So we have D is equal to K times F. Again, distance is equal to K, the constant of variation, times F, the force in pounds. So if a force of 150 pounds stretches a spring 32 inches, how much will a force of 225 pounds stretch the spring? So really easy. So the force in this case is 150 pounds to start. So let's put 150 in for F. And it stretches the spring 32 inches. So I'm gonna put 32 in for D. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve for K so I can figure out that second part that they're asking me. So 32 is equal to K times 150, or I can put the 150K that we're more used to. I would divide each side of the equation by 150. This cancels with this. 32 I know is two to the fifth power. 150 is only divisible by one factor of two. So if I divide each of these by two, I would get 16 over 75, and I wouldn't be able to reduce that any further. So it's up to you whether you wanna write 16 over 75 or the decimal equivalent, but in this case, the decimal is a little nasty because it's a repeating decimal. You get 0.213, and that three repeats forever and ever and ever. So I don't know if you wanna mess with that. I would just kinda of leave it in this format here and just look at the next part. How much will a force of 225 pounds stretch the spring? So all I need to do now is plug in. So I have 16 over 75, that's plugged in for K. Of course, this is equal to D, the distance, and it's multiplied by the force that they're giving me which is 225. Now I can cancel this with this. I know 225 divided by 75 is three. And then 16 times three would be 48. So the distance is gonna be 48. So in other words, to answer this, how much will a force of 225 pounds stretch the spring? The spring will stretch 48 inches. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on direct variation. All right, so let's take a look at one more word problem. And this is one that you typically will see in your homework or maybe on a test. It deals with a very common formula from geometry. So the area of a circle varies directly with the square of its radius. Let me just stop there let's just calculate this formula real fast. So typically when we see direct variation as a power, we're looking at y equals k, the constant of variation, 
times x to the nth power. Now here we're kind of changing the letters around to just represent different things. So the area of a circle is represented with A. So A stands for area, and that takes the place of Y. This is what varies directly with the square of its radius. So the square means to the second power, and for radius we use R, so R squared. Now I could put K in here, but typically we use a symbol which looks like this in this scenario, and that's our constant of variation, and it's known as pi. Some of you have heard of pi, some of you haven't. There's a very famous movie called The Life of Pi, you know, where this guy is in a classroom when he's a kid and he's reciting all these digits of pi, right? So pi is what's known as an irrational number. So after the decimal point, the digits continue forever and ever and ever, and there's no pattern to it, and it doesn't terminate. So what we have to do in these scenarios, and we'll study this later on, we have to approximate this in order to get some type of answer. So when you approximate something, you get close, but you're not having an exact value like we're used to. So as I continue with this problem, just realize that everything here is an approximation. So a circle with a radius of five inches has an area of 78.53 inches squared. Again, approximately, right? Not exactly, but approximately. So what is the area of a circle with a radius of 4.7 inches? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in a 78.53 for A, and I'm going to plug in a 5 for R, and I'm going to get an estimate for pi. It's not going to give me the exact value, but it's going to give me an estimate. So let's go ahead and do that. And then once we're done, we can plug in that estimate and 4.7 for the R, and we can calculate an estimated area. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. So we have 78.53, and this equals... 5 squared is 25, so I'd have 25 times pi. And you'll notice that I left the inches out of this. To make it simple, I just want to work with the numbers and not confuse people by putting, you know, i n squared and all these different things. We'll get to that towards the end when I write the answer. So all I would want to do here is figure out an estimated value for pi, and I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 25. So the estimated value that you get, if you punch this up on a calculator, would be 3.1412. We'll put this as equal to pi. Really, it's not equal. We want to say it's approximately. There's a different symbol for that. It looks like this. So that's approximately equal to, or we're saying it's close to, but it's not exactly equal to. So if you look on the internet, the most common estimate for pi would be 3.14159. So here I have 3.1412. So it's close, it's not there. Now you can calculate as many digits of pi as you'd like to. Um, you can go on the internet, there's some sites that do a million digits or two million digits, so on and so forth. The more digits you list, the more accurate you're gonna be, but the longer your answer is gonna be and that becomes more and more tedious. So typically what you'll see is people will just kind of cut this off and say, okay, let's just go with 3.14. So I'll erase that and just make it simpler and say, the estimate is 3.14, and you'll learn this when you get to geometry. And so I'll plug this back into my area formula. It'll say area, and we're just gonna use equals. I know it's not exactly equal, but we're gonna use equals. We're gonna put 3.14 for pi, and then the radius in this case is 4.7, so times 4.7, and this is gonna be squared. So 4.7 squared is 22.09. So what I'd have is the area is equal to 3.14 times 22.09. So if I multiply this out, I get the area is equal to 69.3626. And you can even estimate that if you want. You can kind of round this to the hundredths place. So look at that two. That would tell me just to drop all these digits and leave this unchanged. So 69.36 would be a good approximation there. Now, some of the things that you might not know, when you're plugging this stuff in, technically you want to say that you have IN, 
which stands for inches, and that's squared. So here, this would be 22.09 inches squared. So you multiply these two together, and in the end, you get 69.36 inches squared, right? Inches times inches is inches squared. So that's going to be our approximation. We'll say that the area is approximately 69.36 inches squared. Okay, so that's the approximate area of a circle with a radius of 4.7 inches. And if you were to type this into a calculator, like on the internet, for example, let's say you put 4.7 in as your radius, it's going to say the area is approximately equal to 69.4. So again, 69.36 is a very, very close estimate to that. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 51. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on inverse variation. So for our first problem, if y varies inversely with x and y equals one-fifth when x equals one-third, we want to find y when x equals two-sevenths. So I want you to recall your formula for inverse variation. It's y equals k over x. All right, so once we have that, we can take our kind of starting scenario. We have y equals one-fifth when x equals one-third. We can plug in and get a value for k and then use that to find the scenario they're asking us about, which is to find y when x equals two-sevenths. Now, the quick way to do this is to realize that we could solve this for k by multiplying both sides of the equation by x. This would cancel with this, and I could transform this formula into x times y is equal to k. So I'm going to plug in a one-fifth for y, and I'm going to plug in a one-third for x. And so what I'd have here, let me kind of scroll down and get some room going. I'd have one-third times one-fifth equals k. So one-third times one-fifth, which is equal to one-fifteenth. So this is my value for k. Let me just erase everything and just write that k. My constant of variation is one-fifteenth. So once I know this information, let me kind of scroll back up so I can fit everything on the screen again. I'm tasked with finding y when x is 2 sevenths. So it's very easy. I'm just going to plug in, and I'm going to say that y is equal to, we have k, which is 1 15th, over, I'm plugging in for x, now a 2 sevenths. So what I'd have here, I'd have y is equal to 1 15th times the reciprocal of 2 sevenths, which is 7 halves, and so this would be equal to 7 over 30. So y is 7 over 30 when x is 2 sevenths. Right, let's take a look at another one. So if q varies inversely with p, and don't let that trip you up, normally we say if y varies inversely with x. So if I wrote a formula here, q would take the place of y, and p would take the place of x. So it would be q equals k over p, or solving for k, it would be what? QP equals K. All I did was multiply both sides of the equation by P, and I solved for K. Now, the information is that Q equals 14.3 when P equals 11.2. So we're going to use this to find out what K is, and then we want to find Q when P equals 3.75. So if I multiply... 14.3 by 11.2, I'm going to get 160.16. So that's my value for k. So let me, let me erase all this. And just say that k is equal to 160.16. So that's going to get plugged in right here, 160.16. And again, we want to find q. We want to find Q when P equals 3.75. So I'm going to plug in a 3.75 there. And if I perform my division to get an answer for Q, I'm going to get Q is equal to 160.16 divided by 
divided by 3.75, which gives me 42.7093, where the three repeats forever. So remember, we're gonna put a little bar on top of the three to say that three continues forever and ever and ever. All right, so let's take a look at a word problem. So over a specified distance, speed varies inversely with time. If a car goes a certain distance in three hours at 200 miles per hour, what speed is necessary to go the same distance in eight hours? All right, so pretty easy to solve this one. I want you guys to remember that the distance formula is what? It's distance equals rate times time. Now in this particular case, what they're saying is over a specified distance. So distance is gonna be a constant. Speed is gonna vary inversely with time. So let's go ahead and solve this for speed, which in this formula is represented with R for rate, right? Rate of speed. So divide both sides of the equation by T. This cancels with this. You get R is equal to distance over time. And that makes sense, right? If the time increases, right, the time to go a set distance increases, your rate of speed had to have decreased, right? I have to be going slower to take more time to go a set distance. So the opposite is also true. If my time is decreasing, my rate of speed is increasing. So knowing that, let's kind of do this scenario. If a car goes a certain distance in three hours, so that means my time is three, at 200 miles per hour, so this is 200, what speed is necessary to go the same distance in eight hours? So let's find out what that distance is first. Again, that's the constant of variation here. And to do that, I would multiply three times 200, right, to get D by itself or distance by itself. And so three times 200 is 600, so we would get distance is equal to 600. Now, once we know that, all we need to do is plug in. Right, we want to go 600 miles in eight hours now. So for the distance, I'm plugging in a 600, and this is over. For the time, I'm going to put an eight. So what's that going to be equal to? Well, if I divide 600 by eight, I get 75. So let me erase this real quick. And we can say that it would take 75 miles per hour to go 600 miles in eight hours. All right, for the next one, if y varies inversely with x cubed and y equals 13 when x equals seven, we wanna find y when x equals 12. So this is inverse variation as a power. So we have y equals k over x to the nth power, in that case, it's just x to the third power. So y varies inversely again with x cubed and y equals 13 when x equals seven. So this one's gonna be a little tedious. We would multiply both sides of the equation. We'd have 13 equals k over, what is seven cubed? Well, it's gonna be 343. So I'd multiply both sides of the equation by 343. And I would get K is equal to 343 times 13 is 4,459. Let me erase all this real quick. Now we wanna find Y, find Y when X equals 12. Okay, so if X is 12, I'm plugging in a 12 there. I know I'm plugging in 4,459 there. So Y is going to be equal to 4,459 over 12 cubed. So that's 1,728. Now, are there any common factors between these two that I can cancel? So for 1,728, if we think about it, it came from 12 cubed. So 12 is what? It's four times three or it's two times two times three. So you'd basically have two times two times three. This would be repeated three times. So it would be two squared raised to the third power, which is two to the sixth power. And that would be three to the third power. So times three to the third power. Now this one, 4,459, you saw us create that from 343 times 13. 13 doesn't factor. And 343 is what? It's seven times seven times seven, which is seven cubed. 
So between the numerator and the denominator, there's no common factor other than one. So in fractional form, this is as simple as we can make this. Now you could divide it on a calculator and put it as a decimal, but it gets kind of messy. It's, it's not a real clean decimal. So let's just leave it in fractional form and say that when X is 12, Y is gonna be equal to 4,459 over 1,728. All right, for the next one, if Z varies inversely with N to the fourth power and Z equals 7,500 when N equals five, we wanna find Z when N equals one half. So Z here takes the place of the familiar Y and it varies inversely with N to the fourth power. So Z equals K over N to the fourth power. This is just like if we had X there. It's just like if we had y here and x here right if you get confused just start out by renaming stuff with the traditional y and x and then go back with the letters that they're giving you right it's easy to get confused with that so now our opening scenario is that z is 7500 when n is 5. we want to use this to find k 5 to the fourth power is 625 so this would be 7500 is equal to, you'd have K over, again, 625. Multiply both sides by 625. Let me kind of slide this over a little bit. And this will cancel with this. So K will be equal to 4,687,000 Let's erase everything here. We know what K is equal to now. Bring this up. And so I wanna plug into this formula here. We know that N in this case is gonna be one half. So this is gonna be one half. And then K is this very large number. So let's start out by just raising one half to the fourth power. So essentially you just have what? The one to the fourth power is one. And then two to the fourth power is 16. So this becomes Z equals 4,687,500 over 1 16th. So I could write this over one and then put over 1 16th. And so what we're doing is we're gonna end up multiplying this by the reciprocal of this. So times 16 over one, I can erase this, and this equals 75 million. So 75 million. So when n equals one half, z is gonna equal, again, 75 million. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. In manufacturing of a cleaner, the cost per gallon varies inversely with the square of the number of gallons produced. So before we kind of move forward, let's just kind of model that for a second. So in manufacturing of a cleaner, the cost per gallon, so let's just say c, is gonna vary inversely with the square, that means to the second power, of the number of gallons produced. So let's just put, for gallons produced, let's just put G, and it's gonna be squared. And let's use K as our constant of variation. Okay, so now that we have that kind of modeled, it says if 250 gallons are produced, so this would be 250 right here, and the cost is $1.60 per gallon, so this is 1.60, we wanna find the per gallon cost to produce 400 gallons of this cleaner. So all I need to do is solve for K, solve for K, and then plug in the information to find this one. So what I'm gonna do is 250 squared is 62,500. So I would multiply both sides of the equation by that. So essentially you would have 1.6 times 62,500. That would give you your value for K. So if I do that, I'm gonna end up with 100,000. So 100,000 is equal to K. All right, so now that I know that, let's erase all this. And I'm gonna be plugging in 100,000 here. And I'm gonna be plugging in a 400 here. Because again, I'm trying to find the per gallon cost to produce 400 gallons of this cleaner. So I'm gonna have C is equal to we'll have 100,000 over 400 squared. Now 400 squared is 160,000. And to start, I'm just gonna reduce 
by canceling zeros. So I'm, re so I'm removing a factor of 10 when I do this. So this with this, this with this, this with this, and this with this. And so essentially I can set this up as 10 over 16. 10 over 16. Now each is divisible by two. If I divide 10 by two, I get five. If I divide 16 by two, I get eight. So I get five eighths here. Now in decimal form, I get 0.625. So essentially what I'm gonna say is, the per gallon cost to produce 400 gallons of this cleaner is 62.5 cents, period. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Inverse Variation. So if y varies inversely with x and y equals 10 when x equals 3, we want to find y when x equals 15. So I want you to recall your formula for inverse variation. It's y equals k, the constant of variation, over x. Or if we solve it for k, it would be yx equals k. So what we're given here is information to find k. We're told that y equals 10 when x equals 3. So I can plug in a 10 for y and a 3 for x, multiply 10 times 3 and get 30 for k. So we know k equals 30. So once we know that, we want to find y when x equals 15. Well, all I'm going to do is just plug a 15 in here for x and plug a 30 in here for k, and I'd find that y equals 2. Right? If I had y equals 30 over 15, y would be equal to 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on inverse variation. If P varies inversely with Z, and P equals 5.5 when Z equals 3.2, we want to find P when Z equals 2.2. So don't get confused here because the letters are changed. Normally we have what? We have Y varies inversely with X. So we have Y equals K, the constant of variation, over X. You're just changing things around. You're saying P varies inversely with Z. So P takes the place of Y, you still have K in the numerator, and now Z is in the denominator. Now, just like you could multiply both sides here by X and solve for K, right, you get that X, Y equals K, you could do the same thing over here, multiply both sides by Z, and you would get that K is equal to Z, P. So in this opening scenario, they give us information to find K. They say that P is equal to 5.5, when z is equal to 3.2. So what is 3.2 times 5.5? Well, that's going to give us 17.6. So let me erase all this. And let's just say that k is equal to 17.6. So now we want to find p when z equals 2.2. So let me highlight that. Find p when z equals 2.2. All I'm going to do is plug in. So I'm going to have my p is equal to... I know what K is, that's 17.6, and I know that Z is 2.2. So if I divide 17.6 by 2.2, I'm going to get 8. Right? So P is equal to 8, let me just write that here, P is equal to 8, when Z is equal to 2.2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on inverse variation. So if N varies inversely with W squared, and N equals 4 fifths when W equals 7 fifteenths, we want to find n when w equals 3 fifths. So what we're going to see here, again, don't let it trip you up when you have different letters involved. Normally we say something like what? If y varies inversely with x squared, so that would be y equals k over x squared. In this particular case, we're saying if n varies inversely with w squared, so n equals k over w squared. So just take a minute. Kind of think about it, make your comparison, and then set up your equation. Very, very easy to do. So now, one of the things before we kind of move forward, we can solve this for k by multiplying both sides by w squared. And so what's going to happen here is this cancels with this, 
And I can see that w squared times n is equal to k. Okay. So now the first scenario they give us is that n equals 4 fifths when w equals 7 fifteenths. So let's plug in a 4 fifths for n. Let's plug in a 7 fifteenths for w. So if I square, let me kind of do this over here. If I square 7 fifteenths, then 7 squared would be 49. 15 squared would be 225. And I'd be multiplying this by 4 fifths. Nothing to cross cancel. 4 times 49 is 196. And 225 times 5 is 1,125. So let me erase everything. Let me erase everything here. And I'm just going to put that k is equal to this. 196, again, over 1,125. Now let me rewrite this. If n varies inversely with w squared, so n is equal to k over w squared. And now we want to look at this scenario. So it says find n when w equals 3 fifths. So if w is 3 fifths and k is this 196 over 1,125, Let's see what n is. So n would be equal to, for k again, 196 over 1,125, and then over. We can just scroll down and get some room. We have 3 fifths that's squared, right? Don't forget to square that because it's plugged in for w. So 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25. So what's going to happen is this first one's going to stay the same. And I'll multiply by the reciprocal of this one. So this would be 25 over 9. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. Is 1,125 divisible by 25? Well, yes, it is. If I canceled this with this, this would be a 1, and this would be 45. Now, is 196 divisible by 9, or is it divisible by 3? Well, 1 plus 9 is 10. 10 plus 6 is 16. 16 is not going to be divisible by 3 or 9. And so this is as much as we can cancel. So we just go through and do the multiplication. 196 times 1 is 196. And then 45 times 9 is 405. So what we end up with here is that n is equal to 196 over 405. And again, this is the scenario where w is equal to 3 fifths. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on inverse variation. So if y varies inversely with x cubed and y equals 3 when x equals 7, we want to find y when x equals 2. So remember, if we have inverse variation as a power, you can write y equals k, the constant of variation, over x to the nth power. In this case, it's x cubed, so x cubed. Now, we got to start out by finding k. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by x cubed, what I'm going to find is that this is going to cancel with this, and I'll have x cubed times y is going to be equal to k. So in this scenario, we have y equals 3 when x equals 7. So I'm going to plug in a 7 for x and a 3 for y. So I would cube 7. 7 times 7 is 49. 49 times 7 is 343. And then I would multiply that by 3, which is 1,029. So we can put that k, k is equal to 1,029. All right, so let's erase all this. And now what we want to do is find y when x equals 2. So we want to find y when x equals 2. So I'm going to plug in a 2 there. I'm going to plug in a 1,029 there. So I'll have y is equal to 1,029 over 2 cubed, which is 8. Now, we know that 1,029 came from 1. It was 7 cubed, so 7 times 7 times 7, which is 343, then times 3. So there are no factors in common between this and this. This is 2 times 2 times 2, other than 1. Right? So this is as simple as we can make this fraction. If you wanted to write it as a decimal, we could divide 1,029 by 8 and get 128.625. So kind of either way you want to write it, y is equal to 1,029 over 8, or y is equal to 128.625 when x is equal to 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 5 on inverse variation. 
So the amount of light measured in foot candles varies inversely with the square of the distance from the source. And we looked at one of these in the lesson, so we wanna just say that L, which is the amount of light measured in foot candles, is going to be equal to K, our constant of variation, over, now this is squared, so that means something raised to the second power, so distance, I'm gonna use a D, so D squared. So let's copy this, and we're gonna bring it down here. So if the amount of light produced 40 feet from a light source is 0.75 foot candles, find the light produced two feet away from that same source. So I'm just gonna plug some things in. So the light produced 40 feet, so this is gonna be a 40 right there. Now 40 squared is 1600. So let me kind of erase this and put 1600. And it says that the light produced is 0.75 foot candles. So let me put 0.75 here. And we wanna start out by just solving for K to find the constant of variation. So to do that, I've just multiplied both sides by 1600. Let me kind of slide this down a little bit. So multiply this over here by 1600. And so this is gonna cancel with this. And we'll have K is equal to 1,600 times 0.75 is 1,200. So K equals 1,200. So we have that out of the way. Now let's rewrite that formula. We have L, which is the light produced, is equal to, we have K, the constant of variation, which we know is 1,200. So let's just put 1,200 in for that, over the distance squared. Now in this particular case, we wanna find the light produced two feet away from that same source. So the distance is now two, and if I square two, I get four. So I'd have 1,200 divided by four, which we know is equal to 300. So to answer this, we would say the light produced is 300, and this is in terms of foot candles, so foot candles. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 52. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on introduction to roots. All right, so we wanna start out today by looking at the square root of 81. And remember, because we don't have a negative symbol out in front, we want the principal square root of 81. So specifically, I'm asking for a positive number that when multiplied by itself, gives me 81. Now the answer here happens to be nine. But if you didn't know that off the top of your head like I do, you could make a factor tree. Right? You could start out by saying, okay, 81, and just thinking about, okay, what, what two numbers would combine to give me 81? Well, eight plus one is nine, so I know it's divisible by nine. If I do 81 divided by nine, I would get nine, and then I could stop, right? I'd find out it's nine times nine, or I could keep going, you know, and complete the factor tree, and find out that it's four factors of three, or again, nine squared. So that's why we say the square root of 81 is nine. What about the negative square root of nine? So this is saying what negative number when multiplied by itself gives me nine? Well, that's gonna be negative three. And right? if I take negative three and I multiply it by negative three, I get positive nine. Now again, notice how the negative is out in front here. This is outside. We should know at this point that if we see the square root of a negative number, like negative nine, for example, this is not a real number. So it's very important that you understand that in this case, the negative is inside of the radical symbol. In this case, it's outside, right? So if it's inside, you're not gonna have a real number, right? Because there's no number that when multiplied by itself is gonna give you a negative number value. So what about the square root of 169? So this is one that is a little tricky to do, even if you use a factor tree, for the simple fact that 13 times 13 would give you 169, and 13 is a prime number, right? So it doesn't break down any further than that. So the square root of 169 is 13. But it's one that's very, very common, so it's one that you're going to memorize very quickly. What about the negative square root of 900? So this is one we can use a factor tree for. I notice that this ends in two zeros, so I can say it's nine times 100, 
or I could do 90 times 10, doesn't really matter. So if I do nine, that's three times three, and I know that's prime. 100 is 10 times 10. So I have all the information now to stop. I don't need to complete the factor tree because if I do three times 10, that's 30, and then three times 10 again is 30, that's 30 times 30 would give me 900. So a number that's multiplied by itself that gives me 900, and then you use the fact here that we want the negative, okay, the negative, so we put negative 30 as our answer. Let me just erase this factor tree here. Since negative 30 times negative 30 would give me a positive 900. What about negative square root of four ninths? So again, I know it's gonna be negative. And then think about the square root of four ninths here. We think about, okay, what number times itself gives me four? Well, that's two. And then what number times itself gives me nine? Well, that's three. So this would be negative two thirds. So if I had negative two thirds times negative two thirds, negative times negative is positive, which is what I'm looking for there. Two times two is four, three times three is nine. So that would in fact give me four ninths. What about the square root of negative 121? Well, some of you might make the incorrect decision and say, okay, well, square root of 121 is 11, and then this is negative, so this is negative 11. Nope, that's wrong. Why is it wrong? Again, this is inside. Okay, if it's inside the radical symbol, we've got an issue, right? You can't have a number that when multiplied by itself is gonna produce a negative result. This is not, not a real number. What about negative square root of 121? This is the one you were thinking of if you made a mistake in the last problem. The negative is outside. The negative is outside of the radical symbol. So what is the square root of 121? It's 11, and then we just want the negative of that. Negative 11 times negative 11 is positive 121. What about the square root of 3 fourths squared? Well, again, as we talked about in the lesson, these would cancel with each other. The square root operation and the squaring operation are opposites, kind of like multiplication and division. So I'm just left with the radicand here, which is 3 fourths, right? It'd be like if I said, what is the square root of 3 fourths times the square root of 3 fourths? Well, that would just give me 3 fourths, right? That's exactly what I'm asking for in this situation. What if I saw something that looked a little bit more complex and I had the cube root of 12x cubed minus 5x and this is raised to the third power? Well, the cube root would cancel with the cubing, right? If I'm taking the cube root of something that I'm raising to the third power, that's going to cancel itself out and I'm just left with this part right here, which is 12x cubed minus 5x. All right, what about the fifth root of 8? and this is raised to the fifth power. Again, this is gonna cancel with this, and I'm just left with this. What about the cube root of negative one? So in other words, what number, when multiplied by itself three times, is gonna give me negative one? The first thing you might say is, oh, this is inside, so this is a problem. Well, it's not a problem in this case because this is odd, okay? An odd number of negatives will give you a negative, so this is okay. So again, what number times itself three times would give me negative one? Well, that would be negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. Positive one times negative one is negative one. What about the cube root of 125? That one's pretty easy to guess. A lot of you will know that it's five. But again, if you didn't know that, just make a factor tree. So start out with 125. I know it's divisible by five. It's five times 25. And then 25 is what? It's five times five. So when you break this down, it becomes what? Five times five times five, or five cubed. So obviously, the number that's multiplied by itself three times to give me 125 is five. What about the negative fourth root of 81? So again, the negative is outside here. So this is outside. So it's okay. So what negative value, when multiplied by itself four times, is going to give me 81? Well, it's going to be negative three. So negative three times negative three is nine, and then times negative three again is negative 27, and then times negative three one more time is positive 81. What about this guy? The fourth root of negative 81. 
So a lot of you get confused on these. You think they're the same. It's not. This is inside. This is inside. And this is even. Can I have a number that is negative multiplied by itself four times and get a negative result? I cannot. An even number of negative factors is always positive. So this value doesn't exist. It's not a real number. What about the fifth root of negative 32? Well, again, this is odd. This is odd. So if we have an odd index, it's okay to have a negative radicand. This is okay in this case. So what negative value, when multiplied by itself five times, is going to give me negative 32? Well, it's going to be negative 2. Negative 2. And the way you think about that quickly is just think about this is going to be negative automatically. Okay, so just scratch that out of your head. Then think about what number raised to the fifth power is 32. A lot of you can remember that 2 to the fifth power is 32 because we do that so frequently, right? We, we should know 2 up to the seventh power at this point because it just comes up so often. All right, so now let's look at the fifth root of 32 over 243. So let's just think about, we know that the fifth root of 32 is 2. We just did that. What is the fifth root of 243? You might not know that off the top of your head. So 243, let's just make a quick factor tree. 3 plus 4 is 7. 7 plus 2 is 9. So I know it's divisible by 9. So let's start there. This would be 9 times 27. We know that 9 is 3 times 3. And we know 27 is what? It's 9 times 3. And 9 is 3 times 3. So voila, we have it. It's 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. We're five factors of 3. So we put a 3 there. So our answer there is two-thirds, right? If I had two-thirds raised to the fifth power, I would get 32 over 243. So when I reverse that and I say 32 over 243, the fifth root of that, I would go back to two-thirds. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on Introduction to Roots. All right, so we want to simplify. We're going to start out with the square root of 9. So this is the principal or positive square root of 9. So what positive number, when multiplied by itself, gives us 9? So at this point, we've seen this over and over and over again. We know the answer is 3. What about the negative square root of 9? So what negative number, when multiplied by itself, gives us 9? Well, we know this would be negative 3. Now, what about the square root of negative 9? Well, this is kind of the trick one, right? You see all three of them in a row, and you're kind of thinking, well, I just did that. This is negative 3. No, that's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. Make sure you understand you can't have the square root of a negative number. So you can't have a negative radicand in that situation. This is not a real number. Okay, it's not a real number. And again, why is that the case? Just do a little thought experiment. Can you think of any negative that when you multiply by itself is going to give you a negative value? You cannot, because a negative times a negative is always a positive. So there's no real number that exists that when multiplied by itself is going to give you a negative 9 as a result. And so we put not a real number. What about the square root of 64? Okay, what is 64 made of? 64, if I do a factor tree, I could do what? I could do 4 times 16. And I know that 16 is what? It's 4 times 4. And so 4 is 2 times 2. Let's circle all these. So I'd have what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 factors of 2. Or 2 to the 6th power. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So if I put this in groups of 3, I'd have what? 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8, times 2 times 2 times 2, or 8. So 8 times 8 would be 64. So a number, or more specifically, a positive number that's multiplied by itself to give me 64 would be 8. What about the negative square root of 64? So again, all I want is the negative of what I just found. And again, notice how the negative is outside. I'm not asking for the square root of negative 64. I'm asking for the negative square root of 64, which is negative 8. Right? This is basically saying what negative value when multiplied by itself would give me 64. 
negative 8 times negative 8 is 64. And again, we have the square root of negative 64. And again, this is inside. This is inside. You can't have a negative radicand in this situation, right? This is not a real number. This is not a real number. Okay, you can't think of a number that when multiplied by itself is going to produce negative 64. All right, what about the cube root of 125,000? So how do we do something like this? Well, first thing I would do is just make a factor tree. So 125,000. And it ends with three zeros, so it's divisible by 1,000. So I could do 125 times 1,000. 125, I know, is what? It's 5 cubed. It's 25 times 5, and then 25 is 5 times 5. So let's circle all these. Then what about 1,000? A lot of you already know that's 10 cubed. But if you didn't know it, you could say, okay, well, this is divisible by 100. I could do 100 times 10. And then 10 is what? It's 5 times 2. And then 100 is what? It's 10 times 10. And then 10 is 5 times 2. So let's circle everything. What you find is that you have 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 5s here. So let's write that. 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. And then I have 1, 2, 3 2s. So I have 1, 2, 3 2s. If I arrange this a little differently, I could take this is a group, this is a group, and this is a group in regards to the fives. And I could take each one of these as a group in regards to the twos. So I could write this as 5 times 5 times 2, or 25 times 2, or 50 to the third power, right? So in other words, if I kind of rewrote this, we kind of put the twos next to the fives. I put 5 times 5 times 2, and then times 5 times 5 times 2 and then times 5 times 5 times 2, All right? So 50 cubed. So this answers our question. What is the cube root of 125,000? It's going to be 50. Let's just write 50 here. Making a factor tree is something you're going to have to become really good at because when you start getting stuff on a test that you don't know the answer to, if you can use a calculator, that's great. It's going to spit the answer out right away. But if you can't use a calculator, you know, you're on some test like that, you're going to have to find solutions, and that solution is generally going to come from being able to factor the number and figure out what factor, multiplied by itself three times, is going to give you that 125,000. And again, that's 50 in this case. What about the negative cube root of 125,000? Well, we have an odd index here, so this is a bit unusual. You wouldn't really see it like that. But basically, you just put the negative out in front of the answer for this, which we know is 50. So this would be negative 50. And then if you saw something like the cube root of negative 125,000, well, a lot of you would say, okay, well, I can't have that negative in there. Again, you can there because this is odd, okay? An odd number of negatives will give you a negative. So if I put negative 50 as my answer here, negative 50 times negative 50 would be positive 2,500. Then if I multiply by negative 50, again, I get a negative 125,000. So again, if I have an index that's odd, I can have a negative radicand. This is allowed. This has an answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on Introduction to Roots. All right, so we want to simplify. So we want the fourth root of negative 1. Well, that's not a real number because this is even here. And we have a negative radicand. So that's a problem for us because there is no real number that when multiplied by itself four times is going to give me a negative. Four negatives being multiplied together would give me a positive. So this is not a real number. What about the cube root of a negative 8? Well, again, as we've seen before, if I have an odd index, this is okay, right? Because I can have three negatives that would make a negative, right? Negative times negative times negative is a negative. So just think about the number there. What number times itself three times would give me eight? Well, that would be two. So then just think about the negative part. You put negative two, right? Negative two times negative two is four. 
4 times negative 2 is negative 8. What about the square root of 784? We're going to do a little work for that because probably don't know what that is. I actually don't know what it is off the top of my head. I could punch it up on a calculator and get it, but that's no fun. I noticed that 84 is divisible by 4. So I know the number is 784 divided by 4 is 196. So 4 times 196. This would be 2 times 2. So let's circle these. For 196, it's also divisible by 4. It's 49 times 4. So then this is 7 times 7. And then this is 2 times 2. So what are we going to end up with? Well, really, 2 times 2 times 7 times 2 times 2 times 7, or 28 times 28, right? So this is 28. In other words, I'm just looking for the same factor times itself. If I kind of separate this and say, okay, well, I have 2 times 2 times 7 times, you know, that would be kind of one group. And then 2 times 2 times 7 again, that would kind of be the second group. So 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 7 is 28. So 28 times 28 would be 784. Again, so 28 is my answer. What about the fifth root of 1,024? We did this problem before in a previous video, but in case you don't remember it or, you know, again, you're not allowed to use the calculator, let's just go about making a factor tree here. I know it's divisible by 4 because the last two digits are. So this is 4 times what? 256. And then 4 is what? It's 2 times 2. 256, I could do 64 times 4. Then this is 2 times 2. And then 64 is what? It's 4 times 16. And then this is 4 times 4. So this becomes 2 times 2. And this becomes 2 times 2. And this becomes 2 times 2. So let me kind of circle all these 2's here. But if you kind of look at each group here, you have one group of 2 times 2 a second group of 2 times 2, a third group, a fourth group, and a fifth group. So if I think about it here, I'm looking for something that's multiplying by itself five times to give me 1,024. Well, that number would be 4. 2 times 2 is 4. So I'd have 4 here, 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 and here. So 4 to the fifth power is 1,024. So therefore, the fifth root of 1,024 is 4. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3 on introduction to roots. All right, so we want to square each radical expression. So if I start here, I have the square root of 11. So if I square that, what's going to happen is these operations cancel out. So this cancels with this, and I'm just left with the radicand, which is 11. Another way to think about this is if I have the square root of 11, and that's squared, this is equal to the square root of 11 times the square root of 11. So whatever value times itself gives me 11, I'm multiplying it by itself, so I would get 11, right? So square root of 11 times square root of 11 would be 11. Again, you could just use the shortcut and do it that way. What about the square root of 5x if I squared that? Again, this operation would cancel with this one, and I'm left with 5x. What about if I squared the square root of 3x squared minus 2x minus 1? So this is squared, and again, this operation cancels with this one, and I'm left with what's underneath here, which is 3x squared minus 2x minus 1. All right, what about the square root of 5x to the fourth power minus 3x minus 7 over 3x, and then we're going to square this. And again, this is going to cancel with this, and I'm going to be left with this. So this would be 5x to the fourth power minus 3x, minus 7, all over 3x. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4, on introduction to roots. So we want to determine if each is rational, irrational, or not real. So we have the square root of 169. So the square root of 169 is 13. 13 is a rational number. So this one right here would be rational. And again, when the square root of a number is a rational number, we can say that the number here, 169, is a perfect square. What about the square root of 200? A lot of you might jump out and say, well, that's a rational number. Well, is it? Let's think about this. 200, if I break this up, I can do 20 times 10. Then 20 is what? 5 times 4, 5 is prime, 4 is 2 times 2. 
10 would be what? 5 times 2. Now, I have 3 2s, but 2 5s. I can't make that into a number times itself that would give me 200. So the result here would be an irrational number. In fact, if you type up square root of 200 on a calculator, you'll see you get 14.142135, and my calculator stops at 62. But depending on what your calculator does or your computer or whatever you're using, you might get a different result, right? Because it's an irrational number. So after the decimal point, the digits are gonna continue with no pattern, and they're gonna continue forever and ever and ever, never terminates, and so that is an irrational number. So let's put that this is irrational. What about the cube root of 49? Well, we know that's gonna be irrational, right? Because 49 is seven squared. Seven's a prime number, so if I try to break that down any further, I would start getting into some messy numbers for sure. So we would put that this is irrational. What about the fourth root of negative 16? Well, again, if the index is even and I have a negative radicand, this is not a real number. What about the square root of 1 fourth? Well, we know that the square root of 1 would be 1. The square root of 4 would be 2. So that would be 1 half, right? So this is a rational number. This is a rational number number. So we could say one fourth is a perfect square and the result is rational. What about the eighth root of negative 13? Again, this is even and you have a negative radicand. So this is not a real number. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on introduction to roots. All right, so we want to simplify here. We're going to look at the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. So I can perform the operations inside of here first, then take the square root of the result. So the square root of 3 squared is 9 plus 4 squared is 16. And then the square root of 9 plus 16 is 25. We know the square root of 25 is 5. So now I'm looking at the square root of 8 squared minus 28. So the square root of 8 squared is 64, and then minus 28. So what's 64 minus 28? Well, that would give us 36. So we'd have the square root of 36. And the square root of 36 is what? It's 6. 6 times 6 is 36. What about the square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared? So this is equal to the square root of 12 squared is 144, plus 5 squared is 25. 144 plus 25 is 169. So this would be the square root of 169. And you'll get to know this very quickly because it comes up a lot. The square root of 169 is 13. What about the cube root of negative 1 cubed plus 6 cubed minus 207? So the cube root, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, plus 6 cubed is 216 minus 207. So negative 1 plus 216 is 215. Then 215 minus 207 would be 8. So this would be the cube root of 8, and this is equal to 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 53. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on the distance formula. All right, so we want to find the distance between each pair of points. All right, so we're going to start out with our first two points. We have the order pair 7 comma negative 3, and then the order pair 4 comma negative 3. So I can label this one as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this one as x sub 2, y sub 2. Again, you can change that around. It's not going to affect your answer. So the distance formula, as I gave to you in the lesson, is d is equal to the square root of, you're going to have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity is squared, plus you have y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. So all we need to do is simply plug into the formula. So if I have x sub 2 as 4, I'm going to plug in a 4 there. I have x sub 1 as 7, so I'm going to plug in a 7 there. Then I have y sub 2, which is negative 3, so I'm going to plug that in there. And then y sub 1 is also negative 3, so I'm going to plug that in there. Okay, so let's scroll down and get a little room going. 
So I'm going to have D is equal to the square root of, I have 4 minus 7. We know that 4 minus 7 is negative 3. So this would be negative 3 squared, then plus, I have a negative 3 minus a negative 3. Minus a negative is plus a positive. So that's basically negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. 0 would then be squared. 0 squared is 0. So you can put plus 0, or you can get rid of it. And basically, I have that d, or the distance, is equal to the square root of negative 3 squared. Negative 3 squared is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. So we get d, or distance, is equal to 3. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We have the ordered pair 3, comma, negative 3, and then the ordered pair 4, comma, negative 8. So these are our two points. And again, we can kind of change it up and say, let's make this x sub 2, y sub 2, and let's make this x sub 1, y sub 1. And so we just plug into our formula, right? It's super simple. So we have d, or the distance between the two points, is equal to the square root of, and then I have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity squared, plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. So if I plug into the formula, x sub 2 in this case is 3, x sub 1 is 4, and then y sub 2 is negative 3, and then y sub 1 is negative 8. All right, so let's scroll down and get a little room going. What I'm going to have is the distance is equal to the square root of, we'd have 3 minus 4, that's negative 1, then negative 1 would be squared. So let's just write negative 1 squared, then plus. Over here, I'd have negative 3 minus a negative 8. Again, minus a negative is plus a positive. So negative 3 plus 8 would be 5. So this is plus 5 squared. So my distance is equal to the square root of negative 1 squared is 1, and then 5 squared is 25. So 1 plus 25. So distance is equal to the square root of 26. Now, the square root of 26 is an irrational number. So I can give an estimate of it, right? punch it up on a calculator and do some rounding, or if I want to be precise, I can just leave my answer as the square root of 26. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have the ordered pair negative 3, comma, negative 8, and the ordered pair 5, comma, 7. So again, what I'm looking at is this is my x sub 1, y sub 1. This is my x sub 2, y sub 2. And essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just arbitrarily labeling them and then plugging into the formula. So my distance formula, once again, is equal to the square root of, we're going to have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity squared, and then plus, we're going to have y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. So we're going to plug in here. So for x sub 2, I have 5. For x sub 1, I have negative 3. For y sub 2, I have 7. And then for y sub 1, I have negative 8. All right, so the distance, let me kind of scroll down here. The distance is going to be equal to the square root of 5 minus a negative 3. Minus a negative is plus a positive. So 5 plus 3 is 8. So you'd have 8 squared here, then plus. You have 7 minus a negative 8. Minus a negative is plus a positive. So 7 plus 8 is 15. So plus 15 squared. So 8 squared is 64, so we'd have distance is equal to the square root of 64 plus 15 squared is 225. So distance is equal to the square root of, what's 64 plus 225? Well, it's going to give me 289. So 289. So distance equals the square root of 289. So a lot of you might say, well, I think that's, I think that's going to be an irrational number, so I'll just leave it. Well, you'd be wrong. The square root of 289 is actually 17. So if you have a calculator handy, you can punch that up and see that, obviously. If you didn't, it'd be kind of tough to guess that with a factor tree because, you know, if you go through your basic divisibility rules, it's going to fail all of them, right? And who would know to check 17, right? It's kind of a random thing. But, you know, you're going to get stuff like this on a test. So you want to make sure, if you don't have a calculator, that you can at least kind of estimate where the square root would be, and then check your divisibility up to that point if you don't have a calculator, right? It's just something you're going to have to do. So the distance in this case is equal to 17.
All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have six comma negative three and seven comma zero. So let's label this as x sub one, y sub one. Let's label this as x sub two, y sub two. And I'm gonna plug straight into the formula now. I think we know it at this point. So distance is equal to the square root of x sub two, which is seven in this case, minus x sub one, which is six. This is gonna be squared, then plus y sub two, which is zero, minus y sub one, which is negative three. Minus the negative is plus a positive. So I'm gonna put plus three. Then this is squared. So the distance is equal to the square root of seven minus six is one, one squared is one. So let's just write this as one, then plus, we have zero plus three, that's three, three squared is nine. So I get the distance is equal to the square root of one plus nine is 10. Now the square root of 10 is an irrational number, right? I know 10 only factors into five times two. So again, I can leave it like this or I can give an estimate by using a calculator and then doing some rounding. Now right, let's take a look at one last problem. So we have two comma negative three and seven comma negative five. So again, I'm gonna plug into my formula. So let's say this is x sub one, y sub one, and this is x sub two, y sub two. So my distance is equal to the square root of, we have x sub two, which is seven, minus x sub one, which is two. So this is squared, and then plus y sub two, which is negative five, minus y sub one, which is negative three. So minus a negative is plus a positive, so negative five plus three. And again, this is squared. So then the distance is equal to, Seven minus two is five, five squared is 25. So we just put the square root of 25 and then plus, negative five plus three is negative two, negative two squared is four. So we put the distance is equal to the square root of 29. Now 29 is a prime number and most of you already know that. So I'm not gonna be able to really factor this. So again, this would be an irrational number, right? So. I can, again, leave it as square root of 29, or I can use a calculator, and then just do some rounding to get an estimate. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on the distance formula. All right, so we wanna find the distance between each pair of points. So we have our two ordered pairs here. So the first kind of point is negative two comma one. So let's label this as x sub one, y sub one, then your second point you're given is negative six comma one. So let's do x sub two, y sub two. And you could switch that up and label, you know, this first point is x sub two, y sub two. And the second point is x sub one, y sub one. You know, when you feed it into your formula, it's not gonna matter which is labeled as which. All right, so the formula that you're given, the distance formula, you have D is equal to the square root of you have x sub two minus x sub one, that's squared, plus y sub two minus y sub one, and then that quantity is squared. So all we need to do is plug into the formula. So for x sub two, we see we have a negative six. For x sub one, we see that we have a negative two. Then for y sub two, we see that we have a one. And then for y sub one, we see that we have a one as well. So let's scroll down and get some room going. And we're just gonna do some basic math here. So I'm gonna have D or the distance between the points is equal to the square root of, I have negative six minus a negative two. That's the same thing as negative six plus two. So that's going to be a negative four. So I'd have negative four squared. And then we have plus, I have one minus one. We know that one minus one is zero, zero squared is zero. So really I can just kind of cut this off and say that D or the distance is equal to the square root of negative four squared is 16. So then D or the distance is equal to square root of 16 is four. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section two on the distance formula. All right, so we wanna find the distance between each pair of points. We're gonna take a look at three comma five and four comma negative three. So those two points there, we're trying to find the distance between the two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label one of them as x sub one, y sub one. So that's kind of like point one. And then the other will be x sub two, y sub two. And again, it doesn't matter which one you label as which. 
Now we're going to feed this information into our distance formula. So distance is equal to the square root of, we have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, and that's squared, and then plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1, and that's squared. So we're just simply going to be plugging things in. So for x sub 2, I'm going to plug in a 4. For x sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 3. For y sub 2, I'm going to plug in a negative 3. And then for y sub 1, I'm going to plug in a 5. All right, so let's scroll down a little bit, get a little room going. And so let's continue. My distance is going to be equal to the square root of 4 minus 3 is 1. You might as well just square it there. 1 squared is 1. So let's just put 1. Then plus, I have negative 3 minus 5. Negative 3 minus 5 is going to give me negative 8. Negative 8 squared would be 64. So this would be 64 here. So my distance is going to be equal to the square root of 1 plus 64, which is 65. Now, 65 is going to factor into what? 13 times 5. And 13 is prime, and so is 5. So this would be an irrational number. So in that case, if I want to be precise, I would just leave it as the square root of 65. If your teacher kind of makes you, you can, you know, punch that into a calculator and get an estimate, right? And then you can just do some rounding to kind of report your answer. But again, if you want to be precise, you put D or the distance between the two points is equal to the square root of 65. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on the distance formula. All right, so we want to find the distance between each pair of points. We're looking at negative 6, negative 8, and 6, 8 for our two points. So what we want to do is label one of these as x sub 1, y sub 1, and then the other as x sub 2, y sub 2. And it doesn't matter which you label as x sub 1, y sub 1, and which you label as x sub 2, y sub 2. In the end, you're going to get the same result. So what we want to do is plug this information into our distance formula. So the distance formula, the D is equal to the square root of, we have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, and this is squared, and then plus we have y sub 2 minus y sub 1, and that's squared. So if I just plug in to the formula, I have D is equal to the square root of, my x sub 2 in this case is going to be 6. So I'm going to plug in a 6 there. Then minus my x sub 1 is negative 6. Minus a negative 6 is plus a positive 6. So I'm going to put 6 plus 6. This is going to be squared. Then plus, we have y sub 2. y sub 2 is 8, so plug that in. Then minus y sub 1, that's negative 8. Again, minus a negative plus positive. So 8 minus a negative 8 is 8 plus 8. And then this is squared. Let's scroll down a little bit. What we're going to have is d is equal to the square root of 6 plus 6 is 12. So we'd have 12 squared, which is 144. Then plus 8 plus 8 is 16. So we'd have 16 squared, which is 256. So we'll have d is equal to the square root of what's 144 plus 256? Well, that's going to be 400. So 400. So we have d is equal to the square root of 400. So is this a rational or irrational number? Well, in case you don't know, the square root of 400 is 20. So I can put d is equal to 20, right? So it's a rational number. 400 is a perfect square. Again, if you don't have a calculator and you don't know that, just start out by just making a factor tree. Okay, so this ends with two zeros. So it's 4 times 100. Okay, then 100 is what? It's 4 times 25. Then 25 is 5 times 5. Now, I could further break down 4 into 2 times 2, but I don't need to because if I look here, I have one group of 4 times 5 and then a second group of 4 times 5. So 4 times 5 is 20, so I know I would have 20 times 20 or the same number times itself to make up 400. So I have my answer there. The square root of 400 is 20. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on the distance formula. All right, so we want to find the distance between each pair of points. We're taking a look at these two points here. We have 8 comma negative 4 and then we have 6 comma negative 7. So again, you want to label one of these as x sub 1, y sub 1. And then the other would be x sub 2, y sub 2. 
And then we want to plug into that formula. So D, which stands for distance, is equal to the square root of, we have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity squared, plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. So if we crank this out, we'll have D is equal to, for x sub 2, I'm going to plug in a 6. So I'd have the square root of, I would have a 6 minus, for x sub 1, I'm going to have an 8. Then that's squared, then plus. For y sub 2, I'm going to have a negative 7. Then minus, for y sub 1, I'm going to have a negative 4. Minus a negative is plus a positive, so this will be plus 4. Okay, then this is squared. Scroll down a little bit. And so I'll have the distance is equal to the square root of 6 minus 8 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. Then plus. Negative 7 plus 4 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So what I'm going to have is that the distance is equal to the square root of 4 plus 9 is 13. Now, we know that 13 is a prime number. Okay? So when we think about the square root of that, that's going to be an irrational number. So if we want to be precise, we can leave this as d, or the distance between those two points, is equal to the square root of 13. If your teacher asks you to, or if, if you're requested to by whatever, the instructions on your test or your homework, go ahead and punch it into a calculator, and then round it to the specified place that they give you, and provide an estimate. Just realize that it's not an exact value unless you're using this square root of 13. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on the distance formula. So we want to find the distance between each pair of points. We're looking at 2 comma negative 3 and negative 3 comma 1. So again, what you want to do is label each point. So this one I'll label as x sub 1, y sub 1, and then the other would be x sub 2, y sub 2. And again, it doesn't matter which point you label as which, it's not going to affect your answer in the end. So you want to just use this information to plug into your distance formula. So remember, d is equal to the square root of, you have x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that's squared, plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that's squared. So I'm going to plug in here. So I'm going to have d is equal to, the square root of, so for x sub 2, I have a negative 3. And then minus, for x sub 1, I have a 2. And this is squared. Then plus, for y sub 2, I have a 1. And then minus, for y sub 1, I have a negative 3. So minus a negative 3 is plus 3. And again, this is squared. All right, so what we want to look at here is we have d, or the distance, is equal to the square root of, Negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. If I square negative 5, I'd get 25. So this is 25, and then plus, 1 plus 3 is 4, and then 4 squared is 16. So this would be 16 here. So what is 25 plus 16? Well, that's going to give me 41. So I'd have d, or the distance, between those two points would be equal to the square root of 41. Now, 41 is a prime number. So... I know that the result here, if I took the square root of 41, would be an irrational number. And so again, if I want to be precise, I would leave this as my answer. The distance between the two points is going to be the square root of 41. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, practice set 54. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for a lesson on multiplying, dividing, and simplifying radicals. All right, so we just want to simplify... We're going to start out with the square root of 45. So remember the objective. In case you didn't watch the lesson, let me just give you a brief rundown of what we're doing here. If you see something like the square root of 45, your objective is to factor this number here and look for perfect squares among those factors. So what is a perfect square? Again, a perfect square is a number whose square root is a rational number. So if I broke 45 down, I could say 45 is what? It's 9 times 5, and 9 is 3 times 3. Now, 9 is a perfect square. Notice that when I factor it, I get 3 times 3. 5 is not a perfect square. So what I'm going to do to simplify this, I'm going to use a little technique, and that technique comes from the product rule for radicals. So 
that rule tells us that I can break this up into the square root of, and I can write any factorization of 45 that I'd like. In this case, I'm just going to choose to write the square root of 9 times 5. This still equals 45, so I still have the square root of 45. I haven't changed the value of anything. And then this is equal to, I'm going to split this up. So I'm going to say that this is the square root of 9 times the square root of 5. Now when I do that, I make it completely obvious that what I'm doing here is I'm saying the square root of 9, and that's kind of a bad color to do that in. Let me do it in yellow. The square root of 9 is going to be equal to 3. So I can just replace the square root of 9 with 3. Right? It makes it more simple. So I'm going to put 3 times the square root of 5. So this right here is just the simplified version of this right here. If you punch up square root of 45 on a calculator, you would get the same result as if you punched up three times the square root of five. The difference between this one and this one is that in this case here, we don't have any factors for our radicand. In this case, it's just five. That would be a perfect square, right? In this case, we did, right? One of the factors was nine. Nine's a perfect square, so we can simplify by just writing it as three times the square root of five. What about something like the square root of 75? Again, I think about factoring this, and I'm looking for factors that would be a perfect square. I gotta get those out so that it's simplified. So I could write this as what? 25 times three. And I could stop there. I don't need to complete the factor tree because 25 is a perfect square. So if I broke this down into the square root of 25 times the square root of three, I know the square root of 25 is five, so I can just write that. So I can say this is going to be five, times the square root of three, right? And that's the simplified version of the square root of 75. If I look at my radicand, as it's officially called, of three, that's not a perfect square. So I can't simplify this any further. What about the square root of 48? So if I think about 48, again, I can factor that. I can do 12 times four, and 12 is four times three. So I can stop there. I don't need to complete the factorization in most cases because I notice that I have a four here and a four here. So really I could have factored 48 as what? As 16 times three. 16 is a perfect square, it's four times four. So when I realize that I can write this as what? I can say this is the square root of 16 times the square root of three. And I can simply replace the square root of 16 with this answer of four. Right? This is 4 times the square root of 3. What about something like the square root of 10 times the square root of 2? These problems are made to make you think a little bit. If I think about the square root of 10, I could write it as what? 10 factors into 5 times 2. So let's just say this is the square root of 5 times the square root of 2. And then I have times the square root of 2, so times the square root of 2. What can I do to simplify this? Well, realize if I had the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, that is 2. Right, so I can write this as two times the square root of five. What about something like the square root of three times the square root of five? Well, if I look at this one, I have three and I have five. Each of these is gonna be a prime number. So there's not really much I can do other than just combine them through multiplication and say this is the square root of three times five, which is just equal to the square root of 15. What about something like three times the square root of 20V? times four times the square root of 20v cubed. Well, the number parts here out in front, you can just multiply those to start. So let's just say that's three times four or 12. Now let's take on each of these kind of separately. Let's say we have times square root of 20, times square root of 20, and then times square root of v, and then times square root of v cubed. Now it's easy to see that the square root of 20 times the square root of 20 would be 20. So essentially what I'm gonna have is what? 12 times, this would be 20. So 12 times 20. And then if I look at this, I can write this as the square root of v to the first power times v cubed, right? I can combine this with this through multiplication. That would be the square root of v to the fourth power. Now, this is very simple to understand. v to the fourth power can be written as v squared squared. So this could be written as v squared squared. Now, if I'm taking the square root of something squared, 
All I do is I cancel this operation with this one and I'm left with this, right? The square root of v squared squared is v squared, right? So essentially what I'm gonna have is 12 times 20 times v squared, right? That's gonna be my answer. So what's 12 times 20? 12 times two is 24, put a zero at the end, that's 240, and then v squared. So 240 v squared. What about negative two times square root of five v times five times the square root of three b cubed? So we're looking at negative two times five, that's negative 10. And then I'd have the square root of five times three is 15. Nothing I can really do there. b times b cubed is b to the fourth power. So we just saw that the square root of something to the fourth power would be that squared, right? So this should be b squared. Again, if I had b squared and I squared it, right? And then I took the square root of that, this operation here is gonna cancel with this operation here. I'm just left with b squared. So I can write this here. This is equal to negative 10. This is gonna be b squared, so times b squared times the square root of 15. And there's nothing else I can really do with that. So negative 10 b squared times the square root of 15. All right, so let's look at some ones that involve division now. And essentially with division, I'm able to split up my numerator and denominator, or I'm able to combine it. So if I had something like, you know, the square root of one over the square root of four, I could put this as this is equal to the square root of one over four. Right, those two would be equal. So I'm starting out here with two times the square root of 10 over three times the square root of eight. So I can take two and multiply it by the square root of two times the square root of five. That's just breaking down the square root of 10, right? 10 is two times five, so I can write it this way. And then I have three times, for eight I can write the square root of two times the square root of four. Now, some interesting things. This over this is one. Square root of two over square root of two is one. I just have multiplication involved here, so I can cancel common factors. The square root of four is two. Then I would notice that I have a two here, so this would cancel with this. So that's canceled out. So all I'm gonna have here is the square root of five, the square root of five over that three that's in the denominator. What about five times the square root of 15 over the square root of 80? So we have what? We have five times, I can break 15 down into five times three. So I can write this as the square root of five times the square root of three. And then this is over, square root of 80. If I think about 80, what pops up in my head is 16 times five. I know 16 is a perfect square. So if I write the square root of 16 times the square root of five, I know that this is four, and I know that looking at this, I can do some canceling. This would cancel with this. Square root of five over square root of five is one. So what I'm left with is five times the square root of three for my numerator over, this would simplify to just four for the denominator. So five times the square root of three over four. What about something like five times the square root of four over three times the square root of 100? So in each case, these are perfect squares, right? So square root of four is two. So this would be what? It would be five times two over, square root of 100 is 10. So three times 10, but I could write 10 as what? Five times two. So you can see you got some canceling to do. This cancels with this, this cancels with this. So this is a one. So this simplifies to one third. All right, what about five times the square root of 12 over four times the square root of 64? So I'm going to write 12 as four times three. So five times square root of four times the square root of three. And this is over, we have the number four times the square root of 64. Now, 64 is what? It's eight times eight. So this is a perfect square. So I might as well just say I have four times eight here. Now I know that the square root of four is two. So I can kind of circle this and say, okay, well this is gonna be two. And then what I can do is I can cancel this with a factor of two here. So this would be two times eight or 16 down here. So I'd have five times the square root of three for the numerator. This is over two times eight or 16 for the denominator. So again, five times the square root of three over 16 is my answer. All right, let's look at a few that are a little bit more challenging. So we have seven times the cube root 
of 81x squared y squared. So what I'm looking for now are perfect cubes. I know that x squared and y squared, those won't be perfect cubes, right? If I had x cubed and y cubed, and I had the cube root of that, well, yeah, this would just be equal to xy, right? Because the cube root of something that's cubed, you just think about those as canceling out. We can erase this, though. It's not the scenario we have. We have the second power here and here. 81, though, I can work with that. If I have 81, I know that's 3 to the fourth power, right? It's 27, which is a perfect cube, times 3. So I'm going to rewrite this as 7 times the cube root of 27 times the cube root of 3x squared y squared. And what I'm meant to do in this problem is just rewrite this as 3, right? The cube root of 27 is 3. So I'd essentially have 7 times 3, or 21, then times the cube root, the cube root of 3x squared, y squared. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have 3 times the fifth root of 224m squared n to the 7. So let's think about the number part first, and then we'll think about the variables involved. First off, let's factor 224. I don't have any idea what the factorization of this number is off the top of my head, but right away I see that it's divisible by 2. I see it's divisible by 4. So I would start with just dividing it by 4, and basically it's 4 times 56. So 4 times 56. 4 is 2 times 2. 56 is what? It's 8 times 7. 8 is 4 times 2. 4 is 2 times 2. So if I look at this, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 factors of 2, where basically I have 32 times 7. So 32 times 7. So this is equal to 3 times the fifth root. We're going to put 32. And then times the fifth root of 7, m squared, and then n to the seventh power. And we'll deal with the variables in a second. So we know that the fifth root of 32 is 2, right? Because 2 to the fifth power is 32. So I can go ahead and write this equals, this is going to be a 2, so 3 times 2 would be 6. So 6 times the fifth root of 7m squared n to the seventh. Now, m squared, I can't do anything with that because if I have the fifth root of something, I have to have an exponent of at least a 5 to be able to simplify that. Now, I have an exponent here that's a 7. So all I need to do is think about the closest number to 7 that's less than 7, that's going to be divisible by 5, and that's going to be 5. So essentially what I can do is I can write this as n to the 5th power times n squared. Right? n to the 5th power times n squared is n to the 7th power. Now, if I took the 5th root of n to the 5th power... I would get n, right? Because n times n times n times n times n would give me n to the fifth power. So if I took the fifth root of that, I get back to n. So I'm going to go and write this as 6 times the fifth root of n to the fifth power times the fifth root of what I can't simplify, which is 7m squared. And now I'm not free of the n's. I still have an n squared there. That's going to be left inside. So times n squared. So this equals, let me kind of erase this. Again, we know the fifth root of n to the fifth power is n. So I'm going to write this as 6n times the fifth root, the fifth root of 7m squared, n squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 1 on multiplying, dividing, and simplifying radicals. All right, so we just want to simplify. We're going to take a look at the square root of 125. So for the square root of 125, what I'm looking to do to simplify, I'm looking at the number here, 125. I want to look at the factors of 125, and I want to see if any of the factors would be a perfect square. And again, what do we mean when we say a perfect square? We mean that the number's square root would be a rational number. So 9 is a perfect square because the square root of 9 is 3. But 5 is not a perfect square because if I think about 5, it's a prime number, right? It only factors into 5 times 1. So I can't take the square root of that and get a rational number. So we're looking for factors of 125 
that are perfect squares, and we want to pull those outside of that square root symbol. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the first thing is, if you don't know the factors of 125, just make a little factor tree. And you don't need to complete it, you just need to stop when you see all the perfect squares that you would get. So I know this is 25 times 5, and I could stop there because I know 25 is a perfect square, right? It's 5 times 5. So I can write this as what? The product rule for radical says I can write this as the square root of 25 times the square root of 5. So then I know that the square root of 25 is 5. So I can just write that. So this is 5 times what's left is the square root of 5. So all I did was just simplify this by looking at the factors here and taking out the perfect squares, right? So 25 was a perfect square, so I said, okay, the square root of that would be 5, and I just wrote it outside of the square root of 5. So this is just the simplified version of this. If I was to punch up the square root of 125 on a calculator and 5 times the square root of 5 on a calculator, I would get the same value. What about something like the square root of 8? Well, this one's pretty easy to do. We know that that is, what, 2 times 2 times 2, or I could write it as 4 times 2, right? 4 is a perfect square because, again, if I take the square root of 4, I get a rational number that's 2. So I could write this as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2, and then I know the square root of 4 is 2, so I can just simply write that. I can say this is 2 times the square root of 2, and then again, this is the simplified version of this. Let's look at one last one. We have the square root of 18. So what should jump right out at you would be 9, right? 9 is a factor of 18. It's a perfect square. So I could write this as what? The square root of 9 times the square root of 2. I know the square root of 9 is 3. So this would be 3 times the square root of 2. And again, this is just the simplified version of this. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on Multiplying, Dividing, and Simplifying radicals. All right, so we want to simplify. We're going to take a look at the square root of 10 times the square root of 3. So the product rule for radicals tells us that we can simplify this by just multiplying 10 times 3 and placing that under a square root symbol. So in other words, I can just say this is the square root of 10 times 3. And we know that 10 times 3 is 30. So this would be the square root of 30. What about something like the square root of 6 times the square root of 12? So I can write this as the square root of 6 times 12, and this is equal to the square root of 72. But if I report my answer like that, I'm technically not correct. We always want to report our answer as a simplified radical. So before I even go into this step, in the last example, there wasn't anything I could do to simplify. But in this example, there is some stuff that I can do. So let me kind of erase this, and let's start the problem over. So if I have the square root of 6, let's think about that as the square root of 2 times the square root of 3. The square root of 12, let's think about that as what? The square root of 4, 4 is a perfect square, the square root of 4 is 2. And let's think about it as times the square root of 3. So 4 times 3 is 12, 2 times 3 is 6. So by the product rule for radicals, I've done nothing illegal. Right? I'm just manipulating this in a way that I can simplify. So now I know that the square root of 4 is 2. So let me just start with that. This has a value of 2. I know that if I combine the square root of 3 and the square root of 3, I'm going to get 3. Okay, So I can put times 3 here. And then all I'm going to have left is the square root of 2 that I really can't do anything with. So this is times the square root of 2. So this equals 6 times the square root of 2. So you've always got to think about what can I do to simplify. And it's usually easier if you simplify before you multiply versus if I had square root of 72 and I had to say, okay, well, this is, you know, square root of 36 times square root of 2. Square root of 36 is 6, so this is 6 times square root of 2. Right? It's a little quicker. I know this took longer because I had to explain it, but it's a little quicker to do it in this stage versus doing it in this stage. All right, let's take a look at another. So we have 4 times the square root of 5r squared times 4 times the square root of 3r squared. So the first thing is I can just multiply the numbers. 4 times 4 is 16. And then I have the square root of 5 times the square root of r squared times the square root of 3 
times the square root of r squared. So if I take the square root of something that's squared, the operations are going to cancel, right? It's like multiplication and division, right? If I multiply something by 3 and then I divide by 3, go right back to what I started with. So if I have r and I square it and then I take the square root, I go right back to r. So this is going to be equal to, I'm going to have 16 times, I have an r here and an r here. So r times r would be r squared. So I'd have 16 r squared. And then the square root of 5 and the square root of 3, I can't do anything with that. So I'm just going to write the square root of 5 times 3 or the square root of 15. So 16 r squared times the square root of 15. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on multiplying, dividing, and simplifying radicals. All right, so we want to simplify. We're looking at 4 times the square root of 15x squared times 5 times the square root of 6x cubed. All right, so I know 4 times 5 will give me 20. Let me just start out with that. So this is 20 times, we have the square root of 15x squared. Let's break that up into the square root of 5 times the square root of 3 times the square root of x squared. Then I have the square root of 6x cubed. So let's break that up into the square root of 2 times the square root of 3 times the square root of x cubed. Right away, there's some things I can do to simplify. Square root of 3 times the square root of 3, I know is 3. So I can basically eliminate those. So 20 times 3 would be 60. So let me write a 60 out front now. And then I have the square root of 5 and the square root of 2. I can't do anything else with either of those. So I'm going to write times the square root of 5 times 2 would be 10. Now, for x squared, if I have the square root of x squared, this cancels with this. Right? If I square something and then take the square root of it, I get what I started with. So if I took x and I squared it and then I took the square root, I'm back to x. So an x would come outside here. And then if I look at this here, I have x cubed. I want the square root of that. How would I go about thinking about that in such a way that I could simplify? Well, remember, the index here is a 2. So I'm looking for an exponent that would be divisible by 2. So in other words, if I thought about this kind of as a side note, I could write x cubed as x squared times x. So if I had the square root of that, I could break it down into the square root of x squared times the square root of x. I just saw that this simplifies to just x. So I'd have another x out here. So x times x would give me what? x squared, x squared. And then I'd have times the square root of x. So let me erase all this. So times the square root of x, or I could just write the x underneath. So I could write it here. And so simplifying this would give me 60x squared times the square root of 10x. What about something like the square root of 12 over 4 times the square root of 3? So we have similar rules when it comes to division. The first thing is I'm just going to break down the square root of 12 into the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And this is over, I have 4 times the square root of 3. This is all multiplication and division here. So all I'm going to do is cancel this common factor with this one. Square root of 3 over square root of 3 is 1. Then I have the square root of 4, which I know is 2, over 4. So I can cancel this with this and put a 2. The numerator now is 1 because everything is canceled. And the denominator is simply a 2. So this is going to simplify to 1 half. All right, so let's take a look at the square root of 8 over the square root of 16. So something like this, I could do it a few different ways. The first way I could do it is, okay, I could say the square root of 8 is what? This is square root of 4 times square root of 2. The square root of 16 I know is 4. So then the square root of 4 I know is 2. So I can cancel this with this and I'd have a 2. This would simply be the square root of 2 over 2. So what's another way I could go about getting this? Well, I could use my quotient rule for radicals, and I could write this as the square root of 8 over 16. If I simplified in here before I took the square root, 8 over 16, we know that's 1 half. So the square root of 1 half. Now, mentally, I could do that in my head because I know that the square root of 1 is 1 and the square root of 2 is just square root of 2. So I could kind of break this up as square root of 1 over square root of 2. You can kind of go back and forth between these two formats of the square root of 1 half or square root of 1 over square root of 2, right? They're equal in value. One thing that happens here, we'd have 1, square root of 1 is 1, over the square root of 2. 
So one thing that happens here is you would notice that this doesn't match this. And you say, well, that's not somewhere you messed up. You didn't get the right answer. Well, I want to tell you that as we move forward, we're going to use a process known as rationalizing the denominator. So this is how you want to actually report your answer. Okay, this is expected of you as you kind of move forward. If you report this answer, it's not technically wrong, but the convention is that you won't have a radical in the denominator. So you're going to use a little trick, which we're going to learn in a future lesson, where you multiply both the numerator and denominator by the square root of 2. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. 1 times square root of 2 is square root of 2. So by doing a little trick here, basically I just multiplied by a complex form of 1, I'm able to match this answer. And again, that's the way we want to report it. So at this stage of the game, in this section, you usually don't get problems that require you to rationalize the denominator. But as you move forward, you're going to get a lot of problems, and this is something you're going to be expected to do. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Multiplying, Dividing, and Simplifying Radicals. All right, so we want to simplify. So I have 3 times the square root of 2 over 2 times the square root of 18. So what I can do here, in the numerator I can't really do anything. 3 times the square root of 2, can't really break that down any further. In the denominator I have 2 times the square root of 18. I know the square root of 18, 18 is what? 9 times 2, 9 is a perfect square. So I can do times square root of 2 times square root of 9. Now, I know that I can cancel this with this. Square root of 2 over square root of 2 is 1. The other thing is I can cancel this with this. Square root of 9 is 3, right? This has a value of 3. So I'm basically canceling a common factor of 3. The numerator is completely canceled, so it's now a 1. The denominator, all I have left is this 2, right? This is canceled. So it's 1 over 2 or 1 half. All right, what about 3 times the square root of 6 over 2 times the square root of 8? So for the numerator, I'm going to write 3 times square root of 2 times square root of 3. For the denominator, I'm going to write 2 times the square root. 8 I could write as 2 times 4, so square root of 2 times square root of 4. So what can I cancel? Well, obviously I can cancel this with this. Square root of 2 over square root of 2 is 1. And then square root of 4 is 2. There's nothing really else I can do to cancel. So I just write 3 times the square root of 3 in the numerator over 2 times 2 or 4 in the denominator. So 3 times square root of 3 over 4. All right, let's look at one that involves the cube root. So we have 2 times the cube root of 750xy to the fourth power. So let's start with just that number there. Let's try to break it down and look for a perfect cube. So what do I mean by that when I say a perfect cube? Well, remember, a perfect square is a number, or it could be a variable, where the square root is a rational number. So a perfect cube would have a cube root that is a rational number. Right? It's, it's the same thing, basically. So if I think about 750, I know I could do 250 times 3. And then 250 I know is 125 times 2. And I know 125 is a perfect cube. Right? It's 5 times 5 times 5. So what I can do, I can write 2 times the cube root of 125 times... Let's deal with everything else. I have 2 times 3. So times the cube root, 2 times 3 is 6. And then let's put this xy to the fourth power in here. We're going to deal with that in a second. So what we know at this point is that the cube root of 125 is 5. So let's just go ahead and simplify by saying this has a value of 5. I'd have 2 times 5. That's 10. So I'd have 10 times the cube root of 6 times the cube root of x times the cube root of y to the fourth power. So let's think about these parts individually now. There's nothing I can do to simplify this any further. 6 is not a perfect cube. No factor of 6 is going to be a perfect cube other than 1, and that's not going to help us. x is not a perfect cube, and I can't factor that any further. So there's nothing I can do with that. y to the fourth power would have a factor that is a perfect cube. Again, when you work with exponents here, if I'm looking at an index of 3, what I need here is an exponent of 3 to be able to pull one of those out. So I'm looking for divisibility by 3. So if I think about y to the fourth power, the closest exponent to 4, that would be divisible by 3, is 3. So I could write this as y cubed times y to the first power. 
right, from the rules of exponents. So if I just said I had, let's kind of break this up into y cubed times the cube root of y to the first power, now I got something that I can further simplify. I know that if I take the cube root of y cubed, these operations are going to cancel, and I'm left with y. So what I have here is 10 times y, that would come out, and then times the cube root of everything left. So 6 times x times y. So 10y times the cube root of 6xy. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on multiplying, dividing, and simplifying radicals. All right, so we want to simplify. So we're going to take a look at 2 times the fourth root of 162 times x to the eighth power times y to the fifth power. So let's just start out with this number right here, this 162. Can we think of any factors of 162 that could be broken down into a number times itself four times? Well, let's take a look. So 162, I know it's divisible by 2. It would be 2 times 81. So I know 2 is prime. Let me just circle that. For 81, I know that that's what? 27 times 3. Now, 27 is what? It's 9 times 3. And 9 is 3 times 3. So voila, I found something that I'm looking for. I have 1, 2, 3, 4 factors of 3. So 3 to the 4th power is 81. So then 81, if I took that and I grabbed the 4th root of that, I would go back to 3. So I can go ahead and split this first part up into 2 times the 4th root of 81 times the fourth root of 2. Now, for these parts here, x to the eighth power and y to the fifth power, I want to think about, let's say, with x to the eighth power. What is an exponent that would be divisible by 4? Well, 8 would be. If I divide 8 by 4, I'd get 2. Now, what does that mean? Why did I say divisible by 4? Well, if I think about this, I can make this into x to the fourth power times x to the fourth power. That's why I asked for divisibility by four. x to the fourth power times x to the fourth power, if I use my product rule for exponents, would get me back to x to the eighth power. If I took the fourth root of x to the fourth power, so if I took the fourth root of x to the fourth power, this would cancel with this, and I'd be left with x. So essentially what's going to happen is I can break this up into the fourth root of x to the fourth power times the fourth root of x to the fourth power. Or another way to look at that is you can take this and say it's really x squared raised to the fourth power. And there's a lot of different ways to kind of look at this to where it'll make sense for you. But just at this point, at this stage in the game, you're not going to get too many of these. You want to kind of just focus on being able to use one of these methods to get the right answer. And then when we get to fractional exponents, this is going to make a lot more sense for you. All right, so let me erase all of this. And then we have y to the fifth power. So y to the fifth power. So what's the closest exponent to this guy that's going to be divisible by 4? It'd be y to the fourth power. So I can write this as y to the fourth power times y to the first power. Now, if I had y to the fourth power and I wanted the fourth root of that, this would be y. Right? That would be y. So I'm going to continue this down here. Let me just kind of move this down here so I have enough room to do everything. So I'm going to put times the fourth root of y to the fourth power times the fourth root of y. All right, so let me erase all that. And you see all I've done is just break this original radicand down, and I've just separated it. If I went through and multiplied 81 times 2 times x to the fourth power times x to the fourth power times y to the fourth power times y, I would get this back exactly, right? Just go ahead and pause the video and try it for yourself. That's what you're going to get back. So you're allowed to separate that as much as you want in order to do the simplifying that you need to do. So we already know that we'd have 2 times the fourth root of 81. We covered that in the beginning. That's 3, right? Because 3 to the fourth power is 81. So this would be 3. I can't do anything with this. So let me leave this alone for right now. The fourth root of x to the fourth power. This is going to cancel with this and give me x. This is going to cancel with this and give me x. So x times x is x squared. So I'd have an x squared here. Then the fourth root of y to the fourth power. This is going to cancel with this, and I just have y. So then times y. 
and then I can't do anything with this. So the stuff I can't do anything with, I just write it under my radical symbol. So this is the fourth root of, I'll have a two and then a y. And I can't do anything else with that to simplify. The only thing I can do here is just multiply two times three together. That would give me six. So I'd end up with six x squared y times the fourth root, the fourth root of two y. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have seven times the fourth root of 405 x to the sixth power, y to the fifth power. So if I think about 405 to start, let me just think about that number. I would factor it. I know it's divisible by five, so let me start with that. So this would be five times 81. We already know at this point that 81 is three to the fourth power. We just saw that. So I know that I could write this as seven times the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of five, then times, let's talk about these variables here. Again, all I wanna do is think about, okay, if I have x to the sixth power, what is the closest exponent to this that's divisible by four? Well, four would be. So then I would just write this as x to the fourth power times x squared, because this one right here can be simplified. The fourth root of x to the fourth power is just x. I can't do anything with x squared, but at least I can simplify this part right here. So I can go ahead and write this as the fourth root of x to the fourth power times the fourth root of x squared. And then I have y to the fifth power. I'm gonna do the same thing. If I have y to the fifth power, the closest exponent to this that's divisible by four is y to the fourth power. So I have y to the fourth power times y to the first power. And again, the reason I'm doing that is if I have the fourth root of y to the fourth power, that's equal to y, right? So I can simplify that. So let me drag this down here so I have enough room to do everything. So times, I'd have the fourth root of y to the fourth power, and times, I'd have the fourth root of y. Let me erase all this. Okay, so now let's go through and simplify. I've got a seven. The fourth root of 81 is three, so times three. The fourth root of five, can't do anything with that, I'll save that for the end. The fourth root of x to the fourth power is x. The fourth root of x squared, I can't do anything with that. The fourth root of y to the fourth power is going to be y. And then the fourth root of y, that's going to not be able to be simplified any further. So now I'll deal with those scenarios. So then times the fourth root of, I'm just going to combine everything I couldn't simplify. So five times x squared times y. So we'll finish up by just multiplying seven times three. That gives us 21. So we'll have 21 xy times the fourth root, okay, the fourth root, of 5x squared y. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 55. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so we're going to start out with 4 times the square root of 5 and then plus 5 times the square root of 5. So remember, if you're adding or subtracting radicals, they have to be like radicals. So that means you have to have the same index Okay, in this case, you have a square root and a square root, so that's a check. And then you have to also have the same radicand. So that's what you're looking at underneath your radical symbol. And in this case, it's a five here and here. So we do have like radicals. So once we figured that out, basically your radical just kind of comes along for the ride and you're adding what's multiplying that common radical. So in this case, I have a four here and a five here and my operation is addition. So all I'm gonna do is add four plus five, that's gonna give me nine, and then multiply it by that common radical, square root of five. So I get nine times the square root of five as my answer. All right, for the next one I have negative two times the square root of eight minus four times the square root of eight. So in this particular case, I've got a negative two, and I've got, you can think about this as plus negative four or minus four, however you wanna think about that operation. But negative two plus negative four would be negative six, and then square root of eight would just come along for the ride because that's common to each. Now, we don't leave it like this because I could simplify the square root of eight. I know that eight contains a perfect square as one of its factors, right? Four is a perfect square, four square root is two. So I can simplify this as negative six times the square root of, I'll break this up into the square root of four times the square root of two. Again, I know that the square root of four is two. And so I'll write this as negative six times two. 
times the square root of 2. And so negative 6 times 2 is negative 12, so this will end up being negative 12 times the square root of 2 as my answer. So what about something like negative 3 times the square root of 2 minus 5 times the square root of 2? Well, again, all I need to do is really look at this minus this. So negative 3 minus 5 is negative 8. So I'd have negative 8 times this common radical, which is square root of 2. All right, so sometimes you're going to encounter things that are not like radicals when you first begin. But after you start simplifying, you might end up with like radicals. So just because we look at this here and we say, okay, well, these two are like radicals, but this one is not, don't assume that you can't do anything with it. Go ahead and simplify it, and then you can see whether you can do something with it or not. So in this problem, we have negative 2 times the square root of 2 minus 3 times the square root of 2 plus 2 times the square root of 24. So let me just combine these two like radicals to start. So negative 2 times the square root of 2 minus 3 times the square root of 2, negative 2 minus 3 would be negative 5. So this is negative 5 times the square root of 2. And then plus, we have 2 times the square root of 24. Now, I know I can factor 24 into 4 times 6. I know that 4 is a perfect square. So I can do equals negative 5 times the square root of 2 plus I'll do 2 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 6. And the square root of 4 is 2. So let me put equals here. I'll have negative 5 times the square root of 2 plus, again, this is 2, so I'd have 2 times 2, or 4, times the square root of 6. Now, are these like radicals now? Well, no, they're not. They're each square roots, so we make it on the index part, but the radicand is still different. This is a 2, and this is a 6. There's no way to combine that mathematically, so we just leave the answer as it is, negative 5 times the square root of 2, plus 4 times the square root of 6. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have negative square root of 8, minus 3 times the square root of 27, plus 2 times the square root of 2. So when we look at this problem, we don't have any like radicals to start. But again, we want to simplify everything and see if we end up with some like radicals. So we have this negative square root of 8. So let me write this as negative 1 times. You can write the square root of 8 as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. I know the square root of 4 is 2. So really, negative 1 times 2, or negative 2 times square root of 2. So negative 2 times the square root of 2. Then minus, I've got 3 here, times the square root of 27. Now, for 27, I know it's 9 times 3, and I know 9's a perfect square. So essentially, I could do times square root of 9 times square root of 3. Square root of 9 is 3, so I'd have 3 times 3, or 9. So this would be minus that 9, and then times the square root of 3. Then plus, I have 2 times the square root of 2. Nothing I can do to simplify that any further. Now, I do have like radicals here and here. What's interesting is, if I combine these, I have a negative 2 and a positive 2. Negative 2 and positive 2 would combine and give me 0. So I'd have 0 times the square root of 2, which is 0, right? 0 times any number is 0. So essentially, all I'm going to be left with is this. So this is going to be equal to negative 9 times the square root of 3, and that's going to be my simplified answer. All right, let's take a look at 2 times the square root of 20 minus 3 times the square root of 8 minus 3 times the square root of 45. So again, no like radicals to start. I can think about 20 as what? 4 times 5. I can think about 8 as 4 times 2. And I can think about 45 as 9 times 5. So we can kind of start breaking these things down quicker. I know that the square root of 4 would be 2. Right, So I can go, go through and write this out slowly and say 2 times square root of 4 times square root of 5. But again, once you start noticing patterns here, you know the square root of 4 is 2. So just go ahead and say, I'm going to replace that with a 2. 2 times 2 would be 4. So this simplifies to 4 times square root of 5, then minus. For this one, I know I'd have the square root of 4 again. Square root of 4 is 2. So I'd have 2 times that 3 there. 2 times 3 is 6. So I'd have minus 6 times what's left here, square root of 2. Then minus. I've got a 3. I've got square root of 45, which I broke down into 9 times 5. So square root of 9 would be 3. So I'd have 3 times 3 or 9, so minus 9 times the square root of 
I'd have a 5 left. All right, so 4 times the square root of 5 and negative 9 times the square root of 5, those are like radicals. These are like radicals. So we can go ahead and combine those. 4 minus 9 is negative 5, so this would be negative 5 times the square root of 5, and then minus 6 times the square root of 2. And again, there's nothing else I can do to simplify this further. These are not like radicals. The index is the same, right? They're each going to be square roots, but the radicand is different in each case. One's a 5, one's a 2, can't simplify any further. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So now we have some variables involved. And so it gets a little bit more complex, but not so much. So we have 2 times the square root of 125y squared n plus 8y times the square root of 80n. So if I simplify this, I have a 2 times the square root of, I mean, think about 125 is 25 times 5. So the square root of 25 times the square root of 5. Then I'm going to do times the square root of y squared then times the square root of n. So what can I do here? So the square root of 25 is 5. So I'm going to circle this and just put this as 5. Can't simplify that. Can't simplify that. But the square root of y squared, this cancels with this, and I just have y. So I know that I have 2 times 5 times y, or 10y. So let's write this as 10y. And then times the square root of 5n. Then plus. Next I have this 8y here. And then the square root of 80n. So I can't do anything with the n, but I can do something with the 80, right? 80 is 16 times 5. So if I took the square root of 16 times the square root of 5, square root of 16 is 4, so I'd multiply the 4 times the 8 and get 32, so this would be 32y. And I still have that square root of 5, so times square root of 5. And then I also have that n there. So really, this would be square root of 5n. And we can see here now that we do have like radicals, right? I have square root of 5n, square root of 5n. And all I need to do now is just add 10y and 32y. And those happen to be like terms, right? If we didn't have the square roots involved and we just said, what is 10y plus 32y? We would just add 10 and 32 and we get... 42, and then y would come along for the ride. So we have 42y times that common radical, which is the square root of 5n. All right, let's take a look at another one with some variables involved. So we have negative 5 times the cube root of 256x to the fourth power minus 2x times the cube root of 32x. So this one might take a little while because as we get numbers that are bigger, as we get higher roots, you know, the calculations just get more and more tedious. So if I had 256, I think a lot of you would know that's 2 to the 8th power. So knowing that, I can really think about writing this using my properties of exponents as 2 cubed times 2 cubed times 2 squared. Now I know that each time I have 2 cubed and I took the cube root of that, I get back to 2, right? So essentially, let me kind of drag this down here out of the way. If I put equals here, and I put negative 5 times, and I broke this down. Let's say I did the cube root of 2 cubed. We know 2 cubed is 8. So 8 times the cube root of 8 again times 2 squared is 4. So the cube root of 4. For this part right here, I know that this is going to be 2. And this is going to be 2, right? So 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. So the number part out here would be a negative 20. Now, I know that the cube root of 4, I can't do anything with that. So I'm just going to have the cube root of 4 here. But with this variable, I can do something with that. Again, kind of thinking about this with exponents. If I have x to the fourth power, and I'm looking to simplify this with an index that is 3. All I want to do is say, okay, well, this is x cubed times x to the first power. And so if I had the cube root of x cubed times the cube root of x, well, I know that this cancels with this and gives me x. So that goes out here. So I'd have negative 20x. 
And then this one right here couldn't be simplified any further, so I could just put that under here. So the cube root of 4x would be that. Okay, so we've simplified this part right here into negative 20x times the cube root of 4x. Then we have minus. Over here, this one's a lot more simple. We have 2x times, for 32, I can think about that as what? 2 to the fifth power. So I know it's really 8 times 4. So I'm going to do the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 4, and then I have that x. So this isn't going to simplify. This is. Cube root of 8 is 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. So let's write this as minus 4x times, again, what won't simplify, which is the cube root of 4x. Now, we have like radicals here. We have cube root of 4x, cube root of 4x. So that's what we're striving for. So all I have to do is say, okay, negative 20x minus 4x is negative 24x, and then times that common radical, which again is the cube root of 4x. So you can see this is not very difficult. It just gets very, very tedious when you have large numbers, you start getting large exponents, and your indexes start getting higher. You know, when you start having stuff where it's like the eighth root or the tenth root or the twelfth root, then you really have to kind of sit down, get some scratch paper out, and really get to work. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. And I kind of saved the best for last. I have something that's the seventh root. So I have negative 3 times the seventh root of 5. Can't do anything to simplify this, so I can just go ahead and just copy that. Minus, I have 2 times the seventh root of 640 plus 2 times the seventh root of 384. So can I simplify this? Well, what is 640? Let's start. I know it ends in 0, so it's divisible by 10. I can do 64 times 10. I know 10 is 5 times 2. I know 64 is what? It's 2 to the 6th power. So if this is 2 to the 6th power, and I have another 2 here, really it's 2 to the 7th power times 5. Well, 2 to the 7th power, we know is 128. So if I wrote this as minus 2 times the 7th root of 128 times the 7th root of 5, well, I know this value is 2, right? Again, how do I know that? 2 to the 7th power is 128. So the 7th root of 128 is 2. Let's put times 2. And of course, negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. So I'm just going to erase this. I'm going to write this as negative 4. And then we can slide this down and just put times the 7th root of 5. All right, next we have plus. We have 2 times the 7th root of 384. So what about 384? What can we do with that? Well, I know it's divisible by 4. It would be 96 times 4, so let's start with that. Or is 2 times 2, of course. What about 96? Well, I know 96 is 3 times 32. 3 times 32. Now, 32 is 2 to the 5th power. So once you start noticing stuff, I've got 2 to the 5th power and I've got 2 squared. Combine those two, I've got 2 to the 7th power, 128. So this is the 7th root of 128 times the seventh root of three. Again, once you kind of spot that, I have a seventh root. If I can spot something to the seventh power, that's what I'm looking for. So this right here simplifies to two. So two times two would give me four. So this would be four times the seventh root of three. Now I have like radicals here and here, but not here, right? I can't do anything more with that. So what I want to do is just say negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7. So this is negative 7 times the seventh root of 5, and then plus 4 times the seventh root of 3. And again, nothing else I can do to combine these. I've got the same index, which is great, but I have a different radicand. I have a 5 here and a 3 here. So that's not going to work, right? The index and the radicand have to be the same for you to have like radicals and to be able to combine this with addition or subtraction. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1, when adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so we want to start by looking at negative 4 times the square root of 3 minus 3 times the square root of 3. So the first thing we're looking at is, do we have the same index 
And do we have the same radicand? Right? We're looking to see if we have like radicals. So in this case, we have a square root in each case, and we have a three for the radicand in each case. So we do have like radicals. And essentially all we would do is just add or subtract the numbers that are multiplying the like radical. In this case, I have a negative four and I have minus a three. So just do negative four minus three, that's gonna give me negative seven. And that's multiplied by that common radical, which is square root of three. So I get negative seven times the square root of three as my answer. For this one, I have three times the square root of seven minus three times the square root of seven. So this is the same thing minus itself. Of course, this is just zero. All right, next we're looking at negative three times the square root of eight plus two times the square root of eight. So negative three plus two is negative one. So I'd have negative one times the square root of eight. But then I can simplify the square root of eight. We know that the square root of eight is able to be written as, and let me just write this negative one out in front, the square root of four times the square root of two. Right? We saw in the last section that we could break it up in that way. And we know that the square root of four is two. So I can really write this as negative one times two. So negative two times the square root of two. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Test Section Two on adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so we're gonna start out with two times the square root of 54 minus two times the square root of 20 minus the square root of 54. So as you know from watching the lesson, in order for us to add or subtract radicals, they have to be like radicals. So they have to have the same index and the same radicand. Now, in a lot of cases you get problems like these, you go through and you simplify everything and you find that you can actually combine everything. Right now, this guy right here is the square root of 20. This is square root of 54 and this is square root of 54. So this one right now I can't do anything with as far as combining with the other ones, but let's simplify everything and see if that changes. So I'm gonna put two times, the square root of 54 I can do square root of nine times the square root of six, right? Nine times six is 54. I know the square root of nine is three, but I'll simplify that in a second. So minus, we have two times, for the square root of 20 I could write the square root of four times the square root of five, and then minus, again the square root of 54 I could write the square root of nine times the square root of six. So I know that, again, the square root of nine is three. So let's go ahead and write, we'd have two times three or six times the square root of six. And then minus, I know the square root of four is two. So two times two would be four. So minus four times the square root of five. And then minus, I have the square root of nine, which is three times the square root of six. So it still ends up being to where I can only combine these right? But I just go ahead and do those. So 6 minus 3 would give me 3. So this would be 3 times the square root of 6. And then minus 4 times the square root of 5. So this is my simplified answer here. I can't do anything else because these are not like radicals, right? I have the same index. They're each square roots, but I don't have the same radicand. I have a 6 here and a 5 here. So there's nothing else I can do. For the next one, I have negative square root of 2 plus two times the square root of 12, plus three times the square root of 27. So for this one right here, I can't really do anything to simplify that. So let's just write negative one times square root of two, plus for this one, I know that 12 is four times three, right? So the square root of four, the square root of four times the square root of three, I know the square root of four is two, so I'd have two times two or four times the square root of three. And then for this guy over here, I have three times the square root of 27. I know I could write that as nine times three. So the square root of nine times the square root of three, square root of nine is three. So I'd have three times three or nine times the square root of three. So what can I combine here? Well, these two are like radicals. So what I can do is I can just lead with negative square root of two, or I can put negative one times square root of two, doesn't matter, plus four plus nine is 13. So 13, times that common radical, the square root of three. So again, I can't simplify this any further because they're not like radicals. I just end up with negative square root of two plus 13 times the square root of three. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section three on adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so we're looking at negative square root of 24 minus the square root of 12 minus four times square root of 18 
plus three times the square root of 24. So I'm gonna try to break each one of these up and see if I can get some like radicals. So the square root of 24, so let me start out with that negative. I can break this up into the square root of four times the square root of six. Now the square root of four is two, so let me erase that and just put negative two times the square root of six, and then minus. For the square root of 12, I can do the square root of four times the square root of three. I know the square root of four is two, so I can put a two out in front, and then just times the square root of three, and then minus. For the square root of 18, I can do the square root of nine times the square root of two. Now the square root of nine is three, so I'd have three times that four there, three times four is 12. So this would be minus 12 times what's left there would be the square root of two. And then plus, now we have that three times the square root of 24. So I could write this as square root of four times square root of six, square root of four is two. So I'd have two times three or six times square root of six. So what can I combine here? Well, this one and this one, those are like radicals. I have the same index, they're both square roots, and I have the same radicand of six. Nothing else I can really combine. So I do negative two plus six, which is four. So this would be four times square root of six, and then minus two times square root of three, and then minus 12 times square root of two. For the next one, I have five times the square root of 75x squared minus four times the square root of 27x squared. So let's take a look at this. So I have five times, this guy right here, I could break this down into the square root of 25 times the square root of three times the square root of x squared, and then minus four times, for this guy I'm gonna break it down into the square root of nine times the square root of three times the square root of x squared. Okay, so pretty easy overall for this one. Square root of 25 is five, right? So I'd have five times five or 25, and then the square root of x squared is just x. So 25x times that square root of three that I can't do anything with. And then minus, over here the square root of nine is three. So I'd have four times three or 12. And then again, the square root of x squared is x. And then times the square root of three, which I can't do anything with. But now I have like radicals, right? I have the square root of three here and here. And so 25x minus 12x would be 13x. So I'd have 13x times that common radical that is the square root of three. So 13x times the square root of three is my simplified answer. All right, for the next one, I've got 3x times the square root of 24x squared y squared plus 9y times the square root of 54x cubed. So if I look to simplify here, I've got 3x times, I'm gonna go ahead and write this as the square root of four times the square root of six times the square root of x squared, times the square root of y squared, plus nine y times the square root of six, times the square root of nine. And I don't think I can fit this all on the screen. So let me kind of go down here a little bit. So this would be times, and then down here, I'm gonna put the square root, x cubed I'm gonna write as x squared, and then times the square root of x. So x squared times x would be x cubed. Now, if I look at how this plays itself out here, square root of four is two, square root of x squared is x, square root of y squared is y. So essentially what I have is two times three, or six, and then I'd have an x from here times x, which would be x squared, and then I'd have a y from there, and then what's left that I can't simplify is the square root of six. Then plus, over here, I've got the square root of nine, which is three, so three times nine would be 27. I've got that y, and then the square root of x squared is x. So I could write xy or yx, doesn't matter. And then times what we have here that's gonna be left over is gonna be the square root of six x. So what I'm gonna end up with here is six x squared y times the square root of six plus 27 xy times the square root of six x. I can't combine these. Even if I had the same radicand here, which I don't, I wouldn't have like terms here, right? Those wouldn't be like terms. So no matter how you kind of slice this one, you don't have like terms and you don't have like radicals. So there ends up being nothing you can do. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so for the first problem, we want to take a look at 4 times the cube root of 48 
plus 3 times the cube root of 5, plus 4 times the cube root of 5, plus 2 times the cube root of 5. So obviously at this point, you should understand that if you're adding or subtracting radicals, you have to have like radicals. So for us to have like radicals, we've got to have the same index, which in this case, everything is cubed, right? So I have an index of three for each of these. And then I also have to have the same radicand. So that's what's underneath the radical symbol. And for these three, okay, for these three here, I have a five in each case. So these, let me highlight them, these are like radicals. So I can go ahead and just combine those. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the numbers that are multiplying that cube root of five. So I would just do three plus four plus two. Three plus four is seven, seven plus two is nine, so that would be nine times that common cube root of five. Okay, that's all I need to do. Then for this part right here, I'm just gonna copy it for right now. So I'm gonna put four times the cube root of 48 and then plus, of course, what we've already found, nine times the cube root of five. Now, can we combine these as it looks right now? No, we can't, right? Because they're not like radicals. But these problems are designed for you to get a little bit of extra practice and simplification. They want you to go through and simplify this guy and figure out, is it going to be a like radical once it's simplified? So if I simplified four times the cube root of 48, what would I get? Well, 48, I know if I factor it, I've got a perfect cube in there, right? We all know at this point that eight is a perfect cube. It's two times two times two. So I could factor this as eight times six. So let's go ahead and write this. Let's write this as four times the cube root of eight times the cube root of six. So I'll put equals up here. And this right here we know is two, right? So if I know this is two, I'm basically gonna have four times two or eight times the cube root of six, the cube root of six. Now, can I do anything to simplify the cube root of six? No, I cannot, right? There's no perfect cube in any factor of six other than one. And again, that's not gonna help you. So you've got eight times the cube root of six plus nine times the cube root of five. Now, these are still not like radicals. So I cannot do anything to further simplify this, okay? So sometimes that's gonna be the case. You're gonna go through this and it, what started out as you didn't have like radicals, you end up with not like radicals. That's just how these problems play out. In other cases, you'll be able to simplify and come up with like radicals and then do some further simplification. But in this case, we get eight times the cube root of six, plus nine times the cube root of five as our answer. All right, let's take a look at one that's a little tedious. We have two times the fifth root of 96, minus two times the fifth root of 96, minus the fifth root of 256, minus three times the fourth root of 405. So the first thing before I do anything, if I have the same thing minus itself, you can just cross that out, right? I don't need to worry about simplifying or doing anything there two of some quantity minus two of the same quantity is zero. So forget about that. This is your new problem here. Now, without even doing any simplifying, I can notice here that I have an index of five and an index of four. In most cases, you're not gonna be able to do a lot to simplify because the indexes are different. If the indexes are the same, you've got a high chance of being able to combine those with like radicals. That's usually how they write the problems. When you see different indexes, a lot of times they won't combine in the end. But let's go ahead and give it a shot. So I've got negative fifth root of 256. Let's just think about simplifying that to start. So what is 256? A lot of you should know at this point that that is two to the eighth power. Okay, so two to the eighth power. Now, if my index is a five, just think about writing this as two to the fifth power times two cubed, All right? This is equal to two to the eighth power, which is equal to what? 256. So I start thinking about this in terms of exponents and I can say, well, this right here, two to the fifth power, which is 32, if I had the fifth root of that, I could simplify. So let me write to kind of complete this, minus three times the fourth root of 405 and put equals. And I'm going to break this part up into negative 
and then we'll have the fifth root of 32 times the fifth root of what? If this was two to the fifth power, then I know I was multiplying that by two cubed or eight. So the fifth root of eight, then minus. Now I have this three and I've got the fourth root of 405. So 405 is another one that you might not work with it that often. You know, I notice that it ends in a five, so I know it will be divisible by five. And essentially it would be what? Five times 81, 81. Now 81 can be thought of as what? Three to the fourth power. You know, we think about what? Three times three is nine, nine times three is 27, 27 times three is 81. So I can break this guy down into the fourth root of what, 81 times the fourth root of five. And I can do some simplifying here and just say that, okay, we know that this is negative out in front. You could write negative one if that makes you feel more comfortable. But I'll just put a negative. I know the fifth root of 32 is two. So let's put negative two and then times the fifth root of eight. Nothing else I can do with that. Then minus, I've got this three here and we have the fourth root of 81. I know that that's three, right? Three to the fourth power is 81. So the fourth root of 81 is three. So I would have three times three. That would give me nine. So minus nine, then times the fourth root of five. Now, is there anything I can do to combine these? No, this is as far as I can go. I've got an index of a five here and an index of a four there right? These are not like radicals. Even if I had the same index, the radicand is different in each case. I've got an eight and a five. So absolutely nothing I can do to go any further. So we just report our answer as negative two times the fifth root of eight minus nine times the fourth root of five. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section five on adding and subtracting radicals. All right, so let's take a look at negative two times the cube root of negative 16 plus two times the cube root of seven minus the cube root of four plus three times the cube root of 16. So what I'm looking to do here is find some like radicals to combine. As it stands right now, I don't have any, but there's some things I can do to make some like radicals. So let's go through and just simplify everything as much as we can. So we start out with this right here. I have negative two times, I have the cube root of negative 16. So let's break that up into the cube root of negative one, right? I can think about this as negative one, and then times the cube root, if I think about 16, I think about it as eight, which is a perfect cube, it's two times two times two, times another two to get to 16. So let's write the cube root of eight times the cube root of two. Let's keep going. So then we have plus, we have two times the cube root of seven, nothing I can do with that. We have minus the cube root of four, Nothing I can do with that. Then plus, I have three times the cube root of 16. So again, I can do three times the cube root of eight times the cube root of two. Now, if I look here, I know that I said that this would be two and this would be negative one, right? Negative one times negative one is one. One times negative one is negative one. So the cube root of negative one is negative one. So I can pull that out and say, okay, I have negative one times negative two, that's two, and then two times two is four. So this equals four times the cube root of two. Now for this one, I have plus two times the cube root of seven. Let me make this three a little better. And then minus, I have the cube root of four. And then plus, I know this is gonna be two, right? The cube root of eight is two. So two times three would be six. So six times the cube root of two. So now I wanna find my like radicals. So what do I have here? Again, like radicals have the same index and the same radicand. So all have an index of a three, but only these have the same radicand. So that's what I can combine. So basically I would do four plus six, which would be 10. So 10 times that cube root of two, and that's all I can combine, right? So everything else just stays the way it is. So plus two times the cube root of seven minus the cube root of four. So again, my simplified answer is 10 times the cube root of two plus two times the cube root of seven 
minus the cube root of 4. All right, let's look at one more that's kind of tedious. So we have the negative cube root of 448 minus 4 times the cube root of 128 minus 4 times the cube root of 7 minus 3 times the cube root of 56. So what can we do to simplify here? Let's start out with this guy right here. So if I did 448, let's factor that guy. So I know that it's divisible by 4, right? It would be 4 times 112. And this is 2 times 2. 112 is what? It's divisible by 4. It's 28 times 4. So this is 4. This is 2 times 2. And 28 is 4 times 7. 4 is, again, 2 times 2. And then you've got your 7. So really, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 factors of 2, or 64, times 7. So 64 times 7. Or again, this is 2 to the 6th power. Now, I know that 8 is a perfect cube, right? We know that. Because 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. But 64 is also a perfect cube because if you think about it, 64 is made up of what? It's made up of 8 times 8. So if this one's cube root is 2 and this one's cube root is 2, then by that process of thinking, the cube root of 64 should be 2 times 2 or 4, right? 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 4 would get you to 64. So another way you can kind of think about that is... If I have 2 to the 6th power here, okay, if I think about how I could write this as something cubed, well, I could get creative and say this is 2 squared cubed, right? So if I took the cube root of that, we know that this is going to cancel with this, and I'm left with this 2 squared, which is 4, okay? So a couple of different ways to kind of think about that. So I'm going to put negative cube root of, again, I'm going to put... 64 times the cube root of 7, and then minus, we have 4 times the cube root. We have 128 there. Now, 128 is 64 times 2. So let's go ahead and put 64 times the cube root of 2. Then we have minus 4 times the cube root of 7. Nothing I can do with that. Then minus 3 times the cube root of 56. So I'm going to break that up into the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 7. Okay, so a lot going on here. So we know that the cube root of 64 is 4. So I'd have a negative 4 there. So this equals negative 4 times the cube root of 7 and then minus. In this case, again, I have the cube root of 64 again. So that's a 4. 4 times 4 is 16. So minus 16 times the cube root of 2 and then minus 4 times the cube root of 7, and then we have minus. In this case, the cube root of 8, we know that's 2. So you'd have 3 times 2, that's 6. So minus 6 times the cube root of 7. So you actually have three things you can combine here. You have like radicals here, here, and here. So I can do negative 4 minus 4, that's negative 8. Negative 8 minus 6 is negative 14. So I'm going to end up with a negative 14 times the cube root of 7. And then this guy just comes along. So then minus 16 times the cube root of 2. So once again, negative 14 times the cube root of 7 minus 16 times the cube root of 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Practice Set 56. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on rationalizing the denominator. All right, so we just want to simplify each. And we're going to start out with 8 times the square root of 2 over 4 times the square root of 5. So I want you to recall from the lesson that we kind of had three things that we wanted to do to make sure that a radical was considered simplified. So kind of the first thing was that if we had a square root, no factor of the radicand was a perfect square. Or if we had a cube root, no factor of the radicand was a perfect cube, so on and so forth. So kind of the typical example I'll give is something like square root of 8. So the square root of 8, we know that a factor of 8 would be 4. 4 is a perfect square. So this isn't simplified because I can break this down into the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. Square root of 4 is 2. 
So the simplified version of this is two times the square root of two. So that's what I mean when I talk about that. Now, the next thing we kind of discussed was that the radicand cannot contain fractions, okay? So if you have a radicand that contains fractions, so something like the square root of 1 16th, let's say, you need to break this up and say, okay, this is the square root of one over the square root of 16. And then of course we can simplify this to one over four, right? Or one fourth. Now, the last one that we talked about was kind of the subject of our video, right? We talked about something known as rationalizing the denominator. So we do this when we have a radical in our denominator. So I'm going to show you on this example here. So 8 times square root of 2 over 4 times square root of 5. Now, I have a radical in my denominator. I have square root of 5. So what can I do to get rid of that? I can have a radical in the numerator, just can't have one in the denominator. So just like we did with fractions, we're going to multiply by a complex form of 1. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of 5. Why would I do that? Well, the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 would give me 5, okay? So essentially, the denominator here becomes 5 times 4, or 20. And then in the numerator, I have 8 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 5. That's going to simply be 8 times the square root of 10. Now, I'm not done because I can simplify between the numerator and the denominator still. Eight and 20 share a common factor of four. So if I divide this by four, I get two. If I divide this by four, I get five. So I'm gonna end up with two times the square root of 10 over five as my simplified answer. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have the square root of five over six times the square root of seven. So again, I have a radical in my denominator. So I don't want that. In order for this to be simplified, I've got to rationalize the denominator. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the square root of seven. Why? Square root of seven times square root of seven would give me seven. So then I just multiply that seven by six and I get 42. In the numerator, square root of five times square root of seven is square root of 35. And there's nothing else I can do here. The square root of 35, I can't make that any more simple, right? Its components are 5 and 7. 5 is not a perfect square, and neither is 7. So I just report my answer as square root of 35 over 42. All right, for the next one, I have 7 times the square root of 4 over 2 times the square root of 6. So before we kind of begin this problem, if you notice that the square root of 4 is 2, and you have a 2 here, well, really, I can just cancel this with this and report 7 over the square root of 6 before I kind of even get started. Right, so it's a lot easier to just deal with that. Now I have a radical in my denominator, so I have the square root of six there. I want to rationalize the denominator or get rid of the radicals in the denominator. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator here by the square root of six. So square root of six over square root of six. Square root of six times square root of six is six. And then seven times square root of six, you just put seven times square root of six. And I can't do anything else to simplify this so I just report my answer as seven times the square root of six over six. All right, so the next one is four times the square root of 12 over the square root of 14. So I can break this up before I start. The square root of 12, 12 contains a factor that's a perfect square, right? 12 is four times three. So what I can do is I can write this as four times the square root of four times the square root of three, and this is over, the square root of 14. Now, the square root of 4 is 2. So I can basically replace that with a 2. And I would basically have what? 4 times 2, that's 8 times the square root of 3 over square root of 14. So I've simplified this as much as I can. And now i got to deal with this radical in the denominator. So again, I want to just rationalize the denominator. And if I have square root of 14 down there, I'm just going to multiply by square root of 14 over square root of 14. So what I'll have is 8 times square root of 3 times square root of 14. So square root of 3 times square root of 14 would be square root of 42. So this would be 8 times the square root of 42. And then over 
Square root of 14 times square root of 14 is obviously 14. And then between the numerator and the denominator here, I can cancel a factor of two. So this would cancel with this. This would be a four and this would be a seven. So I get four times the square root of 42. And then this is over seven. Is there anything else I can do to simplify? No, I cannot, right? Between four and seven, no common factors other than one. And the square root of 42 is what? It's square root of two times square root of three times square root of seven. Can't do anything with any of those. And so this is my simplified answer. All right, let's take a look at one that's a little bit more challenging. So we have 10 plus eight times the square root of two over 10 times the square root of 27. So can I do anything to simplify before I start? Well, I can make this a little cleaner, the square root of 27. So let's write 10 plus eight times the square root of two over 10 times the square root of 27, I'll write that as the square root of nine times the square root of three. Now, the square root of nine is three. So let's write this as 10 plus eight times the square root of two over 10 times three would be 30. So 30 times the square root of three. Now I still have a radical in the denominator. So I still gotta get rid of that. So in order to get rid of that, let's multiply the numerator and the denominator by the square root of three. So square root of three over square root of three. Okay, so in the denominator, it's pretty easy. You've got 30 times, square root of three times square root of three is three. So 30 times three, or I can just go ahead and just write that as 90. Up in the numerator, I've got to use my distributive property. This has to get multiplied by each term here. Okay, so don't forget that. Square root of three times 10 is just 10 times square root of three. And then we have plus. Eight times the square root of two times the square root of three would be eight times the square root of six. Now, is there anything else I can do to make this simpler? Well, yes, there is. Now, normally the common mistake is what? This is addition here. So students will come through here and they'll say, okay, I can cancel you know, this with this and this. Remember, if you have addition, you can't cancel like that. We only cancel common factors. So what I have to do is I actually have to factor something out and then cancel, okay? Again, very, very common mistake. So what I wanna do is say, each here would have a common factor of two in the numerator, right, each term. So I could write this as two times, inside of parentheses, if I pulled a two out from there, I'd have a five times the square root of three, and then plus, if I pulled a two out from here, I'd have a four, and then times the square root of six. Now, what I can do now is cancel between the numerator and denominator, a common factor of two, right? These are factors now. This is a factor, and then this whole thing right here, inside of parentheses, that's a factor. So I can cancel this two with a factor of two down here. This would be 45. And so what would happen is, I'd have my simplified answer, which is five times the square root of three plus four times the square root of six over 45. All right, for the next one, I have five over the cube root of nine. Now you have to put a little bit more thought into these when you have a higher root involved. So a lot of students will make the mistake, they'll go, okay, I have cube root of nine here, so I'm gonna go the cube root of nine over the cube root of nine and say, okay, I have five times the cube root of nine over, so this would be what? Nine times nine is 81, so the cube root of 81. Now, is 81 a perfect cube? No, it is not, right? 81 is three to the fourth power. So what would happen is this would get broken down into what? It would get broken down into 27 times three. So the cube root of 27 times the cube root of three, so this would give me five times the cube root of nine, over the cube root of 27 is three, so three times the cube root of three. Have I successfully simplified this? No, because I still have a radical in the denominator and I don't want that. So if you have some higher level roots, you've gotta give a little bit more thought to this. So then another kind of common mistake, and I say mistake, it will get you the right answer, but it's not really the right way to go. A lot of students will say, okay, what I'll do is I'll just multiply this by cube root of nine over the cube root of nine again. And so what I'm gonna end up with is nine times nine times nine 
or 9 cubed, right? It'd be 729, but that's a perfect cube. So in other words, what they're looking at doing is saying, okay, well, this would end up being 9, right? At the end of the day, because you'd have the cube root of 729 or the cube root of 9 cubed, which is going to get you back to 9. So that's fine. But then here, look at all the extra work I'm going to do. 9 times 9 is what? That's 81. So I'd have 5 times the cube root of 81. And again, I've got to break this down. I just showed you what that is. This would be 5 times the cube root of 27 times the cube root of 3 over 9. And then this equals 5 times. This guy right here is 3. So 5 times 3 is what? That's 15. So 15 times the cube root of 3 over 9. Now, I can cancel a common factor of 3 between here and here. This would be 5 and this would be 3. So I'd end up with 5 times the cube root of 3 over 3. Now, the reason that I don't want you to do that is because you've done more work than you need to. Let's save this answer here. We'll put it off to the side. And let's strategically think about how we can get this answer without doing all that work. Man, that's a lot of work and those are pretty big numbers. If I look at 9 and I just think about this, what is 9? It's what? It's 3 times 3, or it's 3 squared. So in order to get a perfect cube, I just need one more factor of 3, right? So I'm looking for the number 27. So then knowing that, all I need to do is multiply this by what? If I multiply this by the cube root of 3, and then I have the cube root of 3 up here as well, I used way smaller numbers, and I'm going to get the same result. Cube root of 9 times the cube root of 3 is the cube root of 27. We know the cube root of 27 is just 3, so the denominator here is going to be a 3. Okay, what about my numerator? 5 times the cube root of 3, so 5 times the cube root of 3, and then just 5 times the cube root of 3. Now, look at how quickly I got the answer here, doing it that way with just a little bit of thought and effort, versus what we did in the last process to get that answer, right? It's the same answer, but look at how much more work I did the first time around when we multiplied by those bigger numbers, right? So you always wanna multiply by the smallest possible radical because it's gonna save you so much work. I can't emphasize that enough. All right, so now we have three over the cube root of four. So again, I wanna think about what is the smallest possible radical I can multiply this by to achieve my result. Well, if this is a 4, and I just think about 4 as what? It's 2 squared. So really, I want to multiply by another factor of 2, or 2 to the first power, to get me to 2 cubed, or 8. So I think about what? Multiplying this by, in the denominator, the cube root of 2. In the numerator, same thing, cube root of 2. So this equals, we'd have 3 times the cube root of 2 over the cube root of 4 times 2, and that's 8. We know the cube root of 8 is 2. So we're done there. We have 3 times the cube root of 2 over 2, and that's our simplified answer. All right, let's take a look at one final problem. So we have 7 over the cube root of 9a. And again, I want to think about what do I need to get a perfect cube. So if I have nine, I already know that's three squared. If I have a, I just think about that as a to the first power. So for this, I need to multiply by another factor of three. So I need one three and I need two a's. So three a squared is what I need to multiply this by to make it a perfect cube. So then times, we'd have the cube root of three a squared over the cube root of 3a squared. Again, you can be that person that, let me kind of move this down for a second. You can be that guy that comes through and says, okay, well, I'm going to multiply this by the cube root of 9a, and then on top, the cube root of 9a, and then you do it again. So the cube root of 9a over the cube root of 9a. You can go through and do that. You're going to get a perfect cube down there. 9 times 9 times 9 is 729, a times a times a is a cubed. So 729 a cubed is a perfect cube, right? It's 9a cubed. So 
you can do that, but the numerator is going to explode, right? And then you got to go back and simplify all this stuff. So you always want to work with the smallest radical that you can, okay? So again, please take the extra time to do that. You're going to thank me for it in the end. All right, so multiplying by this, in the numerator, I'm just simply going to have 7 times the cube root of 3a squared. Nothing I can do to simplify that any further. In the denominator here, the cube root of 9a times the cube root of 3a squared would be the cube root of 27a cubed. Now this is a perfect cube. So we have 7 times the cube root of 3a squared over. The cube root of 27a cubed is what? 3a. 3a. And so that's our simplified answer. We can do no more here. So we have 7 times the cube root of 3a squared over 3a. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on rationalizing the denominator. All right, so we just want to simplify each. We're going to start out here with square root of 4 over square root of 6. So you'll recall from the lesson that we're not allowed to have radicals in our denominator. So when we see a radical in our denominator, basically in order to simplify, we use a little trick. So if I have the square root of 6 down here, I can simply multiply by the square root of 6, and that would give me 6, right? Square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6. But to make that legal, I've got to also do that to the numerator as well. Square root of 4 times square root of 6 would be what? That would be the square root of 24. Now before I execute that, I want you just to realize that the square root of 4 is 2. So we don't want to execute that. We want to just say, okay, we have 2 times the square root of 6, and that will save us from having to simplify. Now, one of the things you're going to notice is that what? You have a common factor of 2 between here and here. So I can cancel a 2 here with here. This will be a 1, and this will be a 3. And so my simplified answer here would just be the square root of 6, which I can't do anything else with, over 3. What about the square root of 8 over 4 times the square root of 6? So the first thing, before I do anything here, I want you just to simplify this. This is what? The square root of 4 times the square root of 2. Then this is over 4 times the square root of 6. Well, I know this has a value of 2. So I can cancel this with this, and this would be 2. So now we would simply have what? The square root of 2 over 2 times the square root of 6. Now, I don't want this radical in the denominator. So again, I'm going to use my little trick. I'm going to multiply the denominator here by square root of 6. And I've got to also do that to the numerator to make it legal. Square root of 2 times square root of 6 is the square root of 12. This is over 2 times the square root of 6 times the square root of 6. Square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6. 6 times 2 is 12. Now, I'm not done because the square root of 12 can be further simplified. So let's put equals. Square root of 12, I can write the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. Then over, we'd have 12. Square root of 4 is 2, so let's write 2 times square root of 3 over 12. And then one last time, let's cancel a common factor of 2 between here and here. So this would be 1 and this would be 6. And I end up with square root of 3 over 6. All right, for the next one, I have the square root of 5 over 6 times the square root of 8. So, again, I want to simplify if I can before I even start here. So, the square root of 8, I have the square root of 5 over 6 times, I'm going to make that the square root of 4, times the square root of 2. So then I have the square root of 5 over, the square root of 4 is 2, so I'd have 2 times 6, or 12, times the square root of 2. And then I still have a radical in my denominator, so I want to get rid of that. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator here by the square root of 2. So the square root of 5 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 10. Nothing I can do to simplify that further, so it just stays as it is. Then I'd have 12 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. 2 times 12 is 24. So this is my simplified answer here. It'd be the square root of 10 over 24. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2, on rationalizing the denominator. All right, so we want to simplify each. All right, so let's start out by looking at 3 times the square root of 5 
over 5 times the square root of 7. So remember, I don't want any radicals in my denominator. So I want to take a look at how can I get rid of that. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by the square root of 7 over the square root of 7. If I multiply square root of 7 times square root of 7, I get 7. So I'd have 7 times 5, or 35. In the numerator, I'd have 3 times the square root of 5 times the square root of 7. So that would be 3 times the square root of 35. Now, can I do anything else to simplify here? No, I cannot. A lot of students might see this and say, okay, I can cancel this with this. You can't do that. This is the square root of 35, and this is the number 35. Those aren't the same, right? So you can't just go through and cancel that. So your simplified answer is 3 times the square root of 35 over 35. What about the square root of 2 over the square root of 7? So nothing I can do to simplify before I start. I just want to get rid of this radical in the denominator. So I'm just going to multiply by the square root of 7 over the square root of 7. And so square root of 2 times square root of 7 is square root of 14. And then the square root of 7 times the square root of 7 is 7. So I'll end up with the square root of 14 over 7. All right, now I'm looking at the square root of 49 over 3 times the square root of 14. Now, 49 is a perfect square, right? It's 7 times 7. So before I even start, I can write that as 7 over 3 times the square root of 14. And then to rationalize the denominator, I can just multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of 14. So this will be 7 times the square root of 14 over 3 times the square root of 14 times the square root of 14. Square root of 14 times square root of 14 is 14. 14 times 3 is 42. Now, can I do anything to simplify here? Yes, I can. I have 7 and I have 42. Each is divisible by 7. 7 divided by 7 is 1. 42 divided by 7 is 6. So as my final simplified answer here, I'm going to have the square root of 14 over 6. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 3, on rationalizing the denominator. All right, so we want to simplify each. So we're going to start out by looking at the square root of 32 over the square root of 20. So before I do anything else here, I can simplify these to start. So let's just do that. Let's write this as the square root of 16 times the square root of 2. And then over, this I could write as the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. So the square root of 16 is 4. So this is 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. So let's line this out and this out and say that we have 4 over 2 or 2. So this would be 2 times the square root of 2 over the square root of 5. Now, this is still not considered simplified because I have a radical in my denominator. So in order to do that, we use the process known as rationalizing the denominator. So I'm just going to simply multiply the numerator and denominator by that square root of 5. And what that's going to do is get rid of the radical in the denominator. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5. And then 2 times square root of 2 times square root of 5 is 2 times the square root of 10. Now this would be simplified. 2 times the square root of 10 over 5. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at the square root of 3 over 4 times the square root of 5. So anything I can do to start, no, everything is as simple as I can make it. So I just want to rationalize my denominator now. So I'm going to multiply by square root of 5 over square root of 5. And so in the numerator, I'd have the square root of 15, right? Square root of 3 times square root of 5 is square root of 15. In my denominator, I've got 4 times square root of 5 times square root of 5. The square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5. 5 times 4 is 20. And then my answer is just square root of 15 over 20, nothing else I can do to simplify. All right, for this one, I have the square root of 10 over the square root of 15. Now, I can actually do something to simplify here. I can write this as the square root of 5 times the square root of 2 over the square root of 5 times the square root of 3. So anytime I can simplify before I start multiplying, I want to do that, right? I want to make my calculations smaller and less tedious. So let's cancel this with this, right? Square root of 5 over square root of 5 is 1. And I end up with the square root of 2 over the square root of 3. So now I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of 3. So I can get the radical out of the denominator. Square root of 2 times square root of 3 is the square root of 6. And this is over the square root of 3 times square root of 3, which is 3. 
So I end up with the square root of 6 over 3. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on rationalizing the denominator. All right, so we want to simplify each. All right, so for the first problem, we have 8 times the square root of 10 plus the square root of 5. And this is over the square root of 13. So the first thing I notice here is that I have a radical in my denominator, right? So to get rid of that, I'm just going to multiply the numerator and denominator here by the square root of 13. And I've got to be careful here because I have two terms. So I've got to multiply this by this and also this. So square root of 13 multiplied by 8 times the square root of 10, I would have 8 times the square root of 130. Then plus, square root of 5 times square root of 13 is the square root of 65. And this is over, square root of 13 times square root of 13 is 13. Now the question is, can I simplify these further? Because you would think with kind of relatively large numbers, you could simplify the square root of 130, and you could simplify the square root of 65. So for 130, it's what? It's 13 times 10. 10 is 5 times 2. And 13 is prime. So you have three prime numbers there. You don't have any perfect squares. So we're not going to be able to simplify this part any further. What about 65? Well, 65 is 13 times 5. No perfect square in that factorization either. So this is going to be simplified. We can erase that equals and say 8 times the square root of 130 plus the square root of 65 over 13 is our simplified answer. What about 5 plus 4 times the square root of 3 over 10 times the square root of 31? Again, I want to get rid of this radical in the denominator. So I'm going to multiply by the square root of 31 over the square root of 31. So in the numerator up here, this times this would give me 5 times the square root of 31. Then plus, this times this would give me 4 times the square root of 3 times 31 is 93. Then over, I'd have 10 times the square root of 31 times the square root of 31. That's 31. So 10 times 31. Now, can I simplify the square root of 31 or the square root of 93? Well, no, I can't. I saw what they were made out of. Square root of 31, 31 is a prime number. Can't do anything with that. 93 came from 31 times 3. Both of those are prime. Can't do anything with that. So all I can really do here, let me rewrite this. Is multiply 10 times 31. That's going to be 31 with a 0 at the end. So 310. So our simplified answer here is 5 times the square root of 31 plus 4 times the square root of 93, and this is over 310. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on rationalizing the denominator. So we just want to simplify each. All right, let's start out by looking at 3 over the cube root of 3x. So you got to be careful with these kind of higher roots here. If I want to rationalize my denominator, I want to think about the smallest possible radical that I can multiply by that's going to allow me to have a perfect cube, right? Because my index is a three. So to think about this, I've got three to the first power right now. So what I need to multiply by is three squared so that I can get to three cubed and have a perfect cube. So when I multiply here, I'm going to have the cube root of three squared, which is nine. And then I've got that variable involved x. So it's x to the first power following the same logic. I need to multiply by x squared to get to x cubed and have a perfect cube. So I'm going to multiply by the cube root of 9x squared, and i got to do that to the numerator as well to make it legal. So I'm going to have 3 times the cube root of 9x squared in my numerator. In the denominator, I'd have the cube root of 3 times 9 is 27. x times x squared is x cubed. So this is a perfect cube. So I'm going to end up with 3 times the cube root of 9x squared over the cube root of 27x cubed is going to be 3x. Now, I can cancel this 3 with this 3. And what I'm left with here is the cube root of 9x squared over just x. All right, for the last one, let's look at u over the fourth root of 216u. So again, let's think about, this is the fourth root. Start out with 216. If I broke that down, what is that? 
Well, 216 is actually a perfect cube. It's 6 times 6 times 6. So if I multiply, and if it's already 6 cubed, to get to a perfect fourth, I need to just multiply by 6 to the first power. Right? So when I do this, I'm going to multiply by the fourth root of 6, and then I have u to the first power, so I need to multiply by u cubed to get to u to the fourth. So let's do u cubed there. All right, so once I've done that, let's also do that to the numerator. And again, you want to do processes like this because if you went through and just said, okay, I, I want to do the fourth root of 216u times, you know, that three more times, you're going to get a really, really big number. Yeah, you're going to get a perfect fourth, but, you know, you don't want to go through something that tedious. You want to make it nice and small and easy to work with, as easy as possible. So multiplying here, if I have u times the fourth root of 6u cubed, I just have u times the fourth root of 6u cubed. This is over. Down here, 216 times 6 is 1,296. So this would be the fourth root of 1,296, and then u cubed times u is u to the fourth. So then to simplify this further, the top part, the numerator, u times the fourth root of 6u cubed over the fourth root of 1,296 is going to be 6. The fourth root of u to the fourth is u. Now, I can cancel the u between here and here, right, between numerator and denominator. And my simplified answer is going to be the fourth root of 6u cubed, nothing I can do with that, over 6. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 57. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on further operations with radicals. All right, so let's just start out by looking at the first problem. And all we're trying to do here is just simplify as much as we can. So if I have 4 times the square root of 3 times the quantity, the square root of 6x plus 3x squared. All I would do to start out is just use my distributive property. So this guy times this guy. So 4 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 6x, I would write as 4 times the square root of 18x. Now 18 has a factor that's a perfect square, so we could simplify this further, and we'll do that in a minute. For right now, I'm going to put plus, and again, I'm going to use my distributive property. I'll have 4 times 3 times x squared times the square root of 3. So really, I'll put 12x squared times the square root of 3. So now I'm going to think about this right here, because I can't really do anything with that. So the square root of 18x, I can think about this as what? Square root of 9 times the square root of 2x. This is 3. So I could just say I have 3 times 4, or 12, times the square root of 2x, and then plus... 12x squared times the square root of 3. All right, let me erase that. And this is going to be our simplified answer. Right? I can't do anything else here. 12 times the square root of 2x plus 12x squared times the square root of 3. What about the square root of 5 times the quantity? Square root of 5 plus square root of 6. Look at I'm going to use my distributive property. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5. And then square root of 5 times square root of 6 I could write as plus square root of 30. This is as simple as I can make this. I can't simplify the square root of 30 any further, and I can't combine 5 with the square root of 30. So it's just 5 plus the square root of 30 as our simplified answer. All right, what about something like this? We have the quantity negative 7 times the square root of 2 minus the square root of 6a. This is multiplied by the quantity negative 7 times the square root of 2a minus the square root of 6. So these terms are different. A lot of you will look at that and say, well, you know, this is going to be done using a special products formula. Well, it's not because these are different, right? It's not something that we can use one of those formulas on. So we have to use just straight FOIL. So the first term times the first term. So negative 7 times negative 7 is 49. Square root of 2 times square root of 2a. I can think about that as the square root of 4a, which would be what? It would be 2 times the square root of a. So 49 times 2 times the square root of a. Now, 49 times 2 is going to give me 98. So let's just go ahead and report this as 98 times the square root of a. Then I want to do my outer. So I have negative 7 times square root of 2 times negative 
square root of 6. Negative times negative is going to give me a positive, and then I'd have 7. Now think about this, square root of 2 times square root of 6. If you have the square root of 2 times the square root of, I'm going to break 6 down, square root of 3 times square root of 2. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2, so 7 times 2 would be 14. So plus 14 times the square root of 3. All right, the next, what I want to do is the inside. So I have a negative square root of 6a times a negative 7 times square root of 2a. So negative times negative is positive, and then we have a 7. Now, square root of 6a times square root of 2a. That would give me what? Square root of 2 times square root of 3 times square root of a times square root of 2 times square root of a. I'm just completely breaking this down. Square root of a times square root of a is a. And then square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. 2 times 7 is 14. So this is 14a times the square root of 3. Then for the last, I have negative square root of 6a times negative square root of 6. So that's a positive. Square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6. And then I'll just have the square root of a that's left. Now, can I combine anything? Yes, I can. If I look at this, I have like radicals here and here, and I also have like radicals here and here. But I'm going to have a problem combining those, and I'll explain that in a second. But for right now, what is 98 plus 6? Well, that's going to be 104. So this would be 104 times the square root of A. So those combine. Now, we have like radicals here and here, but the problem is... I don't have like terms with what's multiplying the radicals, right? So if I had 14 plus 14a, I really can't do anything with that. So I would just leave these as it is and say plus 14 times square root of 3 plus 14a times square root of 3. And this is my simplified answer. 104 times the square root of a plus 14 times the square root of 3 plus 14a times the square root of 3. All right, let's look at one where we can use our special products formulas. So we have the quantity 7 minus the square root of 5 times the quantity 7 plus the square root of 5. So I have a 7 here and here. I have the square root of 5 here and here. And I have different signs, right? If I look, I have a negative and a positive. So I just square the first guy. Square 7, I get 49. And I subtract away the square of the second guy. Square the square root of 5, and you get 5. So 49 minus 5 is 44, and that's going to be our answer here. All right, let's take a look at another one like that. So we have the quantity 2x squared plus the square root of 9a. This is multiplied by the quantity 2x squared minus the square root of 9a. So again, if I want to think about this, I have 2x squared here and here, and then I have the square root of 9a here and here, and then my signs are different. This is a positive, and this is a negative, okay? So what I want to do here is just take this guy, 2x squared, and square it. So that's going to give me 4x to the fourth power. And then minus, I'm going to take this guy and square it. Square root of 9a squared would be 9a. And that's it. I can't simplify any further. I would just have 4x to the fourth power minus 9a. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So we have the quantity square root of x plus 3, and this is squared. So this follows our x plus y, that quantity squared, that formula, which is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So I'm just going to square the first thing. Square root of x squared is x plus 2 times this times this. So 2 times 3 would be 6 times square root of x. And then plus this guy squared. 3 squared is 9. Nothing I can combine there. So I end up with x plus 6 times the square root of x plus 9. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have 1 over 3 plus the square root of 5. So we talked about scenarios where we had to get the radical out of the denominator, but it was a more complex scenario, right? You had two terms in your denominator. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So in this particular case, the conjugate of 3 plus the square root of 5 is 3 minus the square root of 5. Again, to get the conjugate, you just change the sign, right? The terms are the same. So I have a 3 here and here, square root of 5 here and here. 
the sign is different, right? So that's how we get a kanji. Now what's gonna happen is in the numerator, one times three is three, and then minus one times square root of five is square root of five, so that just stays the same. And then in the denominator, I use my special products formula, right? That ends up being for the difference of two squares, right? I have this times this, which would be nine, minus this times this, square root of five times square root of five is five. So nine minus five is four. So what I'm gonna end up with is three minus the square root of five over four as my simplified answer. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have the square root of two over the square root of seven minus the square root of three. So again, I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So this would be the square root of seven plus the square root of three, right? All I did was just change the sign, just change the sign, and then over, we kind of erase that, square root of seven plus the square root of three. So for the numerator, square root of two times square root of seven is the square root of 14. Can't simplify that any further. Then plus, square root of two times square root of three, that's the square root of six, can't do anything with that either. Can't combine these, that's your numerator. Then over. Now for the denominator, again, you use that special products formula. You would square the first guy, so square root of seven, square root of seven. And we would say minus the square of the second guy, square root of three squared is three. So this equals the square root of 14 plus the square root of six over seven minus three is four. So that's gonna be your simplified answer there. Again, the square root of 14 plus the square root of six over four. Well, let's take a look at another one. We have five over negative one plus two times the square root of three x cubed. So the first thing I wanna do, think about this x cubed here that's under the square root sign. If I had the square root of x cubed, this is really the square root of x squared times the square root of x. This is x, square root of x squared is just x. So I'm gonna rewrite this as five over negative one plus, I'm gonna pull the x out, so two x, times the square root of, what would be left is just the three and the x, so the square root of three x. Okay, so now that I've simplified that, what I wanna do, and let me kind of drag this down here, so we have some room, I wanna multiply this guy, numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So the terms stay the same, so I'll have a negative one, and I'll have a two x times the square root of three x, but the sign is gonna be different. Instead of a plus, it's gonna be a minus. And so in my numerator, five times negative one is negative five. Then we'd have five times negative two x, that's negative 10 x, and then times the square root of three x. Then this is over. For my denominator, I use my formula. I square negative one, I get one, then minus. If I square this guy right here, square two, you get four, Square x, you get x squared. And if you square the square root of 3x, you get 3x. So this would be 12x cubed there. This would be 12x cubed. So I can't do anything further to simplify. So I end up with negative 5 minus 10x times the square root of 3x over 1 minus 12x cubed. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. So we have four plus five times the square root of three n squared. This is over negative five minus three times the square root of five n. So again, if I notice that I have something like this, I have n squared under a square root, this would really bring this n out, right? The square root of n squared is n. So I could rewrite this as four plus five n, just pulling that out, times the square root of three. This is over negative five minus three times the square root of five n. Let me copy this and kind of move it down. Okay, so now I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So negative five, this will be plus instead of minus, and then three times square root of five n over negative five plus three times square root of five n. Okay, so let's crank this out real quick. Scroll down, get a little room going. So four times negative five, my first terms would be negative 20. The outer four times three would be 12, so plus 12 times the square root of five n. The inner, 
you've got 5n times negative 5, that's negative 25n, times the square root of 3. And then my last, I've got 5n times square root of 3, times 3 times square root of 5n, so that's plus 15n times square root of 15n. Okay, this is going to be over. For my denominator, again, I can use my formula. Square this first guy. Negative 5 squared is 25. Then minus, if I square this, square 3, you get 9. If I square the square root of 5n, I get 5n. So 9 times 5 is 45. So minus 45, and then n. So my simplified answer is going to be negative 20 plus 12 times the square root of 5n minus 25n times the square root of 3 plus 15n times the square root of 15n over 25 minus 45n. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 1 on further operations with radicals. All right, so we're going to start out by looking at the square root of 3 times the quantity 4 plus 4 times the square root of 2. So I'm just going to use my distributive property here. I'm going to multiply the square root of 3 times 4. That would just be 4 times the square root of 3. Then plus, I'm going to multiply the square root of 3 times 4 times the square root of 2. So that would be 4 times the square root of 2 times 3 is 6. So there's nothing I could do to simplify here. I don't have like radicals. So I end up with 4 times the square root of 3 plus 4 times the square root of 6. All right, for the next one, I have negative 3 times the square root of 5 times the quantity, the square root of 10, plus 5. So again, I'm going to use my distributive property. So this times this would give me what? I'd have negative 3 times the square root of 5 times the square root of 10. Now I'd do the square root of 5 times 10 is really what? 5 times 2. So the square root of 5 again times the square root of 2. Now I'll simplify that in a second. So then plus, we'd have this times this. So I'd have negative 3 times the square root of 5 times 5. Negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. So I'll put negative 15 here times the square root of 5. Okay. Now as far as this goes, what I can simplify here is I have the square root of 5 times the square root of 5. That is 5. So I'd have 5 times negative 3. That's going to be negative 15. So I'd get negative 15 times the square root of 2. Then minus 15 times the square root of 5. Let me kind of make that a little better. And I can't simplify this any further because I don't have like radicals. So again, my answer is negative 15 times square root of 2 minus 15 times the square root of 5. All right, let's take a look at another one. So I have the square root of 6 times the quantity square root of 10 plus square root of 6. So again, I'm going to use my distributive property. Square root of 6 times square root of 10. And think about this as what? Square root of 2 times square root of 3. That would be the square root of 6 times the square root of 2, times the square root of 5, that would be the square root of 10. Now I know I can do something to further simplify this, but for right now let's just do plus and do this times this. Square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6. So for over here, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. Okay, so that's 2. Square root of 3 and square root of 5, can't do anything with those. Square root of 3 times square root of 5 is just going to be square root of 15. So I get 2 times square root of 15 and then plus 6. Nothing else I can do here. So that's my simplified answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on further operations with radicals. All right, so we're going to look at 7 times square root of 2 plus 2, that quantity, multiplied by negative 2 times square root of 2 minus 5, that quantity. So I'm going to use FOIL here. So I'm going to do my first terms, 7 times square root of 2 times negative 2 times square root of 2. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14. Okay, you'd have negative 14, but you have square root of 2 times square root of 2, which is 2. So negative 14 times 2 is negative 28. So negative 28. Then my outer, 7 times square root of 2 times negative 5 would be negative. 7 times 5 is 35, and then times square root of 2. For the inner, 2 times negative 2 would be negative 4, and then times square root of 2. So negative 4 times square root of 2. And then for my last, 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. So I have things that I can combine here. First off, negative 28 minus 10 would be negative 38. So negative 38. And then we have like radicals here. We have the same index and we have the same radicand. So all I need to do is negative 35 minus 4. That's negative 39. And then times that common radical square root of 2. 
So my final answer here is negative 38 minus 39 times the square root of 2. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at the quantity negative 4 times the square root of 5m plus 5 times the square root of 6. And we're multiplying this by 2 times the square root of 3m plus 3 times the square root of 6, that quantity. So again, I'm going to use FOIL. So first terms, negative 4 times 2 is negative 8. And then I have the square root of 5m times the square root of 3m. Well, 5 and 3, I'm not going to be able to do anything with that. That would just be square root of 15. But if I did square root of m times square root of m, that's the square root of m squared. That's just m. So I'd have negative 8m times the square root of 15. Then for the outer, I'd have negative 4 times 3. That's negative 12. And then square root of 5m times square root of 6. Nothing I can really do with that. So I'm just going to write square root of 30m. And then for the inner, I've got 5 times 2, that's 10. And then square root of 6 times square root of 3m. Now, I can do something with that because the square root of 6 is what? It's the square root of 2 times the square root of 3. And then the square root of 3m, I could do square root of 3 times square root of m. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. So I'd have 3 times 10, or 30, times the square root of 2 times the square root of m, or 30 times the square root of 2m. Now for the last terms, I'll have 5 times 3, which is 15, and then times square root of 6 times square root of 6. Square root of 6 times square root of 6 is 6, so basically I have 15 times 6, or 90. So plus 90. Now, is there anything I can combine here? Well, I don't have like radicals here, right? And there's nothing I can combine with 90, so I end up with just negative 8m times square root of 15, minus 12 times square root of 30m, plus 30 times square root of 2m, plus 90. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 3, on further operations with radicals. All right, so for the first problem, we have the quantity 4 times square root of 3 plus 2, times the quantity 4 times square root of 3 minus 2. So this we can use a formula that we learned back when we talked about special products, right? If we think about x plus y, that quantity, times x minus y, that quantity, this is x squared minus y squared, right? So we have the same thing here and here, the same thing here and here, the difference is the signs. Same thing here and here, same thing here and here, the difference is the signs. So all I want to do is just say the first thing squared. So let me kind of erase this. The first thing squared. So 4 squared is 16. Square root of 3 squared is 3. 16 times 3 is 48. Then minus the second thing squared. 2 squared is 4. So this would be 48 minus 4, which is 44, and that's my answer. Now, to prove to you that this works, again, you should know that it works at this point, but you can go through this the long way, and you can use FOIL, and what's going to happen is the two terms in the middle are going to drop out, right? They're going to cancel each other out. The first, 4 times 4 is 16, times square root of 3 times square root of 3, which is 3. 16 times 3 is 48. The outer, we'd have 4 times negative 2, or negative 8, times square root of 3. The inner, you'd have 2 times 4, or 8, times square root of 3. And then the last, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. So just as I said, the two terms in the middle are going to drop out, and you're left with 48 minus 4, which is 44, as we just found. All right, for the next one, we can use another formula from the special products formulas. So we have 3 times square root of 2 plus 7, that quantity times the quantity 3 times square root of 2 plus 7. So essentially I have 3, I have 3 times square root of 2 plus 7 squared, right? This quantity squared. So I can just use this formula from x plus y, that quantity squared. This is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, right? So I just take the first thing and square it. 3 squared is 9, square root of 2 squared is 2. So 9 times 2 is 18. Then plus 2 times the first guy times the second guy. So 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 7 is 42, and then times the square root of 2. So this would be plus 42 times the square root of 2. And then plus, you'd have the last guy squared, 7 squared is 49. Now, I can combine 18 and 49. That's going to give me 67. So let me erase this. And let's say that this is going to be equal to, we'd have 42 times square root of 2 plus 67. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 4, 
on further operations with radicals. All right, so we're looking at four over two minus the square root of seven. So to simplify something like this, remember, when we saw things like five over the square root of seven, to rationalize the denominator, to make the denominator radical free, I just multiplied the numerator and denominator by the square root of seven. Right? It was a piece of cake, right? I'd end up with five times square root of seven over seven. Very, very easy. In this case, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's still pretty easy overall. So I've got two terms here. So what I taught you in the lesson is you want to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. Now, what is a conjugate? You might not know that from the lesson. Basically, we leave the terms the same. So the two and the square root of seven, those are the same. I don't do anything with that. All I need to do is just change the sign, right? So this will be plus and this will be plus, right? I change this from negative to positive. Now, multiplying by two plus square root of seven over two plus square root of seven is like multiplying by one, okay? It's the same non-zero value over itself. So it is one. So I'm not changing the value of this. So now, if we just crank this out, I use my distributive property in the numerator. Four times two is eight, plus four times square root of seven is just four times square root of seven. In the denominator, I can use my formula from our lesson on the special products. And all I would think about is, okay, I have the same thing here and here, same thing here and here, different signs. So I do the first thing squared. So two squared is four, minus the second guy squared, Square root of seven squared is just seven. So this ends up being eight plus four times the square root of seven over four minus seven is negative three, so negative three. And then you could write this in a bunch of different ways. You could write, you know, negative out in front and then eight plus four times square root of seven over three. Or, you know, you could make each term of the numerator negative and keep the denominator positive. So you could write negative eight minus four times square root of seven over three. A lot, a lot of different ways to write that. So as long as you realize that fundamentally this is the answer, right? And you can change that based on that sign as much as you want, you're pretty much good to go. So let me just read the answer off as negative eight minus four times the square root of seven over three. All right, let's take a look at another one. So what if you had the square root of five plus the square root of two over the square root of three minus the square root of 11? So again, I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. So square root of three plus square root of 11. I kept the terms the same, square root of three and square root of 11. Those are the same. I just changed the sign, right? From negative to positive. That's all you gotta do. Very, very simple. Okay. so. If I was to multiply here, I'm gonna use FOIL, right? I've got two terms here, two terms here. So the first, square root of five times square root of three is gonna give me square root of 15. The outer, square root of five times square root of 11 is plus square root of 55. The inner, square root of two times square root of three is plus square root of six. And then the last, square root of two times square root of 11 is plus square root of 22. Now I can't combine or simplify any of those, right? I'm pretty much stuck with that. Now for my denominator, I'm gonna square the square root of three, that's three. Then minus, I'm gonna square the square root of 11, that's 11. So three minus 11 is negative eight. So again, we come into the scenario where I can write this a bunch of different ways, right? I can put a negative out in front, or I can make you know, each term of the numerator negative and the denominator positive, whatever you wanna do, right? I'm just gonna stop here let you do that if you want. I'm just gonna report my answer as a square root of 15 plus a square root of 55 plus a square root of six plus a square root of 22 over negative eight. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section five on further operations with radicals. All right, so we wanna simplify. And for the first problem we're gonna look at, we have four n plus five times the square root of three n squared, and then this is over, we have two minus four times the square root of five n. Now the first thing that kind of jumps out at me is the fact that I have this n squared here that's underneath that square root symbol. We know that we can simplify that, right? The square root of n squared is just n. So let's, let's kind of rewrite this as four n 
plus 5 times, I'm going to break this up into the square root of 30 times the square root of n squared. Again, we know we can simplify this part. This is over. We have 2 minus 4 times the square root of 5n. Okay, so again, we know we can simplify this, so let's rewrite this at this point. We'll put equals, we have 4n plus 5. I know the square root of n squared would be n, so 5n, then times the square root of 3. Now for the denominator, that's going to be the same, so just 2 minus 4 times the square root of 5n. Now just looking at this, we think about, is there anything else that I need to do for this to be simplified? And the answer is yes, there's something else I need to do. We have a radical in the denominator. Remember, when your answer is simplified, there can't be a radical in the denominator. It's one of the rules. So in this particular case, we have a radical in the denominator, and the denominator consists of two terms. So it's a little bit more complicated to get rid of it, but I taught you how to do this in the lesson. Recall that if you have two terms in your denominator, and you need to rationalize, what you're gonna do is you're gonna multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator, okay? The conjugate of the denominator. So what we do to get the conjugate is we leave the terms the same. So I have a two here, that's gonna stay the same. I have a four times the square root of five n, that's gonna stay the same. The only difference will be the sign. So here I have a minus, so for the conjugate, I'm gonna have a plus. And realize what I'm doing here. I have the same thing over itself, and so that's gonna be equal to one. I multiply by one, I'm not changing the value. In this case, I'm just gonna change what it looks like. Okay, so let's scroll down and get a little room, and we're gonna do our multiplication. So I'm gonna use FOIL for the top part here. So let's go ahead and crank this out. The first part would be 4n times two, that would be 8n. Then the outer, we'd have 4n times 4 times square root of 5n. So 4n times 4 is 16n, and then times that square root of 5n. Then we have the inside, so we have 5n times square root of 3 times 2. So it would be plus 10n times the square root of 3. And then for the last terms, we have 5n times square root of 3 times 4 times square root of 5n. So 5n times 4 is 20n, so plus 20n, and then times the square root of 3 times 5n is 15n, so 15n. Okay, so that's my numerator there. Nothing I can do to you know combine things or simplify any further in the numerator, so we're moving on to the denominator. Now, if you notice, we can use a special products formula for the denominator. I have the same term here and here. I have the same term here and here, and I have different signs, right? I have a minus and I have a plus. So what does that remind you of? Well, when we looked at x plus y, that quantity, times x minus y, that quantity, we squared the first guy, this is x squared, subtract it away, we squared the second guy. So x squared minus y squared. We use the same trick here, right? The two middle terms would drop out, so we use the same trick. All right, so if I square the first thing, which is two, I would get four. Then minus, if I square the second guy, okay, if I square four, I'd get 16. If I square the square root of 5n, if I square the square root of 5n, then what would I get? Well, we know at this point that this would cancel with this, and I'm left with this. So I'd have 16 times 5n, 16 times 5 is 80, so this would basically be 80n. So we're not done yet because there's more that we can do. If I look at this, I notice that every number involved in this thing is even. All right? If I look at 8, 16, 10, 20, 4, and 80, they're all even numbers. So I know that I can pull a 2 out from the numerator, right? Every, every term in the numerator and every term in the denominator, and I can cancel that. Now, the other thing that you might wanna look for is the fact that the numerator, everything has an n, right? I have an n, an n, an n, and an n. But in the denominator, I only have an n that's next to the 80, right? That term 80n. 
So I'm not going to be able to do anything with that. So it looks like the best I can do is just factor out a 2. So factor out a 2 from the numerator and from the denominator and cancel it. So if I factor out a 2 from the numerator, this would be 2 times the quantity. We'd have 4n plus 8n times the square root of 5n plus 5n times the square root of 3 plus 10n times the square root of 15n. And this would be over. If I factor out a 2 from here, instead of 4, that would be 2. Minus, instead of 80n, that would be 40n. Okay. We'll go ahead and cancel this between numerator and denominator. And we can go ahead and write our simplified answer as 4n plus 8n times the square root of 5n plus 5n times the square root of 3 plus 10n times the square root of 15n. And then this is all over 2 minus 40n. All right, so for the next one, I'm looking at 5x minus 5 times the square root of 5x squared. And this is over 4x plus the square root of 2x to the fourth power. So again, what I notice right away is I have the square root of, and then I have this x squared under that. I have the square root of, and then I have an x to the fourth power under that. I know I can simplify those very, very quickly, right? So let's rewrite 5x minus 5. I know the square root of x squared is x. So I can pull this outside of that square root symbol and just put x. And then times what's left, which is that square root of 5. So square root of 5, and then over. Here I'd have 4x plus... Same thing here. I know the square root, the square root of x to the fourth power is x squared. And that one you might not know off the top of your head. But again, if you just kind of write things down, so let's say I had x to the fourth power, it's what? It's x times x times x times x. Well, I know very quickly that that's what? It's x squared times x squared. And when we get to fractional exponents, you know, not in the next lesson, but the lesson after that, you're going to be able to do this very, very quickly, okay? But for right now, you can kind of just do the basics and kind of visualize what's going on to simplify something like this. We know that x squared times x squared will give me x to the fourth power, so the square root of x to the fourth power is x squared. Okay, so this can be pulled outside of the square root symbol, and what I'm left with is the square root of 2. Now, is this simplified? No, it is not, because I have the square root of 2 here. I can't have a radical in the denominator. And again, if you have a situation where you have two terms in your denominator, and at least one of them is a radical, you can use this little technique we talked about. You're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator, and that's going to give you a radical-free denominator. So let's just copy the numerator. And this is over for my denominator. And we're going to go ahead and multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Now, I just told you what this was, and we talked about it in the lesson. Essentially, all you need to do is keep the terms the same. So I have 4x. I'm going to have 4x. I have x squared times square root of 2. I'm going to have x squared times square root of 2. So the terms are the same. What's going to change is just the sign. Okay, so this is a plus. So it's going to be a minus. And essentially all you're doing is you're enabling yourself to be able to square the first term and then subtract away the square of the second term so that square root, okay, is going to drop out and you're radical free. Right? Remember that formula for special products, the middle two terms there are going to eliminate themselves. And so again, you're going to be radical free. All right, so let's go ahead and crank this out. Pretty easy from this point. The first terms, 5x times 4x would be 20x squared. For the outer, you have a positive times a negative. That's negative. And then 5x times x squared is 5x cubed. And then we have that times square root of 2. So times square root of 2. For the inside, we have negative times positive. That's negative. 5x times 4x is 20x squared and then times square root of 5. And then for the last, I have negative times negative. That's positive. 5x times x squared would be 5x cubed. 
and then square root of five times square root of two would be square root of 10. Okay, now this is all over, okay, all over. For the denominator, I know I can use my special products formula, and that tells me just to square the first guy. So if I took that four X and I squared it, I would end up with 16, right? Four squared of 16 times X squared, and then minus, if I took this second guy and squared it, it's a little bit harder to visualize that, so let's just write it down. So if I squared this guy, x squared squared would be what? That would be x to the fourth power. Keep the base the same, multiply two times two, that's four. Then the square root of two squared, the square root of two squared, we know at this point that this cancels with this, and I'm left with this. So I'll have a two out in front. So what I'll have for the denominator is 16x squared minus 2x to the fourth power, and so we are radical free. But we're not done simplifying just yet. Now, if you look at the number parts, okay, like the coefficient here, 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 and here, we can see that they're not all even, right? And not everything is divisible by five. You have, this is divisible by five, divisible by five, divisible by five, divisible by five, but in the denominator, that's not the case. So I'm not gonna be able to pull any number parts out. But what I can do, if you look closely, I have x squared, x cubed, x squared, x cubed, x squared, and x to the fourth power. I can actually factor out an x squared from each term in the numerator and denominator, and I can cancel that. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I pull out an x squared from the numerator, I'd be left with 20 minus 5x times square root of 2, minus 20 times square root of 5, plus 5x times square root of 10, and this would be over. We'd have x squared down here being pulled out as well, so that would be 16 minus 2x squared. Now, I can cancel this with this, and my final simplified answer, I'm going to scroll down and get some room going, we would have 20 minus 5x times square root of 2, minus 20 times square root of 5, plus 5x times square root of 10, and then this is all over, we have 16 minus 2x squared. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 58. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving equations with radicals. All right, so we just want to solve each equation, and we're going to start out with an easy one. We have the square root of x plus 5 is equal to 5. Now, before we kind of jump into solving this problem, let's kind of refresh our memory on what we learned in the lesson. So in the lesson, I taught you that the first thing you want to do when you have a radical equation is to isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Now, in some complicated situations, you might have more than one radical, and so you're gonna do one at a time. Now, the next thing you wanna do is square both sides of the equation. Now, the reason I say square both sides is because in this course, in Algebra 1, we're dealing with square roots only here. Now, when you get into Algebra 2 and College Algebra, you'll get some more complicated scenarios. But for right now, we're just dealing with square roots, so I'm just gonna say we're gonna square both sides. Now, after that, in a problem like this, you're going to be radical free, and you can go through and just solve the equation like you normally would. But there's one little hiccup to this whole thing. When you square both sides of an equation, you're using something known as the squaring property of equality. So when you use the squaring property of equality, it can produce an equation that has solutions that may not work in the original equation. So you have to go through and check every solution that you get once you square both sides of an equation. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, with this example here, we already have the radical isolated on the left side of the equation. So I can just kind of jump in and square both sides. So let me just copy this. And I'm gonna square this side, and I'm gonna square this side. Now we all know at this point that this will cancel with this, and I'm just left with the radicand there. So I have x plus five on the left side, and this is equal to five squared is 25 on the right side. 
So now, very, very easy to solve this. I just subtract 5 away from each side of the equation, and I get that x is equal to 20. Okay. Now, this solution may or may not work in the original equation. Again, when you square both sides of an equation, you've got to check the solutions that you get. So I would take 20 here, and I would plug it back in for x in that original equation. And if I had 20 plus 5, that's 25. So if I had the square root of 25, is that equal to 5? Well, yes, it is. We'd get 5 is equal to 5. And so this is a valid solution, x equals 20. All right, for the next one, I have the square root of negative 5 plus 6n, and this equals n. And again, if I've already got the radical isolated on one side, I can kind of move into the next step where I just square both sides of the equation. So let me copy this real quick. We have the square root of, let me just change the order around, 6n minus 5, this equals n. And again, I'm going to square both sides of the equation. And so this is going to cancel with this, and I'm just going to have my radicand. So I'll have 6n minus 5 is equal to n squared. So this is going to end up being a quadratic equation. And again, at this point, I've only taught you how to solve quadratic equations that you can factor. Again, if you get something you can't factor, you're going to have to use a method known as completing the square, or a more popular method would be to use the quadratic formula. We're going to talk about those in the very, very end of this course. So for right now, let's subtract 6n away from each side. And let's add 5 to both sides. So this is going to cancel and become 0. So you get 0 equals n squared minus 6n plus 5. And those of you who watch my videos know that I like the 0 to be on the right side. So let's change this up and write n squared minus 6n plus 5 is equal to 0. Now, I've only given you problems that you can factor. So we know this will be factorable. So I'll put an n here and an n here. And just give me two integers whose sum is negative 6 and whose product is 5. We know that's going to be negative 5 and negative 1. Right? Negative 5 times negative 1 is 5. Negative 5 plus negative 1 is negative 6. So we solve this using the zero product property. So that means I'm going to set each factor with a variable equal to 0. So that means n minus 5 is equal to 0 or n minus 1 is equal to 0. Very simple equations to solve. I add 5 to both sides of the equation here. I add 1 to both sides of the equation here. I end up with n equals 5 or n equals 1. All right, so let's erase everything. We're going to go back up to the top and check. Okay, so we had n equals 5 or n equals 1. All right, so let's start out by just plugging in a 5 for n. And I've got two occurrences, so I've got to plug it in twice. So I'm going to have the square root of negative 5 plus 6 times 5 is 30, so 30. And this should equal 5. We know this is true. Negative 5 plus 30 is 25. Square root of 25 is 5. So this would check out. All right, so let's erase this and this. And now I'm going to plug in a 1. So I'd have negative 5 plus 6 times 1 is 6. So this would be 6. And then this would be 1. Negative 5 plus 6 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So you get 1 equals 1. So this checks out as well. So your solution here would be n equals 5 or n equals 1. One. For the next one, we have x equals 2 plus the square root of 2x minus 4. And in this particular case, we don't have the easy scenario where the radical is isolated for us. But again, this is very, very easy to do. If I want to isolate this on one side of the equation, let's just say the right side of the equation because that's where it is, all I need to do is get rid of this 2. And I can easily do that by just subtracting 2 away from each side. So I'd end up with what? x minus 2 is equal to the square root of 2x minus 4. Now, my next step, again, once I've isolated the radical, is to square both sides. Okay, I want to square both sides. Now, here's the common mistake. And let me kind of move this down a little bit. I see this, and I default to kind of this kind of algebra one thing that students do. It's a very common mistake, and I just say, 
This is x squared minus 2 squared. Again, this has to be expanded out, okay, using FOIL or for this particular scenario, we know what this is because we studied special products, right? So we know that we would just square x, this is x squared, then minus 2 times this times this. So 2 times x times 2 would be, we'd have a negative 4x there, and then plus this last guy squared, 2 squared is 4. And then this is going to be equal to, let me just kind of slide this down, if I square this guy, this is going to cancel with this, and I'm left with the radicand. Right, I'll have 2x minus 4. So before I go any further, I'm just going to simplify. If I add 4 to both sides of the equation, and I subtract 2x away from both sides of the equation, this will go away and be 0. Scroll down a little bit. And so I'll have x squared minus 6x plus 8 is equal to 0. And again, I'm going to solve this by factoring. So I'm going to set up my parentheses here. I'll have an x here and an x here. And just give me two integers whose sum is negative 6 and whose product is 8. Well, how about negative 4 and negative 2? That would work. And so we end up with what? Using our zero product property, we would say x minus 4 is equal to 0 or x minus 2 is equal to 0. And we solve each. So we add 4 to both sides over here. We add 2 to both sides over here. And we're going to get x is equal to 4 or x is equal to 2. Let's erase everything. We're going to go back and check and make sure these solutions are valid. So again, we had x equals 4 or x equals 2. So let's just start out with x equals 4. So I'm going to plug in a 4 here and here. So I would have 4 is equal to 2 plus the square root of, 2 times 4 is 8, 8 minus 4 is 4. So the square root of 4 is 2. So this would end up being 2 plus 2 or 4. So we would have 4 equals 4. So this is a valid solution. So now let's check x equals 2. Let's check x equals 2. And so we would have what? We would have 2 is equal to 2 plus the square root of, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0, square root of 0 is 0. So I can just erase this, and I have 2 equals 2, so x equals 2 is a valid solution as well. All right, let's take a look at one that's a little bit more challenging. So we have 1 equals the square root of 10 minus k, then minus the square root of 3 minus k. So looking at this, I need to isolate a radical on one side of the equation. So I've got to do one at a time. I can't isolate both of them, and that's what makes this problem a little bit more tedious. So let's go ahead and just add the square root of 3 minus k to both sides of the equation. So on the left side, I would have the square root of 3 minus k, then plus 1. This would be equal to, over here, this is canceled. So I'm just going to have the square root of 10 minus k. So at this point, I'm going to use my squaring property of equality. I'm going to square both sides. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get rid of this radical right here, but I'm still going to have a radical left, so I'm going to have to do this again. So let's go ahead and cancel this with this, and I'm left with this. So this equals 10 minus k. And then over here, I'm going to use my special products formula. I know that I'd have this guy squared. If I squared this guy, I just have the radicand. So I would just have the 3 minus k. Then the next thing I'm going to have is 2 times this guy times this guy. 2 times 1 is just 2. So then it's just really plus 2 times this guy, square root of 3 minus k. And then lastly, I have this guy squared. 1 squared is just 1, so plus 1. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. And now what I want to do is combine like terms, simplify as much as I can, and then I'm going to do the process again so I can get rid of that radical. So I know that 3 plus 1 would be 4. So let me just write 4 here. And nothing else I can do there. Over here, I can add k to both sides of the equation. 
So that's going to go away, and that's going to go away. And then I could subtract 10 away from each side of the equation. So this over here is going to become 0. And on this side, 4 minus 10 is going to give me negative 6. So I'll have negative 6 plus 2 times the square root of 3 minus k. Now I want to isolate the radical. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to add 6 to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. And I'll have 2 times the square root of 3 minus k is equal to 6. Now at this point I can square both sides of the equation and I will be radical free. Some of you might want to take an additional step and get rid of this too. You can do that. You can divide both sides of the equation by 2 and this would cancel with this and I'm left with a 3 over here. Or if you wanted to you could leave the 2 there because it's just multiplication. You could square both sides and you'll be fine. Okay, so let's square both sides. Let's square both sides. And this will cancel with this. And I'll have 3 minus k is equal to 9. Very easy to solve this at this point. I'm going to subtract 3 away from each side of the equation. And I'm going to have that negative k is equal to 6. Multiply both sides by negative 1. And I'm going to get that k is equal to negative 6. All right, so let's erase everything and go back up and check. Again, we said that k was equal to negative 6. And so I'm going to plug in a negative 6 here and here. So I would have 1 is equal to the square root of 10 minus a negative 6 is the same thing as 10 plus 6. So that would be 16. Square root of 16 is what? That's 4. So let's write 4 here. Then minus. We have the square root of 3 minus a negative 6. Again, that's like 3 plus 6. 3 plus 6 is 9, square root of 9 is 3. So you would get 4 minus 3, which is 1. You get 1 equals 1. And so, yes, this is a valid solution here. k equals negative 6. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. And we're going to look at the square root of 2m plus 2 minus 3 is equal to the square root of 8 minus m. All right, so at this particular stage, I have two radicals involved. One of them is isolated for me on the right side. So I can just jump right in and start squaring both sides. So if I square this side, and again, square the other side, then again, this will cancel with this, and I'll have this. So over here, this will just be 8 minus m. And then over here, I'm going to use my formula. I'm going to square this guy, which would just give me the radicand. So that would give me 2m plus 2. Then I'm going to subtract away 2 times this guy times this guy. 2 times 3 is 6, and it would be 6 times the square root of 2m plus 2. Now let me kind of scooch this down a little bit. Okay, and then lastly, I would have plus this guy squared. 3 squared is 9. So what can we do to simplify here? Well, I know that 2 plus 9 is 11. So let me erase this and put this as 11. And I also know that I can subtract 8 away from each side of the equation. And this would end up being 3. Let's get rid of that. Then I have 2m here and negative m here. Let's add m to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. This side would be 0. And over here, this would be 3m. This would be 3m. So now, is there anything else I can do? No, there's not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate my radical. Okay, So I'm going to have 3m minus 6 times the square root of 2m plus 2 plus 3 equals 0. So I'm going to subtract 3m away from each side of the equation. And I'm going to subtract 3 away from each side of the equation. So over here, this is canceled and this is canceled. And I'm left with negative 6 times the square root of 2m plus 2 is equal to negative 3m minus 3. Now, this is going to be a personal preference. You saw in the last example, I divided to get rid of what was multiplying the square root. 
Okay, you don't have to do that. You can square both sides. But let me show you the common mistake that happens when people leave this here. So if I square this side and I square this side over here, I've got to realize that this is multiplication. Okay, so this is multiplying this. Think for one second about having something like a times b squared. Okay, this, this amount is squared. This is a squared times b squared. Okay, so it's no different here. This is negative 6 squared times the square root of 2m plus 2 squared. That's what this is. So negative 6, that quantity squared, is 36 times the square root of 2m plus 2 squared is just 2m plus 2. But here's where I got to make sure I use proper notation. I'm multiplying this by this whole thing. So I've got to use parentheses here, okay? I've got to multiply 36 by both terms there. And again, that's a common, common mistake. And another thing that I see a lot, what students will do is they will, let me just kind of erase this. They'll say, okay, negative six squared is 36. And then they'll just copy the rest. They'll say, okay, well then I have plus two M plus two. Okay, that's wrong. This is wrong. Okay, so you wanna make sure you do this properly. And if you divided both sides by negative six, to clear that, you won't run into that issue. So if you find yourself making that mistake over and over and over again, you might wanna do what we did in the last example, get rid of that to where you just have the square root involved there and you won't make that mistake. Okay, so for this side, 36 times 2m is 72m, and then plus 36 times two, that's 72. We put equals. For this, I'm going to use my formula. So I want this guy squared. So negative 3 squared is 9. m squared is just m squared. So this would be 9m squared. Then I would have a minus sign, and I would have 2 times this guy times this guy. Now, 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. You'd have minus a negative 18, which is plus 18. And then you have that m. Then lastly, you'd have this guy squared. So three squared is nine. So one thing I want you to pay attention to, remember, when you look at these formulas, these generic formulas, it's set up to where x minus y, that quantity squared, produces x squared minus two xy plus y squared. Again, we've studied this in previous lessons. But notice how x is positive there, okay? So x is positive there, and in this particular case, we have a negative out in front. So it changes the sign of that middle term to positive. Okay, so that's why that occurred. All right, so now we just want to simplify. Let me just copy this, 9m squared plus 18m plus 9. Scroll down, get a little room going. And I know that I can subtract 18m away from each side of the equation. That's going to give me 54m. And I can subtract 9 away from each side of the equation. That's going to give me plus 63 over here. This equals 9m squared. And let me just subtract 9m squared away from each side of the equation. And kind of scroll down and get some more room. And so what I'm going to have here is that negative 9m squared plus 54m plus 63 is equal to 0. Now, if I don't want my leading coefficient to be negative, I can multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. If I do that, okay, if I do that, 0 times negative 1 is just 0. Basically, I'm just changing the sign of every term here. So this would be positive now. This would be negative, And this would be negative. All right, so now let's factor. And in order to factor, I look and I notice that Everything is divisible by 9, right? 9 is divisible by 9, 54 is divisible by 9, 63 is divisible by 9. So I'm going to put a 9 out in front, and then I'd have m squared minus 6m minus 7. Okay, and this is going to be equal to 0. So my 9 out in front, set up my parentheses, and this will be m, and this will be m. And so two integers whose sum is negative 6 and whose product is negative 7. Well, I can do negative 7 
and positive 1. So then I would set each factor with a variable equal to 0. So m minus 7 equals 0 or m plus 1 equals 0. So we solve this, we add 7 to each side of the equation here, we subtract 1 from each side of the equation here, I get m is equal to 7 or m is equal to negative 1. Okay, so we had that m was equal to negative 1 or m was equal to 7. All right, so let's start out with m equals 7. And so if I plug in a 7 here and here, what would I get? Well, 2 times 7 is 14. 14 plus 2 is 16. The square root of 16 is 4. You'd have 4 minus 3, which is 1. Over here, 8 minus 7 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So this is a valid solution, m equals 7. Now, when we get to the next one, m equals negative 1, we're going to have a bit of a problem. So I plug in a negative 1 here and here. So I'd have the square root of... 2 times negative 1 is negative 2, so negative 2, plus 2. So this would be what? The square root of 0. Square root of 0 is 0. So I would basically have just minus 3 over here, or negative 3, is equal to, over here I'd have the square root of 8 minus a negative 1. 8 minus a negative 1. It's like 8 plus 1. So the square root of 9. Square root of 9 is positive 3. Do you see the issue? Yeah, negative 3 is not equal to 3. Okay, it's not. So this is false. And so we have to reject this solution. Okay, we would reject that. So the only valid solution for this equation is that m is equal to 7. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on solving equations with radicals. All right, so we just want to solve each equation. And we're going to start out with 2 equals the square root of x over 4. So our first step is always to isolate the radical on one side of the equation. In this particular case, we have an easy scenario where this is done for us. So the next step would be to square both sides of the equation. So we have 2 is equal to the square root of x over 4. And if I square both sides... Okay, if I square both sides, what's going to happen is this will cancel with this, and I'll just have x over 4 on the right. On the left, 2 squared is simply 4. So we all know how to solve this type of equation. We just multiply both sides of the equation by 4, and so this will cancel with this, and I'll have that x is equal to 16. Now, when you use what's known as the squaring property of equality, meaning when you square both sides of an equation, the new equation that you have may contain solutions that don't work in the original equation. So you have to go back and check this proposed solution of x equals 16 in the original equation. So if we scroll back up here, let me just write x equals 16 there. If I plug the 16 in for x, I'd have 16 over 4, which is 4. The square root of 4 is equal to 2. So this would check out, and it's a valid solution so here we have x equals 16. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have k is equal to the square root of negative 30 plus 13k. So again, the radical is already isolated for us on one side of the equation. So we move on to our next step, which is to square both sides. So I would have k is equal to the square root of negative 30 plus 13k. So if I square both sides, if I square both sides, I will have k squared is equal to, this would cancel with this, negative 30 plus 13k. Let me scroll down a little bit. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 30 to both sides, and I'm going to subtract 13k away from each side. And so this will become 0. And what I'm going to have on the left side, I'll have k squared minus 13k plus 30, and this will be equal to 0. Now, we know how to solve this type of equation if it's factorable. If it's not factorable, it's something we're going to cover at the end of Algebra 1. So let's put equal 0. Let's see if we can factor this guy. 
So I'll have k here and k here. Can you give me two integers whose sum would be negative 13 and whose product would be 30? Well, of course, you could do negative 10 and you could do negative 30. So I would set each factor with a variable equal to zero, and I would solve those equations to get my proposed solutions. So I'll have k minus 10 equals zero, or k minus three equals zero. So I'm gonna add 10 to both sides of the equation here, add three to both sides of the equation here, and I'll get that k is equal to 10, or k is equal to three. All right, so let's erase everything. We'll go back up and check. So again, we had that k was equal to 10, or k was equal to three. So let's start out with k equals 10. So if I plugged in a 10 there and there, what would I have? I'd have 10 is equal to the square root of negative 30 plus 13 times 10 is 130. So really, this would be the square root of 100. The square root of 100 is 10, right? You'd end up with 10 equals 10. So this checks out. For k equals 3, 13 times 3 is 39. And this would be a 3 over here. So negative 30 plus 39 would give me 9. Square root of 9 would be 3. So this would be 3 equals 3. So k equals 3 is a valid solution as well. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 2 on solving equations with radicals. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're going to take a look at the square root of negative x plus 10. And this is equal to x minus 8. So our first step here is to isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Now you'll notice that that's already done for us. So we can move into our next step, which is to square both sides. So let me just copy this real quick. We have the square root of negative x plus 10, and this is equal to x minus eight. And I wanna square both sides. And that's gonna get rid of this square root right here. All right, so if I square both sides, this is gonna cancel with this, and I'll be left with negative x plus 10, or I can write 10 minus x, doesn't really matter. If I square this right here, I've gotta make sure that I either use FOIL or my special products formula. Now, it's really easy for me to use a special products formula. I've memorized it, and you should have at this point as well. You would square this first guy x, so that's x squared, then minus two times the first times the last. So two times eight is 16 times x would be 16x. And then this last guy is squared, so plus eight squared is 64. Okay, so now that we have this set up, let's go ahead and add x to both sides of the equation. And let's subtract 10 away from both sides of the equation. So this is gone, I'll have zero is equal to, we have x squared, negative 16x plus x is negative 15x, and then 64 minus 10 is 54. So we can solve this type of equation as long as it's factorable at this point. Again, when we get to the end of Algebra 1, which is a few lessons from now, we're going to learn how to deal with these when they're not factorable. Okay, But for right now, let's write x squared minus 15x plus 54 equals 0. And we're going to set up some parentheses. And let's see if we can factor this guy. So this would be x, and this would be x. And then give me two integers whose sum is negative 15 and whose product is 54. Well, that would be negative 9 and negative 6. So now that I have this, I can set these two factors individually equal to 0 and solve each equation to get my proposed solutions for this problem that I'm working on. So I'd have x minus 9 equals 0 or x minus 6 equals 0. I'm going to add 9 to both sides of the equation, and I'll get x equals 9, or I'm going to add 6 to both sides of the equation, and I'll get x equals 6. So these are proposed solutions. Remember from the lesson, we taught you that if you square both sides of an equation, the equation you produce may have solutions that don't work in the original equation. So I've got to check these to make sure that they're valid. So let's go back up. So again, we had x equals 9, 
or x equals 6. Okay, so let me go ahead and just plug in a 9 for each x to start. So I would have the square root of, I have a negative out in front, and then I'm plugging in a 9, then plus 10 is equal to, I'll have 9 minus 8. So you can see that's going to work out. Negative 9 plus 10 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. 9 minus 8 is 1, so you get 1 equals 1. So x equals 9 is a valid solution. Now let's take a look at x equals 6 now. So I'd plug in a 6 here and here. Let me change this to 6 and 6. So negative 6 plus 10 is going to be positive 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 6 minus 8 is negative 2. So now you see a problem from squaring both sides of the equation. This solution here, x equals 6, which is a solution in the squared equation, is not a solution in the original equation. Okay, So we have to reject this solution, x equals 6. It does not work because 2 does not equal negative 2. This is, this is false. And just one more time, I just want to say, whenever you square both sides of an equation, you've got to check your solutions to make sure that you don't report a false answer like you would have if you didn't check here. You would say x equals 6 is a valid solution, but it's not, right? It produces 2 equals negative 2, which again is false. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on solving equations with radicals. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're going to take a look at n minus 8 is equal to the square root of 24 minus 3n. So our first step with this type of problem is to isolate the radical on one side of the equation. Now, we'll notice that in this problem, that's done for us already. So in this simple example, we're going to start out by just squaring both sides so we can get rid of this square root guy. So we'll have n minus 8 is equal to the square root of 24 minus 3n. So what I want to do is I want to square this side and I want to square this side. Now for the left side, remember I need to expand this. Okay, Don't just put n squared minus 8 squared. That doesn't work. Okay, I can use FOIL or I could just use a special products formula to speed up my work. Remember this is n squared minus, I have a minus, 2 times n times 8. So 2 times 8 is 16, 16 times n is 16n, then plus the last guy squared, 8 squared is 64. And this is equal to, if I square this, it just undoes the square root. So I just have the radicand, which is 24 minus 3n. And now what I want to do is just simplify as much as I can. So I can add 3n to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. And I could subtract 24 away from both sides of the equation. So that's gone. So I would have equals 0. And over here I would have n squared. Negative 16n plus 3n would be negative 13n. And then 64 minus 24 would be 40. So if I try to factor this, I'd have n here and n here. Can you give me two integers whose sum is negative 13 and whose product is positive 40? Well, I know that have to be a negative and a negative. Let me just think about factors of 40. What jumps out at me right away is what? 8 times 5, right? 8 plus 5 is positive 13. Of course, we need negative. But if I had negative 8 plus a negative 5, I'd have negative 13. Negative 8 times a negative 5 will give me positive 40. So I want n minus 8 and n minus 5. All right, so once we've set it up like this, we know we can use our zero product property and set each factor with a variable equal to 0. So I'd have n minus 8 is equal to 0, or n minus 5 is equal to 0. I can add 8 to both sides of the equation over here and get n is equal to 8, then or. I can add 5 to both sides of the equation here, and I'll have n is equal to 5. Now, we're not done. When you square both sides of an equation, you produce an equation that may have solutions that don't work in the original equation. So you're trying to get the solution for the original problem that you started with. So that's why this is an issue for us. So we have to go back and check n equals 8 and also n equals 5 
in the original equation. Okay, so let me start out with n equals 8. So if I plugged in an 8 here and here, what would I get? So 8 minus 8 is 0. So I'd have 0 on the left side. On the right side, I have the square root of 3 times 8 is 24. You'd have 24 minus 24. That's 0. Square root of 0 is 0. 0 equals 0. That's true. And so n equals 8 is a valid solution. Now let's try n equals 5 n equals 5, and see what happens. So 5 minus 8 is negative 3. And this equals the square root of... Now before I crank this out, let me ask you a question. If I take the principal square root of a number, is it ever going to be negative? No, it's not. The square root is always going to give me a positive number, so I know before I even continue this is not going to work out. Right? There's a problem here. So 3 times 5 is 15. I'd have 24 minus 15, which is 9. The square root of 9 is positive 3, not negative 3. So I get negative 3 equals 3. So you can see this is a problem that happened from us squaring both sides of the equation. Okay, So this is not a valid solution in the original equation, so we're going to reject n equals 5. We're going to reject this solution because this is false, right? Negative 3 does not equal 3. So again, this is why it's so important to take your solutions, go back in to the original equation, plug them in, and see if they work. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on Solving Equations with Radicals. All right, so we want to solve each equation. So we're going to take a look at the square root of 2n plus 6 is equal to 2 plus the square root of 9 minus n. So with this type of problem, we want to isolate the radical on one side of the equation before we begin. So here we have two radicals involved. So this problem will be somewhat more tedious, somewhat more involved. And just pay close attention to what you're doing here because it's very, very easy to make simple mistakes and to end up with the wrong answer after all that work because the problem becomes more tedious. So, because we have two radicals in here, we're going to have to square the equation twice, okay? So I'm just gonna start out by squaring the equation because this guy on the left is isolated for me. So we're gonna get rid of this radical first, and then we'll get rid of the radical that's produced from squaring this side in a minute. Okay, so if I square the left side, this would cancel with this, and I'd have my radicand, which is 2n plus 6. So then this is equal to, I'm going to use my special products formula for this. If I square the first guy, I get 4. Then I'd have 2 times the first guy times the second guy. 2 times 2 is 4, then times the square root of 9 minus n. Then lastly, I would square this guy, okay? So plus, if I squared the square root of 9 minus n, I would just have 9 minus n. All right, so now let me simplify before we go any further. You can see that 4 plus 9 would be 13. So let me erase both of these and just write 13. And then I have a minus n over here. Let me add n to both sides of the equation. So let me just get rid of that. So I would have 3n plus 6 is equal to 13 plus 4 times the square root of 9 minus n. Now, I can also subtract 13 away from each side of the equation. So that will go away. And I would have 3n minus 7 is equal to 4 times the square root of 9 minus n. Now, I can divide both sides of the equation by 4 to completely isolate this guy right here. But I don't have to do that, okay? I just want to pay attention to what I'm doing when I do my next step of squaring. Let me explain why. So if I square both sides of the equation now to get rid of this radical, I've got to pay close attention here. This is multiplication, all right? So what most students will do, let me just kind of show you, they'll say, okay, I got 4 squared, which is 16, and then this cancels with this, so I have 
16 and then plus 9 minus n. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, that's wrong. So let me let me kind of further explain why. If I think about something that's very, very simple, let's say I just have a times b, and this is squared. This is what? It's a squared times b squared, okay? So following this same principle, if I kind of said, okay, well, this is 4 squared times the square root of 9 minus n, that squared, well, then it's pretty obvious to see this is going to be what? It's going to be 16 times the result of this. This cancels with this, and so I'd have times the whole thing here. So inside of parentheses, 9 minus n. So you've got to make sure that you do this correctly, otherwise you will not get the right answer. Seems like it's something that's so simple, you know, when I do it for you, but then a lot of you, when you go to do it on your own, you'll make that mistake, but hopefully you'll catch it, and in the future you won't do it again. Okay, so let me erase this and just leave this part right here. Kind of scooch this up a little bit, and I'll erase this, and we'll put equals. And over here, let me use my special products formula. So I would square this guy. 3 squared is 9. n squared is just n squared. Then minus 2 times this times this. So 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times 7 is 42. So then times n, that would be minus 42n. And then plus the last guy squared, which would be 7 squared is 49. Okay, let me write this a little further down. And let me just keep simplifying here. So I have 9n squared minus 42n plus 49 is equal to 16 times 9 is 144. And then minus 16 times n is 16n. All right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to subtract 144 from each side of the equation. That's going to cancel. And I'm going to add 16n to both sides of the equation. That's going to cancel. So what I'm going to have is 9n squared minus 26n minus 95. And this is equal to 0. All right. So let's bring this down. And I've only taught you so far how to solve a quadratic equation that's factorable. Again, I said this in every video. At the end of Algebra 1, we're going to learn how to deal with the situation where they're not factorable. But for right now, I've given you one that is factorable. And we're going to use the factoring by grouping method. So what is 9 times negative 95? Well, that's negative 855. And then this would be the product. And the sum would be negative 26. So this would be the sum. So two integers that fit that profile. Well, if we factor 855, we find that it's what? 171 times 5. Right? And I just did that by looking at it ending in a 5, so I divided by 5 to start. Now, 5 is prime, so I can stop there. 171 is not. It is 57 times 3. So 57 times 3. 3 is prime, so I can stop there. 57 is 19 times 3. So thinking about this now, so if I look at factors of negative 855 that would sum to negative 26, let's think about that for a second. If I did 19 times negative 45, I would get negative 855, and then 19 plus negative 45 is negative 26. So that's what I'm looking for. So I would have 9n squared, then I could put minus 45n plus 19n, then minus 95, this equals 0. So from this first group right here, I could pull out a 9n, and I'd be left with n minus 5. In the second group, I could pull out a 19 and I'd be left with n minus 5. So I have my common binomial factor here of n minus 5. And if I factor that out, I'll end up with n minus 5, that quantity, times 9n plus 19, that quantity, and this equals 0. So let me erase all this. I don't need that information anymore. And I realize some of these examples get pretty tedious. That's probably not something you're going to see in your Algebra 1 textbook, but it's good to get some practice on things that we've already learned how to do. 
All right, so now I'm gonna use my zero product property. So I'm gonna set n minus five equal to zero. And I'm gonna say or, we have nine n plus 19 equals zero. I'm going to add five to each side of the equation. I'm gonna get n equals five or, over here, I'm gonna subtract 19 away from each side of the equation. So I'd have nine n equals negative 19. Divide both sides by nine. And we get n is equal to negative 19 ninths. Now, because we squared both sides of the equation, we have to check all the solutions that we get. Remember, if you square both sides of an equation, you might get solutions that don't work in the original equation. So let's go back up to the top. So we found that n was equal to five or n was equal to negative 19 ninths. So let's check each one now. So if I plug in a five for n, I'd plug in a five here and here, and I'd get the square root of two times five, which is 10, plus six, which is 16. Square root of 16 is four. So this would be four. This is equal to, if I plug in a five there, nine minus five is four. Square root of four is two, two plus two is four. You get four equals four. So this checks out as a valid solution, n equals five. Now let's look at n equals negative 19 ninths. So if I plug that in, I have the square root of, we'd have two times negative 19 ninths plus six. Now two times negative 19 would be negative 38. So this would be negative 38 ninths. To get a common denominator here, let me make this 54, 54 ninths, which is the same thing as six. So then 54 minus 38 would be 16. So this would be the square root, the square root of 16 ninths. Now you're allowed to break that up and say it's the square root of 16 over the square root of nine. The square root of 16 over the square root of nine, and this would be four over three. So the left side here is just gonna be four thirds. On the right side, I have a two plus the square root of nine minus a negative 19 ninths. So this could be nine plus 19 ninths. And again, to get a common denominator going, I'm gonna write this as 81 ninths. So 81 plus 19 is 100, so this would be the square root of 100 ninths. The square root of 100 ninths. And again, I can break this up. Square root of 100, square root of 100 over the square root of nine. So this would basically be what? Square root of 100 is 10, square root of nine is three, so 10 thirds, 10 thirds. So I can make this two six thirds, and six plus 10 would be 16, so this ends up being 16 thirds. Now, four thirds is not equal to 16 thirds. This is false. So this is wrong, and I would reject this solution, okay? And this is what happens when you square both sides of an equation. You sometimes get results that don't work in the original equation. So you have to go back and check. So your only valid solution here is n equals five. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section five on solving equations with radicals. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're gonna look at four minus the square root of negative four minus four x, and this is equal to the square root of negative 10 minus two x. So with these type of equations, we wanna isolate the radical on one side of the equation first. Now, for this particular scenario, we have two radicals involved. We have this guy, and we have this guy. So I've already got one of them isolated. So because I have one of them isolated, I can move on to the next step which is to square both sides of the equation. Now, in a scenario where I just have one radical and I do this, I'm gonna be radical free at that point. In this scenario, because we have two of them, I'm gonna to need to do this more than just once. Okay, so it's a little bit more of a tedious scenario. So let me just copy this four minus the square root of negative four minus four X. And I'm gonna square it and this equals the square root of negative 10 minus 2x, and I'm gonna square this. All right, on the left side, I know that I need to expand this, right? Use FOIL or use your special products formula. 
And I'm going to use a special products formula. I know it off the top of my head. At this point, you should know it. If you don't know it, it's something I would suggest that you memorize because it's going to greatly speed up your work. So I would square this first. So square the 4, I'd get 16. Then minus 2 times 4, which is 8, times the square root of negative 4 minus 4x. And then lastly, we'd have plus the square root of negative 4 minus 4x, that squared. If I squared this, the square root would cancel, and I'd just be left with negative 4. So let me write minus 4, and then minus 4x. Then this is going to be equal to, we have over here the square root of negative 10 minus 2x, and this is squared. So this is going to cancel with this, and I'm going to be left with negative 10 minus 2x. All right, so let's scroll down a little bit. Now, what can we simplify here? Well, I know 16 minus 4 is 12. Let me just erase this and put 12. And I know that I can add 10 to both sides of the equation. So let me add 10. That's gone. I know I can add 2x to both sides of the equation. So that's gone. So the right side is now going to be 0. On the left, I'm basically going to have 12 plus 10, which is 22, minus 8 times the square root of negative 4 minus 4x, and then minus 2x. Let me make sure that's clear that's not underneath that symbol. Okay? All right, now the next thing I want to do is I want to isolate the radical, okay? Because I need to get rid of it. So I need to isolate this part right here, or I can isolate this whole thing right here because that would be multiplication, right? So negative 8 times that square root of negative 4 minus 4x Let's isolate that guy. So I'm going to subtract 22 away from each side of the equation. And I'm going to add 2x to both sides of the equation. And this is going to cancel and this is going to cancel. So I'm going to have negative 8 times the square root of negative 4 minus 4x. And this will be equal to, let me just switch the order here, 2x minus 22. All right, so at this point, I can do one of two things. I can divide both sides of the equation by negative 8 to get rid of this if I want to. But I don't have to, okay? I can leave it there, and I can just square both sides as it is. All right, so if I square this side, again, I keep talking about a common mistake. Remember, if I have a times b, and this is squared, this is a squared times b squared, okay? Very important. This is multiplication. So if I have negative 8 squared here times this, which is the square root of negative 4 minus 4x, this squared. Okay, so it's multiplication. So negative 8 squared would be 64, and then times this would cancel with this and leave me this. But I'm multiplying 64 by the whole thing, so I've got to put parentheses around it. So parentheses around negative 4 minus 4x, then equals. Again, for something like this, I'm going to use my special products formula. So 2x would be squared. So 2 squared is 4, x squared is just x squared. Then minus, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 22 is 88, so 88 and then x, and then plus 22 squared. And that's going to give me 484. All right, so let's clean this up. 64 times negative 4 is negative 256. And then minus 64 times 4x would be minus 256x. Okay, equals, we have 4x squared minus 88x plus 484. All right, so let's add 256 to each side of the equation. So that's gone. And let's add 256x to both sides of the equation. That's gone. So I'll have 0 is equal to 4x squared, negative 88x plus 256x is going to be positive 168x, and then plus 484 plus 256 is 740. OK, so let's just rewrite this. I like 0 to be on the right. So one thing you might notice right away is that you could pull out a 4 from all these terms here to factor. So I pull out a 4 here, 
I'd have x squared plus 42x plus 185, and this equals zero. So I'll put the four out in front, and we're gonna factor this guy. So give me two integers whose sum is 42 and whose product is 185. That's kind of hard to do off the top of your head because who works with 185, but I know it's divisible by five, so we can start with that. And that would be 37 times five, and 37 plus five is 42. So x plus 37, and then x plus five. Now, I'm gonna set each one of these equal to zero. So I'll have x plus 37 equals zero, or x plus five equals zero. Okay, so I'll solve each one of these, subtract 37 away from each side. You'll get x is equal to negative 37, or subtract five away from each side, you'll get x equals negative five. So now, because we squared both sides of the equation, we have to check all the solutions because they might not work in the original equation. So let's go back up and check x equals negative 37 and also x equals negative five. All right, so again, we had x equals negative 37 or x equals negative five. So let's check each one. All right, so if I start out with negative five, I'm gonna plug that in here and here. So I would have four minus. Inside here, I'd have a negative four times a negative five. That's positive 20. So positive 20 plus negative four is positive 16. Square root of 16 is four. So you get four minus four, which is zero. So the left side here would be zero. On the right side, negative two times negative five is 10. So you'd have negative 10 plus 10, that's zero. Square root of zero is zero. So zero equals zero. So this one checks out, x equals negative five. Now the next one I wanna look at is x equals negative 37. So negative 37. And that's a bigger negative value, so it's a little bit more tedious to work with. So let's show all the calculations here. So we'd have four minus the square root of negative four minus four times negative 37. Let's just start out with this. So negative four times negative 37 is 148. So negative four, you'd have negative four plus 148, which would give me 144. So if I took the square root of 144, we all know that that's 12. So essentially I'm gonna have four minus 12, which is gonna be equal to negative eight. So the left side over here is gonna be negative eight. Now, why is that a problem before I, before I do anything over here? Well, we know that when we evaluate this, it should be a positive value. It shouldn't come out to be negative. So if you're on a timed examination, you could stop there and say x equals negative 37 is an invalid solution, right? You would reject it. But because we have time, let's go through and show that. So we have negative eight over here, and this is equal to, we have the square root of negative 10 minus two times negative 37. So negative two times negative 37 is positive 74. So you'd have negative 10 plus 74, that's gonna give me 64. So what this becomes is the square root of 64, which is eight. Right, it's eight. So you get negative eight equals eight, and that's false, okay, that's not true. So we need to reject this solution, x equals negative 37. Okay, we would reject this. And again, that's why it's so important to go back and check the solutions you get when you square an equation. You sometimes get results that don't work in the original equation. Hello and welcome to Algebra One Practice Set 59. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for a lesson on using rational numbers as exponents, which is also known as using fractional exponents. All right, so for our problems today, we're just going to simplify as much as we can. And before I kind of jump in and start talking about the practice problems here, let's start out by going back to what we learned in the lesson. And kind of the first rule I gave you was that if you saw something like a raised to the power of one over n, 
And then we specifically said that A was non-negative, meaning it was either zero or it was greater than zero. And we also specifically said that N was going to be positive. Okay, so that means greater than zero. So if these two conditions were met, we said A raised to the power of one over N was gonna be equal to the nth root, okay, the nth root of A. So to go from this format to this format, I just take the base and it becomes my radicand. And I take my denominator, okay, my denominator, and that's going to become my index. So very, very easy to go back and forth. In fact, once you do enough of these problems, you don't even need to write this formula out anymore. I would recommend writing it out a few times and then putting it on a flashcard. Keep that in front of you as you work your problems. You get through 10 or 15 of them and then you've memorized this. So if I start out with something like 25 raised to the one half power, what is that? Let's just go the slow way. Well, 25 is the base, okay? This is the base. So that's going to become my radicand. So let's write 25 over here. Now let's make our radical symbol. And what's the index going to be? Well, the denominator in this case is a two. So if my index is a two, I don't need to display it, right? It's a square root and square roots don't display the index. So I'd have the square root of 25 or more specifically the principal square root of 25, which we know at this point is five. So you can see that raising something to the power of one half is the same as taking the square root of that. So once again, 25 raised to the power of one half or 25 to the one half power is going to be equal to five. All right, so here's 32 to the power of one half. So we already know this is the square root of 32, but again, let's just do this the long way. So this is my base here and it's gonna become the radicand. So write 32 there, we'll make our symbol. And then here the denominator again is a two, so I don't need to write a two here, but my index would be a two, right? So I'd have the square root of 32. Now, the square root of 32 is not a rational number. So we're just gonna simplify this as well as we can. I know that there's a perfect square as a factor of 32, right? 16 is a perfect square, and 16 times two is 32. So I am gonna break this up into the square root of 16, times the square root of two. Now, I know again that the square root of 16 is four, so I would just write that as a four, and then times the square root of two. And again, this is considered simplified because I can't do anything with the square root of two. It's the best we can do. So I leave my answer here as four times the square root of two. All right, what about negative eight, inside of parentheses, raised to the one-third power? Okay, raised to the one-third power. Well, you can already guess that raising something to the one-third power is going to be taking the cube root of that number. But again, let's do this the long way for a couple more times. This is our base, and the negative eight is included because it's inside of parentheses here. Okay, so let me just highlight that, inside of parentheses. And so this is going to become my radicand. And let's make our symbol. Now, it's not gonna be a two for the index because now the denominator is a three. So my index is going to be a three. So I have the cube root of negative eight, okay? Remember, we're allowed to have a cube root of a negative because negative one times negative one times negative one would give us negative one, right? So a negative is allowed as long as the index is odd. Okay, that's what we have here. So let's put equals here, let's put equals here, and we know the answer is what? It's negative two. Negative two times negative two is four, four times negative two is negative eight. So negative eight inside of parentheses raised to the one third power is the same thing as the cube root of negative eight, and that is negative two. Okay, what about negative 375 raised to the one third power? 
let's do this a little quicker. We know this is the cube root at this point. So let's write the cube root of my base here, which is negative 375. And I know that this isn't a perfect cube, right? I know that. So let's split this up into three things. Let's deal with a negative. Let's put negative one. We'll have the cube root of that times, we'll do the cube root of 125, which is a perfect cube. And then we'll do times the cube root of three. And again, I'm going through this quickly. If you didn't know that, again, going back a few lessons, what would I do? I'd make a factor tree for 375, and I would sit there and go, okay, well, what are the factors here? And once I discovered that 125 is a factor, most of you at this point, after working enough problems, know that's a perfect cube, All right? It's five times five times five. So if you end up with 125 times three, you know you're not gonna be able to do anything with three, it's a prime number, right? And it's not a perfect cube, so you're gonna be stuck with that at some point. So you would stop here and say, okay, I know this is a perfect cube, and go on and simplify. So let me erase this real quick. Let's put equals. The cube root of negative one is, negative one of course, then times, the cube root of 125 is five, then times the cube root of three. So more simply, I can put this as negative five times the cube root of three. And then that's all we can do, right? Three is not a perfect cube, so I can't do anything else. All right, what about negative? And then inside of brackets, eight over 27, this is raised to the one third power. So look at how this is outside, okay? It is not part of what is being raised to the one third power. So when we think about this problem, just write a negative out in front of whatever you do, okay? Because the answer would just be negative. Now, remember that what I'm gonna do here is distribute this, okay? I have a fraction. So I'll have eight to the one third power over 27 to the one third power. And all that really means is that I'm gonna have the cube root, the cube root of eight over the cube root of 27. That's all it is. Now, once I simplify here, I know the cube root of eight is two, and I know the cube root of 27 is three. Right? Three times three is nine, nine times three is 27. So don't forget the negative out in front. This is two over three. So negative two thirds is your answer there. Now, some of you might have started this problem differently. You might have said, well, what I wanna do is have a negative out in front and then do a cube root of eight over 27 like that, and then have negative cube root of eight over cube root of 27, and then end up with negative two thirds. It doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get the same answer of negative two thirds, right? If you did it this way, if you did it this way, going back between working with a radical and working with fractional exponents, you know, there's no difference. You just use what's more convenient for you. All right, the next one we're gonna look at is five to the power of a negative one third. So I showed you how to do this in the lesson and it basically follows the same format of something like this. If I had six to the power of negative two, let's say, I would take the reciprocal of six, so that's one over six, and then negative two would just become positive. So this is one over six squared, which is one over 36. Now, following this format here, what would I do? Reciprocal of the base five would be one over five. Make negative one third positive, so this is one third. Now, there's going to be an issue here. Recall that if I have a radical in the denominator, which is what I have here, I'm supposed to get that out of there. Right? I'm supposed to rationalize the denominator. So if I think about this, it's really what? It's one over the cube root of five. So for the purposes of algebra one, when we see a fractional exponent in our denominator, we're going to take the extra step to simplify. Now your teacher might not require you to do this. She might just say, okay, we're we're working with fractional exponents. Just go ahead and simplify and you can leave fractions in the denominator. That's fine. But I wanna show you how to do it just in case you're required to do it because most teachers will make you. So let's erase this. And let's just think about rationalizing from the standpoint of this. Don't convert it, just try to do it with it as a fraction. 
what would I need to do to make that fraction a whole number? So I have one third. Well, I could add two thirds, right? If I had one third plus two thirds, I would get three thirds and that would give me one. So always think about what can I do to make that fraction a whole number? Now, how do I go about executing that? Well, what I need to do is multiply the numerator and denominator by the same value that's gonna allow me to carry out this addition. To do that, we use our product rule for exponents. If I multiplied by five to the power of two thirds over five to the power of two thirds, what's gonna happen is when I multiply the denominators, the base is the same. So five stays the same and I add the exponents. So one third plus two thirds we know is three thirds, which is just one. So now I don't have fractional exponents in my denominator and I'm basically radical free down there, right? So up here though, I'm left with one times five raised to the power of two thirds. So that's just five raised to the power of two thirds. Now I showed you, let me erase this real quick. When you don't have a one as your numerator, what that actually means. We're gonna see some examples of that in the next practice problem. So let's just cover it here. If I have something like a raised to the power of m over n, and again, a is greater than or equal to zero, so it's a non-negative, and n is greater than zero, well then this is going to be equal to the nth root of a, and this whole thing is raised to the power of m. So what this is telling me is I have the cube root of five. So this is the cube root of five, and then it's squared. And then this is over five. So you could write it like this with fractional exponents, or you could write it like this using that radical. They both mean the same thing. It's just a matter of what's more convenient for you or what your teacher tells you you need to write it as. So what if I saw something like four raised to the power of three halves? Well, again, to use my example, if I have a raised to the power of m over n, and again, a is greater than or equal to zero, and n is greater than zero, then this is equal to the nth root of a, and then this whole thing is raised to the power of m. So this is equal to the square root of four, and then this whole thing is cubed. So the square root of four is two, two cubed is eight. Now, some of you will say, well, it could also be four cubed and then take the square root of that. You'd be correct. I can do this as well. I can say this is equal to four cubed, and then I could take the square root of this. So four cubed is what? That's 64. Square root of 64 is eight. Now, why don't we typically see it that way? The reason is because if I start out by taking the square root, I'm dealing with a smaller number when I go to cube it. So that's gonna to be to your advantage, especially if you don't have a calculator. Now, if you're working with a calculator, who cares, right? The calculator is doing all the work, but specifically if you have these examples with kind of smaller numbers, you can fly through them more quickly without going through your calculator, right? By just doing it the first way. Take the square root first, then cube it. Or take the nth root first, right, in a generic example, and then raise it to the power of m. That's gonna be a lot quicker in almost every scenario. What about 16 raised to the power of five halves? Well, this is gonna end up being my radicand. And my index is gonna be what? It's gonna be a two. And then I'm raising this to the power of five. So I end up with the square root of 16, the square root of 16, and this is raised to the fifth power. Square root of 16 is four. Four raised to the fifth power is 1,024. Now here's the perfect example of why I don't wanna do 16 to the fifth power first and then take the square root of that. If you punch up 16 to the fifth power on your calculator, you will get 1,048,576. That's a really big number. Can you imagine trying to factor that to get the square root if you didn't have a calculator? It would take you forever, right? If I just take the square root of 16, I've got this nice small number, which is four, 
And then if I didn't have a calculator and I had to take four and multiply by itself five times, I could do that, right? I could get 1,024. But trying to go through it this way and saying that I have the square root of 1,048,576 would take forever. So again, this would equal 1,024 this way as well. All right, what about something like 64n to the sixth power? And then this is raised to the four thirds power. So remember, this is power to power rule. I would have 64 raised to the four thirds power. And then I would have n, which is raised to the sixth power, raised to the four thirds power. So we would multiply exponents. So six times four thirds. So this would cancel with this and give me a two. And so I'd have two times four, which is eight. So what I'm gonna end up with here I'm going to take the cube root of 64, the cube root of 64, and then I'm gonna raise this to the fourth power, and then it's times n to the eighth power. So what is the cube root of 64? Well, it's four, right? Four times four is 16, 16 times four is 64. So this would be four to the fourth power times n to the eighth power, and four to the fourth power is 256. And then we would just have that n to the eighth power. So 64n to the sixth power, this whole thing raised to the four thirds power is gonna end up giving me a value of 256n to the eighth power. All right, what about 27x to the sixth power and this whole thing's raised to the five thirds power? So again, 27 is raised to the five thirds power. And then x to the sixth power is raised to the five thirds power. So you get six times five thirds. This is gonna cancel with this and be a two. Two times five is 10. So I've got 27 to the 5 thirds power times x to the 10th power. So again, for this part right here, I take the cube root of 27, the cube root of 27, and then I would raise it to the fifth power, and then of course times x to the 10th power. This is gonna be equal to, the cube root of 27 is three, and so I'd have three to the fifth power times x to the 10th power, and three to the fifth power, is 243. So I'd have 243 times x to the 10th power as my answer. Let's take a look at another one. We have three times k raised to the power of negative one half times k raised to the power of negative three fourths. All right, so what will we do here? So three, nothing happens to that. For k raised to the power of negative one half, I know that's one over, right? Take the reciprocal of k, so one over k raised to the power of one half times one over k again, right? Take the reciprocal of the base. And this is raised to the power of three fourths. So three stays the same. Nothing's gonna happen with that. k to the power of one half times k to the power of three fourths. When we think about those denominators there, k would stay the same. So I'd have times, I'd have a one over. k stays the same. Add the exponents. So one half plus three fourths. Multiply this by two over two. I would get two fourths plus three fourths, which would give me five fourths. Let's erase all this. So this would be five fourths here. Now, I'd end up with what? Three over k raised to the five fourths power. In most situations, your teacher's gonna tell you that they don't want, again, any fractional exponents in the denominator. So how would I go about making five-fourths into a whole number. Well, what I can do here, since I'm dividing by four, and right now this number, if you think about it in decimal form, it's 1.25. So the next closest whole number would be a two. So how can I get to a two? Well, if I had eight divided by four, that would give me two. So to do that, what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to add three-fourths to that five-fourths to end up getting eight-fourths, which is two. We saw how to do that, okay? What we wanna do is we wanna multiply the numerator by k raised to the power of 3 fourths, and then the denominator by k raised to the power of 3 fourths. And again, using my product rule for exponents, in the denominator, k stays the same, and we have basically 5 fourths plus 3 fourths. 5 plus 3 is 8. The denominator of 4 stays the same. And in the numerator, I just have 3k to the 3 fourths power. So this is equal to 3k 
to the 3 fourths power, and then over in the denominator, k raised to the power of 8 fourths is just k squared. So I've cleared my denominator from any fractional exponents. And so my simplified answer here is 3k to the 3 fourths power over k squared. Well, let's take a look at another one. We have 3p to the power of negative 3 halves times p to the power of negative 3 halves times 2p to the power of negative 1 third. So let's go ahead and write this as 3 times 2 would be 6. You can do that to start. And let's use the product rule for exponents first. So let's just have one single p raised to the power of what? I've got negative 3 halves plus negative 3 halves plus negative 1 third. So the LCD here would be 6. Let's multiply this by 3 over 3, this by 3 over 3, and this by 2 over 2. So what I'd have here is negative 9 minus 9 minus 2 over 6. Negative 9 minus 9 is negative 18. Negative 18 minus 2 is negative 20. So I'd have negative 20 over 6. So this is equal to 6p raised to the power of negative 20 over 6, which would reduce to negative 10 thirds. Okay, so what do I do about this? Again, this is 6 over, take the reciprocal of the base, so p goes into the denominator, and the negative 10 thirds becomes positive 10 thirds. Now, I don't want any fractional exponents in my denominator, so what is the next whole number I can get to? If I'm at 10 thirds, it's easy to think about this. If I have a denominator of 3, what I want to do is I want to get a numerator of 12. 12 divided by 3 is 4. So I need to add 2 thirds to 10 thirds to get to 12 thirds. So I'd multiply this by p raised to the power of 2 thirds over p raised to the power of 2 thirds. And then what's going to happen is in the numerator, I'll have 6 p to the power of 2 thirds. In the denominator, p to the 10 thirds times p to the 2 thirds, just have p. And then 10 thirds plus 2 thirds is 12 thirds, which is 4. So I end up with 6p to the power of 2 thirds over p to the 4th power. All right, let's look at one more problem. So we have 3h squared, j to the power of 1 half, k squared, over 2k to the 5 fourths power. So let's just say we have 3 halves times, and then I have a k here and here. If I have k squared divided by k to the 5 fourths power, what this is is k stays the same, and I would subtract, right? 2 minus 5 fourths, or I might as well say I have 8 fourths, which is 2, minus 5 fourths. So this would give me 3 fourths. So I'd have k to the 3 fourths power, I would have h squared, and I would have j to the power of 1 half. So if I want to, depending on how my teacher tells me to write this, I can report my answer just simply as 3 times k to the power of 3 fourths times h squared times j to the power of 1 half. And this is all over 2. This is simplified. Right? You can write these things with fractional exponents. It's OK. Or if you want to use radicals, you can say you have 3 times the fourth root, the fourth root of k, and this is cubed, times h squared times the square root of j over 2. But the question would be, why would you want to write it like this when you could write it in a nice and compact format like this? That's why these fractional exponents are going to be so important moving forward, especially when we get to higher math, when we got a lot of things going on. We want things to be nice, neat, and compact. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on using rational numbers as exponents. All right, so we're going to start out by looking at 32 raised to the power of negative 3 fifths. So what do I do when I have a negative exponent? Well, again, I take the reciprocal of the base, so the reciprocal of 32 is 1 over 32. And then I just make the exponent positive. So it becomes 3 fifths. Now at this point, you should know how to deal with the fractional exponents that we come across. So the numerator is going to stay as a 1. And then 32 raised to the 3 fifths power. Again, 32 is going to be my radicand. Okay, going to be my radicand. 
to kind of make that arrow a little better. Five is going to be my index, right? That's my denominator here. And this whole thing is going to be raised to the power of three. So let me put equals, and I'll rewrite it because it's a little messy. We'll have one over the fifth root of 32, and then this whole thing is cubed. Okay, so what is the fifth root of 32? Just starting with this part right here. Well, that's equal to two. So what I'd have is one over two cubed. Now we know that two cubed is eight, so I'd have one over eight. What about 243 raised to the six fifths power? So I would write this as the what? The fifth root, the fifth root of 243, and this whole thing is raised to the sixth power. Again, this becomes my radicand, this five is going to be my index, and the six is what I'm raising everything to. So the fifth root of 243 is three, so this would be three to the sixth power, which is equal to 729. What about 16 to the power of one half? We should know at this point that raising something to the one half power is like taking the square root, right? 16 would be your radicand, and your index would be a two. So it'd be the square root of 16, which is four. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on using rational numbers as exponents. All right, for the first one, we're gonna look at 81 raised to the power of three halves. And so what I wanna do here is I wanna take the square root of 81, and then I want to cube that result. This is going to be my radicand. This, the denominator, is going to be my index. In the case of a square root, you don't show the two. And this three is going to be the exponent right there. So the square root of 81 is nine. And then if I cube nine, I'm going to get 729. What about 16 to the power of three halves? Well, again, what I wanna do is take the square root of 16, and then I want to cube that result. This is my radicand. Two is going to be my index. Again, we don't show that for a square root. And this is going to be my exponent outside. So the square root of 16 is four. You'd have four cubed, which is 64. All right, four times four is 16. 16 times four is 64. What about 10,000 to the 5 fourths power? So we would set this up as the fourth root of 10,000. And we would raise this result to the fifth power. Again, this is the radicand, this is the index, and this is the exponent over here. So how would I figure out what the fourth root of 10,000 is? Well, we could factor it. I could start out with, 10 times 1,000, and I'm not gonna go any further. I'm not gonna break this down to five times two. Let me just break this down into 10 times 100, and then let's do 10 times 10, so that we can see that 10,000 is one, two, three, four factors of 10. So this would be 10, and then raised to the fifth power. How do we do that quickly? We write a one, and we follow it with five zeros. One, two, three, four, five. And that's also how you could have figured out this one. You could say, well, if I had 10 to the fourth power, it would be a one followed by one, two, three, four zeros. And I have four zeros here, one, two, three, four. So the fourth root of 10,000 is 10, right? But even if you can't remember things like that or use tricks like that very easily, you can go through and use a factor tree and figure out what the fourth root of 10,000 is. Now, once you do that, again, we get 10 to the fifth power, which is equal to 100 thousand. All right, for the last one, let's look at 27 to the two-thirds power. So again, I take the cube root of 27, and then I'd square the result, right? This is your radicand, this is your index, and then this is your exponent over here. And let me just make that a little better. So the cube root of 27 is 3, so you'd have 3 squared, and that is 9. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 3 on using rational numbers as exponents. All right, so we're gonna look at n to the sixth power, and this is raised to the power of a negative three halves. So what I wanna do here is just use my power to power rule to begin. 
n stays the same. And I'm going to multiply the exponents. So if I had 6 times negative 3 halves, what's going to happen is the 6 would cancel with the 2 and give me a 3. So I'd have 3 times negative 3 or negative 9. So n to the power of negative 9 is what I'd have. And of course, we know how to do this. We take the reciprocal of n. That gives me 1 over n. And we make the exponent positive. So my final answer here would be 1 over n to the ninth power. What if I looked at x to the 16th power raised to the 3 fourths power? Again, I want to keep x the same, and I want to multiply the exponents. So 16 times 3 fourths. Let me just fix this sign here. So what would happen here is the 16 would cancel with the 4 and give me a 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So this would be x to the 12th power. All right, for the last one, I'm going to look at 343b cubed, and this is raised to the one-third power. Be careful here. Remember, this is multiplication. So I'm going to use my power-to-power -power rule, and I'm going to remember that it's going to be 343 raised to the one-third power times b cubed raised to the one-third power. Now, all I do there is just multiply exponents. 3 times one-third is 1, right? The 3s would cancel. So what I'm going to end up with is just b. So let's rewrite this as the cube root of 343 times b. And what is the cube root of 343? Well, that's going to be 7. 7 times 7 is 49. 49 times 7 is 343. So this ends up being 7b as our answer. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 4 on using rational numbers as exponents. So we're going to start out with we have a b squared inside of parentheses, and this is all raised to the power of negative 1 half. Then we're multiplying by, we have b, then a to the power of 1 third inside of parentheses, and this is all raised to the power of 3 halves. So let's start out by using our power to power rule. So a is raised to the power of negative 1 half, so let's write that. a to the power of negative 1 half. Then times, we have b squared raised to the power of negative 1 half. So power to power rule, I have b, and then I'll multiply the exponents. 2 times negative 1 half. The 2's will cancel, and I'm left with negative 1. Let's erase this. Then times, doing the same thing over here, I'll have b raised to the power of 3 halves. Then times, lastly I have a, which is raised to the power of 1 third, and that's raised to the power of 3 halves. So again, power to power rule tells us we keep a the same, and we multiply 1 third times 3 halves. So what I'm looking to do now is just cancel these 3's, and I'll be left with 1 half. All right, so now let's do some multiplication. If I have a to the power of negative 1 half, and I multiply by a to the power of 1 half, I keep a the same, and I add the exponents. Negative 1 half plus 1 half is 0. a to the power of 0 is going to be 1. So I can write 1, or I can leave it off. For the sake of completeness, I'm just going to go ahead and write the number 1. Now next I have b to the power of negative 1, and I'm multiplying this by b to the power of 3 halves. So b stays the same, and I'm going to add negative 1 plus 3 halves. Now to get a common denominator going, I'm just going to write this as negative 2 over 2. And negative 2 plus 3 is 1, so this will be b to the power of 1 over 2, or b to the 1 half power. So we can write this answer as b to the power of 1 half, or if we want to, we could just write what? The square root of b. Either answer would be acceptable, but as we move higher in math, we're typically going to report our answer in this format because it's just more compact, it's neat, it's cleaner. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. All right, so now we have x times y raised to the power of 1 third. This is multiplied by y squared, which is raised to the power of negative 2. So for this, I really can't do anything. I'm just going to write x times y to the power of 1 third. Nothing I can do with that at this point. I've got to deal with this first. So if I have y squared, and that's raised to the power of negative 2, leave y the same, and then go ahead and multiply 2 times negative 2 to give you a negative 4. So now I have x times y to the power of 1 third times y to the power of negative 4. y stays the same and I'm going to add exponents. So I'd add 1 third plus negative 4. 
So for negative four, I could write it as negative 12 over three to have a common denominator. One plus negative 12 is negative 11. So this is negative 11 thirds. Now in some classes, you can just write your answer as x, y to the power of negative 11 thirds. But in most Algebra 1 classes, your teacher is going to want you to simplify, and they're specifically going to tell you that they don't want any negative exponents, and they also don't want any fractional exponents in the denominator. So what's going to happen is, if I go ahead and get rid of this negative, I'm going to do so by writing x over, I'm going to drag this into the denominator, and I'm going to make this positive. So this would be 11 thirds. But now I have a fractional exponent in the denominator. And just like when we saw a radical in the denominator, we took an extra step to rationalize, we're gonna do the same thing here. So I want you just to do it with this in fractional exponent form. I don't want you to convert it into having a radical and trying to figure it out that way. Just go ahead and think about what is the next largest whole number that I can get this to? Well, 11 over three is close to four, but it's not exactly four, right? It's, it's gonna be between three and four. So I've gotta get this to four. So what can we do to get 11 thirds up to the number four? Well, we could add one third, right? 11 thirds plus one third is gonna be 12 thirds and that's four. But we can't just go through and add. What we have to do is use a little trick. Remember, if we use our product rule for exponents, it tells us if we have the same base Right, we're gonna add exponents. So if I multiply this by y raised to the power of one third, what's gonna happen is when I multiply here, the y would stay the same and I would add exponents. So 11 thirds plus one third is 12 thirds. And in a second, I'm gonna write that as four. Now I can't just do this, I have to do the same thing to the numerator, right? Otherwise it's not legal. So I'd write y to the power of one third up here. And so my numerator becomes x, y to the power of one third. And so to completely finish this off, I'm gonna write x, y to the power of one third over y to the fourth power. And again, this is just an extra step that we take kind of in algebra one, algebra two, just to report the answer as simplified. Once you get to higher math, it becomes you know, less of a big deal. Hello and welcome to algebra one test section five on using rational numbers as exponents. All right, let's take a look at, we have x to the power of three halves times z to the power of negative one times y to the power of negative one times z to the power of three halves. This is all raised to the five-fourths power. And then this is over y times x to the power of three halves. So let's start out by using the power to power rule to simplify this numerator. So I would have x that stays the same, and I would multiply 3 halves times 5 fourths. So 3 halves times 5 fourths. So what would that give me? Well, nothing would cancel. So 3 times 5 is 15 over 2 times 4, which is 8. So 15 eighths. Now, with z, I have two of them. I have z to the power of negative 1, and I have z to the power of 3 halves. I could simplify first or I could simplify after. Let's just simplify after and say we have z to the power of negative one times five fourths, which would be negative five fourths, and then times y. We have negative one as the exponent there. Again, you'd multiply the exponents, so negative one times five fourths would be negative five fourths, and then times z. We have three halves times five fourths. So three halves times five fourths. Three times five is 15 over two times four, which is eight. Okay. Now this is going to be over y times x to the power of three halves. In the numerator, if I continue, as I just told you, you have two z's there. So you have z to the power of negative five fourths and you have z to the power of 15 eighths. So let me do z to the power of negative five fourths plus 15 eighths. What I do here is multiply this by two over two and I'd have negative 10 eighths. So negative 10 eighths. So negative 10 plus 15 is five. So this would be z to the power of five eighths. Then the rest we'd have x to the power of 15 eighths 
and we would have y to the power of negative 5 fourths. Okay, then this is all over, y times x to the power of 3 halves. All right, scroll down a little bit. So what can we do? Well, I know that if I have x and I have x, I can simplify. x to the power of 15 eighths over x to the power of 3 halves. That's x to the power of 15 eighths minus 3 halves. Multiply this by 4 over 4, and I would get what? 15 eighths minus 12 eighths. So minus 12 eighths. So this would end up being x to the power of 3 eighths. Now we have z to the power of 5 eighths. Nothing I can really do with that. And then lastly, we have y to the power of negative 5 fourths. And we have a y in the denominator. So let's simplify that. So we'd have y to the power of negative 5 fourths minus, this is basically an understood exponent over 1. Let's write it as 4 over 4. So this would be y to the power of negative 9 fourths. Now, of course, we don't want to leave it like that. I would drag y into the denominator, and I would make negative 9 fourths positive 9 fourths. For some teachers, you can report your answer this way, and especially in higher math, nobody's really going to care. But for right now in Algebra 1, we want to stick to not having any fractional exponents in our denominator. So let's go ahead and think about what we need to do to eliminate this fractional exponent. Well, 9 fourths is a little bit more than 2, but it's not quite 3. So the next whole number would be a 3. If I divided what by 4, I'd get 3. Well, 12. So how could I get this to be a 12? What would I do? Well, I'd multiply by y raised to the power of 3 fourths, right? So let's just kind of drag this over here. Let's say we have x to the power of 3 eighths times z to the power of 5 eighths over y to the power of 9 fourths. And I'm not going to do anything illegal here. I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by y raised to the power of 3 fourths. And again, the reason I'm doing that is so that I don't have a fractional exponent in my denominator. So in the numerator, I'll have x to the 3 eighths power times z to the power of 5 eighths times y to the power of 3 fourths. And then this will be over. In the denominator, we have y raised to the power of, I would add exponents here. So I have a common denominator of 4, and I would just add 9 plus 3, which is 12. You'd have 12 over 4, which is 3. This would be y cubed down here. So we'd have x to the power of 3 eighths, z to the power of 5 eighths, y to the power of 3 fourths over y cubed. And again, I just took that extra step, just like when we reported an answer, where we had a radical in the denominator, we took an extra step to rationalize the denominator and get that out of there. Although that's not necessary in very high levels of math, or you can just leave it, it's not a big deal, particularly in lower level math classes like Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, you know, things like this, we're expected to rationalize the denominator. We're expected to, in most cases, not report an answer where the denominator has fractional exponents, although some teachers will probably let that slide and not even ask you for it, at least you know how to do it. So this answer right here is mathematically the same as this answer right here, right? They're the same value. All I did was I got rid of the fractional exponents in the denominator. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 60. In this video, we're gonna look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on the square root property. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're going to start out with x squared plus 4 equals 68. So if you notice, this problem does not look like the problems we saw in our lesson. And the reason is because we have to do a little bit of simplification before we can get it in that format. So before I kind of show you how to do that, I want you to recall the square root property tells us if k is greater than 0 meaning k is positive, and we have x squared is equal to k, then we can say that x is equal to the principal square root of k, or x is equal to the negative square root of k, which we abbreviate as saying x is equal to plus or minus the square root of k. So what I want is a squared term over here, or basically a perfect square, 
equal to something else, right? Something in this format. So what I can do, since I have x squared over here, and that's a perfect square, I can just subtract four away from each side of the equation, and I'm gonna have that. I'm gonna have x squared is equal to 68 minus four is 64. And now if I take the square root of each side, if I take the square root of this side, and then plus or minus, because of this, the square root of this side, I'm gonna end up with, this cancels with this and just gives me x, is equal to plus or minus the square root of 64. Now remember, this tells me I have two different solutions. It follows this format. This tells me that x can be the principal square root of 64, which is eight, or x can be the negative square root of 64, which is negative eight. And if you plug these in, let me kind of erase all this. If I squared eight, I would get 64, 64 plus four is 68, so that checks out. If I squared negative eight, negative eight squared would be 64 also. Then if I add four, again, I would get 68. All right, let's take a look at another one. So I have seven minus five B squared, and this is equal to negative 173. So again, I want something on the left here with my variable that's gonna be a perfect square. Something I can take the square root of, and over here, I don't have that. So let me start by first isolating this, and then I'll go from there. So I'm just gonna subtract seven away from each side of the equation, and I'll have negative five B squared is equal to, if I subtract seven away from this, I'll have negative 180. Now to get B squared by itself, all I'd need to do is just divide both sides by negative five, right, some basic algebra. So this would cancel with this, and I'd have B squared, on the left, and then negative 180 divided by negative five is going to give me 36. So when you start out this problem, it looks impossible for you to use your formula. But then once you do some basic simplification, you get it to something that looks relatively easy. So don't be afraid when your book gives you problems like this, especially when you're on the section that talks about the square root property, there's gotta be a way to simplify it to where we can use this. So let's scroll down a little bit and let's go ahead and crank this out. So I wanna take the square root of the left side and then this equals plus or minus the square root of the right side. So this will cancel with this and I'll have B is equal to plus or minus the square root of 36, which is six. So what that tells me is that I have what? B is equal to positive six or B is equal to negative six. So let's erase everything and we'll check these two solutions. So again, B is equal to six or B is equal to negative six. So if I plug in a six there, I'd have seven minus five times 36. And this equals negative 173. So five times 36 is 180. So I'd have seven minus 180 equals negative 173. And that's true, right? I get negative 173 equals negative 173. And we know the other one's gonna be true because if I plugged in a negative six here, I would get positive 36. And again, five times 36 is 180. So again, you'd have seven minus 180, which is negative 173. So you get the same thing. Negative 173 equals negative 173. So B equals six, and then also B equals negative six are the two solutions for this equation. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have five X squared plus six equals 51. So again, I wanna solve this using the square root property. I've got to try to isolate something squared on the left side here to kind of follow that format that we have. So we want it to look like this, something squared equals something else. So I'm not gonna start out by dividing by five. I wanna first move the six. So let's subtract six away from each side. That will isolate the term five X squared. And this will be equal to, if I have 51 minus six, that's 45. And now, if I wanna just isolate x squared, it's easy, I just divide both sides by five, and I'll have x squared is equal to nine. So again, don't let problems like this in this section of your textbook scare you. They just want you to use your brain a little bit and simplify so you can get it to something in this format, okay? They're not trying to trick you. All right, so now that we have it there, all we wanna do is take the square root of each side. So 
square root of x squared is equal to plus or minus the square root of nine. This cancels with this, and I'll have x is equal to plus or minus the square root of nine is three. So that means x is equal to three, or x is equal to negative three. Now let's check that real quick. All right, so we're gonna plug in for x here. So we'll have five times, I'm gonna plug in a three for x, and that's squared, plus six equals 51. Three squared is nine, so you'd have five times nine, that's 45, plus six equals 51. 45 plus six is 51, so you get 51 equals 51. So both of these are gonna check out, right? Because if I replace this with negative three, I get the same thing, right? Negative three squared is also nine. So here x equals three, or again, x can be negative three as well. All right, let's take a look at the quantity x minus seven squared is equal to four. So again, this looks more complicated, but again, we saw these in the lesson. Really, I can just think about this as taking the square root of this side, and what happens? This cancels with this, and so I have x minus seven right here, and this equals, I've gotta do my plus or minus over here, the square root of four. So plus or minus the square root of four. Now, square root of four is two, so let's just replace this with plus or minus two. And I've got two different equations that I've got to work out. So I've got x minus seven is equal to positive two, then or we also have x minus seven is equal to negative two. So we've got to think about those two different scenarios. All right, so let's add seven to each side of the equation here. We'll get x is equal to nine, then or. Let's add seven to each side of the equation here. We'll get x is equal to five. All right, so let's go ahead and check this. So I'm gonna plug in a nine for x to start. So we know that nine minus seven would be two. Two squared would be four, so that checks out. If I plugged in a five there, five minus seven would be negative two. Negative two squared is also equal to four. Negative two times negative two is four. So this checks out as well. So my solutions here would be x equals nine and then also x equals five. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have x plus five and that quantity squared. And this is equal to negative seven. Now, some of you see this and you notice a problem right away. And this is for those of you who have already worked through this section, you know that this is a trap question. So let's go ahead and solve it the regular way. So let's say I take the square root of this side and I take the square root of this side. Don't forget the plus or minus. What's going to happen here? What's the problem? This cancels with this and I have x plus five and then plus or minus the square root of negative seven. Can you tell me what the square root of negative seven is? No, you cannot. We haven't figured out how to take the square root of a negative number yet. We're gonna to get to that in algebra two. But right now, we say it's not a real number and we don't go any further. Think about it this way. The result of this, no matter what I plug in for x, is gonna be some value. When I square that value, am I ever going to be able to get a negative seven? No, I'm not, not using real numbers anyway. So that means that the answer doesn't exist using real numbers, so we're gonna put no real solution. So if you see something like this on a test, it's a typical trap question. You have some quantity squared is equal to some negative value, you can just stop, okay? Now sometimes they'll add something after this and put a negative out there and it works itself out, so pay attention. It's gotta be just something by itself squared on one side and a negative on the other that's a no real solution all day long. So as another example, let's say I gave you something like, you know, x minus three, that quantity squared is equal to negative 10. Okay, that's a no real solution also for the same reason. This squared could never be negative, right? Again, in the real number system. All right, let's take a look at one more. So we have the quantity five x minus three, and this is squared, this is equal to 27. So again, we know how to solve this. Let's take the square root of the left side and let's do plus or minus the square root of the right side. So this will cancel with this and I'll have 
5x minus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 27. Now, 27 is not a perfect square, so we've got one that's going to be a little bit messy. If I think about 27, it's 9 times 3. So I could write this as the square root of 9 times the square root of 3. Square root of 9 is 3, so I put plus or minus 3 times square root of 3. Now, this sets up two different equations for us. And the first one I'm going to write out as 5x minus 3 is equal to 3 times square root of 3. Then we'll put or. The other one would be 5x minus 3 is equal to negative 3 times square root of 3. Okay, so two different scenarios to solve. And what I'm going to do here is add 3 to both sides of the equation. So I'll have 5x is equal to 3 times square root of 3 plus 3. We divide both sides of the equation by 5, and we get x is equal to 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5. So then over here, I want to add 3 as well. And I'm going to end up with 5x is equal to negative 3 times square root of 3 plus 3. Divide both sides by 5. So I'll end up with x is equal to negative 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5. All right, so let's go ahead and check this. And it looks harder than it actually is. You have inside of parentheses 5 times. For x, let's start out by plugging in 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5. And then remember, you have minus 3 after that. So minus 3, and this thing is squared, and it's equal to 27. So what's going to happen is a bunch of stuff's going to cancel. This is going to cancel with this, and I'll be left with this, right? So let's just erase this real fast now. If I have 3 minus 3, that's going to cancel. So really all I have is 3 times square root of 3 squared. And just think about squaring 3, you get 9. Think about squaring the square root of 3, that's 3. 9 times 3 is 27, so that checks out. Now if I put the negative 3 times square root of 3 in, all that's going to happen is, in the end, I'm going to have a negative here, and it's inside a parentheses, so when I square that negative, it's going to end up being positive 9. So I'll have positive 9 times 3, and again, that's going to give me 27. So both of these solutions are valid. You get x equals 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5, or x equals negative 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5. Or, more conveniently, you could have used notation and said this is x equals plus or minus 3 times square root of 3 plus 3 over 5, and this would notate your two solutions. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, test section 1 on the square root property. All right, so we want to solve each equation, and we're going to take a look at a squared equals 36. So I want you to recall that we can use the square root property to solve an equation of this format. So if we have k greater than 0, and we have x squared equals k, then we can say that x is equal to the square root of k, or the principal square root of k, or x is equal to the negative square root of k. We often abbreviate this by saying x is equal to plus or minus the square root of k. So hopefully you remember this from the lesson. And to attack this problem, a squared equals 36, you just need to think about it like this. I'm trying to isolate a. So to do that, I've got to undo the square. So I've got to take the square root of each side. So if I take the square root of this side, and I take the square root of this side, I've just got to remember, before I take the square root of this side, I need this notation here to say that I need the positive square root of 36, and then also the negative square root of 36. I need to have both of those there. So what's going to happen is this will cancel with this, and I'll have a by itself. And this is equal to plus or minus the square root of 36 is 6. So this is two different solutions. I have a is equal to 6, or a is equal to negative 6. And you can plug back in for the original equation, and you can see that. So let me, let me just copy this. And in the original equation, if I plugged in a 6, 6 squared is obviously 36. If I plugged in a negative 6, negative 6 inside of parentheses squared is also 36. 
So your solutions here, six or also negative six for A. All right, for the next one, we're gonna look at N squared equals 44. So again, this follows this format here of X squared equals K. I know this is generic here, but again, if I have something squared and equals some number, really all I need to do is take the square root of this side so that I can isolate my variable. So this would cancel with this, and I just have this. And I've just gotta remember when I do my right side here, I've gotta account for the positive and the negative square root of 44. So I put plus or minus the square root of 44. So n equals plus or minus. I would simplify the square root of 44. I would write the square root of four, which is two times the square root of 11. So n equals plus or minus two times the square root of 11. Now, if you wanted to check this, let's just, let's just erase this real quick. I would just simply plug in two times the square root of 11, and this would be squared. I'm just plugging that in for n, and this should equal 44. And of course, it's going to, right? Remember, this is multiplication. So I'd have two squared, which is four, times the square root of 11 squared is just 11. So four times 11 is 44. So you get 44 equals 44. So one of your solutions, which is n equals two times square root of 11, is valid. Now the other solution, where you have n equals the negative of this guy, so negative two times square root of 11, that would work out as well. Just imagine putting in a negative two there. It's inside a parentheses, so when I square that negative, it becomes positive, so it leads to the exact same scenario of having four times 11 and getting 44 on the left is equal to 44 on the right. So let's check this off, and again, our solutions are two times square root of 11 and then negative two times the square root of 11 for n. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 2 on the square root property. All right, so we want to solve each equation. We're going to take a look at 5r squared plus 7 is equal to 132. So in the lesson, we kind of use this to describe the square root property. So if k is greater than 0 and x squared is equal to k, then we could say x is equal to the square root of k, or x could be the negative square root of k. And we abbreviated that by saying x is equal to plus or minus the square root of k. So if you're in this section in your textbook and you see a problem like this, you know that it doesn't match this format. So I see a lot of students just, okay, I'm gonna take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of that side. Please don't do that. Simplify first. You know that you have a perfect square here, okay? So I can get that on one side of the equation by doing some simple algebra, right? So I can subtract seven from both sides of the equation to start, and that's gonna give me five r squared is equal to 125. I can isolate r squared by just dividing both sides by five. That's gonna give me r squared is equal to 25. And then to completely isolate r, now I'm gonna use my square root property. So I have something squared is equal to something else. Something squared is equal to something else. So I take the square root of this side, and then I've gotta remember my plus or minus, plus or minus the square root of this side, and so I get r is equal to plus or minus, the square root of 25 is five. So this is two different solutions. It's r is equal to five, or r is equal to negative five. Okay, you've gotta remember that. And if I plug this back in to check, let me erase all this. So I would plug in a five here. Five squared would be 25. So five times 25 is 125. You'd have 125 plus seven equals 132. You'd get 132 equals 132. And this would be for each scenario here because if I square negative five, it's also equal to 25. So again, you get 25 times five, that's 125. Add seven, again, you get 132. Let's take a look at another one. Let me paste this so that you have it. And so if I look at negative four minus six V squared is equal to negative 388, again, try to get it in this format. I wanna just isolate V squared. So how do I do that? Well, let's add four to both sides of the equation to begin. That's gonna give me negative six V squared is equal to negative 388 plus four is negative 384. So now the next thing I wanna do is divide both sides of the equation by negative six. 
again, so I can isolate V squared. Now I don't work with 384 very often and I'm sure you don't. You could do a division or hopefully at this point you're allowed to use a calculator. If you punch that up on a calculator, you're gonna get that negative 384 divided by negative six is 64. So you'll get that V squared is equal to 64. And once you get in this format, it's pretty easy to see that it matches this completely. I would take the square root of this side and then I do plus or minus the square root of this side and we get V is equal to plus or minus eight, right? Square root of 64 is eight. So let's erase all this. And again, this turns into two solutions, V equals eight or V equals negative eight, right? This is just the shorthand. So if I do negative four minus, I have six times V squared, so I'd have eight squared, that's 64. And both eight squared and negative eight squared would be the same thing. So it's no need to just plug these things back in when you know it would yield the same thing. So equals negative 388. So I have negative four minus, what's six times 64? Well, we just found that negative 384 divided by negative six was 64. So if I do six times 64, I know that's 384. So minus 384 equals negative 388. Negative four minus 384 is negative 388. So the left and the right side would be equal. And so both of these solutions are going to be valid. V equals eight, and then also V equals negative eight. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section three on the square root property. All right, so we wanna solve each equation. So we're gonna start out by looking at 12X plus four, that quantity squared, and this is equal to 400. So all I wanna do, remember I'm trying to isolate the variable here, and it's inside of parentheses and it's squared. So to kind of get rid of the squared here, I need to take the square root. So I'm gonna take the square root of this side, and I'm gonna take the square root of this side, but remember, when I take the square root of this side, I've got to account for the positive or principal square root and then the negative square root. So plus or minus the square root of 400. All right, so over here, what's gonna happen is this will cancel with this and I'm just left with 12X plus four is equal to plus or minus the square root of 400. So the square root of 400 is 20. So we'll write plus or minus 20 here. And this leads to two different scenarios. We're gonna have 12X plus four is equal to positive 20. And then also we'll have or 12X plus four is equal to negative 20. Okay, so let's solve each one of these equations. So here I'm going to subtract four away from each side of the equation and I'm gonna have 12x is equal to 16. I will then divide both sides of the equation by 12, and I'll get x is equal to, to simplify this fraction, the greatest common factor would be a four. So if I divide 16 by four, I get four. If I divide 12 by four, I get three. So x equals four thirds. Over here, if I subtract four away from each side, I get 12x is equal to negative 24, I divide both sides by 12, and I get x is equal to negative two. So let's put or, and let's put another or there. And let's check these two solutions in the original equation. So I'm gonna erase everything. All right, so let's start out by checking x equals four thirds. So we'll have 12 times four thirds plus four, and this is squared, and it's equal to 400. So, this will cancel with this and give me a four. Four times four is 16. 16 plus four is 20. 20 squared is 400. So this one is going to check out. Now for the next one, we would have a negative two. 12 times negative two is negative 24. Negative 24 plus four is negative 20. If I square negative 20, if I square negative 20, I would get 400. So this one checks out as well. So our solutions here would be x equals four thirds or x equals negative two. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section four on the square root property. All right, so we wanna solve each equation. We're gonna look at 
the quantity 9x minus 2 squared is equal to 121. So I'm trying to isolate my variable x, and it's inside of parentheses, and the quantity inside those parentheses, it's squared. So in order to isolate this to start, I've got to undo the squaring, and so to do that, I'm going to take the square root. I'm going to take the square root of this side, and then I'm going to do over here, I'm going to take the square root, but I've got to allow for the positive and negative square root. So I'm going to put plus or minus the square root of 121. So this cancels with this, and I have 9x minus 2 is equal to plus or minus, the square root of 121 is 11. This is going to give me two different scenarios. So let's scroll down here. I'll have one equation that is 9x minus 2 equals 11, and then another equation that is 9x minus 2 is equal to negative 11. Okay, so let's go ahead and add 2 to both sides of the equation here. And I'll have 9x is equal to 13. Divide both sides by 9, and I'll get x is equal to 13 ninths. So let's put or. Over here, I'll add 2 to both sides of the equation. I'll get 9x is equal to negative 9. Divide both sides by 9, and I'm going to end up with x is equal to negative 1. So these are my two solutions, x equals 13 ninths, and then also x equals negative 1. So let's go back up to the top and check. All right, so we'll have inside of parentheses, 9 times 13 ninths minus 2, and this is squared, and it equals 121. So let's start out with that. So we know that this would cancel with this and give me 13 minus 2, which is 11. 11 squared is 121, so this checks out. If I had negative 1 in for x, so times negative 1 there, 9 times negative 1 is negative 9. Negative 9 minus 2 is negative 11. So we'd be looking at negative 11, that amount squared, and that would also give me 121. So this checks out as well. So our two solutions here are both valid. x equals 13 ninths, and then also x equals negative 1. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on the square root property. All right, so we want to solve each equation. And we're going to look at the quantity 7n minus 15, and this is squared, and then this is equal to 10. So if I want to isolate n, I've got to undo this squaring here. Now because this whole thing is inside of parentheses and it's squared, I can just take the square root of this side, and this will cancel with this, and I'll be left with this. So I'll have 7n minus 15. On this side, I also have to take the square root, but I have to consider the positive square root and the negative square root. So the shorthand for this is I put plus or minus the square root of 10. So this equals plus or minus the square root of 10. Now, can I simplify the square root of 10? No, I cannot. There's no factor of 10 that's going to be a perfect square other than the number 1, right? 1 times 1 is 1, obviously, but that's not going to help you. So I just keep it as it is, and I say, well, I have two scenarios. 7n minus 15 is equal to the square root of 10, or 7n minus 15 is equal to the negative square root of 10. All right, so let's add 15 to each side of the equation. That'll give me 7n is equal to 15 plus the square root of 10. I can divide both sides by 7, and I'll end up with n is equal to 15 plus the square root of 10 over 7. Now over here, it's going to be similar. I just have a negative square root of 10. So let's add 15 to each side of the equation. And I'll have 7n is equal to negative square root of 10 plus 15. And then divide both sides of the equation by 7. And I'll end up with n is equal to negative square root of 10 plus 15 over 7. Now, if I reorder this, really I could write this as a more compact solution of n is equal to 15 plus or minus the square root of 10 over 7, right? This would encompass this solution and this solution. And to show you that, let me just reorder this 
to 15 minus the square root of 10. So let's check these two solutions in the original equation. All right, so let's start out by doing this one. You're going to see that the scenarios are going to be very similar. So I'd have 7 times n. So n, I'm plugging in 15 plus the square root of 10. And this is over 7. And then I have minus 15, so minus 15. This is inside of parentheses, and it's squared, and it should be equal to 10. So this would cancel with this, and I'd be left with this in the numerator here. So let me, let me just erase this real quick. 15 minus 15 is 0. So really all I'm left with is the square root of 10 squared is 10. Square root of 10 times square root of 10 is 10, so this checks out. Now, if I was to look at the other scenario, the only change is I'm going to have a negative out in front here, and negative square root of 10 times negative square root of 10 is also going to be 10. So in each case here, we've shown that our solution is correct. We have n is equal to 15 plus the square root of 10 over 7, and then also n is equal to 15 minus the square root of 10 over 7. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 61. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we just want to solve each equation by completing the square. We're going to look at 0 equals 12 minus 7n squared plus 17n. So the first thing you want to do when you use this completing the square process, you want to put all the variable terms on one side and just have a number on the other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 7n squared to both sides of the equation. And that's going to give me 7n squared over here on the left. This will cancel on the right. I'm going to subtract 17n from both sides of the equation. So then minus 17n. So all my variable terms are on the left. And this will cancel over here. On the right, I'll just have 12. So once I've done that, the next thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that the coefficient on the squared variable is a 1. In this case, it's a 7. So I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 7. So this will cancel with this, and I'll have n squared, and then minus 17 over 7, n, is equal to 12 sevenths. Now here comes the hard part. We want to look at the variable that's raised to the first power. So that's n right here. Let me kind of circle that. And I want to look at the coefficient of that, so negative 17 sevenths. Now here's what I told you in the lesson. So you want to add one half of the coefficient of the first degree term squared to both sides. So one half of the coefficient of the first degree term squared. Here's how I remember that, because that's kind of fancy. I say cut it in half and square it. So take that negative 17 sevenths, cut it in half. So multiply it by half, and then square it. Okay, cut it in half, square it. That's how I remember. So nothing in here would cancel. I'd just be left with negative 17 over 14, and this would be squared. Now I'd need to use a calculator for this. Negative 17 squared is equal to 289, and 14 squared is 196. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this to both sides of the equation. So this is going to look like this. I'm going to have n squared minus 17 over 7n plus 289 over 196. And this equals 12 sevenths plus 289 over 196. OK, so a few more things to do here. Now, over here, I need to get a common denominator. So I'd multiply this by 28 over 28. So 28 times 12 is 336, so I'd have 336 over 196 plus 289 over 196. That would give me 625 over 196. So let me write that. So this is 625 over 196. Okay. Now on this side, I completed the square. So that means I have a perfect square trinomial, and I can factor this 
into n minus the square root of this guy, which is 17 fourteenths. So minus 17 fourteenths. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's scroll down a little bit. And so what I wanna do now is use my square root property. So I'm gonna take the square root of this side. And remember, I'm gonna put plus or minus the square root of this side. And let me make that a little better. Okay, so what's gonna happen is this will cancel with this. I'll have n minus 17 fourteenths is equal to plus or minus. This is actually a perfect square. The square root of 625 is 25. And the square root of 196 is 14. So let's continue. Let me scroll down, get some room going. This is going to give me two different scenarios. So I have n minus 17 fourteenths is equal to positive 25 fourteenths. And then I'll also have n minus 17 fourteenths is equal to negative 25 fourteenths. Okay, so those two scenarios. All right, so to solve this one, I'm going to add 17 fourteenths to each side of the equation. And I'll have n is equal to 25 plus 17 is 42. So I'd have 42 over 14, which is 3. So I get n is equal to 3. All right, then over here, I want to do the same thing. So if I added 17 fourteenths to each side of the equation, I would have n is equal to, this would cancel. So negative 25 plus 17 is negative 8. So negative 8 over 14. So n equals 3 or n equals, if I divide each by 2, I'd have negative 4 sevenths. So n equals 3 or n equals negative 4 sevenths. Now, I'm not going to check this in the interest of time. But what I will tell you is that you can pause the video, take the original equation, plug a 3 in for n, and you'll see that you get a true statement. And then also plug in a negative 4 sevenths in for n, and you will also get a true statement. So again, n equals 3 or n equals negative 4 sevenths. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have b squared minus 10 is equal to negative 3b. So I want all the variable terms on one side, the constants on the other. So let me add 10 to each side of the equation. And let me add 3b to each side of the equation. And so this would cancel and this would cancel. And I would have b squared plus 3b is equal to 10. Now, I have a coefficient that is a 1 on the b squared. So the next thing I want to do is actually complete the square. So again, I'm looking at the variable that has an exponent of 1, so my first degree term, and I look at the coefficient there more specifically. So I look at this 3, and what do I say? Cut it in half and then square it, okay? So I want to cut it in half, it means multiply by a half, and then square it. Let me scroll down and get a little room going. So 3 times a half is just 3 halves. And if I squared 3 halves, if I squared 3 halves, I would have 9 fourths. So I'm going to be adding 9 fourths to both sides of the equation. And that's going to give me b squared plus 3b plus 9 fourths is equal to 10 plus 9 fourths. Okay, so now let me just simplify over here. I can multiply this by 4 over 4. And let me scroll down a little bit. So I'm going to copy what I have, b squared plus 3b plus 9 fourths. We'll deal with that in a second. Over here, I would have 40, right? 10 times 4 is 40, plus 9. That would be 49 over the common denominator of 4. And now on the left side, I have a perfect square trinomial. So I'm going to factor that into a binomial squared. So this first guy is going to be a b, and then plus... What's going to go on the second position? What's going to be the square root of this, right? 9, if I think about the square root of that, that's 3. If I think about the square root of 4, that's 2. So b plus 3 halves, that quantity squared, is going to be equal to 49 fourths. Okay, so now that we have this, I'm going to take the square root of this side, and I'm going to take the plus or minus square root of this side, and we know that this cancels with this, and I'll have b plus 3 halves is equal to plus or minus the square root of 49 fourths is going to be 7 halves. 
right? Square root of 49 is 7. Square root of 4 is 2. All right, so now we have two different equations to solve. So we have b plus 3 halves is equal to 7 halves. Or also we have b plus 3 halves is equal to negative 7 halves. All right, so now I can subtract 3 halves away from each side of the equation over here. And I would have b is equal to 7 minus 3 is 4. So I'd have 4 over 2, which is equal to 2. And then over here, if I subtract 3 halves away from each side of the equation, I would have b is equal to negative 7 minus 3 is negative 10 over 2. And negative 10 over 2 is negative 5. So my two solutions here would be that b equals 2 or b equals negative 5. For the next one, I have 6r squared is equal to 56 minus 8r. And what I want to do, again, let me add 8r to both sides of the equation so that I can have all the variable terms on one side and only a constant on the other. So I'd have 6r squared plus 8r is equal to 56. And what do I notice now? I have 6 as the coefficient for the squared term, right? So I don't want that. So we're going to get rid of that by dividing both sides of the equation by 6. So I'd have r squared plus, if I think about 8 over 6, I can simplify by canceling a common factor of 2. So this would be 4 thirds times r is equal to, with 56 over 6, each is divisible by 2. 56 divided by 2 is 28, so this would be 28 thirds. All right, so now I want to complete the square. So I'm looking at my variable that's raised to the first power, and I look at the coefficient there. So in this case, that's 4 thirds. And I want to cut it in half and then square it, okay? Cut it in half, so 4 thirds times 1 half, and then square it. So this would cancel with this and give me a 2. So essentially, I'd have 2 thirds squared. So if I square 2, I get 4. If I square 3, I get 9. So I get 4 ninths. So I'm going to add this amount to both sides of the equation. So that would give me r squared plus 4 thirds r plus 4 ninths is equal to 28 thirds plus 4 ninths. OK. So on this side of the equation, on the right, I'm going to get a common denominator going. So I'm going to multiply this by 3 over 3. So 28 times 3 is 84. So this is 84 plus 4 over 9. And 84 plus 4 is 88. So we just write this as 88 ninths. Now over here on the left, I have a perfect square trinomial. So I'm going to factor this. So this would be an r. This would be a plus. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 9 is 3. So this would be r plus 2 thirds, that quantity squared. And then this is equal to 88 ninths. All right, so now that I've done this, I can use my square root property. I'll take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of this side. And so I'm going to have r plus 2 thirds is equal to plus or minus the square root of 9 is 3. So I can write plus or minus the square root of 88 over 3. Now I can further simplify the square root of 88, but I wanted to just do that kind of off to the side real fast. So I know that 88 has 4 as one of its factors, and 4 is a perfect square. So what I can do is I can write that as the square root of 4 times the square root of 22. Square root of 4 times the square root of 22. Square root of 4 is 2. So I'm going to write this as 2 times the square root of 22. And now I have my two scenarios. So r plus 2 thirds is equal to the positive scenario, so positive 2 times square root of 22 over 3. Then or you have r plus 2 thirds is equal to, and this would be your negative scenario, so negative 2 times square root of 22 over 3. All right, so let's start out by solving this one on the left. I would subtract 2 thirds away from each side of the equation. And essentially, I would just have r is equal to, and this is canceled, 2 times square root of 22 minus 2 over the common denominator of 3. And we can put or 
over here. If I subtract two thirds away from each side of the equation, I'm gonna get r is equal to negative two times square root of 22 minus two over 30. And of course I can write this as r is equal to plus or minus two times square root of 22 minus two over three. All right, let's take a look at one more problem. So we have 10x squared plus 21x is equal to negative 2x squared minus 9. So what I want to do here, I'm going to add 2x squared to each side of the equation. And that's going to give me 12x squared plus 21x is equal to negative 9. And then I have all my variable terms on one side, I have the constant on the other. I'm going to make sure that the coefficient for the squared term is a one. So let me divide each side of the equation by 12. So that's gonna cancel. I'll have x squared plus, if I think about 21 and 12, they have a common factor of three. 21 divided by three is seven. So this would be seven x over four this is equal to, for nine and 12, they have a common factor of three. So this would be negative three over four. All right, so now I want to complete the square. And let me kind of erase this and make this seven fourths times x like that. So I want to look at the coefficient on the x to the first power. And that's that seven fourths. And I want to cut it in half and then square. Okay, cut it in half. So I'm going to take seven fourths and multiply it by one half. And then I want to square it. So I'd have seven over eight. And then if I square that, I'm gonna get 49 over 64. So that's what I'm gonna to add to both sides of the equation. So let me, let me erase this. On this side, I'll have x squared plus seven fourths x plus 49 over 64. And then this is equal to negative three fourths plus 49 over 64. All right, so over here, I'm gonna multiply this by 16 over 16, and I'm gonna end up with negative three times 16 is negative 48. So this would be negative 48 plus 49, that would be one over the common denominator 64. Over here, I have a perfect square trinomial. So I'm gonna factor this into x, I have a plus there, so plus, square root of 49 is seven, Square root of 64 is eight. So x plus seven eighths, that quantity squared. And so now I'm at the point where I can take the square root of each side. So I'm gonna take the square root of this side, and then let me scooch this down, and I'll put plus or minus the square root of this side. And so I'll have x plus seven eighths is equal to plus or minus, the square root of one is one, the square root of 64 is eight. So plus or minus one eighth. All right, so let me do the two different scenarios here. You'll have x plus 7 eighths is equal to 1 eighth, then or x plus 7 eighths is equal to negative 1 eighth. All right, so if I solve this one on the left, I subtract 7 eighths away from each side of the equation, that's gone. x is now equal to 1 minus 7 is negative 6 over 8. Now I can simplify that because they both share a common factor of 2, if I divide negative six by two, I get negative three. If I divide eight by two, I get four. So this is negative three fourths as one of my solutions. And then for the other, if I subtract seven eighths away from each side of this equation, I'll have x is equal to negative one minus seven is negative eight, negative eight over eight is negative one. So I get x equals negative three fourths or x equals negative one. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1, Test Section 1 on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we wanna solve each equation by completing the square. And we're gonna take a look at 4p squared minus 16 is equal to 6p. So the first step that we're gonna do here is we're gonna move all the variable terms to one side and we're just gonna have a constant on the other. So I'm going to subtract 6p away from each side of the equation. And that's gonna give me 4p squared minus 6p minus 16 is equal to zero. And then I'm gonna add 16 to both sides of the equation. And that's gonna give me 4p squared 
minus 6p is equal to 60. Now the next thing that I want to do is make sure that the coefficient on the squared variable, which is this in this case, it's a 4, is a 1. So if it's not a 1, what we can do, use a little basic algebra, I can divide both sides of the equation by 4. And what's going to happen is this will cancel with this, and I've got p squared. So now the coefficient is a 1, and that's what I want. And then minus, if I think about 6 over 4, they have a common factor of 2. So I could write this as minus 3p over 2. And this is equal to 16 over 4 is 4. Now here comes the step where we complete the square. So what I'm going to do, and let me kind of write this a little bit cleaner. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the coefficients on the variable that's raised to the first power. So p is raised to the first power. The coefficient is negative 3 halves. Now, what I want to do is I want to cut it in half, and I want to square it. So negative 3 halves, if I cut something in half, it's like multiplying it by half. And then I want to square the result. So negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. 2 times 2 is 4. So this would be negative 3, negative 3 fourths. And if I square this, I would get 9 sixteenths. This is what I'm going to add to both sides of the equation to complete the square. So I'll add 9 sixteenths to the left and also to the right. So I'll have p squared minus 3 halves p plus 9 sixteenths is equal to 4 plus 9 sixteenths. So I'm going to multiply this by 16 over 16 so I can have a common denominator. Let me just copy the left side. So p squared minus 3 halves p plus 9 sixteenths. And then over here, 16 times 4 is 64. So this equals 64 plus 9, which is 73, over 16. So now the left side is a perfect square trinomial. So that means I can factor this guy. So I'm going to factor this into a binomial squared. And from the special products formulas, we know that a p would go here. This is minus, so this is minus. And then I just need the square root of this. Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 16 is 4. So p minus 3 fourths, that quantity squared, is equal to 73 over 16. Now, I have it set up where I can use my square root property. I can take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of this side. And so this will cancel with this. And I'll have p minus 3 fourths is equal to plus or minus. I know the square root of 16 is 4, so let me just write a 4 down there. And then I'll have the square root of 73 in the numerator. So let me set up my two different scenarios here. I'll have two separate equations to solve. I'll have p minus 3 fourths is equal to the principal square root of 73 over 4. And then I'll have a different scenario to solve, which is p minus 3 fourths is equal to the negative square root of 73 over 4. And so let's go ahead and solve the one on the left first. If I add 3 fourths to each side of the equation, I will end up with p is equal to the square root of 73 plus 3 over the common denominator of 4. On the right side, if I add 3 fourths to each side of the equation, I'll have p is equal to negative square root of 73 plus 3 over now, if you want to kind of write this in a more compact way, you could say p is equal to plus or minus the square root of 73 plus 3 over 4. So that's your solution. Now, if you want to, you can go back and check. I've already verified this, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to check. But you can plug in square root of 73 plus 3 over 4 for p in the original equation, and also negative square root of 73 plus 3 over 4, and you'll see that both of these solutions are valid. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we want to solve each equation by completing the square. So I have negative k squared minus 15k is equal to 14. And the first thing I want to do is have all the variable terms on one side and a constant on the other, and I have that. So the next thing I would do 
is I want to make sure that the coefficient on the squared variable is a one. In this case, I have a negative out here. So let's just multiply both sides of the equation by negative one. So if I multiply this side by negative one and this side by negative one, I'll get k squared plus 15k is equal to negative 14. Right? I just change the sign of everything. So now that that's done, I'm going to complete the square. So I wanna look at the coefficient of my variable that's raised to the first power. So that's 15 right there. I wanna cut it in half and square it. So if I take 15 and I cut it in half, I multiply it by half and I square it, I get 15 halves squared and that would be 225 fourths. So that's what I'm gonna add to each side of the equation. So let me erase everything. So I would have k squared plus 15k plus 225 fourths is equal to negative 14 plus 225 fourths. Okay, let's get a common denominator going. So let me multiply this over here. I'm just gonna scooch this down a little bit. Scooch this down, scooch this down. I'll multiply this by four over four. All right, so let me just copy this real quick. K squared plus 15K plus 225 fourths is equal to negative 14 times four is negative 56. So I'd have negative 56 fourths plus 225 fourths. Now, if I do 225 minus 56 is 169, and this is over four. Now over here on the left, this is a perfect square trinomial. So I can factor this into a binomial squared. So I know it would be K plus square root of 225 is 15, square root of four is two. So now I'm gonna use my square root property, take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of this side. So what I'd have here is K plus 15 halves is equal to plus or minus the square root of 169 is 13, the square root of four is two. So this gives me two different scenarios to work through. And the first one's gonna be K plus 15 halves is equal to 13 halves. Then the other scenario is k plus 15 halves is equal to negative 13 halves. So I've got to solve these two different equations. All right, so over here, if I subtract 15 halves away from each side of the equation, I'm gonna end up with k is equal to, 13 minus 15 is negative two, negative two over two is negative one. Then if I look over here, if I subtract 15 halves away from each side of the equation, I would have k is equal to, Negative 13 minus 15 is negative 28 over two. This is gonna be equal to negative 14. So here I know that K would be equal to negative one or K would be equal to negative 14. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna check these. But I want you to go back, plug them into the original equation and verify that we got the correct solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra One test section three on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we just wanna solve each equation by completing the square. And we're gonna take a look at 8m squared plus 9m minus 72 is equal to 5m. So what I wanna do is I wanna have all my variable terms on one side and I wanna have the constant on the other. So let me add 72 to each side of the equation and let me subtract 5m away from each side of the equation. And this is gonna cancel, and this is gonna cancel. And what I'm gonna have is 8m squared, 8m squared, and then plus 4m, and this is equal to 72. Now the next thing is I want the coefficient for the variable that's squared, in this case that's gonna be eight, I want that to be a one. Now it doesn't matter that it's an eight right now, I can do some simple algebra, divide both sides of the equation by eight, and I can convert it. So if I divide this by eight, this by eight, and this by eight, what's gonna happen is this will cancel with this, and I'm gonna have m squared plus four over eight is basically one half, so I'll put one half m. This is equal to 72 divided by eight is nine. All right, so now what I wanna do is complete the square. So I look at my variable that's raised to the first power. In this case, that's here. 
and I want to look at the coefficient. So I want to add one half of the coefficient squared to both sides of the equation. So what I always say is cut it in half and then square it. So if I have one half and I cut it in half, I basically multiply by a half and then I square it. So one half times one half is one fourth. If I squared one fourth, I'd get one sixteenth. Okay, one sixteenth. So I'm going to add 1 over 16 to both sides of this equation. And so I'll have m squared plus 1 half m plus 1 over 16 is equal to 9 plus 1 over 16. And of course, to get a common denominator here, I'd multiply by 16 over 16. And let me just copy this down here. I'd have m squared plus 1 half m plus 1 over 16 is equal to 9 times 16 is 144. Then plus 1 would give me 145. This is over that common denominator of 16. Okay, so now the left side is a perfect square trinomial. So that means I can factor it into a binomial squared where I'll have m plus the square root of 1 16th is 1 4th. And this equals 145 over 16. Now I'm ready to use my square root property. So I'll take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of this side. So this will cancel with this and I'll have m plus 1 fourth is equal to plus or minus. Now the square root of 16 is 4. So I can just write 4 down here. And then the square root of 145, I can't really do anything with. So I'm just going to write plus or minus the square root of 145. So now to solve this, I'm going to have two different scenarios. I'm going to have m plus 1 fourth is equal to the square root of 145 over 4 or m plus 1 fourth is equal to the negative square root of 145 over 4. So let's work on this one over here. So subtract away 1 fourth from each side of the equation. I'll have m is equal to the square root of 145 minus 1 over 4, then or on the right side, if I subtract away 1 fourth from each side of the equation, I'll have m is equal to the negative square root of 145 minus 1 over 4. So if I want to, I can write this solution in a more compact way as m is equal to plus or minus the square root of 145 minus 1 all over 4. And again, I'm not going to check this in the interest of time, but you can plug in square root of 145 minus 1 over 4 and negative square root of 145 minus 1 over 4 back in for m in the original equation. And you'll see that both of these solutions are valid. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we want to solve each equation by completing the square. We're going to look at 19a is equal to negative 4a squared plus 93. So the first thing I want to do is get all the variable terms to one side, and I want a constant on the other. So let me add 4a squared to each side of the equation, and I'll have 4a squared plus 19a is equal to 93. The next thing I want to do is make sure that the coefficient for the squared variable is a 1. In this case, it's a 4, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 4, and I'm going to end up with a squared plus 19 fourths a is equal to 93 fourths. So I'm going to end up with a squared plus 19 fourths a is equal to 93 fourths. All right, so now I want to actually complete the square. So let me scroll down a little bit and get some room going. And what I want to do is look at the coefficient for the variable that's raised to the first power. So that's 19 fourths. And I want to cut it in half and then square it. So I would have 19 fourths times a half. And then I would square that. So 19 times 1 is 19. 2 times 4 is 8. So I'd have 19 eighths squared. And if I punch that up on a calculator, 19 squared is 361, 8 squared we know is 64. So this is what I'm adding to both sides of the equation 
to complete the square. So I'd have a squared plus 19 fourths a plus 361 over 64. This is equal to 93 fourths plus 361 over 64. All right, so over here, I've got to get a common denominator going. So I'm going to multiply by 16 over 16, and I'm going to have 93 times 16, which is 1,488 plus 361 over 64. And over here, I can go ahead and factor this. This is now a perfect square trinomial. So I know I'll have a plus square root of 361 is 19, and the square root of 64 is 8. So a plus 19 eighths, that quantity squared, is going to be equal to 1,488 plus 361 over 64. So on the right side here, 1,488 plus 361 is 1,849 over 64. And over here, I have a plus, again, 19 eighths, that quantity, squared. All right, so now I'm ready to take the square root of each side. So I take the square root of this side, and then I go plus or minus the square root of this side. And what I'm going to end up with is a plus 19 eighths is equal to the square root of 1,849 is actually 43. So this would be plus or minus 43 over, we know the square root of 64 is 8. So 43 eighths. So that leads me to these two different scenarios of a plus 19 eighths is equal to 43 eighths, or a plus 19 eighths is equal to negative 43 eighths. So over here, I'm going to subtract 19 eighths away from each side of the equation. That'll cancel, and I'll have a is equal to 43 minus 19 is 24, so 24 over 8, which is 3. Over here, if I subtract away 19 eighths from each side of the equation, this will cancel, and I'll have a is equal to negative 62 over 8, which I could simplify to. If I divide each by 2, I'd get negative 31 fourths. So here I have a is equal to 3, or a is equal to negative 31 fourths. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to check these, but you can stop the video Go back to the original equation, plug in a 3, and then also a negative 31 fourths in for A, and you'll see that these are valid solutions. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 5 on solving quadratic equations by completing the square. All right, so we want to solve each equation by completing the square. We're going to take a look at 7P squared plus 21P is equal to negative 9. So in this particular scenario, we already have it set up where the variable terms are on one side and the constant is on the other. The next thing I want to make sure of is that the coefficient for the squared variable is a 1. In this case, it's a 7, so I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 7, and that would lead to p squared plus 3p is equal to negative 9 sevenths. Now I'm going to complete the square. So to do that, I'm going to look at the coefficient for the p to the first power. So there's p to the first power, and your coefficient is this 3 here. So what I want to do is I want to cut it in half, okay, cut it in half, so multiply it by a half, and then square it. So 3 times a half is 3 halves, so if I had 3 halves squared, I would have 9 fourths. So I'm going to add 9 fourths to each side of this equation, and I've completed the square. So now I just simplify. On the left, what I'm going to do is I know this is a trinomial that is now a perfect square, so I know it would factor into a binomial squared. So I'll put a p here, I'll put a plus here, square root of 9 is 3, square root of 4 is 2. So p plus 3 halves, that quantity squared, is equal to, over here i got to get a common denominator going, so I'll multiply this by 7 over 7, this by 4 over 4, and you would get negative 36 plus 63 over 28. So this ends up being 27. So let me erase this and put 27. And let's scroll down here. Now I can use my square root property. So I'll take the square root of this side and then plus or minus the square root of this side. And so what's going to happen is we know that this cancels with this. 
I'll have p plus 3 halves is equal to plus or minus the square root of 27, which can be simplified, over the square root of 28. Now, the square root of 27 is the square root of 9 times the square root of 3. So I can write this as, since the square root of 9 is 3, 3 times the square root of 3. So I'm going to write 3 times square root of 3. And then the square root of 28, I could write as the square root of 4 times the square root of 7. The square root of 4 is 2, so I could really write this as 2 times the square root of 7. All right, so now let me set up my two different scenarios. I'll have p plus 3 halves is equal to 3 times the square root of 3 over 2 times the square root of 7. Then I'll put or. You would have the negative version of this, which is p plus 3 halves is equal to negative. Just stick that out in front. 3 times the square root of 3 over 2 times the square root of 7. So over here, if I subtract 3 halves away from each side, I'm going to have p is equal to 3 times square root of 3 over 2 times square root of 7 minus 3 halves. And I need a common denominator, so let me multiply by square root of 7 over square root of 7. So now what would happen is I would have 3 times square root of 3 minus 3 times square root of 7. over a common denominator that is 2 times the square root of 7. And I know that we don't like to report answers where there's a radical in the denominator. So you can rationalize the denominator if you want. You can multiply this by square root of 7 over square root of 7. Square root of 7 times square root of 7 is 7. So down here you would have 2 times 7 or 14. Up here, you would have square root of 7 times square root of 3. That's square root of 21. And then here, square root of 7 times square root of 7 would be 7. 3 times 7 is 21. So you would end up with p being equal to 3 times the square root of 21 minus 21 over 14. Now, we're not done because we have to do another scenario. Let's just take this over here. And we'll subtract 3 halves away from each side of the equation. And we'll have p is equal to negative 3 times square root of 3 over 2 times square root of 7 minus we have 3 halves. Now, again, I need to get a common denominator, so I multiply by square root of 7 over square root of 7. And what's going to happen is I'm going to have negative 3 times square root of 3 minus 3 times square root of 7. So minus 3 times the square root of 7 is over the common denominator of 2 times square root of 7. And again, you don't want a radical in your denominator, so I just multiply this by square root of 7 over square root of 7. And so in the denominator, square root of 7 times square root of 7 is 7. 7 times 2 is 14, so this is 14. In the numerator, if I multiply negative 3 times square root of 3 times square root of 7, Essentially, all I'm going to have here is that this would just be the square root of 21 here. And square root of 7 times square root of 7, we know that's 7. So if I did 3 times 7, that's 21. So this would be minus 21 here. So I get negative 3 times the square root of 21 minus 21 over 14. So if I go back up, this is my first solution. Let me just copy it so I can put them together. Let me bring this back down here. Let me scroll down a little bit. So let me write it in a more compact way. p equals plus or minus 3 times the square root of 21 minus 21 over 14. And again, I'm not going to check this in the interest of time, but you can go back and plug in negative 3 times square root of 21 minus 21 over 14, and then also 3 times square root of 21 minus 21 over 14 in for p in the original equation, and you'll see that both of these solutions are valid. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Practice Set 62. In this video, we're going to look at some additional practice problems for our lesson on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. All right, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula. And we're going to start out with n squared minus 102 is equal to negative 11n. The first thing is that you want to write the equation in standard form. 
So standard form looks like this. You have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. Now the fact that your variable here is an n doesn't matter. I would just want the squared variable to be out to the left, then the variable to the first power to be next, then followed by the constant. So I would just add 11n to both sides of the equation, and I would have n squared plus 11n minus 102 is equal to 0. So once I've done that, now I can identify what a, b, and c are. So a is the coefficient for the squared variable. In this case, it's a 1, so a is equal to 1. b is the coefficient for the variable raised to the first power, so here that's 11. And then c is your constant, so here that's negative, you've got to include the negative, 102. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to plug into the quadratic formula. So let me scroll down and get a little room going. And this is something you should have written on a flashcard or, you know, something at this point you might have just memorized, okay? But if you haven't memorized it, put it on a flashcard, keep it in front of you, write it out each time, and you're going to memorize it. It's x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Now, in this particular case, our variable is an n, so we could just replace the x with an n. So what we're going to do is just plug things in. So everywhere I see an A, I'm going to put a 1. So I'm going to put a 1 here, and I'm going to put a 1 here. Everywhere I see a B, I'm going to put an 11. So 1 here, and then here. And then everywhere I see C, I'm going to put negative 102. All right, so let's crank this out. So we would have N is equal to negative 11 plus or minus the square root of 11 squared is 121 minus we have four times negative 102 that's negative 408 so minus the negative 408 is plus 408 so what is 121 plus 408 that's 529 so you'd have the square root of 529 here and then this is over two times one is two so we don't work with 529 a lot Hopefully you can use a calculator, but the square root of 529 is 23. So what you'd have here is that n is equal to negative 11 plus or minus, again, the square root of this is 23, over 2. So that's going to give me two different solutions. n will equal negative 11 plus 23 over 2, or n will equal negative 11 minus 23 over 2. So in this scenario right here, 23 minus 11 is 12. 12 over 2 is 6. So this is n equals 6. Or negative 11 minus 23 is negative 34. And negative 34 over 2 is negative 17. So n equals negative 17. So n equals 6 or n equals negative 17. Okay, let's take a look at another one. So we have 5 plus 3n is equal to 3 minus 2n squared. So again, I want to put this in standard form. That looks like ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And again, I know we have an n here, but the variable can be whatever. Okay, so I'm going to add 2n squared to each side of the equation, and I'm going to subtract 3 away from each side of the equation. And what I'd have is this will cancel and this will cancel. I'll have 2n squared, 2n squared, and then plus 3n, and then 5 minus 3 is 2, so plus 2, and this will equal 0. So my a is 2, my b is 3, and my c is 2. So we just plug into the formula. So usually you say x, but in this case we have n, so we'll have n is equal to negative b, so b is 3, so negative 3, plus or minus the square root of b squared, b is 3, so that's 3 squared is 9. So then minus, we'd have 4 times a times c. a is 2 and also c is 2. So 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. So this would be 9 minus 16. Now, this is a problem for us. We know that in the lesson we talked about the discriminant. And you might not have watched the lesson, so you might not know this. But if underneath the square root here, you get a negative value, you're going to end up taking the square root of a negative and we can't do that yet. 
right? We say no real solution. So at this point in your class, if you see something set up like that, you can stop and say no real solution. You don't need to continue, right? You can put this over two times a, a is two, so this is over four, but you don't need to continue. Nine minus 16 is negative seven. So let's just stop there and say no real solution. All right, for the next one, we'll look at three x squared minus eight equals zero. And in this case, you might say, well, where's your x to the first power? Well, you don't need it. As long as you have a coefficient that's not zero on your x squared, you're gonna be good to go. So again, if this is already in standard form, really you could write it as three x squared plus zero x minus eight equals zero. So you'd say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, that's your standard form. So a is three, b is zero, and c is negative eight. Plug into the formula. So x is equal to negative b, b is zero, so I don't have to put anything, plus or minus the square root of b squared, again, b is zero, so I don't put anything, minus four times a times c. So a is three, c is negative eight. So let's just do negative four times negative eight, that's positive 32, and then 32 times three is 96. And this is all over two a, a is three, so two times three is six. So what is the square root of 96? Well, 96 is 16 times six. 16 is a perfect square, square root of 16 is four. So I could write this as x equals plus or minus four times the square root of six over six, and that would give me two different solutions. I would have x is equal to four times square root of six over six, which would simplify to if I cancel a common factor of two, this would be a two and this would be a three. So really x equals two times square root of six over three. Or the other scenario would be x equals negative four times square root of six over six. And again, I can cancel a common factor of two, so this would be negative two times square root of six over three. So these are your two solutions. All right, for the next one, I'm looking at negative four r squared plus 52 equals negative three r. At this point, we know that we would just add three r to each side of the equation and put it in standard form. So negative four r squared plus three r plus 52 is equal to zero. So you should know that this is your a, this is your b, and this is your c. a is the coefficient for the squared variable, b is the coefficient for the variable raised to the first power, and c is your constant. All right, so now we're gonna plug into the formula. So in this case, it's r is equal to negative b. So b is three, so negative three, plus or minus the square root of b squared. b is three, so three squared is nine, minus four times a is negative four, times c, which is 52. This is all over two a, two times negative four is negative eight. All right, so. Negative four times negative four is 16. 16 times 52 is 832. Then if I add nine to that, I would get 841. So this would be r equals negative three plus or minus the square root of 841 over negative eight. So the square root of 841 is 29. So I'll have r is equal to negative three plus 29 over negative eight so this would give me negative three plus 29, that's 26 over negative eight. And this would simplify to, if I cancel a common factor of two, negative 13 fourths. So that's one answer. The other would be r is equal to, I'd have negative three minus 29 over negative eight. Negative three minus 29 would be negative 32. So you'd have negative 32 over negative eight. So that's equal to positive four. So again, r equals negative 13 fourths, or r equals four. All right, let's take a look at one final problem here. So we have negative three n squared plus 19 n minus three equals 10 n. So let me just subtract 10 n away from each side of the equation. And this is gonna cancel, become zero. So we'll have negative three n squared plus nine n minus three equals zero. So at this point, we should know that a is negative three, b is nine, and c is negative three. So if I plug into my formula, 
we'll have n is equal to negative b. So b is 9. So negative 9 plus or minus the square root of b squared. 9 squared is 81 minus 4 times negative 3. Okay, this is 4 times a. a is negative 3. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Then times c, which is negative 3. So negative 12 times negative 3 is 36. So you'd have 81 minus 36 there. And then this is over 2a. So 2 times negative 3, that's negative 6. Let's scroll this down a little bit. So what's 81 minus 36? Well, it's going to give me 45. So n equals negative 9 plus or minus. We know 45 is not a perfect square, but it is 5 times 9. 9 is a perfect square. Square root of 9 is 3. So I can write plus or minus 3 times square root of 5 over negative 6. So this would lead to two different scenarios. Before I write them out, notice that you have a common factor of 3 there. So I could write n equals factor out of 3. I'd have negative 3 plus or minus 1 times square root of 5. Again, I just pulled a 3 out from each term. And then over 3 times negative 2. So we can cancel this 3 with this 3. And what I'm going to have now is n is equal to negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 5 over negative 2. Now you can keep it in this compact format or you can go through and write it out n equals negative 3 plus the square root of 5 over negative 2 or n equals negative 3 minus the square root of 5 over negative 2. If you want to write it this way or in the more compact form this way, either way it's saying the same thing. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 1 on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. All right, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula. And we're going to look at 2x squared plus 11x plus 12 equals 0. Now, again, we want to start out by having our equation in standard form. And in this particular case, it already is, right? This is matching ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 where a, in this case, is going to be 2. It's the coefficient for x squared. b, in this case, is going to be 11. right? It's going to be the coefficient for x to the first power. And c is going to be 12. right? That's your constant. Now, we're going to plug these values into the quadratic formula, which hopefully at this point you've memorized. If you haven't, I'm just going to give it to you. It's negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. And this is all over 2a. So we'd have x is equal to this. So x equals, for b I have 11. So I'd have negative 11 plus or minus the square root of, if I squared 11, I'd get 121. So minus, we have 4 times a times c. a is 2, c is 12. 2 times 12 is 24. 24 times 4 is 96. So then this is over. 2 times a, again, a is 2, so 2 times 2 is 4. All right, so inside the square root symbol, 121 minus 96 is 25. The square root of 25 is 5. So I would have x is equal to negative 11 plus or minus 5 over 4. So we know this is going to be two different scenarios. We basically have x is equal to negative 11 plus 5 over 4, or x is equal to negative 11 minus 5 over 4. So we'll have x is equal to negative 11 plus 5 is negative 6. So you'd have negative 6 over 4. And I can cancel a common factor of 2 between numerator and denominator. So this would be negative 3 halves. Over here, negative 11 minus 5 is negative 16. So you'd have negative 16 over 4, which is just negative 4. Let's put negative 4. So x equals negative 3 halves, or x equals negative 4. Hello, and welcome to Algebra 1 Test Section 2 on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. All right, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula. We're going to look at 6n squared minus 10n plus 7 equals 0. So this equation is already in standard form for us. It matches this format. We have ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And everything is lined up. So I know a is the coefficient for the variable that I have that's squared. So that's 6 in this case. 
b is the coefficient for the variable that's raised to the first power. So here that's negative 10. And then c is my constant term. And here that's going to be 7. So once I have these values, I just plug into the quadratic formula. So hopefully you know the quadratic formula at this point. If you don't, I'm going to give it to you. But again, I suggest writing this on a flashcard, using it for each problem. And then after so many problems, you're going to have this thing memorized. So it is, in this case, our variable is n. So I'll put n is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. And this whole thing is over 2a. So if I plug into this, I'll have n is equal to negative of negative 10 is positive 10, then plus or minus the square root of, if I square b, b is negative 10, negative 10 squared is 100, then minus 4 times a is 6 times c is 7. Okay, then this whole thing is over 2a, and a is 6, so it's 2 times 6 is 12. All right, so let's do the multiplication here. 4 times 6 is 24. 24 times 7 is 168. So you'd have n is equal to 10 plus or minus the square root of, what's 100 minus 168? Well, that's negative 68. And then this is over 12. Do you see a problem? Well, you know that I can't take the square root of a negative number with the real number system. We can do it by using the complex number system, but we haven't gotten to that yet. That's something we're gonna do in algebra two. So when we see this, we know that this is not a real number. And so this problem has no real solution. So I'm just gonna put no real solution. And later on in math, we're gonna learn how to deal with this situation. So we will be able to get an answer. But for right now, if you're in this section, you want to just put no real solution. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 3 on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. All right, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula. We're going to look at negative 10x squared plus 6 equals 0. So some of you might say, where's the rest of the equation? Well, this is still a quadratic equation. When we have a quadratic equation, we have to have a squared variable, and we can have no variable that has an exponent higher than two. Basically, the only restriction is that the coefficient on the squared variable is not zero. So this guy right here cannot be zero. But anything else can be zero, doesn't matter. So when I set this up, and let me just erase this real quick, in standard form, I could say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. If I rewrote this, I could put negative 10x squared plus 0x plus 6 equals zero. Zero times x is zero, and so I still have negative 10x squared plus 6. But I do this so that I can match things up. Negative 10 is a, zero is b, 6 is c, and that's going to allow me to plug into the quadratic formula. So let me scroll down a little bit. And our quadratic formula, we'll have x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. This is all over 2a. So we'll have x is equal to, if I plug in for b, I've got a 0. So negative 0 is just 0. So you don't have to even put anything. You just put plus or minus the square root of b squared. So 0 squared would be 0. So then just minus 4 times a, a is negative 10, times c, which is 6. And then this is over. 2 times a, again, a is negative 10, so negative 20. All right, so we know we have a negative times a negative that's positive. Then I would do 4 times 6, that's 24. And then 24 times 10, that's 240. So I would have the square root, the square root of 240 over negative 20. Now, 240 is not a perfect square, but I know that factors of 240 would be a perfect square. So let's think about what we can do here. 240, I know it's divisible by 10 because I just did multiplication. So let's do 24 times 10, 24, let's do four times six, six is three times two, four is two times two, 10 is five times two. So what I can see here is I have what? I have one, two, three, four factors of two, 
or 16 times 3 times 5, 16 times 15. So if the square root of 16 is 4, I can place that outside. So let's write this over here as x is equal to plus or minus 4 times the square root of 15, that's what would be left inside, over a negative 20. So this is two different solutions. You'd have x is equal to 4 times the square root of 15 over negative 20. And of course, I can do some simplification here. I can cancel this with this and have a negative 5 here. So this would be square root of 15 over negative 5, or I can put the negative up front and put negative square root of 15 over 5, or put the negative right here and put negative square root of 15 over 5. doesn't matter how you write it. And the other one, we'll put or, we'll have x is equal to, in this case, it'll be negative 4 times square root of 15 over negative 20. And we know that in this case, the negatives would cancel. And I can cancel this 4 with this 20 and get 5. So I'd have square root of 15 over 5. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 4 on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. All right, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula. All right, so let's take a look at 7x squared is equal to negative 11 plus 10x plus 5x squared. So let me subtract 5x squared away from each side of the equation. That would give me 2x squared, and this would cancel. Let me subtract 10x away from each side of the equation. That would cancel, and I'd have minus 10x over here. And let me add 11 to both sides of the equation. So that would cancel, so this side would be 0. And then over here, I'd have plus 11 equals 0. So now this is in standard form. So we have 2x squared minus 10x plus 11 equals 0. So again, this is A. This is B. It's the whole thing. It's the negative and the 10. And then this is C. So we take these and we plug them into the quadratic formula. So the quadratic formula, again, is negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And our variable in this case is x, so I'll put x is equal to this. Let me scroll down a little bit, and we're just going to plug in. So we're going to have x is equal to b is negative 10. So the negative of negative 10 is 10, plus or minus the square root of, if I square negative 10, I'd get 100, minus 4 times, for a I have 2, for c I have 11. 2 times 11 is 22. 4 times 22 is 88. 100 minus 88 is 12. This would be the square root of 12 here. And then this is all over 2a. Again, a is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Let me scroll down and get some room going. So what I have here is x is equal to 10 plus or minus. 12 is not a perfect square, but I know 12 is 4 times 3, and 4 is a perfect square. So the square root of 4 is 2. So I can write plus or minus 2 times the square root of 3 over 4. Now, I'm not done because I can simplify this further. I can factor out a 2, and inside this would be a 5 plus or minus, and then I've factored out this 2, so I can put a 1 times square root of 3 or just put square root of 3, doesn't matter, and then this is over. I'll put 4 as 2 times 2, and I can cancel this 2 with this 2, and so I'm going to write x is equal to 5 plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. So of course that would be two solutions, 5 plus the square root of 3 over 2, and then 5 minus the square root of 3 over 2. Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 test section 5 on solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. Alright, so we want to solve each equation using the quadratic formula, and we have negative p squared minus 10p minus 25 equals 0. So again, I want to have this in standard form, which it already is, right, it matches ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So a here is going to be negative 1, b here is going to be negative 10, and c here is going to be negative 25. So we're going to plug that in for the a, b, and c in the quadratic formula. So again, the quadratic formula, in this case the variable is p, so we'll put p is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac this is all over 2a. So I'll have p is equal to the negative of negative 10 is 10, then plus or minus 
we have the square root of b squared, negative 10 squared is 100, minus 4 times a, which is negative 1, times c, which is negative 25. Okay, then this is all over 2 times a, and a again is negative 1. So this is all going to be over negative 2. Now, negative 4 times negative 1 is 4. 4 times negative 25 is negative 100. 100 minus 100 is 0. So this would be erased because it just basically be square root of 0, which is 0. So I basically have 10 over negative 2, which is negative 5. And I taught you in the lesson when this part right here, it's called the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, when that is 0, you only get one solution. And so that's the solution here, which is, again, p equals negative 5. 